Web novel fanfiction TG the good. The latest of the latest. Chapter 91 It was a lump of blue light. It was so beautiful that it was hard to believe that it came out of a terrifying monster like Agar's. The fire enveloped the bright light. The tip of Amun became a part of Yongho, allowing him to consume Agar's spirit. He first felt pleasure and then trembled. It was a big shock, which made it difficult for him to breathe. It was blue. It was a lightning type. Greed was awakened, and it consumed Agar's spirit through the fire. It suppressed its power so that it wouldn't lose anything. Instead of swallowing it whole, greed broke it apart into a million pieces and thoroughly analyzed it. It's safe to say that one spirit was that family's history. There were traces of all the spirits that Agars had consumed up until now. They were useless. They were just traces that couldn't be used. But greed didn't allow it. When Yongho's mana grew stronger, the power of evolution wasn't the only thing that grew too. The spirit's color and element that remained within the traces. It was different from the ones before. It was impossible for Yong Ho to control the element separately, like how he did with Forza's coldness. But he could build it up, analyze it and help his body to accept it. Color and element weren't the only things he acquired. Agars was a predator. He acquired new traits by eating and that's how he evolved. It wasn't the power of a demon king. It was a natural trait that his race had. That trait. The power of evolution yelled. For the power of evolution, greed stored that skill on one side of Yong Ho's mana. It was impossible for Yong Ho to use that skill, but it was possible for him to transfer that skill to someone with similar characteristics and strengthen their skill. Yuri. The princess Ant's face popped into his head. He then felt an exhilarating pleasure, interrupting his thoughts. Agarza's spirit was bigger than any of the other spirits that Yong Ho consumed. It was really distorted, so it wasn't very pure, but the amount made up for it. It felt like his spirit and physical body was going to blow apart. He had to release his power. He was disappointed by the fact that he couldn't consume some of the power, but he had to release it. All the other demon kings had to do the same when they consumed a spirit and it was more than they could handle. But greed rejected him this time too. If Yongho's body couldn't handle Agarza's mana, then it would make it so that his body could handle it. A new bowl. A larger and stronger bowl that can be filled with strong mana. The power of evolution was activated. Agarza's mana evolved Yongho's body. A flash of green light enveloped Yongho's entire body. It began to restructure his body. It was safe to say that he was obtaining a new body. His body was developing as mana circulated within him and the passages that's been blocked before were now open. His body became stronger. His bones became stronger as they contained more mana and his physical skills increased. Yongho didn't forget about his wish. He grew a bit taller. His body looked a lot more appealing. And lastly. Someone was cheering for Yongho's development. Amun, the Red Lotus Demon Lance, had been waiting for this moment. The moment where he won't have to suppress his powers. The moment where he'll be able to use his powers. Of course, Yong Ho was still lacking. He still had a long way to go. But it felt like he could take a step forward. He could use his powers a little more freely. Fire appeared on Yong Ho's wrist, which was still enveloped in the green light. The red fire transformed into a lance. Amun wanted to show his owner a part of his true form. Fire and fire. The green and red fire clashed against each other. They burned together and created a giant light. It disappeared with the wind. Yong Ho took a deep breath. It was the first breath he took after his body transformed. His senses became more sensitive. Even though his eyes were closed, it felt like he could feel everyone's presence really well. The transformation only took 10 seconds. But it was safe to say that the time on the battlefield stopped during that time. The insect type monsters realized that Agars had died. Some of them became weak and others started moving more violently. The spirits that weren't directly connected to Agars saw the enormous fire. They saw the lifeless Agars and realized that his shell was the only thing that was left. 
Agars was dead. He lost and the owner of the house of Mammon the demon king of fire consumed his spirit. Yong Ho opened his eyes. Instead of looking at Agars's corpse, he looked elsewhere. He looked at Salami, who landed on the ground and looked slightly scared. You're exhausted. Salami was the spirit that worked the hardest out of all the spirits that belonged to the house of Mammon. Salami calmed down when Yong Ho spoke and tried to smile with its eyes. Yong Ho petted Salami's nose and spoke. Hang in there. Salami was confused and blinked, but Yong Ho didn't stop smiling. The fight wasn't over. Even though Agars was dead, his troops were still standing. Even though they were on the brink of collapsing, there were still over a hundred spirits. Salami's wings were at its limit. Yong Ho knew that too. That's why he said that earlier. With his new body, he gathered his mana and activated the power of evolution. Green flames rose up from his eyes and he saw a box of light. Salamander assault type development. The green light that appeared on the tip of Yong Ho's finger enveloped Salami's body. Salami roared. The wings grew bigger and stronger and its body transformed into a more aggressive one. Salami's front feet and shoulders became bigger. His claws became sharper and scales appeared on his body, similar to a dragon's. Thorns grew on Salami's slim waist and tail. If Salami looked like an ordinary car before, now he looked like an armored car. After the evolution finished, hot air was released from Salami's mouth. Yong Ho smiled and looked around. His eyes landed on Catalina and Ophelia. Catalina covered her face with her hands as her tail and ears flapped. The gap between her fingers was pretty big, so he was able to see her blue eyes filled with excitement and her red cheeks. Ophelia on the other hand had a smirk on her face. She signaled Yong Ho with her eyes. Impressive. Yong Ho looked down, wondering what the two ladies were looking at and when he realized, he laughed awkwardly and put his hands down. While his body was transforming, the fire burned everything, so he was naked. I was wondering why it was chilly. Yong Ho used his mana. After activating a dark green light, he used it to cover the lower part of his body and then got on Salami's back. Shall we finish this? Yong Ho spoke. Catalina and Ophelia both answered in their own ways. Salami spread its wings. After kicking off the ground and flapping its wing, a strong wind covered the ground. My young owner. He heard Amun's voice. Yong Ho swung his right arm as if that was his reply to Amun's calling. Just like his body, he wielded the lance's new form. The spirits that witnessed Agars's death were running away. The insect-type monsters were violently jumping around as if this was their last attempt at bringing Yong Ho down. He saw Skull, who was swinging his war hammer around. Yong Ho didn't wait any longer. Salami was circling around in the air and he gave his command. Salami's fiery wings made the sky cloudy. The fiery lance that divided the battleground. He finished the battle, just like he had stated earlier. The fight with Agars was now completely over, three hours after it had started. The insect-type monsters didn't know how to quit or surrender. They had no choice but to kill each and every one of them. Most of the spirits that were under Agars's control after he devoured their owners had ran away. The insects' violent movements had given them time to run. When looking at just the results, the free city had achieved victory. Even though Agars had twice as many troops, they had managed to defeat them and even brought down Agars himself. However, the free city was damaged pretty badly as well. Out of the three leaders of the free city, Dargan had died. Despite the fact that trolls had strong regeneration skills, Oris fainted right before the war ended because of his injury. Out of the free city's soldiers, the elite soldiers that Ophelia commanded to go with Skull experienced the most damage. During the most important moment, they became Yongho's shield, so they fought the most enemies and because of that, they had the most injuries. Out of the three leaders, Ophelia was in the best condition, so she took care of the soldiers. The workers' guild and the outlaws were against following Ophelia's orders, but since Yongho was standing behind her, they kept their opinions to themselves. They didn't even have the strength to protest. They needed some time in order to make a complaint. 
Ophelia wasn't planning on standing by and watching them protest, but she wasn't going to pick on someone either. In the end, the free city would belong to the House of Mammon. Oris probably realized that Ophelia was the House of Mammon's spirit before passing out based on the way she talked. I'll leave the free city up to you. Yong Ho wore a suit that he obtained at the last minute and spoke while getting on the horse. Ophelia spoke worriedly while her tail moved weakly. Is it really okay for you to start moving? Skull and the others may be okay since they're undead, but still. We don't have a lot of time. Yong Ho and Ophelia were standing in front of the gate. They haven't even finished cleaning up the corpses, but Yong Ho, Catalina, Skull and the other spirits were outside. He didn't have enough time. If Agars died, that meant that the spirits of the dungeons that were under Agars's control had died as well. No matter how many soldiers Agars had, they probably noticed that he had died. The other owners in the east may have realized that there were changes going on in Agars's dungeon. While consuming Agars's spirit, there were a few things that Yong Ho realized. Agars was an actual predator. The reason why he was able to gather a thousand soldiers was because he emptied the dungeons after he took them over. It was impossible to take all the dungeons that were under his control. But he could at least take the two dungeons that were near the free city. Things had already been delayed. He had to move now. I'm fine. Ophelia looked at Catalina worriedly, so she spoke to both Ophelia and Yong Ho. Just like Yong Ho, she was exhausted after continuously fighting, but that didn't mean she was going to fall behind. Catalina was Yong Ho's personal guard. Salami worked the hardest and despite letting a small cry, no one heard it. Yong Ho and Catalina got on Salami's back. Skull laughed while petting Nightmare's mane and the Skull unit didn't look tired at all as they waited for everyone to start heading out. Yong Ho spoke, and Ophelia gave up in the end. She showed respect by seeing him off. S. Daughter, Ophelia will gladly wait for your return, Master. Salami flapped his wings and flew towards the east. Nightmare started to gallop. The Skull unit closely followed their leader. Ophelia, who was now alone, brushed back her gold hair. She looked at the House of Mammon spirits who were heading to the east. She recalled the face her father made when he shouted that the House of Mammon was going to be revived. Chapter, 92 Yong Ho's first stop was the dungeon of the House of A. Lee. It was a natural choice because it was only two days away from the free city. If he moved quickly, it would be possible to get there even sooner. Acquiring the dungeon was much easier than he had expected. Since it was the starting point for the mobilization of his army, Agars had completely emptied A. Lee's dungeon. The few troops left behind by Agars, had all seemed to have fled after noticing Agars's demise. Agars was a natural predator. He literally devoured the fallen king of the dungeon, and was the object of terror to those who had surrendered. Moreover, the traces left in the dungeon of A. Lee indicated that not only was the king devoured by Agars, but some of his servants were as well. Except for the insect-type spirits, who basically acted as his limbs, the rest of the spirits that followed him were dominated by fear. The source of that fear was now gone, so it was quite natural for them to escape. That wasn't the only good news. Not only were there no spirits, but the dungeon was void of traps as well. All that remained were the wreckages of broken traps. They were probably traps that Agars had destroyed in the process of devouring the house of Ailey. Agars did not restore the traps, and instead only used the dungeon of A. Lee as a place to rest. There were no spirits, and no traps. In the end, it was only the complexity of the structure of the dungeon that impeded Yong Ho's movement, but that was no hindrance to the power of greed. The only issue was that the heart of the dungeon of A. Lee was in a severe state. The dungeon wasn't the only thing that had suffered a severe wound, the heart looked like it had been mutilated by the teeth of an animal. Yong Ho extracted the mana from the heart of the A. Lee's dungeon, and then wrapped it in cold mana and stored it in his pocket. It was not that he didn't covet the mana of the dungeon's heart, but he decided it would be better to give it to Lucia. Lucia still hadn't obtained full control over the first floor of Mammon's dungeon. In order to acquire the legacy left by Mammon, it was important for Lucia to grow Lucia to gain control of the lower floors. After resting for half a day in A. Lee's dungeon, Yong Ho then headed straight to the next dungeon. 
judging from the state of the Aeolis dungeon, the other dungeons under Agar's control were likely in a similar position. If the other owners in the east had noticed Agar's death then they too would have probably have entered the dungeons, just like Yongho had done. Nightmare, who was carrying Skull, hid its tiredness and pretended to remain strong, which also caused Salami to stop groaning as well. The next dungeon that Yongho arrived at after the house of A. Li, was the house of Yubing. Just like A. Li's dungeon, Yongho quickly acquired Yubing's dungeon in the same fashion. Unlike A. Li's dungeon, there were a few insect monsters left, but in front of the elite of the Mammon family, they were equivalent to just scraps of firewood. After extracting the mana from the heart of Yubing's dungeon, Yongho had a brief moment of conflict. He was greedy. Could he take a third dungeon? If they strained themselves a little more, then he would be able to collect even more mana. Greed arose. Although it didn't ask Yong Ho to choose, it mirrored his deepest desires. He wanted to consume. He wanted to possess. Yong Ho closed his eyes and took a deep breath. He tamed his greed. He suppressed his desires. It was too much. They were already exhausted from days of traveling. It had already been three days since Agarza's death. It would take more than two days to travel to the next nearest dungeon, so by the time he would arrive at the third dungeon, it would be far more likely that they would have to face other forces, besides Agarza's remaining troops. Yongho thought of the map of the empty southern region inside his head. It seemed that by visiting Yubing's dungeon, they were already outside of the south and now inside the eastern zone of the empty southern region. It was right to go back. Didn't Citri say that unrestrained desire wasn't true greed? Yongho asked Salami with his eyes to hold for a bit longer and return to the A. Li's dungeon. After a sufficient rest at A. Li's dungeon, they would then head back to the free city. An hour after they arrived at A. Li's dungeon, Yongho gathered the remaining furniture in the dungeon's entrance room and invoked the power of evolution while watching the burning bonfire. Some of the members of Skull's squad had filled their evolutionary rate. It was a natural result considering that they had fought some of the most intense battles in the Free City. The only disappointment was that Skull himself, who had fought incredibly valiantly, had only half filled his evolutionary rate. However, that was most likely because Skull had already benefited the most from the power of evolution amongst all the spirits of the House of Mammon. In games, the higher the level that one achieved, the slower it would then take one to grow again. It's still a pity though. The promotion rank after the Skeleton Magic Knight had still not been revealed. Perhaps he would have to evolve him in a specific direction. Maybe he had to strengthen his mana or increase his physical ability like before. It was painful, yet exciting worry. Yong Ho then turned his attention to the Skull Squad's transportation. Just like their riders, the horses had filled their evolutionary rate. Feeling the importance of endurance from their long march, Yongho evolved the stamina of all five of them. And finally, the long-awaited highlight, Nightmare. From now on, you shall be named Bucephalus. He was going to give Skull the opportunity to give it a name, but that seemed a bit difficult. At the current rate, it would have been named either Skull, Skull or Skull. Of course, the Nightmare didn't know of the origin of the name, Bucephalus, the legendary horse of Alexander the Great, but regardless it still gave out a pleasant whinny, as if she liked like the name very much. Name, Bucephalus Female. Race, Nightmare. Attributes, Darkness Level 1. Individual Trait. Proud. Individual Skills. Stamina Slash Agility. Evolution Rate, 100 Slash 100. Stamina Level 1 2. 5. Strength Level 1 2. Toughness level 1 2. Agility level 0 2. 5. Mana level 1 1. 5. Available promotions. Nightmare attack type slash nightmare agility type slash nightmare mana type. Yong Ho raised his hand towards the window of light and then called Skull after thinking for a moment. Yong Ho expressed his intention to Skull as concisely and simply as possible. Which one do you want me to evolve? Skull answered immediately, with a single concern. How to interpret Skull's answer could have been a problem, but Yong Ho immediately understood Skull's wish. That was only possible because of the bond between spirit and owner. 
Yonho evolved Bucephalus into the attack type. Like Salami, Bucephalus evolved to be quite large, but she was still a mare so that her body retained her beautiful curves. She looked more like an armored tank from science fiction rather than an armored vehicle. After completing her evolution, Bucephalus looked back at Salami, and gave out a pleasant snort, as if she was smirking. Salami gave out a low growl in response and then looked at Yongho with sparkling eyes. He seemed to want another evolution. However, it was too soon. Yongho stoked Salami's snout, although he had grown bigger he also looked more cute. Yongho then called Catalina. Catalina was Yongho's personal guard, so she had participated in every battle he had, except for the arena. Thanks to her outstanding performance in the recent battle, Catalina had filled her evolutionary rate. Yongho allowed Catalina to choose her evolutionary route just as he had done for Skull. However unlike Skull, Catalina was able to clearly express her desire. I would like to increase my specialization in mana. Catalina was able to wield dark mana after evolving into a shadow runner. This time she didn't desire to be faster, but instead she desired to be able to better weird her newly acquired powers. Yongho also agreed with Catalina's wish because he thought, from the battle with Agars, that it was essential to increase her offensive power. Okay, close your eyes and relax. You've done this countless times before, so you already know how this works. Of course. Catalina knelt down in front of Yongho and gently closed her eyes. As he was looking at Catalina, Yongho suddenly noticed her long protruding ears. Her ears were fluttering so fast, that it looked like she was about to fly away. Yongho unknowingly grabbed her eyes without thinking. Catalina flinched in surprise, but she didn't open her eyes. Lord, I think I'll get addicted to this feeling. The texture of her ears in his grasp was truly a strange feeling. Yongho closed his eyes, and chanted the Heart Sutra, which he had picked up from somewhere. He invoked the power of evolution. It's done. Yongho spoke, and let go of Catalina's ears. Fortunately, Catalina was distracted by her sudden increase in mana so she didn't mention anything about her ears. Her ears fluttered as she began to examine her dark mana. But, it was too early for him to feel relieved. Yongho quickly brought up another topic as soon as Catalina finished checking her mana. By the way. If one were to absorb the mana from the heart of the dungeon, the dungeon itself would die, right? So would the dungeon continue to shrink until it disappeared? Do dungeons occur naturally in nature? At Yongho's question, Catalina's eyes looked up as if she was searching her memories for an answer. Just as you said, dungeons do occur naturally. But infant dungeons are usually very small and fragile at birth. So they would probably soon die, without the proper care of an owner. After Catalina mentioned an infant dungeon, Yongho thought of Lucia. Catalina continued to talk. Other than that, I've heard that, very occasionally, the dungeon market will sell something like the seed of a dungeon. Perhaps, it's more accurate to call it an artificial dungeon. I've heard that they can be quite powerful, but I also heard that they're incredibly expensive. Apparently they're hard to produce en masse. It was quite an intriguing story. If it wasn't for the current turbulent times, then it would be unlikely for a dungeon to die. So it seemed that the natural cycle of the birth and death of dungeons was roughly equal. Catalina currently wore a cool expression, as if she was satisfied with the fact that she had answered well. Yongho smiled and looked again at Catalina's ears. He then noticed her wagging tail. He suddenly asked without knowing. Hey Catalina. Could I touch your tail? Catalina's expression once again took on a dynamic change. While Yongho was in danger of falling into a new addition, Ophelia was calmly peeling an apple with a calm expression. She was currently inside the hospital, the only medical facility in the free city and the home of the mad Oris. The room that they were in was quiet. Oris lay on the bed and didn't say a word, while Ophelia quietly devoted herself to peeling apples. The peeling sound of the apple apple amplified the silence instead of abating it. How long has it been? Ophelia took a bite of her freshly shaven apple, which caused Oris to open his eyes. He looked up at the ceiling, instead of towards Ophelia and broke the silence. When was it? It was an endlessly open question, but Ophelia understood. 
The mad Oris was a wise author from the days of old. So Ophelia answered him in a gentle manner. Since the first visit to the free city by the house of Mammon. You know that my house was originally in servitude to the Mammon family, right? Opelia's father, Endelion, didn't hide his title. Oris exhaled a long breath. I knew that. But I didn't think that you would serve the Mammon family again like that so soon. It was impossible. No, you're right. At first, I didn't have the slightest intention of serving under his command. If I hadn't been completely overwhelmed by his pressure then the story would have been quite different. Ophelia happily smiled. Oris rolled his eyes, as he looked at the Ophelia before him. I don't think Dargan's death was within your calculations. Dargan died valiantly. However it's true that I did consider that after the fight I would have to devote the free city to the House of Mammon. Yes, I was planning on asking the House of Mammon for help. Ophelia did not deny it. She acted coolly, so he wouldn't get angry. No, perhaps it's because I'm also quite positive about the situation. The moment that Agars decided to invade the free city, everything was already set in motion. This was just a natural step. The master will be back soon. Then the free city will become the territory of the Mammon family. You're already got everything prepared, I guess. The fact that you and I are having a private meeting like this proves that everything is true. No matter how much friendship they had built over the past decade or so, the bar hostess and the guild leader had always been hostile to each other. However, Ophelia was now facing the defenseless Oris, one on one. It would have been an impossible scenario unless Ophelia had not already taken over the guild. What about the outlaws? They give in to strength. The problem will be solved as soon as the master returns. There may be a few who rebel to the end but it won't be a big deal. Ophelia cut the apple. She placed a piece into her mouth and looked at Oris. She began to talk slowly. Become a spirit of the house of Mammon. Just because the free city will be under the ownership of the Mammon family, doesn't make much of a difference. Will he agree? Ophelia's suggestion was to turn the wolf into a hound. Oris laughed bitterly. What if I refuse? Don't. I don't want to lose you after Dargan. Ophelia appeared friendly and determined. Oris once again let out a laugh. Embryo is coming. Yes, that's right. The Western owners are united against him, but perhaps he'll win. We're going to have to fight him. Do you think the Mammon family can win? Ophelia smiled gracefully at the provocative question. No more questions or answer were necessary. Two days later. The mad Oris greeted Yong Ho alongside Ophelia. He became a spirit of the House of Mammon. Chapter, 93 The sight of the free city had not changed much. Many had been killed or injured, walls needed to be repaired, but that didn't change the color of the free city itself. Yong Ho had recently registered the mad Oris as a dungeon spirit and was now facing Ophelia in the pub. He wanted to receive not only the status of the free city but also information regarding the movements of the neighboring dungeons. Of course, he also needed to share what he had personally seen and heard, and especially what he had received in his travels. The free city is quickly being cleaned up. Not that Oris has registered as one of your spirits, it's no exaggeration to say that the free city is now the territory of the House of Mammon. However, not everyone knows this yet, and I don't think that it's necessary to publish this information right now either. Isn't it really important? Yes, I suppose it will be okay if we announce it later. Ophelia smiled and offered Yong Ho a cocktail. There were many reasons why the mad Oris joined them. Ophelia was the leader of one of the three factions. To take complete control of the city, she needed the help of Oris, the leader of one of the other three factions. Furthermore, Oris was a competent man. He was a doctor, an alchemist and an outstanding pharmacist. One more reason was that Ophelia didn't wish to kill Oris. What would happen if she let Oris live and he left the free city? There would be members of the guild who would inevitably want to follow him. After letting people leave one by one, the free city would end up as a shell of its former self. The guild was a vital part of the free city, especially at a time when the outlaws were expected to leave following Dargan's death. Of course, 
it wouldn't matter if they had time on their side. There were enough people traveling to the free city to allow them to eventually rebuild the city's power. But there simply wasn't enough time. Like water rising from underfoot, an inevitable danger was quickly approaching. It seems that battle has begun in the west of the region. The wolf demon, Embryo, has clashed with the Western Owners' Alliance. A long war would typically be expected, but this is Embryo, who we know has been making aggressive moves. We don't know what variables are in play. While listening to Ophelia's explanation, Yong Ho carefully looked at the map of the southern region. Unlike the other forces that had clashed with Embryo, the Western Owners' Alliance wasn't just fighting in a single field. They understood that their strength lay in numbers, and had expanded out their front. It was impossible for Embryo to appear in every battle. Even if they lost to Embryo in one battle, they could win in another. In a way, this was a war of attrition. And if it truly was a war of attrition, then Embryo, who had fought repeatedly in recent battles, couldn't help but be at a disadvantage. Is there any chance that Embryo will lose? It exists. And that would be a much better outcome for us. But I'm not sure. With all due respect Embryo's actions somewhat resemble your own. Yong Ho tilted his head in confusion. Ophelia laughed bitterly. Because, despite the odds, he's winning every fight with overwhelming power. Yong Ho didn't immediately respond to Ophelia's sudden flattery. Ophelia liked that Yong Ho would sometimes show a soft side. She felt that it was a sign of his humanity. Considering the length of time that you've been the owner of Mammon's dungeon, and what you've accomplished then I'm not wrong. And we always have to assume the worst. The worst scenario I can imagine is that Embryo defeats the Western Owners Alliance and still has the power to hit the South. Yong Ho nodded. It was an inhumane thought, but the longer the war, the better. The greater the damage between the two sides, the better it was for Yong Ho. Now, let's talk about the threats nearby. Some of the outlaws have noticed a change in the free city. And some are even trying to stage armed protests without prior notice. Is it serious? If Oris hadn't joined use, then it would have been quite a problem but not anymore. I should be able to handle it on my own. Ophelia smiled with fierce eyes. However, Yong Ho liked how she looked. Yong Ho pleasantly replied. You're also outstanding. Thank you. Skull, who was standing in the background, suddenly let out a laugh at the warm atmosphere and Catalina smiled softly. Ophelia only had one item left to report. Jung Saros's daughter seems to be extremely anxious. Although she doesn't yet know that the free city is in the hands of the House of Mammon, however the results of the battle with Agars are enough to scare her. If we just leave her be, then there's a high likelihood that she'll surrender to whoever comes down south, whether it's the Western Owners Alliance or Embryo. Didn't you say that she wasn't the type to surrender? She can't just die. Moreover, the divisions within her household are accelerating. Yong Ho nodded. The dungeon of the House of Jung Saros was quite far from the House of Mammon, but not the Free City. Yong Ho had been so active in the Battle of the Free City, that she was right to be afraid. I think it's time to consider staging a dungeon attack. Of course not immediately. But that didn't mean that it wouldn't be soon. So far, Yong Ho had experienced several dungeon battles, but he had never actually attacked a properly guarded dungeon. The fight against Jung Saros's daughter would be the first. When Ophelia's report was over, Yong Ho briefly told her what happened during his journey to the east. Ophelia had already confirmed the evolution of Salami, Bucephala's and Skull's squad and was now envious of Catalina's development. She wanted to evolve, too. She also wanted to become stronger. Yong Ho wasn't sure if it was because she was mistress of the pub, but Ophelia seemed to have many different faces. One moment she was a dignified woman, now she looked like a little girl. He recalled an image he had seen on the internet once of a boy staring at a trumpet through a glass window. Shall we? Ophelia? Can I? Are you able to evolve me? Ophelia asked like a little girl. Yong Ho nodded Ophelia had fought two battles after joining the House of Mammon, and had trained with Eliger dozens of times, which one could interpret as picking on the elderly. Although Ophelia's evolution rate had slowly increased, it was now full. What do you want to specialize in? 
Uh, wait for a moment. Let me think about it. Skull laughed as Ophelia visibly became excited. However Catalina looked a little strange. She alternated her gaze between Yongho's and Ophelia's hands with widened eyes. Her lips clenched. Yongho felt her gaze. But why? Perhaps she found it exciting watching from an outside perspective. Yongho bit his lip and endured his laughter. He looked at Ophelia, who had only just made her decision. It would be fun to ask if I could touch her tail. Yongho shook his head. He spoke to Ophelia, whose head was tilted in confusion, and Catalina, who was focusing on them with outstretched ears. Let's begin. Close your eyes. Ophelia closed her eyes, and Catalina focused even more. Yongho looked at Ophelia's tail for a moment and reached out his hands. He placed his hands on her shoulders and injected his mana. He invoked Ophelia's evolution. Give my regards to Brother Eliger. Ophelia had evolved with mana specialization and was now seeing Yongho off. Yongho smiled at her affectionate eyes and voice. He wanted to stay in the free city for a few more days, but he couldn't. He had to go back to the House of Mammon. He had to reassure Eliger, who was waiting for his return, and also evolve Lucia. Furthermore if Yongho continued to stay in the free city, there was the possibility that Jung Saros's daughter would die of a nervous breakdown or make an extreme decision. The former didn't matter, but the latter did. The mad Oris had already made up his mind, and didn't have an uneasy attitude in front of Yongho. Yongho let go of his worries about Oris because he knew that the talented Ophelia would remain at his side. Yongho left the free city and headed back to the House of Mammon. Perhaps because of the thought of going back home, he seemed rather light-footed. The dungeon meerkats, which had evolved into high meerkats, were now able to observe from longer distances than before. After earlier finding out of Yongho's return, Eliger came out to meet him with the rest of the spirits. Yongho was pleased to see all of the spirits greeting him. Yongho felt that he really had returned while facing Eliger, who now resembled more of a middle-aged man rather than an elderly butler. The goblin rangers and Spot admired Salami, who had evolved once again, with widened eyes. While the princess ant, who was always accompanied by Spot, stared at Bucephalus with glistening eyes. She looked just like a cute girl, perhaps because of the dress she was wearing that Catalina had worn as a child. Meanwhile Rykum and the orcs eagerly inquired about the battle in the free city. However, Skull's squad couldn't talk, and all Skull could say was Skull. Yongho and Catalina were the only ones that could satiate their curiosity, so they sent pleading eyes to Catalina, who was quite easygoing. Yongho allowed Catalina a short break to reunite with the other spirits, however that was exactly what she didn't want as she was dragged away by the orcs, led by Rykum. Yongho, instead brought along Skull as he headed to the heart of the dungeon. On the way, Lucia made repeated coups and cheers. I've missed you so much. Master. Lucia cried out, as soon as Yongho entered the heart of the dungeon. He couldn't see her, but her voice was enough. Yongho stroked the dungeon's heart as if he was patting her head and then took out the mana from both A. Lee's and Yubing's dungeons. Lucia, as always, expressed her feelings with onomatopoeias. Gulp gulp. I'm salivating. Yongho understood why the expression spoilt daughter existed. While laughing, Yongho injected the mana into the dungeon's heart, the body of Lucia. Lucia shuddered with excitement. Yongho could feel her soul tremble. The mana of the dungeon has rapidly increased. The dungeon's control is now much stronger. A larger area can now be controlled. A new area has been detected. I only know that it exists, but the area is underground. I can feel the presence of an underground floor. There is even more space on the underground floor than the first floor. Ah! It's so delicious. It's now possible to upgrade existing facilities. I think we can start building a space door now. Master is the best. There was some mixed personal feeling in Lucia's report, but it really was great news. In particular, the last piece of news shook Yongho's heart. Are you saying that we can start construction of the space door now? Yes, master. Enough mana has been gathered. 
We don't have the right materials yet, and construction will take a while, but it's still possible. Yong Ho's happiness was also Lucia's happiness. He tightly clenched his fist. After that pleasant surprise, he once again stroked the dungeon's heart. Well done. You've done really well, Lucia. He he he. Let's get started right away. I'll transfer some of the spirits involved in other construction work. Please give me permission. While acting a little silly, Lucia projected a window of light in front of Yong Ho's eyes. It was a list of the spirits in construction and a report on what they were currently doing. Yong Ho quickly reviewed the information and signed the permission. Lucia spoke again. Since you've been away for such a long time, I recommended that you should take a really long rest. Only for today. Are you going right back to work tomorrow? You should rest for a little longer. Are you planning on visiting the arena or exploring the second floor? If it's the latter, I can prepare some of the spirits to accompany you. At Lucia's question, Yong Ho shook his head. He wasn't planning on doing either. There's a place I have to go. When Yong Ho spoke, Lucia immediately understood where that place was. My valuable customer, how can I help you today? Chapter, 94 My dearest customer, how can I help you today? As soon as Yong Ho entered the virtual space of the dungeon market, he heard a voice. As he opened his eyes, Citri greeted him with a bright smile as usual. It was something he experienced every time he saw her, but it truly was stunningly beautiful. Catalina and Ophelia were also beautiful, but they seemed different. While the two of them still felt like people, Citri had the feeling of some sort of mystical being, like an angel or a goddess, rather than a person. Like a masterpiece or a sculpture created by a master in the pursuit of perfect beauty. But there was natural emotions and expressions added to it. Yong Ho stared at Citri for a moment, and Citri tilted her head in response to Yong Ho's slightly different gaze. My dearest customer. It's been a long time. He responded with a smile. Citri tilted her head again, but only for a moment. She then immediately smiled again and waved her finger. A chair for Yong Ho rose from the floor. There was quite a distance between Yong Ho and Citri. It was close enough to easily allow a conversation, but it wasn't enough to enable them to reach each other. So Yong Ho was able to see Citri's full body in front of him. Not just her, but the pure white world that she had created. It was because of Gus Ion. His conversation with Gus Ion had given him quite a different perspective. Yong Ho consciously buried himself a little more into the back of the chair. Yuzhen's voice and expression, when talking about Citri, rang in his head. If she had or if she'd done it a little better he might not have died. The number of feelings contained within Yuzhen's words were uncountable. Anger, sorrow, pain and hatred were all mixed within a single terrifying emotion. Why was Mammon, the king of greed, dead? Why did he suddenly disappear? It's too early. It would be better if you never had to know. Gus Ion then became silent. He added a few words about Citri, but he didn't mention again about Mammon's death. Gus Ion said that Citri was one of Mammon's women. But it was never that simple. She was one of the two people who could say that they received Mammon's true love. The other, of course, was Elun, the one who cut the night. I'm not going to hurt you. It sounds strange but you are the successor. The true successor who has emerged after more than a thousand years. That was what Gus Ion had said. Yong Ho woke up from his thoughts and blinked. He almost screamed when he saw how close Citri's face was. He could almost feel her breath. My dearest customer. Are you sick? I don't think that you have a fever. Citri raised her hand naturally and touched Yong Ho's forehead. It was an indescribable touch. Yong Ho controlled his breathing. He attempted to keep a straight face as he spoke. I'm a little tired. Here's a list of items that I would like to buy. Citri squinted her eyes as if she was slightly suspicious, but she accepted the document of light that Yong Ho had formed in the air. Citri sat down further away to a more suitable distance and reviewed the document of light. Interesting. The purchase list contained the names of various spirits and materials. 
Among them, Citri was particularly interested in the materials required to construct the space gate. Are you planning to construct a space gate? Yes, Kaiwan first started to build it. I'm going to finish it. Hmm. Citri turned her attention back to the document. Yongho looked at Citri and began to think. Why did Kaiwan try to build a space gate? It took an enormous amount of mana and a considerable amount of material to create it. Yongho himself wanted the space gate because he needed to return to Inji, but what was Kaiwan's reason? By the way, Citri opened her lips again. She asked with a subtle knowing smile. Do you clearly know how the space gate works? What? Yongho asked unknowingly. Instead of immediately answering, Citri just expressed that she knew something. The space gate that Yongho knew was a two way connection between two places. It was a passageway to return to Inji, Yongho's hometown. A device that can freely create doors in space, which Catalina and Eliger previously opened incompletely. Don't look like that. If you complete the space gate, you'll be able to open a door back to Inji. But, it's a little tougher than you might think. Citri waved her hand. One of the items in the document of light expanded and spread out within the air. This material is currently not in stock in the southern branch. Although, I think there's some extra in my private warehouse, but it's my own private collection. Yongho's mind felt complicated. Was it because of what Citri had said, about the supply of materials? It wasn't. It was about something else she had said. And also what he had said. Yongho stretched his shoulders. Is there anything that you want from me? Citri smiled brightly. Then, once again, narrowed the distance between them and spoke. Tell me. What happened in a free city? I heard that you defeated Agars. Citri was interested in Yongho himself. There was always a deep goodwill in her eyes. Was it because, as Gusayan had said, that Yongho was Mammon's true successor? I don't know anything else, but it's clear that she was in love with Master. At least I believe so. That's what Alun had said. Yongho recalled Gyujin's voice again and then closed and opened his eyes. He began to talk about his experiences in the free city as lightly as possible. Citri was a good listener. She always gave a good response when it was required. Yongho seemed to be skilled at bringing the story to life. That's how it happened. After finishing the story, Yongho exhaled a long breath. Although all he had done was talk, he now felt very tired. Citri showed a gentle smile. Instead of expressing her thoughts, she buried herself deeply into her chair and for a moment her lips parted and smiled like a young girl. I think we should keep our last promise. Do you remember what I said last time? Where I said that you should experience more of the world. He couldn't forget it. Yongho nodded. You mean the auction house? Yes, the auction house. A gathering place for many powerful people. There's an auction two days later, so the timing is great. What do you think? Would you like to participate? Citri's beauty always caused him to be nervously tense, so he didn't immediately accept. He felt a bit out of shape, but he asked what it would take. Is there anything like an entry fee? An amount that should be paid to the auction house in advance. He asked since he had once read about an high-end auction house from a novel when he was younger. Citri laughed loudly. There is, but I'll exempt you. That's what I promised. From what you're saying, I presume you've accepted. Citri stood up from her seat. She lowered herself in front of Yongho's knees. She looked up at him and asked. To the master of the great house of Mammon, would you give me the honor of placing my lips to the back of your hand? Although the typical position of man and woman had changed, Yongho quickly reached out the back of his hand. Citri gently held Yongho's fingertips and placed her lips on the back of his hand. The softness of her lips felt like melting snow, quickly followed by a dizzying heat. Think of it as an admission ticket. It's your first time, so I'll escort you. A pay red crest appeared on the back of Yongho's hand. It was the familiar symbol of the dungeon market. One person can accompany you. I'll you up at night in two days' time, so I'll see you then. I'll also ship your order. Citri went back to her seat. 
and as if it were a sign, the whole white world around him collapsed. The connection to the virtual space had been lost. Just as he promised to Lucia, Yong Ho took a rest. However, it was only one day in fact, just half a day. As soon as the next morning dawned, Yong Ho began to start the work that he had postponed. Perhaps because of the trouble with the orcs, who were led by Rikam all day, or simply due to his current low blood pressure, he began to meet with all the ministers along with Catalina, who had started to doze off. The purpose of these meetings were listen to the grievances and hardships of each spirit and improve their working conditions, but the main purpose was different. It was the evolution of the spirits. Yong Ho didn't just value Skull and the other main combat spirits. The spirits guarding the dungeon such as Rikam, the orcs and the Treant were also very precious to him. Without the Golden Rangers and Burgrim, Manon's dungeon wouldn't be able to operate as efficiently. While Yong Ho advanced his evolution rate through warfare, the spirits who remained in the dungeon also increased their evolution rate in their own way. For the spirits of the House of Mammon, training at the spirit's training ground was now routine. Among the spirits, the Goblin Rangers, who were now considered the seniors, had evolved to take advantage of their strengths. John had strength, Ron had stamina, Jan had agility and June had her intellect. It had been proven time and time again that the power of evolution had a certain amount of power to change aspects of one's appearance. The goblin rangers differed from the usual hobgoblins. Not just their face, but their actual body shape now resembled more like a human. Rikam and the other orcs also benefited from the power of evolution. Unlike the other orcs, Rikam specialized in endurance. If Rikam were continued to grow, he might evolve into an orc emperor, the top orc warrior. It took Yong Ho a long time to meet each spirit. H. Ice Mana also wasn't an infinite resource, so he was eager to rest. However, he couldn't just that he was done for the day, especially with faced with earnest look of his spirits. It was now Burgrim's turn. After the orcs evolved, he had been waiting for his turn with longing eyes, and he now finally stood in front of Yong Ho. He was nervous, but his face was hardened. Lucia whispered to Yong Ho. Since his first evolution, he has been devoted to his work. Currently, there is not a single thing within Mammon's dungeon that hasn't been touched by his hands. He almost lived within the training grounds. Yong Ho understood why Burgrim was so nervous. Only Yong Ho himself could see the evolution rate. From Burgrim's position, it wasn't possible to know how much his evolution rate had progressed and how long it would take to fill up. It was best for him to just continue to train and work in silence. How frustrating and irritable it must have been. Still, it was a relief. Burgrim's evolution rate was now completely full. Yong Ho spoke to Burgrim. Well done. Close your eyes and stand still. Burgrim had been watching the meetings from behind all this time. Burgrim tightly closed his eyes and gulped. Yong Ho placed his hand on Burgrim's forehead and invoked the power of evolution. Once again, he evolved the mana attribute. Suddenly, there was a reaction. Yong Ho felt Burgrim's mana. It was very small but it was clearly pulsating. Burgrim's mana pool had been reborn. Burgrim also felt it. He began to shed tears unknowingly. It was a feeling that he had thought he would never feel again. But now he felt it. It felt like a light in the darkness, although it was small, it was like a dazzling star. Burgrim knelt on the floor. He kowtowed to Yong Ho several times in a row. Yong Ho raised him up. He ordered him to go back and rest since he was currently overwhelmed with emotion. Now we can create magical equipment. Congratulations, Master. It was as Lucia had said. However, Yong Ho didn't feel much joy in that fact. It was because now that Burgrim had recovered his mana, he had now regained his purpose in life, which caused Yong Ho to feel far more profound. Yong Ho happily sat down on his throne. He then began to talk with Yuria and Spot, who approached him after being surprised by the weeping Burgrim. The evolution of Spot was simple, but Yuria's evolution was not so easy. This was because he wanted to give her the characteristics absorbed by Agars. In the end, Yong Ho couldn't help but have a break. And by the evening. With the last spirit in front of him, Yong Ho finally had a smile on his face. Ah uh, master. 
Elijah faced Yong Ho's smile with shaking eyes. Unlike the other spirits, Yong Ho didn't have to wonder how to evolve Elijah. After evolving into the red demon beast, Elijah had also worked hard. Even in the absence of Ophelia, he had continually cultivated his martial arts. Yong Ho spoke with a natural expression. Elijah's evolution route was set out by Ophelia. You want to evolve your stamina. You're still weak in your lower back and lower body. Oh, and Ophelia says hello. There wasn't any choice. Elijah fondly remembered Ophelia, who had first twisted his arm and then kindly called him brother he gently closed his eyes and accepted the power of evolution. Another day had passed. For the first time since absorbing Agar's spirit, Yong Ho, who had exhausted all his mana, slept in. While Catalina, who had also overslept, rejoiced in her bliss. There was no exaggeration to say that the person to accompany Yong Ho to the auction house had been decided from the beginning. Yong Ho, who was dressed in a sharp demon suit, one of the few heirlooms of the Mammon family, looked around. Just like when he had first met her, Catalina wore a beautiful dress and tried to look cool, as if she was attempting to go back to that time. People from the dungeon market have arrived in front of the dungeon's entrance. It was the news they were waiting for. Yong Ho, who was already waiting in the entrance room, took a deep breath. He looked around at Catalina again. Shall we go? Yes, master. As Yong Ho waved his hand, Lucia opened the entrance to the dungeon. They were greeted with the spilling moonlight. Just as it was a long time ago, in the age of the King of Greed. Chapter, 95 The night sky of the demon world was overwhelming in a different sense than the daytime. There wasn't a dazzling harmony of brilliant colors. Instead a heavy blue, close to black, covered the sky. The darkness looked as if it was made to be cold and heavy. The horizon couldn't be distinguished, as the darkness melted from the heavens to the earth. Starlight cascaded down. And beyond, the white moon shone. The moon was brighter in the dark. However, it never pushed the darkness away. The moonlight was in harmony with the darkness, as it conveyed warmth in the coolness of the dark. And now they stood under such moonlight. Yong Ho now understood what it was like to be breathless, even though it was just for a moment. Citri was beautiful enough to disturb someone's mind, even if they had a clear mindset. It seemed that Citri knew this and purposely cultivated her own beauty. Moreover, she now stood under the dazzling moonlight. Catalina wasn't that much different from Yong Ho. The fact that she was a woman didn't matter. Citri smiled gently as she met them. Her naturally flowing white dress was reminiscent of a moon goddess. Time froze. There was power in Citri's beauty. However, there was one that kept calm even amidst the still time. There was one who was not dazzled by the beauty of Citri, but merely looked calmly at it. Amun. Citri spoke with her eyes. Amun didn't respond. His body was currently in the form of a bracelet on Yong Ho's right arm. Mammon's twelve spirits each had different feelings for Citri. For Ilun, the one who cuts the night, it was a love-hate relationship. For Gusayan, the strong, it was resentment. And for Amun, the red lotus demon lance, it was sympathy. His feelings were a mix of fondness and sadness. Citri still had a small smile, but it was cracked. Some of her deepest feelings, hidden within her heart, were revealed. However, her emotions only wavered ever so slightly. Citri's beauty was like the moonlight which conveniently covered her emotions, which in comparison were like fireflies. My dearest customer, it's time for our appointment. Her voice was gentle. Her red hair was slightly raised, so the curve of her white neck was clearly revealed. Yong Ho took a deep breath. He lightly held the stunned Catalina's frozen hand, and gave her a smile. He then gently pulled her hand and headed toward Citri. Citri looked at Yong Ho and Catalina with a warm expression. As they walked closer, she bowed gracefully and then waved her hand. She pulled two masks out of thin air and held them out to Yong Ho and Catalina. This is an anonymous auction. You don't have to wear it right now, but you'll have to wear it once you enter the venue. Yong Ho's mask was just a plain white mask with no shape or pattern, like the one from the Phantom of the Opera. It was cut off at the lower half, 
beneath the nose, exposing the mouth and chin. The mask that Catalina received also exposed the lower part of her nose, but it was rather colorful and looked like a butterfly. With rainbow colors harmoniously blending in with the large black wings. While Citri was giving an explanation to Yong Ho, other things were going on. The dungeon market courier, dressed in an all-white costume, delivered the package to Eliger. After looking down at his mask for a moment, Yong Ho looked back at Citri. He was curious about Citri's mask. Yong Ho didn't know where the auction was going to be held, how long it would take to get there or how he was going to get there. If Gus Ion hadn't told him that Citri was Mammon's woman, then he would have never accompanied her, no matter how good their relationship was. If you thought about it she's basically an old lady. It would be natural for someone to be stunned by that revelation, but it wasn't something that Yong Ho would mention. Yong Ho smiled unknowingly, and Citri tilted her head slightly in response. My dearest customer. It's nothing. He took a deep breath again. He remembered. Citri wasn't the guardian of the House of Mammon. She had ignored the two previous owners, and didn't provide any decisive help to Kaiwan. It was the same for Yong Ho. She did show him favoritism, but only through slightly indirect help. Of course, if he thought about things such as the mana recovery potions given to him by Citri, then it wasn't all small. However, when he fought Foras or Agars, Citri was just a bystander. All right, let's get started. We have a long way to go. Citri took a step back. And clapped her hands while looking at Yong Ho. Catalina was the first to notice something strange in the sky as she widely opened her mouth. Yong Ho also lightly exclaimed. A carriage began to descend from the night sky, amidst the moonlight. The white wagon was without a roof and looked incredibly beautiful, but Yong Ho and Catalina saw something other than the wagon. Dozens of cats running through the night sky. What Citri had prepared was a cat carriage. Freya, the goddess of magic and beauty, from northern European mythology, was said to have traveled through the night sky in a cat carriage to keep her promise with Odin. It was her mission to spread the seeds of chaos all over the world to create Einherjars, the warriors of the gods, for the last war. The cat carriage raced through the night sky. For Yong Ho this was a completely new experience because he had never flown through the night sky with Salami. Moonlight and starlight. Mana flowed through the blue darkness. The wind slapped his cheeks. The cat carriage was faster than Salami the starlight turned from a point into a line, and then soon became indistinguishable from the darkness. It wasn't physically fast. The cat carriage seemed to leap through space. In an instance it seemed to magically leap over a vast distance. When the starlight regained its shape, the cat carriage began its descent that seemed close to falling. The thrill, as if he was riding a roller coaster, caused his whole body to tighten up. Fortunately, it didn't last long. When they landed on the ground, Citri was the first one to step out of the cat carriage. Followed closely by Yong Ho and Catalina. As soon as the three of them got off, the surrounding landscape quickly transformed, while the cat carriage returned to the sky unnoticed. They had only taken a few steps before the place where they stood suddenly transformed from a white desert into a cozy wooden corridor. Despite the reality in front of him, Yong Ho felt like he was accessing the virtual space of the dungeon market. Citri took another few steps forward. She turned around in front of the door at the end of the hallway and faced Yong Ho, while wearing her own mask. Unlike Yong Ho and Catalina, her mask was in the shape of a lioness that covered her entire face. Beyond this door, is the auction house of the dungeon market, led by Samuel, the fastest wings, one of the five directors of the dungeon market. Please put on your mask. Yong Ho put on his mask, which helped to calm his agitated mind and was a symbol of anonymity. My dearest customer, didn't I tell you that I would let you experience greater things? The lioness mask completely obscured Citri's face. She grabbed the doorknob. Please, don't feel overwhelmed. The door opened with a pleasing sound. And then Yong Ho realized. The meaning of what Citri said about experiencing greater things. Beyond the door was a banquet hall for the giants. The moment the door opened, the air changed. Unbearable weight suffocated his whole body. It reflexively conjured up past memories. When he had first met Amun. 
when Amun and Gus Ion clashed with each other. However, this was different. This was a completely different kind of pressure from that time. It was like a whirlwind. Dozens of giant pools of mana collided and tangled together, creating a complex stream of mana. Not just one, but several. Forming a dense suffocating tightness. There was no such absoluteness from Amun. However, the mana was indifferent. The streams of mana seemed to be tanged up at random. Yong Ho attempted to draw out his mana. He tried to resist the raging mana. But, Citri shook her head, as if to say not to do that. For what reason? How come? Yong Ho clenched his teeth. And then he realized that Citri was just standing there naturally. And so were the many people behind the door. They didn't concentrate their mana. They just radiated it naturally. And their emanating mana tangled together created the current heaviness. Ophelia had previously said that four horns indicated the strength of one of the pillars of the southern region. However, if you talked about the whole demon world, then it was only enough to be slightly influential. It was ridiculous to compare the number of demons in the southern region to the number of demons that existed throughout the entire demon world. What kind of beings existed beyond his horizon? How many horns do they have? How much power do they possess? Yong Ho didn't forcefully draw out his mana. He accepted the weight. He endured and took another deep breath. Of course, it was still overwhelming. But, he tried to get used to it. He was not afraid of the new world before him. The real reason Citri had brought Yong Ho to the auction house. Was this. To remind him of the fact that skies exist beyond skies. To show Yong Ho what kind of world he would be venturing into in the future. The significance of this auction was the attendance itself. How much time has passed? Having just barely regained his ability to look around, Yong Ho heard harsh breathing coming from Catalina. The burden was heavy even for Yong Ho, who had four horns. The weight felt by Catalina, who had three horns, was several times greater. Catalina endured the pressure. It was thanks to Gus Ion. If she hadn't tasted Gus Ion overwhelming pressure in the arena, she would have likely passed out. Yong Ho grabbed Catalina's hand. Even in the midst of hardship, he shared his mana. Catalina's breath suddenly became calmer. Citri quietly looked at him. She then swept aside the magical curtain that obscured the beings beyond the door. Come this way. I'll show you to your seats. Citri did not protect Yong Ho and Catalina, as Amun had done. She took a turn and led them to their seats, while Yong Ho followed behind alongside Catalina to keep her from falling behind. The area beyond the door was magnificent. It reminded Yong Ho of a grand ballroom scene seen in movies. There was those who gathered together and chatted, while there were those who stood in secluded spots and quietly observed their surroundings. Citri walked slowly. Which allowed Yong Ho to be able to take a look around. Masks covered the faces of all of the participants. However, he knew that they were demons. There were many characteristics that could be used to identify an opponent, such as skin, body shape and unusual features. However, Yong Ho lacked any information in the first place. Instead of trying to forcibly identify clues, he could simply feel the participants and their natural aura. A few minutes had now passed since they had walked through the door. Yong Ho realized that the mana that filled the banquet hall wasn't natural. Most of the participants tightly controlled their mana. Concealing the color and attributes of one's mana was one of the very basics. Even the mana that was exhaled with their breathing had been finely tuned. No, that's not it. It was clear to Yong Ho that such coordination was almost entirely done at a subconscious level. Their level of mana control was unparalleled compared to the foes that Yong Ho had encountered before. This was true for all of the participants. When the door was first opened, an abnormal shock pierced Yong Ho's back. It took his breath away. Instead of controlling his breathing, he tried to control his mana. It was impossible to do it like the other attendees right now, but he tried anyway. He erased the color and attributes of his mana. However, he didn't forget to act in conjunction with Catalina's mana. Yong Ho felt like he was walking naked inside a storm. 
sweat began to secrete from his hand that was holding Catalina's. Time passed by extremely slowly. A single moment seemed to split into dozens or hundreds of equal lengths. And when he took a step forward, Yong Ho suddenly turned his head. It was an inexplicable impulse. Greed had guided his action, but it was different from usual. At the end of his gaze, a large man came into view. The man was also looking at Yong Ho, his face obscured with a terrifying ghost mask. As soon as Yong Ho turned his head their gazes instantly collided. The slow passage of time suddenly came to a standstill. The man was a considerable distance away, but it felt meaningless. Why? What did greed feel in that man? Dearest customer. This way. Citri's voice broke the frozen time. She didn't even look at the man. The moment Yong Ho heard Citri's voice, he was able to free himself from the man's gaze. Catalina spoke, and Yong Ho squeezed her hand once again in response. He smiled at the bottom of his mask, and followed Citri into the auction house. He could still feel the man's gaze. But Yong Ho didn't look back. A woman in a parrot mask called to the man wearing the ghost mask in a quiet voice. Instead of directly responding to the woman's call, the man in the ghost mask squinted his eyes. He was now picturing the small black-haired man, who was now out of sight. He was so inexperienced that he even struggled with the air of the auction house. But why? It bothered him. It wasn't just a hunch. Nothing. Let's go. The woman in the parrot mask looked perplexed at her master, but she soon regained her composure. She guided her master with a gentle gesture. One of the six kings who ruled the demon world. The king of gluttony took a step forward. Ladies and gentlemen. Let's begin today's auction. The first item for auction today is the champion of the world, Azrin. Chapter, 96. Ladies and gentlemen. Let's begin today's auction. The first item for sale is Azrin, the champion of the world. The inside of this auction house was like an opera house. There was a large stage in the center, with seats all around it. However, the shape of the seats was a little different from normal. There were clusters of two to four seats connected together, and gaps between each cluster. Is this an advancement of couple seats in theaters? Yong Ho briefly recalled a theater where he worked for a short time. It was similar but different. The auction house looked more akin to the end of year award ceremonies on TV. Citri led Yong Ho to a spot in the center of the hall. In that spot was a long sofa with a long table beside it, adorned with the number 27 foot dot. This man bravely attacked the dungeon of the King of Violence. Although the King of Violence showed mercy, the very fact that this man survived is a testament to his value. The auction continued while Yong Ho was looking for a seat. Citri silently sat on the left-hand side of the sofa, while Yong Ho, still holding Catalina's left hand with his right, hesitated for a moment before sitting beside her. Naturally, Catalina sat next to Yong Ho on the right side of the sofa. There was enough space between Yong Ho and Citri to fit another person. Which was quite a striking difference from Catalina who closely sat next to him. It seemed to naturally symbolize Yong Ho's distance from Citri, which had not yet been filled. Citri didn't mind, however, and Yong Ho, who had now sat down, was finally able to look at the stage. As a champion, he's got talents in many areas. He's a powerful prosecutor, a wizard and an outstanding tactician. He truly is a jack of all trades. Although he is excellent as he is, he'll still be able to perform satisfactorily even if you resurrect him as an undead. The auction was held by a man wearing an elephant mask. It was truly bizarre. Other than the mask, the only thing the man wore was a well-dressed suit, but for some reason he looked very attractive. It was the first time Yong Ho had ever felt this way about a man, rather than a woman, so he suddenly felt quite agitated. Whether Citri had been able to discern Yong Ho feelings or not, she spoke in a quiet voice. That's the incubus, Rod Caro. One of Samuel's henchmen. He's a dangerous person who can attract others subconsciously. Be careful, because his seduction works on both men and women. Citri finished talking with a smile. Yong Ho thought he could pay back Citri, but he decided not to mention it. Instead he focused on the auction again. 
The man in the elephant mask, the incubus Rod Carroll, stood next to the champion Azrin. He looked like an ordinary man in appearance. He had murky blonde hair, which was quite common, and was of an average size. Yong Ho examined the warrior more closely. He soon realized that his eyes were dead. It was as if his eyes had begun to decay. There was no light left in his gray eyes, which were now closer to black. It wasn't his figure or appearance that didn't match his fancy armor, it was his eyes. Yong Ho thought of Burgrim. He had lost all hope in life and was barely alive. Yong Ho fantasized what must have happened in his mind. He would not have attacked the king of violence alone, so he must have had companions. What happened to those companions? Had they all died? Was he in despair because he had been taken to this strange world and enslaved? That's it for the introduction. Let us now begin. The starting price is 5,000. It was enough money to purchase hundreds of lower class spirits. Yong Ho cleared away his useless delusions and looked at Azrin objectively. Even within this auction house, Yong Ho did not fight the surging tide of mana. He naturally invoked the power of evolution. Name, Azrin M. Race, Human. Strength level 4-3. Stamina level 4-3. Mana level 7-3. 5. Skill level 6-3. 5. Since he wasn't one of Yong Ho's spirits, he could only see a rough amount of information, but Yong Ho felt both admiration and disappointment. Azrin, the champion, was the highest level of existence that Yong Ho had examined to date. However, he didn't have much potential for evolution. Yong Ho suddenly turned to his side. Catalina's breath was calm. It was an incredibly quick adaptation, even despite Yong Ho's resonating mana. Yong Ho had four horns, while Catalina only had three. The difference was huge. If considering the absolute amount of mana possessed, it was clear that Catalina had less than half of Yong Ho's. Nevertheless, Catalina was able to successfully adapt to the flow of mana within the auction house. She protected herself by gently passing on the mana swirling around her. Come to think of it. Aside from Amon, who degraded himself, Catalina had by far the most potential out of all of Yong Ho's spirits. She had a potential of four stars, which even the warrior Azrin did not have, and even her lowest potential was three and half stars, which was comparable to Azrin. Catalina was a shiny gemstone. The beauty and value of the cut would be dependent on the method of cutting. Catalina noticed Yong Ho's gaze and asked him quietly. Yong Ho responded as if it was nothing and then lifted the power of evolution. The champion Azrin was auctioned off to a man wearing a dragon mask. The auction continued. Like Azrin, there were times when a person came up for sale, and there were also times when mysterious artifacts came up as well. Yong Ho enjoyed the auction in his own way. When people came up for sale, he examined their potential with the power of evolution, and when items came up, he evaluated them with the power of greed. It was important for him to expand his understanding of the world and fill in gaps in his knowledge. Time passed. The thirteenth item now came up to the stage. You may think of this as a short break. This is the cursed crown of Einkel. A small crown was placed on top of a cart pushed by a woman in a bunny mask. The crown, made out of pure metal, was not only worn but was also covered in damage, as if it had been poorly kept. Caro subsequently gave details about the crown. His explanation was so frivolous, that it felt like the only reason for it was for people to just have a break. Even the curse of the crown felt mischievous. However, Yong Ho swallowed dry saliva. Karo's explanation wasn't heard. Greed raised its voice. But, it was different from before. Greed had always been obsessed with value. It pointed Yong Ho to its desire. However, greed did not point to the crown. It stretched out its branches everywhere except for the crown. Nevertheless, Yong Ho felt a deep coveting feeling towards it. Greed was the same. It was saying that he needed to get his hands on the crown, even though it didn't stretch out its branches towards it. It was an unknown sensation. It had never been like this before. No, was that really the case? Had this sensation really never been felt before? There had been a similar sensation. 
but, that just made it even more incomprehensible. Just before entering the main auction house, he had encountered a man wearing a ghostly mask. When his eyes met with his. It was similar to the sensation that he felt at that time. Obviously it wasn't entirely the same, but he felt similarities. The price starts at 100. Karo's voice broke through his mind. Yongho reflexively looked at Citri. And Citri gently greeted Yongho's gaze, as if she knew that he would look at her. Yongho was embarrassed by Citri's gaze, but only for a moment. Instead of hesitating, he asked in a slightly urgent tone. I'll pay for it as soon as I return. Could you lend me the money? Citri responded with a smile. Instead of talking to Yongho about Gatabuddha to say that something is right or wrong dash, she raised her long slender finger to participate in the auction. Few coveted the crown, as evidenced by its frivolous sale in the first place. Even so, after Citri's bid became a little too high, all the other potential bidders eventually disappeared entirely. The final bid was 500. He couldn't afford to be extravagant, but he was able to cover this amount. Yong Ho, who prayed whenever the price went up, breathed out a sigh of relief. After Yong Ho managed to regain his tranquility, Citri spoke. Then shall we go back now? You've now had plenty of experience in the higher skies, your guard has crossed a threshold and you also got an item that you wanted. When Citri mentioned that his guard had crossed a threshold, Yong Ho hurriedly looked at Catalina. Catalina blinked as if she was wondering what Citri was talking about, but quickly understood. It was the same for Yong Ho. Catalina's mana control had noticeably improved from before entering the auction house. Yong Ho's mana control had improved as well, but if one were to compare them, Catalina's improvement was clearly superior. Thank you. Well, I just kept my promise. Citri responded gently to Yong Ho's thanks and then stood up first. She then naturally led Yong Ho and Catalina out, as she had done with them when they entered. It was almost near the end of the auction when the King of Gluttony entered the auction house. The King of Gluttony felt rather satisfied, as his secret deal with Samuel had been quite successful. The woman in the parrot mask politely handed over the catalogue to the King of Gluttony. It was a catalogue of the items that were auctioned off today. The catalogue did not simply just contain pictures or descriptions. The catalogue recorded specific moments with mana, making it possible for the reader to get a vivid feel of the item. The King of Gluttony suddenly stopped, as he was turning one of the pages with a light touch. The woman in the parrot mask, who was focusing on the King of Gluttony, asked in a quiet graceful voice. Master, have you found anything of interest? The King of Gluttony did not answer. He just stared at the catalogue instead of repeating her words, the woman in the parrot mask peeked at the catalogue. On the page when the King of Gluttony's hand had stopped, was the listing of the cursed crown of Einkel. It was a small enough item to be a children's toy. The curse of the crown also seemed rather crude. Nevertheless, the King of Gluttony continued to stare at it. He stared at the item for a long time, then spoke in a low tone. Who won this item? That was the King of Gluttony's question. However, the woman in the parrot mask could not answer. In the case of an anonymous auction, the dungeon market never divulged the buyer's information. Please wait a moment. The woman in the parrot mask stood up after barely being able to squeeze out an answer. Now that this was the case, she had to figure out which masked attendee had won the crown. If she were to ask that question from on the auctioneers, she would at least be able to know what they looked like. When the woman in the parrot mask left, the king of gluttony exhaled a long breath. He reached out and touched the image of the crown floating in the air. The curse of the crown was crude. The shape of the crown was also of little value. But the metal that made up the crown. Ordinary people were unable to recognize it. Even for discerning blacksmiths, it was difficult to appreciate the true value of the metal. But the king of gluttony knew. It wasn't because he had a good eye. The power of gluttony was telling him. The great ancient power was shouting. Seven deadly sins. Seven sins. A fragment of the great demon king's soul. A portion of the highest existence. Seven miracles. A fragment of the great demon king's flesh. And the mysterious fragments. Dozens, hundreds of them. 
The metal that made up that crown was one of those mysterious fragments. But even so, it was a fragment of the body of the great demon king. God's metal. Yes, what other expression would suit such a metal? The king of gluttony was a meticulous man. He asked himself. Did the buyer recognize the true worth of the crown? Perhaps he just bought the crown for his own amusement. It didn't matter if it was for just personal amusement. But if that was not the case, then would he have recognized the true nature of the crown? No, it can't be. The only king inside the auction house was the king of gluttony himself. If there was another king, then he would have known. All six existing kings were kings that the king of gluttony had personally met and competed against. But why? Why did he have such an awkward feeling? The king of gluttony waited for the woman in the parrot mask to return. And suddenly he recalled a man. A young man wearing a white mask that he had encountered before the auction began. The king of gluttony shook his head. He turned the pages of the catalog in the hope that it was just an unfounded fear. Thank you very much for today. Yong Ho climbed off of the cat carriage and thanked Citri. It seemed like they had been away for a long time, but the night was still not yet over. The dawn was still far away. Citri laughed. She gazed at Yong Ho with affectionate eyes. I'm also happy when my beloved customer improves. Just think of it as something I did for myself. And. Citri suddenly stopped talking. She squinted her eyes and smiled. You look sweet together, but can't you let go now? Yong Ho blinked, but soon understood. He glanced at Catalina's hand which he had still been holding ever since they had left the auction house and returned to Mammon's dungeon. Catalina became flustered, causing her ears to begin to flap. Yong Ho became startled and quickly let go. Both of her ears were bright red. Citri did not tease the two of them with silence. Instead, she took the crown out from between her breasts and held it out to Yong Ho. Here's the crown. You have a good eye. Was that just a joke, or was the crown really worth something? While Yong Ho was contemplating on it, Citri took a step back. You should go in. Eliger will be waiting for you. He didn't know about Eliger, but the high meerkats had just woken up and were now watching them. Yong Ho nodded. He first gave Citri a farewell. I'll see you next time then. Yes, you too. I look forward to seeing you again. Citri also gave her farewell in return. Catalina bowed her head after briefly pondering how to say goodbye. Yong Ho and Catalina then headed side by side back to Mammon's dungeon. Citri looked at them from the back and wore a lonely smile upon her face. She climbed back onto the cat carriage. The figure of Yong Ho. With Catalina standing next to him. Reminded her of Mammon and Alun. Citri reminisced for a long time as the cat carriage flew through the night sky. She sang in a quiet voice, as dawn approached. Mammon. The great king of greed. The only man the Citri had ever loved. And. Citri looked down at her hand. She bit her lips without realizing it. She remembered what she wanted to forget, but couldn't. More than a thousand years ago. The day the mammon disappeared from this world. Citri clenched her fist. She held the same hand to her chest that had taken mammon's life. Once again, she called out mammon's name. But there was no answer. Only a watery voice hovered in the dark night sky. Chapter, 97 the Cursed Crown of Einkel. After speaking out loud, Yong Ho put down the brochure he had received from the auction house. He naturally looked at the crown. There wasn't much information in the brochure. The name and origin of the crown and an outline of the legend behind it. The first owner of the crown was King Einkel, who was said to be from the eastern part of the demon world. There was a legend that said that anyone with the crown at their bedside would be visited by nightmares. Unlike tinnitus, it was a legend, not a definitive curse, since there were those who did not receive nightmares, despite having the crown on their bedside. According to the Dungeon Market's brochure, some people may not even have nightmares at all, while others who did, would only have a couple of them. It was like a child's toy. It could be dangerous if one had a fatal nightmare, but that wasn't necessarily going to be the case. 
although it differed person to person, it would probably only cause one to recall the most shameful things in life. It was a crown that reminded him of one of the penalties of the lower floors of Mammon's arena. Yong Ho carefully lifted the crown. He could definitely feel the mana, albeit weakly. It wasn't something that greed would covet. However, Yong Ho didn't give up easily. Although he was a major in computer engineering, he decided to experiment with a variety of methods. Yong Ho concentrated mana into both of his hands. There was no response from the crown. Yong Ho repeatedly invoked the power of evolution. He closely looked at the crown, but no letters of light appeared. It was too early to give up. Yong Ho aroused greed. As always, smoke, that was only visible to Yong Ho, appeared. Greed began to stretch out in all directions as if searching for a place to go, and soon began to raise its voice. It was just like in the auction house. Except there was one thing that was different. The crown was now in Yong Ho's hands. It wasn't far away, like in the auction house. Greed headed towards the crown. The smoke wound around Yong Ho's hands as well as the crown. What happened next was purely instinctual. Yong Ho instinctively aroused his mana. Green mana, blooming like flames, began to concentrate in both of his hands. Greed and mana became one. Yong Ho infused his mana into greed. It was a combination he had never even thought of trying. The results of such a combination were truly magnificent. His mana had been amplified. However, it didn't stop there, his mana was being tempered. Greed elevated Yong Ho's mana to a higher level. Yong Ho breathed out roughly. The flow of mana was too fast. Moreover, it flowed roughly. Like the galloping of a wild horse. It was clear that if it had only been a few days ago, Yong Ho would not have been able to control it. But that wasn't the case now. Experience from the auction house, now made it possible. Yong Ho took the reins of the galloping wild horse. He turned the runaway horse into a race. An instinct dictated, Yong Ho infused the new mana into the crown held in his hands. The crown did not explode. It didn't even melt into the unruly mana. The crown responded. It accepted Yong Ho's mana as if it had been waiting. Store. Amplify. Respond. Yong Ho recognized the true essence of the crown. The current reaction wasn't because of some special magic on the crown. It was the power of the metal itself that made up the crown. It was only then that he understood. Greed wasn't craving like usual. Instead it was resonating with the metal that made up the crown. How could this be? What kind of metal resonated with greed, one of the seven deadly sins? Yong Ho put aside the currently unsolvable questions and exclaimed at the idea that suddenly came to his mind. He yelled. Catalina. Master. At Lucia's call, Catalina rushed towards Yong Ho and blinked at the sight of the cut crown. It was Yong Ho who cut the crown. Instead of explaining to Catalina, Yong Ho returned Amon, who was currently emitting a high temperature, to his bracelet form and handed one of the pieces of the crown to Catalina. Hold it. For a dungeon spirit, the order of the owner was absolute. Catalina faced Yong Ho, holding a piece of the crown. Yong Ho took a step back. After opening up a reasonable distance from Catalina, he gave her another command. Arouse your mana. Catalina bit her lips, but soon did as Yong Ho ordered. Black mana arose. Yong Ho felt Catalina's mana. Realizing the connection between owner and spirit, he also aroused his own mana. It wasn't his ordinary mana. Greed and mana covered the fragment of the crown in his hands. Soon, a strange reaction occurred that Yong Ho was hoping for. The piece of the crown held by Catalina suddenly responded. Despite not touching Yong Ho's mana, it showed the exact same reaction as the piece held in Yong Ho's own hands. And then again as expected. Catalina's mana was amplified. The power of greed partly infused with Catalina's black mana. Catalina was stunned at the sudden amplification of her mana. But that wasn't the only thing that surprised her. She felt Yong Ho within her amplified mana. Catalina focused. She controlled the mana that began to run wild and made it her own. 
she had also experienced the auction house, so she too was able to control it. It was like a well-forged blade. The attributes of Catalina's black mana also became stronger. Yong Ho understood. It was originally just a crown, so there was no connection between the two pieces. Instead it was himself and Catalina who were connected. The current phenomenon occurred because he, the owner, was conscious of his connection with Catalina, the dungeon spirit. Catalina did not possess the power of a sin. But Yong Ho was able to use the power of the crown to amplify his own sin. The power of sin that was amplified was then transmitted to Catalina, and the crown piece that Catalina was holding reacted to that power, inducing Yong Ho's desired response. Store, amplify and respond. Still, the identity of the metal was unknown. However, the use of the metal was not. All that remained was to find a more efficient way to utilize it. Catalina. Yes, master. Catalina looked at Yong Ho, anticipating an explanation. However, Yong Ho said something entirely unexpected. Let's go find Bergrim. Catalina was unable to ask any questions. Since she was busy chasing after Yong Ho, who had swiftly exited the room in the blink of an eye. Yong Ho wasn't the only one in Mammon's dungeon with glistening eyes. After recovering some of his mana, Bergrim began to make magical gear like crazy, as if to show what the madness of a craftsman was really like. Of course, his mana was still too weak. There was no shortage of materials that would digest his mana. But still, Bergrim utilized his mana. He had begun to make new dishware for the kitchen. Strong spoons and forks had been mass-produced. The knives and ladles could even temporarily be used as combat weapons. Bergrim, who was currently making iron chopsticks for Yong Ho with all his heart and soul, suddenly jumped up from his seat. It was a sudden visit, but he graciously greeted Yong Ho without a hint of reluctance. For Bergrim, Yong Ho wasn't just his master, but his lifesaver no, even more than that. Yong Ho asked Bergrim, while handing him the pieces of the crown. Could you melt these and make something like a ring or bracelet? Yong Ho's eyes twinkled in anticipation. There was no way Bergrim could decline facing those eyes. Fortunately, he was good at making jewelry. Nodding his head in acceptance, Bergrim carefully reached out to take a look at the crown pieces. Yong Ho quickly handed over the crown pieces to him. Bergrim tapped the crown pieces with his finger. It seemed as if he was listening to its sound, as at the same time he closed his eyes and began to feel them. Some of the great esteemed dwarves are said to be able to hear the sound of metal. Perhaps it's better to say that they can interact with the metal itself. Bergrim is most likely trying to figure out the strength and ductility of the metal that makes up the crown pieces. Lucia explained to Yong Ho. Yong Ho was pleased with the fact that Bergrim was an esteemed dwarf and was delighted that he was working with a smile upon his face. After smiling at Yong Ho, Bergrim took out a small blackboard and chalk that lay in the corner of the workshop. He asked Yong Ho a question in poor demon language. Yong Ho looked around Catalina. Catalina's ears began to droop with embarrassment as she drew Yong Ho's attention. After examining Catalina's ears, neck and wrists, Yong Ho soon made his decision. He thought of the rest of his spirits and then spoke to Bergrim. Two rings, one for a man and one for a woman. One bracelet for a man and one anklet for a woman. And finally a necklace. That one's for a man. If there's any metal left, just keep it. The rings were for Yong Ho himself and Catalina, while the bracelet and anklet would belong to Eliger and Ophelia respectively. While, finally, the necklace was for Skull. Upon hearing Yong Ho's order, Bergrim pondered for a moment and quickly wrote a new question on the board. Bergrim's gaze alternated between Yong Ho and Catalina, causing Yong Ho to quickly speak out. No, nothing like that. There are just items to be given to some of the spirits. I'll wear one of the rings, while the rest will belong to Catalina, Eliger, Ophelia and Skull respectively. You know who they are, right? He almost emptied out all the air from his lungs. Yong Ho didn't look back at Catalina. For some reason, after they had visited the auction house, he kept thinking about it. After looking around the room for a moment, he quietly spoke to Bergrim. But it would be nice if you made them look pretty. 
Bergrim responded with a hearty grin, which Yong Ho couldn't object to. Thump thump. Throb throb. Flutter flutter. Lucia spoke very quickly, and Yong Ho fanned his face to cool off. He also asked Bergrim, while ignoring the fluttering noise from behind his back. By the way, do you know anything about this metal? It was clear that Bergrim was an outstanding blacksmith, but he wasn't born in the demon world. He wasn't used to using the metals of the demon world. Yong Ho asked another question. If you're not going to use all of the crown, could you cut some off? The crown wasn't that big in the first place, but it was far larger than a bracelet or ring. Bergrim broke one of the crown pieces in half again and handed it to Yong Ho. Okay, then please start work right away. I don't want to push you, but how long will it take? Bergrim's answer was very refreshing. Yong Ho patted him on the shoulder and took the piece of the crown. Yong Ho then left the workshop, alongside Catalina, who had now regained her calmness. Let's go to the arena. Originally, he had planned to explore the stairs leading to the next underground floor. But he had changed his mind. For now, visiting the arena was more urgent. It was a medal that even Bergrim didn't recognize, perhaps if it was Amun or Gus Ion, they might know. No, it was more likely that both of them would just know it as a medal that responded to the power of greed, and nothing else. Also, it was now time to challenge the arena again. Thanks to Agar's spirit, he had strengthened, not only his mana, but his physical ability as well. Moreover, he also wanted to test out his newfound power the mana of greed. Yong Ho hurried his steps. He headed to the arena. Yong Ho's arrival was the same as usual, as the man in the beast mask led the way. However, when he physically arrived at the arena, there was something different. Gusan. Although Yong Ho had only visited a few times before, Gus Ion had always been there early. He always stood with his back facing the entrance as if he was pretending that he never waited. He only turned around after Yong Ho greeted him. Only. This time, however, he was facing Yong Ho from the front. As soon as Yong Ho passed through the corridor, he seemed to know. Furthermore, it didn't end there. I have something to tell you no, I have a favor to ask. Yong Ho squinted at the unexpected words. Catalina's eyes widened in surprise. Gus Ion scratched his cheek. It seemed that it was difficult for him to make a request. Talk to Kai Wan. That is my favor. Yong Ho's expression became even more subtle. Chapter, 98 Gus Ion had asked for a favor. Furthermore, his request was for Yong Ho to have a conversation with Kai Wan. It was a suspicious question. Wasn't it Gus Ion who prevented him from having even a short conversation with Kai Wan in the first place? Facing Yong Ho's suspicious gaze, Gus Ion cleared his throat as if he was hiding something. Yong Ho continued to stare at him with his arms crossed. In the end, it was Gus Ion who spoke first. Time doesn't flow naturally here. I'd heard such from Amun. Time doesn't stop, but it doesn't flow normally, does it? For over a thousand years, that was the secret why spirits in the arena were able to stay alive. It was no exaggeration to say that the arena was another world that existed within Mammon's dungeon. Gus Ion nodded. Yes. When you're here, you can't really feel the passage of time. One year is like a single minute, while one minute is like an entire year. I've spent at least a thousand years here. But my senses don't remember the past years as a thousand years. Sometimes it just feels like a year has passed, while other times it just feels like a few days. This space is such a place. Yong Ho was able to empathize to some extent. When he was in the arena, he couldn't really grasp the flow of time either. He had originally thought he had stayed for more than half a day during his last visit, but when he came out, it ended up being only two hours. But what connection was there between the nature of the arena and Kaiwan? Gus Ion pursed his lips. He then cut off his remaining hesitation and spoke. Kaiwan's spirit is on the verge of collapse. Gus Ion wasn't joking. His eyes were as serious as the time when he was telling the story of Mammon. I told you when you first came, didn't I? It has been decades since Kaiwan's disappearance. Yong Ho also remembered that time. 
Kai Wan's pale face came to his mind. I don't know how time passes in this space, but we can't fool the absolute nature of time. No matter how we feel in this arena, time is still flowing. Gyuzhen's voice sank heavily. It wasn't just the decades of Kai Wan. Gyuzhen's voice contained a thousand years following the death of Mammon. Kai Wan was in a poor condition from the beginning. She couldn't accept the reality that she had to stay in the arena. She had to leave so many things behind. The House of Mammon had only just begun to rise again. There were her faithful subordinates, and there was also her sickly younger brother waiting for her return. Kai Wan wasn't unique. The previous generations before Kai Wan, had all eventually been defeated and locked up inside the arena, they too had to leave behind many things. But Yong Ho could understand Kai Wan's heart. He understood why she had such a strong obsession. The previous generations of owners were better off. The Mammon family was still alive and well developed, and they were proper successors. Unlike Kai Wan. Kai Wan would not have been devastated by her inability to leave the arena. It was clear that she was more concerned for her brother, who would not be able to make it without her, and who would remain alone within the house of Mammon. Kai Wan maintained herself through sheer belief. All she had left was her faith. Yong Ho understood. He remembered the questions she asked that day when he first met her. She spoke out unknowingly. Brother will you come to the arena? Even if it's just a descendant. Yong Ho closed his eyes. Gyuzhen's voice went on. Visitors to the arena must be challenged at least once. But if you're with a companion, it doesn't matter which one of you accepts the challenge. Kaiwan pinned her hopes on that point. She said that there was a strong subordinate that could easily pass the first floor. What was his name, Endelian? It was a wish that could not be fulfilled. Ophelia's father, Endelian, was disappointed by Kayan and left the Mammon family without him. Furthermore, Kayan was unable to overcome the sudden attack of the crazy ants. The only passageway to the arena had been lost. That's how time passed. Decades in absolute terms but for Kai Wan, that time seemed like hundreds of years. Kai Wan, described in Kayan's records, was a woman of steel. But the Kai Wan that Yong Ho encountered at the arena was like a piece of fractured glass ready to break. And then you appeared. Yong Ho opened his eyes. Gus Ion faced him. I had a hunch. You're not the one that Kai Wan wanted. There was even the possibility that you would provide the worst possible answer in Kai Wan's imagination. Is that why you interrupted? Gus Ion laughed bitterly. I am the manager of the arena. Kai Wan is a fighter of the arena, and is among my favorites of Mammon's descendants. In the end, it was Gus Ion who was the righteous one at that time. Yong Ho sighed. He was as crude and clumsy as he had always been. Gus Ion continued. Kai Wan is no longer able to sustain herself just through belief, as she used to. All because you appeared with the truth. You know of what happened with Kayan, perhaps you might be able to bring him. Kai Wan's mind was sick. And finally, her limits had been reached. Yong Ho clenched his teeth. He now understood why Gus Ion had interfered. Was it reasonable to let Kai Wan know about her brother's death and the fall of the Mammon family? Gus Ion had judged that now the time had come. She had to face the truth, even if it were to break her. Yong Ho swallowed dry saliva. Catalina remained silent, and even held her breath. Kai Wan's brother, Kayan, died of illness. Yong Ho squeezed out his voice. He confided all he knew to Gus Ion, as if he was performing a rehearsal. It was a panorama of tragedy. Gus Ion lamented the fact that the former owner had committed suicide. That's the worst. Yong Ho thought so as well. Just imagining how Kai Wan would react to the news was horrible. But there's also a positive aspect. Gus Ion said. It wasn't something that he said casually. His voice was still subdued, but it was calm. Kai Wan's brother, Kayan, became the owner of the Mammon family, married, and even had children. He allowed the House of Mammon to continue on. It was an ordinary tale. But it was important that such mediocrity was achieved. Gus Ion laughed bitterly. He rubbed his lips a few times and then dropped his hands. 
Save Kaiwan. It's now time for her to get rid of her obsession. No answer was necessary. Gus Ion stepped back, and the man with the beast mask led Yong Ho again. Yong Ho ordered Catalina not to follow him. As Gus Ion has said, he couldn't really feel the flow of time. Just a few steps felt like an age. The man with the beast mask led Yong Ho to the arena's waiting room. In the waiting room, Kai Wan sat on a chair with a nervous expression on her face. Her eyes, visible between her gray hair, were filled with anxiety and fear, rather than hope. Kai Wan looked up and saw Yong Ho. She opened her lips but couldn't speak. Her hunger for the truth was so great that it was difficult for her to squeeze out her voice. Yong Ho remembered the first time he saw Kai Wan. Some of her memories were left inside her mana. A small and shabby girl. A girl who cried and cried that she would never fall. Yong Ho swallowed his saliva once again. Without avoiding her gaze, he faced her from the front. He spoke in a surprisingly bold voice. Kaiwan, Kayan is dead. It happened a decade or so ago. There were no screams or howls. Yong Ho grabbed both of Kaiwan's shoulders. He told her a story that made her feel like she would be crushed into ashes. The word tired was insufficient to express how he felt. Gus Ion smiled at Yong Ho, who had now left the waiting room and returned to the arena. He patted Yong Ho's shoulder, as if pretending to be friendly. You've done enough. Now it's her problem. As the manager of the arena, I give you my utmost gratitude. Yong Ho recalled the Gus Ion he saw in Mammon's memory. This incident was proof that Gus Ion was a sincere person. After hearing the full story, Kaiwan fell asleep crying in Yong Ho's arms what happened after she woke up was, as Gus Ion said, her own problem. Yong Ho sat down on the nearest chair. He then asked Gus Ion, who naturally sat down next to him. Didn't you say that conquering the arena would free the arena's spirits? I said that you could earn the spirits. Well, in the end it's the same anyway. And. And. No, that's enough. I'll keep that a secret. So, are you going to challenge the fourth floor now? Yong Ho laughed. Gus Ion hated that it made him somehow feel like a villain. Yong Ho shook his head a few times, pulled something out and then spoke. Before that, there's something I would like to ask you. Amen, the same goes for you. I want to know the identity of this metal. In Yong Ho's hand was a piece of the crown. Gus Ion saw it and smiled a little differently than before. Instead of taking the medal from Yong Ho's hand, he asked Yong Ho a question he didn't expect. Is that all of it? No, I've got my blacksmith making some jewelry to give to some of my spirits. He had originally intended to explain what the medal could do. Amen was watching from the side, but not Gus Ion. However, Yuzhen's reaction made his thoughts disappear. You were right. He really is Mammon's true successor. Isn't that right? Amen. As if to answer Gus Ion, the flames of a red lotus rose into the air. A soft voice accompanied the flames. Brigada. God's metal. Fragments of the true king's flesh. It responds to the fragments of the soul. Instead of offering an explanation like Amen, Gus Ion rolled up his sleeves. A black bracelet, hidden under his white suite, was revealed. Yong Ho wouldn't have known if he had seen it before. But now he knew. It was the same metal that made up the crown. It's something I received from Mammon. He was the first person in the demon world to discover its use in this way, just like you. All of us except for Amen he gave to the twelve spirits of Mammon, jewelry made out of Brigada. It was a voice full of sadness and deep longing. However, Yong Ho couldn't respond to Gus Ion. He wasn't surprised by the great tale of the true demon king, or the mysterious fragments of the flesh. When he heard Gyuzhin's story, a question came to his mind. Gus Ion said that Mammon was the first one to use Brigada, in this way. Did that mean that kings before Mammon's era failed to recognize the true nature of Brigada? Or was Brigada only discovered during Mammon's time? Perhaps it was neither. Yong Ho came up with one possibility. The Twelve Spirits of Mammon. Even after Mammon's death, they were subjugated to the maze of greed. 
Only. Gus Ion knew what Yong Ho was thinking. Once again, he burst out laughing. He gave Yong Ho a good answer. Yes, the twelve spirits of Mammon. We are the first true dungeon spirits of the demon world. The current system of dungeon spirits is nothing more than an imitation of the original created by Mammon. The flames of the red lotus rose up. Amun's voice echoed in Yong Ho's mind. My young master. I can now draw out the power of greed. For generations, the kings who ruled this world were those who possessed the power of sin. And, now it's time to learn why. Light shone from the Brigada in Yong Ho's palm. The green flames of greed arose through the guidance of Amun and Gusayan. The true power of the seven deadly sins, revealed itself. Chapter, 99 I feel sorry for the owner of the fourth floor. Gus Ion laughed and crossed his legs. Catalina sat next to him, in the special reserved seat, instead of Amun. Unlike Gus Ion, who was full of contentment and composure, Catalina looked at the arena with a nervous expression. On each side of the wide circular arena, stood each of the participants. Standing on the left was the Crimson Ogre, Victor, the fourth floor master and on the right was Yong Ho, the owner of the House of Mammon. Crimson Ogres were the elites of the Ogre race. Similar to the Hobgoblins of the Goblins race, and the War Orcs of the Orc race. Not only were Crimson Ogres much larger than the typical Ogre, they were also red all over similar to the Red Demon race. The red light emanating from both of the Crimson Ogre's eyes looked terrifying. Furthermore, Victor wasn't simply an ordinary Crimson Ogre. He was a powerful force compared to ordinary Crimson Ogres, one of which had threatened the House of Mammon on the day that Yong Ho had ascended to the throne. However, Yong Ho wasn't afraid of Victor. It was thanks to his experience against previous powerful enemies, but it was more due to his concern with what Amun was currently saying to him in his mind. Brigada is a fragment of the true demon king's flesh. Because of this, it responds to the seven deadly sins, which are fragments of the soul of the true demon king. Both fragments mutually resonate with one another. My young master. Stay focused. Brigada is like a lantern that guides one's way through the darkness, and even you, who is still inexperienced, will be able to unleash the power of greed with Brigada's help. Yong Ho didn't know what the true demon king was. It was also the first time he had ever heard of the terms fragments of flesh, or the fragments of the soul. But he somehow naturally understood. A light arose from the piece of crown grasped in his left hand. The aura of greed burned not only on the surface of his body, but it also penetrated deep inside him. It became one with the flow of his mana. The power of greed was extremely rough. It was difficult for them to combine naturally. But they had definitely become one. The flesh desired the soul, and the soul desired the flesh. The current intensity was not a rejection. Rather, it was evidence of the strong synergy taking place between them. Focus. And yearn for it. The seven deadly sins came from the soul of the true demon king. Therefore, each sin has a different nature. The root of greed is hunger. Desire. Covetousness. Liberate the power of greed. Yong Ho drew in his breath. He strongly held Amun up in front of him. He connected to his desires just as Amun had requested him. He thought of each of his desires one by one. The flames of greed burned even brighter. The things he wanted. The things he wanted to do. The things he wanted to enjoy. He was true to himself. He yearned with purity. Greed was not dependent on the nature of the desire. Rather it was the strength of the desire, the more powerful greed became and the more powerful he became. The crimson ogre's eyes shook as he gazed at Yong Ho. The aura emanating from Yong Ho was unusual. Victor's reasoning was shouting to him that he had to rush Yong Ho right away, but his instincts refused. It wasn't just the mere flames that bothered him. In Victor's eyes, the flames instead looked like a living creature. The flames seemed to create a figure of a terrifying being. Victor's breath became rough. Yong Ho's breath, on the other hand, became increasingly calm. The flames still seemed to be wild and out of control, but in reality they weren't. They were under Yong Ho's control. A little more. 
desire a little more. Yearn for it. My young master. Master of greed. Amun loudly exclaimed. Yong Ho desired. He desired to win. He desired to defeat the floor master of the fourth floor to gain Mammon's mana and to take the artifacts from Gusion. He also wanted to see Kaiwan again. He wanted to save Kaiwan and make Gusion his loyal subordinate. It was exhilarating to imagine Gusion calling him master. And, and. Yong Ho stepped forward. He hit the ground and raced towards the Crimson Ogre. He was as straight and fast as a loose arrow. All the flames from Yong Ho's body concentrated together and were then channeled into Amun. Victor reacted. He suppressed his instincts to flee by letting out a roar. And with that roar, he charged towards Yong Ho. Catalina tightly clutched her hands together. Gus Ion rose from his seat with a fierce smile upon his face. Dodging was the right thing to do. The answer was for Yong Ho to use his quick agility to dodge Victor's attack and then counter-attack his side. That's what Catalina wished for. However, Gus Ion didn't think so. And neither did Yong Ho. Victor's roar filled the arena. He swung his huge iron club with all his might, causing it to resemble a thunderbolt. However, Yong Ho did not avoid the thunderbolt-like club. He firmly stood face to face with his opponent. He thrusted Amun towards Victor. He liberated the power of greed. The unleashed power was overwhelming. The great torrent of power was like a tyrant destroying everything in its path. Victor's iron club couldn't reach Yong Ho. It was deflected at a similar thunderbolt-like speed. A powerful mass of power, that could no longer be said to resemble a simple flame, smashed into Victor. The power was so overwhelming, that only the expression swallowed, was appropriate to describe its impact. Victor's upper body was completely annihilated by the flames. And yet, the unrelenting momentum of the flames did not slow down, instead they began to burn the surrounding atmosphere and then collide with the invisible wall that surrounded the arena. The impact of the enormous force shook the entire arena. Catalina gazed at Yong Ho with rapt attention. The arena's spirits in the audience were rendered speechless. Among them, those who were past masters of the House of Mammon understood instinctively. That was greed. That was the power of the seven deadly sins. In terms of absolute power, Yong Ho still wasn't powerful enough to reach them, but yet he still unnerved them. Their intrinsic quality of power was different. As the saying goes, they were in different worlds. Gus Ion smiled brightly. He unknowingly whispered Mammon's name into the air. Victor was sure to have seen it. The face of greed. The appearance of the true king from the fragment of the king's soul. There was no reason to wait for Victor's resurrection. Gus Ion was completely convinced. He now looked at Yong Ho Young Master with friendly eyes. Yong Ho exhaled and stretched out his stance. He didn't think of correcting his posture. There seemed to be an indescribable sense of power within him that dominated his whole body. This was greed. This was the power of the seven deadly sins. But that wasn't all. It was only just the beginning. He had only experienced the tip of the iceberg. Great job. My young master. I believe that you could do it. Amun softly spoke. But, with a hint of laughter mixed within. It was the first time that Yong Ho had ever heard Amun laugh. However, my young master. Your desires are mostly related to women. And so was the last desire that you thought of right at the end. I understand that the young master is currently in his prime, but you've not even experienced a woman yet. How come? Yong Ho's whole body suddenly froze in quite a different sense than ever before. His sense of accomplishment which had been seething throughout his body suddenly died. For some reason, a strong silence hovered around Yong Ho. A small amount of cold sweat seemed to drip from his forehead. After a while, Amun spoke again. I'll keep it a secret from Gus Ion. Only. Should he be thankful, or ask to be left alone? Fortunately, Amun was caring, unlike Gus Ion. Amun transformed from his lance form back into a bracelet. In addition, Amun's presence, which he had initially felt beside him, now felt distant. Master. 
Master. Catalina's bright voice could now be heard, as the invisible barrier, surrounding the arena, had now disappeared. As expected, her ears and tail were flapping while she waved towards him. Her cheeks seemed to be burning with excitement. Ah! When Yong Ho remembered the last desire he had during the battle against Victor, he quickly turned around after waving his hand a little. As he turned away from Gyuzhin's gaze, he reached out towards Mammon's mana emanating from Victor's body. He absorbed Mammon's mana. Chapter 100 His current mana was enough to defeat the floor of the fourth floor with a single strike. Moreover, he had still to test the full capabilities of his physical body which had been reborn after defeating Agars. However, instead of challenging the fifth floor, Yong Ho chose to go back for now. The ostensible justification was that he believed it would better to fight the master of the fifth floor after receiving the Brigada jewelry from Bergrim. Whereas the actual real reason behind his decision was that he might desire to commit suicide if he had to unleash the power of his desires again. But I'll still have to take care of it. He picked a box of light, with the power of greed, and received a good-looking pair of manacles in the air. They looked like an item for a barehanded fighter. I'll give these to Eliger. Eliger now possessed strong mana. And recently, he had been honing the southern martial art, taught by Ophelia, which was a barehanded art, so the manacles were perfect for him. Are you already leaving? Why? Don't you want to try the fifth floor? It was the voice of Gus Ion, who seemed a little sad. But, he couldn't change Yong Ho's mind. No, that's it for today. I'll come back tomorrow with the Brigada jewelry. Please take care of Kai Wan. Don't worry. I'll watch over her. The price of her facing the truth won't be small, but I'm sure she'll overcome it. It wasn't just a pretense that Gus Ion cared about Kai Wan. Yong Ho sincerely hoped that Kai Wan would overcome her troubles. I'll see you tomorrow then. Yes, I look forward to it. Young Master. Yong Ho, who was about to turn around after saying farewell, suddenly stopped in his tracks. He asked back unknowingly. What? Farewell. No, not that. Yong Ho pressed him for an answer, but Gus Ion just ignored him. Catalina, who was standing behind him, gave a small smile. In the end, rather than pressing for an answer, Yong Ho just lightly chuckled. Instead of asking more questions, he turned around. Unlike the first time, Gus Ion now felt quite pleased. I'll keep going. For the day when he'll be able to conquer the arena. Yong Ho stepped forward. The man in the beast mask silently appeared and led Yong Ho and Catalina out of the arena. The next morning, Yong Ho overslept. Fatigue, which had come in exchange for the liberation of greed, was accompanied by an inexplicable dream. Master, are you all right? Sometimes you need to forget about everything and take some well-earned rest. How about taking the day off for today? At Lucia's worried tone, Yong Ho breathed out a sigh of relief. Although Lucia was connected to his mind, she was fortunately unable to see his peculiar dream. No, it's okay. I've already had quite a good rest. I've got a lot of work to get done today. As he replied to Lucia, Yong Ho clenched his fist. The combination of his natural mana and the power of greed was still very weak. I've only just opened the door. Instinctively, he understood. And he also seemed to understand what Amun meant when he had earlier spoken of the seven deadly sins. Only those who possess the power of the seven deadly sins can reign as kings. Only they can rule the world. At the moment the crimson ogre, Victor, was overwhelmed by the power of greed, Yong Ho too was overcome by such power. It was because he had just taken a small glance at the huge iceberg hidden beneath the surface of the water. Mammon, the king of greed. The fact that Yong Ho himself was the successor of such a great figure had just struck a new chord within him. It had already been a rather long time since he had inherited the house of Mammon, but it was the first time that he had ever felt so strongly about the significance of his existence. Yong Ho stood up. After stretching, he washed his face with the water left in his room. He began the day. After spending the morning eating and carrying out some personal training, Yong Ho took Catalina, Eliger and Skull to visit Bugrim's workshop. Bergrim, who seemed to be much more tired than usual, welcomed Yong Ho. 
the dark circles under his eyes seemed to have formed during the night. His complexion looked bad, but he still smiled proudly. Bergrim quickly put away the chalkboard that he was using to communicate with, placed the newly made jewelry onto a tray and then handed them to Yongho. One of the pieces must have just been finished, as Bergrim had just removed it from the workbench. Wow! Yongho was amazed. Every single piece of jewelry was beautiful. The rings, with small embedded green emeralds, looked like a pair. Since the crown was originally gold, the rings too were gold, with a bit of embellishment regarding the embedded jewel, causing them to look elegant and classy. The bracelet and anklet were also a pair. If the rings pursued a clean elegant style, then the bracelet and anklet looked more stylish. They were covered with scales reminiscent of a dragon. The necklace, however, was completely made out of brigada. It was also adorned with a dragon's head, that looked as if it was about to breath fire. You've done an amazing job. Your work is really admirable. He felt like he should give him a prize for his hard work. Of course, for Bergrim, the best prize would be for Yongho to invoke his evolutionary power, however to do so Bergrim still needed to fill his evolution rate. Yongho quickly invoked the power of evolution to examine Bergrim's evolutionary potential. Although it wasn't really a prize, Yongho gave Bergrim a promise for his next evolution. Next time, I'll strengthen your mana. It's a promise. Just his word was enough. Bergrim knew that Yongho was a man of his word. Yongho immediately began the distribution of the jewelry. He handed Skull the necklace, and gave Eliger the bracelet. Yongho placed one of the rings onto his right hand. Now, other than for Ophelia, there was only one left to give. Thump, thump. Flutter, flutter. Lucia imitated Catalina's heart. Ignoring Lucia's antics, Yongho took a deep breath. He smiled awkwardly and then spoke to Catalina. Give me your hand. Catalina bit her lower lip. Yongho carefully reached out and placed the ring on Catalina's long slender finger. Lucia continued to make noise to increase the awkwardness of the situation. Catalina's flapping ears and tail expressed her fervent joy. After giving her the ring, Yongho quickly turned around and let out a series of coughs, while scratching his face. Come to think of it, it was the first time he had ever given a woman a gift. Yesterday, I gave you a rough explanation of the nature of Brigada, didn't I? So from now on, I'll be able to empower you, so please accept the power. Yongho quickly spoke and then aroused the power of greed. Light suddenly emanated from the jewelry worn by Catalina, Eliger and Skull. Wow! Unlike Catalina, who quickly combined the power of greed with her own mana, since she had already experienced it before, Eliger and Skull struggled while making a series of strange sounds. Skull, however, soon regained his composure and managed to gain control of his mana, albeit with difficulty. However, Eliger did not. He continued to sweat profusely and struggled to control his mana. He still has a long way to go. Yesterday, Catalina had successfully controlled her mana, when Yongho first experimented with the Brigada, despite having to wield a much larger amount of mana compared to today. But, that was inevitable. Unlike Eliger and Skull, Catalina had experienced the pressure of the Dungeon Market's auction house. Moreover, her talent for mana was even better than Ophelia's. Eliger. Don't be too upset. Once Ophelia arrives shortly, I'll provide you with special training. Although Yongho tried to cheer him up, Eliger still seemed to be rather dejected. Yongho smiled and gathered up the power of greed. After saying farewell to Bergrim, he led his spirits out of the workshop. And as if she was waiting for that precise moment, Lucia suddenly spoke. Master, I've recently received a report from the dungeon meerkats. They've spotted Ophelia in the distance. It seems that she shall be arriving at the dungeon in about ten minutes. Her arrival is about an hour earlier than scheduled, but I don't think it's because of anything important going on. Perfect. He would be able to give her the anklet and then ask her to train with Eliger. He could then focus on the arena for the rest of the afternoon. Master. Ophelia is here. Shall we all go out and meet her? At Yongho's words, Eliger made a somewhat complicated expression. 
His face displayed a mixture of both joy and suffering. Yong Ho led the spirits to the entrance room of the dungeon. And Ophelia, as always, provided Yong Ho with the recent news. We're going to need a new dungeon. Chapter 101 Thanks to the cooperation of the Mad Oris, the task of taking control of the Free City was going smoothly. Some of the outlaws had noticed that the Free City was now in the hands of the House of Mammon and had rebelled. However, that fell short of a typhoon in a teacup. Out of the three factions, the outlaws were the most sensitive to strength and weakness. Most outlaws instinctively realized that they needed to conform to the new order. There were only a few who wanted to oppose the new order. Moreover, those who were reckless or insane enough to cause violence among that small minority disappeared without a sound, even before they knew the full truth. All of this was Ophelia's handiwork. Ophelia and Oris made the most intelligent and cooperative of Dargan's men, the orc mage Yukon, the new leader of the outlaw faction. Once again, the backlash was weak. This was because there was no one other than Yukon who was a potential candidate. This was the result of the screening operation. All of those that had the ability and charisma to lead a group of lawless men were either killed in the battle against Agars, suddenly disappeared one day, or left the free city on their own feet. The mad Oris was a wise man, unlike his epithet. He knew a storm was coming from the west. If he hadn't gotten on board, then it would have caused trouble for the large ship, that was the House of Mammon. They were preparing to withstand that very storm. Oris's very cooperative nature had saved Ophelia more time and energy beyond what she had initially thought. And the result led to an earlier than scheduled visit to the House of Mammon. Ophelia, the daughter of Endelion, greets the master of the House of Mammon. Ophelia, who showed her usual grace, greeted Eliger and the other spirits one after another. Catalina smiled, Skull chuckled, and Eliger showed a complex expression of both happiness and terror. Now that the dungeon had restructured, it took quite some time to walk from the dungeon's entrance room to the throne room. Since Yong Ho was a practical person, he had a conversation with Ophelia while they were on the move. Almost all of it was regarding the situation in the free city. Ophelia, an information trader, knew exactly how to handle information. She knew how to wrap or distort, and knew how to concisely deliver only the most essential news. So as they arrived at the throne room, they were already done talking about the free city, there was nothing more to share. However, Ophelia wasn't here just to talk about the free city. We're going to need a new dungeon. Ophelia spread a map of the southern region across a large table in the newly constructed conference room beside the throne room. Colored pieces of wood, that had been prepared in advance, were placed on the map as indicators of power. It looked quite different from before. It felt like the vicinity surrounding the free city had been emptied. The three dungeons of Forres, Ale and Yubing had all disappeared. While the dungeons of Abigail and Jungaris had virtually less than half the power of before, and moreover the free city was now entirely under the House of Mammon's control. Ophelia pointed to the west of the southern region. The fight in the west is now escalating. Fortunately, it's not going to be settled in a single battle, but, as I first expected, it's going to last for another two to three months at the most. The wolf demon king, Embryo, was doing well against the Western Owners Alliance, which included almost all of the Western Dungeon Owners. Despite dozens of days of fighting, he wasn't being pushed back. The need for a new dungeon is to prepare for the end of the fight in the West. Ophelia stopped speaking and took a breath. She opened up a new map of the western and southern border area. The southern region is full of empty land, but there is still roads in place across the border. They lead to a vital strategic point. Several lines had been drawn on the map. All the lines looked like they were drawn at random however they all had one thing in common. They all passed a single point on the map. Whether the Western Owners Alliance or Embryo wins, it's likely that the winner will want to consume the South. So we need a fortress to stop them. It was difficult to capture a fortress built on a vital strategic point. Some would just ignore the fortress, pass by it and attack somewhere else, but that was a very dangerous idea. Of course, it wasn't impossible. It could be a very effective strategy, if certain conditions were established. In most situations, however, this was not the case. 
Ignoring the heavily armed fortress and passing it by, was the equivalent of turning your back against a sword-wielding opponent. The dungeon would act as both a powerful fortress and a deterrent. Building a defensive dungeon at this point will effectively negate any western threats. The House of Mammon was no longer a declining family in the southern region. It was a powerful family of the south. Yong Ho looked at Ophelia's map carefully. There was already a dungeon in place at that strategic point. We're going to have to target the dungeon of the House of Randolt. Yes, you must force the owner of Randolt's dungeon to surrender, or personally take it over by launching an attack. If he surrenders to one of the Western powers, or makes way for them, then both the free city in the House of Mammon will be in danger. Yong Ho touched his chin for a moment and organized his thoughts. He asked Ophelia. Will the master of the House of Randolt, consider a surrender? The possibilities are 50-50. He is a man who does not behave rashly, as evidenced by his past actions. He's also extremely cautious. The master of the Randolt family simply stayed in his dungeon in the midst of a number of short-lived events. When the House of Forest was exploited by Jungarus, he remained silent, and he didn't even make a move when the free city was exposed to the threat of Agars. If we have to attack it's going to take a long time to fortify the dungeon again. Yes, you saw it right away. We don't know how the Randolt family will behave, but if you get your hands on the House of Randolt's dungeon, then you'll need to look at it from a slightly different perspective than Mammon's dungeon. It's not a castle that serves as a living space you need to look at it as a battle-ready fortress. The renovations of the dungeon will also have to proceed in that direction. And. Ophelia took a breath. She suppressed her excitement and spoke in a calm voice. It won't be easy acquiring Randolph's dungeon. While it's important to have a necessary amount of time for fortification, it's even more important to carefully attack with causing any significant damage. You'll need to be fully prepared. It was a valid point. Although Yong Ho had attacked the dungeons of Ale and Yubing in a row, both dungeons were almost completely devoid of any spirits guarding those dungeons. The fight against the House of Randolt would be the first official dungeon attack that Yong Ho had attempted. I understand. You're incredibly competent. At Yong Ho's straightforward praise, rather than being humble, Ophelia showed a graceful smile. Ophelia was like an alluring temptress disguised as a pure maiden. Okay, I'll leave the preparations of Randolph's attack to you, Ophelia. Organize what you need and report back to me. Yes, master. I'll follow your will. Ophelia, once again, gracefully showed respect. Yong Ho looked at Rikam, who was sitting in the corner of the conference room. Rikam help Ophelia. The orcs are going to be involved in this attack, so I would like you to especially focus on training. Yes, master. Rikam also showed Yong Ho his respect. There were two reasons for the mobilization of the orcs. The first was to minimize the damage of the attack. The more overwhelming their power was, the less potential damage would be caused by needless fighting. The second was for the orcs' growth. The best way to build one's evolution rate was to risk one's life. The fiercer the fight, the greater the increase of the evolution rate. He didn't intend to force the orcs into danger just for growth, but he couldn't just leave them in a safe place. The meeting was concluded. As Rikam left the conference room, Yong Ho began to talk about something else. I forgot to give you these earlier. It's a gift for you Eliger. Inside the box, which Catalina had fetched from Yong Ho's from, was a pair of manacles. It was the item that he had obtained after he cleared the fourth floor of the arena. Eliger had a look of emotion as he received the manacles. They weren't simply an ordinary pair of manacles, as Yong Ho had personally chosen them, with the power of greed, from the arena. Despite their lightness, they seemed very firm, and there was no inconvenience regarding mobility of one's fingers or wrists. Thank you, master. No further words of thanks were required. Eliger's eyes had already begun to fill with tears. Come to think of it, it was the first time he had given something to Eliger, other than the bracelet. I need to care of him more often. It was a similar feeling for Yong Ho as when he gave his mother a present on Mother's Day. Ophelia's eyes glistened as she watched Eliger receive the pair of manacles. She smiled and looked at Yong Ho, as if she was asking, is there anything for me? 
Yong Ho now felt like he had switched roles. Instead he now felt like a parent with multiple children. He smiled and held out an anklet made of brigada. He gave a short and concise explanation on the anklet's properties to Ophelia, whose eyes were glistening with happiness. Certainly it won't be easy. Ophelia, who had dealt with the power of greed in the past, spoke while a slight trickle of sweat. Ophelia, who was quite confident in her mana control, knew that it was a power that couldn't be easily handled. However, it was also true that she was motivated to succeed. If she could handle it properly, then she would be able to achieve growth in an innovative way. The longer you spend training with it, the more efficient you'll become. So please continue to work hard, despite its difficulties. It was something he had heard from Gusayan. Brigada not only amplified the power of the seven deadly sins, but also stored them. Therefore, if Brigada was used for a long time, then it was possible for a subordinate to access the power of the seven deadly sins even without the support of the master. Of course, it would be less powerful than if Yong Ho himself applied it. After asking Ophelia to train Eliger and Skull, Yong Ho, alongside Catalina, headed towards the arena. The reason why Yong Ho had Catalina accompany him every time he went to the arena was simple. It was to prepare for Yong Ho's own potential defeat. Kaiwan always went to and fro from the arena alone, and then one day she went missing. There was no one powerful enough to save Kaiwan in the Mammon family at the time, but it was clear that the fate of Kayin and the House of Mammon would have been a little different if they had known exactly where and how Kaiwan went missing. At least the chances of Indelian leaving the House of Mammon would have been greatly reduced. Yong Ho, along with Catalina, practiced how to use Brigada, as they traveled to the arena. Yong Ho regained his breath as he gathered up the power of greed, just like habit, he opened the door to the arena. However, as Yong Ho was on the verge of entering the arena, Catalina suddenly spoke up more loudly than normal. Master. Ha. Huh. Yong Ho turned around. Astonished by her own voice, Catalina quickly swallowed her dry saliva. She took a large breath as she faced Yong Ho. And then spoke with slightly drooping ears. I have a favor to ask of you. Yong Ho completely turned towards Catalina. It was no exaggeration to say that Catalina has stuck by his side ever since he had come to the demon world. It wasn't a short amount of time either. And during that time, Catalina had never revealed her needs. But now Catalina was asking him for a favor. Yong Ho had no choice but to take her seriously. Catalina swallowed her saliva again. Her ears straightened as she faced Yong Ho. For the first time, she revealed her desires. I want to challenge the first floor of the arena. Please let me. Her demand was a concern. Yong Ho spoke to rebuke her. The penalty is different from mine. Moreover, it can be incredibly dangerous. Kaiwan traveled alone to prevent the spirits of the Mammon family from challenging the arena. As Gusayan had warned, the arena's penalties were harsher for ordinary spirits. Catalina knew that. But she couldn't give up. It wasn't something she asked with complacency. But master. I'm your guard. She wanted to be strong. As the heir to the king of greed, she wanted to stand by her master's side as he was advancing. She wanted to catch up to him even by just a little bit. That was the relationship between the master and spirit. Yong Ho could feel Catalina's sincerity. He felt her intense growing desire. He couldn't refuse such a sincere request. Yong Ho nodded. Okay. But only after you're able to handle Brigada a little better. Okay. I'll try. Thank you so much for allowing me. Catalina was delighted, evident by her flapping ears. Yong Ho unknowingly patted Catalina's head. He then fully turned around to enter the arena. However, there was one more voice that caught Yong Ho's attention. Master. The door of space has reached 50% completion. Lucia suddenly gave a report, which caused Yong Ho to pause. He patted Catalina's head, as she was wondering what was going on, and then, once again, headed to the arena. The door of space. A world that he had forgotten. The time was approaching for Yong Ho to go back home. Chapter 102 As Yong Ho passed the long corridor of the arena, 
the same guy greeted him, as always. Dressed in a white suit, he had red skin and a red tail, another symbol of the red demon. Glad to see you here, said Gus Ion, turning around with a smile. At first, he looked ugly but pretty cute now. Gosh, how can I think this uncle is cute? Yong Ho momentarily stopped thinking like that and replied loudly, me, too. Although Yong Ho's reply seemed rather arrogant, Gus Ion didn't care. Gus Ion even liked it because Yong Ho was none other than the successor of the King of Greed. So, he thought Yong Ho should not get cold feet in front of him, one of the twelve spirits of the House of Mammon. Watching Gus Ion bite a cigar in his mouth, Yong Ho asked again, stepping forward, how about Kai Wan's condition? Is she calm now? Lighting a cigar in his mouth, Gyuzhen's eyebrows wriggled slightly, who then responded. She is resting on her own floor. She's still a bit unstable I think she will be up and running soon. She is like that. Yong Ho agreed. She was the one who raised up the house of Mammon on the verge of ruin. Despair and abandonment were foreign to Kai Wan. Don't you think you are too concerned about her? Kai Wan is also one of the floor masters in the arena. Someday she will fight you. Well, let's see. Moreover, as the floor master, she was not Yong Ho's archenemy, a new challenger in the arena. Fighting in the arena wasn't a real life threatening fight. Even if one died while fighting in the arena, it was just a virtual experience of death. Of course, it didn't mean the fighting was something trivial. The pain was real, so was the sense of death. Since he trained with Amun, Yong Ho had already experienced near death more than a dozen times, but the feeling of death was something he could not get used to despite his numerous virtual deaths. Okay, anyway, if you want to free Kai Wan according to your wishes, you'll have to defeat that child at least once. Gus Ion muttered a little while putting out some smoke. Yong Ho knitted his eyes because he felt Gyuzhen's words were a bit incongruous. In order to free Kai Wan, I must defeat her. Was he simply talking about the process of me conquering the arena? Yong Ho felt he didn't mean it. Let's stop our small talk here. Are you going to challenge right away? Yong Ho hesitated for a moment because he wanted to ask Gus Ion a little more about what he had just said, but somebody spoke before him. The flames of the red lotus, burning next to Gus Ion, said in a low voice. Gus Ion with strong power, my old friend. Wouldn't that be the only story you're going to talk about? Somehow, there was something mischievous in his words. Yong Ho was also curious because it was far from the way Amun used to speak decently. On the other hand, Gus Ion frowned. After puffing out smoke hard toward Amun, he turned to Yong Ho. You said you were learning spearmanship from Amun, right? So what? It seems like it's true. You're learning it then. Gyuzhen's response was significant. Instead of asking him hurriedly, Yong Ho waited for his next words. Gus Ion looked back at Amun again, then asked Yong Ho, Do you have to have someone like Red Demon under your control? I'm not talking about small fries, but someone who knows how to fight. I've got one. Yong Ho nodded right away. Although he felt sorry for Eligos, the first thing that came to his mind when he mentioned Red Demon was Ophelia's face. But why did he suddenly mention Red Demon? Was it because he was of the same race? Gus Ion quenched Yong Ho's curiosity in no time. Learn physical skills from that guy. More specifically, how to use your body by using magic power. Ain't I already using it? Yong Ho asked again. His question was valid. Ever since he arrived in this demon world, he had used the magic power in fights, no matter if it was big or small. If he hadn't used it from the beginning, he wouldn't have survived until now. But Gus Ion shook his head. Strangely, he rubbed off the cigar in the air and said, Let me say this for caution's sake, but I'm not good at explaining. So, let me show you something. Stopping there, he cleared his throat several times in a row and then corrected his position. He lightly punched twice into the air. Do you see the difference? Catalina drooped her ears and knitted her brows. His punch made no difference, except that his second punch was slightly faster and stronger than his first. Moreover, his posture itself was the same as before. However, Yong Ho was different. 
He noticed the flow of Gyuzhin's magic power and realized what the difference Gus Ion mentioned was. The flow of his magic power was different. Yes, it was. There was something more in his second punch, something like an internal explosion in the body or circulation. While Yong Ho was murmuring like that, Gus Ion opened his eyes wide because he never expected Yong Ho could notice the difference, and his observation was quite accurate. That's why Amon made me explain to you. Instead of replying, Amon simply laughed faintly. Gus Ion spoke directly to Yong Ho, who was still having a hard time trying to find out the difference, all the demons survive on magical power. You know this, right? Yes, I do. Good. That's why we demons are supposed to use magic power no matter what we do. My punching a moment ago explains it further. Yong Ho slightly wrinkled his forehead. Based on what Gus Ion himself just explained, his explanation was messy. However, Yong Ho tried to combine what he saw for himself with his experiences so far. Then he reconstructed what Gus Ion had said. Does it mean that you circulated the magical power according to its movement? In other words, when you punched, did you double its speed and power by using the optimized magic power? Gyuzhin's face brightened at his explanation. Oh, that's correct. How smart you are, my little master. Little master. Anyway, you're right. If you use the magic power according to your movement, you can multiply that power several times. Besides, you could move faster. Gus Ion quickly changed the topic when he was faced with how to call Yong Ho. Yong Ho nodded. He seemed to have read it somewhere in a martial arts magazine. Since we demons were born based on magical power from the beginning, we instinctively use magical power, even though our level is different. Your cute guard is no exception. It's because of her magic power skills that she could display explosive movements with her slim figure. Catalina's ears drooped a little more. She roughly understood what Gus Ion was talking about, but she wasn't sure about explaining when and how she used that magic power, which was natural because she was born with it, as Gus Ion said. Walking with two feet, which was easy for any average man, was never simple. When one took a step, the bones and muscles of one's whole body had to react with an exquisite balance. It was very difficult to properly explain that process. But you are not like us, Yong Ho. You use magical power when punching artificially, but what should I say it's like you're collecting magical power to use magic. That's not the natural way of using magical power. This is probably because you are from the human world, not the demon world. As if satisfied with his own explanation, Gus Ion nodded at what he said. Yong Ho, too, could understand it immediately this time. Gus Ion continued, as you know, your race, the Red Demon, doesn't know anything about magical power. However, they're excellent at maximizing their physical movements by using magical power. So, try and learn to use magical power from one of the Red Demons. That skill alone will make you a lot stronger than now. In fact, Yong Ho's body completely changed while he was absorbing Agar's essential teachings on physical movements, so if he could master the use of magical power, he could show amazing movements. Gus Ion took out a new cigar and put it in his mouth as if he finished talking. Yong Ho looked at him briefly and said with a smile, Gus Ion, aren't you a red demon, too? Ha! Huh. Chapter 103 Although Gus Ion asked back instinctively, he could confirm Yong Ho's reply in his face. Gus Ion put out the cigar that he had just lit. Then he looked down at Yong Ho and asked, Let me ask to double check. Are you now asking me to teach you? Well, I heard you are the strongest red demon ever. Wouldn't it be nice for me to learn from the strongest one if I had to learn it all? Gus Ion turned his mouth up at his words. He liked Yong Ho's description of him as the strongest red demon, but he had another reason. Gus Ion burst into a loud laughter for a while before opening his mouth. Man, it's the first time I've ever seen a guy like you for ages. Even Kaiwan didn't tell me to teach her. In fact, most of them around Gus Ion couldn't even speak to this guy with Herculean strength. Gus Ion corrected his posture. With his arms folded, he looked down at Yong Ho as if observing him then he immediately nodded. Okay, if you can run up to the seventh floor at once, I'll teach you. Now that Yong Ho ran up to the fourth floor, he had to cover the remaining three floors at once. 
Amun, who had been looking at them quietly, showed a little anger for the first time. Catalina looked at Yong Ho with anxious eyes because she could predict how her master would react. Okay, I accept that condition, Yong Ho replied. Gus Ion smiled big then pointed at the arena leisurely. He kept puffing out cigar smoke. He looked down at Yong Ho, who was lying on the floor of the arena like a lump. Then he said with an empty laugh as if he was dumbfounded, Man, how come you really did what I told you? It would be a lie if Gus Ion didn't expect it at all but he gave Yong Ho such a condition, thinking he would not accept it. In the arena, one was supposed to fight a stronger floor master as one moved up the floor. Moreover, the level of difficulty went up sharply, starting with the fifth floor, so Gus Ion thought that Yong Ho would crumble on the sixth floor. And even if Yong Ho managed to get up to the sixth floor, Giant Bear, the floor master on the seventh floor, was far from an easy enemy. But Yong Ho beat all of them. Granted that he skillfully used Brigada and the magical power of greed, his achievement was more than what Gusion expected. Amun was also surprised. My little master. Your greed no, your anguish is really amazing. Who could have expected your delusions brought about such enormous greed? The source of greed was desire, and Yongho's greed didn't know its end. Gusion tilted his head. Yongho asked, anguish. What the heck are you talking about? We decided to keep it a secret. Secret? Yes, a secret. Well honestly, it's a little embarrassing for me to talk about it. Embarrassing? Yong Ho wanted to cut off their conversation at once, but he was too weak to speak. His fingertips trembled. Perhaps it was because he was stung by the giant spider, Ungoliant, the floor master on the sixth floor. Master, are you okay? Can you hear my voice? Only Katarina was sincerely worried about Yong Ho. She let her ears drooped with a sad look. It's harmful. Her face was too close to him so was her breathing. Yong Ho calmed down by reciting some passages of the Buddhist scriptures that he had learned a while ago then took a big breath. After standing up with the support of Catalina, he absorbed the magical power of Mammon left by the floor master on the seventh floor. Phew! It worked. He felt that his magical power had increased, and at the same time, his body got more energized than before. He broke through the seventh floor with an unyielding spirit. Although he was out of shape in body and soul along the way, he got lots of things. It wasn't just Mammon's magical power and rewards that he got. His evolutionary skills leveled up almost entirely while he was desperately fighting with his peers or stronger beings. With little more effort, it seemed that he could achieve the next level of evolution. Above all, he remembered the promise Gus Ion made to him. You will keep the promise, won't you? Asked Yong Ho. Yes, of course. However, you're too weak to learn from me today, so if you visit me next time, I will teach you the basics first. Gus Ion was also satisfied. Honestly, he wanted to teach Yong Ho even if he didn't make the promise, for Yong Ho's growth was so fast and dazzling. By the way, do you have any good healer under your wing or something like a clinic? The injuries Yong Ho suffered in the arena were not real. However, he was mentally bruised like in the real world. A strong mental shock could inflict damage to the body, so him getting proper treatment was very important. But Yong Ho had nothing to say because the best healer in the Mammon family was Yong Ho himself. It was a long time ago when he could talk about evolution or advancement. He thought of Oris that he had just obtained, but he was staying in the free city, not in the dungeon of the Mammon family. So, Yong Ho could not use him immediately. From the looks of Yong Ho and Catalina's expressions, Gus Ion could find the answer, so he said with a sigh, All right. As we have ended up like this, we have no other choice. Gus Ion displayed his fingers in the air. As if examining a document, he rolled his eyes and said, First floor look for scat hack on the first basement floor. It was a presence on the first floor of the labyrinth of true greed at the bottom of the shallow mammon family. Catalina's eyes opened wide at the name of scat hack. Yong Ho had also seen the name in the record. Gus Ion nodded. Scat hack, the immortal witch. Among the twelve spirits of the house of mammon, she is in charge of healing. 
Perhaps because of breaking through the three floors at once, Yong Ho realized that a lot of time passed when he left the arena and returned to the dungeon of the House of Mammon. After calming down Lucia and Eligos who was nagging at him, he immediately fell into a deep sleep. How many hours passed again? Yong Ho woke up at dawn, when everyone was asleep, and left the Demon King's room. He was looking for the door of space whose construction was in progress. Since it was under construction, there was no spirit involved in it, for its external construction was almost completely finished on Kaiwan's watch. What was needed now was the maturation of the magic circle to operate the door of space, namely, enough time and magical power. Yong Ho stood at the door of the space, which looked like a portal that he had seen in games. It was in the shape of a large, round metal circle on the altar. After looking at the door of the space for a long time, Yong Ho giggled. Is it just chicken and coke that I miss the most now? Dang it! How miserable I am! He missed his parents' faces, but what occupied his mind at the moment was something to eat. It had been several months since he came to the demon world. He would be lying if he said he didn't miss them. He really wanted to go back home after riding out the danger of his life several times. But he took a big breath. He now sat down and looked at the door of space. Lucia remained silent, not to disturb Yong Ho, so did Catalina, who was seated in the hallway. After some time passed, Yong Ho stood up and turned around without any regrets. Someday he would go back home through the door of space but not now. He had no intention of leaving now, neglecting the members of the House of Mammon irresponsibly. Yong Ho himself was the head of the Mammon family as well as the new king of greed. So, you don't have to worry, he said loudly. He seemed to have heard some flapping sound from the corridor. He giggled but stepped forward without looking back. Then he moved forward. Chapter, 104 A herd of wolves went around at dawn. Originally, they should have been running after their prey. However, they smelled blood early on and gathered lots of clues from the smell. The smell suggested there were overwhelmingly more enemies than allies. Moreover, there was an unfamiliar smell mixed in that blood. The pack of wolves informed their boss that they should be prepared, but their boss was not in a hurry. Slowing down, they moved forward, sufficiently prepared. Their movement was like tranquility before the storm, which was so calm that anyone who did not know the situation would think it was just their casual walk. Embryo, the leader of the pack and the demon king of the wolves, was covered with blood all over its body, bled by the enemies. The heads of the coalition of western houses and their loyal spirits did not stop resisting in a spectacular display of grit until the last minute, but Embryo felt irritated this time because the situation was so difficult. The strategy chosen by the Western Families Coalition, expansion of the battlefield, was effective. They didn't allow Embryo to deal a final blow to crush them all. They engaged in small battles repeatedly for a war of attrition focused on getting rid of Embryo's forces, not Embryo himself. Embryo was strong, and his army was also strong, but they were not invincible. The Western Houses Coalition won the battlefield without Embryo. Embryo was alone, while there were several heads in the Western Families Coalition. The more fighting there was, the more damaging it was to Embryo. So, Embryo also changed his strategy. He forced an inevitable fight against the Western Houses Coalition, which desperately avoided fighting with the Demon King of the Wolves. Embryo attacked the dungeons. The dungeons in the west, which had been already conquered, or the dungeons in the north, located adjacent to the west, were ignored. Instead, he mobilized the troops to attack each of the dungeons of those heads of families belonging to the Western Owners Alliance. This time he did not go to the trouble of occupying the dungeons like he did in the north. After occupying the core dungeons, he thoroughly destroyed them. The heads of the Western Owners Alliance could not give up the dungeons like Embryo. The dungeons deserted by Embryo were a kind of extended bases under his command, but each of them was a home base to the heads of the Western Owner Alliance. Dungeons were different from normal fortresses and castles. So, the fall of the dungeons meant the death of the subordinate spirits registered in the dungeons. Heads of the houses and their spirits were connected to each other. In other words, they were in the same boat, protecting each other. Of course, their status was different from each other. Even if the dungeons were destroyed, their heads survived, but their subordinate spirits, 
who made the contract with their masters through the dungeons, lost their lives. The mass death of subordinate spirits greatly weakened the power of their masters. It was not symbolic but real. The weakening of their magical power even weakened their overall physical capabilities. In order to save their spirits, the masters had to cancel their registration before the dungeons fell. However, the cancellation also greatly weakened their power. The dungeons were limited, and it was not easy for the masters, who cancelled their registration, to find a new dungeon. Embryo weakened individual heads, the foundation of the Western Families Coalition. There were few family heads who could attack Embryo's dungeons while their dungeons were being attacked. It was clear that some heads of the Western Owners Alliance proposed attacking Embryo's main dungeons, but they could not easily carry out such an idea. Embryo's main dungeons were in the north, not the west. Moreover, there was no way of identifying which dungeon really belonged to Embryo. Embryo had several dungeons. Those family heads, who had multiple dungeons, could make one of them their main dungeon by investing time and magical power. It had already been a while since Embryo occupied the north, during which he could have moved his core dungeons if he had wanted. Moreover, Embryo did not have any subordinate spirit. There was some speculation that the wolves that he always took around were his subordinate spirits, but no matter how clever they were, they were mere wolves. There were few family heads who replaced their spirits, whose number was limited, with ordinary wolves. If Embryo did not have subordinate spirits, attacking his dungeons could deal a psychological blow to him, but it would not weaken his power tangibly. The heads of the Western Owners Alliance could not pursue the same strategy as Embryo's. While most of them had only one dungeon, Embryo had multiple dungeons. They had to invade the northern part, relatively far away from them, but the northern part belonged to Embryo. Moreover, it was impossible for them to attack Embryo's dungeons quickly because the target of their attack was not clear. Their crucial weakness was that they were more concerned about protecting themselves. Currently, their dungeons were exposed to destruction, but there were few heads who could dare to head out to the northern areas to fight. Such a task was like hanging the bell about the cat's neck to them. Embryo took a deep breath. Sooner or later, the heads of the Western Owners Alliance would be forced to divide from within or pursue a new strategy, which would mean their unavoidable fight with Embryo that they had so desperately avoided. They would have to face Embryo sooner or later, so they needed to be a little bit more patient until then. While Embryo led his elite troops and attacked their dungeons, the heads of the Western Owners Alliance attacked the frontline strongholds established by Embryo. Even if their dungeons were destroyed, Embryo would not suffer fatal damages like the coalition's heads. But he could not ignore the damages lightly. So, he had run desperately to defeat the task force of the heads of the Western Owners Alliance that repeated a hit and run strategy to avoid him. No matter how strong Embryo was, he couldn't maintain an army without supplies. He saw the frontline base several hundred meters away from him when he slowed down enough. As he got closer, he sized up the situation with his sharp observation. The frontline base was not destroyed. There were not many friendly forces killed compared with the enemies, who suffered heavy casualties. Looking at the number of those killed and the enemy's condition, his attack could be called a certain victory. Embryo now realized why he won. Death Knight The mighty Death Knight stood firmly against a mountain of enemy corpses. His presence was a tremendous pressure on Embryo. Indeed, he was qualified to claim the status of the strongest undead along with Elder Lich. A black full-plate armor enveloped his whole body, and a dark blue cloak resembling the night fluttered in the wind. His huge magic sword, stained with a lot of blood, emitted the aura of the wicked. He was obviously stronger than any of the family heads in the southern area. Embryo laughed bitterly. The Death Knight was certainly here to support him, but his presence was like a warning. There were more powerful beings under the Death Knight's master. Compared with the real force behind him, the Death Knight was just like the tip of the iceberg. Embryo, it looks like you were struggling to fight more than I expected. A harsh, gloomy voice rang from the ground. The voice belonged to the Surveillant, a servant of the King of Gluttony. The frontline base was now around the corner. Embryo stopped where he was. Instead of approaching his subordinates who maintained a strange distance from the Death Knight, he took a break with the wolves. He could not inform them about his meeting with the surveillant. 
It is a gift from the king. Use it well, said the surveillant. Embryo gulped. He couldn't respond, nor could he engage in a subtle war of nerves with the surveillant as usual. It was not because of the death knight's presence. Embryo looked in the sky. The surveillant laughed menacingly. Embryo's competence and agility usually rubbed him the wrong way, but this time, it gave him joy. Don't forget. The king is watching you, Embryo. The surveillant disappeared in no time. The death knight bowed to Embryo from a distance. But Embryo couldn't respond to both. Clenching his teeth, Embryo stared at the dazzling sky of the demon world. His presence beyond that cloud. The death monster surpassing the death knight. He clearly revealed the power of the six kings, who ruled the demon world. Dragon. As if responding to his quiet call, the air current in the sky changed. The mighty magical power of death disturbed the sky of the demon world. Come to your senses, brother. Just do what you have been doing. Ophelia shouted, staring straight ahead. Blue magical energy emitted from her slim, elastic calves. Eligos breathed roughly. Suppressing excitement and tension, he clenched his fists. He gathered dark red energy in both hands and was prepared for the battle. The dungeon battle lighting could not drive out all the darkness. It could only illuminate the center of the crossroads with a wide road in all directions. Skull. Skull, who was standing on the opposite side of Ophelia and Eligos, shouted loudly. The thunderbolt of greed arising from Brigada's necklace was present not only in Warhammer but also in the magic shield Yongho obtained on the fifth floor of the arena. The skull unit also shouted as their captain did. Each of them stared at the darkness while grabbing their weapons. Catalina calmly caught her breath. She controlled the magical power of greed originating from Brigada. Greed strengthened her magical power. Her black magical power was now like a blade that freely transformed itself. It was not an exaggeration to say that Catalina's body, armed with black magical power on her arms and legs as well as daggers on both hands, was now a weapon itself. Rykam and several orcs under his control kept swallowing, standing beside Catalina. They were not seen because it was dark, but it was not easy to guess how many they were, given their shouting. The goblin rangers and Baduk who stood among the orcs couldn't even breathe properly because they felt so tense. Kaya. Chapter, 105. Suddenly, a monstrous shout was heard. Then dungeon monsters charged from three directions of the crossroads. The first basement floor of the House of Mammon. The forbidden land for more than a hundred years was now occupied by the dungeon monsters. Dozens, maybe even hundreds of dungeon monsters rushed at the House of Mammon spirits. Most of them were ghouls and skeletons. There were among them who were full of blind hatred for the living. They were the Banshee and Abomination, the incarnation of horror. Eligos breathed roughly and fast. Ophelia grinned after slapping Eligos on the back. Instead of waiting, she charged at the dungeon monsters face to face. Dang it! Help me, brother! He couldn't tell her to stop if she wanted to save her life. She was like a typhoon, who penetrated deep into the ghouls and kicked them hard. It seemed that the ghouls, not Ophelia, had to shout for help. Wow! Eligos rushed after Ophelia. It wasn't because he was afraid of the consequences if he didn't rush now, though it was partly true. But he had another reason. Eligos was the butler of the Mammon family. He had to show his strength befitting his status as the great Mammon family's butler. Of course, he was a little bit, yes a tiny bit worried about Ophelia's safety. Eligos, equipped with a unique dynamic strength of a red demon beast, overwhelmed the ghouls. Eligos punching literally crushed them all at once. Awesome, brother. You look like a beast. Ophelia kicked in the air with a hearty laugh. With the energy arising from her sharp toes, she cut several ghouls with the blade of magical power. Skull, Skull. Skull, who was standing on the opposite side, also showed off his bravery. He didn't stop at merely smashing the ghouls with a battle hammer with a lightning strike. The magical power of greed soared from Brigada that Skull had on his neck. Skull, a skeleton magic knight, concentrated its magic on the hammer. 
he struck the ground at once to release a tremendous lightning strike. Dozens of lightning strikes that were spreading around the attacking point covered the entire corridor. Not only the ghouls but even the banshee, which could be said to be almost an astral body, could not avoid the lightning strike. The bodies of the ghouls exploded here and there because they could not overcome the impact of the lightning strike. Banshee's astral body was scattered in the air. Skull shouted again, Skull! Skull! It was a rush order. At the captain's order, the Skull unit invaded the place that had been devastated by the lightning strikes and wiped out the dungeon monsters. Under the command of June, the only female goblin, the goblin rangers fought in an organized manner. Baduk, with a bamboo spear, joined them, so June made a new formation including Baduk to tackle the ghouls. They weren't greedy. They held their places as if they were defending their positions in a basketball game. The goblin rangers were not in their element when it came to the offensive. Rykam and the orcs were excited as they were engaged in a real fight after a long time. No matter what others said, the orcs were born fighters. But this time, they had to take a step back. There was a great wall between the ghouls and them. Catalina ran through the darkness. With the blood of the dark elf running through her body, she could see through the darkness. Inheriting the blood of the succubus, she could control the magical power of greed with amazing sensitivity. She was a shadow runner. Darkness was her friend, not her enemy. Not only the floor but also the walls and ceiling were her fighting stages. Running through the walls and kicking the ceiling to penetrate into the ghouls, she rotated herself where she was and swung her arms in an instant, she released the power of her black magic. The blade of the shadow raged. Soaking in the magic of greed, it stretched over a few meters and broke everything that stood in the way. Banshee, the semi-spirit, couldn't avoid the blade of the shadow, and neither could Abomination, whose thick skin denied the attack of a normal blade. The blade of the shadow changed its shape freely. Sometimes it was a giant reaper's scythe. Sometimes it was a sharp scimitar. Thanks to Catalina's mobility, which occurred almost instantly, the fighting was as good as a wide-range attack. Wow! Way to go! Standing carefree among the spirits fighting against the enemies charging from three directions, Yong Ho clapped and cheered them. Salami, standing by his side, looked at him incredulously, but he did not intend to join them in the intense fighting. It wasn't a matter of Yong Ho alone becoming strong. The spirits under his control had to be strong as well. The best way to accumulate evolution EXP was the experience of real fighting that risked one's life. The more powerful the opponent and the more fierce the battle was, the more evolution EXP one could get. Moreover, he needed to be more adept at using Brigada. Yong Ho looked at Catalina closely, in particular. He was impressed by Eligo's fighting like a beast, but Catalina's progress stood out. He felt she could really challenge the first floor of the arena with her current skills. The ground shook. Dungeon monsters appeared from another direction of the crossroads. As if to make up for their absence from the fighting until now, their numbers were several times more compared to the monsters from other directions. Yong Ho turned to them. He wasn't afraid even though dozens of ghouls were charging toward him. He reached out in the air and grabbed Amun, the Red Lotus Demon Spear. Let's go, Salami, Yong Ho said, and Salami understood it. Regretting the absence of its rival Bucephalus here, Salami gathered all the magical power. Yong Ho did not run. Instead, he concentrated the power of greed on the tip of Amon. Kaya. Ghouls popped out of the dark. Yong Ho pulled Amon and stepped forward, trampling on the ground strongly. Salami also opened its mouth wide to emit flames. The mouth of greed swallowed the flames of Salami. The one direction of the crossroads, namely the entire wide corridor, was engulfed with the waves of sparks. Not only the ghouls but also the darkness itself was driven out. Since it was the sparks of enormous magical power, those who were fighting in the other three directions had no choice but to look back for a moment. And they all smiled. The air was on fire. The burning smell filled the hallways, and all the spirits soon had to refocus on their fighting while frowning. Yong Ho also frowned, but he was still smiling. How much time had passed? The moment Eligos smashed the last remaining ghoul's head with a fist, 
they heard Lucia's voice that they had been waiting for earnestly. The first basement floor of the Mammon family has been occupied. I'll supply the magical power from now on. Magical light poured out from the ceiling. Faced with the light, Yong Ho looked around. Then he met the eyes of those spirits belonging to the Mammon family, which were ebbing away from it, avoiding the light. The first basement floor of the Mammon family. The exploration of the labyrinth of greed, the giant castle of Mammon, the king of greed, was about to begin now. After they won the battle and occupied the hall on the first floor, Yong Ho began to send the spirits upstairs, which didn't know about the truth. The orcs, including Rykam, did not know much about the labyrinth of greed. Goblin rangers and Baduk also thought that this battle was part of the operation to recover Kaiwan's legacy, as it always had been. However, it was impossible to cheat them forever. According to Amun and Gus Ion, this was the beginning of the labyrinth of true greed, not the fake one. Therefore, there was a possibility that a truly great facility or artifact could be discovered. Even if Kaiwan was the best of the dungeon heads for the past few generations, it didn't make sense that she achieved all of this during her reign, spanning ten years or so. Apart from Baduk or other goblins, it was possible that June or Rykam, who had smart brains, would detect the truth. It wasn't that he couldn't trust Rykam or the goblin rangers. But he had to have the worst situation in mind. If the existence of the labyrinth of greed was known even by mere chance, not only Yong Ho but also all the spirits of the House of Mammon would be in danger. Except for the subordinate spirits, all of the others returned to the ground floor. After confirming that the passage connecting the ground floor and the first basement floor was tightly closed, Yong Ho felt relieved and looked around the area. It was a large space. The square space, the center of the crossroads, was large enough for a basketball match. The straight corridor was also wide enough for five or six adult men to walk shoulder to shoulder. This is indeed the dungeon of the House of Mammon. Ophelia did not hide her admiration. When she showed curiosity like that, she looked like a pure girl, not a veteran pub mistress who had gone through ups and downs. In a way, her reaction was natural. Before starting the exploration, Yong Ho confessed the truth to his subordinate spirits. They were in the same boat as him, sharing his fate. Moreover, they were supposed to continue to explore the labyrinth of greed with Yong Ho. That was why he confessed the truth. He confessed the existence of the labyrinth of greed to four people. It was in the same vein that Ophelia was more excited than usual during the battle. In fact, she had been seized with all kinds of delusions after hearing from her father, Endelian, about the depths of the Mammon family. So, it was natural for her to get excited because she realized that the identity of the depths was nothing but the labyrinth of greed. Chapter, 106 Eligos also looked around and moved a lot. Catalina also did the same. Even though she was aware of the existence of the labyrinth of greed even before Yong Ho's confession after hearing relevant stories while coming and going to the arena, she wiggled her tail violently in excitement. It was only Skull that remained calm. Actually, it was so calm that it was rolling on the ground. It was quite a scene Yong Ho saw after a long time. As you all have experienced, there are many dungeon monsters. Some more might be in hiding, so you have to be careful of their traps, too. There were almost no records on the labyrinth of greed in the archives of the Mammon family. Since they had to hide the identity of the labyrinth of greed, the successive owners of the House of Mammon handed down its information to their descendants only orally. It was obvious that the relevant records were missing. What was handed down to them until Kaiwan's era was the existence of the Labyrinth of Greed, as well as the twelve spirits of the Mammon family somewhere in its depths. Catalina and Eligos became nervous at the word trap. If this was the first floor, it's supposed to contain the most traps, to say the least, because it was the first line of defense against the enemy infiltrating the dungeon. Yong Ho smiled bitterly at Catalina and Eligos when they erected their tails as if to show they were extremely nervous at the moment. Then he looked back at the owner of the third tail, who was moving it cheerfully. Don't you think the traps won't work properly, do you? Maybe not. That's why the dungeon monsters were moving around in droves like that. Of course, we can't afford to let our guard down, said Ophelia. Having said that, she caught her breath calmly. She knew she was going to embark on exploration, not tourism. 
What Yong Ho needed now was not a girl with twinkling green eyes, but a veteran tavern hostess. Eligo said, Scothatch has another name, Aquarius, in addition to her different name Immortal Witch. Accordingly, she has so many anecdotes related to water. I may take things easy, but if there is a residence for Scathack somewhere near here, it might be a water-related place. Although there were few records on the Labyrinth of Greed, the records on the twelve spirits of the Mammon family were overflowing. They were powerful demons that left their names in the history of the demon world even before they became the spirits of the Mammon family. Scathack in the legend was a witch, who handled water and life. She was so deeply related to water that it was not an exaggeration to say that all the records about her started and ended with water. Yong Ho nodded and said, that makes sense. Let me keep it in mind. Good job, Eligos. Eligos smiled in satisfaction at his praise. Though he was not as pleased as Catalina, his wagging tail showed he was happy. I think I have to praise him more often. Yong Ho made up his mind like that then turned his gaze to Ophelia to seek her opinion, too. But Skull came into his eyes again when he did that because the way he rolled on the floor was somewhat different than usual. Skull. Skull, Skull, Skull responded, raising his body. It still couldn't understand Yong Ho, but they could barely communicate as the dungeon head and his subordinate. Yong Ho could understand its meaning roughly. When Yong Ho approached and checked it, there was moss sprouting through the cracks of the floor. It's moss, said Ophelia, who had approached him before he realized it. Catalina also nodded. Finally, Eligos looked at Skull before turning to Yong Ho in no time. Yes, it's moss. Indeed, it was moss. There was nothing unusual about it. Yong Ho narrowed his eyebrows and soon understood why Skull paid attention to the moss. The moss was growing in only one direction of the crossroads. There was no moss in the center of the hall. No moss could be found in the other three directions. There was moss growing in only one direction, and the farther he looked, the more moss he could see. Moisture, said Yong Ho. Skull nodded with a hearty laugh. Even a little bit of water was needed for the moss to grow. Yong Ho thought for a moment then looked up and asked Lucia, Lucia. Can you tell me where the source of water is based on where you're standing now? The same direction as the moss is growing now. The waterway on the first floor of the dungeon of the Mammon family used groundwater as its source. Be it the labyrinth of greed or groundwater, it was certainly located under the first floor. If Scathack was in a water-related place like Eligo said, it was most likely to be near the source of the water. Of course, the situation would be different if Scathack built a waterway as she did on the first floor of the dungeon to supply water to other places. However, Yong Ho shook his head. The first basement floor had been sealed for nearly a hundred years. Even if there was a waterway or any other facility, it was unlikely that they were operating properly. Ophelia, what do you think of what Eligo said? I agree with my brother's opinion. It's highly likely that Scathack is residing in a watery place. She replied immediately. Smiling at Skull, Yong Ho nodded again this time and said, Nice job. He now realized why Skull rolled on the floor. Skull laughed in satisfaction. He was as happy as Eligos. Okay, shall we start? Now, Yong Ho located the direction where there was the source of the water. He closed his eyes and activated the power of greed. What he wanted was Scathack, the immortal witch. He specified her images as much as possible and put together all the information he knew about her. His wild greed, exploding in all directions, converged into one. Then he went forward without hesitation. Catalina and Eligos pulled out the lighting equipment for dungeon exploration to brighten the place. They started exploring the labyrinth of greed. About five minutes after their expedition began, Yong Ho and his subordinate spirits were quite embarrassed because the path was too simple. It was just a straight path. There were no crossroads, which were so common, let alone corners. The traps that they were worried about in the first place were the same. There were entrances leading to small rooms on either side of the path, but they only looked straight. Another five minutes passed, and Yong Ho reached the end of the corridor. They stopped at a door almost as large as the width of the corridor. It was a door with a large tree embossed on it. 
Ophelia and Eligos grabbed the handles of the door, respectively, while Catalina and Skull stood on both sides of Yongho. Yongho also embodied Amun in case of any danger. They exchanged glances quickly. When Yongho nodded, Ophelia and Eligos, who exchanged glances lastly, opened the door. Light poured out from inside. Moreover, the light greatly embarrassed them. It wasn't just light or lighting. Is it sunlight? Yongho blurted out before he knew it, and Ophelia, frowning at the sudden light in the dark, sniffed about. It smelled like water as well as dirt. The fragrant smell of grass tickled her nose. A meadow spread out inside the door. How could anybody imagine they were inside a dungeon? Swallowing, Yongho took a step inside the door. The wind blew. It was a wind with the smell of grass. There was a sky on the high ceiling that seemed to be at least 30 meters tall. It was the blue sky of the human world, not that of the demon world mixed with various colors. Is it biosphere? It was an artificial ecosystem that could be seen in a movie. It was weird, indeed. He could recognize that there was a ceiling, and the sky clearly stretched out in it. Then, is that an artificial sun? Warm sunlight was pouring down from a pile of light, shining in the middle of the sky. He never imagined that he would see such a spectacular sight in a dungeon like this. Suppressing his excitement, he looked around calmly. It was vast, first of all. It was a space that seemed to be hundreds of meters in diameter. There was real dirt on the ground, with even bugs and small animals on it. Catalina pointed to a corner with a blank expression. Yong Ho, who looked at it, also blinked. There was a lake. Since it was such a vast place, the lake was far from small. And there was an island in the middle of the lake. It was an island covered with ice as if to ignore the temperature inside, which was warm enough to be spring weather. Yong Ho again focused on greed. As expected, greed stretched toward the ice island. Turning Amun back into the shape of a bracelet, he stepped toward the ice island. He hesitated for a moment in front of the small wooden bridge connecting the edge of the lake and the ice island, but he soon made a decision. Confronting Mammon's twelve spirits carried a big risk. Chapter 107 One could not be sure how true it was, but among the stories that had been passed down to the Mammon family was one about those who confronted Mammon's twelve spirits but got killed for failing to pass their test. However, Yongho did not hesitate. He trusted Amun and Gusayan. If Skathak had been too dangerous for Yongho, the two would not have recommended him to meet her. The island itself was not made of ice. Only the surface of the island as well as a building that resembled a small temple in the middle of the island were covered with ice. Yongho's subordinate spirits naturally posed themselves for fighting. Instead of picking Amun, he activated the flame of greed, which opened the path by melting ice. It was as if the snow was melting. The ice blocking the entrance to the temple also melted quickly as soon as it touched the flame of greed. He felt that the ice was reacting to greed itself, not heat. Ophelia and Eligos opened the door this time, too. The sunlight pouring from the sky naturally lit the inside of the temple. All kinds of light sparkled from the colorful stained glass on the ceiling. And a blue beauty was sitting on the frozen throne underneath it with her chin resting on her hand. Just like everything else on the island, she was also covered with ice. Yongho was confident that she was Skathak, the immortal witch. When he first took Mammon's magic on the first floor of the arena, he saw her face. She was a beauty with blue hair, holding a water bottle. She could never die thanks to her transcendental vitality. She opened her eyes. Amid the melting ice, Skathak lifted her head and opened her lips, hello. She said just one word. Yongho instinctively felt that the test began. Something intense passed through their souls. Yongho, who closed his eyes instinctively, opened his eyes again in a strange familiarity. Everyone fell on the floor. Eligos and Catalina fell to the floor, motionless as if they passed over, while Ophelia was moaning, short of breath. Even Skull fell and wriggled on the floor without standing up properly. Skathak blinked then said in an embarrassed voice, Uh. Are you alright? Really? Even before Yong Ho could respond, Skathak showed her strength once again. 
This time, too, something intense passed through Yong Ho's soul, and he finally realized what it was. He seemed to know why it was familiar to him. It was the real experience of death. Scat Hack shocked everyone in Yong Ho's group strongly enough to make them feel they experienced a dozen deaths. So, it was natural that they fell down. The test was hard for not only Ophelia, who was trained with psychological magic, but also Skull, who had already experienced death once. But the test was too easy for Yong Ho. He looked back at Amun that positioned itself on his right arm before he knew. As for the experience of death, he experienced it more than three dozen times. Every time he practiced with Amun, he had to die at least fifteen times. It might sound strange, but Yong Ho got used to death. They knew it. They already knew what Scat Hakka's test was. That was why not only Gus Ion but Amun didn't mention the test to him at all. Because of dozens of similar near-death experiences, even Ophelia and Skull passed out. Scat Hack looked at Yong Ho, who was still in good shape, with a strange expression then raised her hand again. Yong Ho urgently stopped her action. Wait a moment. I have something to give you. This is a letter from the owner of the arena, Gus Ion with superhuman strength. Having said that quickly, he searched for something. However, he stopped moving his hand when Scat Hack responded quickly, Uh. It's from my sweetheart. Your sweetheart. He unwittingly asked back, and she nodded with a cheerful smile. Yes, my sweetheart, my love. Yong Ho recalled Gyuzhen's face when he gave him the letter. He seemed to know why Gus Ion made such an expression at that time. Her eyes were like those of a zebra before it was eaten by a lion. Gosh, is her memory distorted? Scathack was a beauty who seemed to have a very pleasing personality. She was almost as tall as Yong Ho, about 180 centimeters in height, but the ratio of her body was so good that he didn't think she was that tall. Moreover, Gus Ion, Scat Hacka's alleged boyfriend, was a giant, who was over two meters tall. Standing side by side, they would probably look good as a couple. Scat Hack read the letter carefully twice, no, three times. Given that she was smiling, with one hand on her cheek, she seemed to be happy about the contents of the letter very much. It doesn't look like a love letter, Yong Ho thought. The man who wrote the letter was none other than Gus Ion. Yong Ho couldn't even imagine that clunky man sitting at his desk and writing a love letter. Oh, maybe he could. Yong Ho thought there was something cute about him. But Yong Ho shook his head soon. After stopping such idle delusions, he examined his subordinate spirits lying on the floor. Gently patting Catalina's wobbly tail, he turned to Scat Hack. Is this really good? It's okay, it's good. You might feel shocked, but it doesn't do any harm to your body, and it has no side effects. I am not a person who is hard on you. While talking gibberish like that and waving her hand, she finally folded the letter. Even after reading it several times, she bit her lips slightly as if she still wanted to keep reading. It took about several minutes for her to put it on the handle of the chair. He thought that given her behavior, she was far from Mammon's twelve spirits like Amun or Gus Ion. When he felt Scat Hacka's test began, he felt some powerful magic at the moment, but it was a very short moment, so he didn't remember it. Right now, the only thing that Yong Ho saw was a blue china dress, which was torn off on both sides to reveal her legs, a pure white fur wrapped around her neck and shoulders, and her sky-blue hair tied up in a knot beautifully. Hmm. I see. You're my little master, according to him, said Scat Hack, lightly clearing her throat. Given her use of the title Little Master referring to him, Yong Ho thought she was Gyuzhen's girlfriend. Good to see you. Let me introduce myself again. I am Scat Hack, the immortal witch. I'm one of the twelve spirits serving Mammon, the king of greed, and a gardener who manages the Garden of Life. Then she asked for a handshake, smiling brightly at him. Yong Ho was rather embarrassed because this was the first time he met her, which was so different from his encounter with Amun or Gus Ion. Well, come to think of it, isn't this normal? He thought. Rather, Amun and Gus Ion were the ones who were abnormal since they abruptly shook hands with him. Yong Ho gladly held her hand. He introduced himself, meeting her blue eyes. I'm Yong Ho Chan, the head of the House of Mammon. 
Scat Hacka's hand was cold, but it felt good. Since she didn't let go of his hand even after shaking hands, he had no choice but to withdraw his hand first. He changed the topic as if to hide his awkwardness. As for the Garden of Life are you talking about this place? To tell you more precisely, it refers to the whole ground floor. Well, all the spirits who came with you fell asleep. To be honest with you, since you're the head of the Mammon family, it's the first floor of the Labyrinth of Greed. Scathack slightly winked at him. Somehow, it looked like she could easily answer his questions, so he dared to ask her one of the questions that he had been curious about for a long time. How many floors are there in the Labyrinth of Greed? Ah. Uh, has such a basic record been missing? Sorry to ask you, but what is the number of the head of your family? Do you know the name of any previous family head? How much time has passed? She asked, tilting her head continuously, which embarrassed him again. Oh, what is the number of my family head anyway? He had never asked himself about it. Even when he looked at the family tree, he was content with checking out the family heads, but he never paid any attention to the number of the family heads. Since he overlooked the names of the previous heads, he could not remember any name. After all, he replied carefully, narrowing his eyebrows, You don't know Kai Wan, do you? Don't know. Since she didn't even know Kai Wan, it was impossible she knew Kayan. So, Yong Ho stopped asking and tried in a different way. More than a thousand years have passed since Mammon, the King of Greed, disappeared. Skat Hakka's eyes trembled for a moment. Chapter 108. Although the passage of time was ambiguous, she was different from Gus Ion, who was always awake in the arena while she had been asleep. Gosh, it seems that time has passed much more than I expected. She barely opened her mouth, but she was obviously embarrassed. Maybe the smile that she had shown to him until now was a little exaggerated. She closed her eyes once. And when she opened her eyes again, she smiled a bright smile like before and said, the labyrinth of greed has a total of thirteen floors. As you may have already noticed, each of Mammon's twelve spirits is in charge of one floor. The thirteenth floor belongs to Mammon. She was not done yet. She stopped talking for a moment then pointed to Yong Ho's arm with her eyes. Amon has no floor to take care of because that guy is a little special. Yong Ho looked at the bracelet anew. So, he asked what came up to his mind naturally. Which floor is Gus Ion in charge of? Seventh floor. His own arena is there. Other floors are unique, but his floor is especially unique. Well, you can call it a totally different space. What she said made sense. That was what Yong Ho always felt whenever he passed the long corridor leading to the arena. Yong Ho looked around for a moment. There were many large windows in the small temple Skathaka's residence. The sunlight pouring over the window was warm. You said it was a garden, right? Yes, the Garden of Life. Since the Labyrinth of Greed is the residence of Mammon, the King of Greed, isn't it natural that the first floor should be a garden? The Garden of Life wasn't just a symbolic name. So, Yong Ho responded instinctively, Oh, that's why there was no trap. Yes, it is none other than the Garden of the King of Greed, which leads to his palace. Wouldn't it be a good place if we didn't talk about any dreadful stuff? There were no traps on the first floor. It was literally a space open to people who came to the garden or the house. The most thorough defense of the dungeon's entrance was the basis of the dungeon's defense. However, the labyrinth of greed, Mammon's residence, completely ignored the basics completely. So, this is the king's garden. As the residence of the greatest king in the history of the demon world, it symbolized his act of differentiating himself from other kings, which was arrogant and imperious. That was why it was appropriate for the king, Yong Ho thought. Skathak looked into Yong Ho gently then grinned with her arms folded. Okay, I like you, little master. So, let's talk a bit officially. Congratulations on passing the first test. The first test. That means you have a second test. Well, of course. Did you think you could be the master of this place by simply enduring a near-death experience? She said with a smile. However, the moment she finished talking, a huge magical power filled the palace. It was a magical power with a terrible chill that seemed to freeze everything in the world. 
and Yong Ho realized that it didn't just fill the palace. The magical power was tightly controlled. The magical power released by Skathak surrounded only Yong Ho, giving him a sense of pressure as if the whole world was collapsing. He might have died from suffocation in the past, but not anymore. He found the flow even under the pressure of magical power that seemed to allow for any loophole. Instead of resisting her magical power, he released the flame of greed and adapted to the flow. He mixed it with her magical power. The magical power that suppressed him naturally dissipated. His whole body was soaked with sweat. Although it took only a dozen seconds, he felt like he consumed more than half of his mental power. She was still looking at him. Then she withdrew her smile and slowly closed her eyes. She bowed to him and said, Forgive my rudeness, head of the Mammon family. You, the descendant of the great family. The flow was similar to Gyuzhin's but different. Yongho replied relatively calmly after taking back the flame of greed. I forgive you. He didn't care about his croaky voice when he said that to her. Skathak understood why Gusayan used the title Little Master for Yongho. She stretched her back to stand up and said cheerfully, Since you have passed the first test, the Garden of Life is now yours, Little Master. You can do whatever you want here. Besides, you can freely use this island, the Sanctuary of Healing. Her change of attitude was very swift. So much so that Yong Ho might have been curious if he had not forgiven her. As if she already noticed the subtle change in his look, she continued quickly, This is the palace that the King of Greed has presented to me. In this palace, I can share my overflowing vitality with others. As long as you were not killed, I could heal your wounds, though it would take some time. This would be no exception even if any part of your body was amputated. I can also shake off your mental fatigue. Your spirits, who have fallen, will be healed here cleanly, so don't worry. Indeed, it's exactly what Gus Ion said to him. This was a place that would be of great help to the Mammon family with no proper therapist. I saw a crossroad in the middle. Can I see the same space like this one even if I go another way? Just like the Garden of Life. You're supposed to, according to the original design. But I'm not sure because hundreds of years have passed already, as you said. I think I could keep this place because of my magical power, but don't you think other places were devastated? Then, all you have to do is supply magical power to restore them. But it was more easily said than done. He couldn't feel Lucia as if he entered the arena. Perhaps, the area that Lucia could control at the moment was only the first floor's hall. What about the rooms attached to the corridor? Aren't they almost like a warehouse? I basically can't go outside this garden. I don't know what the previous family heads had renovated here. She shrugged her shoulders then sat down on the chair again. She then said while gently picking up Gyuzhin's letter, therefore, let me announce the second and final test. Then the letter in her hand pointed to the floor. Her action carried an ambiguous meaning. Bring my sweetheart here. Then you can be my new master. Can you do it? Gus Ion could not leave the arena, so there was only one way to get him out of the arena and bring him here. It was for Yong Ho to be the new owner of the arena and free all the spirits out of it. It will take some time but I can. She laughed at his answer and said in a gentle voice, I really hope it won't take much time, seriously. Although she was laughing, she was obviously concerned. Yong Ho seemed to notice her embarrassed look when she realized that hundreds of years had already passed. Did Mammon trap his twelve spirits in the labyrinth of greed because he was greedy? If that was true, why did they still show unchanging affection for Mammon? Amon or Gus Ion didn't answer his question. He felt Skathak would not either. Instead of facing her, Yong Ho turned around and looked out the window. There was a lake shining brightly under the sunlight and a fertile land beyond it. It was an affluent land that could not be easily found in the demon world. Have you decided what to do in the Garden of Life? Skathak asked from behind his back. Yong Ho nodded slowly. Hey, you know this is the Garden of Life, right? Of course. Two days have passed since Yong Ho became the owner of the Garden of Life. As soon as he met with Skathak, Yong Ho, who had access to the virtual space of the dungeon merchants, looked at the farm with a proud expression. A dozen of skeleton soldiers he acquired were slowly plowing the field. 
Until now, the House of Mammon has purchased all the ingredients from the virtual space. In fact, the House of Mammon didn't do this. Almost all the dungeon heads in the southern areas were dependent on food from the dungeon markets. The lands in the demon world were barren. Growing grains was not easy. But the Garden of Life was different. The land was fertile, there was plenty of sunlight, and water was right next to it. It was impossible to achieve complete self-sufficiency here, but it was possible to considerably lower dependence on dungeon market's food. Besides, farming was one of the tasks that could help him accumulate evolutionary EXP. Scathack made a long face when she looked at the undead, a symbol of death, farming in the Garden of Life. Covering her nose with one hand, she complained, they stink. They are sleeping all day anyway. Well, that's a different matter. When Yong Ho wasn't there, she sat back in her chair and fell into a deep sleep. It seemed like she hadn't had a lot of sleep from the beginning. Also, she seemed to have consumed a considerable amount of magic power to maintain the Garden of Life. Yong Ho said with a laugh as if to ignore her complaint, Anyway, you can make grains grow faster, right? She pouted but didn't say she couldn't. Yong Ho looked at the farm again happily. He was really happy to see Eligoza's face, who stood in the middle of the farm, commanding the skeletons as if he owned the whole world. Well, this is my first time seeing the House of Mammon's head in a thousand years. Not caring much about what she said, which he actually seemed to have heard from Gus Ion, Yong Ho left her place. He got the healer in Scathack and acquired a farm that he didn't expect, but he could not afford to be complacent now. Embryo was coming from the west. So, Yong Ho had to be prepared to stop him. His next goal was to secure a dungeon of the House of Randolph, which he would use as a shield to protect the West. Yong Ho stepped forward to get out of the labyrinth of greed. Chapter, 109 Oh, good. It looks like you are a very quick learner because you are good at controlling magical power. Gus Ion, sitting on the chair in the waiting room, clapped loudly. Yong Ho took a deep breath. Ignoring Gyuzhin's voice that broke his concentration, he circulated his magical power once again. What Gus Ion asked of him was to let the magic power run constantly. His request was very easy but difficult to meet. The magical power of the demon world was like a living creature. Even the magical power concentrated in one place was supposed to constantly pulsate and move. However, the movement was disorderly, and in fact, it was often meaningless. What Gus Ion asked for was not such a pointless movement, but a purposeful movement. In other words, it was the flow of magical power that could harmonize with the movement of the body for their synergy effect. It was a piece of cake for Yong Ho to make the magic flow in the desired direction. It was an easy request. However, Jujin's other condition made it much more difficult to meet his request. Gus Ion wanted Yong Ho to control his magical power unconsciously. Just as people didn't think about how to move bones and muscles when they moved their hands, he demanded that Yong Ho put his magic to work naturally according to his movement. That was the basics. It was necessary for Yong Ho to embody the movement of his magical power, just like those in the demon world. Yong Ho moved his hand. Perhaps because his repetitive training was efficient, he could move his magical power without being conscious of it. Merely moving his hand made him feel more empowered than before. I think I had better start training you when you don't feel that your magical power is different from before, said Gus Ion. Gus Ion could point it out because he accurately discerned Yong Ho's condition. Indeed, he was one of Mammon's twelve spirits. Yong Ho smiled bitterly. Although he knew well that Gus Ion was awesome, he didn't want to admit it somehow. It wasn't because he had any bad feelings toward Gus Ion like he did at first. Rather, it was because he was now close to Gus Ion now. So, did you finish writing a reply to Scathack? Yong Ho asked him sharply, and Gus Ion flinched at that. Gus Ion was away from his place with excuses that he was writing a reply when Yong Ho was fighting with the floor master on the eighth floor or practicing alone in the waiting room. Gus Ion, who was getting nervous as if he was a criminal under interrogation, quickly changed the topic and said, So, your escort girl wants to challenge them in the arena. She made a big decision. Yong Ho laughed happily because Gus Ion obviously wanted to avoid his question. Nodding once, Yong Ho said, Well, it's Catalina's choice. 
and I think she can do it without any problem. She has become strong just like I did. By the way, did you write the reply? Since Yong Ho talked more than he expected, Gus Ion frowned at his last words. After hesitating for a while, he took out a letter from the inner pocket of his coat. Here you go. The letter sealed by melted wax gave him a pretty antique feel. Yong Ho received Gyuzhin's reply to Skathak, but Gus Ion didn't let go of his hand. Still holding on to the letter, Gus Ion looked at Yong Ho and whispered with a serious expression, Don't read it. Never. I promise you. Never. After replying as seriously as Gus Ion, Yong Ho snatched it from him and put it inside his pocket. Well, Skathak recites it to me anyway. At that moment, Gyuzhin's expression changed dramatically. Yong Ho was prepared for a situation where this giant red demon rushed to take back the letter, but fortunately, he didn't do it. That did not happen. Gus Ion helplessly sat on the chair like a man who gave up everything. While tilting his head, Yong Ho sat down next to Gus Ion and asked, What's wrong with Skathak? She's nice and pretty. You seem to like it secretly, said Yong Ho seriously. She had a good personality befitting her legendary reputation as the best among the twelve spirits of the House of Mammon. It was true that she was a dazzling beauty, though she wasn't as beautiful as Citri. Sakathak was a bit of an idiot, but she was still attractive enough to anybody. Gus Ion smiled with an empty expression then shook his head. Looking down at Yong Ho, he said, I like her but it's scary at night when I'm with her. What did you say? Gus Ion clicked his tongue. Then he said, waving his hand at Yong Ho, who opened his eyes wide, you do not yet know the true depth of the night. You're not ready. You are still a rookie. It seems like you haven't even started it at all. Well, maybe that's why you can create such strong anguish and longing. Amun, who remained silent until then, suddenly intervened. Gyuzhin's eyes popped up at his heavy and serious voice this time. Uh. What do you mean he hasn't even started it? Whatever. Next time I come here, Catalina will challenge the first floor instead of me. I'm going to challenge the ninth floor after that. This time, Yong Ho quickly changed the topic. Gus Ian alternately looked at Yong Ho and Amon with suspicious eyes, but Amon did not show any particular feelings while Yong Ho also desperately avoided Gyuzhin's gaze. Gus Ian, who tilted his head several times, banished his doubts in no time and replied, Yes, in order to bring out Brigada's true power, the strength of your subordinate, namely your spirits, is also important. The real power of Brigada? Not yet. Let me tell you about it when you reach the next level. If you try to run before even walking, you will fall. Gus Ion looked like a man, and he was actually big-hearted. However, he was unusually inflexible now. However, Yong Ho gently accepted what he said. Since it was time to leave the arena, he asked Gus Ion, how about Kai Wan's condition? Well, she is still recovering but smoothly. So, you won't have to worry. Gus Ion wasn't the type of man who told useless lies. As he said, she was recovering really smoothly. If so, she might as well show her face at least once, Yong Ho thought. But he stopped thinking like that anymore and stood up. Okay, let me come back next time. When Yong Ho opened the door of the waiting room, a man in a beast mask appeared as if he had been waiting. Standing beside him was Catalina, who was training in another waiting room. He looked sharp. Even though he was hidden in a sheath called Catalina, the blade named Black Magic seemed to give off a sharp light. Yong Ho reached out and stroked Catalina's hair. Whenever he touched her hair, the sharpness of the Black Magic gently gave away. Catalina's expression, which became unusually hardened, also changed gently. Let's go back. Yes, Lord. Catalina replied, flapping her tail, who now went back to normal. Yong Ho also smiled happily then stepped forward with her. It was when he was about to get out of the waiting room when Gus Ion stopped him. Hey, little master. When Yong Ho turned around, Gus Ion folded his arms after a little pause, he said, Kai Wan is the floor master on the tenth floor. And the reward on the tenth floor is special so is the penalty. Yong Ho was currently staying on the eighth floor. 
There was only one floor left for him to finish to move up to the tenth floor. When he returned to Kaiwan's break room through the long corridor of the arena, Yong Ho could shake off all the agitation in his heart. He didn't need to be particularly nervous because he would have to confront Kaiwan. Rather, what was important was the specialness of the reward and punishment rather than the fact that the opponent was Kaiwan. He could not yet know the rewards and the penalty. However, it was clear that he had to be more prepared than usual. Master, what happened to you in the arena? You look pale. As soon as he got connected to Lucia again after leaving the arena, her voice was heard. Since her voice sounded quite worried, he responded brightly, No, nothing happened. I'm just a little tired. Didn't anything unusual happen in the dungeon? Your subordinate spirit, Ophelia, who went as an envoy to the house of Randolt, returned. I think she came back with their reply to our surrender advice. She came back quickly. She really did. Ophelia's mission was to deliver a surrender advice, not get their reply. So, the fact that she got the reply meant that the head of the Randolt family replied quickly. Maybe they had already prepared the reply even before Ophelia arrived. Where is she now? Well, she is relieving fatigue by sparring with Elagos, a subordinate spirit. I will have her come to the conference room right now. Yong Ho didn't know what her sparring with Elagos had to do with her releasing fatigue, but he felt relieved anyway. If something big happened to him, he would not have anybody to contact because he was in the arena, but at least Ophelia was there, sparring with Elagos leisurely. I have to hurry. Let's hurry up, Catalina. Catalina quickly nodded then headed to the conference room with Yong Ho. Chapter, 110 The head of the house of Randolt was already anticipating that I would come. To tell you more specifically, he knew I would come with a surrender advice written by the Mammon family. That was what Yong Ho expected. So, he asked back, what is their reaction? They were relatively calm. Here is the reply from the head of the house of Randolt. Ophelia took out a letter from her inside jacket. It was sealed more strictly than the one Gus Ion sent to Scathack. Instead of handing out the letter to him, she pulled it toward her chest and said with a serious expression, it's an ordinary letter imbued with no magical power. However, maybe there is something like poison on it. Please allow me to open it first. Just because magic existed, it didn't mean that all traps should be set only by magic. It was possible that somebody could have put a poisonous powder inside the letter, or they could have poisoned the corner of a letter. Remembering the letter poisoned with anthrax in the news some time ago, Yong Ho frowned because he didn't like the fact that Ophelia was to check out the letter at the risk of her life. But Ophelia had a determined expression on her face. So, he eventually nodded. Okay, go ahead. Thank you. She took out a knife. She cut the envelope itself and examined the letter very closely. It was almost ten minutes or more after Yong Ho received the letter from her. He is demanding a duel with me. What's written in the letter was very concise. To summarize it, it was as follows. Reviewing the letter after Yong Ho, Eligos narrowed his eyebrows and said, So, he wants to have it out with you in a duel. He is determined to fight to the end if I reject, right? The head of the House of Randolph's challenge to a duel was something Yong Ho didn't expect at all. Reading the letter last, Rykam said, Well, it's my own guess, but don't you think he has offered the duel merely to save his face? Saving his face. Yes, because it isn't good for the Randolt family head to surrender without any fight. His pride might feel offended in that case. Rykam had a point to some extent. As he said, it was quite understandable that the loser would become the winner's subordinate. What do you think of it, Ophelia? Ophelia bit her lower lip before answering right away. She did so whenever she said something somewhat negatively. After taking a deep breath, she said calmly, as I reported to you the other day, the head of the house of Randolt is just stuck in his own dungeon, so much so that he is called too timid. But I don't think he offered you a challenge to duel to save his face without any chance of defeating you. Requesting a duel is a double-edged sword to him. What she said also made sense. Nodding at her, Rykam added, she has a point. He might want to try to prove his strength or worth by throwing down the gauntlet. Obviously, he sought to prove his worth, not to save his face. 
Ophelia also nodded this time and said, I think he might want it. Anyway, it's true that he is strong enough to challenge you to a duel. All things considered, it was logical to think that the head of the house of Randall threw down the gauntlet, knowing he would be defeated. Nonetheless, Yong Ho could not readily accept it. At that moment, Catalina, who was watching them silently, raised her hand timidly and said in a soft voice, isn't it something like a trap? For example, the house of Randold heads offer that Yong Ho could choose the dual location could be a trap to make him feel complacent. So, Yong Ho once again read the letter from him. His writing was concise but elegant. Or he might really want to have it out with me. Deciding the final victor in a duel. No shedding useless blood. Ophelia, do you know something about his fighting style or his strength? Knitting her brows, she said, well, his fighting style or strength is not widely known because he is stuck only in his dungeon, but there is quite a bit of fragmentary information about it, given his long activities as the family head. To tell you some certain things, he's got three horns, and he seems to rely on magic rather than physical skills. He may be stronger than Foras or Jungseros, but I think he is absolutely below Agars. Is he a wizard? Yes, so maybe he is an easier opponent to you because you can read the flow of magical power. Perhaps, you can read most magic in advance. Accordingly, you will be able to evade, defend, or disturb him easily. Anyone who was good at magic could read the flow of magical power. However, Yong Ho could discern the color and properties of magical power, and he could even read the movement of magical power even during battle. The difference between reading the flow of magical power in a calm state and reading it during a life-threatening battle was like night and day. Is it possible that the house of Randolph Head will break his promise? There is little possibility that he will. It's so important that only a few reviews of this case are enough, but that's how I have felt it from my face-to-face -face meeting with him, said Ophelia sharply, just like a former veteran tavern owner. Yong Ho closed his eyes for a moment and organized his thoughts. The duel certainly carried great risk. With a stronger power, Yong Ho didn't need to take the risk. But he didn't need to shed useless blood. Also, he could own the Randolph family without big backlash. Yong Ho fully appreciated the concern of his subordinate spirits. He felt a strong sense of trust in them. They were loyal servants who would firmly support him, no matter which choice he would make. So, Yong Ho made the decision. Opening his eyes, he said, Ophelia, I'm sorry to say this, but can you visit the house of Randolph once more? Ophelia, Endelian's daughter, will follow the order of the head of the great house of Mammon. Not only Ophelia, but also Catalina, Eligos, and Skull expressed their due politeness to him. Yong Ho stood up from his seat then revealed his decision. It took four days for Ophelia to leave the house of Mammon, visit the house of Randolph, and receive a second reply from them. And again, three days later, Yong Ho sat in a special seat of the arena and gulped. Although the arena was familiar to him because of his frequent visits, he couldn't hide his anxiety as he did on his first visit. In the arena, there was a deadly battle going on between Catalina and the floor master on the first floor. Noel Chieftain, the floor master on the first floor, was so huge that it couldn't even be compared with ordinary Knowles. Moreover, he was very quick and clever. The sword and Yora took control of the space by using two different weapons at the same time. Of course, Catalina was faster than Noel Chieftain. The blade of the black magic that she could now freely use also boasted its terrifying attack power. Comparing the two's strength objectively, Catalina had the upper hand. Gus Ion admitted it, and Yong Ho could confirm it, too. However, fighting was not judged by rivals' objective capabilities alone. About ten minutes after the fighting started, Noel Chieftain finally fell to the floor. At that moment, Yong Ho sprang to his feet and rushed to the arena without asking for Gyushin's understanding. Catalina. Catalina won. Noel Chieftain fell on the floor with his body stabbed by her black sword. However, Catalina didn't emerge safely. Her whole body was covered with blood and sweat. And more than half of them belonged to Noel Chieftain. When Yong Ho reached the arena, she couldn't hold up and sat down. She was breathing roughly. Moreover, the wound areas on her body swelled black as if she was poisoned. The fighting in the arena looked like an actual one, 
but it was not real. Accordingly, no matter how severely one was injured, one was supposed to recover after the fight. It was like how the floor masters of the arena revived even if they died in a fight. Of course, they could not be said to have been resurrected because they had never been killed. However, Catalina was different. She was one of the twelve spirits of the House of Mammon, not its head. So, some harsh rules, which were different from Yong Ho's, were forced on her. All of Catalina's injuries were real. A spirit like her, not the house head, had to really fight to obtain the arena's rewards. Death in the arena meant real death in her case. Catalina couldn't open her eyes properly. Perhaps it was because she actively fought without knowing she was poisoned. It seemed that the poison already spread all over her body. Yong Ho tried to stay calm. He gently laid her on the floor and put his hands on her abdomen the most injured part of her body. Then he activated the power of evolution. This was why Yong Ho set today for her challenge in the arena. Assuming the full evolution EXP was 100, Catalina's EXP right before she challenged the first floor was 99. Whether she won or lost, she could not fill her evolution EXP fully. Yong Ho could cure most of the wounds thanks to the effects of the power of evolution. It didn't matter even if the wounds were so serious that they could not be treated with the power of evolution, for he could still buy enough time to take the injured to the Garden of Life where Scathack resided. Fortunately, Catalina's wounds could be healed with the power of evolution. Her expression gradually became calmer. She passed out as if she was exhausted, but her face shone with joy and a strong sense of accomplishment. Only then did Yong Ho feel relieved. Approaching them from behind, Gus Ion laughed heartily and said, Congratulations on breaking through the first floor. Chapter, 111 When Gus Ion moved his fingers, Mammon's magical power that had formed on the fake body of Noel Chieftain penetrated into Catalina's body. Although the efficiency of absorbing the essence of an ordinary demon, not the demon king, was very poor, Catalina was a little different. As a subordinate demon of the King of Greed, Yong Ho, she could use the magic power of greed through Brigada even if she could do it in a small way. But greed helped her absorb more magic power. It allowed her to take more magic power than usual. Moreover, what Yong Ho chose was the extraordinary evolution of magic power. Thanks to this, Catalina's magic power increased significantly at once. This was more than what Yong Ho expected. Sooner or later, she will get a fourth horn, said Gus Ion, glancing over Catalina. Yong Ho, who thought she was praiseworthy, unwittingly pinched her soft cheeks then turned to Gus Ion. While pointing to one of the boxes of light floating in the air, he said, Do you mind if I choose the reward? Yeah, take them all. With any delay, Yong Ho took Gyuzhen's words into action. A red belt emerged from the box of light he selected, guided by greed. It's a belt of strength. It is a simple artifact that increases your strength when you wear it. I guess it will be good to make up for the lack of your escort girl's muscle strength. Isn't it too big for Catalina to wear? You told me that one of your subordinate demons was a craftsman. Ask him to drill a few more holes. Yong Ho wondered if it was okay to deal with it harshly, given it was an artifact, not just a belt, but he nodded. After putting it away in good order, Yong Ho carefully held Catalina, who passed out on the floor. Gus Ion said again, what do you think? Why don't you use your newly gained momentum to challenge the ninth floor? It was a pretty attractive offer. Since he experienced Mammon's magic power, Yong Ho was also moved by Gyuzhen's suggestion to some extent. However, Yong Ho shook his head and replied with a bitter smile, I'm sorry, but I have an appointment now. Yong Ho knew that the level of difficulty would increase once he moved up to a higher floor. He could get stronger if he challenged the ninth floor, but there was no guarantee that he could win unconditionally. So, he thought that it was better to maintain his best condition at the moment. Gus Ion sensed it in no time. He called the man with a beast mask to guide Yong Ho. On the morning of the fifth day after he got the second reply from the house of Randolt, Yong Ho looked far away, standing in the wilderness. Behind him were Catalina, Skull, and Ophelia, with the fluttering flags of Skull's seven units equipped with their own weapons. Although Yong Ho arrived a little earlier than the appointment time, he didn't need to wait long. 
he saw a group of people approaching him from far away. They were Tigrius Randolt, head of the House of Randolt, and his men. Yong Ho and Tigrius decided on the location and time of their duel. What Yong Ho chose was a remote place in the wilderness located between the houses of Mammon and Randolt. The place was located at a certain distance from both houses, and it was difficult for each side to prepare an ambush or trap because all directions were open. Besides, it was also an advantage that there were no outsiders to watch the duel. Both agreed to bring only ten people on both sides. The number of their subordinates was just right, not too small or big. I'm Tigrius Randolt, the head of the House of Randolt. An old man, who lightly descended from the back of a giant lizard reminiscent of a dinosaur, introduced himself. His voice was deep and sonorous. Yong Ho already recognized who he was, even his portrait, through Ophelia. But he felt differently when faced with Tigrius like this. Tigrius was an old man who looked much stronger and tougher than him in the portrait. He was tall and thin. His neatly arranged hair and beard were almost gray. His gray eyes glared sharply. It was exactly what Yong Ho felt in his writing style of the reply. Tigrius was elegant. Yong Ho felt as if he met an English gentleman, a real nobleman. Behind Tigrius, in a black suit, stood his subordinate demons dressed in neat clothes as well. They were made up of several races, and even orcs were dressed in neat suits. Yong Ho also got off salami. Facing Tigrius, he introduced himself. I'm Yong Ho Chun, the head of the House of Mammon. Tigrius narrowed his eyes at the name Yong Ho Chun. Yong Ho had never hidden his name for any reason, nor had he advertised his name. Most of the demons living in the Free City also remembered Yong Ho only as the Mammon House Head or the Demon King of Flames, but they did not know his name. Yong Ho Chun. It was a heterogeneous name even in the demon world where all kinds of races were mixed. At least it was enough to believe that he didn't come from the pure family lineage of the House of Mammon. But Tigrius didn't care about Yong Ho's name. He hit the ground with a large cane instead of a sword or a spear. The metal cane, which seemed to have no shortcomings as a weapon, had a woman with wings against the moon carved at the end of its corner. Rather than a simple decoration, it seemed like a strange object with magical meaning. Since we've already confirmed each other's will in the letters, we don't need to drag it long. This is the contract we talked about in advance. I have already signed it, so you sign it, too. Having said that, Tigrius hit the ground with the cane, which formed a blood-red character in the air. Like the letters Tigrius sent so far, the contract contained only the essential contents. Before signing it right away, Yong Ho turned to Ophelia briefly. She confirmed with a look that the contract was correct. As the name suggested, the contract was an artifact for the contract. Completed by both signing the contract, this magical tool could exert a powerful deterrent. Since the magic itself was supposed to be used by the two who signed the contract, the difference in their magic power was meaningless. Just because any one of the two had a stronger magic power, he could not ignore the contents of the contract or resist its deterrence. The contract signed by the two had absolute binding power. And that was why it was extremely difficult to find such a contract in the demon world. Ironically, its absoluteness and honesty turned lots of people off. Before signing it, Yong Ho read the contents of the contract one more time. There was no room for any cunning play on words because only simple and clear facts were on the contract. The loser of the duel becomes the winner's subordinate. It was not an exaggeration to say that the contract contained only that phrase. Yong Ho moved his fingers in the air to sign it. The letters of red light were united in the air and lighted up, and soon, they were split into two and flew to Yong Ho and Tigrius respectively. A complex red pattern was engraved on the back of their hands. It was a sign of the contract. Tigrius said again, we don't have to talk any longer. I hope we can have a duel right away. Rumors that Tigrius was timid were wrong. He was the most impressive of those family heads that Yong Ho had met until now. He was also different from forests that gave out an animal-like murderous aura. He gave out an elegant, not murderous atmosphere. He's a real nobleman. After murmuring a bit, Yong Ho nodded. He erased any lingering suspicion of Tigrius's trap or plot from his mind. It was a fair duel. 
It was like a fight in the arena. Yong Ho grabbed the red flames that bloomed in the air. He also injected magical energy into the magic magnet on his left hand, covering it with silver metal. Yong Ho had no intention of dealing with him lightly. Tigrius didn't come here to lose. He opened the four horns at once to project magic energy fully. The surrounding area was shaken and a new force was applied to the flow of the magical energy that filled the sky and the earth. Yong Ho's magic power was more than rumored. Tigrius's face was full of tension. But he was not moved yet. He also opened the horns without backing down. Three horns protruded from Tigrius's forehead at the same time. Tigrius did not face Yong Ho's magic directly. He gently dissipated magic energy and stepped forward slowly. Let's start the duel now, Tigrius said. Yong Ho accepted it. And at some point, the two disappeared at the same time. Yong Ho's movement resembled that of Catalina. He did not depend solely on his physical performance like he did until now. Magic power helped his movement, resulting in an explosive instantaneous speed. When Tigrius disappeared in front of him, Yong Ho looked at the left and right instinctively. When Yong Ho was fighting demons in the arena, he saw one fleeing at a tremendous speed, so much so that even his eyes could not catch it. But even so, it was fast in the end. It was necessary to move from the point of departure to the destination. He didn't care if it was his afterimages. Any clue that could help him find out Tigrius's course was enough. But he could see nothing. Tigrius disappeared before my eyes. Yong Ho's feet, who kicked the ground to rush forward, touched it again. During that short moment when he couldn't even swallow, he acted instinctively. Ophelia's screaming was heard behind his back. Blink. When he heard her voice. Yong Ho already turned around. His opponent disappeared in front of him. If so, where could he appear again? In front of him again? No. He would most likely appear from the side or in the rear. And there's one more thing Yong Ho couldn't explain. It was probably something he had learned from Amun while sparring with him dozens or hundreds of times. Maybe the experience he had accumulated so far was the answer. But it didn't matter. Yong Ho instinctively turned around. By doing so, he could face Tigrius again, who disappeared in front of him by using the magic of a short-range jump. Yong Ho's inversion was clearly faster than he expected. But Tigrius didn't feel embarrassed, for Yong Ho had almost twice as much magic power as himself. So, no matter what Yong Ho did, he didn't feel it was strange. From his position as a challenger, Tigrius simply did his best to do what he could. Chapter, 112 At the same time, Tigrius prepared two magics. One originated from his cane and the other from his left hand. A barrage of magic poured out like a machine gun from the tip of the cane. It was an energy missile, one of simple yet effective attack magics. It was fast enough. Dozens of magical lumps pouring from the front were clearly intimidating. That was why Yong Ho moved forward. He didn't distance himself from Tigrius by stepping aside or stepping back. He discerned the flow of Tigrius's magic. No, he felt it now. It was like an arrow. Energy missiles drew a certain trajectory. Yong Ho sensed the trajectory and moved accordingly. Yong Ho's subordinate demons felt so thrilled and they saw their master rushing forward while evading energy missiles by a hair's breadth. Greece. Tigrius urgently put into action the magic on his left hand. The ground in front of Yong Ho lost its coefficient of friction and became extremely slippery. Yong Ho anticipated various kinds of attack magic but he didn't expect this kind of blocking at all. He inevitably stepped on the ground and fell, losing his balance. Seizing that chance, Tigrius once again used Blink. He really wanted to attack Yong Ho at the moment, but increasing the distance from him was his top priority now. Tigrius's judgment was correct. Yong Ho didn't fall helplessly. Although he didn't anticipate the kind of magic that Tigrius possessed, he sensed that something magical was forming. So, Yong Ho swung Amun the moment he slipped. There was no strength in his swing, but he didn't need it anyway. A wave of green flames originating from the tip of his spear swept over the place where Tigrius had stayed. 
Tigrius understood that the head of the House of Mammon could sense the flow of magic power. Maybe he could see it from the beginning. Anybody who was sensitive to magic could do it. It was unusual to do it during an urgent battle, but it was pointless for Tigrius to talk about it when Yongho was already using it. Instead of landing behind Yongho's back once again, Tigrius retreated and immediately triggered the next magic. He could not afford to save the magic numbers that he had memorized. Various colored lights filled the space between the two. Their dazzling splendor was comparable to the sky of the demon world. Tigrius's excellent hearing captured even the slightest noises that he would not have to hear. And that sensitivity could sometimes be his weakness. If you can see, see it. Feel free if you can feel it. It was oversupply. For Yong Ho, who was concentrating on the flow of magic, he felt shocked as if the whole world was filled with magical light. Then, Tigrius fired energy missiles in succession. Dozens of energy lumps hit Yong Ho like a bomb strike. This time, Tigrius felt instinctively that his attack was successful. However, most of his attacks did not do any damage. Green flames bloomed. Tigrius's elaborate attack backfired. Yongho blocked a barrage of energy missiles with the shield of jamming, the power embedded in Kaiwan's ring. He recovered himself by causing green flames to block the magic power surrounding him. Tigrius laughed bitterly. Indeed, Yongho wasn't an ordinary opponent. It was no coincidence that Yongho defeated Foras and Jungseros in succession before beating Agars. However, Tigrius was not yet ready to give up. Rather, he was thinking about victory even at this moment. Carrying the cane, Tigrius changed his posture. Rather than increasing the distance with Yongho again, he rushed as if he wanted to have a head to head fight. The green flames disappeared at once. Yong Ho, who came out of the green flames he had created himself, swung Amun at Tigrius, who charged from the front. Rather than avoiding the attack, Tigrius swung his cane at Amun. There was a thunderous roar. It was more than imagined. It was so powerful that Yong Ho felt a lingering throbbing on both arms. Strength, a strength enhancing magic, and haste, a speed enhancing magic. It wasn't just all there was. Tigrius carried a total of five sub-magics on his body, which drastically enhanced his physical ability that was already powerful enough. It was true that one should not be deceived by the appearance of an old man. Judging from his look, Foras was also an old man anyway. Tigrius turned to blink again. This time, he appeared from Yongho's right side and swung his cane. Yongho barely escaped the attack. He was not wielding his cane recklessly. His swinging was refined and skillful in a sharp contrast to Fora's beastly movement. Obviously, he mastered specific martial arts for a long time. Tigrius used various kinds of magic even amid the head-to-head -head fighting. Attack magic such as energy missiles, as well as close-range magic such as grease, confused Yongho, but he endured them well. He was never dominated by Tigrius. It was true that Tigrius's physical abilities drastically improved. However, Yongho's physical strength was not far behind him. In fact, Yongho's body underwent a complete change for the better. Tigrius apparently honed his skills for many years. But what about his actual battle experience? When it came to the battle that risked his life, Yongho had far more experience than Tigrius. No matter what others said, Yongho already experienced virtual death hundreds of times. Yongho's action exceeded Tigrius's expectations. The moment Tigrius thought he would step back, Yongho moved forward even at the risk of his life. Obviously, he acted as if he left everything to Providence. Oh, no. Tigrius doubted. Yongho's action was thoroughly calculated. It was far from his reliance on luck or recklessness. Tigrius could confirm it in his eyes. Bang! Amun poured out, pressing Tigrius's cane and fixing it on the ground. It did not stop there and released intense green flames. Green flames surged splendidly toward Tigrius as if a hawk soared in the sky. Tigrius was close by, so he did not have enough time to activate Blink. No, maybe he already used up all of his available Blink. During that short moment, Yongho's eyes met his. Tigrius let go of his hand that was holding the cane. The green flames swept over Tigrius. 
This time, Tigrius surpassed his expectations. Tigrius took one step further. The green flame scattered without harming him. It was not because Yongho weakened the intensity of the green flames to save his life. The flame shield. It was a flame barrier that Tigrius had prepared for today's duel, a secret weapon that protected him from fire attacks. On the premise that he would be helped by his cane, Tigrius could use three magics at the same time. Nevertheless, the reason he used only two magics until now was because he wanted to maintain the flame shield. As for the green flames that Yong Ho shot at him first, Tigrius didn't have to avoid it because he would have endured them with the power of the flame shield. But he avoided the green flames excessively to seize the moment to reverse the tide. The flame shield burned red. Tigrius did not spare his magic. Charging at Yong Ho immediately, he concentrated magic on his right hand. The blade of pure white magic soared up. The green flames didn't work because Tigrius was too close for Yong Ho to use the spear. The flame shield would serve as a barrier against not only the green flames but also other attacks by Yong Ho. Right at this moment, the goddess of victory turned to Tigrius himself. It was a perfect checkmate. But the moment Tigrius was about to declare victory, he saw something strange. Yong Ho also let go of Amun. Then, he rushed forward as if to narrow the distance with Tigrius. It seemed as if he was throwing himself into the blazing flame shield. Was he reckless? No. Tigrius could feel Yongho's magic power, though not as much as he. Tigrius was amazed at the magic energy that he should feel at this moment. An intense chill enveloped his body. Something from the magic field on Yongho's left hand broke the flame shield. The flame shield was broken like a thin glass window before the intense chill. Two attributes. It wasn't just magic. It was pure magic. That was why Tigrius was all the more astonished. How could Yongho do this? Tigrius couldn't think any further. After destroying the flame shield, Yongho punched him endlessly. Tigrius used his last available blink to retreat. Since it happened instantly, he could not even think of attacking Yongho from his back. And Yongho now chased him. He rushed toward Tigrius without any hesitation as if he knew the old man would retreat. Blink was definitely a magic that helped one to leap through space. So, it was impossible to notice one's leaping process between the origin and destination points. But it wasn't a magical power. The magic power at the destination point was distorted. It would have been difficult to detect Tigrius if he had moved back as he did, but this time, he operated Blink within Yong Ho's view. Amun was now held again in Yong Ho's hand. However, an intense chill was still coming out from the magic field of his left hand. Tigrius could not be sure which of the two was the real one that tormented him. But he had no time to think. He exercised the power of the Demon King. He combined two magics into one beyond his limits. The flame shield against flames. The aqua shield against chills. Yong Ho clearly witnessed that the two colors and attributes became one before his eyes. That was why he didn't stop. Yong Ho lifted Amun high above his head and struck against the barrier that Tigrius had set up. At that moment, a lightning bolt struck, which was not a metaphor, but a real thunderbolt. It was a lightning strike. The third attribute of his magic neutralized the attributes of the flame shield and aqua shield. Tigrius was astonished and so were the demons of the house of Mammon, who was watching it. They knew early on that Yong Ho had the attributes of fire and chill. But a lightning strike? There was no such thing. Of course, Yong Ho didn't learn the lightning strike magic. But Skull understood it. The Brigada necklace was absorbing Skull's own magic. In no time, Catalina sensed it, too. She felt that she was being united with Yong Ho. Her dark magic was being delivered to Yong Ho through Brigada, which had the attribute of darkness. Since her energy was exhausted instantly, she felt some pain, but her heart was filled with a deep sense of fidelity that she was being united with her master. Her joy was greater than her pain. Yong Ho could deliver the magical power of greed to his subordinate demons through Brigada. That was why they could add greed to their magical power until now. Brigada's role was to amplify, respond, and save magic power. 
The greed embedded in Brigada absorbed the magic of the subordinate demons and got delivered to Yongho. The next step that Gusan mentioned. The reason why he said that in order to bring out Brigada's true power, the subordinate demons should also become stronger. Yongho realized it himself and exercised it in the real battle. Catalina's black magic was condensed into Amun that he lifted high. Yongho then struck it again. As if to show off Catalina's strength, her black magic that transformed into a huge sword completely destroyed Tigrius's shield. Crushed by the overwhelming force, Tigrius could no longer withstand it. He helplessly flopped down. Amun did not harm Tigrius, and the black magic only cut the air. Tigrius gasped for breath. He looked at Yongho with trembling eyes. And he understood that it was time for him to implement the contract. I admit defeat. You're the head of the House of Mammon, no, my lord. He admitted defeat completely. Yongho also breathed roughly. Using Brigada was quite difficult for him because he was not familiar with it. But he withdrew Amun with a smile. He also took back the chill from the magic field on his left arm then reached out. He raised Tigrius by himself and said, Welcome, Tigrius, the wizard of the House of Mammon. Tigrius laughed bitterly at his new title. Instead of complaining about it, he once again expressed his respect for Yong Ho as his subject. It was the moment when the two families of Mammon and Randall became one. Chapter 113 An unexpected blow was always painful. Embryo, the demon king of the wolves, sat on the walls of the newly occupied city and looked far away. He looked toward the north, not the west or south that he used to. Meanwhile, Embryo's operation went well. The family heads in the western region didn't dare to leave on an expedition to the north when their own dungeons were in danger. Although there were some who attempted to advance to the north, they often ended up ending their expedition shortly. Nobody knew where Embryo's core dungeon was. The northern region had been already occupied by Embryo. It was unreasonable for them to go on a faraway expedition when their dungeons were in danger. There were several reasons. That was why Embryo could keep pressing those family heads in the western region. He could keep driving them into a corner. He could force them to choose a single round match. But something unexpected happened. The reasons that covered embryo could be sustained only when the family heads in the western region made a rational judgment. But they gave up everything, who was like revenge demons earnestly hoping for embryo's ruin. So, those reasons could not be accepted by them. They were willing to sacrifice themselves to set fire to a forest named embryo. Most of them were survivors. They were not only children or brothers or relatives of the family heads in the northern and western regions trampled by embryo but also, their loyal dungeon demons. And they attacked the north. They didn't think of retreating. They attacked embryo's dungeons or front lines at the risk of their lives and succeeded in inflicting considerable damages to embryo. Of course, embryo's forces were not to be defeated by their sporadic guerrilla battles. If they had been such a weak force in the first place, they could not have subdued the northern region. Embryo put an end to the turmoil in the north within a relatively short period of time and pressured on the family heads in the western region. However, it was clear that he had a setback in the plan. After all, the time required to end the turmoil was described as short at first, but it proved relatively short. In fact, Embryo had to exhaust a considerable amount of time to do that. The family heads in the western region, exhausted from being chased by embryo endlessly, bought some time for a break. They began to look for ways to use revenge demons. That was why embryo went out of his way. In a situation where the supply line linking the north was in jeopardy, he achieved the feat of attacking one of the western cities in an ambush and occupied it overnight. One of the wolves wandering around embryo looked down at the wall. Death Knight stood in front of a mountain of corpses piled up as a warning sign. Behind his back, who was standing with a huge sword as if he were a gatekeeper, a purple magic power close to black rose like a haze. The powerful undead was supposed to radiate the energy of death around it. And such energy of death altered the magical power omnipotent in the demon world. The undead began to rise among the crowd of corpses. Of course, their number was small, and most of the newly produced undead were zombies that were hard to be called undead at best. But they couldn't be ignored at all. 
The wolf that was staring at Death Knight frowned. Hugin, the wisest of the wolves following embryo, discovered that Death Knight's action was a sort of an armed demonstration. It was true that the powerful undead radiated the energy of death. However, a powerful undead could keep such energy hidden from outsiders. Obviously, Death Knight didn't try to reinforce his force by increasing the number of zombies. That Death Knight was showing off his ability to create the new undead simply by radiating the energy of death by himself. And his show-off was not directed toward the family heads in the western region. Obviously, it was directed toward Embryo on the wall. But Embryo didn't care. He felt that the outright hostility of the surveillance became a little more concrete. Rather, it was a good sign to him. If the surveillance had sincerely been wary of Embryo, he would have posed an invisible threat instead of such a childish act. Embryo stroked Hugin's head. His gaze toward the north turned to the east and south this time. It seemed that he could occupy the western region sooner or later. Ploros, the demon king who could be called the head of the western owner's alliance, was by no means a fool. Further expansion of the front was not beneficial to the western owner's alliance. It would be possible for them to attack Embryo's rear to some extent by using revenge demons, but it would be nothing more than their desperate efforts that could not affect the general situation. Be it a single round match or a thorough defense, there was no choice but to mobilize the forces now. The damages in the western region were too big to continue a war of attrition. That was why Embryo concluded that the western region would be occupied sooner or later. So, he thought of the east and the south, his next target after occupying the western region. The eastern region was still in turmoil. The big chaos and turmoil that Embryo caused awakened those with ambitions in the eastern region. It was the so-called Warring States period. It would take a considerable time for the turmoil in the eastern region to subside. The eastern region was wide. There were also quite a few powerful demon kings. If somebody could subdue the period of confusion and unify the state, he could be a strong rival of Embryo himself. However, Embryo wanted to pay more attention to the southern region than the eastern region. A wind was blowing in the southern region. The sudden wind began to swallow everything in the region. It wasn't surprising that the new strongman defeated those family heads there. But it was something that raised Embryo's attention that he took the free city after defeating Agars. In the southern region, there were no houses with strong power like those in the west, and there were not many families like those in the east. That was why Embryo had ignored the southern area the most until now. He thought it was a place that he could easily take immediately after occupying the west. However, the time came for Embryo to think differently about the southern region. The House of Mammon. It was the very house where that great king of greed was born. Although it lost its past glory, it once had the name of the king during the old days. Embryo, you don't have the power of sin. So, you can't be a king. Embryo recalled the fortune teller Naga's words, who he trampled in the north. Instead of thinking of something positive or negative, Embryo simply turned around. He muttered softly, Is he the demon king of flames? The new divinity that has risen from the southern region. The new demon king bearing the name of the house of Mammon on his back. The wind blew. With the energy of death, it blew toward the north. Name, Tigrius Randolt Male. Race, Magius Mine. Category, Demon King Demon King of Union. Attribute, Flame Level 3. Individual Nature. Prudent Slash Upright Slash Honest. Individual Aptitude. Intellect Slash Magic Power. Evolution EXP 0 Slash 100. Strength Specialization Level 2 2. Physical Strength Specialization Level 3 2. 5. Intellect Specialization Level 4 3. Magic Power Level 4 3. Skill Specialization Level 4 2. 5. Thanks to the effect of the contract, Yong Ho could observe Tigrius's evolution information in great detail even though he had not yet made him his subordinate demon. What caught Yong Ho's interest more than anything else was his other name, the Demon King of Union. Is it also his last magic? During the battle, Tigrius's two different magics merged into one, and they were completely different properties like fire and water. When it came to magic, Yong Ho was close to a layman, 
but it didn't mean he had no commonsensical knowledge of it at all. As far as he knew, two magics could not become one like that. Closing his green eyes, he pondered for a moment. He spoke to Tigrius in a low voice, who remained silent after declaring that he would become Yongho's subordinate, is the demon king of Union your other name? Since he had been accustomed to speaking to Eligos informally, he could ask Tigrius the same way. At that moment, Tigrius replied with his eyes glaring, Yes, Lord. That is my name as a demon king. The power of the demon king was not given by providence. He obtained the power by awakening the possibility of his own soul as the demon king. Therefore, the name of the demon king could be called the name of the soul. Tigrius tried to suppress his curiosity. Yongho's different name, known to the public, was the Demon King of Flames. Tigrius thought so until now, but he didn't think it was true. Just as Yongho was deeply impressed by Tigrius's magic of merging two into one, Tigrius was also greatly shocked by his free attribute transformation. Moreover, this time, Yongho accurately found out Tigrius's other name. There was a possibility that Yongho guessed right after watching him merge the two magics, but Tigrius's intuition denied such a flimsy possibility. When his green eyes flashed, it was clear that some magic power was triggered. Maybe it was not his attribute transformation, but the power that he just showed. So, Tigrius got curious and wanted to know. However, Tigrius himself was now a subject of the House of Mammon. So, he could not ask his lord to reveal the secret. The power of the demon king was the best weapon the demon king had. So, asking him to reveal the secret of such power was like asking a warrior for his sword. Tigrius took a deep breath. Yongho and he had a different status. Yongho was his master, while Tigrius was his vassal. The master had to know clearly what power his vassal had, so he could use his subordinate's power in the right place. Tigrius was good at making himself clear. Now that he pledged to become Yongho's subordinate through the contract, he did not consider himself more than a vassal of the House of Mammon. So, he explained to Yongho about his power in a soft voice, which could not be heard around him. Chapter, 114 I have the power to unite two different objects into one, even though it's temporary. But it's not possible for anything. After I first obtained this power, I tested many ways and concluded that combining magic was the most useful, and as a result, I've come to take the path of a wizard as I'm now. Combine two different things. At that moment, Yongho momentarily recalled his own evolution of union. Excuse me, but can you show it to me? No problem. Tigrius, who answered readily this time, opened both hands. Since the magic that he had memorized was almost exhausted, he activated a simple magic that did not require much preparation. Fire arrow in the right hand. Fire arrow in the left hand. An arrow of flames formed on his hands. Tigrius made eye contact with Yongho. Slowly, he brought his hands together in front of his chest, then clasped his hands finally. He shouted, Combination Magic Fire Ballista! and opened his hands wide. At that moment, a huge arrow of fire formed on his palms it was huge enough to befit the name Ballista. I can combine the same magic to further strengthen it, or I can combine different magic to create a new one. After cancelling Fire Ballista, he activated the magic once again. This time, it was not the same magic. Strength in the right hand. Haste in the left hand. Combination Magic Booster. It didn't have as much of a visual effect as the one a moment ago. However, Yongho could see the color and properties of the magic directly. He gulped, watching the miracle on Tigrius's hands. It was thanks to this magic combination that Tigrius could carry several auxiliary magic on his body, for two magic combinations brought about the same effect as using four auxiliary magics. The more Yongho saw it, the more magnificent he felt about it. It was indeed an appropriate choice that Tigrius decided to use the power of magic combination. A magic layman, Yongho could think of various magic combinations at that moment. So, it was needless to say how many magic combinations Tigrius, a real wizard, could think of. What if Yongho could evolve Tigrius? What kind of achievement could Tigrius show if he led the wizard to a higher place than now? Ah, uh, by the way. Such power was only possessed by the demon king. 
Tigrius was now Yomho's subordinate. If he could unleash the power of evolution, Tigrius had to be subjugated to Yongho himself. In other words, he had to be Yongho's subordinate spirit, not the head of the house of Randolt anymore. What would happen to his power when Tigrius was not the demon king anymore? Could he lose it? If that was the case, it would be regrettable. Yongho wanted to maintain Tigrius's power while having him under his command. You don't have to worry too much, whispered Ophelia, noticing Yongho's concern. Yongho signaled to Tigrius appropriately then turned to Ophelia. She explained quickly and briefly, as you know, the power of the demon king is manifested from the soul of the demon king. Ascending to the position of the demon king can be said to be an opportunity to awaken. Then, does it mean that his power is still maintained even when he steps down from the position of the demon king? Not really. It is true that the position of demon king itself exerts considerable power in maintaining power. To get straight to the point, anybody who has been in the position of the demon king for a long time can still use his power even if he loses his position because power is the manifestation of the power of the soul. However, his power would be weaker than before. There is no way he can avoid it. According to her explanation, Tigrius would still be able to exert his power even if he lost his position as the demon king. Yongho was not sure about the duration of for a long time when she mentioned it, but Tigrius reigned as the head of the House of Randall longer than Forus. In fact, the duration of his reign itself would not be a problem. When Yongho sighed as if he was relieved, Ophelia smiled brightly. Then she continued, and the results can vary, depending on how you can merge the House of Randall because Tigrius can serve you while maintaining his position as the Demon King. And actually, this is more common. The Six Kings are also governing their kingdom in this way. Yongho nodded. The power of his evolution has not stopped growing. If Yongho himself became stronger, he could unleash the power of evolution even if he didn't make Tigrius his subordinate spirit. After a brief conversation with Ophelia, Yongho approached Tigrius again. He told Tigrius what Ophelia reported, I hear that the main force of the House of Mammon started. So, we are going to wait here to join them before heading for the House of Randolt, as I told you before. Okay. I will inform the dungeon of the House of Randolt in advance. That was why Yongho stayed in the wilderness even though the duel was over. He could not go and take over the House of Randolt with his current force. Of course, he didn't suspect Tigrius, for Tigrius, whom Yongho met only briefly, would break his oath. There were two reasons why he mobilized his main force. First, he needed to put down the possible rebellion by the subordinate spirits of the House of Randolt without armed conflict, and secondly, he would need considerable manpower to rebuild the dungeon there. Deborah, a subordinate spirit of the House of Randolt, acted at Tigrius's order and contacted the dungeon through telepathy. As a special spirit, she could exchange telepathy with her twin sister, no matter how far they were from each other. Now that Yongho settled almost everything with Tigrius, all he had to do was wait for the main force led by Rikam. The new power of Brigada. Yongho looked back at the ring on his hand then turned to Catalina and Skull. It wasn't just Catalina and Skull alone that felt connected to Yongho. Yongho also felt a strong bond when using their magic power. He didn't make any calculated thinking that he would use those spirits with higher utility value as his subordinates. For that reason, the moment he felt connected to these subordinate spirits, their feelings were so pure. Skull laughed at Yongho's gaze, and Catalina fluttered her ears and tail needlessly. Yongho gently touched the ring then turned back and looked west. Two days later, he arrived at the dungeon of the House of Randolt. He immediately started renovating the dungeon. The renovation started from the heart of the dungeon. After pondering for the past two days, Yongho made a decision on how to merge the House of Randolt with his. Tigrius Randolt would retain his demon king status. First of all, Yongho would maintain a simple master slave relationship instead of having him as his subordinate spirit. Of course, Yongho would have him go back to his original status as a subordinate spirit, but not now. The dungeon of the Randolt House was the first expanded base that Yongho acquired, and at the same time, it was a shield to block the forces from the western region. Yongho could not afford to stay at the Randolt house for that long. 
Even before the attack on the west began, he had to break through one more arena first, and if possible, he had to explore the labyrinth of greed. That was why it was better to keep the position of the head of the house of Randolt for now. Moreover, Tigrius's power was very useful. Since it was certain that his power would be weakened if Yong Ho made him his subordinate spirit, he could not weaken the strength of the friendly force recklessly. Of course this rests on the assumption that Tigrius won't betray me. So, it took two days for Yong Ho to make the decision. Yong Ho already trusted Tigrius wholeheartedly for he was moved by Tigrius's attitude before and after the duel. However, he needed a little more time for more reasonable judgment. It was a very important issue. If Tigrius betrayed him during the battle, an irreversible situation would occur. So, Yong Ho had to arrange a safety device. And the first safeguard was the control of the heart of the dungeon. Master. Can you hear my voice? Lucia's voice was heard from the heart of the dungeon in the deepest part of the house of Randolt. Her voice wasn't very clear. He felt like Lucia's voice was distant as if he picked up a phone with poor reception, and there were also noises that interfered with their conversation when she spoke. Yong Ho slightly tweaked the position of the remote communication unit attached to the heart of the dungeon. Next to him, Tigrius improved his connection with Lucia by controlling the letters of light that floated in the air. Lucia's voice flowing from the dungeon's soul became more and more clear. Ayuho. Can you hear me? If you hear me, please answer me. Tubi tubi bop bop. My master is a fool. Yong Ho blushed when Lucia's voice continued. He could have smiled at her if he had been in the house of Mammon, but this place was the house of Randolt with Tigrius standing beside him. Yong Ho said in a soft voice after clearing his throat several times as if to hide his embarrassment. Lucia. Hiccock. Master. This time I can't hear you well. I think the communication status is bad. It was a white lie. Yong Ho grinned when he thought of this girl with blue hair, who was desperately pretending otherwise. It seems you and I are well connected. Hee hee, you know I love you, my master. Instead of answering, Yong Ho pretended to hit her forehead in the air. As the communication status improved, Lucia, who was connected to Yong Ho via the heart of the dungeon of the house of Randolt, responded with a laugh. Watching all this, Tigria said, she's very peculiar. Ha! Huh. She has a lot of emotion. I didn't see a lot of dungeon souls but I have never seen a dungeon soul like her. It didn't sound like he mentioned it without any reason. There was a little curiosity in Tigrius's eyes like a wizard. Really? Blurring a bit, Yong Ho looked back at the heart of the dungeon then he said while touching the remote communications device, Lucia, can you feel your friend here? I'm going to subjugate some of the dungeon functions of the Randolt house to the dungeon of the Mammon house. The dungeon soul here will guide you, so finish the work. Okay. Hi, I'm Lucia. Chapter, 115 Lucia spoke vigorously. Unlike when she was in the Mammon house, only her voice was heard now, so not only Yong Ho but Tigrius could hear it. Yong Ho felt a lot of expectation in Lucia's voice. It seemed that she was excited to meet the souls of another dungeon for the first time. Yong Ho wasn't as excited as Lucia, but he earnestly waited for the replies of the dungeon soul of the house of Randolt. While Lucia's heart was pounding in excitement, there was a reply from the dungeon soul of the house of Randolt. A new communication line with the dungeon soul of the house of Mammon is opened. It seems that it will take about ten minutes to do this. It was a hard female voice. It seemed that the female didn't want to reply to Lucia's greetings. Sullen. I will help you with the work. Lucia spoke briefly, but apparently, she was disappointed. The sullen face of this blue-haired girl, with her shoulders drooping, came to Yong Ho's mind. Yong Ho turned back to Tigrius and asked, is that the typical response? Most of the dungeon souls I have met are like that. I think my dungeon soul is perhaps more common than Lucia. Tigrius had no reason to lie, but it seemed that Lucia was really a special spirit. That's good to know. From Yong Ho's point of view, a cheerful Lucia was much better. When the communication line with Lucia is completed, we will start renovating the dungeon. I explained to you on the way, but I'm thinking of making this a fortress. 
The new dungeon will be very different from it now, said Yongho. Yongho seemed to feel sorry for Tigrius. Tigrius looked at Yongho differently from when he witnessed Lucia's rich emotions. Then he replied with a warm smile reminiscent of Elagos, that's fine. I think you need the renovation to stop the forces from the western region. I understand. Thank you for your consideration. After he expressed gratitude duly, Tigrius recovered his usual look. His face was that of an old gentleman who gave out the aura of a serious nobleman with gravitas. While Lucia occupied some of the functions of the House of Randolt, Yongho headed for the makeshift lodge of the House of Mammon arranged in one corner of the House of Randolt. Originally, Tigrius wanted to provide Yongho with the Demon King's room and his own bedroom as the accommodation for the Mammon House spirits, but Yongho declined it. Tigrius was still the head of the House of Randolt. So, Yongho wanted to respect it. Of course, that was not the only reason. A guest room is much better for me. It would not be pleasant for Yongho to take someone else's bedroom, especially that of an old gentleman like Tigrius. Moreover, Yongho did not intend to settle down in the house of Randolph for good. When the dungeon renovation was completed to some extent, he planned to return to the house of Mammon to break through the arena. The spirits of the house of Mammon waiting at the lodge welcomed back Yongho. Accompanied by Ophelia, Skull, and Catalina alone, Yongho moved to the guest bedrooms. Sensing the reason why he called her to his bedroom, Ophelia said, gently pressing on her pounding heart, I would like to ask for the evolution of my physical strength. Yongho laughed. Although Ophelia changed into a fox-like girl from a veteran tavern hostess who had gone through ups and downs, her sharp eyes remained the same. Not magic power, but physical strength? Yes, because balance is important. Especially for red demons like me and brother Eli, physical ability is as important as magic power. For the red demons, magic is merely the means to strengthen their body. The basis of strength is not magic power, but physical ability. Her detailed explanation was quite reasonable. However, Yongho was bothered by something unusual she mentioned. Brother Eli. Because Brother Eligoza's name is too long, I like Eli. It's like his nickname. Ophelia laughed brightly, which made Yongho frown. He said grumly, recalling Eligoza's face. Let's start. Ophelia laughed again this time. She closed her eyes then stretched her body comfortably. Yongho took his breath. He put his hands on her shoulders and tried to empty his head. It had already been proven in several cases that Yongho's own thought had some influence on his appearance after going through an evolution. He made sure that his envy, not suitable for a master like him, shouldn't have any effect on her appearance. Yongho thought about good things as much as possible. Then he activated the power of evolution. There was no violent external change. But a violent change took place within her body. The strengthening of the body itself. Her bones became harder. Both her internal organs and muscles were strengthened, and her skin became more elastic. And. Ah. Uh, he could not describe it accurately, but the aura of Ophelia changed a little. Had she become more attractive? He seemed to hear Amon murmuring that he felt so because of his mood or agony. Shaking his head, Yongho concentrated. New boxes of light floated above Ophelia's head. Red Demon Breaker. Red Demon Vanguard. Both were new routes to level advancement. Even though the evolution was over, Yongho's green eyes were still shining. Watching him, Ophelia gulped before she knew it. Seeing there was something going on, she quietly waited for his next move. Instead of saying something, Yongho touched the boxes of light in the air one by one. And he saw something different from before. It was the same as before that a translucent silhouette was drawn over Ophelia's body whenever he touched them. However, the type of silhouette was different this time. Transformation. Is it like a battle mode? Even after leveling up, Ophelia's appearance did not change much. However, she had some other look during the battle, unlike her usual look. The Red Demon Breaker was an aggressive type. After switching to battle mode, Ophelia turned into a wild figure reminiscent of a feline beast. Her hands were stronger, and her legs were longer and firmer. And black patterns appeared all over her red skin. 
On the other hand, Red Demon Vanguard was a speed type. Unlike Breaker, whose physique itself was getting bigger as a whole, Vanguard changed Ophelia's body shape more slenderly. But she looked very agile. It was obvious that she could move much faster now. Yong Ho intended to have Ophelia choose one. Since her advancement was possible only after her evolution EXP maxed, she had plenty of time to think about it. Let me have high hopes for Eligos. What was the next step for Red Demon Beast? How much wilder could it turn? After grinning, Yong Ho let go of his hands from Opelia's shoulders. He briefly explained to her about the advancement to Opelia, who opened her eyes wide instead of asking what was going on. Next was Skull's turn. If Ophelia was the busiest spirit in the dungeon of the House of Mammon externally, Skull was the one who spent the most time training. Although Skull could no longer collect EXP properly even in the intermediate training ground, he did not roll around the floor quietly. Skull trained his unit endlessly, literally 24 hours a day. While Ophelia quickly gained her EXP by sparring with Eligos and through her tight schedule, Skull gained evolution EXP through training. Skull evolved mainly toward increasing his physical abilities such as physical strength and build. But things were different now. Skull was not just a warrior, but a magic warrior who knew how to use magic power. Yong Ho, who put his hand on the head of Skull, kneeling before him, applied the evolution of magic power on him. The magical power that more clearly revealed its presence than before after merging with Skeleton Mage was transformed into a larger and stronger form. Yong Ho felt lightning from Skull. But I still don't think of his advancement stage. Yong Ho felt sorry for it. After all, it seemed that there was still a long way for Skull to move up to a death knight. After completing the evolution of Skull, Catalina looked at Yong Ho with an expectant expression this time. Yong Ho grinned mischievously at her flapping her tail, then gently hit her on the forehead and said, Did you already forget that you evolved after breaking through the first floor? You're greedy. Catalina responded by drooping her ears and tail. Yong Ho stroked her hair and said to everyone again, Anyway, for the next few days, I will focus on planning dungeon remodeling because it needs a major renovation. Maybe I need to reorganize the dungeon once. I also have to buy the necessary materials. Just like a dungeon located along the route to the western region, the dungeon of the House of Randall was already quite in combative form. But that wasn't enough. Yong Ho intended to turn the dungeon into an indomitable fortress. Fortunately, Tigrius obediently followed his intention because he knew well that it was the only choice to prevent attacks from the western region. On that day, Yong Ho immediately planned a draft of the fortress in cooperation with Tigrius and Ophelia. And the next day, he reorganized the dungeon. It was different from the previous reorganization of the first floor of the dungeon of the House of Mammon in the past. When Yong Ho implemented the dungeon reorganization, the first floor of the House of Mammon was really small. It would take three days to reorganize the dungeon. After that, they would need to spend a considerable amount of time laying the foundation for the full-scale fortification of the dungeon. Yong Ho delegated the supervision of the whole remodeling process to Ophelia and Tigrius. He had Skull and his unit on standby as the security guard. Then he headed back to the House of Mammon accompanied by Catalina alone. I'm going to come back here after breaking through the ninth floor of the arena, no, tenth floor. Salami, the spirit of flames with the House of Mammon, carried Yong Ho and Catalina on his wings and spread them. It left the traces of flames in the sky of the demon world. Chapter, 116 what was the most powerful one among the numerous races in the demon world? There were lots of disagreements about it. However, there was one race that had been always mentioned among them. It was the dragons. They were both the king of flying animals as well as the king of wild animals. They possessed a particularly strong body among the beings of the demon world, and they were born with powerful mana befitting their strong bodies. Often called ancient dragons, who lived long enough, they could be said to be a disaster in themselves. They were like a god and the representation of a strong man, who reached the ultimate level in both physical strength and mana. And there was one who stood at the top among those dragons. Although he didn't have the seven deadly sins, he rose to the position of king. In the history of the demon world, 
he was the only one who rose to the position of king without possessing the seven deadly sins. People called him the King of Violence. Great Dragon Lord. The King of Violence was like a mountain. Interestingly, this expression satisfied both its substance and metaphor. The giant body of the King of Violence was several hundred meters long. Even though it curled up, roiling its tail, it could not hide its giant body. The King of Violence never acted recklessly. Like the name Violence, he was an extremely powerful being, but he did not use his power anytime anywhere. He was like a volcano. Normally, he remained silent, but once he showed his anger, the whole world was shaken. The King of Violence awakened from a deep sleep. However, he did not open his eyes or move his body. It was only his mind that awoke. The King of Violence thought about his unsurpassed magic power, which could be called part of his body. He connected his soul with one of the seven fragments of that demon king. Godly energy and the seven deadly sins shared their history. Since ancient times, when the demon king disappeared, godly energy changed many hands, which never forgot them. The traces of some of their unsurpassed magic power were left behind, though they were small. And there was one that left the biggest traces in the annals of godly energy. The King of Greed. In magic, its owner's soul and memory were supposed to exist. The King of Greed's magic power was great enough to be recorded as unsurpassed abilities. Although fragmentary, there were some great moments of his magic power recorded. Then, why did the King of Greed suddenly disappear? Who was it that took his life? The King of Violence tried to sleep quietly. He peeked into the memories of godly energy. Thanks to Salami flying almost half a day, though he took a break on and off, Yong Ho could reach the dungeon of the House of Mammon before dark. The Hymir cats, which mainly monitored the ground, were flustered at Yong Ho's sudden appearance. So, he told them to watch over the airspace as well and stroked their heads one by one. Watching him, Catalina touched her own head slightly. It was Trey Ant, one of the veteran spirits of the House of Mammon, that greeted Yong Ho after the Hymir cats. Now fully established himself as the main gatekeeper of the House of Mammon, Treant bowed to Yong Ho, along with the other two Treants that he had bought recently. Repeating evolutionary changes, they had a much more flexible and tougher body than the typical Treant. However, they were essentially trees, so they could easily perform motions that ordinary Treants could not. After the Hymir cats and Treant, Eligos came out to greet Yong Ho along with Baduk and Yuria. Congratulations on your victory, Master. Eligos spoke with glaring eyes. Eligos had been serving as the butler since the time when the House of Mammon was on the verge of collapse. It was natural that Eligos felt so proud of Yong Ho because he made the House of Mammon stand tall again and took over another dungeon. Baduk, who was next to Eligos, expressed happiness more honestly, while Yuria slightly lifted her sleeves to show due respect to Yong Ho, saying lispingly, Well, congratulations. Yong Ho laughed loudly like Skull and stroked Yuria's hair. Then he headed for the Demon King's room with Catalina, who was touching her hair again this time, and Eligos, who started to wipe his tears with a handkerchief. Master, take a good rest. It must have been difficult for Salami to fly all day long, but you know our master also had a hard time hanging on Salami for the whole day, right? Lucia spoke in a quiet way. Feeling like he sat on the throne for a long time, Yong Ho nodded at her. As Lucia said, he was exhausted, so he was thinking of taking a break today, but he had some more work to do. Yong Ho grinned at Eligos after looking at him with the power of evolution. It's what I have expected. The fact that Ophelia's evolution EXP maxed out meant that Eligos did the same thing, for the two always practiced together. Can I still evolve? When Yong Ho's green eyes glared, Eligos asked him with an expectant voice. It was natural that Eligos showed such a reaction. Eligos came from the demon world. Moreover, he was a member of the red demon called the battle race. He had no reason to refuse to become stronger through evolution. Instead of answering right away, Yong Ho rested his chin on his right hand. Then he looked at Eligos with his eyes slightly open. He did so for a few seconds when Eligos felt nervous then said, Ophelia asked me to evolve the magic power of Brother Eli. Eligos cleared his throat when Yong Ho emphasized Brother Eli. Obviously, 
He was embarrassed. Feeling pleasant but angry at the same time, Yong Ho asked, Do you have any nickname for her? Uh, no. I just call her Ophelia. Her name itself is Pretty Oops. At that moment, Yong Ho laughed wickedly like the Demon King, and Elagos was flustered, muttering something like he was brainwashed. Originally, Elagos was a red demon whose skin was red, but today, it looked much redder. Fortunately for Elagos, Yong Ho knew when to refrain himself. In fact, if he dug more about Elagos' relationship with Ophelia, Yong Ho felt he would be hurt, so he stopped. Anyway, he stopped playing games with Elagos and stood up. Let me evolve you with a specialization of magic power. So, close your eyes. Since Yong Ho changed the topic, Elagos closed his eyes, feeling relieved. Yong Ho activated the power of evolution. He brought out Elagos's possibilities, which changed the latter in no time. Elagos's magic power became strong. Besides, it was accompanied by his physical change this time. A third horn came out from his forehead. Pricking her ears and hearing their conversation with her eyes open, Catalina once again opened her eyes wider. The difference between having two horns and three horns was like night and day. Moreover, a new box of light appeared above Eligoza's head. Red Demon Tyrant. Like Ophelia, the box was one, not two. But the name itself was really strong. Tyrant. Following the beast first, it was a tyrant this time. Yong Ho instinctively touched the box of light and looked at Eligos, who just went through an evolution. He was the same as Ophelia. In addition to his usual form, he had a separate combat form. Eligos seemed to understand why he was named Tyrant. Even now, he had a well-developed upper body with an inverted triangle, but his combat shape was more than that. In particular, his shoulders and arms were developed, and his two fists full of hair looked like a wicked blunt weapon by itself. Perhaps, the combination of a bear and a gorilla would look like Eligos. In any case, it was clear that Eligos gave out the aura of a wild beast. The black patterns among the hair growing all over his body also stood out. He looks like a super beast, Yong Ho thought. He withdrew his hands and deactivated the power of evolution. By the way. Suddenly, something strange came to Yong Ho's mind. Red Demon Tyrant. Obviously, the name befitted Eligos, who went through an evolution. But Eligos felt uncomfortable about it. Why? Not only Eligos but also Catalina and Ophelia felt the same way. A new name after advancement. They understood the new names of Goblin Rangers and Skull after evolution. Hobgoblin was the superior species of a goblin. In the case of Skull, he was an artificially born undead, so it was natural that there were higher species such as skeleton soldier and warrior. But what about Red Demon or Dark Elf? Well, Catalina had the mixed blood of Dark Elf and Succubus. But it was not an exaggeration to say that she was walking on her own path now. Although her physical abilities were strong enough to be confused as a human being, she was a human after all. On the contrary, the owner of the body, which was extremely weakened, was also a human. It was strange that there were detailed sub-items such as Red Demon Beast and Strider. It wasn't just because of Eligos but also because their sense of incompatibility was close to exploding beyond the critical point. Well, let me ask. Yong Ho cleared his complicated thoughts by lightly shaking his head. After stopping Lucia's attempt to nag in the bud, Yong Ho took a good break. Red Demon Tyrant? What the heck is that? Chapter 117 as expected, Gusion tilted his head. He did the same thing when he heard Red Demon Beast or Strider. Yong Ho narrowed his brows when Gusion said he could not understand Eligoza's new name at all. At that moment, Amon cut in. Gusion, just stop pretending not to know. My little master. It is probably the name that the soul of the young master or the power of evolution created for the sake of convenience based on his knowledge. That's why Gusion doesn't know those names. The power of evolution. Amon responded by increasing the flames. Gusion said with a giggle, Well, the power of evolution or the power of the demon king is based on the individual soul of the demon king. Namely, it falls out of nowhere. 
maybe I can say it's the power of my little master's soul. Yong Ho already heard a similar story. Recently, Ophelia mentioned the power of the soul while explaining to Yong Ho about the power of the demon king. When you first exercised the power of evolution, you said you saw things like colored smoke. But now, you can even discern the systemic family tree. Who changed it? Wonderful. Yong Ho nodded. It was a convincing explanation. It was Yong Ho himself who changed the incomprehensible form of colored smoke into an evolutionary information window like the game system. That was the case for them having names after evolution. Yong Ho gave them names for convenience's sake so that he could easily distinguish them. Um, somehow, I liked it. In fact, the new name reflected Yong Ho's preference because all the words he used to make the names came off the top of his head. Let's stop chatting at this point. The floor master on the ninth floor is waiting for me anxiously. Having said that, Gus Ion sat in his first class seat. Amon also silently sat next to him silently. Yong Ho turned his shoulders a few times as if to warm up lightly then headed for the arena. Seated in the front seat of the stand, Catalina watched Yong Ho. He's going to have a rough time. That guy is particularly strong among the floor masters on the ninth floor. This time, our little master might be penalized. Gus Ion giggled, biting a cigar in his mouth. There were several floor masters on each floor of the arena. That was why a different floor master appeared, depending on the challenger. Kentoros Kale, the ninth floor master, was the strongest among the floor masters available on the ninth floor. Despite Gyuzhin's expectation, however, Amon just smiled quietly then created gentle flames. Gus Ion soon knew why Amon reacted like this. Standing in front of Kentoro's Kale, wearing golden armor and armed with a large sword and shield, Yong Ho activated Amon and the magnetic field at the same time. Today, he intended to fight in a slightly different way than before. The magic power of greed was activated. The green flames that were burning on Yong Ho's right hand and the cold chill on his left hand were embodied in blue. And that wasn't all. This time, Brigada was activated. Yong Ho drew black magic from Catalina, who was sitting in the stand. The green flames and chill were mixed with black magic. Yong Ho found it hard to combine the flames and cold air into one. He could easily add darkness to the attribute of each one. Kentoro's Kale watched Yong Ho in embarrassment. He felt the magical power arising from Yong Ho's hands was unusual. Gus Ion opened his mouth wide then turned to Amon after blinking several times. He asked with his eyes, have you taught him by any chance? Amon answered with flames, suggesting he didn't. Did he realize it by himself then? Oh, our little master really has a knack of surprising people. Yong Ho's next step in using Brigada was to bring out the magic power of his subordinate spirits and make them his own. That wasn't all. Now, Yong Ho naturally fused their attributes. By adding darkness to the flames and chill, he created greater power. It was natural that Kentoro's Kale was embarrassed. He had never seen any head of the House of Mammon displaying such abilities based on the spirit's attributes in the arena. I'm sorry for Kale, but the guy on the tenth floor will have to face the same fate, unfortunately. Oh, it's Kaiwan on the tenth floor. It might be our little master who would be in trouble while challenging Kaiwan. Gus Ion grinned brightly, which looked rather wicked than mischievous. Amon concentrated on the arena again. Yong Ho and Kentoro's Kale clashed head on. As Gus Ion expected, the arena was filled with Kale's sad screaming. How cruel! That was what Gus Ion said first to Yong Ho when he returned to the stands after defeating Kale. Yong Ho frowned pointing to his body covered with wounds. You know I suffered a lot. Can't you see? The combat suit he purchased at the dungeon merchant was a mess. In particular, both sleeves were severely torn. However, Gus Ion clicked his tongue as if he didn't like Yong Ho's way of fighting. Gus Ion said, that's because you're still inexperienced in using both flames and chill at the same time. Don't you know who was dragging his feet while using all kinds of techniques in the name of practice? I feel sorry for Kale. He really liked to have the chance of fighting someone strong after a long time, saying he would show his chivalry. Then Gus Ion shook his head from side to side. 
Recalling Kale's muttering about the honor of a knight even before the fight, Yong Ho scratched his cheek a little. Come to think of it, Yong Ho felt he was too harsh toward Kale. Well, I also struggled quite a bit. Seriously, tell Kale that it was a great match. Are you kidding? Gus Ion giggled at that. Anyway, he was glad that Yong Ho made big progress. Yong Ho was getting strong and faster than any other family head that Gus Ion had ever seen until now. And the source of his strength was not only his greed and amen, which pleased Gus Ion. Wait a minute. Let me serve you after a long time. Suddenly, Gus Ion reached out to Yong Ho with big hands. Yong Ho unwittingly got nervous, but he didn't step back or act strangely. Something amazing happened when Gyuzhin's hands passed through the air above his head. Wow! Yong Ho's combat uniform, which was in tatters, recovered its original condition. It wasn't clear whether it was possible because of Gyuzhin's personal magic or any special power of the arena, but Yong Ho felt good about it anyway. Can't you upgrade my magic power and physical abilities? Asked Yong Ho. While making a satisfied expression at Yong Ho's question, Gus Ion frowned because he felt Yong Ho was too greedy like the King of Greed. No, I can't do it for you. As I told you from the beginning, this is my special service for you. Oh, I see. I have to give it up then. Ignoring Gyuzhin's words, Yong Ho searched for something in his pocket. Then he took out a bottle from the set of magic potions he obtained as a reward for defeating Kale on the ninth floor and drank it. It was different from the magic potion that Citri got him before. To be precise, the good Citri gave him were superior. Although the magic potion was obtained from the ninth floor, his magic power didn't max out immediately. It helped him heal slowly, but it had nothing like the effect of magic power enhancement. Nonetheless, he got as many as ten bottles. Moreover, it should be considered that Yong Ho's own magic became so powerful that it could not be compared to when he received the magic potion from Citri. Watching Yong Ho swallowing the magic potion, Gus Ion whistled then asked with a smile, are you trying to challenge the tenth floor without resting first? Although Gus Ion told Yong Ho that Kale was overwhelmed by him, that was not true. Gus Ion just exaggerated Kale's defeat to make fun of Yong Ho, so he admitted that Yong Ho also suffered a lot. In a general situation, Yong Ho should stop fighting and go back. He had as many as ten bottles of magic potion, but at the same time, it meant that he had only ten now. It didn't befit Yong Ho if he tried to challenge the tenth floor by consuming one of them. But it was Gyuzhin's misjudgment. Yong Ho was by no means the type of person who acted in a calculated way. Well, I feel good. I need to keep up with the momentum, let alone save time. Obviously, Kai Wan was a tough opponent. But Yong Ho's five senses were sharpened by his fight with Kale, so it was the right time for him to challenge Kai Wan. Yong Ho took off the bottle of magic potion from his mouth, which he drank about half of it. Given the speed of his surging magic power, he felt it was wise to stop drinking at this point. I wonder if I can seal this and drink it again later. The magic potion that Citri gave him worked only when he drank it down at a time. Well, I feel I can fight, given that my magic power is surging after drinking half of it. When he was agonizing for a moment, he noticed Catalina, flapping her tail gently. He turned to her and asked, Catalina, would you like to drink it? In fact, she was exhausted after supplying her black magic to him. She blinked at his unexpected suggestion but replied with a bright smile, thank you. Then she immediately took the magic potion from him and brought it to her mouth. She did it so naturally, but he felt embarrassed. He blushed before he knew it. He hurriedly let out the heat from his face, fanning with his hand desperately. But she was calm, and even Gus Ion casually looked at him. He felt rather awkward at the moment. What's the matter with you? Asked Gus Ion. Oh, it's kind of hot all of a sudden. Given that Gus Ion, who liked to make fun of him, tilted his head, Yong Ho realized that he didn't need to be excited at all. Wow my magic power is really recovering. After drinking the remaining magic potion, Catalina said, smiling brightly again. Yong Ho's eyes were fixed on her lips alone at the moment. Little Master. It was Amun's voice. Chapter, 118. Hmm. 
the next step that you mentioned last time. Fortunately, Yong Ho came to his senses after hearing Amun's voice. Gus Ion replied with a cheerful smile, yeah, I hate to admit it. The next step is for you to empower your subordinate spirits then share the power of Brigada with them. That's why the kings with the seven deadly sins should have powerful subordinate spirits under their command. Although there were several subordinate spirits, their master was one. What kind of synergy would be created if the power of all the powerful subordinate spirits were concentrated on their master? What if all the power of twelve spirits of the house of Mammon, each of whom could be called a legend, would be combined into one? That's outrageous. Yong Ho seemed to know why only those who had the seven deadly sins reigned as kings. It was really a great power. Brigada is a fragment of the demon king's flesh the fragments that didn't turn into godly energy. Suddenly, Yong Ho got intensely curious about godly energy. He could exert this much power with the general Brigada. Then, what kind of miracle could he pull off if he had godly energy? The seven unsurpassed magic powers that existed in the demon world were currently owned by each of their masters. Namely, the six kings of the seven deadly sins such as the king of pride, the king of envy, the king of lust, the king of sloth, the king of gluttony, and the king of wrath. And the king of violence who reigned as king even though he had no seven deadly sins. If Yong Ho didn't defeat one of them, he would never own the unsurpassed magic power. Yong Ho shook off such thoughts and decided to focus on his current job for now. At that moment, Gus Ion said, as I told you the other day, your opponent on the tenth floor is Kai Wan. Since the reward is special, the penalty is also special. What is the reward? Well, you can check with your own eyes after winning. I can't tell you the penalty right now. But at least you're not dying because of the penalty, so don't worry. Can you tell me which floor Kai Wan lost? Asked Yong Ho one after another. As if he organized his thoughts, Gus Ion replied after moving his neck several times, well, she was defeated several times. It would be no exaggeration to say that as a family head, she experienced the most defeats since the arena was created. If there is one of her defeats that you might be interested in, it's the twentieth floor. It was the penalty that demoted Kai Wan to a subordinate spirit of the arena from the head of the House of Mammon. It was the twentieth floor, not far from where Yong Ho was. You don't have to delay. Let's get started, Yong Ho said, turning his arm lightly. Not only Yong Ho's magic power but also Catalina's was almost completely restored. Giggling to himself, Gus Ion pointed to the arena with his chin. Kai Wan is waiting for you at the moment and very earnestly at that. Yong Ho turned to the arena. Indeed, as Gus Ion said, a woman with gray hair was standing there alone. Kai Wan, the demon king of distortion, it was her. Kai Wan wasn't dressed in an attire that Yong Ho used to see in the arena. A skin-tight leather attire mixed with black and red and a long hanging sword. Her gray hair was wrapped around her sad but ferocious face. She was the same as the one that he peeked at through the little magical power present in her ring of distortion. That look of hers was the same as the one when she was still the head of the House of Mammon. On the surface, she was quite calm. Rather, she was full of spite at the moment. Kai Wan stared at Yong Ho without saying anything, and Yong Ho faced her silently. After taking a deep breath, he opened the bag he brought for this visit in particular. He took out an old book and handed it to Kai Wan. This is Kian's journal. He kept a journal until he died. Kai Wan's eyes trembled. Yong Ho finally realized that Kai Wan wasn't staring at him but just looking at him. Yong Ho waited this time again, and Kai Wan clenched her teeth. After she received the journal reluctantly, she slowly turned the pages. Nobody hastened their fight. Gus Ion was silent, and the arena spirits and the previous heads of the House of Mammon in the stands waited for Kai Wan to respond. Kai Wan couldn't read the journal properly because her overflowing tears with the journal. She gasped for breath. Soon, she struggled to hold back her tears, but she couldn't control herself after all. She cried sadly like a child. Yong Ho waited again this time. After hesitating for a moment, he carefully hugged her. Just like she first heard about Kian's death, she didn't push away Yong Ho. Relying on his body temperature, she expressed her sorrow freely. 
how much time passed. Kaiwan's crying subsided. But she did not lift his forehead from his chest. After catching her breath several times, she said in a low voice, thanks. Then she pushed him out. She also stepped back to increase the distance between them. Finally, she faced him. At that moment, he just replied, you're welcome. When he deliberately spoke lightly, Kaiwan smiled a bit. Laughing a little loudly, she said, you didn't attack me when I was reading the journal or crying. Then, you could have defeated me easily. That was what Yong Ho didn't expect at all. He heard Gus Ion, who was sitting in the special seat in the stands, laughing heartily. Yong Ho smiled bitterly and said, well, I could do so, but it's not fair. It was a lie. Yong Ho didn't even think about it in the first place. Kaiwan knew it, too. That was why she hugged Kayan's journal dearly then turned around. Only after leaving it outside the arena, she stood again, looking at Yongho. If we fight for nothing, it won't be fun. So, let's bet. If you beat me, I'll grant your wish, no matter what it is, she said. What if I lose? When he asked back immediately, she leaned her head slightly. Well? I haven't really thought about it. In fact, I'm so grateful to you that I don't want to ask you for anything. Although it was brief, she smiled at him. Perhaps, she had never smiled like that for the past few decades. Yong Ho was calm on the surface but very agitated deep down. Did she say she would grant my wish, no matter what? At that moment, he heard somebody shouting from behind him. Me, me too. It was Catalina. Raising her tail upright, she shouted with her blushing face. If your master beats me, I'll grant your wish. Uh. Why did Catalina suddenly interfere? Catalina flinched at Yong Ho's embarrassed glance. She then covered her mouth with both hands. With her ears drooping, she became silent. Yong Ho blinked again, and Kai Wan smiled brightly. She even giggled, holding her belly. She was very different from the one that Yong Ho used to remember. Even Gus Ion and the former Mammon family heads, who looked at her with an embarrassed expression, felt the same way. She is cute. Kai Wan took her breath. Then she faced Yong Ho with a bright smile that she had never shown to anyone other than her younger brother Kian. Let me tell you again, thanks. So. Her ecstatic smile was brief. There was now ferociousness in her eyes full of affection. Powerful magic power came out from her body that was defenseless a moment ago. Kaiwan stepped forward. Her step was very light, but it was far from small. Kaiwan's breathing quickly enveloped Yongho. I will do my best. As soon as she finished talking, she brought out a storm with her sword. Yongho couldn't remember how he stopped her first blow. Her enchanted smile made him let down his guard, and her single advance made a dozen meters of distance to zero. It was a miracle that he stopped her first sword attack, aiming at his chest. No, it wasn't like a miracle. Yong Ho stopped it with his skills. His sense of fighting never collapsed because of her smile. His sense of death, which he cultivated by dying dozens or hundreds of times, responded sharply. The moment Kai Wan swung her sword, the magnetic field covered Yong Ho's left arm. Her sword and the magnetic field collided, and Yong Ho's lower body hit the ground hard without waiting for his command. Without resisting the force from her attack, he moved his body accordingly. He increased the distance to buy time. While he was stepping back, the flames of Red Lotus arose. Kai Wan's vision was dazzled for a moment, and by the time the flames disappeared, he already grabbed Amon. His distance from Kai Wan was only five meters. Both hit the ground at the same time. They rushed toward each other. Yong Ho flew high. He wielded Amon hard from top to bottom. On the other hand, Kai Wan flew low. She looked like she was crawling on the floor. She pulled her hand, holding the sword between her armpits. Yong Ho concentrated, so he could share the time. At that moment, Amon drew a beautiful trajectory. She was inside the trajectory. Now, even before she touched him, she was about to expose her upper body to Amon. But that didn't happen. Buang. During that moment, 
Amun struck the air, not Kai Wan. Clearly, Yong Ho struck down with Amun, but it was a horizontal cut. Amun's flames burned the air above Kai Wan's gray hair. Space distortion. She didn't just make a shield to protect herself. She distorted the space itself where Yong Ho was attacking and directed Amun's attack into the wrong place. But she herself penetrated into his body. Besides, she moved around behind his back and babbled on cheerfully. It's time for you to be punished. Her sword wrapped around his body. It wasn't a figurative expression, but it was real. It was what they called a whip sword. Its blade, which turned into something like a whip, coiled his body like a snake, and Kaiwan shook her arm roughly. Then she hurled him hard on the ground. A powerful shock beyond imagination hit him on the back. Moreover, the blade of the whip sword slit his body. A dazzling sense of pain penetrated his spine as if it contained poison, or there was something special about Kaiwan's magic power, flowing through the blade. Her attack didn't end there. She unleashed her Herculean power and randomly swung the whip sword that stretched more than a dozen meters. Yong Ho, hanging on the end of the whip sword, had to kiss the ground several times. It lasted dozens of seconds at most, but his damages were beyond imagination. He had never been dealt a big blow like this since he challenged his opponents in the arena. Actually he had never been wounded heavily since he fought for us. Cook. Yong Ho became more vigilant. His whole body ached, but he activated the green flames. Burning Kaiwan's mana, he opened all four horns. At that moment, Kaiwan's whip sword could not withstand his vast mana and let go of him. But he couldn't feel relieved because she, who was standing before him, was gone. He cast the spell of chill as much as he could. He instinctively activated it. Kaiwan, who was about to attack him from the side, was engulfed by the chill. But he failed this time, too. The shield of distortion that she spread out wide drove out the chill. Then she charged at him and brandished the sword. The tight and powerful sword struck his waist like a blunt weapon. At that moment, he almost broke his legs, but he endured it, clenching his teeth. Once again, he swung Amun and spouted the waves of green flames. But she escaped his attack. She disappeared again this time. The green flames went nowhere, blocked by the barrier of distortion. Chapter, 119 He's being fooled by her. Watching their fight silently for some time, Gus Ion spoke. The battle went on as he expected. Objectively, Kaiwan had more disadvantages than Yong Ho. Although she had four horns as he did, the quality and quantity of her mana were different. Yong Ho had almost five horns, while Kaiwan just managed to get four. The same was true for their physical strength and durability. In all respects, Yong Ho's body went through a total change, so it was superior to hers in every respect. Yong Ho also surpassed her in the ability to detect mana. Beyond detecting it, he even discerned it. Moreover, he freely used more than two attributes, while she could use only one attribute. Above all, she could not discern mana as he did. Namely, he was superior to her in terms of mana, comprehensive physical performance, and sense. The only advantage she had over him was her talent for fighting. But she was stronger. Fighting was not about comparing the same things. Fighting was about defeating the opponent with one's comparative advantage. Kaiwan was slightly faster than Yong Ho. For more than a few decades, he honed her skills in the arena. She had far superior swordsmanship than him. These three factors were more than enough for her win. She would teach him what defeat was. But he is expecting to defeat her. Amun spoke quietly. Gus Ion turned to Amun and smiled bitterly. He wanted Yong Ho to learn from defeat. He wanted Yong Ho to reflect on his own shortcomings on the occasion of this fighting. But on one hand, Gus Ion expected Yong Ho to overcome this ordeal. He wanted Yong Ho to break through the tenth floor without any defeat for the first time in the opening of the arena by defeating her. Can he defeat her? asked Gus Ion. Instead of replying right away, Amun sparked red flames. He looked at the arena. The fighting was going on. Maybe he will. He should surely. Gus Ion also looked at the arena. 
He opened his eyes wide at the spectacular scene there and stood up in no time. That's why I like my little master. Fortunately, Yong Ho couldn't hear it. That was why Gusayan laughed louder. He swung his clenched fist in the air. Amon smiled quietly then he watched Yong Ho. The moment Gusayan turned his head, Kai Wan, who hit Yong Ho multiple times, was about to step back to increase the distance between them. Kai Wan hit the ground in succession. She wanted to distract his gaze with her exceedingly speedy jump. Her own attack was effective. She could block his long-range attack with the power of distortion. In terms of short-range fighting, she was much more advantageous. If she continued to fight on like this, she could defeat him overwhelmingly. What she told him first was sincere. She really appreciated his consideration. Since she was so grateful to him, she wanted to show her skills fully. Gus Ion told her to teach him about defeat, saying it would make him stronger, and that it would help him truly stand tall as the king of greed. Kaiwan agreed. That was why she activated her mana more ferociously. Strong mana radiated from her four horns. This time, she planned to attack him from behind. This time, she wanted to deal a fatal blow by breaking his legs. But she did not want to inflict severe pain on him. She wanted to finish the fighting as soon as possible. However, Yong Ho had no intention of giving up so easily. The waves of the green flames swept over Kai Wan once again, who was about to attack him from behind. Moreover, this time, it was different from the previous one. She thought the green flames would engulf her from the front, but bigger waves of flames swept her from overhead. It was like a tsunami a huge attack that she could not avoid nor distort. Kai Wan clenched her teeth. She wrapped the power of distortion around her whole body. With the shield of space, she blocked his attack from all directions except the floor. The green flames covered the barrier of distortion. They continued to burn without fading. As if to block Kai Wan's movement, his mana kept pouring down from above. It was definitely a huge power. Kai Wan could do nothing except sticking it out with the barrier of distortion. But his attack was relentless. No matter how strong his mana was, it was too excessive. If this fighting would end up as a war of attrition, it would be Yong Ho, not Kai Wai, who would be defeated. How long could he keep that waterfall of flames? A dozen or two seconds at most. Kai Wan curled up her body so as to reduce her mana by reducing the barrier of distortion. Fighting was about striking the opponent with one strength. However, Yong Ho made the wrong move. This is better for him. Kai Wan didn't need to torment him anymore. All she had to do was to wait until he collapsed after using up his mana. But her assumption crumbled in just a few seconds. What the heck is this? She raised her head then hugged her shoulders before she knew it. Everybody was tense. The blood of Mammon, the king of greed, flowing through her body, shouted wildly. The waves of the green flames were still robust. Kai Wan could not dare to release the power of distortion. She could not even see something green beyond her eyes. A few seconds passed again, and Kai Wan gulped. She could clearly feel that Yong Ho's mana was getting stronger. Even though he was pouring out his mana like crazy, his strength grew stronger and stronger. What the hell is happening outside? An unknown fear seized Kai Wan. She couldn't stand it anymore. This time, it was Kai Wan's turn to go the extra mile. Kai Wan didn't save her mana. Faced with the overwhelming waves of the green flames, she solidified the barrier of distortion. Then she launched herself to cut through the waves of the green flames. During that short span of time, Kai Wan ran into the gap in the waterfall of the green flames that seemed to close any time soon. She managed to get out of it and looked at him. And she understood what he had done and why he bound her with the waterfall of green flames. Green eyes flashed from his eyes. Unlike his right hand, which he extended as if to control the waterfall of green flames, he placed his left hand on his chest. What he activated was the power of evolution. And what he had done for several seconds when she was held in the waterfall of green flames was the evolution of mana specialization. It was crazy. He had never used the power of evolution in the midst of fully pouring out mana. He should not have done it in front of his enemy. Nonetheless, he did. 
he had a duel with Tigrius. He had fighting experiences while conquering the fifth to ninth floor, and now he was fighting Kaiwan. During the battle, his evolution EXP reached the maximum. It wasn't the first time. Normally, he would have put it off after the battle. He knew how to fight. He hit the opponent's strength with his own strength. By using that skill, he could survive until now. He continued to defeat his opponents, who were much stronger than him objectively. It was his mana that made him superior to Kaiwan. However, he could not defeat her with his current mana. What should he do now? The answer was simple. He needed to make his strength more mighty and surpass her in terms of mana. Ah! Yong Ho roared. At that moment, the entire arena was shaken once again. Powerful mana swirled around him. The waterfall of the green flames disappeared, but no one could notice it because he was now showing a more powerful strength. A fifth horn sprouted through his forehead. The moment he overcame the wall of distortion, he released mana completely different from the previous one. Moreover, he didn't stop there. Another roar rang from the barrier surrounding the arena. Catalina screamed in pain and joy, clutching her chest. A fourth horn sprouted over Catalina's ears. The moment Yong Ho became stronger, Catalina, the dungeon spirit, also overcame the barrier, which once again reinforced him. Kaiwan couldn't hesitate anymore. Rather than overwhelmed, she rushed forward courageously as if she could not be defeated. But he couldn't reach her. Although he desperately wielded his sword, he was blocked by the shield of distortion. The green flames reinforced by Catalina's black mana encircled Kaiwan in an instant. Yongho gasped for breath. Doing evolution during battle was indeed difficult. But he smiled. Beyond the shield of distortion that started from her left hand, he faced her eyes that became as sharp as those of cats and beasts. It's round two. Now it begins. Kaiwan couldn't answer. Yongho didn't care. He concentrated the power of greed in one place and expanded the shield of distortion into a terrifying size. Kaiwan's slender body bounced out in an instant. Instead of pursuing her, Yongho extended his right hand. Catalina. In response to his call, her black mana expanded with an explosive momentum. Looking almost like a giant's hand, it grabbed Kaiwan. Kaiwan hastily activated the power of distortion. But it was too late. By the time she activated the power of distortion, the giant's hand was already hitting the floor. Kohak. She had a shock that seemed to break her whole body. However, Yongho did not stop there. He did not miss the mana of the wind arising from her left arm. He had the black giant press down on her with his hand and activated the green flames once again. The green flames were blazing, aided by black mana. The flames reached her in an instant, like a spark burning along a fuse, and swallowed up the mana of the wind that she created hard. After swallowing her who protected himself with the shield of distortion, he beat her body with black mana. It was literally a brutal attack. Even though he was using Catalina's mana through Brigada, he still felt it was insufficient. Obviously, it was a war of attrition. Yongho violently roared and swung his right arm once again. Then he struck down Kaiwan several times, who was engulfed with the green flames by the giant's hands. However, Kaiwan suffered no wounds thanks to the shield of distortion. But she could do nothing about the shock. When she was struck for the third time and when Yongho also felt that he reached his limits, the shield of distortion surrounding her body was broken. It was not because she couldn't withstand the shock but because she lost all her energy. Yongho hurriedly withdrew his mana. At that moment, he felt tremendous fatigue. Since he used too much mana, his hands and feet were trembling. Although he couldn't see her, he felt Catalina, gasping for breath in the stands. However, he moved forward instead of sitting down. Then he approached Kaiwan, who fell on the floor and wiggled. Kaiwan was on the verge of losing consciousness. Barely holding on, she looked at Yongho's face and smiled a bit. She almost ran out of steam when she swore, You bad bastard. Yongho smiled. She passed out with a smile. Mammon's mana was formed over her body. He grasped Mammon's mana with more joy than before. 
he enjoyed the full thrill of victory. Right after that, he saw boxes of light floating before his eyes. Chapter 120 Yong Ho did not wait for the guidance of greed. The moment he saw the boxes of light lining up side by side, he could feel it immediately. On the far left was something that could grant his wish. It was so natural, and Yong Ho realized that he was breathing with greed. He wasn't sure if it was a temporary phenomenon or if he really leveled up, but at least for now, it could be said that Yong Ho was greed itself. When he touched them, the boxes of light shattered, scattering away. A sheet of antique parchment appeared through the twinkling light. Magic scroll. The moment Yong Ho blinked and grabbed the parchment, somebody shouted loudly, Hey, little master. You're so cruel and brutal. You have no mercy at all. Yong Ho quickly turned his head to find Gus Ion standing there. Catalina was in his arms, who contracted the distance between the stands and the arena with one big jump. As he had such a big build, she looked like a baby in his arms. Since she could not come here in person, I've carried her here. With a hearty laugh, Gus Ion put her down on the floor. She stumbled as if she heard some loud noise above her head, or she was exhausted, so he quickly reached out to support her. Then he hugged her waist with one hand. Catalina, are you okay? When he gently hugged her in her arms and asked carefully, she nodded. She smiled with an effort. I'm fine. She was lying, of course. Her whole body was hot like a fireball as if she had a fever after a fourth horn sprouted shortly ago. However, it seemed that he didn't have to worry much. She experienced it before, and above all, there was a great sense of accomplishment and joy in her eyes. In the end, Yong Ho also smiled at her and said, Thanks. I've won, thanks to you. Having said that, he stroked her head with his other hand that did not hold her waist. She slightly bit her lower lip as if to hide her expression, but she couldn't help but turn her mouth up slightly with joy. She couldn't even control her flapping ears and tail. Hey, you guys are looking good, but they are watching you, said Gus Ion, pointing toward the stands with his chin. Not only the former heads of the House of Mammon but also the arena spirits were watching Yong Ho and Catalina intensely. Yong Ho tried to avoid embarrassment by clearing his throat. He then gently lowered her from his arms after persuading her, who was trying to stand up, to sit down on the floor, he faced Gus Ion. Then he held out the scroll that came out of the light boxes. What is this? Summons. There was a word placed at the top which looked like the title. Gus Ion answered, folding his arms, as the name suggests, it is a summons. You can summon the arena's spirits. At that moment, Yong Ho's eyes looked different. Gus Ion laughed insidiously because he already expected such a reaction. However, there are some limitations. While reading the summons instinctively, Yong Ho raised his head again. Giggling a lot, Gus Ion raised three of his fingers. First, this is not permanent. If you read the summons carefully, you will realize that the maximum days of summons are three days. Then he folded one finger. The three fingers did not mean only the summoning period of three days. Second, summon targets are limited to the floor masters you have defeated so far. In other words, I'm excluded from the summons list. Dang it, moaned Yong Ho before he knew it. He regretted a lot that he could not summon Gus Ion. If he could, Gus Ion could do lots of things during those three days. His regret was Gyuzhin's pleasure. Gus Ion said with an air of arrogance, Oh, it is too early for you to be disappointed. The floor masters you summon can sincerely do their best without any adjustment. That's the third limitation. Gus Ion folded all three fingers. At that moment, something came to Yong Ho's mind quickly. Gush Ion, you said Kai Wan went up to the twentieth floor, right? Yes. You said that the tenth floor is special is the eleventh floor weaker than the tenth floor. No way. Replying leisurely, Gus Ion observed Yong Ho. At first, he didn't like Yong Ho that much, but these days, the more he saw Yong Ho, the more he liked this little master. Obviously, Yong Ho must have grasped the meaning of the third limitation while talking with Gus Ion. Kai Wan had climbed to the twentieth floor. That meant that Kai Wan was at least stronger than the floor master on the nineteenth floor. 
Despite that, Kai Wan was serving as the floor master on the 10th floor instead of the 19th floor. If that was the case, the reason for that was just one. Yong Ho realized what it meant when Kai Wan said she would use her total might right before fighting. So, what she meant was she would use her total might on the 10th floor, right? Correct. Kai Wan did not lie. Like she said, she really did her best. However, her total might was limited. Yong Ho made a forced laugh. He asked, dropping his shoulders, I wonder if all the floor masters did the same thing. Some of them did, but others didn't. For example, the steel cow, Torin, you fought on the first floor has used his total might. But poor Kale, who lost to you on the ninth floor, is different. The real Kale is much stronger. After all, the lower their assigned floor was, the less might they could use. Come to think of it, such logic was very plausible. Yong Ho didn't know how many spirits there were in the arena, but it was difficult to think that their individual abilities were ranked according to the difficulty level of each floor. What are the specific restrictions? Well, mana or physical abilities as a whole there are some other things, but it's difficult to list them all because each individual has different capabilities. As if it was difficult to explain, Gus Ion, with a slight frown, shook his hand. Gus Ion then glanced at the summons in Yong Ho's hand as if to change the topic and said, even if you have passed the tenth floor, few guys get the reward like you. Obviously, you will find it useful. Yong Ho nodded unwittingly. Now that the battle with the western region was around the corner, there was no reward more valuable than this one. Indeed, it's a special reward. You deserve to be condescending. No way. As you know, there are some more rewards. Oh my gosh, I've never seen Kai Wan smiling so brightly like that. Pointing to Kai Wan with his chin, who passed out, Gus Ion giggled again. At that moment, Yong Ho tilted his head because he couldn't understand what Gus Ion said. In no time, he blushed. Wish. Obviously, she mentioned it. Since she mentioned it without specifying the situation where Yong Ho would be defeated, it was difficult to say that the betting was proper, but she made the promise anyway. If you win, I will grant your wish, no matter what it is. Kai Wan's voice was automatically played in his head. Moreover, it wasn't just her voice that came to his mind. Yong Ho's eyes turned to the lower right. Catalina, who was resting quietly, flinched at his gaze and lowered her head slightly. Unlike her stiff tail, her slightly drooping ears were red. Any wish? Kai Wan clearly said she would grant it. Yong Ho blushed. He was a twenty-year-old blood-boiling youth who graduated from all-male middle and high schools as well as college. Even if a saint peeked into his mind, he wouldn't blame this young man. However, there was someone who admired him in a different way. A tremendous desire no, it's anguish. It's really awesome. It's awesome in many ways. Little master, if you had this kind of anguish in the battle with Kai Wan, I guess you would have won even without turning to evolution. Amun's stern voice broke his delusions. Only then did Yong Ho notice Gyuzhen's smirking gaze and cleared his throat in succession. Then, he blew away the heat from his face by fanning it with his hand. Right at that moment, his legs were wobbly, and he flopped down helplessly. Oh my gosh! My lord! Catalina, with her head down, was startled and hurriedly turned to Yong Ho. As if to stop her, Gus Ion shook his hand. You don't have to worry. He is simply exhausted. As you witnessed, he was messed up by Kai Wan. His injuries were almost healed in the process of evolution, but his accumulated damages were still there. Gus Ion said to Yong Ho, go to Skathak. She will cure you well. Injuries in the arena weren't real injuries. However, his mind regarded his injuries in the arena as real. So, he could not overlook his injuries. What he could avoid in the arena was physical damage and death. So, he had to endure the fatigue, pain, and aftereffects from his injuries. Well, you have a point, but. Yong Ho also knew Scat Hacker's ability because the reason he sought her from the beginning was to have her treat his injuries in the arena. Like Gus Ion said, he actually went to Scat Hack for treatment in the past. But there was something that he had to do first for now. Like you said, I don't think the compensation is over yet. 
This time, Gusion tilted his head. Yong Ho looked at Amun on his wrist. Amun. Unlike Gusion, Amun understood what Yong Ho meant. It wasn't just Yong Ho whose evolution EXP maxed out. It had been a few months since Yong Ho obtained Amun. There have been so many things since then. Above all, he experienced so many deadly fights that he couldn't count them one by one. And finally, all of Amun's evolution EXP were gathered. Amun's previous changes were made due to the power of evolution. It was because Amun himself released his power a little more with Yong Ho getting strong enough. He wanted to evolve Amun. He wanted to make Amun return to his original figure, which Yong Ho had degenerated to fit himself. However, Amun gently expressed his rejection. He spoke in a strict but friendly voice. You don't need to hurry, little master. First, I recommend you to visit Scathack for rest. You are exhausted, and as things stand now, you can't evolve my body. And. As a little master, you had better hear something from Scathack. Yong Ho could not accept it initially. How earnestly he wished for the chance to evolve Amun since he got him. Above all, he had been long prepared for evolving Amun, the Spear of Red Lotus. After all, Yong Ho nodded, accepting his suggestion. Yong Ho stopped thinking about him any further. He turned to Kai Wan. Although she passed out after exhausting her physical strength, she looked very calm. Can I see her when I come here next time? Actually, he met none of the floor masters that he had defeated so far. Gus Ion replied sardonically, Don't worry. Just think about your wish. Well, it must be too obvious. Then he laughed slyly again. Yong Ho, who blushed instinctively, said a little fiercely, Bullshit, man. Give me the letter. What letter? Chapter, 121. Instead of answering, Yong Ho mimicked Yuzhen's expression. Alarmed, Gus Ion gnawed his teeth and rummaged through his pocket. Man, here you are. It was his letter to Scathack. Upon receiving the sealed letter, Yong Ho smiled warmly. He was not sure whether it was because of the power of greed or his illusion, but he felt Yuzhen's sincerity in the letter. Gusun. Why? I just called you. I think you're a better guy than I think. Yuzhen's expression turned bizarre. Yong Ho laughed like Skull and stood up with Catalina. It seemed like the two relied on each other. Let's go, Catalina. Yes, master. She quickly responded and nodded with a joyful expression. Her tail fluttered pleasantly. Yong Ho and Catalina moved out of Guzhen's sight. Watching them silently, Gus Ion muttered with mixed feelings, I wonder if I am right in describing them as master and Alun well, Alun was more ferocious anyway. He spoke with longing and joy as well as wistfulness mixed in his voice. Amun didn't respond, and Gus Ion did not want his response. Taking out a cigar and putting it in his mouth, Gus Ion kept saying wistfully, I really miss our Lord. Even now, when he closed his eyes, he remembered clearly the last time he looked at the king's back. Let me go back now, Gus Ion. Almond's voice was also trembling. Smiling at him once, Gus Ion slightly stuck out a cigar in his mouth, and Almond scattered the flames of the red lotus in the air with a smile. One of the small embers lit his cigar. Amun disappeared. Yong Ho and Catalina were no longer visible. But Gus Ion did not turn. Standing still, he was puffing out the smoke. Then he recalled the distant past. It's really bad for my heart. Do you know how anxiously I am waiting for you every time you go to the arena? You get disconnected to me suddenly then it takes a few hours to connect to you again. If you think I like you because you have come back much stronger, you're mistaken. Awesome. The dungeon's mana has been greatly enhanced along with the control. What am I saying now? Anyway, it's not good for my heart. As soon as Yong Ho got out of the arena, something like Lucia's nagging or affectionate complaints kept pouring down like rain. Making a sorry expression at her voice full of worry, Yong Ho laughed silly at her continuing chattering. Come to think of it, isn't Lucia's whole body her heart? Then, what's bad for the heart means that it's also bad for her whole body, right? Yong Ho stopped being a bit delusional about her and raised his head again. 
Catalina looked at him with a worried expression. Since she couldn't hear Lucia's voice, it was natural that she thought his action was strange because he suddenly giggled as soon as he turned around the arena. He stroked her hair again then said emphatically to clear her suspicion, did you say I became so strong? Of course. Maybe you can take full control of the first basement floor. I'm sure you can. Definitely. What happened at the arena? Lucia was usually psyched but even so today. She seemed so because she underwent a sudden growth. Although he couldn't see it, he could feel it. Obviously, the heart of the dungeon grew one step further. The images of Lucia in his head also changed from a young girl to a girl in the mid to late teens, who looked like an adult now. Instead of explaining, he pointed his finger at the center of his forehead. As he withdrew mana to hide the horns, what he touched at the tip of his fingers was his smooth forehead, but Lucia could discern it. Fifth horn. Oh my god. My master has a fifth horn. There was a marked gap between the second and third horns. And the gap widened as the number of horns increased. So, it was natural that Lucia grew up, and that Catalina had a fourth horn. Yongho's growth this time was so dramatic. Anything unusual while I was in the arena? He asked. No, but something unusual happened yesterday. Dungeon Spirit Eligoza's mana has become stronger. I can't confirm the current status of the Dungeon Spirit Skull and Ophelia because they are in the dungeon of the House of Randolt, but it is clear that they have also changed oh my god. Lucia. Lucia could not immediately answer his call. Only shortly afterward did she respond emotionally. A fourth horn has sprung out of Ophelia, the Dungeon Spirit. Finally, Ophelia has a fourth horn. Wow, numerous happy events in a row. Yong Ho smiled happily then told Catalina briefly about it since she was curious about what was going on. Even Catalina was so happy about Ophelia's fourth horn, but her expression was rather strange. Moreover, the way she touched the upper part of her ears was also unnatural. Only then did he find out what was on her mind. So, while brushing her hair, he told Lucia, Catalina also has four horns. Wow, really? I'm thrilled because everyone has suddenly become strong. Yongho's expression represented Lucia's reaction. Catalina, who wanted to show off her four horns, slightly bit her lower lip to hide her satisfied smile. He stroked Catalina's hair again and let out a long sigh. Since he was psyched in one way or another, he forgot he was still in bad shape. Lucia asked again in a worried tone. Master, are you okay? You look very tired. He didn't deny it flatly. Leaning against Catalina slightly, he said to Lucia, Tell Eligos to come here, no, to Skathaka's room on the first basement floor. Catalina and I will also move there. Okay. Don't overwork yourself. Please wait where you are now. I'll call Clay Golems in the training ground to come here. Sometimes it would be nice to use something to ride on, right? She insisted rather than inviting him to do so. Yongho nodded gently again this time. Sure, please. Yongho sat with Catalina on the sofa in Kaiwan's lounge. How long did they wait? Soon, clay golems appeared, making a thumping noise. What a mess you are. Skathak, standing clockwise, spoke to Yongho with a bitter smile. Yongho, who was held in clay golems elegantly, smiled bitterly. Lucia was currently trying to take over the entire first floor of the Labyrinth of Greed. So, Yongho directly ordered the golems to put him and Catalina down. Eligos wasn't seen yet because he was still coming down. Watching the clay golems waddling out of the Garden of Life, Skathak cast her gaze at Yongho and Catalina again. Well, I don't need your explanation. Okay, you need recovery first. Take a deep breath and relax. Yongho and Catalina gently followed her instruction. Right after he breathed out, Yongho suddenly felt naked. Skathak. He didn't even finish talking. When Skathak beckoned lightly, all his clothes including his underwear were removed. In a strange sense of liberation, Yongho knew what he had to do. But it was too late. The moment he rolled his eyes to the side, this time, a fresh blue liquid wrapped around his body. It was the same for Catalina, 
who was sitting next to Yong Ho. Scat Hack touched the air again. Then, Yong Ho and Catalina's clothes were folded and placed neatly on the floor. How about it? You feel so comfortable that you don't even want to resist, right? With his whole body buried in a blue liquid mass and only his head sticking out, he nodded instinctively. He wanted to deny it, but he felt really comfortable. Catalina moaned pleasantly with her eyes closed. Yong Ho felt so comfortable as if he was bathing in hot spring water. He felt like all the fatigue in his body was washed away. And that wasn't the only effect. The blue liquid, which could be called the vitality of Scathack, the immortal witch, breathed new power into them. It also affected their souls, too. It's extremely significant that the demons have one more horn. What I mean is you should not be content with the fact that your mana has become strong. Scathack approached him. Part of the blue liquid from the floor entwined her legs. Elun even described one more horn as rebirth. I agree with it to some extent because it's not your appearance that changes. Your essence can be changed. And this change becomes greater as the number of horns increases. Yong Ho could feel something about Scathack. His feeling was similar to what he felt about his dungeon spirits Catalina and Elagos. It seems that both of you overworked yourselves. You seem to have consumed a lot of mana right away as soon as you got another horn. But you will be in big trouble. So, you had better refrain from repeating it next time. Yong Ho could not help but laugh awkwardly at her words. Obviously, he must have been crazy enough to use up the power of evolution during the battle. Oh my gosh, I think I was nagging too long. Don't speak ill of me later. She was kind and gentle, which was different from Lucia's. It was unthinkable to speak ill of Scathack, who smiled as lovingly as a mother. Yong Ho pointed to the floor with a glance. Rummage through the inner pocket of my jacket. You'll find a letter from Gusayan. Scat Hacker's expression immediately brightened. Thank you as always. You're welcome. Smiling shyly, she took Gyuzhin's letter. Normally, she would have opened the seal of the letter and started reciting it to Yong Ho, but she didn't today. Looking at the letter lovingly for a moment, she quickly poised herself and faced Yong Ho again. I want to read it right now, but I have a lot to do today. In particular, I have something to tell you, little master. Her voice was still sweet. But her eyes were a little different from before. Yong Ho recalled what Amun had said before he left the arena. Skathak has something to tell you. Why was it now? Was it because he had five horns? You know that Brigada and the seven godly energies were the fragments of the demon king's flesh, right? She started by asking him. Yong Ho nodded because he experienced various things since he got Brigada. The absolute power that didn't exist anymore. Some said that the demon king was the true creator of the demon world, and others said he was just a symbolic mass of power. No one could affirm which was more true. However, no one could deny the fact that the demon king existed. The seven deadly sins, the fragments of the spirit of the demon king. The seven godly energies, the fragments of his flesh. Brigada, the remnant of the demon king and God's metal, who didn't have godly energy. Skathak now started to mention godly energy, which was not the seven deadly sins, and Brigada. Chapter, 122. Godly energy can be said to be a huge chunk of Brigada. Brigada is an alloy with a lot of impurities while godly energy is pure gold. Therefore, its synergy with the power of sin is not comparable to Brigada. Moreover, each godly energy has special abilities. The godly energy that fell into the hands of the king with the power of sin is truly the strongest weapon. All the six kings, who currently rule the demon world, had one godly energy. Even though he possessed one of the seven deadly sins, only Yong Ho had no godly energy. You can deal with godly energy with godly energy alone. However, there is no godly energy in the house of Mammon now. In the past, Mammon, the king of greed, possessed four out of the seven godly energies. But after his death, there wasn't a single godly energy left in the Mammon family. All of them were taken away by other kings. Yong Ho felt a little incongruity in Skathaka's words. She spoke as if the day would come when Yong Ho had to confront other kings. 
maybe she wanted him to prepare for the future. The distance between Skathak and Yong Ho narrowed. They were close enough to feel each other's breathing. My master, the King of Greed, has prepared something, so any future King of Greed can confront those kings with godly energy proudly. Skathak reached out. Then, Yong Ho's hands, buried in the blue liquid, were naturally lifted. She gently wrapped them and said, You are a qualified person. I'm going to make your power complete by getting the approval of all twelve dungeon spirits. Even while all of his clothes were being removed, the magnetic field on his left arm was activated. Silver metal covered his left arm. Skathak kissed the magnetic field then breathed new magic into the back of Yong Ho's hand. The light enveloped the magnetic field. At that moment, its shape changed, like a dungeon spirit exposed to the power of evolution. A small circle was drawn on the back of his hand with the magnetic field. There were twelve grooves in the circle like a clock, and a clear blue gem was placed in one of the grooves that grooved between ten and eleven o'clock. Yong Ho could understand it. He instinctively felt Skathaka's mana from the magnetic field. Conquer the Labyrinth of Greed. Get the recognition by the twelve spirits of the House of Mammon as the new king. If you become the true king of greed. Skathak smiled. Clipping her words a bit, she took a step back and widened the distance with Yong Ho. Showing elegant manners to him like she met him on the first day, she concluded by saying, you'll have a new godly energy. It's not the existing godly energy of the demon king, but Mammon's the king of greed. The eighth godly energy. Despite being different from all the seven godly energies that originated from the demon king, the new godly energy can stand up against them. I don't want to push you for it hurriedly. But it would be better for you to have a clear goal, right? Skathak moved her hands again. Then, a black shadow erupted behind her back. It took on the form of fear. Yong Ho had seen it before. Although he saw it momentarily, he remembered it clearly. Obviously, it was one of the twelve spirits he faced when he peeked into the memories of Mammon. What's on the second floor of the Labyrinth of Greed is Capricorn, Baphomet, the Demon of Slaughter. It was a vicious monster that could be called Darkness itself, which reaped death with a huge scythe. It's the worst among Mammon's twelve spirits. Skathak, the immortal witch, never lied. Yong Ho knew it. He stared straight at the red eyes of the black monster formed behind her back. It was none other than magic. The monster's red eyes had mana. Yong Ho slowly closed his eyes and locked Skathaka's mana transmitted through her eyes, the window of the soul, and his memories of it under his eyelids. Darkness colored the world. But it wasn't long. New colors began to color the whole world that turned black. It wasn't just Skathaka's mana. Mammon's mana that he absorbed from the arena also responded. Those memories arising from that mana filled the empty spaces one by one. Yong Ho forgot himself. His five senses gradually became dull, and in the end, only vision and a little hearing were left. It was a black world around him. The grey sky filled with dark clouds was like a disaster. Corpses were scattered around the collapsed and broken castle gates. They were all badly disfigured bodies. The flesh and blood were randomly entangled, making it impossible to distinguish each other. Destruction was not limited to the castle gates. Yong Ho could smell the scent of rotting corpses, carried by the wind from far away. It was still. Although corpses were everywhere, there was not a single crow around them. Obviously, they all ran away. The smell of death was simply so strong. The living did not dare to approach. Apparently, a child's arm was in the middle of the road. The old teddy bear, which he must have grasped to reduce his fear, was mixed with blood and pieces of flesh. It was impossible to tell if it was the child's arm or someone else's, who died in this city. Just because the sky was grey, it did not mean that everything in the world lost its colour. Although it was a scene of terrible destruction, the city contained many colours, as if to remember the glory of the past. Blue roofs and white walls, red and blue curtains, and grey bridges. Green grass even in this place full of death. Yong Ho could realize that this city was occupied by the demon world. This could be called the human world, just like the place where Yong Ho came from. Someone stared at the teddy bear in the child's hand. 
The watery eyes hidden under the blue hair were full of melancholy. Scathack, the master of memory, couldn't pick up the teddy bear, after all. Calming her rough breathing, she stared at the center of the city, where all the causes of death originated in. Gus Ion stood next to her. He was no longer a leisurely and large-hearted man, his signature appearance in the arena. He was full of anger. The anger was so intense that the mana emanating from his fists distorted the atmosphere around him. Ilun did not disturb Gus Ion. Although she covered her eyes with a red belt, she could know it. This place was not a battlefield, nor was it a space where they confronted each other with hostilities for survival. It was a place where they committed slaughter. It was a feast of meaningless death. Ilun was silent, and it meant that she was extremely angry. A black-haired knight disturbed the three. Kentoros, he was wearing silver armor and had round shields and large bows on each arm. He did not express anger like the three. He just looked at the center of the city with cold-hearted eyes. There was nothing like an expression on this middle-aged man's face with some wrinkles. Let's go. Yong Ho heard a voice behind his back. And the owner of the voice began to walk ahead. As always, he led his members majestically just like a king. Yong Ho couldn't read anything from that voice. It was a voice that they could interpret differently. Some would feel anger in that voice, while others would feel calm. When they approached the center of the city, the smell of death grew thicker. It looked like everything that had not lost its color even under the gray sky seemed to be dyed with darkness. And finally, the source of death revealed itself. A mountain of corpses piled up randomly became the throne for the incarnation of death. Sitting on it, the black monster was chewing on a leg that seemed to be the child's, with an eerie smile. Its head reminded one of a goat. The body, covered with black hair, was full of muscles that seemed to burst out any time soon. The black monster shook its head. Then, it stood up, goring its two huge, fierce horns in the air. It was huge. And it was mighty. Yong Ho felt his breath stopped at that. He felt different pressure from Gus Ion or Amun. It was different from the blade-like mana that he felt at the auction house. There was no hostility in that sticky one. Only pure murderous spirit was overflowing. Laughing fiercely, Gus Ion clenched his fists. Scathack also made a ferocious expression that could hardly be hers normally. Ilun silently raised his hand on his lap. The black monster laughed louder. The incarnation of death, created by a lunatic religious leader by offering 10,000 believers as human sacrifices, was gladly willing to even die of himself. The monster grabbed a huge scythe. Since waking up, those it killed already exceeded hundreds of thousands. Maybe it was close to a million. Having harvested countless deaths, it could be called death itself. The black-haired Kentoros raised his hand. He didn't do it to pull the bow. He asked his colleagues to stop. Kentoros's light brown eyes did not illuminate the black monster. He only faced the back of the king standing silently. Yong Ho could not see Mammon's expression. As Scathack did, he had to look only at his back. Mammon raised his hand. And his action alone changed the air around him. The murderous intent of the black monster, which seemed to press down the whole world, was broken and scattered. The flames of red lotus arose. Originating in Mammon's hands, they engulfed death. It never concealed its huge power, which burnt the heaven and earth and evaporated the sea. The black monster roared. It rushed, threatening death. It looked like an overwhelming pressure as if a big mountain was crumbling. But Mammon was not scared. He swung Amon toward the incarnation of death attacking from the front. No more peeking from now on. A voice was heard. At the moment, the whole world was colored with light. But darkness swallowed up everything once again. Oops. Yong Ho opened his eyes. The forgotten sensations came back to him all at once and caused confusion. Chapter, 123 It was the six kings who currently ruled the demon world. The king of pride reigning in the northern part of the demon world. The king of envy confronting the king of pride in the northeastern part. The king of lust who never moved out and was stuck in his harem. The king of gluttony looking for opportunities in the southeast. 
the king of violence who keeps silent in the West. The king of fury, the only woman among the six active kings. The territory of the king of fury, located in the western part of the demon kingdom, had the most borders with the territories of other kings. It bordered the territory of the king of violence to the southwest. It shared the borders with the king of lust and the king of gluttony to the east. It also shared a narrow border with the southern land called a land without owners. Separated by the sea to the north, it shared the border with the king of pride. In other words, the territory of the king of fury shared the borders with all six kings except the king of envy. Other kings' impressions about the king of fury were that he was a warmonger. No wonder he was the only king who had fought all other kings. Of course, other kings here referred to as the six kings. Even the king of fury couldn't fight the king of sloth, who never moved out of his place, or the king of greed that didn't exist. As was the case with the confrontation between the kings recorded in history, there really did not exist a full-scale war in which they intended to kill each other. So, most of them ended up fighting lightly when they had to. The direct fighting among kings was too dangerous. Moreover, kings were aiming for the chance to attack each other. As one of the five directors of the Dungeon Chamber of Commerce, Orobas, the strongest monster, commented that the kings were afraid of each other's surprise attack, so they could not conduct an all-out war. The reason the King of Fury was called a warmonger was not just because he wanted to confront all the other kings. She had the most experience in fighting on the battlefields, so when the fighting started, she always stood at the forefront. She even fought in battles where a king didn't have to. Thanks to this, the mortality rate of the King of Fury's army was ridiculously low, even though they were mocked as the idiots who only know how to rush. It was because the King of Fury always took the lead. Warmonger. The one who quenches her thirst with the blood of the enemy. A crazy BTCH who knows nothing but fight. That was other kings' typical description of the King of Fury. But as was usually the case with such a description, most comments about the King of Fury were more of a lie than a truth. Hey, you son of a BTCH. Are you going to fight, really? Crazy. Are you going to wage a real world war? A half-naked woman on a huge bed shouted, shaking her arms and legs violently like a child. Her name was Dhritara Sutra. She was none other than the King of Fury, who was also the King of Gandharva, who led the eight tribes in the demon world. She, who preferred the name of Dhritara because she might twist her tongue while pronouncing Dhritara Sutra, drooped down her slim and white arms and legs as if she was tired of shouting. When it came to the King of Fury, people thought of her as one with a grim and ghostly look, but she was far from that. Gandharva, her original tribe, boasted of stunning beauty among her eight tribes. One could feel her softness just by looking at her dark blue hair. Her long and thin limbs were nice and beautiful. But only her eyes were a little different. Her eyes with five colored lights, which was hard to describe, were scary rather than beautiful. People looking at her had fear because of her eyes. Like the Gandharva race, her body smelled very sweet. The horsetail protruding from her hips did not get tangled with each other no matter how much she swayed, nor did it lose its luster even in the midst of a sandstorm. The King of Fury caught her breath while huffing and puffing. She really tried hard not to be furious. Contrary to popular images of her as a warmonger, or rather she liked the fight itself, but she didn't like the consequences of the fight. A war was supposed to kill lots of people. Moreover, a war produced not only numerous orphans and widows, but it also burned everything in the world. The reason why the King of Fury always stood at the forefront of the army was simple. To her, that was the way to reduce the number of deaths the most. An overwhelming force deprived her soldiers of combat opportunities. That meant that their chances of dying were also reduced. At the same time, it could minimize the death toll of the enemy. Unless they were the same kind of king, who in the world would want to fight the King of Fury? Those enemies who confronted the King of Fury chose to run away or surrender. Sometimes they challenged her, but she could easily win by killing their leader. Nobody believed this, but the King of Fury was a pacifist. What was the point of fighting each other in the wretched demon world? However, the King of Fury was both a pacifist and a realist, so she realized well that pacifism in the demon world was a vain delusion. 
For this reason, the King of Fury did not preach pacifism to his subordinates, although she wished for it deep down. It's really annoying. So annoying. The King of Fury was so upset that she was about to go crazy. But the fact that she really shouldn't be furious at this moment made her even crazier. If she really got angry, her fury would awaken. The awakening of that force, fury, one of the seven deadly sins, would be the worst situation. The King of Fury hated herself whose fury awakened as much as a war. So, she took a deep breath once more. Counting the numbers she learned from the King of Violence the other day and memorizing the scriptures of the alien world helped her calm down her fury a lot. Thank you, uncle. I got helped again today. The King of Fury, who briefly thanked the King of Violence, the only one that could stop her when the force of her fury was activated, covered her face with both hands. Then she gave it a thought seriously. When the King of Pride and the King of Envy began to interfere with each other's dungeon spirits, she didn't feel interested because their actions were nothing new. But the situation was getting worse. If the situation was left escalating like this, an all-out war among kings would be possible in hundreds of years. It couldn't be better if the King of Pride and the King of Envy met each other in a secluded place, fighting for death, and both died. But that was not the reality. It was clear that their confrontation would result in an enormous number of casualties. Moreover, their fighting would most likely escalate. Obviously, other kings would intervene. Popular criticism of the King of Lust was that he was crazy about sex. Stuck in his harem, he indulged himself in drinking in sex. However, such criticism was also much of a lie like that about the King of Fury. The King of Fury, who had actually encountered the King of Lust, knew the truth better than anyone else. The King of Lust was a terrifying figure. If he had a chance to confront the King of Pride and the King of Envy, he would end his seclusion and stand up against them. There was also the King of Gluttony. This ignorantly large pig always openly revealed his greed. Unlike the King of Fury who was always worried about the possible breakout of an all-out war between the King of Pride and the King of Envy, he would obviously wait for them to fight earnestly. What was even more funny was that this wasn't the worst. If either the King of Pride or the King of Envy would win more easily than expected, and as a result, the two sins and godly energy were concentrated into one, it was evident that a huge fire of war would devour the entire demon world. In that case, not only her race, Gandharva, but also her eight tribes and the demon world as a whole would groan in the face of the disaster of a world war. King of Pride, you son of a BTCH. Stop it now. There was a limit to the pressure that she could put on the King of Envy, whose territory didn't share the border with that of the King of Fury. That was why the King of Fury turned her sword to the King of Pride. She concentrated her naval forces in the north to attack the rear of the King of Pride. If you fight the King of Envy as you do now, I will attack you from behind. So, stop fighting here. However, it was questionable whether her strategy would work. The King of Fury finally sighed again. The southern region was also noisy. The empty land in the south, an abandoned land. A war was going on even there. However, it was only a storm in a teacup. The possibility was almost none that the battle there would affect the entire demon world. But why did she care? Strangely enough, she was bothered by the war in the southern region. She felt as if she was missing something. The King of Fury shook her head. It was a useless worry. She could not afford to pay attention to the southern region. Now was the time for her to focus on the north. The King of Fury stood up from her bed then looked at the entire map of the demon world that filled one side of her spacious room, especially the House of Mammon located at the southern edge. But she looked at it only briefly. The days of the King of Greed ended a long time ago. She didn't have to worry. Her five colored eyes turned north. The sound of her sigh spread in the spacious room again. Chapter 124 It was impossible for Yong Ho to completely regain Amun's power with just one evolution. But it was definitely a step forward. Amun's power was in a different league. Yong Ho definitely felt that way. He was thrilled with Amun's power. Of course, Amun's power required that much mana, 
so much so that although Yongho himself was in a different league with five horns, even he felt that Amun's power was simply too overwhelming. Amun did not have a clear shape on his hand. It could be described as the spear of flames at best. Despite that, Catalina was awakened by Amun's power that shook the entire Garden of Life. However, Yongho couldn't afford to glance at Catalina. Two lights emerged from the magnetic field on his left hand. One was aqua blue, a symbol of Skathak, the immortal witch, and the other one was dark red, a symbol of Amun, the demon spear of the red lotus. Yongho closed his eyes then faced the burning world, not darkness. My little master. The flaming eyes looked down at Yongho. It was Amun's soul that he had encountered several times. But it was different from now. Yongho could feel Amun closer. Can we talk like this even if I don't go to the arena? Not always. However, it is possible, though in a limited way, when you release my power like now. Yongho laughed awkwardly. It's because Amun was outrageously eating away at his mana. He could talk with Amun now because Amun could release a powerful mana thanks to his sudden evolution, and he gave Skathak mana subtly, but he wouldn't do it next time. It was questionable whether Amun could maintain his current status even for several minutes even when he was focusing on fighting, let alone talking with Yongho. However, it meant that Amun had such a powerful strength. It was clear that Amun went one step closer to the power Mammon exercised. You may have heard it from Skathak. Conquer the labyrinth of greed and subdue the twelve spirits of Mammon. Then you will be able to complete the godly energy of the king of greed. I believe you can succeed in it. Yongho found Amun's voice strict and serious, but at the same time, deeply affectionate. His kindness was clearly different from Skathaka's. Yongho became somewhat embarrassed, so he changed the topic, feigning innocence. Come to think of it, if Skathaka's star sign is Aquarius and Baphomet's is Capricorn are they in the zodiac? The zodiac signs meant the twelve constellations that divided the sun's orbit. Could it be true that there were twelve zodiac signs in the demon world like the human world? Yes. Mammon, my master, said that the twelve zodiac signs were learned from a different world. Probably, this knowledge originated from your hometown, little master. It was not true that the twelve zodiac signs existed in the demon world. However, it was clear that Amun used the twelve zodiac signs as a motif and named the twelve spirits of the house of Mammon. Yongho himself was the descendant of the descendants left behind by Mammon in the human world. There was nothing strange about the fact that Mammon had knowledge of the human world. Ah, uh, so, what is your star sign, Amun? What about Gyuzhin's and Elun's? Gyuzhin's star sign is Taurus, and Elun's is Libra. I've no particular star sign. My master said that I had better have an extra star sign because there was nothing befitting me. Actually, I am somewhat alien even among the twelve spirits. Wait a moment. If you don't have one, isn't it true that twelve zodiac signs are not complete from the beginning? Yes. Moreover, there were a lot of vacancies since some of the spirits already died. This is my little wish I think it's good for you to fill the vacancies with new dungeon spirits. I mean, you can complete the twelve new spirits by combining those from the old and new generations. Unlike his usual attitude, Amun spoke in a little excited tone. Yongho laughed pleasantly. The names of each of the twelve zodiac signs came to his mind. Which one was good for Catalina? Virgo or Aries? As if he already read Yongho's mind, Amun blinked. Libra would suit your escort girl. She is a Lun's successor in many ways. Yongho was bothered by his mention of various ways, but he laughed it off. Amun continued. And you may think I'm meddling too much, but I hope that you can put off your right to claim your wish that you obtained the other day. I hope you can put it off until after you defeat Baphomet or the gang of the Western region. Yongho blinked at that because he never expected it. Moreover, Amun mentioned even his right to claim his wish. Amun continued calmly while he was at a loss about how to respond. Whenever I think of you and your escort girl's right to claim the wish granted by Kai Wan, I see the little master's desire is overflowing. Given the power of greed, it's clear that you are going to use it carefully. It is a catalyst of great power. This does not mean that you should not use the right to claim your wish at all. 
if you postpone its use too much, you will not be able to use it as a catalyst. Project your desire more purely. Namely, not delusional sexual desires, but what you, little master, really want. Almond was extremely serious, which made Yong Ho even more embarrassed. It was as if his parents discovered a secret folder that he had hidden. Yong Ho wanted to tell Almond that he should not be so serious about talking about such stuff, but he didn't. Moreover, Almond's last words needed to be heard seriously. Almond laughed again then said in a blazing flame. I believe it. Surely that day will come. I mean the day when I will call you my master, not little master. Almond was the same as always. Confirming his sincerity, Yong Ho smiled brightly. As he said in front of Skathak, Yong Ho straightened himself and responded, It won't take so long. I look forward to it. The green flames came out of the red lotus, which soon engulfed the whole world. Yong Ho closed his eyes then opened his eyes again to face reality. Time passed fairly for everyone. The moment when Yong Ho talked face to face, there were new developments in the empty western and eastern areas. The house heads in the eastern region were never stupid. They could predict the future based on their judgment of the future. They were safe now. It was funny to discuss safety in the midst of dungeon battles following the turbulence caused by Embryo, but it was a fact. While Embryo, who occupied the northern region, attacked the western region, the eastern region was also in great turmoil. The successive dungeon battles produced winners and losers, and from the moment the number of losers began to surpass that of winners, the eastern region gained a strange peace. The increased risk held back reckless action. Moreover, the surviving winner's power was big enough to threaten each other. It was as if the six kings, who were ruling the current demon world, could not engage in such a conflict because they checked against each other. In other words, they entered the so-called Cold War status. In the midst of this turmoil, Agars, who might break the balance of power recklessly, was removed. Moreover, since he was not removed by anybody in the eastern region, there was little possibility that the pendulum of power would swing to one side. The house heads in the eastern region finally recovered their peace of mind and looked around. In just a few months, the situation in the southern abandoned area changed completely. Several dozens of house heads over there were reduced to 14 or 15, all told, in the whole southern area. Some of them were killed by others while others gave up their status as the demon king and chose to become their dungeon spirits. The northern region was devastated. The only demon king left behind there was Embryo, the demon king of wolves. The destruction of the western region was underway. The western owners alliance, who rose triumphantly, were facing the last fight. To simply discuss the number of troops, they were numerically superior to Embryo's forces, but few believed in their victory. It was the southern region that produced the most unexpected results. People often referred to the southern region without owners as an abandoned land. The southern region was just an abandoned land in the vast south. The number of house heads there was the least, compared with other regions, and the distance between the dungeons was also long. It was truly amazing that such a region stood out amid the turmoil. The House of Mammon It was no exaggeration to say that the house perished, no matter how wonderful its past glory was. Moreover, the head of the House of Mammon defeated Agars, who was considered to be the strongest in the entire blank area in the south. Now, the house heads in the eastern region had to recognize that the House of Mammon in the south was no longer a fallen family. It was a powerful family that could exert influence over the entire deserted area. The house heads in the eastern region thought of the future. What was Embryo's next move? Would it be right for him to sit in the eastern region and watch the western region go to ruins? The heads of the two houses that divided the eastern region joined hands instead of fighting to decide each other's superiority. Now wasn't the time for them to fight. Their priority was to deal with the wolves approaching them from afar. The heads of two houses began to move. Their activities were not confined to the eastern region. Is this the result? Ophelia, who returned to the free city to deal with urgent affairs, calmly asked the uninvited guest in front of her. Instead of looking at him, she glanced at a small box on top of an oak bar. The small box had a wet bottom. And what wetted the bottom was a red liquid that flowed out of the box. 
the uninvited guest responded by acting. With a gentle smile, he opened the lid of the box. Ophelia did not smile nor did she frown. Her gaze was cold to hide her agitation. In the box was an object that she guessed when she heard it. Junceros's daughter. It was her severed head, the head of the house of Abigail. The uninvited guest did not cover the lid again. Ophelia rolled her eyes to stare at the uninvited guest. He was a devil from one of the eight tribes, who was hard to find in the southern region. He was covered with green skin, close to blue, dressed in a spacious attire common anywhere. He had a strong build, and his face had a sea urchin-like beard that matched well with his sharp ring eyes symbolizing a devil. He said, it's just a gift of friendship. It's always fun to get rid of the troubles in your neighborhood. Chapter 125 The uninvited guest had a snake-like tongue. Ophelia knew he was very cunning, and she did not forget that it was a gift, but at the same time, it was a display of strength. It was true that the house of Abigail was on the verge of collapse. Besides, Jungseros's daughter was so weak that she could not be compared with Foras or Jungseros. But even so, she was the owner of her own dungeon. She was the owner of a dungeon heavily fortified. Even though Ophelia was watching Jung Saros's daughter sharply, she did not know her death until the uninvited guest appeared. The house heads in the eastern region showed that they could infiltrate the southern region anytime and kill the head of any house stealthily. Instead of an ambiguous diplomatic language, Ophelia spoke directly, So, you want me to be an anvil in return for your being a hammer, right? Great. That's correct. If you guys in the southern area stop embryo, we in the eastern region will attack the northern region without losing the momentum. The uninvited guest also replied straightforwardly. Ophelia gently rubbed the smooth surface of the bar with her fingertips. It was virtually his unilateral notification as follows. Now that the western region is being attacked, we won't attack the northern region. For we want Embryo to completely destroy the western region. But at the same time, we don't want Embryo to occupy the southern region because Embryo will become too strong in that case. We will plant hope in the House of Mammon, so they won't surrender, for we want the House of Mammon to fully confront Embryo that destroyed both the northern and the western regions. Ophelia thought to herself, in other words, you guys in the eastern region want to subdue Embryo and the House of Mammon, fully exhausted after occupying the northern region and devastating the western region. She clearly read his intention, but she found it meaningless to argue with him here. Regardless of what the future holds for them, the eastern region was an ally of the House of Mammon, given the current situation. We've left the dungeon of the House of Abigail as it was. I hope it will be of any help to the House of Mammon. Thank you for your hospitality. You're welcome. You are the one who got rid of Agars, who were running wild everywhere. Our master is really grateful to the House of Mammon. They were done talking finally. Ophelia bowed him out with a smile, while the uninvited guest left the tavern leisurely like he did when he entered. Counting the number in her heart, Ophelia closed the lid of the box, thinking time passed a lot since he left. Looking out the window, she saw the sun setting. But she couldn't hesitate. It seemed like she had to run all night today. It was at dawn when Yong Ho met Ophelia. Since he fell asleep late at night, he was very tired, but he couldn't avoid Ophelia, who ran here all night. As soon as Ophelia was done briefing, he closed his eyes and asked what came to mind first. How did you deal with the body of Jung Saros's daughter? I came here after ordering her burial after a simple funeral. Well done. He was serious. He didn't have any grudge against Jung Saros's daughter, who he had never seen. In some respects, she was a pitiful woman. The next question he asked Ophelia was how she would respond to the unilateral notification by the uninvited guest from the eastern region. It was no exaggeration to say that her response was already decided. Let's take over the house of Abigail first. It is impossible for us to fortify at this point. How about using it as a dummy? The heart of the dungeon of the house of Abigail was highly likely to be good food for Lucia. However, Lucia didn't necessarily need it. It would have been desperate food for the House of Mammon in the past, but it was only one of its options now. Ophelia said, I think it's better to use it like a dummy, too. If you pretend to reinforce it a little, 
it will be difficult for outsiders to guess the dungeon's defense condition. Rykum, a counselor to Yongho like Ophelia, was now staying in the house of Randolt. Since Yongho and Ophelia agreed, there was no reason for Rykum to oppose. Yongho told Ophelia to rest then wrote a simple command. It was a letter ordering the crazy Oris in the free city to occupy the house of Abigail. A few hours later, Ophelia, who woke up at almost lunchtime, embarrassed Yongho a lot. Right to claim your wish. Sounds like a really good idea. Fortunately, you have become strong thanks to the little master. I myself feel motivated to hear that. Ophelia already heard from Lucia about what was going on, but she was still curious about what happened for the past several days when she was away. So, as soon as Ophelia woke up, she grabbed Yongho's escort girl Catalina and inquired about what had happened. Just like a good and innocent girl, Catalina told her about even what she didn't have to. It was only natural that she was completely debriefed by Ophelia, formerly a veteran intelligence peddler. Among what she confided to Ophelia was the reason why the power of the dungeon spirits grew rapidly, the godly energy of the king of greed that Skathak mentioned. The evolution of Amun, the magic spear of the Red Lotus, and the existence of Baphomet, the worst spirit located on the second floor of the labyrinth of greed. Each of them was interesting to Ophelia, but what caught Ophelia's attention personally was the right to ask for a wish that Kaiwan granted to Catalina and Yongho. Watching Ophelia talking to Elagos in the training field cheerfully like a lively girl, Yongho shook his head. He didn't look at Catalina who was checking his mood with her ears and tail drooping as if she now realized she leaked a secret. Instead, he watched Elagos, who was greatly embarrassed. Elagos was mounting a sophisticated attack on the pretext of sparring. But the training field was also a place where they exchanged physical affection naturally. Besides, Ophelia mentioned she would grant his wish on the excuses of inspiring his motivation. Since Elagos could not out-talk Ophelia, he was desperately asking Yongho to intervene, but it was useless. Yongho ignored him by cruelly turning his head. I'm sorry, Elagos. Their sparring sounds like fun. Although Yongho felt terrible whenever he was mocked by Amun, he enjoyed being an onlooker at this moment. He was also curious about what kind of wish Ophelia would say to Elagos. Well, like Ophelia said, this is going to motivate him a lot. Yongho didn't need to be flustered just because the eastern and western regions were in turmoil. Since the House of Mammon was taking care of what was necessary in an orderly manner, it would be better for Yongho to relax with small events like this. Perhaps having heard the rumor, the dungeon spirits of the House of Mammon began to arrive at the training field to watch the fight between Elagos and Ophelia. As it was the break time after lunch, not only goblin rangers, but also orcs, and even Bergrim and Treant came out. Yuria and Baduk sat next to Catalina. Given the situation at the moment, Elagos had no other choice but to fight. There was a fight a man could not avoid in his life, and this was the one for Elagos. Elagos revealed all three horns and displayed all his might. The dungeon spirits of the House of Mammon were greatly agitated by the butler's power that they had never seen before. Elagos was much stronger than expected. Ophelia smiled cheerfully at Elagos' muscles that had swollen like a beast. She also spared no strength. She showed all her might by revealing a fourth horn. The dungeon spirits were shocked and got agitated again after seeing that. Orcs, the born fighters, clenched their fists and swallowed, watching the fight. Bergrim kept his eyes narrow to watch the two on the training field. Let me start. Hope I'm in your good hands, brother. Shortly after exchanging greetings, the two red demons kicked off the ground at the same time. They rushed at each other with terrifying speed. It was truly breathless sparring. A head-to-head -head battle in which neither chickened out was going on. Yongho was freshly shocked. Eligo's growth was beyond imagination. Yongho took him to small battles a few times, so he knew he became strong, but little did he realize that this old butler became so strong since then. He is almost as strong as Ophelia when she entered the house of Mammon. No, it was different this time. He was stronger than Ophelia. Ophelia gave Eligos the right path. Eligos's beast-like offensive rooted in his Herculean power, producing tremendous offensive power. 
As far as his hurtling toward his opponent was concerned, Eligos might be the strongest among the dungeon spirits of the House of Mammon. Ophelia blocked Eligos's attack effectively. Considering that she was his teacher, her skills were remarkable. Everyone in the House of Mammon, including Yong Ho, was absorbed into their sparring. However, their sparring did not last long. About two minutes or so passed when Eligos punched her hard. Since his punch was on the target, she couldn't block or avoid it, so she bounced back because of the impact. The orcs shouted at that moment, but Eligos, who punched her in the face, was very embarrassed. He was even worried that Ophelia was wounded by the punch. In fact, he threw the punch aimlessly, but as it turned out, Ophelia, not anyone else, was hit directly by the punch. Oops, you beat me. You've gotten a lot stronger, Brother Ellie. Ophelia, who fell somewhat seductively, spoke cheerfully. Eligos was embarrassed again. The orcs, shouting in joy, now realized that something was wrong. But she did not care what they thought. She gently raised his upper body and said, whispering with a fox-like expression, Now, what kind of wish would you, Brother Ellie, ask of me? I hope it's not something trifling. Ophelia tilted her head slightly. Everybody in the training field kept silent, watching them. Chapter 126 Eligos couldn't say anything with a stupid expression, and Yong Ho, a real man who graduated from an all-male middle school, high school, and college, just blinked. Wow. On the other hand, Catalina, Yuria, and Lucia moaned in admiration. Alarmed by their reaction, Yong Ho suddenly came to his senses. He felt there was something these women should not have learned from Ophelia's interaction with Eligos, but it was too late. Eligos, who was moving his lips without saying anything, turned to Yong Ho. Again, he was desperately signaling him for help, but Yong Ho ignored it at once. Paying particular attention to Catalina and Yuria, he walked ahead and left the training field. Ophelia Scary Girl Shaking his head from side to side, Yong Ho looked back at Catalina slightly. As if she discovered something new, moved by the romantic interaction between Eligos and Ophelia, Catalina's gleaming eyes seemed very dangerous. And two days later, Yong Ho met Skull, who hastily returned from the house of Randolt, and headed underground with all of his dungeon spirits. They were in front of the second floor of the Labyrinth of Greed. They launched the attack on the Gate of Hell, the massacre demon Baphomet's place. The first floor of the Labyrinth of Greed, the Garden of Life, was literally a garden. Therefore, it was as good as an open place. With no facilities to defend against the enemy, there was only a beautiful scenery that suited the castle of the Great King. However, the second floor, Gate of Hell, was different. Indeed, this was the beginning of the castle of the Demon King. It was the first door at the end of the beautiful garden. Regardless of an ally or an enemy, anyone who wanted to enter the labyrinth of the King of Greed must pass it. The passage connecting the first and second floors was very huge. It was no exaggeration to say that the whole room located in the opposite direction from Skthaka's room was a passage leading to the second floor. When they passed through a huge arch door decorated with trees, vines and colorful flowers, a staircase wide enough for dozens to pass at the same time appeared before them. A film of soft mana blocked the space between the first and second floors, so it was impossible to discern what space was under the stairs. Yong Ho came here with the minimum number of dungeon spirits he selected in person. They were four dungeon spirits of the House of Mammon, Salami, Bucephalus, and four skeleton knights that stood out among Skull Squad. Under the influence of the Encotropegnium, a huge mountain on the dungeon of the Mammon family, called the End of the World, those dungeon monsters were far more powerful than the normal dungeons that appeared in the House of Mammon. And this tendency got worse as they went down to the deep floor. On the second floor, there would probably be dungeon monsters more powerful than those on the first floor. Moreover, since the second floor was an entrance, it was highly likely that traps were installed, unlike the first floor. When she met Yong Ho, Skathak did not specifically mention the structure of the second floor or the traps installed. However, she recommended that he take only the elite members rather than mobilizing a motley group. Going about 10 meters down the stairs, he stood in front of a canopy of subtle mana. The stairs also ran down to the canopy as if they stretched down the lake. Yong Ho didn't bother to look back. 
After smiling at himself, he stepped beyond the canopy. He felt as if he dipped his feet in the water. Instead of stopping, he speeded up. He quickly crossed the canopy and entered the second floor. The air changed. It was different from its freshness on the first floor. It was quite different from the garden of life that made him feel that it was cute despite its vastness for it contained a mountain, a field, and a lake. It was such a huge space. The whole second floor was a huge space. The ceiling was over 40 meters high, and the floor was real earth, not stone. Beyond the wilderness reminiscent of the free city was erected a truly massive castle wall. It was exactly as Skathak said. Yong Ho didn't think that the space he was standing now was inside the dungeon. He almost made a forced smile at the vastness of the second floor. Oh my god! Catalina, who passed through the canopy after Yong Ho, opened her mouth wide. She decided she would not be surprised no matter what she saw, but she never imagined that she would face the vast wilderness and high walls before her eyes. To talk about its functions alone, it was like the gathering place on the first floor of the House of Mammon. In other words, it was like a combat space where they secured a large space first to block the enemies with defense facilities. The only difference was the size of the space. If Yong Ho made the gathering place, assuming the fight among a few dozens, the second floor of the Labyrinth of Greed assumed thousands. Rather, it seemed possible to assume tens of thousands of forces at this scale. Elegos, who crossed the canopy after Catalina, kept gulping at the spectacular scene. He couldn't even imagine that there would be a place like this in the basement of the Hazu of Mammon where he had been staying for decades. He was aware there was a basement, but he just thought there were literally several basements. Moreover, this was not the end. This was only the second floor. Thirteenth floor. Yong Ho got goosebumps at the thought of it. It was the thing of the distant past, more than a thousand years ago, but Yong Ho could feel how powerful the House of Mammon was in the past. Let's go. Yong Ho could not afford to be overwhelmed. He came here to conquer the second floor, not for sightseeing. Salami, who was already embarrassed in the Garden of Life, opened his eyes wide. Bucephalus also went down the stairs with a confused look. There was a wilderness of about a hundred tens of meters from the end of the stairs to the wall. The wall was in contact with the ceiling. Therefore, the only way to enter the castle was to destroy the gate or the wall. After getting on Salami's back, Yong Ho looked far away. There were many large and small scars on the grey wall that looked as strong as deep-rooted trees. There were a lot of embrasures for a long-range attack, and there were a couple of stone statues of a fierce-looking giant on the left and right side of the huge castle gate, which seemed to be twenty meters high. When Yong Ho looked closely, there weren't only two statues. Stone statues in the shape of giants or monsters were seen at regular intervals. Some were so severely damaged that they could not be identified. The statues were still far away, but they were so huge that Yong Ho could only recognize shapes roughly. Catalina and Eligos once again expressed pure admiration. But Yong Ho was different. From the moment he saw the stone statues, he felt a strange anxiety. No way. At that moment, he saw something else. The flow of mana that was being released from the wall engulfed the statues. Vast space and wide ramparts. Would Yong Ho deal with the invading enemy with long-range weapons? Was there no other way than opening the wall for the hand-to-hand -hand fighting? He got the answer soon. The stone statues standing on the left and right of the castle gate took a huge step. They didn't roar or shout. Their giant stomping replaced it. The ground was shaken sonorously, which was as good as an earthquake. The stone statues saw Yong Ho at the same time. Then they rushed at him immediately. Let's go. Yong Ho yelled. It was not a retreat order. He had Salami spread the wings of flame. There were four stone statues on the move. In the past, they would have run away without fighting, but they would not now. Just the huge stone statues alone could not stop Yong Ho himself and his dungeon spirits. Salami flapped the wings hugely. The dungeon spirits triggered Brigada at once. Catalina spread her wings made of black mana and defended Yong Ho, who soared, scattering flames. Eligos and Ophelia kicked off the ground at the same time. 
they concentrated mana on their fists and legs. At the same time, they revealed their horns. Skull. Skull lifted the battle hammer. The battle hammer, reborn in Bergrim's hand, did not simply save Skull's lightning strike. The lightning spell cast on the battle hammer itself strengthened Skull's lightning strike. Bucephalus charged at them. The members of Skull's squad who got on their respective nightmare horse followed their captain and raised their magic weapons. It was only a hundred meters of distance between them. The moment they ran toward each other, there occurred the first collision. Ignoring the giants, Yong Ho flew toward the city gate. Catalina, who was separated from Yong Ho after soaring, saw the stone statue on the left. She strongly wished she could stand near Yong Ho. As the escort knight for the King of Greed, she wanted to stand by him. She needed the power to do it. She needed the power to be able to walk with him side by side. The darkness of greed rose from Catalina's fingertips. In an instant, it became huge before turning into a black blade. The stone statue could not attack Catalina. It was impossible for the statue to even look back at her passing by its side at a tremendous speed. The stone statue's head fell to the floor. The moment it slid along a cleanly cut surface and touched the ground, Elegos and Ophelia threw their punches at it. Bang! Although the two attacked the statue, there was only one noise heard. Elegos, who jumped high, punched the giant's abdomen, which resulted in massive destruction. The stone statue with a broken hole in its stomach collapsed from its knees. Ophelia did the same thing. On the stone statue where she gored with her horns was a trace of a huge whirlpool. With a hole in its chest, the stone fell back. Skullkull. Skull shouted. Chapter 127. Outpowering the collapsing statues, Skull looked up. The last remaining statue struck Skull with a sword. Instead of running away, Bucephalus rushed at the sword. At Skull's order, Bucephalus climbed not only the blade of the sword but also the stone statue's arm. Bucephalus was done with it so quickly that the statue could not even withdraw its arms. When it shook its arms vigorously, Bucephalus was already about to attack its collarbone. The lightning of greed flashed from Skull's right arm. The battle hammer that swallowed up a lot of lightning hit the stone statue's jaw. The sound of the attack was different from when Elegos or Ophelia mounted the attack. The lightning strike exploded not only the stone's jaw but also the air. The shattered head of the stone statue scattered in all directions. Skull, skull. Bucephalus stepped in the air. It created a scaffold made of dark magic where its feet touched, which was the unique driving method of the upper nightmare horse flying in the sky. When the fourth stone statue collapsed, Yong Ho turned to Amun. He shot Amun engulfed in the green flames at the castle gate right before his eyes. Break through the gate. It couldn't be called flames anymore. A great greed swallowed up black mana. It transformed Amun into a huge ballista. An incredible physical force hit the gate. The gate crumbled with a terrifying noise. Actually, it was separated from the wall as it could not withstand the impact. Salami entered the castle and hurriedly flapped its wings of flames. He almost fell to the ground due to the aftermath of the terrible blow, but he adroitly kept his balance before landing safely. Yong Ho also groaned in pain because he felt like his right arm would fall off. At the same time, he felt a strong pleasure in the fact that he destroyed the gate with a single blow. Yong Ho looked back from Salami's behind. The artificial sun sunlight poured over the broken gate. The dungeon spirits of the House of Mammon followed Yong Ho, fully releasing their own mana. Yong Ho looked ahead again. He had no intention of stopping. There were a series of wide spaces inside the wall. It seemed that Mammon thought of the second floor of the Labyrinth of Greed as the continuation of the huge gathering places. Namely, places for large-scale engagement. Because of this, the passage was wide, and the size of each room was also unusually large. Yong Ho moved forward without hesitation. Dozens of dungeon monsters appeared in droves, but they couldn't stop the advance of Yong Ho and his spirits. Whenever the flames, lightning, and darkness rained down, they were destroyed in mass. Fortunately, there were few traps along the way. According to Ophelia, 
there were traces of a huge magic position or traps all over the second floor. However, most of them reached the end of their lifespan or were severely damaged and destroyed, which was natural. It was already hundreds of years ago that the House of Mammon lost the second floor of the Labyrinth of Greed. During that long period of time, Mammon's people were not supplied with properly and used up mana in dealing with the dungeon monsters coming up everywhere. In some respects, I wonder if we are now benefiting from the dungeon monsters. Yong Ho was referring to the trap of the Labyrinth of Greed. If properly activated, the trap would have been a much greater threat than the dungeon monsters. Yong Ho only went straight ahead, following Skathaka's advice. Baphomet is the last barrier on the second floor as well as its gatekeeper. The passage leading to the third floor is beyond Baphomet's sealed paper. To get there, you just have to go straight. The previous king was a very bold man. She was right. After he passed through five large rooms following the castle gate, he saw a straight path. With Catalina's power, he looked through the darkness to find a huge door. It was clear that it was the door leading to Baphomet's sealed paper. Yong Ho, who ordered his dungeon spirits to just move on until now, told them to stop for a moment. All of my dungeon spirits have become strong. They really fought much better than he expected. In fact, he was busy taking care of his own growth until now, but his dungeon spirits made a big progress, too. Especially, Eligos drew his attention. Ophelia had been recognized as a strong woman in his mind since she entered the House of Mammon. In the case of Catalina, he felt it was natural that she became strong since she was around him as his escort knight all the time. But Eligos was an exception. He was the one who guarded the House of Mammon alone even when all the other dungeon spirits were fighting on the battlefield. Eligos didn't show all his skills when he sparred with Ophelia. His sparring partner was Ophelia. Regardless of his denial or not, Eligos cherished her very much. How could he display his real skills when she was his sparring partner? But Eligos was different when the opponent was the dungeon monster. He fully displayed his real skills while fighting the dungeon monster. Yong Ho understood why Eligos' name for his next advancement was Tyrant. He attacked the dungeon monsters fiercely just like a hungry beast catching its prey. His fierce attack completely belied his usual appearance, so Yong Ho was shocked by such a stark contrast. Yong Ho smiled before he knew it when he recalled the days when he had just become the head of the House of Mammon, for he clearly remembered the small Eligos who went out to draw water every morning. Then he looked at Skull. When it came to the amount of training, no dungeon spirit of the House of Mammon could surpass Skull. That was why Yong Ho trusted Skull all the more. Moreover, Skull played a very important role in the battle against Baphomet. Skathak chose Yong Ho himself and Skull as the key players in this battle because of the characteristics of Baphomet. Death, Baphomet was the incarnation of death sent by fanatics in the alien world. Because of this, even though he was weakened, he exhaled the energy of death naturally like his breathing. Those whose energy was weak lost their lives just by being exposed to Baphomet's energy. Even those strong men saw their strength weakened because of their instinctive fear of death. It was only Yong Ho and Skull who could exert full combat power even in front of Baphomet's energy of death. After experiencing more than hundreds of near-death experiences, Yong Ho could endure the energy of death. Since the undead Skull was already dead, he would rather feel calm in the face of Baphomet's energy of death. It was because of Baphomet that Skathaka's test was a near-death experience from the beginning. Anyone who did not pass her test could never be an opponent of Baphomet. Yong Ho patted Skull on the shoulder, who he thought was always reliable. Skull laughed heartily when he felt Yong Ho's confidence in him without Brigada. Skull Skull. Yong Ho was not in a hurry. He kept sharing the magic potion he obtained from the arena with the dungeon spirits. The restorative scat hack made for him also played a great role. About thirty minutes passed. They caught their breath fully by now. Yong Ho ordered Salami, Bucephalus, and the Skull Squad to stand by. He then sprayed the lights into the passage. After driving away the darkness, they went forward. It was a huge bronze door. Yong Ho realized that the name of the second floor, Gate of Hell, referred to this door. Dozens of people were embossed on the door. They were groaning and crying in pain. 
Yong Ho took his breath deeply and held the doorknob. By Herculean force, he opened the gate of hell very slowly. It was filled with impenetrable darkness. But he could see. Rather, he felt it. A black monster fell in the middle of the wide empty area. Large shackles were attached to its neck as well as its limbs, and those tied on its legs were still connected to the floor. The door was not yet opened halfway. However, the energy of death came out continuously. The black monster raised its head slowly, crying in a spooky voice. It was laughing. Its creepy laugh filled the empty place with the energy of death. Red eyes, Yong Ho remembered seeing them when he peeked into Scat Hakka's memory. The black monster shook its shoulders. It touched the floor with its hands and raised its upper body very slowly. It stared at Yong Ho with its red eyes shining alone in the dark. Yong Ho was scared. It was much more dreary than what he saw in her memory. He felt like Scat Hack saying that it had become weak was an absurd lie. Death wrapped around his body. He could feel hundreds, rather thousands of eyes around. The screaming of resentful ghosts filled the whole world. But Yong Ho opened the door. He didn't close it. Then he took a step forward in the darkness. Brigada was activated at once. His dungeon spirits followed their king, Yong Ho, just like Mammon's twelve spirits had done in the past. They were not terrified by the fear of death. Yong Ho didn't have to say any more. He quietly raised his hand. Like Mammon in his memory, he grabbed Amon, the magic spear of the red lotus that bloomed in the air. He drove away not only darkness but also the energy of death with the green flames of greed. The blue water, which was like the symbol of Skathak, spewed out from the uncompleted godly energy located in the magic field of his left hand. Baphomet laughed like crazy. His crazy laughing soon turned into a roar. Baphomet saw Mammon in Yongho. So, it cursed him and got crazy. Grabbing the scythe of death from the darkness, it charged at Yongho wildly. It was like the rush of death itself. Yongho also rushed forward to confront it. As the new king of greed, he confronted the incarnation of death. Chapter, 128 It wasn't the first time Yongho had faced the monster. He encountered it when he first faced Amun, when he met its eyes in a burning world when he encountered Gusion in the arena, and the moment Skathak revealed her skills for a very short time. He remembered it all, and he didn't forget the horrible feeling at that time. He was always overwhelmed by its absurdly enormous presence. He felt the same thing this time. Baphomet lost its strength as a dungeon spirit because it lost its master. Besides, it was extremely weakened since it had been sealed for a long time and shorn of its strength by the other twelve spirits. Nonetheless, it was the incarnation of death that came from the alien world. It was so huge. So, Yong Ho felt like he would be trampled by this absurdly huge creature at any moment. But this time, it was different. It had to be different. He had to face this monster and defeat it. Instead of stepping back, he boldly advanced and confronted Baphomet head-on, which rushed toward him without hesitation, like a runaway locomotive. Baphomet's body was huge. It was somewhat different from what he saw in Skathaka's memory, but its head, resembling a black goat, and its huge body were the same as before. It looked like a mountain seemed to collapse in front of his eyes. Laughing like crazy, Baphomet wielded the scythe of death. It was wielding from above the power of death itself. Yong Ho did not miss that moment. He opened his eyes and saw death rushing to him. It had a trajectory. But what was seen wasn't everything. Black mana swirled around the blade of its giant scythe. It was obvious that black mana would devour a space several times the size of the sickle. Yong Ho could not move back at this point. It was also reckless for him to block the monster by wielding Amun. But Yong Ho did not stop. He took another step, remembering Skathaka's words. Master. Two voices rang almost simultaneously. And at that moment, when the screaming was going on, Catalina quickly approached him from behind his back, hugged him, and became his wings. The scythe of death swept the air. Yong Ho and Catalina overcame the evil energy of death. Under the wings made of black mana, Yong Ho saw Baphomet's red eyes. 
Then he swung Amun to cut through the space above Baphomet's head. Waves of the green flames engulfed Baphomet's head. The death wrapping around Baphomet's body exploded and it collided with the green flames. Cutting through the scattering energy of death, Eligos and Ophelia rushed toward it. The two scattered to both sides with Baphomet in between. They then attacked it with full force. There was no roar, no explosion, no scream. The air was scattered by their strong attack, but that was it. Baphomet turned to blink. Its enormous body reappeared ten meters high above its original place. Eligos was embarrassed. Ophelia immediately raised her head and looked at Baphomet. And death crushed Eligos and Ophelia one step ahead. It was a completely different kind of force they had never felt before. It wasn't the overwhelming presence of the strong. It wasn't even a physical force of destroying and breaking. It was death, the end of everything. The feeling of helplessness that they could not resist. The feeling of despair that there was nothing to rely on. Death penetrated Eligos and Ophelia. It didn't damage their bodies in any way. However, Eligos knelt down. Ophelia resisted by generating the mana of greed, but she could not stand it long. For a few seconds when Ophelia desperately resisted, Baphomet landed on the ground again. Then it swung its left arm to strike down Ophelia. Suffering from the helplessness of death, she punched head-on by a giant blow. She bounced off more than a dozen meters like a broken marionette. Then Baphomet kicked out Eligos by swinging his right arm, holding the scythe of death. Rotating its body greatly, it once again released the wave of death. The chains on Baphomet's neck and arms broke through the air with a terrible noise. Skull Cull. Skull broke through death. He broke the black and huge waves of death with a battle hammer. He narrowed the distance with Baphomet at once and swung the lightning hammer again. Lightning flashed from Baphomet's legs. It wasn't a fatal injury. However, Baphomet's legs were bent for a moment. Skull pulled the hammer again. And above Skull's head, and higher above Baphomet's head, Yong Ho pulled Amun. Then, holding Amun upside down, he created the pillar of flames. The green flames struck Baphomet hard then engulfed its whole body. Catalina rejoiced, but it was too early for her to rejoice. The moment when the green flames covered its whole body, Baphomet kicked out Skull. Using that momentum, it rotated its body, and once again, it tore the air with chains on its limbs. Holding the scythe of death tightly, it split the air. But the scythe didn't reach Yongho. Nonetheless, death did not stop and spread. The power that could only be expressed as pitch black penetrated Yongho and Catalina. Catalina's head was broken. She was helpless, with no screaming or moaning, like Eligos experienced. Yongho stuck it out, clenching his teeth. Even while he was falling, he swung his left arm wildly. Just like he did when he defeated Kai Wan, he added Catalina's black mana to the mana of greed. And he swept both Baphomet and the ground with a giant's hand at the same time. Baphomet jumped to avoid the giant's arm. Yongho landed on the ground with the help of a giant's arm instead of falling to the floor. He raised his head to attack the monster with Catalina, who finally pulled herself together. But they were crushed by Baphomet. It wasn't like black mana or death. Literally, a huge palm pressed both Yong Ho and Catalina simultaneously. They could not resist the pure physical force created by the monster's weight and speed. Both of them got tangled together and were crushed on the floor. They screamed in pain when their bones were broken. Baphomet laughed madly. Yong Ho felt he was losing consciousness. He was punched only once, but the blow was so painful. Yong Ho once again clenched his teeth under Baphomet's palm. If he could not use his limbs freely, he intended to release his mana all at once and bounce off the palm of this monster. At the same time, Yong Ho felt that Eligos and Ophelia began to move. And even Skull, who was thrown on the floor by Baphomet's blow, was also standing up again. Each of them released mana of greed. Yong Ho further amplified the mana of greed by sinking with the dungeon spirits. But at that moment, Yong Ho made eye contact with Baphomet. It lowered its head to see him even when the spirits of the House of Mammon were rushing toward it. Its head resembled a goat. 
It was different from a human head. Yong Ho could read its expression. It smiled brightly. That was the only smile it could make madness and rejoice, brightness and joy. It was obviously more weakened than before. But there was something that didn't change. It was still the incarnation of death. It was a monster formed at the sacrifices of ten thousand people, as well as the death itself imagined by beings in the alien world. It survived by eating over tens of thousands, rather millions of deaths. Death smiled. It exuded a force that could not even be compared with anything until now. With no sound or movement, it covered a huge black space. It swallowed up the lights of the dungeon lighting devices that Yong Ho's party had spread for this battle. Eligos and Ophelia fell to the floor in the same position they were charging. Thanks to the power of greed, they did not die immediately, but that was it. They couldn't move even a finger because of their enormous helplessness. Skull was no exception. Although he already belonged to death, it did not mean he was free from death. His vivid sensation of death elicited a sense of life from him. Skull remembered his life for the first time since becoming an undead. That was why he experienced the second death. Old fear and dread, as well as all the things he had to give up by dying, once again destroyed Skull's spirit. Skull collapsed. He suffered from deep despair and sorrow, so much so that it wasn't strange even if tears poured out of his hollow eyes. Memories of living tormented him. Yong Ho breathed a short, rough breath. He became more and more unconscious. Although he experienced hundreds of times of mental death in the space Amun created, all of it was fake. It wasn't real death. He couldn't feel the passage of time, which was natural, for it was what death was. There was nothing there. Despair broke his will. Empty feelings swallowed up his anger. Accepted, death. Absolute serenity. Baphomet raised its hand. In fact, no matter how fast it did, Yong Ho felt its action was very slow. Yong Ho did not close his eyes. Instead of Baphomet's hand or death sickle, he saw something else. It was a so called kaleidoscopic view of his life events. Chapter 129 He graduated from an elementary school life that he would never spend like that if he were born, grown up, and went back to it again. He entered an all male middle school because it was close to his home. He entered an all-male high school because the nearby co-ed high school was closed. Then he entered an engineering college because he liked engineering. Now, one more thing would make his life perfect joining the army. He had joy and sadness. Although he had frustrations and trials, he had achievements and happiness. It was a good life. He had no regrets. Although he never dated a girl, it wasn't a big deal. He didn't have a blind date, which he had expected a lot before going to college, but it didn't matter. Rather than being confessed by a lover, he never confessed love to any girl, but he didn't care. At least he kissed once. His partner was Ophelia. He kissed her for the purpose of overwhelming her mentally. He also touched Catalina's ears and tail. Kaiwan also said that she would grant his wish, whatever it was. His thinking was perhaps unfounded, but he felt that Kaiwan fell in love with him. To be honest, wasn't she serious? Didn't she say she would grant his wish? She could not say it to anybody, right? What about Catalina? She didn't show her heart to me, but was she feeling the same way as Kaiwan? So what? Damn it! Yong Ho opened his eyes suddenly. When he looked back nostalgically, he found his eyes wet before he knew it, so he got rid of this kaleidoscopic stuff. He had to survive now. There were still many things he hadn't done yet. My little master. Almond's voice was heard. It was clear that perhaps from the moment death filled the empty space on the second floor, Almond called him anxiously. The passage of time was still slow. Baphomet only now grabbed the scythe of death. So, Yong Ho had to move first and stand up after getting rid of this monster. Desire. Long for it. Be greedy. My little master. Amun shouted. Yong Ho understood it. So, he brought out the power of greed. It was an original desire. He might be blamed for bringing out the will to live like that, but he didn't care. He imagined. 
he hoped and wished for it. He burst out anguish, hope, and desire. I really want to do it. He shouted. Yes, he was serious. There were so many things he wanted to do. There were so many things he hadn't done yet. So he couldn't die. He couldn't be overwhelmed with death. Time accelerated. Baphomet felt embarrassed. At the same time, he saw the scythe of death at its peak. Yongho grabbed Amun. He felt Catalina was still groaning in death. Clenching his teeth, he activated the magnetic field. The power of greed. The power of desire. He didn't recklessly use up the unleashed anguish. His godly energy was a mass of brigada. Although the magic field on his left hand was incomplete, it had godly energy. Finally, Yongho brought life out of the twelve spirits, which was the power of immortal which Skathak that perfectly matched his will to live. Blue watery light exploded from his left hand. The power of life drove away Baphomet's death. Baphomet stumbled. For the first time since it confronted Yongho, it screamed in pain. It suffered by crying out the name of Skathak, who had the power of life. Yongho breathed roughly. He couldn't stand up, but he poured the power of life onto Baphomet. By offsetting death with life, he transformed Baphomet from the incarnation of death into just a giant monster. He needed to take the next step immediately, but his next move was already ready. Stand up, my dungeon spirits. His dungeon spirits were faithful to his order. Eligos and Ophelia ran toward it. When they stood up again, they felt a strong force of life. They shared Yongho's desire and will to live from the mana of greed transmitted through Brigada. This time, they completely destroyed Baphomet's legs. Baphomet collapsed, kneeling down. It wailed even louder. It tried to drive away Yongho's force of life that neutralized his death. Catalina took his hand. She didn't want to die either. There were so many things she wanted to do while still alive. Holding her hand, he stared sharply at Baphomet. Then he ordered the last dungeon spirit right next to him. Skullkull. Skull rose from death. Grabbing the battle hammer, he rushed toward Baphomet. All the power of the dungeon spirits was concentrated on Yongho through Brigada, which he, in turn, retransmitted to Skull. The green flames rose from the tip of the battle hammer. Greed with black mana sword, and the mana of Eligos and Ophelia connected them all. Baphomet was struggling desperately. Instead of the scythe of death being evaporated by the power of life, he swung his huge right arm. Skull rode over it and charged at it. He added lightning to the power of greed, with the battle hammer that was broken without withstanding Baphomet's concentrated power but still functioning. Skull jumped up and stared straight at Baphomet's red eyes. It was no longer the incarnation of death. What was standing before him right now was just a huge black monster. Skull struck it with the battle hammer in a row. The concentrated power of greed exploded right above Baphomet's head. Skull landed on the ground as if to fall. Eligos and Ophelia raised their heads, breathing roughly. And finally, Yong Ho, who stood up finally, stretched out the magic field of his left hand. Baphomet, whose head was destroyed, could not see Yong Ho. However, Yong Ho saw its red eyes. As the king of greed, he granted the promised rest and peace to the incarnation of death that was still harboring death despite his drastic weakness. Baphomet smiled. Yong Ho felt that way. And at that moment, Baphomet's enormous body turned into black ashes and scattered in the air. Yong Ho slowly clenched his fist and looked at the newly added jewel on the back of his left hand with the magic field. Black with a purple hue. Capricorn, the power of Baphomet, the demon of slaughter. Yong Ho reaped the power of life and possessed the power of death. It was like breaking a tight string suddenly. The moment when new power was added to the magic field, Yong Ho felt deeply tired. He acutely felt the pain all over his body again. It hurt and very much at that. He felt like his bones were broken all over his body. Although he was punched by Baphomet once, his whole body ached. Baphomet's attack wasn't just punching. The moment Yong Ho was pressed by its palm, the black mana arising from Baphomet's left hand hacked his body. 
his body wasn't only bruised but also his skin ruptured. Besides, his body bled from various cuts. He wanted to squat down right now. However, he stuck it out, taking a deep breath. He was holding Catalina's hand in his right hand instead of Amon. Catalina was injured, as well. Since she was behind Yongho, she wasn't hacked by black mana, but Baphomet striking down damaged her more than Yongho. Yongho looked at Catalina, who in turn, looked at him. They both poured so much mana into Brigada that their hands were trembling, but they smiled at each other, which looked silly. Yongho hugged her. Rather it was Catalina who hugged him. The two leaned on each other like that. He realized that he was alive by burying his face in her neck. When death engulfed everything, Yongho had a desire. That desire wasn't just lust. Had it been only lust, he would never have overcome Baphomet's death. There were a lot of things he really wanted to do. He seemed to know why Amon described his lust as anguish. It was greed. He didn't give up on anything. Rather he couldn't give it up. Everything belonged to Yongho. Catalina was warm and soft when he hugged her. So he naturally closed his eyes. He wanted to stay like that for the rest of his life. Not only her breathing but also her subtle body scent was all sweet. Strangely enough, however, he recalled Kai Wan's face at that moment. To be precise, it was her smile right before she confronted him in the arena. Come to think of it now, it was almost like a foul smile. How could she show such a smile to him right before the fighting? He thought she outwitted him back then. It was not Kai Wan alone that came to his mind. Gus Ion, Skathak, and Amon's faces came to his mind one by one. He also remembered his own dungeon spirits and the exclusive twelve spirits of the House of Mammon. He smiled awkwardly and opened his eyes. As if she was tired, Catalina did open her eyes. She was wiggling her tail weakly, but that was all. She seemed to totally rely on him. It looked like she would collapse at the mere touch. Yong Ho hugged her waist a little harder. He kissed her head unwittingly and looked around. They were all exhausted. Chapter, 130 Eligos and Ophelia were lying on the floor. Yong Ho thought they were having a touching hug, but they were too tired to do it. However, they were still strong red demons. Eligos, who could be called the strongest of the mammon spirits, raised his upper body slowly. But Ophelia couldn't get up easily as if the blow by Baphomet was quite strong. However, she did not lose consciousness and whispered to Eligos. Yong Ho eventually gave up standing. He sat down, touching the floor with one hand and holding Catalina with the other. As soon as he sat down, he wanted to lie down again, but he barely held down the urge to do so. When he turned his head a little more, he saw Skull. Skull was also a total wreck. The battle hammer that Burgrim improved for him was completely destroyed. What he had now was a bag only. His armor and helmet were also broken. He wasn't as bare as when he first came to the House of Mammon, but it was the first time since his fight with Poraz that he was injured so much like this. Skull, kneeling on the floor and supporting his upper body with one cracked arm, trembled. His chin and head, in particular, trembled badly. Skull. It was Skull that dealt a final fatal blow to Baphomet. Did he overwork himself because Yong Ho mobilized too much power into him? When Yong Ho called him in a worried voice, Skull slowly turned his head. Ghost flames that were supposed to be present in his hollow eyes were too small. And that wasn't all. Yong Ho felt somewhat concerned about Skull. It was something like a feeling of strangeness. And Yong Ho alone didn't feel it. He could sense Skull's feelings transmitted through Brigada. Yong Ho found it hard to express what it was. It was the kind of feeling that he could express by comparing it to a torrent raging under the quiet water. Skull. Yong Ho called him again. Skull reacted at his affectionate calling. Although it was a skull without any expression, Yong Ho knew that Skull was trying to smile, though with an effort. Skull Kull. Speaking slowly and quietly, Skull fell to the floor instead of struggling to stick it out. As if he was encouraged by Yong Ho's calling, Skull cleared his anxiety a lot. Skull now seemed to be resting comfortably like Ophelia and Catalina. 
Watching them, Yong Ho gulped. His sense of strangeness about Skull disappeared, and he could do nothing because there was nothing unusual about Skull at this point. Yong Ho just hoped it wasn't a big deal. Then once again, he held Catalina anew and hugged her. After overcoming the temptation to fall asleep next to her, he looked at the mana in the empty space. The energy of death hadn't yet completely disappeared from there. It was the same black mana but different from Catalina's. Catalina's black mana resembled the gentle knight that embraced people. On the other hand, Baphomet's black mana was like cold and terrifying despair. Black mana swirled in the place where Baphomet stood. When it swirled once, the darkness scattered in all directions, which was spectacular, indeed. Yong Ho touched the magic field on his left hand with his right hand over her waist. Despite him not seeing it, the newly created Baphomet jewel clearly came to his mind. The power of death contrary to Scat Hakka's life. Yong Ho finally let out a sigh. Prepared for fainting, he extended his right arm. Instead of hugging Catalina, he let her rest her hair on his thigh and grab the air. Following the flames of the red lotus, the green lotus arose. He collected not only his remaining mana, but also that of Elagos, Ophelia, Skull, and even Catalina, who almost passed out, and poured it into Amun. His efforts paid off. Although he was not in the arena, he could talk with Amun. My little master. Watching Amun's true body, the burning spear, reminiscent of a weapon from the age of mythology, Yong Ho asked, is Baphomet completely dead? He couldn't afford to beat around the bush. Amun answered his straightforward question. Baphomet is the incarnation of death. The realization of the concept of death, that humans in the alien world conceived. Its body, which had been worn away for a thousand years since the disappearance of its owner, has now completely disappeared. Since the container holding the concept has disappeared, the concept will also disappear. However, we can't say it's completely extinct. The essence of Baphomet remained in its unfinished godly energy. Not only Baphomet's power, death, but also some consciousness remains in it. But, my little master. You don't have to worry. It will never be able to hurt you, nor it will. Baphomet couldn't hurt him. It also didn't have the intention to do so. Yong Ho let out a long sigh. Amun smiled gently. My little master. Good job. The power of greed comes from desire. However, simple lust can't bring out the true power of greed, for it would be closer to the power of the king of lust rather than the power of the king of greed. Clearly, the power of lust was strong for you, but because it was mixed with the pure, original desire, you could overcome Baphomet's death. Hope and desire. Project your true wishes onto your desire. Indeed, Amun correctly pointed out what seemed to be embarrassing to Yong Ho. Instead of replying, Yong Ho looked at Catalina's face blankly. He had the urge to touch her cheek, but he couldn't because he was grabbing Amun at the moment. But he was reaching the breaking point slowly. This time, he really wanted to touch her cheek quite seriously. So Yong Ho asked the last question, third floor. Who among the twelve spirits controls the third floor? Amun didn't answer right away. There was some pause. As a human, Amun would have sighed or smiled bitterly during that short span. Elun whose star sign is Libra, cutting the night. She is the owner of the third floor of the Labyrinth of Greed. After answering, Amun withdrew the flames then went back to a bracelet, its original shape. Cutting the night Elun. The escort knight for Mammon, the king of greed, and his sweetheart. Yong Ho caressed Catalina's cheek. He closed his eyes because of her extremely soft face, but he shouted with all his might. He called Salami, Bucephalus, and the Skull Squad, who were waiting in the corridor. The passage to the third floor was opened, but now was not the right time to move. First, he had to go back to Scathack on the first floor to restore stamina and mana. He felt Salami running behind his back. Only then did Yong Ho take a load off his mind. Touching Catalina's cheeks, he fell into a deep sleep. The end of the long battle was around the corner finally. Ploros, the head of the Western Owners' Alliance, laughed vainly. It was not because Sekiro of the House of Burn, his strong ally, literally disappeared, bleeding before his eyes. 
the Western Owners' Alliance was defeated by Embryo. And that defeat was already certain from the beginning. Five horns, which was the evidence of the strength towering over Embryo's head. They weren't new horns as a result of Embryo destroying the house heads in northern and western regions. Although he had only four horns from the beginning, Embryo, who cultivated his mana over the years, knew it. Embryo had five horns from the beginning. Most of the house heads in the northern and western regions lagged far behind him in power, and perhaps, even the power they absorbed by essences of horns was little. It was natural that the house heads in the northern region lost to Embryo helplessly. It was also understandable that each of them showed their might just like the one-man army. It was highly likely that there were quite a few with five horns under the command of six kings. But it was not the case in the barren place of the south. To be precise, Embryo could be said to be the only and the most powerful in the southern area. Embryo absorbed the essence of Sekiro. Since it had only four horns from the beginning, his absorption helped him a bit. Embryo took another step. Ploros smiled bitterly at that. It wasn't just because of Embryo's horns that Ploros understood the defeat as something certain from the beginning. Ploros realized who was standing behind Embryo. That was why he gave up and laughed scornfully. You can't be a king, Embryo. You will eventually fall miserably after chasing only the king's shadow. It was not known which king was supporting Embryo. However, whoever he was, he would not ignore Embryo's ambitions. Embryo did not answer. He just silently approached Ploros. That was why Ploros laughed again. Instead of begging for life miserably, he wounded Embryo's mind with a final scorn. You know, Embryo, that you can never be a king. Those were his last words. Ploros couldn't talk anymore. With his heart destroyed while he was still alive, he died. Embryo took his essence. It could get quite a lot of power, just like the strongest head of a house in the western region. You cannot be a king. It was a curse. Embryo decided to think so. By ordering a group of wolves to eat Ploros's body, it dispelled his displeasure. The smoke from the battlefield covered the sky. Death, screams and groaning resonated everywhere. Leaving all this behind, Embryo stepped forward. He was heading for the south, where a great king was born. Chapter, 131 Yongho slowly opened his eyes. Just as he woke up from a pleasant deep sleep, he regained consciousness naturally and calmly. First, it was cold. He felt someone's familiar softness all over his body. Scathack. Specifically, it was the blue liquid that Scathack used to handle. As if he was asleep for quite a while, his eyes hurt, but he couldn't properly move his arms and legs. After struggling in the blue liquid, he gave up and looked straight ahead. Somebody's pleasant smile welcomed him. Let me wipe it. Scathack, sitting on the ice throne, moved her fingers lightly. Then, some of the blue liquid came up like tentacles and wiped his face. Her service didn't end there. One of the blue liquid tentacles stopped near his mouth and spewed clear, cold water. He didn't feel like drinking it, but it tasted slightly sweet and fresh. Resting his chin on her hand, she said, don't worry because this is a clear water I've drawn nearby. It wasn't the blue liquid or your purified urine. Ah. Uh, really? Scathack giggled at his question. He felt nervous because he couldn't understand why. He shook off useless thoughts and looked around. He saw dungeon spirits sitting at regular intervals around Scathack's throne. Her whole body except her head was covered in blue liquid. Everyone is recovering, except that cheerful skeleton. He got confused again at her statement. She gently moved her hand and turned the blue liquid containing him halfway around. At the entrance to her small palace was Skull lying naked with his armor removed. I tried to adjust his posture several times. Maybe he feels the most comfortable in that posture, namely rolling on the floor. She was correct. He asked her, can't you recover Skull? Are his injuries too severe? No, his injury itself is not very severe. But he needs a different type of treatment. I treat people here by sharing my vitality. But because Skull is an undead, his body will be broken and destroyed if I share my vitality with him. Yong Ho could understand it. Just like in games, 
casting heal magic to an undead damages their physical health rather than healing it. He looked at Skull with a bit of anxiety. He didn't think of any other way to heal Skull than evolving or advancing him. Scathack said again, don't worry too much. I think a special skeleton like Skull can recover naturally. With sufficient mana, he will stand up quickly. Actually, he has recovered quite a bit. What? Then, did Skull have something like a natural recovery function? He had never heard about it. Scathack tilted her head and asked, uh. You didn't know. Is this the first time Skull has ever been injured? No, he was injured before. Did Skull get this new ability when he had a consolidation evolution or advancement? Skull was now out of the lineage of the general undead monsters. Maybe he got it while he became a magic knight. Since becoming a knight, he was not injured so much. If that was the case, it was reasonable to think that Yongho didn't know his natural recovery function. But. Why? Yongho felt somewhat strange about Skull. Skull was the type that rolled on the floor as usual, but he felt different about it this time. To be precise, there was something different about Skull before and after fighting Baphomet. Skull. When Yongho called, Skull replied back immediately, Skull Skull. But he still didn't stand up. Scathack added, well, it's very hard for Skull to stand up now. All the joints of his body were broken. His upper body was restored yesterday. If his recovery goes well, he can stand up tomorrow. She was optimistic, but Yongho couldn't be relieved to hear that. The fact that Skull's upper body had recovered yesterday meant that Yongho himself was unconscious for at least a day. How many days have passed since I got here? Three days. About sixty-two hours, exactly. Really? Three days? Since you fought Baphomet, you were shocked mentally rather than being damaged physically. Besides, you used up all your energies, more than you could. Because of that, I am completely exhausted, as you see. Smiling warmly, she let her shoulders droop. Come to think of it, she looked more pale than usual. The reason she didn't get up from the throne was probably because she was weak. Yongho instinctively realized it. Skat Hakka's vitality, which offset Baphomet's death, was not just power stored in her godly energy. Actually, she drew it from herself, just as Yongho took his dungeon spirit's power through Brigada. He also understood how he could defeat Baphomet and why Scathack and Gusion asked him to challenge Baphomet. Apart from Yongho's suffering, Baphomet's body was clearly weakened, so much so that it was incomparable to the twelve spirits of the House of Mammon such as Gusion and Scathack. Nevertheless, Baphomet was strong. Its power of death was overwhelming. Yongho could defeat it because he could offset Baphomet's death with her vitality. Otherwise, even if Yongho himself managed to overcome its death with the power of greed, he would have been defeated in the end. Is it true that I can use godly energy to draw out the power of the twelve spirits that recognized me? That's why it's called godly energy. However, you can't do it freely, like drawing out the power of your own dungeon spirits because they haven't fully recognized you. In order to derive their power, you need the corresponding power. I don't know what method you used, but in this fight you made it, and you stole my power. Because of that, you won, but I was exhausted. It seemed that she referred to the mana of greed that Yongho amplified by the outburst of his anguish. Yongho asked again, then what is Baphomet's power? Same thing. Baphomet can use its power, but not completely. Just like you used my power, it needed to pay the price. You defeated him, but. You are not yet capable enough to control Baphomet's death. After stopping there, she took a big breath. She looked at Yong Ho quietly, with his chin resting on her hand, and continued again softly, you don't have to be too impatient. Someday you will get the power of everybody. I can guarantee it for you. Strangely enough, Yong Ho felt relieved to hear what she said. He leaned against the blue liquid. After relaxing anew, he looked back at his own spirits, especially Catalina. He felt reassured. Scathack laughed at that. Oh my god. Your affection for her is obvious now. Yongho decided to become impudent at that moment. 
He calmly turned his gaze to her and said, I heard from Amun that the third floor belongs to Alun. Right. And given her personality, she is probably fully ready for any attack. In a sense, you might find her tougher than Baphomet. So, I recommend that you challenge the third floor after getting stronger. Suddenly, she closed her eyes tightly then snapped her fingers lightly. Then, the blue liquid surrounding him was sucked back to the floor. Like before, the magical power arising from her dressed him back. I'm done healing you, little master. Your spirits need to recover for another half a day, so go up first. I think Lucia has lots of things to report to you. It had been as many as three days since he got here. So, he was curious about what was going on on the ground. Thank you, Scathack. You're my little sister. You can always rely on me. With a smile, she waved her hands, and Yong Ho responded quickly then hurried out of her place. At that moment, he immediately heard Lucia's voice, as if she had been waiting for him. Master. Butler June and Tigrius, head of the House of Randolt, have something to report to you. June, the only female dungeon spirit among goblin rangers, had been on the job training as a butler apprentice under Eligos for a while. Since Eligos was absent for the past few days, she probably took over his job. Salami, who was rolling around at the entrance to the Garden of Life, recognized Yong Ho and quickly approached. He quickly climbed on Salami's back and heard Lucia's report. June's report is about the current status of the dungeon spirits, the number of gold mines, the tax collected from the free city for this month, and the control of the dungeon of the House of Abigail. Briefing him quickly, she showed him light sentences and a few numbers. It was a much more simplified report than usual. Yong Ho understood why Lucia was in a hurry. So, he gave it a quick look and asked for the next report. This is a report from Demon King Tigrius under your command. The fight between the Western Owners Alliance and Embryo is over. Embryo has won. Embryo seems to be realigning troops. Tigrius got this intelligence twelve hours ago. After all, Yong Ho was sliding into the inevitable fight. Chapter, 132 Moreover, he could not take Lucia's report as real time. Perhaps, the fight itself already ended at least twelve hours earlier by now. Probably the fighting was over two or three days ago. What would be Embryo's next move, who destroyed the Western Owners Alliance? Would he advance into the southern region directly or take a brief break? Your subordinate, Demon King Tigrius, has requested materials for fortifying the House of Randolt. Since he is in a very urgent situation, you might want to help him out as soon as possible. Salami, who noticed that something serious was going on, quickly moved. After arriving at the central hall of the Garden of Life immediately, he climbed the stairs leading to the ground. Lucia, how far is the House of Randolt from the place of the final battle between the Western Owners Alliance and Embryo? Because they fought deep in the west, it would take at least five days based on their average marching speed. If so, Young Ho could feel relaxed even if Embryo already started his forces. And there was little possibility that Embryo started his forces right after defeating the Western Owners Alliance. As expected, Tigrius was a very careful guy. Lucia showed Yong Ho not only the news about Embryo's victory but also the paragraphs from the report that Tigrius filed separately. It was about the progress in their fight, the size of the troops mobilized by both sides, and the movement of Embryo's forces located elsewhere. Embryo could not immediately move his forces. He needed to realign after the battle. He had to have them take a rest even for a day. If that was the case, Yong Ho had some time to prepare for his advance. Even if Embryo decided to advance to the southern region as quickly as possible, it would take at least three days for them to reach Yong Ho's place. Salami ran down the hallway of the House of Mammon. The dungeon spirits, who welcomed back Yong Ho after a few days, showed their respect to him, but he could not afford to return their greetings. Kicking the door of the Demon King, Yong Ho ordered. Tell Bergrim to prepare the weapon for Skull. Tell Tigrius that I will supply him with the necessary materials. Tell Oris to have his men stand by, so they can move any time. Ophelia and her forces will understand what I mean. Are you going to head straight to the house of Randolt after stopping by the dungeon market? Yong Ho got off Salami's back. 
When Yuria, who was cleaning the demon king's room with Baduk, nodded to say hello, he raised his hand lightly and sat down on the throne. No, I'm going to leave after one or two days break. Since he had several days of preparing for Embryo's attack, Yongho had to make the most of this period. Although Lucia didn't know what Yongho was thinking, she didn't ask anymore. Okay. I will convey your message to Bergrim, Tigrius, and Oris. Lucia's sincere voice was fading from his ears. After taking a breath, he closed his eyes. Then he accessed the virtual space of the dungeon market. The virtual space of the dungeon market was a huge network created by magic. The head of each house could enjoy virtual services by accessing the network through clients provided by the dungeon merchant. Yongho slowly opened his eyes. Since everything that he saw, heard, and touched in a virtual space was transmitted directly through consciousness, not through his five senses. It was not necessary to have a human body, but all the heads of houses, including Yongho, possessed the same physical body in the virtual space as they did in the real world. The virtual space was kind of a device to not only protect self-consciousness within a huge mass of mental magic called a virtual space, but it also reduced the sense of incongruity that one felt instinctively. Yongho was now familiar with it, for he accessed it so many times. However, he felt a sense of incongruity instead of feeling familiar this time. When he opened his eyes, it was not a white space that filled my vision. There was light through the darkness. The piles of light connected in a series of dots like an archipelago located in the Great Sea had different shapes. Funny enough, the current situation itself was quite familiar to him, for it was similar to the scene he saw when he peeked through the memories of Kaiwan, Mammon, and Skathak through mana. But why did he suddenly see these things? Did something happen while he was accessing the virtual space? Was that the reason why he regenerated the memory from Mammon embedded in himself or the mana of the Twelve Spirits? Yongho stepped forward. Then one of the piles of lights came to his nose. He heard no sound. He focused on those who stood among the lights. Gus Ion was bleeding. He cried out, sitting on the floor, with his body covered with scars. Skathak was breathing life into him. Yongho couldn't grasp the situation. He didn't have any clue just like Skathaka's memory that he saw in the Garden of Life. Only Gusayan and Skathak were in the dark. Skathak was also crying. Yongho was really shocked to see her crying with a messy face like a child because she always smiled cheerfully. Yongho gulped before he knew it. He realized that Gyuzhin's tearful gaze was directed at a certain place. Yongho moved on then Gusayan and Skathak faded from him. A new pile of light came to him. It was Citri. She wasn't as calm and elegant as she had been. She cried sadly. She, who squatted on the floor, was holding a lun covered with blood. Yongho could not comprehend the scene. He couldn't even tell whose memory it was now. Elun opened her lips with an effort. Citri bowed hastily, and Elun slowly moved her lips. Yongho didn't know what Elun was talking about since her voice was hardly audible, but Yongho instinctively felt that it was Elun's last. Citri nodded several times. Elun smiled gently at her. She tried to touch Citri's cheeks with her bloody hands but couldn't. Her arms soon drooped again and stopped moving. It was a deep silence. Citri touched Elun's cheeks with her trembling hands. She hugged Alun's body that started to get cold and kissed her forehead several times. Her tears didn't stop. Weeping silently, Citri held Alun's head in her arms then looked into the sky. She was looking at something in the air. Yongho stepped forward again. Instead of the red sky of the demon world, he encountered a new pile of light this time. The moment he saw the back of someone he knew, he lost memory. Darkness swallowed everything up. It's all my fault. Yongho heard a voice. The moment a ray of light drove away the pitch black darkness, it turned into pure white as if to turn a page of a book. The virtual space of the dungeon market returned to its original place. Yongho turned around. Citri was blankly standing in the direction where the voice came from. Yongho saw her sad eyes. Recalling her a moment ago, Yongho felt like tears were about to flow down her cheeks at any moment. But Citri didn't cry. 
she even erased her grim smile and laughed cheerfully. She pointed to Yong Ho's left arm with her eyes. I see. You've started to create godly energy. I wish I had anticipated it, but it's faster than I expected. It's really my fault. A white chair rose behind Yong Ho and Citri's backs. Citri asked him to take a seat. As you can guess, what you saw a moment ago is my memory. The mana of the twelve spirits embedded in your lovely magic field and that person. Whether the mana of the king of greed came by coincidence or necessity, it stimulated the storehouse of memories I made. I wonder if I have to call it a kind of harmonized phenomenon. Yong Ho opened his lips, but he couldn't say anything. He had lots of things to ask, such as what the memories he had seen were, why Alun died in Citri's arms, and what happened the day Mammon died. But Yong Ho stopped himself from asking. Properly speaking, he couldn't because the moment he made eye contact with Citri, he realized that she would not answer all his questions. Chapter 133 Citri lifted her hands lightly with her palms up. This is my private space. You would not have seen all those things in my memory in a normal virtual space. Otherwise, I would have prepared something in advance. That's my fault, though. You haven't done anything wrong. I don't have any intention to get upset because you peeked into my memory. When she finished speaking, she let her shoulders droop. She said a little jokingly, well, I can't deny any more that I'm also an exclusive dealer for the House of Mammon. She stuck out her tongue at the end of her words, tilting her head. Normally, he could hardly see her acting charmingly like that. Citri was beautiful. Her acting charmingly for the first time fascinated him. However, he couldn't erase her weeping face from his mind. He seemed to discern her feelings hidden in her charming behavior. Well, shall we get back to our business? Citri approached him with a chair. The distance between them was wide enough to have a small table between them. He closed his eyes and took a deep breath. After forcibly emptying his mind, he faced Citri again. I would like to buy something. Then he quickly moved his fingers. Then, a document composed of letters of light was created before her eyes. It was about the last installment of materials needed to fortify the house of Randolt. Citri nodded. Then she moved her fingers and presented a bill for the materials to Yong Ho. It almost matched the cost Tigrius specified in the report. They stroked the deal by signing in the air. Since he already spent all of the remaining budget for the fortification, he could not purchase anything else unless Oris arranged the financial support from the House of Abigail. It was time to leave but Yong Ho could not stand up because Citri, who already got close enough to touch his knees, quietly grabbed Yong Ho's hand. You are very urgent, dear client. Yong Ho did not hide. It wasn't because he peeked into her memory that he couldn't focus on her surprisingly soft touch. Embryo defeated the Western Owners' Alliance. Most probably, they will be marching to the south. Embryo's forces were different from previous enemies. He could not be compared with not only Foras and Jungseros but also Agars and Tigrius. Citri looked into Yong Ho's eyes and tilted her head. So. Yong Ho was embarrassed. Citri grabbed his hand a little harder. She asked, facing close to him, what are you afraid of? It was Yong Ho who boldly challenged Baphomet, one of Mammon's twelve spirits. Then, could Yong Ho unusually be scared of Embryo just because he was a powerful demon king who occupied both the north and west? The reason that Yong Ho felt more nervous now was not because he was afraid of Embryo. Even when he had to face Foras as the head of the House of Mammon with no resources, he could not think of the option to run away. What Yong Ho felt nervous about was the difference between his fight against the Floor Masters in the arena as well as Twelve Spirits and his upcoming fight against Embryo. He had also fought the powerful Agars. What made him feel uneasy? Citri discovered that Yong Ho himself didn't know exactly why he was uneasy. That was why she let go of his hand and caressed the back of his hand gently. Well, it's me who wants to be comforted now. Still, since you are my deal client, let me tell you something. Looking straight into his eyes, Citri withdrew her hand and asked, My dear customer. What does the House of Mammon mean to you? Obviously she was not asking him about the long history or tradition of the House of Mammon. 
she didn't mean that he should take pride in being the descendant of that great king of greed. What did the House of Mammon mean to Yong Ho? He blinked. In no time, he gave a hollow smile, for he understood why he was more scared about fighting Embryo than Baphomet. The House of Mammon was not a place that he was taken to forcibly. It was a precious house. It was a place that he lived with not only Catalina and Eligos but many dungeon spirits. But Embryo was different from Baphomet or the Floor Masters. He could destroy not only himself but also all of the Mammon house. It's okay since the King of Greed has been greedy for ages. It's natural that you want to take them all because Mammon himself was also a very greedy person. Citri laughed brightly. Just like she did to Elun, he kissed Yongho's forehead. Let me stop here. I look forward to seeing you again next time. She stepped back. As soon as she moved her hand playfully, pure white swept over his mind. Yong Ho opened his eyes. The demon king's room was quiet since Yuria and Baduk left after cleaning the room. He took a big breath. He moved his fingers and opened the reports Lucia submitted into the air again. He read them all but paid attention to one paragraph. He saw it, but he deliberately put it off. The door of space was completed at a time when his fight with Emmerbio was around the corner. Yong Ho smiled. He reached out and removed the report. It wasn't because he didn't want to go back to his home country. He wanted to see his father and his friends. He wanted to eat chicken or coke but not now. He already decided on something when he resumed the construction of the door of the space. Back then, he vowed that he would go back to his home country only after defending the House of Mammon, his house, by defeating Embryo. Lucia. Tell Scathack to speed up healing my dungeon spirits. There is something I have to finish today. He made up his mind. So, instead of stopping and turning around, he just had to go straight ahead. He stood up from the throne. Then he headed to Bergram's workroom to pick up the weapons to give to Skull in person. Gus Ion was different from him in Citri's memory. Encountering Yong Ho, Gus Ion burst into a hearty laughter. Scat Hack was right. It's really my first time seeing a head of a house like my little master. I've defended the arena for over a thousand years. But this is my first time in my whole life. The former heads of the House of Mammon sitting in the stand were also confused. Kaiwan, standing next to Gus Ion, did not hide her embarrassment. She laughed awkwardly as if he was dumbfounded and asked Yong Ho, pointing with her chin, Are you really okay? Well, no problem. Replying immediately, he did not look back. Behind his back were not only Catalina but also the dungeon spirits of the House of Mammon, standing. Nobody among the previous heads of the House of Mammon who had visited the arena brought all of them there with him. Why? There were several reasons. For example, it was dangerous for anybody, who was not the house head, to challenge in the arena. Or it was because those dungeon spirits, who inherited the legacy of the House of Mammon, might become stronger than its head. Or it was because the house head didn't want to share the opportunity called the arena with them, even if they were dungeon spirits, or it was because the house head was afraid of an increase in those who knew the secret. There was only one thing that really bothered Yong Ho. It was none other than the danger of the arena. But if he could share the power with them through Brigada, or if the dungeon spirits could refrain themselves from challenging the floors under the command of Yong Ho, he could reduce the danger of the arena drastically. When you go out to the arena, it's only after all of you get advancement. Yong Ho wasn't going to be content with just keeping it. He was determined to have Embryo dare not to covet the House of Mammon, let alone the North and the East. Now the fight against Embryo was just around the corner, Yong Ho didn't have enough time. But Yong Ho and his subordinate spirits were determined to stop and defeat Embryo's forces. Each of the dungeon spirits moved forward and embarked on the challenge one by one. Chapter 134 It had already been a few months since Embryo, the demon king of wolves, mobilized his forces in the north. Embryo fought constantly throughout that period. As a result, he unified the northern region and destroyed the western region. The outcomes of the wars were different. Although they were invaded by Embryo's forces, the results were different in each region. Most of the dungeons in the north survived. Not all the heads of houses there were annihilated. 
many of them survived by going under his command. On the other hand, the western region was thoroughly destroyed. To put more pressure on the western owner's alliance, Embryo destroyed the heart of the dungeons that he already attacked. The destruction of the dungeon meant the collapse of their livelihood. Moreover, Embryo erased not only the dungeons but also the estates of the heads of houses from the map. Only ruins remained in the western region. Most of the heads of houses there were killed. Residents there, who lost their houses, had no choice but to become refugees or bandits to survive. Embryo accepted most of those refugees to use them as human shields in the next war. On the day the Western Owners' Alliance collapsed, the last dungeon in the West, the House of Burn, fell. After greedily swallowing the heart of the dungeon, Embryo mobilized his forces into the only city left in the Western region. The battle, which left total ruins behind, had a bad effect on Embryo's forces as well. Their fatigue was different from it when they unified the northern part. But Embryo didn't want a pause in the attack. Although he occupied the western region right after destroying the northern area, he became impatient and greedy. The situation drove him into a corner. The turbulence that Embryo himself created by starting the war was no longer playing its role. The eastern and southern regions were virtually unified under different flags. Instead of fighting each other like those in the northern region, the heads of houses united as one like the Western Owners' Alliance to block Embryo himself. Of course, Embryo could stop advancing any more and go back. If he led his troops back to the north, those in the east and the south would not dare to make the mistake of raising up an army to challenge him first. However, Embryo could not take over the southern area if he gave up now. It was also against his own ambition, and the king of gluttony would not allow it. The timing could not be better if he decided to attack the southern area. The confrontation between the king of pride and the king of envy, which was intensifying in the northern part of the demon world, diverted the king's attention from the south to the north. Even the king of gluttony, who was the strongest supporter and enemy of Embryo, was no exception. So, now was the golden opportunity for Embryo to attack the southern region. It was a once-in-a-lifetime chance for Embryo to unify the southern region for the first time since the great king of greed, Mammon. The problem is the eastern part. It was the eastern part where there were the most heads of houses. But only two of them shared the power of all others there, and Embryo could not ignore their power. Embryo wondered why they didn't attack the northern region while he was fighting the western owner's alliance. The reply to his question was simple. They were waiting for the Western Owners' Alliance to fall into Embryo's hands. Then what would they do next? If I attack the southern region, they will immediately advance to the north, Embryo thought. Obviously they read each other's intentions too well. It was highly likely that the heads of houses in the eastern part struck a deal with those in the southern region. In other words, those in the south would be an anvil for their counterparts in the east, while those in the east would be a hammer for their counterparts in the south. Embryo smiled lightly. If that was the case, he would carry out what they wanted. Let me attack the southern region. He was going to attack it as fast and as strong as possible. While the forces he left in the north were blocking their counterparts in the east, he would lead his army to destroy the southern area. After occupying the south, he would advance straight into the east to smash them. It would have been difficult for him to make the same decision as this if he had to wage a war in the human world, not the demon world. Why? It was because of the problem of military supplies. The western area, which had been thoroughly destroyed, could not serve as a supply base properly. If Embryo penetrated into the southern area to attack the eastern part, it was evident that the supplies route would be unusually long. It was too unstable to make up for the supplies by plundering in the enemy's area. No matter how well the soldiers fought, they couldn't fight without eating. However, they could solve this problem in the demon world. The solution was to keep the dungeons in the south instead of destroying them as they did in the western region. This didn't mean that they would solve the problem of supplies by consuming the food in the dungeons under their control. They were going to use the dungeon market. By using the newly acquired dungeon market as a transport destination, they were going to purchase grains from the dungeon market. In addition to grains, they could supply not only military equipment but also dungeon spirits as much as they wanted, if they had the funds. As everyone in the demon world admitted, the dungeon market's delivery was fast and accurate. 
moreover, even six kings could do nothing about the dungeon market. The heads of houses in the southern or eastern area could not obstruct Embryon's deal with the dungeon market. Embryo had enough money. The number of goods he collected in the process of destroying the dungeons and cities in the west was truly enormous. He realigned his focus in the last city of the western region. Then he ordered Bizarro to move his troops to the south as the advance party, who a former house head was now serving as his trusted general. Embryo's forces began to move. Finally, his army launched an attack on the south. As expected, Bizarro's advance party used the crossroads where the House of Randolt was located as the attack route. Since Embryo planned to take the dungeons in the southern region under his command, Bizarro's decision was a natural choice. Bizarro, the demon king of rain, was a practical man. He knew how to use those refugees from the western region as human shields in the war. There was no plausible declaration of war or a magnificent speech to raise the morale of his forces. Bizarro advanced his troops into the dungeon of the House of Randolt. A cruel battle began. Screams and howls filled the dungeon. Since dozens, rather hundreds of lighting fixtures cleared the darkness in the dungeon, the unfolding scene was harrowing all the more. Nothing could hide the tragic casualties everywhere. However, the dungeon of the House of Randolt, which had been thoroughly fortified recently, embarrassed Bizarro's forces. A typical dungeon would have been already occupied, but a series of defense zones of the dungeon delayed their advance. The poison that arose from the floor melted the flesh of the advance party. The numerous javelins shooting from the corridors turned the forcibly mobilized arrow shields into something like hedgehogs. Goblins and kobolds, pushed to the forefront as arrow shields, cried out in fear, but they had nowhere to run away amid the arrows raining down on their heads. The lizard men, the backbone of Bizarro's forces, didn't hesitate to behead the runaways. Bizarro used the reckless method of destroying all the traps of the dungeon by using these arrow shields. Funny enough, however, this method worked quite well. The durability of the traps wasn't supposed to last forever. Bizarro's forces blocked the holes where the odor of the piled up corpses was leaking out, and the javelins flying from the wall did not harm Bizarro's forces, who used the bodies of the killed goblins and kobolds as shields. Luckily for Bizarro, all the available javelins in the dungeon ran out. To make matters worse, the flames of the traps operated by mana had the same limits. Each time they shot the flames, poor kobolds and goblins were burned in droves, but the number of their shots was limited. The mana of the dungeon was not unlimited. Bizarro sacrificed nearly 300 goblins and kobolds in breaking through the traps in the dungeon. As a result, he succeeded in neutralizing most of the traps. Bizarro, the commander of the raid, did not even enter the dungeon of the House of Randolt. Positioning himself outside the dungeon along with his own men, Bizarro compiled the real-time information about the fighting results and drew a dungeon map of the House of Randolt. It was literally a messy dungeon. The shape of a dungeon differed according to its master, but its width and depth were usually the same. As an experienced head of a house, Bizarro could find out the size of the dungeon on the house of Randolt almost accurately. That was why he swore at its previous owner, astonished by the dungeon. The house of Randolt made more than 70% of its entire area as a defense area. Except for the dungeon spirit's living space for food, clothing, and shelter, there were virtually no other facilities. But it was almost over now. Although he sacrificed 300 out of the 700 soldiers he led, he could neutralize almost all of the dungeon traps. The only thing left now was the gathering ground, the final defense zone of the dungeon. Bizarro was sure of victory. So, he looked at the dungeon map comfortably. He waited for the victory news from his men inside the dungeon. Chapter 135. Crazy Bastard. Tigrius cursed, which was something uncharacteristic of him. After observing the entire dungeon through the soul of the dungeon, he could not help but curse. Just as Bizarro was embarrassed by the fortification of the House of Randolt, Tigrius was dumbfounded by Bizarro's tactics. Bizarro's way of attacking was far from reasonable. How could he dare to sacrifice hundreds of his own forces to destroy the dungeon traps? But he did. And his method paid off. At first glance, it was the least effective and the most reckless, but the final results were completely different. 
most of those that were killed were goblins and kobolds that didn't play any other role than being arrow shields. Although they numbered about 300, Bizarro could protect his main forces from the attack with little damage. Moreover, it had to be taken into account that the purpose of the traps wasn't only to kill the enemy but also to delay them. If Bizarro's forces had attempted to break through the traps in a normal way, they would have had to spend much more time and energy than now. The only hindrance that he had to break through was the gathering place. Although Rykam and the dungeon spirits were defending the final line of defense, they were outnumbered by Bizarro's forces. Despite the sacrifice of nearly 300 troops, Bizarro's forces still numbered over 400. Moreover, he had nearly a hundred troops standing by outside the dungeon. In other words, Bizarro was a very meticulous guy. Therefore, it was impossible to ambush the commander of the enemy by using the secret passage of the dungeon. But Tigrius didn't give up. He went back to the secret passage by using Blink. He gave up the option of destroying each of the enemy forces in the dungeon while Rykam and the dungeon spirits were playing the role of anvils at the gathering place. As things stood now, the gathering place was in danger of being taken over even before he destroyed them in the dungeon. Poison in the right hand, gust in the left hand. He cast a spell while running. Pushing through the door of the secret passage, he put his hands together. Then he blew out the poisonous wind forward. A green wind with a tremendous amount of poison swept the lizard men attacking the gathering ground. In an instant, more than a dozen lizard men fell, bleeding. Tigrius. Rykam came running to him, shouting. As if he was engaged in a fierce battle, he opened the way with a battle axe stained with the blood and flesh of lizard men. The situation of the dungeon was worse than Tigrius expected. All of the traps installed in the gathering area were neutralized. The defensive positions were also almost completely destroyed amid the fierce battle between them. Tigrius, who was temporarily incapacitated in the aftermath of the combination magic, quickly raised his body. Rykam cut a lizardman's neck once again with the battle axe. Come this way. I have to make space. Extreme fortification of the House of Randall simplified the rest of the space. What was located next to the gathering place was the heart of the dungeon. Tigrius smashed the head of a lizardman attacking him with his cane. At the same time, he ran toward Rykam and prepared a new spell. There weren't many spells available in a closed space where intense fighting was taking place at the moment. If he decided to use one, Tigrius had to be prepared to sacrifice friendly forces just like Bizarro did. Firewall in the right hand, gust in the left hand. He wanted to sweep away the inside of the gathering area with the gust of flames, which would bring big damages to the friendly forces, but he had no other choice now. Rykam groaned. A lizardman's long spear pierced his shoulder. The orc, who was fighting right next to him, was wrapped in a steel net thrown by the lizard man. It was helplessly dragged along in an instant, and it turned into a piece of minced meat in no time. At that moment, Tigrius didn't hesitate anymore. He gathered magic in both hands. Combination magic. Firestorm. A huge wave of flames covered the inside of the gathering area. It engulfed not only the enemy but also the friendly force. But it was weird. The color of the flames was not red. Moreover, it wasn't even hot. The dungeon spirits of the House of Randolt engulfed in flames screamed and struggled instinctively before stopping soon. Although the green flames engulfed them, they were not injured. On the other hand, the lizard men that were caught in the same flames were dying. Tigrius looked at both of his hands in embarrassment. Firestorm was still in his hand. Some of the flying flames didn't flare up, swallowed up by the green flames. At that moment, Rykam shouted. All the dungeon spirits of the House of Mammon shouted in joy. As if they were crazy, they quickly jumped into the green flames and roared. The Demon King of Flames. The green flame faded. And this time, the blade of black mana swept everywhere. Starting from the entrance of the gathering site, it ruthlessly hacked those lizard men that barely survived the green flames. The dungeon spirits of the House of Randolt could see now. Tigrius rejoiced to see his master who finally arrived at the scene. You've kept the defense line very well until now, Tigrius, Yongho said with a smile. 
There were so many lizard men in the gathering place that there were still lots of them who survived despite the waves of flames and the whirls of black blades, but Yong Ho didn't care at all. Yong Ho wasn't even standing with reinforcements. Next to him was only one escort knight, who always accompanied him. But the lizard men didn't dare to attack him. Although ogres were ignorant, they instinctively knew who was superior, so they stepped back, screaming. The battle didn't become more intense. Regardless of friendly forces or enemy, they didn't dare to fight. Tigrius released the mana he concentrated in both hands and thought for a moment. Yong Ho was a different man this time. He was not the kind of man that Tigrius had fought before. What the hell happened during this short period? Moreover, it was not only Yong Ho alone that changed. Tigrius, a demon king and wizard, did not miss the fact that it was Catalina who wielded the blade of black mana. That mana was much stronger than he imagined. Although he could not figure it out because mana was released instantly, he felt it seemed to be the same as his. Moreover, I felt some specialness embedded in mana, which he could not explain properly. Tigrius shook his head. Now was not the time for him to think about stuff like this. There were still many enemies. Outside the dungeon was Bizarro standing by with his elite forces. But Tigrius blinked at that moment because he felt something very strange. How could Yong Ho appear here? Every passage of the dungeon was filled with enemies, and outside the dungeon, Bizarro was standing by with his elite forces. Tigrius looked at Yong Ho. Instead of explaining to him, Yong Ho laughed heartily. Realizing something, Tigrius swallowed. He urgently called the soul of the dungeon and ordered it to explain what the dungeon meerkat saw. Tigrius shuddered, astonished. Only four men were destroying Bizarro's army numbering 100. Demon King of Rain Bizarro couldn't understand the current situation. Only a dozen minutes ago, he was waiting for the good news about victory while sitting in the shade. However, something unknown poured down from the sky with a terrifying force. There was a lot of dirt, and when it settled, the only thing he could see was the bodies of five or six mangled lizard men. When he was distracted by that, there were a couple of explosions in the left and right of the 100 elite soldiers standing in a row. It was a terrific explosion. On the right, thunder and lightning stroke, and on the left, there occurred something very strange, such as lizard men soaring into the sky in groups as if they were going against gravity. It was a pitch black knight on a black horse that seemed to be wielding the weapon of lightning. And it was a huge red monster with black horns that threw the lizard men into the sky as if it were a storm. Bizarro couldn't issue any order to his elite forces. He couldn't open his mouth because he was so embarrassed by the sudden situation. And his embarrassing inaction could not be blamed. Even if he had issued any order at that moment, the situation would not have changed. The last lizard man that fought to the end without fleeing was thrown into the air. The red-skinned muscular giant, rather a beast who threw the lizard man weighing more than 200 kilograms with a single punch, approached Bizarro, letting out a breath reminiscent of purgatory smoke. Turning white, Bizarro shuddered. Although he kept thinking he had to run away, he couldn't move even a finger. As if his tendon was cut off, Bizarro's arms were drooping without moving. And his legs were bent at a bizarre angle and could not function properly. It was one of the four that smashed Bizarro's elite forces. Wrapped in black mana that fluttered like flames, it stood alone and looked down at Bizarro, who fell on the floor. The beautifully raised buttocks and narrow waistline obviously showed it was a beautiful woman, but its face was far from a woman. More specifically speaking, it had no face at all. There was something that looked like eyes, but they were nothing more than something like a metallic mask. All black, it was literally a weapon. With the black mana arising from its whole body, it not only cut lizard men but also Bizarro's both arms. Bizarro caught his breath. Even though his whole body was covered with wounds, he still had power. If he could release the power that empowered him as the name, the Demon King of Rain, he could escape, rather struggle desperately. Don't think of anything. The person that smashed Bizarro's legs burst into laughter. It was exactly two, not four, who defeated one hundred lizard men. While a black knight on a black horse and a huge red monster smashed the lizard men, Bizarro could not help them out because his feet were bound by two women. He had to confront them who were equal or superior to him in fighting. 
One of them, a red demon woman, trampled his thigh hard. He struggled again in terrible pain, and the red demon, Ophelia, pressed down his shoulder with both arms. Licking her lower lip, she said, This is your last moment, so I hope you can enjoy it enough. This time, again, something that Bizarro could not understand happened. With her eyes half closed, Ophelia kissed Bizarro. He felt it was soft and sweet, but at the same time, he got goosebumps. He lost consciousness, though very briefly. But he immediately felt that the moment he faced Ophelia, who breathed out seductively after kissing with her lower lip, he let her read his mind. But there was no time for him to worry about it. A huge shadow came over him. Covering not only him but also Ophelia on top of him, it roared like a beast. It was displaying a clear hostility toward him. With a smile, Ophelia stepped back. A giant, red beast, Elagos, who turned into a beast, clenched his two fists reminiscent of a giant hammer. Bizarro could no longer remember what happened after that. Chapter, 136 Brother Eli's jealousy was far stronger than I thought. As if she felt shy, Ophelia covered her face with her hand, blurring her words. And Elagos, who stood next to her, shook his head, pressing on his temple as if his head was pounding and said, I can't remember. However, given that his red skin was getting redder, Elagos seemed to admit it. As if he understood, Yongho patted Elagos on the shoulder and looked down at Bizarro's mangled body. Although he had the fourth recently, he had four horns, but he met his last moment very tragically. Yongho lightly joined his hands together and prayed for his rest in peace then took his essence. The larger the difference between one's mana and the others, the worse its efficiency, so he couldn't take much from Bizarro. Nonetheless, Yongho felt a bit of thrill. Phew! Yongho looked back at the smashed lizard men soldiers and admired the great achievement that only four, rather two, made in the fight. Promoted as Red Demon Tyrant, Elagos acquired a new ability called Beast, as Yongho expected. His new title exactly reflected his new ability. As soon as he empowered himself, Elagos turned into a beast. At first glance, he looked like a gorilla. Both arms, tightly fused with muscles, looked like iron pillars, and his fists were reminiscent of the weight of heavy equipment for destroying buildings. White hairs with gray color grew out of not only his head but also chest, arms, thighs, and other areas where hair could grow, making him look like a real beast. Elagos, in his beastly shape, was truly the monster of the House of Mammon. Aside from his images as a monster, Elagos's endless strength was impressive, as evidenced in the House of Mammon and the House of Randolt. Yongho himself and Catalina got on Salami. Skull rode on Bucephalus. And Ophelia got on the back of Elagos, who turned into a beast. Although they took a few breaks in the middle, they smashed the lizard men, feeling no fatigue after traveling such a long distance. Skull was promoted from Magic Knight to Eldritch Knight. In fact, Skull made the most surprising achievement in this battle. When Yongho evolved Skull last time, he was not sure when he could promote Skull. But this time, he could see it. Moreover, Skull's ability to evolve also increased. Even his level changed. Obviously, Skull changed before and after fighting Baphomet. Although Skull could not discover what changed as it was getting around casually as usual, Yongho doubted one possibility. Perhaps. Did Skull feel something from death? Perhaps, Skull recovered some of its former self before becoming the undead. After becoming an eldritch knight, Skull became stronger overall. It was now nearly two meters tall, and despite having only bones, it unleashed terrifying power. Its mana was also stronger, so it could use lightning much more powerful than his days as a magic knight. Skull could not wear the armor that Burgrim had made because of the different dimensions. Therefore, the armor protected only part of its arms and legs, chest, and back. Fortunately, the helmet could be used as it was. What Skull chose as the replacement of the broken battle hammer was a relatively short new battle hammer and a huge claymore. Both were magical weapons that Burgrim had used before. Ophelia kept smiling at Elagos as if she liked his shyness. Promoted to the Red Demon Breaker, she also gained beast skills like Elagos. However, her beast skills were different from Elagos's. It was true that she became more militant, 
but there was something elegant about her, reminiscent of a feline beast. Her appearance didn't change that much, either. Gus Ion said the reason for this difference was that the two had different temperaments in the first place. But it was mainly because they were affected by Yong Ho's preferences, just like their appearances after evolution was influenced by Yong Ho's thinking. Finally, Catalina was promoted from Shadow Runner to Shadow Mistress. As the owner of the Shadow, she could create her own alter ego with black mana. One of the four who smashed Bizarro's army was none other than her alter ego. The only drawback was that her alter ego would disappear naturally if it was too far away from Catalina and that if Catalina did not directly manipulate it, its behavior pattern would be too simplified. But she could deal with it without any problem. It was when Catalina and her alter ego fought together in the same place when her alter ego could unleash its power fully. Currently, Catalina had limited ability to control her alter ego, so her alter ego only imitated Catalina. But even that was powerful because there was plenty of room for its application, such as delayed attacking or simultaneous attacks from various angles. After dissembling her shadow alter ego, she patted her ears lightly. It seemed that she felt quite a sense of accomplishment in this battle. Yong Ho laughed bitterly again. Sorry. Originally, Catalina used to move her ears more actively, compared to other elves, but it was thanks to Yong Ho's evolution that she advanced as far as here. In other words, his subconscious wishes that he wanted to see more of her cute ears made him evolve her skills. But Yong Ho kept mum about it according to Gyujin's advice and looked at her tail. It certainly seemed to be moving more briskly than it did before her advancement. Well, she had lots of other improvements anyway. For example, her figure was one of them. Of course, since it reflected Yong Ho's tastes, it was questionable whether Catalina would like her own figure. After completely absorbing Bizarro's essence, Yong Ho faced Ophelia again. While teasing Eligos until now, she got serious again and said, I read Bizarro's mind and got some information. Bizarro was the chief of the advance party that attacked the house of Randolt. Currently, Embryo himself is leading his main forces to the southern area. It seems that Embryo is planning to attack the east after penetrating through the south at once. And. And. It seems that Embryo thought he would easily take over the House of Randolt with Bizarro as the head of the advance party. It looks like the House of Randolt is a piece of cake to him. Yong Ho laughed bitterly, but he understood. Bizarro led as many as 700 soldiers. If Yong Ho himself had not come to help out Tigrius, or if he had arrived a little late, the House of Randolt would have been captured in the end. How many are Embryo's main forces? At that question, Ophelia narrowed her brow slightly. She hesitated for a moment and said, around 4,000, I guess. There are about a thousand elite soldiers who have followed Embryo from the north. Yong Ho closed his eyes tightly. He understood why Embryo underestimated the southern region. Currently, the number of troops the House of Mammon could mobilize was 1,000 at most, even if all the troops of the Free City joined them. But the gap between the troops was not big enough for Yong Ho not to overcome. Although he was ridiculously inferior to Embryo in the number of troops, he had confidence that he would never be outpowered by Embryo in terms of the quality and competence of his men. The war in the demon world was different from the ones in the human world in many ways, which Yong Ho discovered in history. It was because there existed the owners of transcendent combat power. The number of Embryo's horns is at least five. Embryo devoured not only almost all the heads of houses in the west but also those in the north. Having eaten them all, he would have at least five horns, given his enormous absorption of their essence. Yong Ho stopped thinking about it anymore. He looked back at Tigrius, who couldn't help but admire the dungeon spirits that were so different from what he had seen last time. Troops of the Free City and Skull Squad led by Oris are coming from the rear. So, let's get rid of the enemy's bodies piled up in the dungeon and realign our forces. Got it, master. Tigrius nodded. However, he couldn't completely hide the anguish around his eyes. Although the defense of the House of Randolt was remarkably strengthened with complete fortification, it was trampled by only 700 soldiers led by Bizarro. Given that Embryo's main troops numbered 4,000, he wondered how Yong Ho and his reinforcements could stop them. Yong Ho also understood Tigria's concerns. However, 
he did not want to give up before fighting. Tigrius felt the same way, too. Tigrius, I have one suggestion. I hope you think it over well before replying. I won't mind if you refuse to answer. Yong Ho spoke, and this time, Tigrius read his mind. I want you to be the dungeon spirit of the House of Mammon this time. His suggestion was what Tigrius expected. It was largely for two reasons that Yong Ho did not make Tigrius a dungeon spirit until now. First, in order to effectively proceed with the fortification of the House of Randolph, it was necessary to have someone like him who could order the souls of the dungeon in the field. Second, Yong Ho himself could not afford to make Tigrius a dungeon spirit back then. Now, he solved both problems and now he needed one more powerful dungeon spirit rather than the demon king under his command. Yong Ho's suggestion was that Tigrius should give up the status of the demon king. Since he played the role of the head of the house of Randold, he would not lose his power, but the weakening of his power was inevitable. He had to give up the house now. Tigrius slowly closed his eyes. It was something he was prepared for when he was defeated in the battle. Moreover, he was interested in becoming a dungeon spirit of the house of Mammon. How strong could he be? Where would the power of evolution that he heard from Ophelia lead him? Let me accept your command, master. To his own surprise, Tigrius responded cheerfully. Yong Ho took his hands with deep gratitude. And three days later, Yong Ho, who confirmed the movement of Embryo's main forces through the scouts, gathered all the dungeon spirits in his room. Because the living space of the dungeon was reduced drastically by excessive fortification, the demon king's room was also narrow. The only furniture in the room was just one bed, so when the five dungeon spirits gathered in one place, there was only a little space left. The reason that he gathered them was to convey his own tactics that he had been pondering over for the past few days. But there was one thing he had to do first. Namely, he had to invite Tigrius as the seventh member as a dungeon spirit. Sitting on the bed, he took out a summons from his pocket. Each of the four who already knew the subject of the summons made different expressions, and Tigrius was looking at the summons alone seriously. Yong Ho let out a long breath. After deciding firmly, he tore the summons to free his mana. And the one who appears thus. The one who descends beyond the constraints of the arena as well as time and space. Her grey hair fluttered in the strong wind. There was mischievousness in her ferocious eyes. The head of the House of Mammon three generations ago. Kaiwan, the Demon King of Distortion. So, have you come up with any wishes for me this time? Standing ask you, she asked teasingly, licking her lips lightly. Yong Ho smiled bitterly instead of answering. He welcomed her with open arms she would be the Joker in his fight against Embryo as well as his Sixth Sword. Chapter, 137 Bizarro, the Demon King of Rain, didn't come back from the battle, nor did the seven soldiers led by him. It was because his forces were virtually annihilated. His soldiers, who infiltrated the dungeon of the House of Randolph, could not get out of it. None of the hundred elite lizard men, who guarded Bizarro outside the dungeon, run away, as if to demonstrate their loyalty and courage, and were literally annihilated. Since there was none who could convey the bad news to him, Embryo didn't know what happened in the dungeon. But there was one thing he knew for sure, which was that the demon king of rain, Bizarro, died. The evidence that the soul of the dungeon he was in charge of perished confirmed it. Embryo wondered how Bizarro died. Bizarro was the master of a house in the northern area. He had four horns, but he just advanced to that level. His combat competence was mediocre, and his personality was good enough. He was far from hot-tempered nor was he stupid enough to kill the goose that laid the golden eggs. If he had been such a person, Embryo himself would not have spared his life. Of course, there could be no absolute survival in battle. It was possible that Bizarro was killed by a stray arrow or sword. But Embryo could not imagine such a scenario easily. When something happened, there was supposed to be some plausible reason for it. It was never common for a rat to kill a cat. Did the head of the House of Mammon kill him? Embryo wondered. What if the house head himself defended the House of Randolph and took Bizarro's life? It was this man who defeated Agars. Although Embryo had never faced him in person, it was highly likely that this man had more than four horns. 
But Emmerbio still could not understand why nobody out of the 600 soldiers, apart from Bizarro and his loyal 100 lizard men, didn't return from the dungeon. Were they all annihilated? If that was the case, perhaps, the House of Mammon was much more powerful than Embryo himself expected. Embryo pondered over what to do now. It was ridiculous for him to withdraw his forces now. Moreover, even if the House of Mammon was more powerful than he expected, Embryo thought they were obviously not stronger than his forces. In his mind, the House of Mammon couldn't have been stronger than the Western Owners' Alliance. It was true that the head of the House of Mammon took the essence of those heads of houses in the southern area after defeating them, but it was only a couple of them whose essence he took. If he had been strong, his absorption of their essence would not have been good enough to result in his dramatic growth. If he had been born weak, he must have had the fourth horn only recently. Of course, there was a possibility that the master of the House of Mammon was a man with superhuman strength. If that was the case, Embryo couldn't understand his behavior pattern up to now, for the Mammon Master slowly took over the hegemony of the southern area after struggling in various battles. There was only one master in the House of Mammon now, and the most soldiers he could mobilize was around 1,000. Certainly, it was incomparable to the Western Owners' Alliance with a dozen masters of houses and nearly 7,000 troops. We're going to attack the southern region as planned. Embryo's command was conveyed to his commanders. Except for the 1,000 troops that left for the north as supporting units, the remaining 3,000 troops resumed their march to the south. Since there was no table in the room, Yongho laid out a map of the front lines on the floor and explained the tactic he devised. It was never complicated. It was a very simple tactic. It took about 30 minutes for him to brief his dungeon spirits about it. Cross-legged on the floor, Kaiwan looked sharply at the map with her arms crossed. And soon, she rolled her eyes and met his eyes. I've been thinking about it. So. You must be crazy, seriously. Having said that bluntly, Kaiwan laughed as if his tactic was absurd. Since her look was so ferocious, it looked like she was ridiculing him. But Yong Ho, who always appreciated her selfless smile, understood the true meaning of her laugh. Of course, Kaiwan had no intention of ridiculing or denouncing him. She thought his tactic was rather absurd, but at the same time, she admired it a bit. Yong Ho chuckled at her comment that he was crazy. As if to avoid her gaze, he rolled his eyes to see other dungeon spirits. Eligos was looking at the map with a blank expression. Ophelia tried hard to make a smile, and Catalina, puckering her lips, was looking at Kaiwan. It seemed that she was more bothered by Kaiwan ridiculing Yong Ho as a crazy man than by his tactic itself. Skull chuckled as usual. The purple ghost flames in its hollow eyes gave out a calm impression, but it still felt like a skull. Yong Ho, who was nervous about the various changes in Skull these days, let out a breath of relief briefly. Lastly, Tigrius, who joined the House of Mammon as its fifth dungeon spirit, did not betray his expectations. He said calmly, it's definitely a reckless tactic, but it seems your tactic is the best at this point. You will never be able to beat Embryo by simply holding up in the dungeon. Ophelia added, I agree with Tigrius. And. And. When Yong Ho asked back, Ophelia narrowed her brows as if she was embarrassed and replied, it seems like the tactic fits your personality well. I'll take that as a compliment, said Yong Ho with a smile. Yong Ho then looked at Kai Wan again. She unfolded his arms and touched the floor with both hands. Leaning back, she said, Well, since I've been summoned as your dungeon spirit, I've no other choice but to follow your order. Like Ophelia just said, the tactic seems to fit your personality. I can feel something like your cunningness or meticulousness that you have shown in the arena. I think your tactic is better than that. Honestly, I really like it. When Yong Ho visited the arena last time, he did not challenge the eleventh floor. Instead of obsessing with the mana of mammon or the rewards of the arena, he was seeing the bigger picture. The dungeon spirits moved under Yong Ho's control. They didn't even think of challenging the floor that required their utmost strength. They challenged those floors only that they could win comfortably enough to satisfy the evolution EXP. As a result, Catalina, Ophelia, and Skull only challenged up to the third floor, and Eligos only challenged the second floor. 
Although each of the dungeon spirits was strong enough to challenge higher floors because of their four horns equal to their master, Yong Ho never allowed it. Despite his status as the king of greed, Yong Ho exercised moderation in a strange place. Gus Ion blamed him for that but liked it at the same time. On the other hand, Kai Wan thought their behavior was really surprising. However, this tactic was truly befitting Yong Ho. At the same time, it was obviously reckless. She could feel his conviction in victory with this tactic. That's why he did it before. By using the power of evolution during a battle, Yong Ho evolved himself. She witnessed it in front of her eyes, but she thought his action was absurd when she thought about it even now. When she noticed Kai Wan's sharp glance at him turning agreeable, Catalina pricked her ears. Fortunately or unfortunately, no one paid attention to her ears, though. Tigria said again, even if your tactic is successful, you will incur heavy casualties. I am not sure if this crazy commander Oris can effectively control the freewheeling troops of the free city I'm a bit worried. The situation this time was different from when they fought Agar's army in the free city. Ophelia replied on behalf of Yong Ho, it will be alright. Nobody in the free city army knows that the western region was devastated. So, they have every motivation to fight. Moreover, Oris will fight well. You don't have to worry. Although Ophelia spoke calmly, she had a point. It was natural that she showed such a reaction as one of the dungeon spirits of the House of Mammon and one of the heads of the free city. Instead of colliding with her about it unnecessarily, Tigrius backed off. Yong Ho was satisfied with the fact that the dungeon spirits were coordinating among themselves well without him bothering to reconcile their opinion. Ophelia, convey to Rikam and Oris about my decision. Tigrius, double-check the defense posture of the dungeon. Skull, have your squadron stand by. Given the speed of Embryo marching his army to the south, you have to get them leaving tomorrow morning. I'm sorry for all this, but make sure you get enough rest. All of them responded to him by politely accepting his order. Then, what about me? Kaiwan asked. Although they were faced with a life-threatening battle, they could not stay nervous forever. Standing up, Yong Ho told Kaiwan, let's go to the restaurant and eat something. It's like you're here on vacation in decades, right? There is nothing to eat in the arena anyway. Yong Ho said that, although he never experienced an army life. Kaiwan smiled brightly at his reply while blinking, curious about what he was going to say. Well, I would like to grant two wishes for you, not one. By the way, when are you going to ask for it? Why are you so lazy in letting me know about it? Is it a big wish? Yong Ho smiled bitterly at her question. Instead of replying, he said to Kai Wan while gesturing with his chin, let's go. Kai Wan stood up readily. Then Catalina, who also stood up before she knew it, moved her lips. Was she going to say the same thing as she did in the arena? Kai Wan stroked her hair as if she was cute. Thanks to that, Catalina curled her lips suddenly while trying to say something. Yong Ho also stroked Catalina's hair. Kai Wan laughed. She is cute too. You bet. She is cute and pretty. Agreeing with her a bit awkwardly, he left the room ahead of Kai Wan. Unlike Ophelia who looked at him weirdly, Yong Ho appreciated Tigrius very much, who turned his eyes away from him elegantly. Chapter, 138 Days and nights changed one after another. Embryo's army, finally crossing the borders between the west and the south, was approaching the dungeon of the house of Randolph fast. Embryo didn't rush. Riding on a giant wolf instead of a horse, he turned his gaze aside. Lotus, the demon king of wild animals, one of the house masters under his command, replied politely, there is a group of troops ambushed in the right rear of the dungeon of the house of Randolph. About six hundred, all told. Given that their arming posture is not organized, it seems they are from the free city. As the name suggested, Lotus could freely control wild animals and even shared their senses. Embryo nodded. He didn't expect their defense posture was poor like that. It was unlikely that the master of the House of Mammon, whose troops were absolutely inferior, would retreat. To make matters worse, since the master could not place all his troops in the mid-sized dungeon of the Hazu of Randolph, it was highly likely that he had them ready to ambush Embryo's army. Move forward like we did. 
While attacking the dungeon of the House of Randold, his forces were in danger of being ambushed, but Embryo didn't worry that much. His forces were different from Bizarro's in terms of the size of the troops. Even though Embyro mobilized 1,000 troops to attack the dungeon, he still had 2,000 troops on standby. Now, Embryo kept gesturing to Lotus. After understanding his signal, Lotus bowed out politely and headed to the left wing of his main forces. Then he turned the marching course of the light infantry troops composed of orcs and lizard men slightly, for the target of his attack was not the dungeon, but the forces of the free city in ambush behind it. Orc warrior Kijamu, commander of the main unit's heavy infantry, accelerated the march. Of the 1,500 troops located in the center of the main unit, about 900 people, more than half of them, followed his command. Consisting of heavy infantry and arrow shields, their main mission was to attack the dungeon of the House of Randolt. The remaining forces left behind were 600 light infantry, who were reserve units. Moreover, there were troops on the right wing of the main unit. Dozens of cavalry, headed by a death knight riding on a giant lizard running on two legs, and about 500 light infantry, stopped marching like Embryo's main forces and kept their place. The fighting began from a distance. The light infantry led by Lotus clashed with the forces of the Free City. Since their ambush was exposed to the Lotus army, the Free City soldiers had no tactical advantage at all. They were just struggling to fight back the Lotus's light infantry that numbered almost twice as much as them. Kijamu didn't pay attention to Lotus's fighting. His heavy infantry, with scared goblins and kobolds attacking ahead, stormed into the dungeon. Embryo just watched his commanders leading the fight. Instead of leading the forces by himself, as he did when fighting the Western Owners Alliance, this time he took his time and just waited. He heard the clattering of horses' hoofs behind his back. Again, it was as he expected. In the current situation, there were not many things the master of the House of Mammon could do. Embryo felt that the master would try to divert his attention to the troops in the front line then have his own elite forces attack the main forces led by Embryo's commander in the rear. Embryo could clearly understand how Bizarro was defeated. Perhaps, he was defeated by the same tactic. The wolves turned. The elite soldiers mixed among the reserves calmed their confusion. Embryo burst into laughter after noticing a group of soldiers running to him at a distance. Twenty of them at most. Each one of them was an elite soldier, but their number was too small. It was like hitting a rock with eggs. Was he crazy? Embryo raised his hand. He didn't even have to go out. Death Knight, who was standing by on his right, could handle them alone. But at that moment, the air of the battlefield changed. Terrible mana was released from the elite soldiers of the House of Mammon, who were rushing like a moth running into the flames. As the attack was so sudden, Embryo was at a loss about what to do. His main unit was dealt a strong blow. Kuhung. It was a beast's roar. Huge red monsters that penetrated into his main forces threw them into the sky, wielding their arms violently. The red beast on the monster's backs commanded them with a single flash of light. But the cavalry of the House of Mammon didn't charge at Embryo's main unit. The pitch-black nightmare, flying in the lead, turned to the right when the red monster and the beast revealed their claws. The cavalry rushed toward the death knight. Lightning struck and gusts arose fiercely, protecting the cavalry. Moreover, the mana unleashed by each of them was exceptionally powerful. Extreme confusion dominated Embryo's main unit. However, he couldn't think of quelling the confusion. He didn't even look at the Death Knight, who was about to collide with the Pitch Dark Knight. When Embryo and his men were distracted by the ambush of the House of Mammon, they suddenly raised their heads. Embryo glared his eyes before he knew it. Under the red sky of the demon world, there was another sun. A huge and intense lump of green flames flared up. Embryo could not afford to think about where they suddenly appeared or how they hid mana. The red monsters, apparently under the master's command, were raging inside his main unit. Embryo hastily opened up his mana. Yong Ho, standing on the back of Salami, roared and brandished Amun. The sun of the green flames hit the ground. Embryo's army witnessed a disaster pouring out from the sky. Those who witnessed their colleagues' heads being smashed by the red monster's fists, those who screamed to overcome their fear, 
and those who tried to run away instinctively raised their heads and looked at the sky. It was beautiful. The green flames exploding under the red sky of the demon world were luxurious, glamorous, and mysterious. But they couldn't admire it because the flame was alive. The sun of green flames that hit the ground turned into dozens, rather hundreds of flames. They covered the sky and the earth and colored the whole world green. Sparks of the flame scattering like petals turned into fatal weapons and struck Embryo's army. He spread the map of hell on the ground. Those who were engulfed in flames screamed painfully. The moment the sun of green flames hit the ground, its heat and shock instantly killed nearly a hundred soldiers. The remaining survivors were also swept away by a wave of sparks from the source of the shock. Yong Ho looked down at all this from the sky. Although they couldn't destroy all of Embryo's main unit and his right-wing troops that didn't move, the ambush already achieved a lot. Nearly 200 troops were incapacitated by the attack, and the battlefield was thrust into an extreme chaos. But Yong Ho felt his attack wasn't sufficient. The attack was just a killer punch. He really had to prepare for lots of stuff for this attack. He concentrated mana for about 30 minutes. At the same time, Kaiwan used the power of distortion non-stop for 30 minutes so that he couldn't have his abnormally concentrated mana caught by embryo. She distorted the flow of mana in the atmosphere adroitly to hide his mana. Added to this was Tigrius illusion magic. Thanks to this, Yongho wasn't even caught in the eyes of Lotus, the demon king of wild animals. Lastly, Skull, Tigrius, Eligos, and Ophelia mounted a combined attack. While Embryo and his army's eyes were fixed on the ambush, Yongho soared on the back of Salami. Of course, he had to distract Embryo's attention even during that short span, so Kaiwan, on Salami's back like Yongho, did her best to use the power of distortion to deceive Embryo. Then came the killer attack by Yongho and his dungeon spirits. Without any regret, Yongho breathed harshly and drank the mana potion he had obtained from the arena. So did Kaiwan. Exhausted after using the power of distortion for about 30 minutes, she tried to recover mana instead of looking down on the ground. Yongho's attack just began. There were still many enemies, and Embryo was well and alive. Ooh! Eligos roared in the flames that covered the ground. He literally ran around like he was crazy. The flames of greed never harmed Yongho's possession Eligos. As a result, Eligos wasn't afraid of the flames at all. Rather, Eligos actively used the flames. While being faithful to his wild nature, Eligos freely used the skills he acquired so far. The Storm of Power Whenever he wielded his punches amid the green flames, enemies' blood splattered and bones scattered everywhere. A terrifying noise of breaking and destruction resonated in all directions. Ophelia ran silently. If Eligos was a storm in the air, she was lightning on the ground. She was fast and intense. Moreover, her attack didn't know distance. A shock wave that she caused by kicking in the air broke the atmosphere and crushed the ground with a strike. The role of the two red demons was to break the backbone of Embryo's main unit. Accordingly, they didn't stop for a moment. They didn't forget that the moment Yongho's green flames disappeared, he would be exposed among the 1,000 troops. Skull's unit penetrated the troops on the right wing of Embryo. They suffered relatively less damage from the green flames, but it didn't mean their resistance to lance charging was reinforced. The giant black horses carrying Skull's troops on their backs guaranteed the unusual impact and racing power of the cavalry. They immediately trampled on the light infantry in Embryo's right wing. Penetrating the infantry squad with lance charging was a standard military tactic. The moment they stopped moving, the cavalry was no longer a cavalry. For this reason, Skull Squad penetrated Embryo's right wing. They ran diagonally and got out of the place except for one. Skullo. However, Skull didn't penetrate the right wing. Skull immediately ordered its unit's members to get around and charge again at the right wing. Skull then turned the head of the horse. Skull drove a horse face to face to the one who rushed forward without turning his gaze even when the sun of the green flames was pouring down. Bucephalus exuded a hot, harsh snort. Skull also roared wildly, grabbing Claymore, which was embedded with lightning. The Death Knight. 
he was one of the prized figures of the undead monsters. Chapter 139 The Death Knight held an unusually huge Zweihander in his hand. Wrapped around in pitch black armor, he fluttered a red cloak and released a wicked energy. It was overwhelming. It was a terrifying energy indeed. The wicked energy was so intense that Embryo's army near the path of the Death Knight screamed in painful groaning. It wasn't an enemy that an ordinary undead monster could deal with. It was in a different league from the start. But Skull didn't back down. It sharply stared at the Death Knight with Bucephalus and glared its purple eyes even more. The wicked energy of the Death Knight. It didn't matter. Skull didn't care. Claymore screamed from Skull's hand. Brigada shined. Skull brought out not only the mana of greed but also other power. It was death. It was the power of Baphomet, the demon of slaughter and one of the twelve spirits of the house of Mammon. Lightning was added to death. The mighty power to tear even the wicked energy of the Death Knight was present in Skull's Claymore. The Death Knight also didn't back down. He rather smiled at Skull's power. A great warrior when he was alive, he laughed like crazy and frantically wielded Zweihander at Skull. The moment they were compressed against each other and the moment they stopped moving, the two warriors who returned from death looked at each other. They clashed violently. Embryo didn't look away. When the sun of the green flames hit the ground, he opened all of his five horns. It wasn't the time for him to hide his power fumblingly. The huge mana he released instantly became a barrier in itself. It easily blocked the waves of the green flames raining down in dozens of strands. Embryo saw the essence of the sun of the green flames. Despite death rising to overtake him from all sides, he analyzed it. It was strong. Even if that was the master's all power, his evaluation didn't change. Embryo erased everything from his mind that he had expected of the House of Mammon so far. And he closed his eyes. There were two red demons running around like crazy. They were also strong. Each of them could be compared to Ploros, the strongest in the Western Owners' Alliance. An undead monster, apparently from the House of Mammon, was confronting the Death Knight. It was a pretty tight fight between them. And this kind of fight was far beyond Emerbio's expectation. There were already three players comparable to Ploros. In addition, the master of the House of Mammon was much stronger than them. Were they all? Embryo opened his eyes. Once again he released powerful mana to put out the green flames around him. He saw two women as if they were dancing down from the sky. Kaiwan was gorgeous. She damaged the world with a whip sword that stretched to dozens of meters in length. The dark red mana that bloomed under her gray hair spread out in all directions. Catalina was sharp. She could be called as good as the blade of black mana. She landed on the ground, cutting through the air, and cut everything standing in the way by scattering blades of black mana in all directions. Then she cleaned the place where her king would stand. And there was one who landed on the ground between the two women. He was holding the spear of the red lotus, revealing his five horns without hesitation. He was still far away from embryo. There were more than a hundred troops in between. Embryo looked into Yongho's eyes. Yongho also didn't avoid his gaze. Embryo realized something. It wasn't how strong the master of the House of Mammon was or how he created his current power. What Embryo realized was what he had to do in the future. Right now at this moment, the fight here would determine the fate of the southern area. The eastern region was still intact, but in the end, it was only a stepping stone for his advance. The land where the greatest king of greed was born. Who would rise up again in the land? Who would succeed the genealogy of the great king? Embryo ordered the attack, and his command resonated in the sky. Mobilize whatever you can. Do your best in this fight because this is a fight worth fighting for. This time Yongho raised his head. Although he was facing Embryo, he looked at the sky instinctively. Catalina groaned. Kaiwan opened her mouth wide. What was coming down from the sky? Even at the moment when Yongho created the sun of the green flames, there was something watching the ground from a higher place. Huge wings covered the sky. Death came down. Crazy Oris fought with all his might. 
Embryo's army was almost twice that of the free city. Moreover, Boris's forces were inferior to them qualitatively, let alone quantitatively. Embryo's army boasted of their most fighting experiences in the southern blank. The bums in the free city also had lots of fighting experiences, but the nature of their fighting was different. A tight, dense formation by Embryo's army pressed the freewheeling formation of the free city troops. The bums in the free city who were not accustomed to this kind of fight eventually had to choose to survive rather than fight to kill their enemies. So, Oris came out to the forefront. It wasn't a situation in which he would command them in the rear. After all, Oris was tasked with keeping the enemy at bay. What he needed at this moment wasn't a cold-hearted commander, but a mad troll who would smash the enemy's bones in the front line. He smashed an orc's head with a stick. He killed the goblins rushing without fear by trampling on them. He then swallowed drugs, which maximized not only the troll's unique regenerative power but also strengthened all the functions of his body. Regardless of friendly or enemy forces, they were killed here and there. Oris looked everywhere with glittering eyes. Since the drug was working, Oris let out a breath roughly and shouted. Right at that moment, the sun of the green flames hit the ground. The intense shock lasted only for a moment, but it stopped all fighting. Orc warrior Kajamu's heavy infantry, who were beating the dungeon spirits of the house of Randolph Hard, looked toward their main unit blankly. So did Lotus, the king of wild animals, who was in the thick of slaughtering the free city troops. Oris laughed. He was in doubt when he heard it first, but now he could trust it sincerely. He was sure he could win the fight. But when he believed so, the sky opened. Something more intense than the sun of green flames made everybody look up at the sky. There was something he had never seen before. But everybody knew what it was. Oris stepped back. He was more than a few hundred meters from it, but he made eye contact with it. Staring at Oris himself, it spread its huge wings. No. Someone shouted. And that was it. Bone Dragon descended over the forces of the Free City. Although it was fooled by death, it breathed out the power of the Great King of One, called Dragon Breath. What was the strongest among the numerous races in the demon world? There were lots of disagreements about it. Given that there were big individual differences even among the same race in the demon world, such disagreements were taken for granted. However, whenever they mentioned it, they never failed to mention this race. Bone Dragon The descendants of the Great King of One, who had inherited the fantastic veins of water. Some called them the king of all wild beasts and birds. Others said their very existence was a miracle. They were strong. When fully grown, they were dozens of meters tall, and they were very tough. Their muscles were transcendent, and the scales were firm. Despite their large body and weight, they could freely roam the sky. Bone dragon's bones, teeth, and claws were compared to the hardest metal in the demon world. Aside from their mighty physical power, their inherent mana was also extraordinarily powerful. To talk about the average mana of each race, dragons were the best in the demon world. As if their skills were insufficient, the dragons also had various other skills. Some of them had superpowers compared to the power of the masters of houses. Some called them perfect beings. And the ultimate weapons they possessed. The primitive power inherited from that great king of one. Dragon breath or breath weapon, it was pouring down from the sky now. It was a lump of power embedded with terrible wicked energy. It was purple. Crazy Oris couldn't know more than that. He was crushed by its overwhelming power without defending himself or avoiding it. Like the sun of the green flames, the breath weapon exploded as soon as it hit the ground. The purple wicked energy covered dozens of meters in diameter and annihilated all that existed in it. A huge thing, which was dozens of meters long from head to feet, was floating in the air. That alone was amazing, but it really unleashed an overwhelming power. The battlefield froze. Embryo's army and the soldiers of the Free City looked at Bone Dragon, forgetting the fight. They instinctively covered themselves. And what happened immediately afterward astonished everyone again. Bone Dragon threw itself on the ground. Its descent, which could be called a free fall, was an attack in itself. The ground shook as if there was an earthquake. 
numerous soldiers were crushed by its giant body. Bone Dragon moved. Rotating its body roughly, it swept the ground with its tail. Dozens of soldiers again died in its simple attack. Bone Dragon roared then turned around, releasing a terrible wicked energy. Its dreadful eyes glared threateningly. It wasn't necessary to tell friendly forces from enemies in this situation. The soldiers of the free city couldn't move like a frog in front of a snake. Embryo's army was no exception. Even though Bone Dragon didn't do any harm, they were seized with fear instinctively. This is Bone Dragon. It's undead. So it's weak. Weaker than when it was alive. It doesn't have any special skills. So, don't be scared. Somebody spoke quickly. It was none other than Kai Wan. She was wary of Bone Dragon that she saw with stiff expression and embryo at the same time. She had a point. Bone Dragon was weaker than a living dragon. Bone Dragon, which could be called a sort of skeleton, lost many powerful weapons unique to the dragon. The scales harder than any armor were no longer present in it. In the process of falling as an undead, it lost most of its skills, and its cold-hearted intelligence turned into that of a beast. Nonetheless, it was still a dragon. Chapter, 140 Moreover, it didn't lose everything. It had a terribly wicked energy, and it regained something else because it rose again from death. Its defense ability was weakened, but its durability became stronger. It could continue to fight in the battle despite injuries that a living being couldn't endure, just like Skull. Hundreds of soldiers of the free city evaporated in an instant. It didn't take too long for the remaining troops to be completely destroyed. There was no time. Embryo was looking this way even at the moment the bone dragon's breath weapon hit the ground. Kaiwan. Yong Ho called. Kaiwan rolled her eyes at his somewhat tense voice. There was a bit of fear and a lot of pride to hide it in her ferocious eyes. Yong Ho said, It's my wish. Detain Embryo. Yong Ho spoke shortly, but what he meant was clear. After a brief pause, Kaiwan smiled bitterly. Although he stood in the midst of close to 1,000 enemies, facing the terrifying posture of Bone Dragon and Embryo, Yong Ho shouted proudly, Okay, if you do well, I'll grant you one more wish. And grant my wish, too. This wasn't the time for anybody to smile. But Kai Wan spoke cheerfully with an effort. Yong Ho also responded with a bitter smile, Don't you think you are using your right to grant wishes too often? Because it's worth it. She stopped saying anything further then stared at Embryo instead of Yong Ho. She wore a fierce smile befitting her ferocious gaze. Defense is my specialty. I'll stick it out. But come back to me quickly. Honestly, I think this is going to be rather tough for me. The moment she finished talking, the battlefield frozen by Bone Dragon Dragon began to move again. Bone Dragon spread its wings and hit the ground. Eligos and Ophelia resumed fighting. Shouts, screams, and cries filled the battlefield. Embryo moved forward. Fully opening her four horns, Kaiwan stepped forward. She showed her back, not her face, to Yongho. Yongho also turned around. Instead of watching Kaiwan, he hugged her waist, and Catalina understood what she was supposed to do. Catalina hugged him face to face and spread her wings of black mana. Their attack was simultaneous. Bone Dragon finally screamed and soared into the sky. By wielding the whip sword, Kaiwan recklessly slaughtered the enemy soldiers located between her and Embryo. Tigrius raised his head, and Eligos and Ophelia shared their intention through their eyes. They broke through Embryo's forces to move toward Kaiwan. Catalina flew. And the traces of red flames were added to the black traces in the sky. Flying over while burning the remnants of the flames, Salami carried Yong Ho and Catalina on its back again. Yong Ho looked down at the ground for the last time. Skull and Death Knight were fighting against each other. Eligos and Ophelia almost reached Kaiwan. Kaiwan attacked Embryo and his soldiers recklessly as if to attract their attention deliberately. Embryo didn't counterattack Kaiwan. He stepped forward and stopped. He looked at Yong Ho. Embryo's eyes were cold. And Yong Ho knew it. 
Although he didn't know why, Yong Ho realized that Embryo also took an adventure. Despite the fact that he was in a very favorable situation, Embryo exerted all his powers. Yong Ho was right. For Embryo, Bone Dragon was a secret weapon that he didn't want to use until the last moment. Embryo already revealed the Death Knight. If Bone Dragon was added to this, it would definitely attract others' attention too much. Perhaps, some among the kings might feel suspicious about Embryo's tactics. The Death Knight and Bone Dragon were too powerful for a housemaster in the southern area to own. Nevertheless, Embryo revealed Bone Dragon. He knew from his sense, sharpened through numerous battles, that he did the right thing. He couldn't afford to hide it now, for he knew that this was a fight in which he had to kill Yong Ho by mounting a massive attack from the beginning. Embryo and Yong Ho turned away from each other. Grabbing the handle on Salami's back, Yong Ho clenched his teeth. He released mana as if not to be outpowered by Bone Dragon's massive body that blocked his vision. Embryo took another step and stared at Kai Wan, now attacking him magnificently like a mantis in front of a wagon. He combined the mana released at random for a proper combat posture. Bone Dragon roared. Facing its dreadful roaring right before its eyes, Salami screamed grotesquely. Salami spread the wings of the flames wide and soared higher into the sky. Yong Ho thought that he could not hope for Kai Wan's support when she was in an overwhelmingly unfavorable situation like now. So, he had to defeat Bone Dragon by joining hands with Catalina alone. Salami twisted its body with a wild scream. Despite its huge wings, Bone Dragon was fast. Bone Dragon's molars penetrated the space where Salami stayed until a moment ago. The sound of its teeth meshing each other was already horrible. But Yong Ho couldn't afford to be distracted by it. So, he ordered, and Salami flew again, screaming. Rather than increasing its distance with Bone Dragon, Salami got rather closer to it then penetrated into its neck. At that moment, the blade of black mana created by Catalina with all her might hit Bone Dragon's neck. But that was it. Her attack left a small scratch on its bone, but it was not broken. Despite the attack, Bone Dragon kept its place. Rather, Catalina was almost thrown out by Bone Dragon's repulsive force. In the meantime, Yong Ho concentrated his consciousness and checked the mana flowing in the body of Bone Dragon. It was a huge flame. Crimson flames of mana covered the entire body of Bone Dragon. The flames were so strong that he couldn't spot any weaknesses. Bang! Bone Dragon once again bit the air. This time, it didn't stop there and released mana. Although it lost mana after becoming an undead, Bone Dragon didn't lose the operational skills on mana. Several lumps of mana condensed in a circle raced toward Yongho. Salami. Ka. Giving out a screech, Salami spread its wings. In a desperate aerobatic flight, it changed its direction in the air then flew toward Bone Dragon's back once again. Yong Ho swung Amun and poured the green flames on the back of Bone Dragon. Bone Dragon roared. The unique energy of death of the undead was added to one of Bone Dragon's innate abilities, the Dragon Peer. It was a terrifying force that deprived the will of life, like the energy of death that Baphomet released. Although Catalina hastily combined the black mana to create a huge shield, it wasn't a physical attack on Bone Dragon. Salami, exposed to the energy of death, momentarily lost consciousness. Yong Ho endured it by clenching his teeth and ordered Catalina in heart. He swung Amun once again and burned anything around Bone Dragon to disturb its vision. Catalina lowered her posture while falling down. She buried himself on Yong Ho's back and put her arms on Salami's back. After releasing black mana and binding her around Salami's body, she spread huge wings behind its back. Cook! Screaming strangely, Catalina barely flapped her wings and flew again before crashing down on the ground. There was a big explosion again. Moreover, the ground exploded this time. The explosion occurred because Bone Dragon, with its vision blocked by the waves of the green flames, fired dragon breath recklessly toward the ground. The energy of death spread in all directions. Some of Embryo's soldiers disappeared along with the ground. Salami finally regained consciousness and flapped its wings again. Catalina breathed out roughly and withdrew the wings of black mana. 
they couldn't fight this way any longer. Basically, it exhausted Yong Ho and his dungeon spirits. So, he needed something else to deal a fatal blow to Embryo. Salami! shouted Yong Ho. At that moment, Salami repressed the desire to run away once more. At the command of its master, it concentrated all the power on the wings of the flames. Forgetting even Bone Dragon, Salami soared into the sky. Bone Dragon and Salami crossed each other. In that short moment, Yong Ho saw Bone Dragon once again. The mana of death flared up like flames. The mana of death. The energy of death. Yong Ho realized. He encouraged Salami even more. While rising almost vertically, he grabbed Amun. He concentrated mana on the magic field on his left hand. Bone Dragon was definitely strong. Its physical strength was superior to Baphomet's. However, it was different when it came to the energy of death. Unlike Baphomet, the incarnation of death that descended in the alien world, Bone Dragon was just an undead. Its physical force was incredible thanks to its powerful mana, it was essentially inferior to Baphomet. So, Yong Ho thought he could defeat Bone Dragon and he had to. The Red Demonic Sky Salami rotated in a place high enough to make everything on the ground seem so small. It turned its head to the ground and stared at Bone Dragon located hundreds of meters below. Ka! The wings of flames flared up in the air. Salami descended vertically. Yong Ho put Amun on his side. Yong Ho and Catalina shined brightly at the same time, and a tremendous black mana covered the magic spear of the Red Lotus. It really created a huge spear. Lance charging was pouring vertically. Bone Dragon saw it. As soon as Salami turned in the air and opened its mouth, Bone Dragon opened its mouth and let out Dragon Breath. It was different from before. It wasn't a single shot. Like the breath of flames of red dragons, the energy of death continued to come out. But Salami didn't avoid it. It accelerated its speed by screaming wildly. The huge spear made of black mana and breath weapon clashed in the air. And at that moment, Yongho's magic field as well as the godly energy of the King of Greed sent out blue watery light. The force of life. The power of the immortal which Scathack covered the spear of black mana. The life-empowered huge spear penetrated the breath weapon full of the energy of death from the front. It was a collision of tremendous power. The tip of the spear was shaken randomly. The breath weapon was shaken by the power of life, which could be called its complete opposite. But it was not strong enough. It couldn't penetrate the breath weapon. Rather than trampling on the energy of death, the energy of life gradually began to be eaten away. Scathack once told Yong Ho that he needed to pay the corresponding price to bring out his godly energy. Yong Ho could do it when he fought Baphomet. The power of his intense greed was so huge that even the magic spear of the Red Lotus admired it. But he didn't now. His mana was insufficient. He couldn't bring out the force of life from his godly energy. But he clenched his teeth and exerted all his power to bring out mana. If he were pushed out for a moment, he would perish here. Rather than penetrating the breath weapon, he would be crushed by the energy of death. He needed to be greedy now, so he could bring out the mana of greed. He had to pump up the will to live. Can he do it? I like you. Chapter, 141 At that moment, Catalina shouted behind his back. Despite the fact that he was on the verge of life and death, Yong Ho blinked before he knew it. Catalina hugged his back tightly. It wasn't just because she witnessed his fight with Baphomet. She thought if she didn't do it now, she could never do it. Burying her head again, she shouted again, I really like you. Her feelings were conveyed to him through Brigada. It was a more intense and pure expression of her affection for him than any of her words. Yongho's face turned red. Salami screamed about her confession amid the fighting, but she didn't care. Yong Ho now felt Catalina's thoughts and feelings. He felt as if his heart was bursting. His will to live was overflowing now. Desire. Amun's voice reached him, and he also shouted at Amun. He desired while being grateful to his simple-mindedness. He desired and desired. I'll survive. I'll surely survive. 
let me win by all means. Ooh. The mana of greed exploded. He brought Skathak's life from his godly energy. He finally penetrated the link to Skathak, which he couldn't because of insufficient power. It seemed that he could hear her voice, who must be in the labyrinth of greed. Life overwhelmed death. It didn't stop offsetting it but destroyed it. Despite Bone Dragon's enormous mana, the breath weapon collapsed. Salami spread its wings of flames and sped up again. Catalina hugged Yongho's waist even tighter. Amon roared. A fatal blow. Lance charging penetrated the breath weapon. Without slowing down the momentum, Amon penetrated into Bone Dragon's mouth. The vortex of life from the huge spear tore death. And it finally reached the center of Bone Dragon, where there must be Bone Dragon's heart, a mass of powerful mana when it was alive. Greed shouted. The greed arising from Yongho's whole body was exactly divided in two. One wrapped up Catalina, and the other wrapped around the center of mana. The spear made of black mana was dismantled. The watery blue energy of life exploded and opened the way again. What was left now was the green flames of pure greed. Greed led the way. Even at the moment when he penetrated Bone Dragon like an arrow, Yongho cut through the center of mana with Amun. What happened next was Salami's forceful advance. Finally, Salami penetrated through Bone Dragon. Catalina looked behind her back, blushing. She witnessed Bone Dragon shattering in the air. Yongho didn't hesitate. He ignored the common sense of the demon world that the living shouldn't absorb the essence of the undead contaminated with the energy of death. Greed, it was one of the seven deadly sins. The green flames swallowed the essence of Bone Dragon and its power. Yongho also couldn't help but look at the spectacular scene. The red breath weapon shattered in the sky. The huge spear engulfed in the green flames penetrated Bone Dragon. The explosion that shook the sky, and the loudness and splendor that reminded one of thunder and lightning. Salami left the traces of flames in the sky. It slipped out of the bones of Bone Dragon and drew a new trajectory once again. The bones of Bone Dragon poured down from the sky because the power of death that made Bone Dragon exist as an undead was destroyed by Skathaka's force of life. Those who watched Bone Dragon's fighting, shouting with joy, were so embarrassed. They were so shocked to watch the huge dozen meters long being shattered into pieces. Embryo was as embarrassed and shocked as them. Grabbing Kaiwan's neck. Embryo raised his head before he knew it. He couldn't take his eyes off the sky even though he could break her neck with a little more push. Kaiwan smiled slightly. She was covered with wounds. When Yongho was engaged in a fierce battle with Bone Dragon in the air, another fight was going on intensely on the ground. Despite the fact that her specialty was defense like she said, she was thoroughly abused by Embryo. Embryo had something similar to Yongho, but he was different. His pressing down on Kaiwan with overwhelming mana was the same as Yongho, but he was different in terms of its delicacy and sophistication. It was literally impossible to do something about Embryo. He read not only Kaiwan's attack but also her every move. He read even the power of distortion early on and dealt with it. Blood flowed from her lips. She was hit only twice, but the blow was big. Her right shoulder was smashed, so she couldn't move, and the color of her abdomen exposed to his attack terribly changed. She quickly reduced the shock with the power of distortion, but her internal organs were messed up with a little shock. However, Kaiwan didn't lose her fighting spirit. She still had her left arm and two legs, so she could fight as much as she could. I'm different from you she barely said with her neck held by Embryo. Embryo, who was chasing the traces of the red wings, rolled his eyes at her feeble voice. Even though her eyes were half-closed, she still looked at Embryo ferociously. Their fighting lasted only shortly, but Kaiwan already sized him up. Embryo's mana was familiar to Kaiwan himself. We have the blood of the great house of Mammon flowing through our body, but that's it. Mammon's blood was flowing in Embryo's body. Nobody knew the reason. Over a thousand years was never a short time even in the demon world. Maybe Embryo was a remote relative of Mammon, or he might not know he shared the blood of the house of Mammon. Embryo's eyes were cold. However, 
Kaiwan didn't miss the agitation hidden in his cold eyes. Kaiwan didn't know how the fight would end up. That was why she had to raise the odds of Yongho's chance of winning a little more. Kaiwan was thinking of infuriating embryo. So, she made a terrible smile. She never showed it before Yongho, but she now showed the most ferocious smile at embryo, which she used to show at those who insulted and despised the House of Mammon. Her smile contained sarcasm on her viper-like lips. Kneel down and respect and welcome the King of Greed. From Kaiwan's point of view, she didn't expect much when she said that. She just wanted to keep insulting him to break his composure. Contrary to her intention, her words got on his nerves from the beginning. Embryo's eyes trembled. He couldn't hide his agitation anymore. Even at that moment, Embryo looked back at the sky. It was his instinctive movement. Not only Embryo, but everyone on the battlefield did so. Bone Dragon was no longer in the sky. The traces of the flames that Salami's wings left behind were beautiful, but they weren't strong enough to draw attention from everyone on the battlefield. Nonetheless, everyone looked at the sky. Those who were sensitive to mana felt more pressure. Embryo opened his lips. Kaiwan smiled slightly. Bone Dragon's mana wasn't scattered. Its essence that the living couldn't even absorb because it was contaminated with the energy of death burned in the green flames, which looked too small. The master of the House of Mammon, the Demon King of Flames, swallowed the essence of Bone Dragon. It was stupid. It was like swallowing poison. But the master didn't collapse. There was no painful scream from him. The release of a huge mana. A vortex of intense mana that shook the surrounding area. The sin of greed embryo said, as if he sighed. At that moment, Kaiwan wrapped the power of distortion around her neck and bounced off embryo's hand. Kaiwan fell down to the floor. Embryo quickly turned his head. Instead of praising their king, Eligos and Ophelia kicked off the ground again, feeling their mana growing. And the sun of the green flames rose again. Yong Ho, who drastically shortened the time required for concentrating mana by almost fully releasing the absorbed essence of Bone Dragon, looked down on the ground. Five towering horns on his head shook. Salami headed back to the ground with its wings of flames. Embryo's army had experienced this kind of stuff before. So, they were agitated. They tried to run away with a screech. Kaiwan smiled. Embryo knew he couldn't even use her as a shield against Yongho. Surprisingly, the green flames of the master of the House of Mammon could distinguish between friendly forces and enemies. Therefore, Embryo decided to face the disaster proudly. He erected five horns and released mana. He also activated his power. Yongho swung Amon. The son of the green flames hit the ground once again. It destroyed Embryo's main unit and once again recreated the map of hell on the ground. Yongho closed his eyes for a moment. He felt the mana transmitted through Brigada. He briefly found out the condition of his dungeon spirits engaged in the intense fighting. Skull was still fighting the Death Knight with all its might. Eligos and Ophelia smashed Embryo's main unit amid the green flames. Commanding Skull's unit instead of Skull, Tigrius destroyed Embryo's forces in the right wing. Yongho opened his eyes again. Catalina let go of her hands around his waist. She knew what she had to do. She couldn't intervene in his fight with Embryo. What she had to do now was to save more soldiers of the Free City fighting under Oris's command. Standing on Salami's back, Yongho looked at Catalina. She laughed vigorously, flapping her red hot ears. Yongho kicked Salami in the back. Catalina also flew spreading her wings of black mana. The two flew in different directions. Embryo. Shouting at him, Yongho landed on the ground. The green flames flaring up all over the place were split automatically, making way for Yongho. And the green flames exploded not far from Embryo. Powerful mana crushed the green flames. But Yongho focused on his consciousness. He read Embryo's mana in the air. He wasn't just content with seeing it. He predicted its trajectory. Amon clashed with an unknown huge spear. Yongho and Embryo looked at each other beyond their weapons. Each other's mana clashed in the air and exploded. Chapter 
142. The two pushed each other away. They distanced themselves from each other as soon as they clashed, and they took the same tactics almost simultaneously. It was to increase the intensity of their mana in the surrounding area. Yong Ho and Embryo realized it instinctively. They could read the flow of each other's mana, so they increased the concentration of mana to delay the other party reading the trajectory of the attack with the help of the flow of mana. Embryo stepped forward. But at that moment, someone intervened in the battle between the two demon kings. With a thunderous screech, Eligos punched Embryo like lightning. It was a perfect surprise attack. Yong Ho and Embryo were so conscious of each other that they couldn't pay attention to others. Embryo quickly twisted his upper body, but Eligos punched Embryo's left arm immediately. Even with that attack alone, his left arm was torn out. Eligos smiled. Embryo's left arm, which had been torn off, was fluttering in the air. Then Eligos broke the floor with his fist. Then Embryo stepped forward and threw a punch in Eligos's chest with his left arm. Then he came up with the penetration strike to put all his mana into the opponent's body. With a thunderous noise, Eligos's massive body rose slightly upward. Soon he collapsed, gushing blood. Embryo shook his upper body just like he did when he confronted Eligos. Ophelia rushed toward Embryo and attacked Embryo's thigh hard with a turning kick. Her sharp kick cut his left leg like a beast's teeth. But Embryo moved ahead again. Stepping on the ground with his left foot, Embryo stretched out his arms then he mounted a penetration strike into Ophelia's abdomen, who stopped momentarily because of embarrassment. Yong Ho stepped forward strongly. As if he was doing lance charging, he charged at Embryo, pointing Amun upright. Ophelia collapsed, throwing out blood and pieces of intestines. In terrible pain, she understood what Embryo's real power was. She kept thinking, hoping that Yong Ho would also discover it. The Demon King of Wolves, it was just his nickname. It wasn't the name Embryo had as a true Demon King. Embryo's real power was regeneration. It was his super speed ability to regenerate, which was fast and strong enough to recall immortality. It wasn't because Embryo avoided Yong Ho's attack that he twisted his body after releasing that power. In fact, the purpose of his action was to minimize the shaking of his body in the aftermath of Eligos and Ophelia's attack. In other words, he immediately penetrated into the opponent's body for a counterattack right after being attacked. He did the same this time. That was why Embryo confronted Yong Ho's attack from the front. Yong Ho stabbed into the air, not Embryo. It caused a strong wave of the green flames and engulfed Embryo. Ophelia's intention was passed on to Yong Ho, so he was convinced of what he saw. Embryo's ability to regenerate was real, not tricky. Supahaha. Embryo jumped over the waves of the green flames. Although he was wounded by the heat of the ultra-high temperature, he didn't care. By the time he passed through the flames, his wounds already regenerated. Thanks to the powerful magic field around his body, he had no fatal injuries. The huge spear in Embryo's right hand stabbed into the air. His action was completely different from it when he fought Kaiwan. All his movements were optimized only for his attack. It was an extreme move that neglected his own defense. He was faster and more powerful. Yong Ho, who managed to get out of it by kicking the ground, grabbed Amun. Then he stretched out Amun toward Embryo, who was advancing again to get him. But Embryo didn't avoid the attack. Rather he didn't defend it. Amun pierced Embryo's abdomen. Embryo groaned in pain, but he didn't collapse. Rather he took a step forward. Yong Ho quickly released Amun from his hand. But it was already late. Likewise, Embryo's right palm, who abandoned the huge spear, touched him. It was the so-called penetration strike. Embryo's mighty mana began to spread with terrifying momentum. Yong Ho bounced off randomly. It was no exaggeration to say that he was thrown out almost a dozen meters or more. This was something abnormal that he never expected. Embryo's penetration strike was a skill to destroy the opponent by pouring mana into his body. It was far from a technique to push the enemy out. Yong Ho rolled on the floor. Clenching his teeth, Embryo pulled out Amun from his abdomen. His penetration strike failed. 
It was true that he touched Yong Ho for the penetration strike and released all his mana, but that was it. Putting up with pain, Yong Ho raised himself up. His tattered left arm, covered with wounds, drooped. The moment Embryo turned to the penetration strike, Yong Ho moved his left hand. It was impossible for Yong Ho to clearly pinpoint Embryo's target, so it was almost a miracle that he could avoid it. Fortunately, Embryo's attack was straight and linear. Embryo touched Yong Ho's left hand. At that moment, Yong Ho activated the Ring of Distortion and blocked his penetration strike with the Shield of Distortion. The reason why Yong Ho bounced back was because the penetration strike couldn't get into his body and only bounced off the Shield of Distortion. But Yong Ho's defense was incomplete. Above all, he activated the Shield of Distortion too quickly. Although he managed to block the mana of the penetration strike, he could not block it completely. Even though he was exposed to just a little bit of Embryo's mana, his left arm was in tatters. Probably, he couldn't use his left arm during this battle. On the other hand, Embryo was still well and strong. Although his whole body was burned by the flames of the Red Lotus while he was separating Amun from his hand, Embryo wasn't wounded. As soon as he pulled Amun out, he recovered his body in an instant, as if he was going against time. Yong Ho stared at Embryo and thought about his power. If his regeneration ability was his real power, he would never be truly immortal. Mana. Only now could Yong Ho realize what it was. Embryo increased the concentration of mana that he was releasing around him, but he couldn't hide the flow of mana completely. His mana was being consumed for regeneration. That meant that there was clearly a limit to his regeneration ability, as well. What should Yong Ho do now? Should he keep attacking Embryo until his mana run out? But Embryo didn't let Yong Ho buy time. Yong Ho concentrated his consciousness. Instead of reading his mana, Yong Ho tried to read Embryo's movements. He felt a sharp pain in his left arm again but tried his best to put up with it. Embryo's right hand stabbed into the air. Embryo's weapon wasn't just the penetration strike. He had powerful mana based on the five horns, a stocky body, and superhuman patience and will to endure even the pain of his whole body being burned. Yong Ho barely managed to avoid Embryo's right hand. However, his action was a trick to make Yong Ho avoid it. Embryo's real attack came from his left hand. And Yong Ho also saw it. Embryo wasn't the only one who set the trap. Yong Ho grabbed the air. Then the flames of the red lotus arose. Amun, which Embryo had thrown on the floor, rose from Yong Ho's right hand. Embryo couldn't respond properly to Amun's sudden appearance. He couldn't even use the secret weapon he had prepared for this battle when he was dealt a strong blow by Yong Ho. Amun again pierced Embryo's abdomen. Yong Ho held his breath. Instead of screaming, he poured magic into Amun. The violent green flames arose roughly, burning Embryo's body from the inside. But Yong Ho didn't stop. He saw Embryo regenerating his body and collapsing amid the green flames. Embryo was gathering mana. Even in terrible pain, he raised his arm and grabbed Amun, which showed truly his astonishing will. Embryo stared at Yong Ho while suffering from pain beyond imagination. Not content with grabbing Amun, he took steps to narrow the distance with Yong Ho. Then Yong Ho once again poured out mana. Embryo's body burned again. Thanks to the enormous power of mana, Yong Ho could notice Embryo's bare bones. And Embryo took it as an opportunity. He delayed recovering his abdomen, so he could get out of Amun. Even amid the pain of his hair turning white because of the intense heat, Embryo finally created a moment of counterattack. Yong Ho saw Embryo, so did Embryo. At that moment, Embryo's right arm was bitten by something. It was Kaiwan's whip sword that snatched it like a viper. Ah! Kaiwan let out a screech. Then she pulled Embryo's whole body with her left arm. Just like she did to Yong Ho on the tenth floor, she struck Embryo on the floor by swinging her whip sword violently. She held him only for a moment. She couldn't hold him for long because her injuries were so severe that she found her left arm already losing strength. But that was enough. Time was made. Embryo regained freedom from Kaiwan by cutting off his right arm wrapped in the whip sword. Instead of attacking Kaiwan, who fell, exhausted and bloody, 
he grabbed the magic spear he created with mana. Then he ran into Yong Ho again. Yong Ho confronted him now. Appreciating Kai Wan's help, he rushed toward Embryo. During the time Kai Wan created, Yong Ho kept pondering over how to defeat Embryo. Yong Ho and Embryo clashed. Embryo aimed at Yong Ho's immovable left arm. Yong Ho also stabbed him with Amon this time. Both attacked each other without thinking about their own defense. They crossed each other. Embryo was a little faster in attacking. He pierced Yong Ho's left shoulder with the magic spear. But it lasted only a moment. Yong Ho didn't stop. Enduring the pain, he stretched out his right arm. He stabbed Embryo's chest with the magic spear of the Red Lotus, Amon, and created the green flames of greed. They repeated the same attacks several times. Embryo activated the power of regeneration and at the same time focused on the magic spear. He wanted to release mana through the tip of the spear. But he did it differently now. Chapter 143 Embryo, who was trying to heal his wounds by using his power, felt his power disintegrating. Death. A dark purple light flashed from the magic field in Yong Ho's left arm. The terrible power of death ate away Embryo's power. It was also excessive for Yong Ho. Skat Hakka's life and Baphomet's death were different. The mana of death, raging insanely, pushed its blade into not only Embryo but also Yong Ho. Moreover, Embryo didn't give up before the mana of death. He turned all the mana he was trying to exhale to Yong Ho toward Amun. He resisted the mana of death while empowering the power of regeneration that was constantly diminishing. Embryo showed a truly thrillsome will, but Yong Ho didn't care. The driving force of Embryo's strong will wasn't important to him. What really mattered was that he had to destroy Embryo at this moment. Embryo's mana clashed against Yong Ho's mana violently. This type of fight was new to Yong Ho. It could be called a showdown between the two men's pure mana. Embryo was a little stronger when it came to mana itself. Because of the energy of death, Yong Ho didn't fully absorb the bone dragon's mana. Moreover, he used too much mana when he released the force of life. Yong Ho drew mana from Brigada and didn't stop there. He hoped more than that to destroy Embryo. Yong Ho took the power of mana greedily. The power of combination magic, Dungeon Spirit Tigrius's power as the master of the house, although the power of his soul was weakened, he still had it. Greed brought it out. Yong Ho screamed in extreme pain as if his head was breaking. He added a new light to the magic field emitting purple light. Skat Hakka's life was back in strong motion. To bring it out, Yong Ho consumed not only his mana but also his own force of life. He triggered the power of combination while staring at Embryo, astonished by his new power. It was a mess. It was the power of combination that he couldn't properly control in the first place. But that was enough. Skat Hakka's life and Baphomet's death didn't cancel out. The two different forces repelled each other strongly and finally exploded. Death swallowed up Embryo's power. The explosion caused by the opposite power of the two blew away Embryo's magic. Embryo screamed. Yong Ho roared once again. The green flames of greed surged from Amun, the magic spear of the Red Lotus. Yong Ho's knees were broken helplessly. He couldn't hold up anymore and flopped down. He was breathing roughly. He felt like his heart was bursting. And his hand holding Amun trembled violently. His mana ran out. He could no longer endure the pain. If he could, he wanted to collapse and faint right away. However, he once again clenched his teeth and looked straight ahead. Embryo was down. With his whole body covered in blood, Yong Ho didn't know how he was wounded. Unlike Yong Ho himself, Embryo still had mana. But Embryo didn't activate the power of regeneration. He barely breathed out occasionally. Yong Ho felt that Catalina was running toward him. Salami, which dared not to intervene in the fierce battle, flew down and landed on the ground to protect its defenseless master. Yong Ho caught his breath. He raised his upper body while falling forward and clenched his teeth. Although he took the bone dragon's mana too quickly, it was definitely a driving force for his growth. Moreover, his evolution EXP had maxed out thanks to this fight. So, he had to stand up. 
he shouldn't lose consciousness yet. He had to share Catalina's mana to activate the power of evolution. There were still the remnants of Embryo's troops in the house of Randolt and in the rear. The fight between Skull and the Death Knight was also not over. Yong Ho stood up. He stumbled, but he finally stepped forward. Watching him, Embryo's hands trembled. The two faced each other again. Salami stood by Yong Ho's side. Catalina's black mana was gradually transferred to Yong Ho through Brigada. And at that moment, Embryo sprang to his feet. He passed by Yong Ho, who flinched because he couldn't react instantly. Then Embryo poured all his remaining mana into the ground. Yong Ho flopped down again. Salami stood between the two. Embryo's last attack didn't miss. The black demon watcher, who was leaning out of the ground halfway, was killed when his heart burst. It was because Embryo activated the secret magic from the day he encountered the watcher. Yong Ho couldn't understand the situation. But he realized it instinctively. Instead of attacking himself with the remaining mana, Embryo attacked the demon soaring from the ground. Embryo, who fell on the watcher's body, closed his eyes. He couldn't see any more. Now his mana ran out completely. He had no sign of recovering. Embryo smiled faintly then squeezed his voice and said, King of Greed you're back. Actually, Embryo had been longing for his return throughout his life. He didn't want to tell his story in detail nor did he want to persuade the King of Greed to understand him. He continued, Hide your greed beware of the King of Gluttony. The Watcher was killed. But nobody knew there might be another Watcher. Even if it wasn't true, the King of Gluttony would soon infer the situation. Embryo's hearing, as well as sight, were paralyzed. Even his pain became dull. He didn't question his own action. Maybe he projected his wishes and unfulfilled dreams onto the new King of Greed. King of Greed, Embryo said for the last time. With a faint smile, he died. Embryo's army scattered in all directions and fled. Rykam, who fought fiercely in the dungeon of the House of Randolt, didn't know the situation of the battle. He simply flopped down on the floor, content with the fact that the battle was over. Tigrius, who not only helped Skull fight the Death Knight but also Embryo's troops in the right wing, was also exhausted. He was pretty much exhausted, but the old gentleman didn't flop down. He rode his horse to command the surviving Free City troops. Skull's armor was shattered again. Claymore was also so badly damaged that Skull could never use it again. However, Skull grabbed the half-broken Death Knight's skull with his hand. Only after getting to Yong Ho, it rolled on the floor. As if to reassure him, Skull said in a dying voice even though it was already dead, Skull Skull. Eligos fainted. Ophelia, leaning over Eligos, gave a grunt of pain. Since both of them were strong red demons, they could survive. Otherwise, they would have lost their lives by Embryo's penetration strike. Catalina, who transferred all her mana to Yong Ho, drooped on Salami's back. And she was satisfied with the current situation. She hasn't heard Yong Ho's answer to her confession, but she felt happy that she confessed and that he survived. What a mess. Squatting on the floor, Kaiwan spoke. She stretched her legs, leaning against some monster, not knowing whether it was an orc or not. She looked terrible, but at the same time, she looked pretty comfortable. Yong Ho squatted in front of Kai Wan. Thanks to Catalina sharing mana with him, he could barely move around. If he used mana again, it was certain that he would lose his strength completely, so he put off using the power of evolution later. He also decided to think about Embryo's last words and actions later. Thanks, Kai Wan. His short compliment contained his genuine and deep appreciation. He really thanked Kai Wan. Without her help, it would have been Embryo, not him, who was here. You're welcome. I had a very pleasant vacation thanks to you. I feel like I'm alive after a long time, she replied with a bright smile. He felt it before, but her smile was really charming. Moreover, the fact that she made such a smile at him alone was even more revealing. Alien mana was circulating around Kaiwan's body. It was none other than Gyuzhin's mana, not anyone else's. I think I used too much mana. I'm sorry, but I need to return early. I think if I don't go now, 
I might die soon. Let me go and get some treatment. Kaiwan was a dungeon spirit in the arena. Until the new owner of the arena appeared, the fate of her life and death was left with the arena. Yong Ho nodded. Next time, I'll get you discharged from there, not just vacation. Let's eat a lot of delicious things again. That's great. I look forward to it. Kaiwan leaned down. Gyujin's mana grew stronger and stronger. Yong Ho Chun. Kaiwan called him again. She seemed to hesitate for a moment then rolled her eyes and said, It's my wish. Don't move and stay still. Don't even answer. At that moment, Catalina pricked her ears. Salami felt something ominous. Yong Ho remained still as she requested, and she moved his body with a grunt. She wrapped his face with both hands and gently kissed his lips. Her kiss was short but very intense. It was different from when he kissed Ophelia. Hee <laughs> hee. Kaiwan laughed in a silly manner, which didn't fit her at all. After touching his cheek, who hardened like a stone statue, she winked at Catalina, who was shocked in fear. She winked at Catalina again and said with a smile, See you later. Gushin's mana enveloped Kaiwan and disappeared with her. Salami shook its head as if it shouldn't have seen them. Catalina was drooping on Salami's back just like wet laundry. She was about to cry now. Watching them all, Skull laughed heartily. Then it shouted once again for Yong Ho, who was overcome with deep emotions at the victory. The battle was over. It was a victory for the House of Mammon. Chapter 144 The southern and northern parts of the demon world were hugely different, like night and day. Unlike the southern area called an abandoned land, the northern part always played an important role in the history of demons. First, the land there was fertile. Even without special magical measures, they could do farming without any problem. There were rich underground resources, and transportation of goods on sea routes was brisk thanks to the three rivers that led to the deep sea, one of the three major seas of the demon world. However, it wasn't because of this alone that the northern part was called the blessed land. That was not the most important reason. There was a powerful flow of mana in the north. Since it was more powerful than any other area of the demon world, some even called it the Great Flow. Perhaps, thanks to the powerful flow of mana, those in the north were often superior to those in other regions within the same race. It was because some were born with more mana than others. Those in the north were strong. They lived longer, and even their reproduction rate was faster than that of those in other areas. And there was one family that had dominated the northern part for a long time. That family was very special. Even in the long history of the demon world, there was no other family that could pair with that family. Originally, the seven deadly sins couldn't be inherited from generation to generation. Regardless of the current kings but also the previous ones, it was common that the house of the seven deadly sins changed with the emergence of a new king. But this family was an exception. Since the seven deadly sins emerged, this family had never lost the title as the sin of pride until now. The master of this house always reigned in the north as the king of pride of the day. Even before the great king of greed emerged thousands of years ago, his ancestors were the king of pride. Even now, more than a thousand years later, they maintained that privilege. The dungeon of the king of pride was the oldest dungeon in the demon world. The weight of the accumulated years surpassed the labyrinth of greed. All those born and raised in the north grew up, watching the dungeon of the king of pride. The king of pride was someone who reigned over the people. The first king of pride thought that looking down on the earth from the sky befitted him. Therefore, his dungeon was not built underground. Built on the ground, the dungeon stretched toward the sky. The tower of pride was the tallest skyscraper in the demon world. At that time, the king of pride was on the top floor of the skyscraper. In his place while facing the sky, he thought about the worldly affairs. He was young. Over a hundred years had passed since he took over as the king, but since he was born with such a powerful manna, he had no sign of aging. He was tall and his eyes were confident. He had gray hair and a strong build, with three eyes on his forehead. Wearing a pitch black cloak adorned with black bird feathers, he grinned on the throne made of dozens of wings. He looked at the pieces on the chessboard again. 
The King of Fury was demonstrating force beyond the sea. But he didn't care. The King of Fury was the weakest of the six kings, contrary to popular rumors. That ridiculous peace seeker wouldn't dare cross the sea. Like it or not, the King of Violence was a dragon. He was the guardian of the treasure. He usually crouched in his own nest, and he didn't bother to provoke a war first. The rest of the kings were like him. So, the King of Pride was convinced they wouldn't make the provocations. It was too long. A false peace under the name of balance was no longer needed. Now, he needed destruction for a new beginning. The King of Pride made up his mind. He exercised psychokinesis to move the pieces of the chessboard. It wasn't just the pieces that moved at that moment. The troops in the north crossed the border. He started a war. Yong Ho's battle with Embryo was over. But it didn't mean the war was over. There were lots of things Yong Ho had to take care of everywhere. The immediate problem was how to handle the remnants of Embryo's army. Almost all those soldiers under Embryo's command survived and left the battlefield. The troops of the House of Mammon didn't even dare to chase them. Although they won, the damage was too great. Oris was killed, and more than two-thirds of the troops of the Free City, who followed Oris, were also killed with only two hundred surviving. Most of the Free City soldiers complained of extreme stress and fatigue. Therefore, it was impossible to have them pursue their enemies. Embryo's soldiers dispersed in all directions. Most of them fled to the west, but there were quite a few who ran away deep into the south. Of course, nobody thought they would capture the dungeon of the House of Mammon or occupy the Free City. However, their existence itself was a headache for the South. It was necessary to subdue them sooner or later by defeating them or absorbing them into the South. Even Lotus, the demon king of wild animals, who accompanied Embryo on this battle, also survived and escaped. It was okay if he ran to the West or North, but if he penetrated into the South, it was a different issue. Lotus was the master of a house with power. He was far from an ordinary remnant. The northern and eastern regions were also troublesome. In the north, there were several house masters who had surrendered to Embryo. Since they had been waiting in the north to stop the provocations by the east, it was difficult to judge how they would act after Embryo's defeat. Currently, the biggest source of trouble was those in the east. They initially tried to fish in troubled water while Embryo was fighting with the House of Mammon. Now that Embryo was gone, it would be nothing strange if they attacked the South instead of the North. Of course, it was more likely that they would march into the ownerless North instead of attacking the South. This was the bigger problem in a sense. The immediate problems were more annoying and challenging. For example, problems such as the reorganization of the House of Randold, collection of the Bone Dragon's bones, the return to the House of Mammon, calming down the popular uneasiness in the Free City, and the restoration of dungeon spirits. Out of these headaches, the last one made it even more difficult for Yong Ho to handle things efficiently. Basically, he was short-handed for lots of work. Half a day passed after the battle with Embryo was over. Yong Ho was perching on the bed of the Demon King's room in the deepest part of the House of Randolt. His outside wounds were healed thanks to another evolution through furthering physical strength, but that was it. His whole body ached. But he couldn't fall asleep easily. It wasn't just cosmetic problems that the House of Mammon faced today. What was the demon that Embryo defeated at the last minute? What did Embryo's will mean? Yong Ho didn't take Embryo's essence and that of the demon that surged from the ground, for they were totally destroyed. It seemed to be the effect of the magic that Embryo activated for the last time. Beware of the six kings. Watch out for the king of gluttony. Tigrius, the least injured among the dungeon spirits, couldn't give counsel to Yong Ho because he was so busy with taking care of the aftermath of the battle. Ophelia, who usually served as an advisor to Yong Ho whenever problems like this happened, was also a patient now. Yong Ho gave up asking for their advice. It seemed that the best policy, for now, was to take a rest. It was foolish to just worry because there were so many problems. Well, I took care of the bigger problems anyway. Actually, he was done with moving the wounded soldiers into the dungeon of the House of Randolt. Since most of the spaces of the house were fortified, most of the wounded soldiers had to lie down in the aisles or gathering places, but it was inevitable. 
Sure, that's the way I should do right now. Letting out a long breath, he turned his gaze to the side. He was faced with something he had to solve now. Catalina was sitting at the end of the bed quietly. Her long ears and tails were drooping on the floor. Even after the battle, she worked tirelessly until now. She was exhausted because she shared all her mana with Yong Ho. However, she might have another reason for letting her ears droop like that. He gulped before he knew it. The sound of him gulping was heard unusually loud. Yong Ho took a deep breath again. Even though he did so several times, he couldn't calm down his pounding heart. Rather, his heart was beating more rapidly now. So, he said, pretending to be calm as much as possible, Catalina. Uh, uh, yeah. Master. She said, flinching a little bit. But she was looking down at the floor. He clenched his teeth, which was really bad for his heart. He felt like his face was blushing. But he had to speak. So, he opened his mouth again, though stutteringly. You know I mean what you said to me during the battle. Catalina slowly turned her head and looked at him. Chapter, 145 She was nervous, too. As if she was scared, her eyes were welled with big tears. He couldn't continue because his head was in a whirl at the moment. But she didn't wait indefinitely. Instead of biting her lips, she pricked her ears straight. Facing him directly, she said, I was serious when I said that. That was how far she could say. Even without Brigada and even without getting connected to the dungeon spirit, he could know her feelings. So, he answered, I like you, too. In fact, Yong Ho thought of a lot of nice expressions about her, but that was all he could say calmly at the moment. He said again, I mean I like you. It looked like a basic answer that even an elementary boy could say, but Yong Ho didn't care. He saw her flapping her ears like wings after a long time. Despite her watery eyes, she couldn't hide her lifting the corner of her lips with joy. His heart was beating faster again. She pulled her buttocks slightly and approached him. Master. Uh. I hope you can grant my wish will you? He never expected it, but he nodded immediately. Honestly, it was impossible for him to think rationally now. She let out a big breath then swallowed and moved boldly. She narrowed her distance with him and said, seeing him face to face, please stay still. Don't even talk. At that moment, he was going to say, wait a minute, but stopped. He thought about what she just said because he had heard it before and several hours ago at that. Anyway, he stiffened like a piece of wood, and Catalina wrapped her cheeks with her trembling hands. Ophelia and Kaiwan did the same thing to him, and now Catalina was doing it. It seemed that he was born to be kissed rather than kiss somebody. Catalina gently closed her eyes. However, Yong Ho couldn't close his eyes. He couldn't take his eyes off her lips, getting closer to his lips little by little. Ophelia, Indirian's daughter, is interfering with the master of the great house of Mammon. I'm really really sorry. But it's too urgent for me. And I think this is the perfect time. Startled, Yong Ho turned his head toward the direction where the voice came from. Catalina was standing in the corner of the room, boasting of her best agility among the dungeon spirits. She erected her tail as if she was quite surprised. Ophelia, the owner of the voice, alternately looked at her and Yong Ho with mixed feelings and narrowed her eyes. Salami was shaking behind Ophelia's back for some reason. Clearing her throat once, Ophelia continued, It's not something like the enemy's ambush. It's because of the bones and restored items of the bone dragon. She couldn't hide her fatigue when she said that. In fact, she was incapacitated after she was hit by embryo during the battle. No matter how much she took the potion, it was irrational for her to stand before Yong Ho like this now. However, instead of falling and taking a break, Ophelia chose to move, clenching her teeth. She needed someone to take care of picking up the pieces after the battle. Even though Yong Ho and Catalina were busy with picking up the pieces after the battle, they weren't yet used to it. It might sound arrogant, but without Ophelia, it would have taken much more time for Yong Ho to clean up after the battle. Ophelia said, although I collected the ruins of the battlefield in one place, I don't have enough troops to guard and transport them. And it is not the right time for us to ask for additional troops from the free city. 
So, I wish we could use the transport service of the dungeon market, although it was expensive. Besides, we need more medicine to treat the injured. The bones of the bone dragon were in themselves a great treasure. So, they shouldn't be neglected. Despite that, the ruins of the bones were scattered on the battlefield randomly. In the eyes of former merchant Ophelia, it looked like the gold nuggets were up for grabs on the street. Yong Ho couldn't answer right away. It wasn't because he didn't understand her request. Since he was busy cleaning up outside the dungeon until now, he knew well how badly the bones were neglected. The reason he agonized was because the House of Mammon had no cash reserve. The delivery service of the dungeon market was quite expensive as Ophelia said. Like an excellent dungeon spirit, Ophelia read his mind, and said, you can pay for their service with some of the bones. I know it's too good to pay with the bones, but it's more urgent to safely move the bones of the bone dragon into the warehouse of the mammon house and to heal the wounded. I am sorry, but I would like you to approve it. Ophelia found one more value in the bones of the bone dragon. Who made the bone dragon? Who the hell gave the bone dragon to embryo? The clue on that question could be found in the bones. There weren't so many individuals or groups with the ability to create undead monsters like the bone dragon. Such power was too strong for the master of a house in the abandoned southern land. The death knight and the bone dragon were too powerful dungeon spirits to be owned by the master of a house in the south. There must be somebody behind it. Be it an individual or a group, there was clearly a certain presence behind Embryo's back. Yong Ho nodded at Ophelia. He stood up and approached her. Let me approve it. I think you are in charge of the deal with the dungeon market, too, right? Sorry, she replied, narrowing her eyebrows. Since she was sincerely sorry, she couldn't even smile. He smiled at her. Although he really wanted to take a break at the moment, he gave it up. Okay, let me access the virtual space right now. But I also have something to order you. He grabbed Ophelia's hand then led her to the bed, so she could sit on it. Now, take some rest. Sleep first, and take care of other stuff after you wake up. Ophelia couldn't answer right away because she felt like she would collapse on the bed when she was just sitting there. Well, I think I have to greet you when you come back. Just go to sleep, lady. Yong Ho slightly winked at her and sat on a throne in one side of the Demon King's room. Lucia, get ready for me to access the virtual space. Okay, master. And just a moment ago my heart was pounding. Lucia giggled brightly. Yong Ho, who completely forgot Lucia was watching him all along, tried to calm down. Before accessing it, he saw Catalina for the last time. I will be back. I'll wait. Catalina's tail flapped. Yong Ho closed his eyes comfortably. He accessed the virtual space of the dungeon market. It was the first time that Yong Ho accessed the virtual space of the dungeon market in a place other than the House of Mammon. He opened his eyes in a strange atmosphere. It was quiet. And there was nothing. He just blinked in a white space. It was a very familiar space, but he had never encountered anything like this. Ah, uh, Citri? There was no answer from her. He looked around in a little anxiety. Was this such a terrible place? The pure white horizon, which was just connected endlessly without even its shadow, was terrifying. What the hell happened? He tried calling her once again. Citri. Recognition number, 009. Descendant of the man. Yong Ho Chun, the current master of the House of Mammon. Your recognition has been completed. Welcome. When the letters of light spread out in front of his eyes, he could hear the slightly stiff voice of a woman. Her voice was suddenly heard, but since he was familiar with it, he was rather relieved. It was a standard voice that could be heard everywhere, such as when they introduced the catalogue of the dungeon merchant. The voice continued. Citri is currently attending the dungeon chamber of commerce. You can't chat with Citri now. Would you like to go back? Or would you like to trade in normal mode? Yong Ho knitted his eyes slightly. Maybe he was overconfident, but it was Citri's way of dealing with him. The Citri that he used to be familiar with would have conveyed a direct message to him instead of relaying her message through a machine. 
Is she attending an emergency meeting? He became curious. Citri always described herself as a big shot in the dungeon market. And her statement wasn't a lie. She was a powerful witch that had lived for over a thousand years. If it was an emergency meeting in which Citri had to attend, the agenda was highly likely to be unusual. I wonder if it's related to embryo. He momentarily questioned it, but he soon shook his head. There was zero possibility that the emergency meeting was about it. It was highly likely that it was a much bigger agenda at the meeting. Looking at the letters of light, Yongho asked, Can't I wait here until Citri returns? You can. However, I can't tell you exactly how long you have to wait until she comes back. How long has it been since the meeting started? I can't answer that question. In a way, it was a natural answer. Instead of asking more, Yongho moved his fingers. Although he couldn't see Citri at the moment, the whole white space made him adjust to the situation. A chair that looked very fluffy rose behind his back. Let me wait here. Can I browse the catalogue of the dungeon market? Sure, you can. I hope you have a great time. The letters of light disappeared. And, as if it could be a substitute, a round sphere of light was formed around his left hand. Buried deep in the white chair, he gently touched the sphere of light. Then, a familiar catalogue of the dungeon market opened in the air. The reason he chose to wait wasn't just because he was curious about the results of the meeting that Citri attended. He needed a direct deal with her. Since he wanted to pay with the bones of the bone dragon for the delivery service, it was absolutely necessary for him to negotiate with her about the price. Good. He decided to relax. Being connected to the virtual space itself consumed mana, but now he had five horns. The amount of mana recovered naturally was more than that consumed in the virtual space. If he could stop being impatient, he could have a pleasant break. What a big catalogue. It was different from the limited catalogue that Citri had shown to him so far. The general catalogue of the dungeon market boasted of very detailed items because of the vast variety of its trading items Yong Ho first typed Bone Dragon on the search bar. Soon, the complicated stuff on the screen disappeared and a concise sentence appeared on it. Chapter, 146 Catalog of Six Star Dungeon Spirit Most items can't be bought here. If you want to buy them, please consult with the person in charge. Until now, the dungeon spirits Yong Ho dealt with were those with three stars at most. Six Star Dungeon Spirit He admired it unwittingly. Without Skathaka's force of life, he would never have beaten the bone dragon. I see. He now understood why it was so strong. At the same time, he had some doubts. How did Embryo get the bone dragon? The price of the bone dragon was astronomical. Since he developed a gold mine, Yong Ho could make a lot of money, but that wasn't enough. Of course, Embryo must have been richer than Yong Ho himself. Still, it seemed difficult for Embryo to buy the bone dragon, Yong Ho thought. First of all, its price was too expensive, but there was another essential problem here. In other words, the bone dragon wasn't a dungeon spirit that he could get with money alone. Yong Ho closed his eyes gently. There were a few things that came to his mind, but instead of jumping to conclusions, he decided to sleep on it for now. He needed some more information about embryo. Let me take care of what I can do now. After opening his eyes, Yong Ho looked for things he could do with the bones of the bone dragon. Things he imagined were laid before his eyes various weapons made from dragon bones. A smile came to his lips naturally. He wasn't sure if Bergrim could smelt the dragon's bones, but if Bergrim could, it would be a jackpot for Yong Ho because he could have a whole dragon's bones dozens of meters long. Overly excited at the prospect, Yong Ho checked the price of weapons made from dragon bones. Once again, he smiled happily. I think I will make a lot of money by trading the dragon bones. He seemed to know why Ophelia was so anxious. It was natural for her to get nervous when she saw such a trove of gold was being neglected on the street. Yong Ho gulped and browsed the catalogue again because something came to his mind suddenly. Got it. Four Star Dungeon Spirit. Dragon Soldier. Skeleton born from dragon's bones. Made with dragon bones as a material, 
it boasts of much stronger defensive power than an ordinary skeleton. Depending on the type and age of the source dragon, its properties and strength are different. Yong Ho fidgeted with his fingers in a row. This time, he looked for the menu items on the scroll item, not dungeon spirits. Scroll of Dragon Soldier Creation Dragon Bones Needed It is recommended to purchase dragon bones together. Fortunately, it existed. Yong Ho breathed a breath of relief. Although the House of Mammon had a good wizard like Tigrius, he was a novice in terms of necromancing. So, Yong Ho thought of filling Skull's unit with dragon soldiers. He thought of one more. He felt really empowered, imagining that Skull would be reborn as a bone dragon. He felt satisfied as if his belly was full without eating anything. While fighting Embryo, he realized very clearly that the battle in the demon world was different from that in the human world. The combat power of each dungeon spirit was truly superhuman, so it was possible to overshadow numerical superiority by qualitative strength. Initially, Yong Ho reluctantly chose the elite soldiers under the inevitable circumstances, but he had a vision. It was better for him to produce ten elite soldiers at the cost of producing one thousand troops with poor armament and combat power. It was a difficult task for ordinary masters of houses, but Yong Ho himself had the power of evolution. And he could make it. After googling on the bone dragon and dragon soldiers, Yong Ho checked the dungeon spirits, feeling more relaxed. He didn't check them out for purchase or window shopping. He examined the genealogy of high-class dragon soldiers one by one. Let me buy them low and grow them for battle. What he paid special attention to was the top-level class. They were clearly different from the class of flames that he came across accidentally. Ifrit, the crown of flames in the shape of a beautiful woman. Wicantra, the crown of the land in the shape of a powerful giant. And the top-level crown with the remaining five attributes. Oh, Salami is also in their league. However, Salami was already too far from Ifrit. Perhaps, without repeatedly evolving itself until it became something like a dragon, it would hardly be close to a human shape. Some time passed, and it was time for Yong Ho to pile up purchase items in his head. While the letters of light were splitting in front of his eyes, a dazzling beauty appeared. Dear client, thank you for waiting. Citri was there as always. After greeting Yong Ho who stood up happily for greetings, she created a chair across him. I had to attend a meeting because something urgent happened. She frowned slightly as if she was in trouble. Yong Ho asked carefully, have you solved the problem? No, not yet. It's just the beginning. It looks like this kind of meeting will continue for some time. Citri smiled cheerfully. After seeing her smile, he was convinced that even though Citri would give him some hints about the meeting, she wouldn't tell him what happened at the meeting or why the meeting was held. Citri changed the topic. My dear client, what has brought you here? She looked so beautiful when she asked him, tilting her head a bit. But even before he answered, she clapped her hands and said with a bright smile, Oh my God! I would like to congratulate you from the bottom of my heart. The fact you are here right now means that my dear client has defeated Embryo, right? Her statement made it clear that the agenda of the meeting wasn't Embryo's defeat. He nodded with a smile. Citri suddenly narrowed her eyes and said, By the way, I don't think that's the only thing I want to celebrate. Any other good news? He couldn't manage his expression. Faced with his silly expression, she pulled her body slightly back. Well I feel like my loyalty to my dear client has been weakened very slightly. Don't make such an expression before other ladies. That's my sincere advice. But Yong Ho couldn't help but laugh. Recalling Catalina flapping her ears, he cleared his throat once again. Changing his expression this time, he said, I would like to trade the bones of the bone dragon. His deal with Citri was quick and cheerful, as always. So, he sold the entire left leg bone of the bone dragon. In return, he purchased the delivery service by the dungeon market, a large number of recovery items, and a scroll to create dragon soldiers. In his mind, the price of the bone dragon's bones were sold a little lower, but he didn't protest because he didn't think Citri wouldn't force him to price down the bones. As if she read his mind, she added lightly, if you incur the wrath of the undead, 
the value of the dragon's bones is supposed to go down because the energy of death resides in the dragon's bones. Please keep this in mind if you are going to smelt the bones of the bone dragon. Yong Ho just laughed bitterly. The deal was all over. He enjoyed his conversation with her, but he stood up because he wanted to take a break more than anything else now. Let me leave now. See you next time. Can I give you a piece of advice before you leave? Citri also stood up. Getting closer to him, who was puzzled, she whispered, If you are going to visit the house, you had better hurry up. If you delay, you might not have time to visit. He looked at her. Hiding her expression, he stepped back. It was just clear that her advice was related to an emergency meeting. I love you, client. See you next time. Bowing to him, she disappeared after winking at him. It seemed like she was asking him to find out more by himself if he was curious. It was clear that something big had happened to the demon world. Given Citri's attitude, it didn't seem like it would have a direct negative impact on him, but he had no choice but to be careful from now on. He shook his head once. He pulled himself together and closed his eyes. Then he logged out of the virtual space. Pit-a-pat, pit-a-pat. Lubbed up. You can treat me as if I don't exist. I can understand. Between breakfast and lunch the next day Yong Ho, who barely woke up from more than ten hours of sleep, listened to Lucia, half asleep. Had Catalina not woken him up, he would have slept for a few more hours. Sorry to wake you up. No, you don't have to. I asked you to wake me up by this time. Thanks. Smiling softly, he got up from his bed and stretched himself lightly. He stroked Catalina's head. He looked around in no time and kissed her lips lightly. He felt good but shy at the same time. Catalina raised her tail with her ears blushing. Wow, oh my gosh. Will you really treat me like someone who really doesn't exist? Don't you know I'm watching you? Letting Lucia's complaint in one ear and out the other, he pinched Catalina's cheek. He wanted to touch her more, but he didn't want to be trapped by Lucia. BR. Whiny. Sob sob. Seeing Lucia expressing onomatopoeia in a row, it seemed that Lucia was really sad or angry. Since Lucia was like his alter ego, it was natural that Lucia reacted like that. He left the room after teasing Catalina and Lucia a little more in different ways. After having a quick meal, he gathered the dungeon spirits and Rykum, the leader of defense of the House of Mammon in one place. You guys did a great job. He was serious. Indeed, all of them suffered so much that none were in good shape. Yongho looked back at Rykum, who was bandaged almost all over her body. Rykum, all the dungeon spirits who participated in the battle will receive due rewards. Thank you for surviving. The dungeon spirits of the House of Mammon were not characters in games. They were real human beings with their own lives. So, he needed to give them due rewards, aside from his compliments. He could not get their loyalty for nothing. Tigrius, perhaps the least injured among them, said, the delivery service team of the dungeon market has started shipping the bones of the bone dragon. You don't have to worry because they are quick and accurate. But Tigrius was also exhausted like others because he was tasked with cleaning up after the fight for the reason he was the least wounded. Seeing him for a moment, Yongho turned his head to the side. He noticed something unusual in Tigrius's eyes. Do you want to say something? Chapter 147 Instead of answering immediately, Tigrius moved his lips up and down a few times, something unusual for his typical reaction. After hesitating for a moment, Tigrius said, I'm sorry to say this, but I would like to get some bones of the bone dragon. Just a little bit. Although he was an ascetic and perfect old gentleman, he was also a wizard. Above all, what he wanted was the bones of the bone dragon. If he wanted, he could use it not only as weapons material but also material for magic experiments or a catalyst for various powerful magic. Moreover, the bones that Yong Ho got this time were those of a fully grown dragon. It was natural for a wizard to covet the bones. Yong Ho smiled brightly at his desperate gaze. Since he became one of his dungeon spirits, Tigrius had never expressed his desire openly, so Yong Ho wanted to grant his request. I can't say you can use them to your heart's content, but
but you can use some of them. You can trust me. Thank you. As if he felt a bit embarrassed, Tigrius didn't hide his smile. Watching him, all of the other dungeon spirits showed approving smiles. Fighting at the risk of his life, Tigrius was already a member of the House of Mammon. Rykam said again, I think we will be done cleaning up before dark. How about the funeral? I think we can handle their bodies here quickly and proceed with it formally after returning to the free city. Because of the compensation for the killed, I don't think we can wrap up the matter in a hurry. The funeral was not only for the dead but also for the living. The free city had the largest pool of talent that was available to Yongho. Since they had a potential for the city's development, Yongho could never treat the matter lightly. Ophelia's face turned somewhat gloomy as if she recalled Oris, the maniac commander of the free city who lost his life to the bone dragon. Rykam continued to brief Yongho about the recovery status of the injured and the fatigue of the remaining troops. Okay, let's discuss what to do next from now on. Ophelia, please go ahead first. When Yongho pointed to her, she stood up and said after greeting him briefly, the battle is just over, so there is a lot of speculation. I'm sorry, but I hope you can take this into account. It was unavoidable. There was clearly a limit to Ophelia's intelligence. Above all, she was exhausted at the moment. No matter how strong she was as a red demon, she couldn't heal her severe wounds right away. However, she smiled and continued, as if to reassure everyone, in this battle, more than 500 of the embryo army, made up of about 3,000, were killed. Out of the remaining 2,500, most of them were alive and fled, except for those who were severely injured. Most of the frontline commanders also survived, so there is a possibility that they could gather the runaway soldiers to engage in military activities. But it is unlikely that they're going to be a big threat because their leader, Embryo, was dead. What she said up to this point was already discussed yesterday. Pointing to the northern and eastern parts of the southern area, she continued, it's been a day since the battle was over, so I guess rumors are already spreading. In fact, the north is more of a problem than the ruined west, but since the north is located very far from the south, and people there are faced with the army in the east, so they don't pose an immediate threat. In my opinion, they will be absorbed by the eastern army, or they will enter into a power struggle among themselves after repelling the eastern army. There were numerous geographic patterns that could not easily pass between the north and south. The reason why Embryo hit the south from the outskirts of the west was partly to block the east from outside support, but the main reason was because attacking the south right from the north was geographically difficult. The biggest problem is the people in the east. They are maintaining their troops safely at the moment. But I can say with certainty that they won't be a threat to the House of Mammon and its master. Even Ophelia herself was confident that she could defeat the head of the Eastern Army. The House of Mammon was strong, as evidenced in this battle. Elagos was moved to tears quietly. Catalina also suppressed her feelings by biting her lips slightly. The two dungeon spirits, who saved the House of Mammon from the verge of collapse, felt like the present situation was a dream. Since there are so many survivors, the rumors will spread specifically and widely. If the masters of houses in the east are smart enough, they won't act recklessly. Although they thought of fighting Embryo after occupying the northern area, either Embryo or the House of Mammon was much stronger than they expected. If they heard the outcome of the battle this time, it was highly likely that they would get scared and refrain from provoking. There are two options for the eastern army attack the north as it is now, or go back to their homeland and preserve their power. I guess they'll attack the north. There was a real possibility that they would attack the north. They already rose up the army and needed to strengthen their army to challenge Yongho. Moreover, now that the power of the House of Mammon declined greatly after fighting Embryo, this was the right time for them to attack him. If they hesitated a little longer, they would have no choice but to withdraw their army even if they didn't want to, for the east, their main base, would be likely occupied by the House of Mammon in the south. Ophelia nodded as if she agreed with Yongho's prediction. In fact, either way is good for us. If they attack the north, we can give back what they were trying to profit from us while we're fighting Embryo. Yongho had nothing to lose in this situation. The House of Mammon had the necessary power. Elagos, who wiped his tears off slightly with a handkerchief, asked Ophelia, can we expand to the west? 
Unfortunately or fortunately, there is little left for us to take in the devastated West. Luckily enough, it seems that there are some supplies left in the last city as soon as it is known that Embryo was dead, they will be the target of looting. The West will be simply hell. Maybe sooner or later, refugees will come from the West to the South in droves. Ophelia, who responded affectionately to Eligos, turned to Yongho. Yongho nodded because he agreed with her. When she was done talking, Rikam said again, in order to expand to the West, we need some time to heal. I'm sorry to say this, but we need infantry to conquer and maintain the dungeons and estates there. Although we won, the number of troops we can mobilize from the House of Mammon was greatly reduced. I recommend you focus on restoring your strength, first of all. Yong Ho accepted his recommendation because he was right. After pausing for a moment, Yong Ho had everybody pay attention to him. He said in a calm voice, I'm going to tell you about another topic. He was not going to talk about the post-battle cleanup or prediction of what was coming next. Turning his eyes away from them slightly, he said, Embryo was definitely a strong man. He was a faithful hero who unified the North and the West in just a few months. But even so, I feel that the troops he mobilized in the battle yesterday were excessive. In particular, the Bone Dragon. Are you saying that somebody is behind Embryo? Tigrius asked. Yongho nodded at his sharp question. I think that's very likely. If someone is really behind his back, he must be extraordinary. Apart from the Death Knight, the Bone Dragon is really in a different league. At least in the southern area, there were none who could possess a Bone Dragon. Money wasn't the problem. Top-class dungeon masters could not be bought with money alone. Moreover, the Bone Dragon that Yong Ho defeated this time was not included in the catalogue of the dungeon market. If so, it was the Bone Dragon that the dungeon market created secretly, or one created independently by an individual or a group without the help of the dungeon market. Either way, its scale was too big. Even considering the whole land of the demon world, not just the southern area, there were not many who could create a bone dragon. From now on I want to make a little assumption. You can take it far-fetched. So, take that into account when you listen. Not only Tigrius, but also Ophelia made a subtle expression. Clearing his throat once, he said, Embryo acted strangely before he died. Instead of attacking me with his full might, Embryo chose to protect me. Protected you? Ophelia asked suddenly. Since she didn't hear it yesterday, she was obviously embarrassed to hear it. The black demon that thrust through the ground tried to ambush me. I was so exhausted and focused on Embryo then that I didn't notice it, but Embryo killed the guy. He killed it by using an enormous amount of magic as if he expected its attack in advance. Yong Ho couldn't take the essence of Embryo and the Black Demon because the last magic used by Embryo completely destroyed the essence of both. It didn't seem like he improvised this kind of magic hastily. Maybe it was magic that he had prepared only to defeat the Black Demon because he never used it while fighting Yong Ho, who had magic as powerful as that. He left me a strange will. Hide your greed. Beware of the six kings, especially the king of gluttony. Having said that, Yongho waited for a moment. Rikam and Tigrius sprang to their feet almost simultaneously. Really? It was not because Embryo left a will that they were astonished. They were more worried about some facts contained in the will. Yes, Rikam, I am the king of greed with the sin of greed. Yongho admitted it. Looking back at Tigrius who was making an astonished expression, he raised his right hand and said, and this is Amun, the magic spear of the red lotus. The flames rose. They saw it many times, but it was still very fresh to Rikam and Tigrius. That was true. It wasn't something like the flames of the demon king. Yongho's magic up to now was not dependent on artifacts. The return of the king of greed, Amun, the magic spear of the red lotus that guards him at hand, and the legendary-like beings in the demon world. Tigrius felt calm amid the confusing situation, for only now could he understand it. The miraculous actions that Yongho showed him so far were far from those by an inexperienced and young demon king. He was the true king of the south that finally returned. Grabbing Amun again, Yongho waited until Rikam and Tigrius sat down. 
Then he said in a low voice, Embryo told me to hide the fact that the king of greed appeared. And he warned me to be wary of the king of gluttony among the six kings. So, I've guessed in reverse from here. Chapter, 148 Yong Ho put several pebbles on top of the entire map of the southern area. They pointed to Yong Ho himself, Embryo, the king of gluttony, and the black demon, respectively. The mastermind of Embryo is the king of gluttony. And the black demon is his minion that he placed to monitor or help Embryo. Monitor him? If they had a cooperative relationship, it's illogical that Embryo killed the black demon. So, I think Embryo and the King of Gluttony maintain the type of relationship that helped them use each other, not a master-servant relationship. Tigrius nodded and said, assuming that the King of Gluttony coveted the southern area, that makes sense. If Embryo tried to use the King of Gluttony as you said, he might have plotted to revolt deep down. It was also possible that the King of Gluttony tried to use a surrogate called Embryo instead of directly confronting Yongho. It's not just because of the barren environment that the southern area had been abandoned. It's because nobody wanted any of the six kings to take possession of the southern land, the birthplace of Mammon, the great king of greed. According to his logic, the king of gluttony used the surrogate to unify the southern area and ruled it behind the scenes. If so, what you have just said means that Embryo betrayed the king of gluttony at the last minute. Not only did he save you by killing the Watcher, but also, it warned you against the king of gluttony, said Tigrius. Yongho nodded at Tigrius' assumption. Catalina, who was silent until now, narrowed her eyebrows and asked, did Embryo hate the king of gluttony so much? Based on his explanation, Embryo took the last step of interfering with the king of gluttony's scheme instead of dealing a fatal blow to Yongho who killed him. At first glance, Embryo's action could not be understood. Maybe he projected himself onto you, master. Or he might have changed his mind just before dying. Yongho nodded at Ophelia's analysis. Actually, he also thought of it, too. He said, there are too many assumptions here from the beginning. I don't think it's a good idea to jump to any conclusion before we gather more information about Embryo's intention. I would like to pay more attention to the king of gluttony. Ophelia said, first of all, I think it's better for you to keep hiding the power of greed, as Embryo said. The other kings will not stand still when they hear the seventh king of greed has returned. Tigrius said this time, I also agree with Ophelia. If you think about it carefully, the king of gluttony seems to have the biggest headache. His territory borders the northeast of the southern area. Moreover, if he had been really behind Embryo, he would have amassed enormous intelligence, compared with other kings. In the extreme situation, they could mobilize their troops for the simple fact that you defeated Embryo and the Bone Dragon. They might move their troops directly because of their wariness of other kings, but it's possible that they can send their minions to gather intelligence about us. That's why I'm thinking of choosing to build up our strength in the south rather than expanding into the west immediately. In that case, we can leave the north and the east as they are, Yong Ho responded. Actually, he didn't need to hurry. What he needed now was not an external expansion. The dungeon spirits of the House of Mammon who knew the truth of the Labyrinth of Greed understood his intention. His priority was to attack the Labyrinth of Greed and complete his godly energy. Eligos recalled the arena more than anything else. If Yong Ho controlled the arena and obtained all of the dungeon spirits there, including Gus Ion, he would not need to fear anything, even if his rival were the King of Gluttony. He could deal with the King easily. When Catalina, Eligos, Skull, and Ophelia, who could be called his original dungeon spirits, exchanged meaningful glances with each other, Tigrius felt a strange sense of alienation, but he remained silent. As he did today, he believed that one day he would hear from Yongho about it directly. When they almost wrapped up their conversation, Yongho brought out the last topic. Ophelia, collect intelligence about the northern part of the demon world. Are you talking about the northern part of the demon world, the territory of the King of Pride? If the southern area was at the southern end of the demon world, the King of Pride's territory was located at the northern end. Since both territories were at the opposite end, they were too far from each other. But Yong Ho had a good reason to ask Ophelia for it. When I accessed the virtual space of the dungeon market yesterday, Citri was attending an emergency meeting. And she said to me, if you don't do it now, 
you won't have any time to visit home. No way. She may have said it simply because of the southern area, but I don't think that's all. It is possible that the fight between the King of Pride and the King of Envy has escalated more than they expected. In fact, Yongho had never been outside the south, let alone the southern area itself. However, he could easily guess that the fight between two kings would have a great influence on the entire demon world. It was just like the fighting between the United States and the Soviet Union during the Cold War era. If that's true, it's a grave situation, Tigrius moaned. If something went wrong, the whole demon world would be engulfed in the flames of war. While everyone was in a serious mood, Catalina curled her lips again. After hesitating for a moment, she asked carefully, Master, aren't you planning to visit the human world? Well, very briefly. Aside from my homesickness, I have to. The door of space was already completed. Moreover, he felt this was the only opportunity to visit his hometown as Citri said. If he dragged his feet a little longer, he would not be able to leave this place because of the King of Gluttony as well as his concern about the northern and the eastern parts. Yong Ho turned to Elagos and said, How often do I have to visit? You have become so strong, compared with when you just came to the throne of the master of the House of Mammon. If you visit this time, you will have no problems for at least hundreds of years. Yong Ho was already a powerful existence that was half a human and half a demon. To describe him, he could be called a hybrid demon, like Catalina. In the case of Bergrim or Azrin, a hero of the alien world, who he had seen at the auction house of the dungeon market, they didn't need to regularly visit their hometowns even though they were from the alien world. It was because, unlike Yongho, they were already familiar with mana before they came to the demon world. Okay, I think I have to visit my hometown quickly. He didn't intend to stay long. Maybe for two to three days. He wanted to say hi to his parents and reassure them about his safety then return quickly. At that moment, he suddenly laughed playfully because of Catalina's expression, who was standing behind his back. Why? Will you miss me even if I am absent for a few days? Only now could they confirm each other's affection. Definitely, she would miss him. However, she couldn't even say yes immediately. When she blushed without answering, he took her hand and said, You don't have to be disappointed because I'm going with you. Astonished, she blinked, and Elagos and Opelia, who had already talked about it, exchanged meaningful glances. And Salami, waiting outside the door in the hallway, shook its head and clicked its tongue. Any dungeon spirit will do. How about Ophelia, Elagos, Tigrius, or Skull, except for Catalina? In terms of camouflage, I think Tigrius is the best. Late at night, Lucia urgently made an offer to Yong Ho, who just returned from the House of Mammon quickly. He needed to have one dungeon spirit accompanying him on his visit to his hometown. The dungeon spirit was supposed to escort him but would also assist him by using the magic for his return to the demon world. Yong Ho, a human being, was like a sign in the human world. Because of him, they could stably create the coordinate of the door of space leading to the human world. That was why he needed its opposite. If someone in the demon world directly connected to Yong Ho closely accompanied him, it would be possible to obtain more stably the door of space leading to the demon world than he himself passed it alone. So, Yong Ho chose Catalina. Besides, she was his escort knight. In all respects, she was the right candidate. But Lucia didn't seem to think so. Master? You're so mean. If you cross into the human world, I can't watch, or protect you. How could Lucia watch or protect him? So, he quickly ignored her suggestion this time. He picked up the communications gear and talked to Ophelia, who remained in the house of Randolph. I will restore the power of the house of Mammon as much as possible during your absence. Don't worry about the situation here. Have a safe and pleasant trip. Yong Ho also replied shortly because the device could only convey short messages. Okay, I hope I'm in your good hands. I, Indirian's daughter, Ophelia, will try to meet your expectations. His communication with Ophelia was cut off. He looked back at the dungeon spirits who came out to see him off. Master, have a great trip. Yuria, already the cutie of the House of Mammon, said goodbye to him on behalf of them. She was really cute when she slightly bowed to lift her skirt. 
He stroked her head gently. Let me buy you a present. Have you heard about chicken? Chicken. Yes, trust me. It's incredibly delicious. It is also a symbol of world peace. If I can, I'll bring coke, too. Yuria's eyes twinkled at his grand explanation. Baduk, who was next to him, drooled at the name of the food. As a result of repeated evolution, Baduk turned into a reliable creature, but it was still a simple animal. After exchanging his gaze with Salami lastly, he stood at the door of space. Just like he did when he first met her, he gently grabbed Catalina's hand, who was dressed in a suit. Please have a great trip. Please say hello to your father. This time, Yongho didn't ignore Lucia's words. After greeting her, he turned to Catalina. Shall we go? I, escort knight Catalina, will risk my life to protect you, master. Although she said it gravely, her ears and tail flapped. How would his father react when he saw this escort knight? Lucia activated the door of space. Almost all of the mana produced daily by the House of Mammon was put into the door of space. As it was not sufficient, about half of the mana she accumulated for the past few days was exhausted. Mana swirled inside the empty circular frame of the door of space, creating a plate of blue mana that moved like a wave. There was a road that led to the human world over there. Yongho didn't leave for the human world for good. It would be his brief visit. Nonetheless, his heart was pounding. He stepped forward and threw himself into the door of space with Catalina. Chapter 149 This time, he felt different when he accessed the virtual space of the dungeon market. This time, he felt somewhat different when he passed through the secret passage to the arena. The feeling when the water of Skathaka's life covered his whole body. The moment he felt it, he lost consciousness. When he opened his eyes again, completely different senses dominated his whole body. Time has passed. He could recognize it. He only closed and opened his eyes, but there was definitely something in between. Yong Ho breathed. He quickly regained the sensation of his whole body. He felt the warmth and softness at his fingertips. Regardless of who was the first, Yong Ho raised his upper body almost at the same time as Catalina. Sitting down, they looked back, as if they promised to do so. Their mana was swirling. It looked like he was seeing the distortion created inside the dungeon. The twist that sprinkled a brilliant light naturally became smaller and fixed at the size of a small tennis ball. Only then could Yong Ho afford to look around. He opened his mouth wide open. It was foreign and familiar to him. It was strangely unfamiliar to him because almost all of the large furniture such as the bed and desk disappeared, but it was definitely Yong Ho's own room. The wallpaper and ceiling he was used to seeing for the past ten years proved that it was his room. He was back. This was Earth, the human world. Perhaps, since he realized he was back to his home, he felt that even the air was different. He could hardly see the flow of the demon world, which he always saw in the demon world by concentrating his consciousness. In fact, he was freed from the demon world now. It's my home, he said. Catalina looked around, flapping her ears slightly. When she first took him, she couldn't afford to look around because she took him only in haste. He couldn't pay much attention to her. He suddenly rose from his seat and shouted again. My home. The smell of the room he missed so much tickled his nose. In fact, there was nothing special that he could smell in the room, but he was touched anyway. He quickly opened the door and shouted instinctively, Dad. Son is back. Dad. But he heard no answer from his father. There was no one in the living room. Catalina said cautiously, there seems to be no one in this house right now. Actually, she was much better at sensing human presence than him. He nodded. Come to think of it, it was natural there was nobody at home at this time. I think daddy went to work. Chicken house. Our family business. Moreover, when Catalina and Elagos kidnapped him, they did something else. They said they left a letter he prepared carefully in the human world. Of course, it was a letter with translation magic, so that people in the human world could understand it even if they didn't know the language of the demon world. Since your son has the talent of a demon king, 
we are inviting him as the master of the house of Mammon. That was what was written in the letter, according to Elegos and Catalina. If the letter had been found in another house, his father might have suspected that his son, who was in delusion, left a strange letter before leaving the house, but Yong Ho's house was special. Maybe his father might have been happy to learn that his son finally carried out his determination. Um, my father might have thought so. His father might have even thought that it should be him, not his son, that Elegos and Catalina should have taken. Thinking about his father, Yong Ho calmed down. Although he was still excited, he could think about lots of other things. He looked at Catalina. She was good. Her ears and tails flapped vigorously. Good. After checking something out, which Catalina could not understand, Yong Ho looked back at himself. He first checked what he brought with him from the demon world. His suit as the demon king, reminiscent of a semi-suit, was neat. The magic field on his left arm was also kept well in the form of gloves, and the flame bracelet, another form of Amun, was kept in good shape. He injected a little mana into Amun. As if to respond, there was a faint green flame around the bracelet. He could feel Amun. Next, he opened the leather pocket on his waist. It was barely the size of a fist, but what was inside was special. It was full of items that seemed expensive at the first glance. It was the human world without the dungeon market. Although he was going to stay here for a few days, he didn't want to be financially pinched as the demon king. Besides, he wanted to make fortune for his father. If he could have his way, he wanted to bring much more than now. However, since he spent so much money for the fight against Embryo, there weren't many cash assets he could bring immediately. How fortunate! Not only Catalina and Elegos, but also Ophelia did not know well about the movement between the two different worlds through the door of space. Even wizard Tigrius and Burgrim, who experienced moving between the two different worlds knew little about this field. What Yong Ho knew for sure was that all kinds of electronic devices, such as a computer and cell phone that he carried with him when he was first taken to the demon world were destroyed. Besides, those with a fairly complex internal structure among the items in the desk drawer were ruined without exception. On the other hand, the clothes Yong Ho himself wore were intact. As a result, he took the gold and silver jewels under the assumption that those with simple structure would be okay. Fortunately, his prediction was correct. After breathing a sigh of relief, Yong Ho looked back at the place where the twist of mana happened. He recalled something that came to his mind when he witnessed the gentle spreading of mana that leaked out like reverberation. By the way, Catalina. What were you going to do about me in the first place? Pardon? He slightly scratched the back of his neck. He didn't intend to question her about his kidnapping now. After experiencing the movement between the two worlds, however, he wanted to ask her. Moving between the two worlds wasn't far from normal. The amount of mana spent making the door of space was truly enormous. It might sound ridiculous, but Yong Ho himself made rapid growth beyond everyone's expectations. There was a reason why Tigrius called him a man with a miraculous growth after seeing him. That was why he could create the door of space. But what would have happened if Yong Ho himself did not have the sin of greed? Could he have achieved the same growth as now? It was questionable whether he could have managed to move between the two worlds even if he had not been defeated by the master of a house like Poros. The reason he came to the human world now was because he needed to visit once. Of course, he didn't have to come now. Elegos explained why Yong Ho should visit the human world. According to him, since Yong Ho was from the human world, he needed to be exposed to the atmosphere of the human world on a regular basis. Otherwise, his power could be weakened. However, to examine his explanation a little further, it was somewhat different from what Yong Ho first thought. In fact, anyone didn't have to visit the human world by all means just because he was from it. Those who could handle mana from the time they first entered the demon world actually did not have to visit the human world. Yong Ho himself was now a very powerful demon king. Despite that, however, he needed to visit the human world once. It was because his mana was weak when he moved from the human world to the demon world, and his ability to control mana was also poor. In other words, regardless of how strong he became after entering the demon world, 
the amount of mana and his ability to control it at the time of moving between the two worlds determined the frequency or necessity of his revisiting. It was a rather strange phenomenon. It seemed more like an artificial concept of permission rather than a natural phenomenon. It was like the situation where the length of one's stay in a foreign country differed, depending on what kind of visa one received when receiving one's entry or exit visa. It seems that there is an alien world with no restrictions like this. In any case, it was true that Yong Ho needed to visit his hometown once. And after this visit, he wouldn't have to revisit the human world for the next hundreds of years. Maybe the time limit itself would disappear because Yong Ho himself became that much stronger. However, Yong Ho was still in doubt when he recalled his first kidnapping. In what way did Catalina and Eligos think about having Yong Ho go back home? The two didn't even know that Yong Ho himself had the sin of greed, and they didn't expect he would make such a rapid growth. Did they take him to the demon world without any plan just because they wanted to satisfy their pressing needs? Besides, Yong Ho had one more question. Eligos clearly said that he would use all of the remaining mana of the House of Mammon to open the door of space. When he experienced it, however, he wondered if it was possible. The House of Mammon at the time was really on the verge of ruin. They might have had a very small amount of mana by then. Until now, Yong Ho deliberately held the urge to ask this kind of question, but he had no other choice but to ask now. When Yong Ho narrated his questions one by one, Catalina curled her lips. After her ears drooped several times, she looked at his face and said very carefully, there was a scroll. Scroll. Yes, it was one of the few legacies that had been inherited to the House of Mammon without being lost. I and the butler collected mana to operate the scroll. Generally speaking, the magic of an ordinary scroll was supposed to be triggered by mana built into the scroll itself. However, since she mentioned she needed to get more mana, the scroll certainly didn't seem to be an ordinary one. How many scrolls were there at the time? Well just one. Still, it was useful. When I opened the door of space with this scroll, I could engrave a magic circle in the room of the demon king. So, I thought I could open it again at least once with the help of a famous wizard or the dungeon market or make the door of space like now. It was what Yong Ho thought it was. Instead of getting angry, he pinched Catalina's cheeks painfully. He felt upset that she called him without any contingency plan, but she and Eligos were so desperate at that time. Regardless of the process, however, Yong Ho chose the path to become the master of the Mammon House. When she looked like she was going to cry, feeling sorry, he found her long face so cute that he could not let go of her hand easily. He felt like he learned something dangerous just like when he first touched her tail. Hmm. Let me ask you one more. How did you find me? At first, he didn't pay much attention to it, but he felt it was a little weird when he thought about this. He couldn't even understand why he had not been curious until now. Gently rubbing her red cheeks, Catalina replied, well, the scroll itself was not intended to open the door of space but find and bring someone suitable for the master of the Mammon House. Two candidates from the Mammon House were identified by the scroll, but only you had the ability to become the master. The other one was my father. Yeah. Perhaps, the person that the scroll found was you. It seemed that your father was spotted because he was near you. I can confess it to you only now, but little did I think I was connected to the human world like this. I see. Yong Ho roughly understood the whole situation, but other questions came to his mind. Why did Mammon come to this place, Yong Ho's own hometown? And what was the difference between the human world and other alien worlds, such as Bergrim or Baphomet's hometown? Chapter 150 They bought and sold beings in the alien world at the dungeon market. If so, did they deliberately open the door of space and go to the alien world to search for beings to take as slaves? Or did they go on a slave hunt whenever the twists leading to the alien world by chance opened up? Yong Ho got curious about this question but got it out of his head for now. He could get the detained answer if he could go back and ask Tigrius or Citri, or even Scathack, but not now. Citri wouldn't have said that for no reason. When he told Citri he was rebuilding the door of space, she said it would never be easy. The former Citri would not have said so simply because supplying mana was difficult. Obviously, there was something else that Yong Ho himself did not know yet. 
When he was lost in thought, Catalina hesitantly asked, A master? She seemed worried that he might be angry a lot. However, he stroked her hair and said with a cheerful smile, All right. I'm home anyway. Let's enjoy our stay here until we go back to the demon world. He was serious. After checking the scroll with the seal of the dungeon market, he reached out and closed the door completely. When returning, all he had to do was to make a little gap by tearing the scroll in the place where the door of space was opened then send a signal to the House of Mammon. Then, the House of Mammon that received the signal was supposed to open the door of a new space by using Catalina as a coordinate. The duration of his stay in the human world was about two days based on the demon world. Accordingly, he first needed to find out about the time difference between the two worlds. He would compare the time spent in the demon world with the time that passed here. He first headed to the window. He pulled out the blinds and looked out the window. Wow! He admired what he saw outside, and Catalina opened her eyes wide at the scene that she saw for the first time. Big snowflakes were falling down from the sky on a dark winter night. Let me compare it thoroughly, but it's almost the same. He didn't simply compare it by the change of seasons. There were so many red things outside the window in addition to snow. Given that the church not far from his house was decorated with Christmas trees, it seemed to be around the end of the year. It was perhaps just before or after Christmas. Then what should he do now? Should he wait, sitting down in his room, until his father came back? Since he was not alone in the room, he could do something attractive to her, but he couldn't. He headed to the living room then stood there looking at a small bulletin board in the living room. Oh, is this the rumored warning letter from the school? At the left corner of the bulletin board, there was a warning letter issued by the university. Since he got F in all subjects, it was natural that he got the letter. But he wasn't afraid at all because he planned to drop out anyway. He was no longer a freshman of an engineering college, but the master of the Mammon House as well as the King of Greed. Nodding bravely, he turned his gaze to the side again. This time, he instinctively flinched before he knew it. You're all right. It was the same as the warning letter. But it had nothing to do with his own life. He deliberately ignored the physical examination notice stamped by the Ministry of Defense, and he quickly looked at the bulletin board. Since there was nothing special, he reached out to Catalina, who fluttered her tail and looked around. Catalina, let's go to see my father. Oh, no, let's go and eat chicken. Just like Yuria did, Catalina tilted her head at the word chicken, but only for a moment. After tearing the disguise magic scroll that Tigrius had prepared for her in advance, she hid her ears and tail and held his hand. Then both of them went out in a pleasant mood. As soon as he left the front door, Yong Ho had no choice but to go back home. Unlike the warm southern area in the demon world, he felt so cold on a night in Seoul where big snowflakes were falling down. He took out a long parka and mountaineering clothes called a windbreaker from the closet. After thinking hard for a moment, he handed the parka to Catalina because he felt it would make her warm enough. To his slight disappointment, she did not show any particular interest in the elevator. In a way, her reaction was nothing unusual because there were quite a few things like boxes that moved automatically in the demon world. Rather, she showed more interest in the snow falling down from the sky. Ever since she was born, she had never left the southern area, so she grew up without seeing snow at all. He cautiously reached out when he watched her ears flinching instead of fluttering. He touched the space where her ears were supposed to be in place, but he actually touched her real ears, for Tigrius magic did not transform her ears. It just simply concealed them. Startled, she flinched, but he instinctively moved his fingers. Without bothering to read her mana, he touched her erected tail. His erotic feelings were revived this time, too. Her touch was sensual enough to make him addicted to it. No, this is not important. He asked her if she could wrap her tail around her waist or put it inside the padding. As things stood now, passers-by could hit her tail. Catalina initially urged him not to play a prank on her, but she nodded awkwardly anyway. As he passed by the door of his apartment unit, cold air blew over his cheeks. He looked around, breathing in cold air. White snow covered the whole world. It was such a contrast with the black sky, 
but he didn't feel they didn't cancel out each other. The night gently wrapped the white snow, and the white snow gave the night warmth. Christmas decorations on the flower beds of his apartment created a more colorful scene. Until last year he complained about such decorations, but this time, he felt different. The world looked so beautiful to him. I feel really warm out here. With his hands in his pockets, he made a gap inside it by slightly raising his left arm. Then he signaled to her with his eyes. She curled her lips then crossed his arms. As Christmas had yet to come, Christmas carols were playing everywhere. There were quite a lot of people on the street. Although the streets were wide, everything was densely located, compared to the southern area. She might have lots of curiosity here. Instead of looking around her, however, she leaned slightly to him and looked up at the stars in the night sky. He was also in a strange mood. It wasn't just because she was next to him. He came back to Earth, the human world. Just a few days ago, he was engaged in a life-threatening battle with Embryo, but now, he was in peace. But he didn't want to stay in peace forever. He felt that the place he had to return to was not here but to the House of Mammon. He walked on the street slowly. Instead of looking around like her, he focused on himself. But that didn't mean that he was insensitive to people around him. Passers-by were looking at them from all directions. Some of them stopped walking and turned to him and Catalina, and others even took pictures with smartphones. Catalina, who had a sharper sense than him, could not miss it. She whispered to him, Master, their intense gaze at us is not very good. Did they find out my identity? Obviously, her voice was rather sharp than nervous. Although he used to tease her with a soft touch, she was his escort knight. She could overpower these passers-by easily if she had to defend him. But he gently tapped her on the forehead and said, It's all right. They're not looking at you for that reason. So, just never mind. She tilted her head with a puzzled expression but listened to him. He rather enjoyed their intense gaze and various feelings in it and stepped forward. Among them were some women, who were turning their eyes at him, not her. He took great delight in it. Well, I'm more handsome and cool now. My body is in better shape, too. He was praising himself deep down when he suddenly stopped and smiled in satisfaction, looking at a store at a distance. It was a store decorated with wood. Inside the glass wall was full of customers, who enjoyed chicken and beer. It seemed as if he could hear their chattering from the chicken house. He wasn't moved to tears when he entered his room, but this time, he suddenly shed tears before he knew it. Rolling his eyes, he looked at somebody busily moving among the customers. Let's go. He couldn't wait any longer. Folding his arms, he walked with big strides. The store door opened with a jingling sound. Daddy, he said briefly. The middle-aged man, who turned to him after hearing the jingling bell, faced him and stopped moving. Shortly afterward, he opened his mouth again. Son. Yong Ho and the middle-aged man, Kija Chion, stepped forward toward each other at the same time. Daddy. Yong Ho opened his arms to give him an emotional hug. His father hugged him tightly. After tapping him on the back a couple of times, he looked back at his face. He said with a smile, Welcome back. Let's share our dramatic reunion after the shop is closed. Delivery has been backed up. As you know, it's the busiest season of the year. Yong Ho just blinked at his thrilled voice. He could not believe his ears. Two chicken orders in World Park Complex 6. I put the delivery address on the paper bag. When he came to his senses, he was already outside the store. He found himself holding a paper bag with chicken in each hand. Yong Ho looked back again. His father wasn't looking at him. Ah, master. Catalina, who couldn't even enter the store at all, spoke in an embarrassed voice. Looking at her briefly, he laughed. He laughed heartily. Yeah, he's my daddy. This is normal in my house. It is right for us to share the joy of our touching reunion after business hours. Yong Ho felt a bit sorry for his father's way of welcoming him back when he returned home in several months, but he felt reassured at the same time. Obviously, his father understood his long absence from home well. Come to think of it, 
I wonder if he intentionally posted the warning letter from the university and the physical examination notice on the bulletin board? Did he do it to tease him as soon as his son came back? Again, such action befitted his father. That was why Yong Ho happily climbed onto the delivery motorcycle. Moreover, I wasn't alone here today. Sitting behind his back, Catalina naturally hugged his waist. Chapter 151 Kong Sok Chicken delivery man is here. Go get it. Yong Ho heard a husky voice over the speakerphone. He waited for the front door to open, manipulating the card reader that he handled after a long time. Catalina flapped her invisible tail behind his back. Shortly afterward, the front door opened, and a handsome and strong young man appeared. Although it was midwinter, he was wearing short-sleeved shirts and shorts. Hello. The chicken's price is 13,111. As soon as the door was opened, the young man, who spoke in a friendly manner, took a card out of his wallet. This man, whose name must be Kongsok as heard over the speakerphone, was dumbfounded. He looked at Catalina over Yong Ho's shoulder blankly. Yong Ho turned up his mouth slightly again. He skillfully manipulated the card reader after receiving it from the man. Then he gave the chicken bag and a card to the man who was still resting his dreamy eyes on her. Enjoy. Uh, thanks. Goodbye. At that moment, the man came to his senses and returned Yong Ho's greetings with a smile. He wistfully looked at her again, but he closed the door in no time. It looks like he had a crush on you. When Yong Ho whispered, getting on the elevator, Catalina slightly narrowed her eyes. She said in a very serious voice, he is obviously a fragile human being, but he looks unusual. Maybe he has great potential. By evolving several times, she came to cultivate a great sense of discernment. So, given her statement, it seemed that the man was really a man of unusual strength. I wish I had examined him more closely. Something like his manna. However, Yong Ho already left the man's house, who was only a young man in his twenties that ordered chicken. Since the man didn't inherit the blood of the demon king like him, Yong Ho didn't have to care much. Yong Ho climbed on the motorcycle again. A stream of news was appearing on the large outdoor monitor of the broadcasting station across the street. Recently, there are more and more people going into a coma while playing online games. This is happening in several games, not any specific game. For this reason, experts present various views on it. Most experts point out various harms such as addiction to online games, but some experts have completely different opinions. Reporter Hiram John is going to report in detail. Reporter John. The sound of the broadcast news faded away. Yong Ho went out for seven more deliveries after that, and it wasn't until eleven o'clock at night that he could meet his father at home. Fortunately, his father closed the store earlier than usual. His father sat down on the floor of the main bedroom and asked Yong Ho and Catalina to sit down. He listened to his son's story relatively calmly. Yong Ho did not make the mistake of telling him honestly what he had suffered. Not only did he skip anything about the battles, but also he greatly glorified the condition of the House of Mammon. He didn't want to make his father worry about him uselessly. After hearing all of his son's story, his father let out a heavy sigh and looked at his son and Catalina alternately. Shaking his head in no time, he said in a low voice, Dang it! I should have been there. He almost murmured to himself, which made Yong Ho smile. It befitted his typical reaction. As if he said it as a joke, his father also giggled. Anyway, you solved my long-cherished wish instead. I would like to congratulate you on becoming a demon king. Um, is it okay for me to celebrate you? I don't think there is somebody like a warrior in the demon world, right? Yong Ho barely held the urge to laugh at the word long-cherished wish. As expected, it was not Yong Ho alone who had delusions when he came to find out the secret of his family. Come to think of it. Adjusting his posture, Yong Ho looked at his father. Then he triggered the power of evolution right away. Name, Kija Chion Male. Race, Human. Property. Individual Nature. Smart slash whimsical slash sly. Individual Aptitude. Intellect slash stamina. After all, like father, like son. Yong Ho, 
who laughed at his slyness first, let out a mixed and subtle sigh. It wasn't because of his father's extremely low stats. In fact, he could evolve his father quickly even without collecting evolution EXP. Is he the same grade as a skeleton worker? After all, his father was as good as a human being. What Yong Ho could evolve with the power of evolution was only those who had a certain level of relationship with him. Only then could he make them his dungeon spirits and evolve them. However, Kija Chion was different. He was Yong Ho's father. He could evolve his father even without making him his dungeon spirit. Daddy, close your eyes and stay still. I'll do something good for you. Your eyes are glittering so intensely. I don't think I need a flashlight in case of a blackout. You're different from me. Because I am a real demon king. When Yong Ho approached him, chattering lightly, his father looked somewhat anxious, but he soon closed his eyes. Yong Ho put his hand on his shoulders and activated the power of evolution. Oh my! When Yong Ho chose the specialization of his physical strength, he got the expected results. His father wasn't as much rejuvenated as Elegos, but that was enough. Not only the fine wrinkles around his eyes have disappeared, but his build has grown stronger than before. He doesn't have a horn yet. Yong Ho thought about goblins for a moment then shook his head quickly. He felt he should not think about more than now. Regardless of his son's reaction, Kija Chion was amazed by his thick arm muscles. Then he glanced at Catalina who was smiling softly as if she enjoyed watching them all along. He told Yong Ho again, Son, I have something for you, too. It's a family treasure that I was going to pass on to you someday. I think now is the time. After telling him about it directly, his father opened a small safe inside a chest. He pulled out a box the size of his palm and presented it to his son. This is our family treasure. According to our ancestors, it is said to be the object of the man, the very demon king whose blood is flowing in our family members. According to him, this had been kept for over a thousand years. It's a mysterious item. It looks like an ordinary antique, but it certainly has some power. Over the past thousand years, our family lost this item several times. But it was handed back to our family in one way or another, I hear. Then he opened the lid of the box. There was a black, round metal plate inside the box. Yong Ho had never seen it before. However, Catalina's expression changed. A smile disappeared from Yong Ho's face. It was composed of a metal plate. God's metal brigada reacted to Yong Ho's mana. It shined brightly on its own. The fragments of memories that had been kept for over a thousand years were just revealed. He was holding a woman in his arms. The woman with dark hair and purple eyes was by no means ordinary. But he didn't care. Although the woman was considered alien to humans in this world, she was just a woman to him. She was beautiful, wise, and kind. And she loved him, above all. That was enough. He himself. He blinked his eyes. The woman disappeared. He saw a man covered in a lion's skin. So heavy and tall, the man was meeting her eye level even when he sat down. The man said something to her, which made sense. Unlike his savage appearance, the man was always rational. The man wasn't eloquent, but she nodded at the man's short but powerful words. But in the end, she didn't follow the man's words. The man wasn't angry. He sighed once as if he also expected things would end up like this. As always, the man stood up. The man took a few steps again. The surroundings changed completely. Two women stood far away. They stood side by side. Then one of them was hugging the other, but their expressions were different. The blonde woman, who covered her eyes with red leather, was angered by the red-haired woman who kept trying to stick to her. But the woman didn't push her away. The red-haired woman smiled brightly at the blonde woman. She pretended to be extremely friendly to that blonde woman. It was a familiar scene. When he covered his eyes, more things came to his mind and disappeared again. What appeared lastly was a red-skinned man and a woman with watery hair. The red-haired man's head had a horn like a bull's. He said something, holding the woman's waist tightly. It was what he used to say, something like I would follow you wherever you go. 
This time, again, she nodded. But she did the same to the man wearing the lion's skin. He could not accept it. He could not allow her to share his last moment. He turned around. There was an endless staircase under the blue sky. He looked down from there. Their images overlapped, and their visions were mixed. Yong Ho looked up from the bottom of the stairs at the man who was introduced as he, himself a moment ago. Hello. Mammon. There came out a voice, unwittingly. The man on the stairs, Mammon, the king of greed, smiled brightly. Instead of looking down from above, he flopped down on the stairs. Yong Ho instinctively felt that this was not a conversation. It was a unilateral notification. Those standing there now were the same illusions until now. Mammon rested his chin on his hand. Two large horns replaced his crown. The rest of the horns were hidden, so it was not known how many horns he had originally. It was an illusion. Obviously, it was no more than an illusion. However, there were mixed feelings reflected in Mammon's eyes, something like affection or kindness. The fact that I'm facing you here means that you are special among my descendants. You're a special guy who not only has the power of greed but also comes from an alien world. I wonder how many years passed after I died until you were born. I'm also curious about how much you resemble your founding grandma Yan. I wonder if I can find any trace of your resemblance to Yan since your blood has been mixed for numerous generations. The woman with black hair and purple eyes. Mammon took his hand off his chin with a regrettable expression. Unfortunately, you are still not qualified. I'm afraid I can't tell you everything. But it looks like it won't be long before I will lower the bar for qualifications. Yong Ho wanted to ask what the heck he was talking about, but he couldn't say anything. He could not even climb the stairs. He just got fixated on the spot, and Mammon stood up and opened his arms. Boy, keep this in mind. I have always been faithful to my desires. That's why I do not regret my choice at all. That was why he did not listen to the man in the lion's skin or Gusayan. He rejected Skathaka's wish because he loved her. He didn't need to share his last moment with her. Boy, the new king of greed. I hope you can do the same. Chapter 152 Mammon smiled. Seeing his smile, Yong Ho had no choice but to accept his advice. Mammon turned and slowly climbed the stairs. He moved on with Yong Ho gazing at him from behind. Looking at his back, Yong Ho raised his head a little more. He looked up to the sky at the end of the stairs. And he realized that the sky was not in the demon world or in the human world. It was something different. Darkness captured the light. Yong Ho opened his eyelid. Cough. He gasped for breath. When he opened his eyes urgently, he saw his father thrown into confusion. He could hear Catalina's voice, too. Yong Ho felt heartsick. Losing his balance at the moment, he quickly reached out and touched the ground. Catalina hugged his waist. His jacket was taken off, or rather, it was torn apart. A metal plate that was split into dozens of pieces was attached to his left chest like a tattoo. Like a wound from a beast's claw, it was long and reached down to his side. It didn't hurt. Rather, he felt fresh. He felt like he got a big load off his chest. He naturally closed his eyes. He felt greedy. His greed ate something new. He could do what he couldn't do before. The power of attribute. Something he devoured but could not make his own. Greed awakened Agar's lightning again. The earth, which was the attribute of the landworm, also woke up after lightning. He felt the light and darkness one after another. The earth, fire, wind, water, lightning, light, and darkness, called the seven great attributes, all radiated their own light inside greed. Their strength and weakness existed. However, everything empowered him. Even those things other than the seven great attributes could now be called his attributes. Yong Ho opened his eyes again and reserved his stronger greed. Then he smiled with an effort at his father and Catalina, who was wearing a worried expression, to try to calm them down. I'm okay. Are you really okay? Doesn't it hurt? Yes, I'm fine. 
Mammon's purpose was twofold, namely passing down memories and reinforcing greed. Of the two, passing down memories was incomplete. However, only reinforcing greed was done properly. I feel like I've learned how to deal with greed. It was the kind of know-how that he could obtain only after dealing with the power of greed for a long time. He felt he obtained it. He even felt greed and his own will were united into one. Yong-ho carefully pushed Catalina aside and changed the way he was sitting. Watching his son quietly, his father let out a sigh as if he felt relaxed. Well, I think it's true that the demon king's blood is flowing in our family. The devil's blood is also flowing, Yong-ho said abruptly. One of the transferred memories naturally came out. Our ancestors, I mean the woman who married Mammon and gave birth to our ancestors. She wasn't pure human but half human and half demon. She was sort of a nine-tailed fox, and her name was Yan. Catalina, who didn't know what a nine-tailed fox was, blinked with a confused look. His father, who was dumbfounded for a moment, soon regained his composure and said, it's unconventional, but it's a secret of our birth that isn't particularly surprising. Anyway, it happened a thousand years ago, and those born at that time were also the very distant ancestors of Yong Ho's family. Yong Ho also nodded at the new fact about his ancestors. The descendants of the demon king or the descendants of the demon king and the half demon were the same. Anyway, Chion's family was mixed with lots of human blood for a thousand years. The legacy inherited from generation to generation for a thousand years was now in Yong Ho's heart. Moreover, it was unlikely that he would remove it. His father stood up, slightly glancing at the clock on the wall. He told Yong Ho and Catalina, who were about to stand up simultaneously. It's so dark outside. Go to sleep. I have made the bed for you in your room. Daddy? His father passed by his son and opened the door of the main bedroom. It seemed that he planned to show him to the room in person. After all, Yong Ho also hurriedly stood up. Catalina also came out with the two into the living room. However, the way his father acted was a bit weird. Instead of heading to Yong Ho's room, his father headed toward the front door. On the way, he didn't forget to put on the coat on the sofa in the living room. Let me go out for a drink. I'm probably coming back late tomorrow morning. Pardon? What the heck was he talking about? How could he get out when his son returned home in several months? Was he going out for a drink with somebody at this time? When he was at a loss about what to do, his father clicked his tongue. Then he winked at Yong Ho and left quickly. Before following his father, Yong Ho recalled his last glance at him. Then he naturally understood what his father signaled to him. He gulped before he knew it and turned quickly. Instead of taking care of Catalina, who was also embarrassed, Yong Ho opened the door of his room. There were two pillows but one blanket in the middle of the room. He could immediately understand what it meant. Both blushed and gulped at the same time. It was dark and quiet. Even though he kept a thick cotton blanket on, he felt like he could hear his heartbeat. He gasped for breath, though briefly. Without even closing his eyes, he just stared at the ceiling. In fact, there was nothing special about it. It wasn't the first time he laid on the floor side by side with Catalina like this. Didn't he sleep with her on the floor like this for a few days after becoming the master of the house? No, it's different. How can it be the same this time? Yes, that was true. This time, the situation was too different. It was definitely not the same as the previous situation. First of all, there was no Eligos. There was no Lucia. There wasn't even Ophelia who could open the door any time and disturb them. Even Amon didn't respond as usual. It was as if Amon fell asleep. Katali. Mast. The two blurred at the same time before stopping. In extreme tension, he squeezed his voice. You go first. You first, master. Even this time, they talked at the same time. Their voices couldn't mix in the air and shattered. He closed his eyes tightly in a tense situation that made him so nervous and excited. He caught his breath to pluck up courage. At that moment, there was something that touched his fingertips. It was her hand that he held not only today but also several times in the past. 
but her touch was special this time. Her hand just touched his fingertips, but he felt like his chemistry with her was electrifying. He didn't know if he moved first or Catalina did it first, but suddenly, their hands touched each other. Naturally, they interlocked their fingers. Remember my wish for you. It's still valid, right? She said when he opened his eyes. Although she stuttered, she said it clearly. He turned his head to the side. Lying on her side, she was looking at him with her ears drooping. He did not move. She carefully stretched out one of her hands that didn't touch him. She had her face close to him. This time, she closed her eyes again. He could hear her breathing. Then she kissed him. Her shy kissing did not end there. She felt like her tongue melted. Her heart was beating wildly as if it was going to burst at any moment. The saliva she tasted for the first time was so sweet. You're so good at kissing. He was embarrassed. Her kiss was clearly clumsy. But it was really fascinating. Since it was her first time kissing him, it was funny for him to question if it was good or bad, but he was convinced that she kissed well. Her kiss reminded him that she was a half-succubus. Her breathing, which paused for a moment, continued again. Her sweet breathing touched his lips. Gently opening his eyes, he gulped again before he knew it. He looked at her blushing cheeks and her eyes, wondering about what to do. Curling up her body because she was shy, she looked so lovely to him. He naturally caressed her cheeks, which were hot. He smiled, and she slightly curled her lips. Her ears that drooped got stiff as if she was tense. He then touched his ears and kissed her once again. Yongho's father returned home around lunchtime the next day. His son, whose mind he read so well, was comfortably sitting on the sofa in the living room. His son looked so peaceful and relaxed as if he owned the whole world. He winked at his son like he did last night, who was smiling at him like a man. This time, Yongho opened his mouth first. Daddy, are you not going to open the shop? Today the store is closed temporarily. Have you forgotten telling me you are going back tomorrow? Yesterday, the store was already open, and there were customers, so he could not forcibly close it. But he could close it today. Catalina, who usually slept late in the morning, woke up much later today. Feeling a bit awkward, Yongho prepared lunch. Usually, there were only two at the dining table, but today, there were three after a long time. Another dreamlike day passed. Packing lots of stuff to take to the demon world, Yongho tore the scroll to create a new twist. When he sent a signal to the House of Mammon, a large door of space was formed from the twist. I will come back again. He couldn't go with his father. It wasn't time yet. It was highly likely that a new war would break out in the demon world. His father tapped Yongho on the shoulder. He didn't feel sorry for his son, who didn't talk about going with him. Son, as always, I respect your choice. So, behave yourself well. Don't get hit by anybody. Got it? He winked with one eye. At that moment, Yongho knew it. His father already noticed that what his son said was not true and that the demon world was by no means a peaceful and safe place. After all, Yongho couldn't deceive his father. His father could discern everything about him by merely looking at his gaze. It was possible because he was his father and parent. His father slapped him on the shoulder. Instead of holding him in his arms, his father took a step back and increased the distance between them. Go back now. Yes, dad. Yongho smiled at him. Catalina moved up and down her lips to say goodbye but gave up. She returned his goodbye by bowing to him. His father also smiled, beckoning to him to hurry up. Yongho held her hand. He gave his father a slight nod for the last time and threw himself into the door of space. Standing still, his father watched him going back. Even after the door of space was closed and the twisting completely disappeared, he stood there for a while then turned around. The demon king's blood is flowing in our family. It had only been four years since he said it to Yongho. His father left his son's room. His blue eyes glittered intensely after a long time. He closed the door with an awkward smile. It was time for him to open the store. Chapter, 
153. Embryo was dead. The meaning of his death in the southern area was extraordinary. He was the most powerful master in the southern area and also the most belligerent. Few thought that Embryo's death would mean the end of the war. His death was likely only the beginning of a new war because of his risky ambitions during his lifetime. In the worst case, the entire southern area could be in unprecedented turbulence like a carriage without the horsemen. Everyone in the southern area was all on edge. Embryo's remnants were seeking a way to survive, and the masters of houses in the eastern area were restless because of the power of the new master of the House of Mammon. It wasn't the masters of houses that suffered the most when war broke out. The ordinary people, who were destined to be sacrificed in the war, kept being anxious about their future. However, all of this only mirrored the situation of the southern area. Embryo's death. From the perspective of the whole demon world, it was not a big event. It could be rightly called a storm in a teacup. The king of gluttony thought it should be called like that and intended to make it a minor event. The king raised his unusually large arm to enjoy dinner. A glutton as well as a gourmet, he ate, drank, and devised how to start a war. At last, a war broke out. The king of pride finally advanced his army toward the territory of the king of envy. Since the former declared a war, befitting his grandiose ambitions, nobody believed the current war would end up being a small local war like before. It was an all-out war. An all-out war among the kings who had sin and godly energy. The king of gluttony was eating food more quickly. Rakshasas, who had been kidnapped from the king of fury's territory, hastily brought new food to him. Gandharbas, the beautiful girls and musicians for him, also played faster music to the pace of his eating. The king of gluttony came from a lowly devil, a small and fragile demon often eaten as snacks by large monsters such as ogres or trolls. As a result, the king of gluttony knew his limits. Unlike other kings, who were noble from birth, he knew how to endure and stick it out. The king of pride was certainly strong. Probably, he was the strongest of the current six kings. But the king of envy was also as tough as him. He was the oldest king, along with the king of lust. He was a living legend that lived during the same era as Mammon, the great king of greed. The fight between the two was unlikely to end quickly. So, the king of gluttony had to make the most of it. Namely, he wanted to control information and minimize several facts about Embryo's death. The Bone Dragon Its power was only the delusion of the wanderers, who fled the battlefield. Its power was greatly exaggerated in the process of its rumors spreading everywhere. It was more of an undead wyvern. That was the right title for the dragon. And it would soon turn out true. The kings were not supposed to have any interest in the southern area. They had to look to the north only. The king of gluttony himself was thinking of pretending to do so. He already deployed his troops on the northern and western borders. He would attack the southern area only after his battle with the northern area escalated enough. It was when all the kings got the south out of their minds when it was time for him to occupy the south. The master of the house of Mammon. His performance on the battlefield was impressive to the king of gluttony. He could not obtain detailed information about the master because the mole he placed to watch embryo was killed. But his defeat of embryo as well as the bone dragon and the situation of the battle he grasped indirectly through the eyes of the crow were enough to confirm that the master was very powerful. The sudden emergence of a powerful master in the southern area. It wasn't impossible. It was really possible. But what if it was not true? What if the master, like the king of gluttony, came from a low birth? More than a thousand years had passed since the sin of greed disappeared. The king of gluttony began to move his hand again and devoured the food in front of him. The power of experience was great. Yong Ho's second movement between the two worlds was much better than his first one. Instead of sitting down, he stood upright and met the dungeon spirits of the house of Mammon who came out to welcome him back. Welcome back. Just as she did when he left, Yuria greeted him on behalf of them. Yong Ho put down packages on both hands and stroked her head. Yuria wasn't the only one to welcome him back cutely. I earnestly waited for you to come back. Welcome back, master. How was your trip to your hometown? Lucia, who was talking to him cheerfully, suddenly raised her voice. 
Startled, Yong Ho raised his head. Yuria as well as other dungeon spirits looked at him, embarrassed. Lucia shouted again. There is something different about you. Seriously. Something different about you. Ah, uh, oh, no. I'm sorry, I haven't protected you. Sob, sob. I should have seen it. What Lucia said last was the most important. Yong Ho, who smiled awkwardly in embarrassment, sharply looked at Lucia, and she giggled as if she deliberately cracked a joke. Ha, our master has become a man. You have lost your purity, but that's your other charm. As you have been breathed on, why don't you decide to be a bad man from now on? Yong Ho narrowed his eyes even more. He even doubted that Lucia was talking to someone else, not him. Her use of vocabulary was getting more lively day by day. Stop joking now. After whispering to her, he took his hand off Yuria and looked at other dungeon spirits. An unexpected person was standing among them. Ophelia. I, Ophelia, Indirian's daughter, am happy to meet you, master of the Mammon family. I briefly stopped by before heading to the free city. Unlike Yuria, who greeted awkwardly, Ophelia greeted him professionally, rolling her eyes quietly. Catalina, who was standing blankly behind him, looked at her. Hum. Her moaning had mixed meanings. Catalina let her ears droop and curled her lips when she found Ophelia's sharp glance. Eventually, she lowered his head, blushing. Ophelia grinned then told him, who was a bit embarrassed like Catalina, it seems like you had a great and rewarding vacation out there. Congratulations. Her statement was as significant as her gaze. Although Ophelia was not as good as his father in terms of discernment, Yong Ho found it hard to hide his sleeping with Catalina from her. So, he just chuckled. Salami, lying on the floor at some distance, shook its head at Yong Ho's reaction. You've brought lots of stuff here. Can you tell me what they are? Asked Ophelia. Ophelia, one of the good dungeon spirit models, did not put her master in trouble. She changed the topic appropriately. So, he replied right away, well, I don't want to see you empty-handed. So, I've brought a motley of stuff. Indeed, the baggage was full of various stuff. Since they were extraordinarily strong, Yong Ho and Catalina could bring them. The baggage was heavy enough for four or five adults to carry. Yuria, who was closest to Yong Ho, also showed interest in the baggage. She didn't flap her tail or ears like Catalina, but two strands of her hair that protruded like antennae were cutely flapping instead. Baduk, sitting next to Yuria, also sniffed its nose. It seemed that Baduk was trying to prove his smelling power like a dog. All right. Look at this, Yuria. This is a chicken. Yong Ho did not delay opening the baggage. He opened one of the paper boxes on the top of the baggage and showed them the savory seasoned chicken. It was fried chicken prepared by his father passionately for the dungeon spirits of his son and the house of Mammon. There was no chicken as a dish in the demon world, but there were creatures that almost looked like chicken. Yuria and Baduk instinctively realized that what he took out was meat. Baduk already started to drool. Yuria also drooled over it. Yong Ho did not stall for time. He immediately wrapped a chicken leg in a piece of paper and gave it to Yuria. Thanks for the chicken. After thanking him first as she learned, Yuria bit the chicken leg. Then she made an expression she had never made before. Her expression was ecstasy itself. This time, Baduk was drooling profusely over it. Yong Ho handed a piece of chicken to Baduk and observed it happily. He was not sure about their eating culture in the whole demon world, but there was one thing that he could confirm at least within the southern area. The dietary culture in the southern area didn't develop very much. All meat was grilled or boiled raw, and most vegetables were eaten raw or boiled in water. It was the same for the bread made from grain. However, pancakes made with eggs were among the most delicious foods. Of course, even in the southern part of the country, there was something called splendid dishes. For example, Ophelia's tavern sold some quite delicious dishes. But it was hard to say that they were really delicious. The average taste was so low that they just tasted relatively delicious. The reason why the food culture in the southern area was so undeveloped as to rival British cuisine was because of the food situation there. 
since the area was so desolate, they could not properly farm. With nothing around, seafood was also rare, and most of the fruits in the forest were inedible. In a word, food was rare there. It was impossible for them to develop food in this situation. They didn't have enough food to eat right now, so how could they study something like cuisine? It was all thanks to the dungeon market that cooking in the southern area was developed as much as it was now. If the dungeon market had not supplied them with basic food at low prices, the population in the southern area would have certainly been reduced by half. So, long accustomed to the rustic southern food, these dungeon spirits had the first taste of delicious dishes of modern society. What a difference between cooking for survival and cooking for gourmandism. Chapter, 154 Yuria, who ate a chicken leg right away, was so excited that she was jumping up and down in place. It looked like she wanted to express her feelings but couldn't think of the right words. Baduk was chewing on even the chicken bones beside Yuria. Since the two showed such a fantastic response, other dungeon spirits, who gathered near the door of space, watching the two eating carefully, showed deep interest. They were already drooling because of the delicious smell of the chicken. Yom Ho served a piece of chicken to one of the dungeon spirits that pretended to be the most indifferent. She was none other than Ophelia. Hey, Ophelia, try it. It's delicious. Ophelia received one and took a bite of it gracefully. Catalina held the urge to laugh hard while watching her. She then flapped her ears in no time because she saw Ophelia's tails wagging violently. Isn't it delicious? Hmm, yeah, I have to admit it. Ophelia held the urge to take one more bite as much as possible. In fact, she was the hostess of a tavern nearby, which could be called the best restaurant, in the area. So, she didn't want to show them she was making a big fuss over the food. Although she wasn't honest, Yong Ho was satisfied because he also noticed her tail wagging fervently even without Catalina's signaling to him with her eyes. Yong Ho opened a few more chicken boxes and handed them out to those dungeon spirits that gathered near the door of space. While everyone was enjoying the chicken happily, Trey Ant, which couldn't eat food, let its branches droop with a long face. Let me tell you what I have brought here. Ophelia, who secretly packed a box for Eligos, turned around in embarrassment. Instead of embarrassing her, Yong Ho naturally pointed to the box stacked right under the chicken. This is Coke. It's a soft drink. It's really the best if you drink it cold. Yong Ho just felt good just by looking at it. But Ophelia was a little different. She blinked her eyes several times and asked in a cautious tone, Master, did you bring only something to eat? So what? Ophelia's pretty eyebrows frowned a bit. He heartily laughed at her gaze that reflected regret and a little bit of patheticness. I'm kidding, of course. He removed the boxes of clothes he bought for some dungeon spirits such as Catalina, Yuria, and Ophelia. He then pointed to the things laid under them. There were stacks of large bags. I bought some seeds. Seeds? Do you mean seeds to grow crops? Right. The grains supplied by the dungeon market are okay, but their breed was not improved. These seeds are a better breed you can grow properly in the garden of life. There were potatoes in the human world, and there were similar crops like potatoes in the demon world, but they were different. Potatoes in the demon world were small and tasteless, and they didn't taste as good as those in the human world. It was because of the difference in crop breeding. Potatoes in the human world were improved in a way that they became bigger, more delicious, and more productive. Compared with wild corn that didn't go through crop breeding with the corn grown on a farm, grains of the latter were ten times as many as the former. All the crops supplied by the dungeon market couldn't be called wild crops, but they were inferior to their counterparts in the human world. That was why Yongho brought the seeds. The garden of life was not just fertile land. There was an aura of growth promotion that originated in Skathaka's vitality, whose amount would make it possible to collect several times as many seeds within a few months. And these are books on farming. I've also brought some cookbooks. Although Ophelia did not know the human characters, she could roughly guess what kind of information was in it. After admiring the excellent binding of the books and the printing method, she agreed with his opinion. If we can provide delicious meals of excellent quality, the morale of dungeon spirits will go up greatly. After all, 
all of them are working to eat. Moreover, the pleasure of eating was very important in the demon world where there were few dishes to enjoy. It was far from the situation wherein the army soldiers paid lots of attention to the taste of combat food. Except for chicken, coke, and a few favorite items, it was no exaggeration to say that virtually all of the items in Yong Ho's baggage were agricultural products. Since his visit to the human world was made so suddenly and his stay there was so brief, he could not afford to buy other stuff. Yong Ho felt it rather awkward to bring out clothes for Yuria and Ophelia lastly in the presence of other dungeon spirits, so he changed the topic. How have you been here? Didn't anything else happen while I wasn't here? Restoring their strength is going on well. Brother Eli and Skull are returning to the House of Mammon with the Skull Unit. Maybe they will arrive by tomorrow morning. They started late because they were wounded, but they are all in good shape now. You don't have to worry. Ophelia paused for a moment then continued after catching her breath. The House of Randolph has stabilized again under Tigrius' command. I'm going to go back to the Free City tomorrow. And the bones of the bone dragon have been stored safely in the warehouse. Bergrim is so anxious to work on his dream right now. Listening to her briefing quietly, Yong Ho opened his eyes wide and asked, Huh? Bergrim is just looking at them now. Yes, since the bones of the bone dragon are a valuable asset. It is impossible for Bergrim to tamper with them without your permission. Cutting him off, she related the rest of her briefing to him. A battle between the runaway soldiers seems to have broken out in the west, as expected. I guess refugees from the west will come in a few days. In the case of the north and the east sorry. I have not yet gathered intelligence about the situation there. However, I think those in the east will have heard about Embryo's death by now. So, I think they will have to choose whether to attack the southern area or defend their own land by the day after tomorrow at the latest. Don't worry. They are far away from us anyway. What about the remnant soldiers? Those runaway soldiers, who fled to the south, were not engaged in any suspicious activities yet. Contrary to our concerns, Demon King Lotus of the Wild Animals seems to have moved westward. The situation was very favorable for Yong Ho. It seemed that he didn't have to worry about them at this point. June, take the remaining chicken to the restaurant and hand it out to other dungeon spirits and move all other packages to my room. June, the only female goblin ranger, who was playing the role of butler Eligos, bowed to him and followed his order. John, Ron, and Jan moved with June like they were one. Although there were three helping her, they acted in perfect unison. Master, you must have been very tired from your journey. Are you going to move around right away? When Lucia quickly asked quick-wittedly, Yong Ho replied in a low voice, you know I had a good rest for two days. And it seems that there are a lot who have been waiting for my return anxiously for the two days I was away. He recalled several of them in his mind. Catalina approached him. Leaning toward him, she, who had a deeper bond with him than ordinary dungeon spirits, asked, which one would you want to see first? Well, let me think about it. I guess she's going to wait for me more earnestly. He beat around the bush, but Catalina instantly knew who she was, for they could understand each other's intention just by looking at their eyes. Catalina curled her lips slightly when he mentioned that woman. I was worried that the power of your anguish would disappear I think my concern was unfounded. The power of your anguish has become stronger. Yong Ho was standing in the middle of the arena. There was no enemy on the other side. There was the wreckage of the thirteenth floor floor master, giant war golem, scattered everywhere after being completely shattered. The instant opening of his mana, which could be better called explosion, was far from simple. Mana released by Yong Ho was always different. Depending on the color and properties of the opponent's mana, he brought out the opposite. Yong Ho himself possessed only three attributes flame, chill, and lightning but the mana he released during battle was much more diverse. Not only Catalina's darkness, but also Eligos's land and Ophelia's wind were added to his strength. Amon did not hide his satisfaction. Yong Ho became stronger. His spearmanship made a lot of progress, so he really looked like a master spearman. Your previous anguish had a mix of shame, inferiority, and anger. But now it is different. It is a purer desire. 
you have the desire to have more and the confidence in having more. Indeed, such desire can be said to fit your greed. Desire. I am proud of you since you are faithful to your desires. Obviously, Amun praised him, but he didn't feel like that. Ah, uh, please. Yong Ho wished Amun didn't mention it in a serious voice like that. He swung Amun briskly and turned the spear into a bracelet then hurriedly fanned himself with his hand. After taking off heat from his face to some extent, he took Mammon's mana and the rewards of the arena. Mammon's mana tasted delicious. Perhaps, thanks to the growth in his ability to utilize greed, the efficiency rate of him absorbing mana also improved. The reward is usually good. It was a ring that improved the concentration of magic casters. He felt he had better give it to Tigrius. When Yong Ho turned after wrapping up, Catalina, who was waiting in the audience, stood up suddenly and clapped her hands. Yong Ho felt satisfied with her reaction. Oh my look at her turning up her mouth with joy, said Gusayan. Instead of responding right away, Yong Ho used Catalina's black mana as brigada. Then something amazing happened. Chapter, 155 Yong Ho jumped more than 20 meters with just one foot roll. He jumped so high that it seemed like he was flying. Its principle was simple. The moment he kicked off the ground, the black mana released from his legs propelled him off the ground strongly. Landing right in front of Catalina, he reached out and hugged her waist. Once again, using black mana, he stood in front of Gus Ion this time. His action was completely different from showing off his Herculean power. Only the one who could use black mana freely could make such a gentle jump. Moreover, Yong Ho performed the same tricks as before with the mana of his dungeon spirit he brought out through Brigada, not his own mana. Hey, you can do something extraordinary. You seem to have become too strong suddenly, don't you? Said Gus Ion, laughing loudly. Snorting at him, he let go of Catalina. Then he flopped down across from Gus Ion. Stop eating, man. I've brought it here for Catalina. Are you going to eat it all? Hey, don't blame me for eating. Actually, I've got one left for her. I know you are the king of greed, so don't be mean to me. They exchanged barbed words, but they just did it jokingly. Yong Ho looked at the chicken box with a bit of regret on his face. Kai Wan was recuperating in the recovery room of the arena. It was natural that she was still in bed because she was injured heavily during her fight with Embryo. Don't worry. Even those who were battered by you are up and running once they are discharged from the recovery room. You can see them next time, said Kai Wan. That's good. After replying quickly, Yong Ho caught his breath. After trying to forget her smile that kept popping up in his mind, he faced Gus Ian. Yong Ho could see his smiling face, which was so familiar to him by now, but at the same time, he could see his face, who was crying and begging. Of course, his second image was an illusion. It was from the memory that he had read from Mammon's legacy in the human world. Mammon didn't tell him everything, saying he wasn't qualified yet. Mammon also said twelve spirits of the House of Mammon, such as Gusion and Skathak, were not ready yet, but he didn't tell Yong Ho the truth about his own death. But it didn't mean that there were no clues at all. Yong Ho could create a single picture, though incomplete, by putting together the fragments one by one. Mammon didn't share his last moment with the twelve spirits. Yong Ho could not know what caused Mammon's death, but he was certain they were not with him during his last moment. At that time, Gus Ion cried and begged Mammon to allow him to stay with the master until his last moment. Citri was looking up to the sky, hugging Alun who was dying. Skathak asked Yong Ho to fight with his dungeon spirits all the time. And Mammon went alone, leaving all of them behind. Mammon died alone. Then, who and what killed him? Why was there no record of his death in history? There was one more question. Why do Mammon's twelve spirits hide the truth from Yong Ho? What were the qualifications Mammon mentioned? Gus Ion wants to tell me about it, Yong Ho thought to himself. He could feel it. Amon, Skathak, and Citri hid the secret, but for different reasons. Gus Ion was holding the urge to tell. On the other hand, Amon and Skathak didn't want to talk from the beginning. Why were they divided about it? 
Yong Ho remembered Mammon's words, I have always been faithful to my desires. Because of that, I do not regret my choice. That was what Mammon said to him. At first, Yong Ho thought he said it to express his satisfaction. But he came to think differently about it when he reflected on it more. He felt like Mammon was drawing a line between himself and Yong Ho. I hope you can do the same, too. Go your way act according to your desires. Don't be bound by Mammon himself. Yong Ho blinked. At that moment, Gus Ion, in reality, not in his memory, was looking at him anxiously and said, Little master. Are you feeling ill? Were the wounds you got from embryo infected? No, I'm a little tired. I understand. You broke through three floors at once. There were almost very few who challenged the floor recklessly like you after the tenth floor. Kaiwan lost on and on, but finally, she continued to challenge persistently and climbed it. There were seven floors for Yong Ho to challenge before the twentieth floor, where Kaiwan lost. Considering the corresponding increase in difficulty, it seemed that he could reach the nineteenth floor without much difficulty. Come to think of it. Suddenly, he said something that came to his mind, so he asked Gus Ion, is there any other floor where they issue a summons on the way to the nineteenth floor? Gus Ion answered, well, I can't guarantee, but you might get one because you will challenge the floor after the tenth floor. Even if they issue a summons, it's not difficult to get you one. By the way, why do you need a summons? Are you going to bring Kaiwan to do something? Gus Ion accurately read his mind. Yong Ho nodded. In fact, like Gus Ion pointed out, Yong Ho planned to summon Kaiwan if he could obtain a summons. Well, I want to experiment with one thing. So, he needed Kaiwan only. The situation could be a little different if another previous master of the House of Mammon appeared on his way to the 19th floor, but right now, he couldn't think of any other candidate than Kaiwan. Nodding slowly at his earnest answer, Gus Ion asked, looking back at Amun, the flames of the red lotus next to him, Amun, is it true that the anguish of our little master is getting stronger? It's getting stronger. But. It's a little bit different. It is greed, not lust. Of course, it doesn't mean that there is no lust in it at all. At that moment, Yong Ho shook his hand wildly and stopped Amun from talking more. Somehow, it seemed that Catalina was making a sullen expression behind his back. Why did Gus Ion, who usually never cracked a joke, mention it in a situation like this and put him on the spot? Yong Ho, sighing at Amun's gentle laugh, said to Gus Ion, Deliver the chicken to Kai Wan well with my best regards. Let me go back. He stood up. Gus Ion saw him off in person. I see. That's why you said you needed my approval. It was really very late when Yong Ho left the arena, but instead of going to the Demon King's room, Yong Ho headed to Bergrim's workshop because he knew well that Bergrim was looking forward to seeing him. On top of Bergrim's workbench was a whole bone almost the size of Catalina. It was part of the ribs of the bone dragon. The bone dragon's bone was definitely a great material. It was hard and light, and it had strong magical energy inside it. Nonetheless, it was bone, not metal. Its processing was not smooth. It was impossible to melt it like metal then harden it to reshape it. The only way to process a dragon's bones was to drill it. If one ground a bone to make a knife, it was inevitable to discard some bones. And it was almost impossible to utilize all the discarded bones. Of course, dragon bones were also valuable as a magic catalyst, so they were not discarded forever. But the bones required lots of waste in the process of making tools. That was why Bergrim waited for Yong Ho. Only after receiving a specific order and getting his permission to use the amount of bone could Bergrim start working on. Desire was flaring up in Bergrim's eyes. His eyes were glittering as strongly as when he was longing for the evolution of mana. Yong Ho thought to himself, is it similar to the situation where he obtained an incredible toy in his hand? Yong Ho could not know it. He just giggled at Bergrim and gave him a specific order. Aside from making the dragon soldiers, which could be called high-level skeletons, he had no specific plan about how to use the bones, so he decided to provide Bergrim only one large fong and a few small bones. He thought this would be enough for Bergrim to make weapons and armor for his dungeon spirits. 
Bergrim started working right away. It seemed that he had no intention of taking a break until he produced the results. Catalina, who came out on the hallway, said with admiration, he always seems to be passionate whenever I see him. Yeah. He's completely different from when I saw him the first time, right? She nodded. When Yong-ho first came to the house of Mammon, Bergrim was languid with his eyes drooping. It wasn't just Bergrim that changed. All the dungeon spirits of the house of Mammon have changed since then. Butler Eligos has changed a lot too, she said with mixed feelings. At that moment, Yong-ho chuckled because he recalled the bleak house of Mammon when he saw it first. John and Ron, the first dungeon spirits that he bought at the dungeon market, were no longer just goblins. It had been a long time since they surpassed ordinary goblins not only in appearance but also in their abilities. Even if they fight ogres even now, they were highly likely to win. Heading to the Demon King's room with Catalina, he chatted with her. There were almost no dungeon spirits in the hallway because it was so late at night. When they finally reached the room, he heard Lucia's voice. Master, it's deep at night. You have to take a rest now. Yong-ho knitted his brows, while Lucia kept talking. Pit a pat Lubbed up. This time, let me count from one to ten. Uh. Our connection is getting lost. Master. When did you get this skill? I'll hate you if you disconnect the line with me. Lucia, which was interrupted in the middle of her talking, completely disappeared in the end. Freed from her connection, Yong-ho reached out to Catalina, who opened her eyes wide, not knowing what happened. Let's go. We're going to be busy tomorrow. Time for rest now. That was true. Tomorrow he was going to summon dragon soldiers and evolve dungeon spirits including Skull. Probably, he would use more mana tomorrow than today. Catalina blinked once. She looked back at her room at the entrance of the Demon King's room and smiled differently. Then she said warmly to him, who made an awkward expression, Sure, master. She held his hands, then naturally stepped into the room of the Demon King. Unlike the southern area where peace was restored, the northern area was on fire. It was the chaos caused by Embryo's death. The eastern army struck the northern army fiercely. Some of the northern soldiers fought a deadly battle, while others gave up too easily, surrendering to the eastern army. Embryo's dungeon was also among those that were ruined and burnt down. It was a small and insignificant dungeon. For this reason, few of the northern army knew that the dungeon burning right now before their eyes was Embryo's. A wolf went out of the burning dungeon. The wolf came out to fulfill his order that he gave before leaving the dungeon. The leader who led the herd of wolves was killed. However, the leader's members weren't killed altogether just because their leader was killed. If a new leader appeared, they could continue to survive as long as they wanted. The wolf carrying Embryo's legacy suddenly left the northern area. The wolf headed south to join the killed leader's runaway soldiers, who had followed him. The wolf was the new leader that Embryo had nominated as the new leader just before his death. It was the wolf that Emmerbio recognized as the king. The moonlight was cloudy. The wolf ran through the dark night. Chapter 156 There was an expansion of fertile land under the sparkling artificial sun. It was the laws of nature that life would be born and would grow. It was not different here. Countless plants sprouted, grew, and bore fruit. It was a scene that one felt warm about just by looking at it. The golden waves of wheat swayed like waves in the wind, and the corns in full ear were shyly wrapped in green leaves. Strawberries and grapes, which would surely smell so sweet in one's mouth with a bite, also showed off their beauty with their own colors. It was beautiful. It was a scene that made one feel the greatness of life and nature, except for a bit of a sense of strangeness. Don't you think our little master is so mean this time like he was last time? Scathack, the immortal witch and the owner of the Garden of Life in charge of healing the twelve spirits of the House of Mammon, frowned. The Garden of Life was full of death. Nearly fifty skeleton soldiers were absorbed in farming with their own farming tools. As they were new to the garden, many of them weren't familiar with farming, but they made up for their clumsy skills through their meticulous and repetitive actions peculiar to the undead. 
The way that the undead in the realm of death cultivated plants caused Scathack to feel an instinctive sense of strangeness. Moreover, there were more than fifty skeletons in the garden. Similar things were going on in all four circular rooms on the first floor. In some rooms, they grew fruit intensively, and in other rooms, they grew preference items such as sugar cane, cacao, and tobacco. The most impressive among them was the room where they grew medicinal materials such as hemp and poppy. The beautiful garden where Scathack healed the visitor's mind and body did not exist anymore. Instead, there were only rice paddies and fields filled with the smell of manure from all directions. Yong Ho, who returned from the human world, increased the number of skeletons a lot. Skeleton workers, who could be called the lowest dungeon spirit, were very cheap. A dragon's single finger bone, which cost less than pure dragon bones, could buy tens of skeleton workers. Yong Ho purchased a total of 200 skeleton workers. There were very few masters of houses who bought as many skeleton workers as he. When Yong Ho recalled Skull when he arrived at the House of Mammon, it was natural that he thought so. Skeleton workers performed very badly. They were weak and slow. Of course, they were good at repetitive work almost without taking any break, but their efficiency was so low that it was hard to regard it as their strength. Besides, their learning ability was also limited. Given these factors, it was questionable whether the unit price of skeletons was really cheap. Nonetheless, Yong Ho purchased skeleton workers in large quantities, for he had some measures to deal with them unlike an ordinary master of a house. Oops sorry. I was nodding off. What did you say? Yong Ho, with his whole body buried in the blue liquid, spoke slowly with his eyes half-closed. He had shadows under his eyes. On the day he bought the skeleton workers, Yong Ho promoted all of them to skeleton soldiers. They were literally tremendous construction workers. However, with the money to buy 200 skeleton workers, he took advantage of gaining 200 skeleton soldiers. It was a really profitable business, given that he would promote them to skeleton warriors or higher beings later. It was good to have an elite force, but it was also necessary to have as many skeletons as possible. Yong Ho learned and felt a lot while fighting Embryo. From now on, he intended to use the power of evolution more aggressively. Scathack let out a long sigh again, after all. Instead of blaming Yong Ho, who looked worn out with fatigue, she turned her eyes at the dragon soldiers that made her feel uncomfortable. She frowned at them again. Unlike typical skeletons, the dragon soldiers were farming by twos and threes in a field. They were seven, all told, but each of them was strong enough to be equivalent to five or six skeleton knights. To convert them into skeleton soldiers, they were worth more than a few hundred. It was really eerie and terrifying to see them, about two meters tall, squatting on the field and hoeing clumsily. It was unthinkable for them to be engaged in such manual labor. As dragon soldiers, they were supposed to be proud of themselves. As an undead, they wouldn't disobey their owner's orders, but they could throw tantrums and complain while working. However, the dragon soldiers were busy hoeing hard. It was because another powerful being that could smash their pride at once was also squatting and honing like them. Skull Skull Dragon Bone Knight Its existence itself was different from general dragon soldiers. It was huge. It even gave the aura of grandeur beyond just being huge. Its color was pure white itself. Since it was made from the hardest and sharpest fangs of the dragon's bones, it was slender and sturdy. Its anti-magic resistance was also excellent. It would obviously ignore any typical mana. The purple flame burning in its head, reminiscent of a humanoid or dragon, caused wonder and fear at the same time. It was a great warrior that could confront a death knight, arguably the pinnacle of the skeleton warrior series. Skullkull. After murmuring something like the sun is so warm, so it's good for me rolling on the floor, Dragon Bone Knight got down to hoeing hard again. Scathack murmured, come on, it went too far. She felt like that because she witnessed the whole process of Skull being reborn as a Dragon Bone Knight. Yong Ho really invested a lot in Skull. So, his efforts to create a dragon soldier to be used for evolving Skull were unusual from the beginning. First of all, he selected the best quality of the dragon's teeth as materials. 
Then he went through one more process instead of simply using the scroll of summoning a dragon soldier as he did for other dragon soldiers. It was Tigrius's combination magic. Tigrius, who was summoned from the house of Randold, used the scroll of summoning a dragon soldier and that of summoning a skeleton mage at the same time. And he combined the two magics with the power of combination magic. Of course, it wasn't easy. Yongho didn't use the magic by himself. It was the magic contained in the scroll. Moreover, Tigrius's power itself was weakened after he became Yongho's dungeon spirit. Nonetheless, Tigrius finally succeeded. Although he wasted the scroll of summoning a dragon soldier and the scroll of summoning a skeleton mage, his efforts paid off anyway. Thus, a dragon soldier with the power of a skeleton mage was born. This time, Ophelia did her bit. To prevent an emergency, she weakened the ego of the dragon soldier with mental magic. She badly complained about having to kiss a skeleton, but the price she paid for that was very cheap compared to the results. Of course, this was what Yong Ho thought to himself. Finally, Yong Ho activated a combination magic evolution. He was satisfied with the outcome. Just looking at it, he felt like his belly was full even without eating anything. Skull now had the physical strength that surpasses a dragon soldier and the magic ability that surpasses typical combat wizards. The small number of magic that Skull could use was somewhat its weakness, but it was still more than enough to be used in battle. Skull had been reborn as a deceptive all-weather wizard warrior with strong attack power, high defensive abilities that could ignore typical magic but use its own attack magic. Despite that, Skull was hoeing humbly in the field. No matter how powerful it was reborn, Skull was still a Skull. Scathack clicked her tongue then turned to Yong Ho again. He was half asleep at the moment. She asked, I know you overworked yourself these days. Then you didn't sleep at all last night. Tell me honestly. You didn't sleep properly for the past several days, right? Yong Ho flinched at her questioning. Then Lucia cut in as if she had been waiting for this chance until now. You're right. Scathack, just listen to me. You've got to spread this gossip everywhere. I've got one thing to tell you. Whispering. Whispers. Oh my god. How indecent. Scathack screamed with both hands on her cheeks. But Yong Ho shouted, Lucia, you didn't hear anything except for the whispering, right? I just kept working. That's all. Really? Are you sure you just worked, doing nothing else? You disconnected the communication link with me, who's cute, pretty, poor, and miserable, and just kept working for several days. Are you sure? As if she was really disappointed in him for the past few days, Lucia pressured him a lot. Burying himself in the blue liquid, he cleared his throat and said, well, let me exercise the right to remain silent. He felt it fortunate that Ophelia was not here at the moment. Catalina was asleep, wrapped in blue liquid across from him. If she had been awake and seen this, she would have been very embarrassed. Scathack burst into laughter. After soothing Lucia with kind words, she said, You've got nothing to be ashamed of. It's natural, and you're the king of greed anyway. Then she lifted his blue watery eyes and looked a little further away. She continued, I want to make more money. I want to have a woman. I want to be strong. I want to grow a dungeon. I want to evolve dungeon spirits. All this is greed. There is no such thing as a high or low greed because it's hope and wish. It's what everybody really wants. Staring in the air, she turned her eyes back at him and earnestly said like his mother, greed itself is not bad because it is the driving force of our life and development. So, just desire it as much as you want. Just keep wishing for it. Don't be shy. Your strong wish will be your strength in no time. She made a beautiful and brilliant smile. Yong Ho, who unwittingly looked at her, enchanted with her charming smile, seemed to understand why she had the power of life. Come to think of it. There was something that came to his mind. Chapter, 157 Yong Ho asked right away, Scathack was life and Baphomet was death, right? Is the power of the twelve spirits of the house of Mammon like that? Isn't it something like concept, not attributes such as earth, fire, or wind? 
Scat Hat clapped her hands to hear it and said, How discerning you are. You're right. Most of us twelve spirits are using concepts as our power, which can be said to be the result of the intellectual activity of the lives with their own will and emotions. Then, what about Gus Ion? He asked it instinctively, but the more he thought about Gus Ion, the more curious he was because he could not think of any concept that suited Gus Ion. She waved her hands and said, Ask him directly. My sweetheart has the power suitable for him perfectly. Ah, it's not something like cuteness. I almost gave you a correct answer. Well, I don't think he isn't even close to cuteness. Uh. Why? You will never know how cute he is when we are alone. So much so that I want to tell others how cute he is. She said, blushing, but he tried not to imagine his being cute to her. He felt goosebumps at the thought that Gus Ion was acting cute to her when they were together. What is Alun's power? He didn't mention it just to change the topic. Checking it out was important to him because he was planning to start attacking the third floor of the Labyrinth of Greed today. Well, it's the power that suits Alun the most. But at the same time, it is also a very ambiguous force. Depending on who has her power, the strength and weakness of her power will be very different. But I believe you can use her power as well as anybody else. It seemed that she didn't want to answer his question fully. After he got out of the blue liquid, Yong Ho summoned Skull and the dragon soldiers. He also ordered Lucia to call Eligos and Ophelia. About thirty minutes later Yong Ho was done preparing for the attack and left the Garden of Life. He headed for the Labyrinth of Greed on the third floor, the realm of Elun. Dragon Fear, it was one of the several powers that the descendants of the great dragon lord that inherited the vein of fantasy fully. It was an overwhelming power. Its existence itself caused others instinctive fear. Reborn as a dragon bone knight, Skull could exert power similar to dragon fear. It was a powerful force that could not even be compared with the fear of death that the ordinary undead induced to the living. So much so that a road was opened the moment Skull stepped forward. Wendigos, the dungeon monsters that resembled a monkey, who were in charge of controlling the entrance to the third floor, couldn't even dare to approach Skull's party. The only thing they could do was to scream in anger while shuddering. Bucephalus, which was carrying Skull on its back, moved on ostensibly as if he was boasting. Since Bucephalus had been promoted to Nightmare Vanguard after the bloody battle with the Death Knight, his showy marching was quite a view. Looking back once, Bucephalus snorted hard. It seemed meaningless to others, but Salami took it differently. Shaking its head as if it was upset, Salami kept signaling to Yong Ho with its eyes. Yong Ho understood Salami's feelings. That was why he gently got off Salami's back and waved his hand. He looked at Eligos, who was gleaming with a strong desire to win, promoted by Skull's pompous behavior then gave him a brief order. Kill them. There were hundreds of Wendigos. But it didn't take long for all of them to collapse. It looks like the third floor is a gambling hall, said Ophelia, looking around. Since the battle was not over yet, she was still in combat mode, and her voice was more excited than usual because of that. After getting rid of hundreds of Wendigos in the room at the entrance, Yong Ho continued to move inside. Just like the other floors of the Labyrinth of Greed, the third floor was also full of dungeon monsters piled up over a thousand years, so the battle never ceased. Yong Ho stepped back and watched in order to get the Dungeon Spirit's Evolution EXP. He then looked around like Ophelia. He asked Ophelia puzzlingly, Did you say this is a gambling place? The third floor was more like indoor rather than the first or second floor. The first entrance room's ceiling was so high and spacious that Salami could even fly there, but it wasn't after that. There was a series of corridors, so he felt like he entered a large dungeon. Currently, the place where Yong Ho and his party stopped was a space that could be called a gathering place. There was a towering path in the middle of the square-shaped room, and a wide staircase was connected to the floor about one meter low. Since the stairs were connected to the whole road, it could be said that the central passage was made of stones stacked in a pyramid shape on the flat ground. Although there were several long grooves in the stone ground, that was it. So, he felt like it was a square rather than a gambling hall. Ophelia explained, it seems to be a traditional slime stadium. Those stairs look like seats, 
and there are slimes racing along the grooves on the ground. Originally, things like partitions should be stretched along the grooves, but they seem to have been broken with the passage of time. I can see quite a bit of debris around. Probably they might have bet money over there and got the dividend. She seemed to have a point. Recalling the racetrack he went with his father, he imagined the slimes crawling hard along the rails one after another. They didn't move vigorously, but they looked pretty cute, he thought. I found some traces in the room where we first entered, things like dice and gambling chips. Probably they might have gambled at several small tables in that room, just like they did in my tavern. Uh. Wasn't the second floor of the gateway to the labyrinth of greed? Gambling room right next to the door. Well, they could express their confidence like that because this is no other than the labyrinth of greed. And in my opinion, it seems that the third floor is a space to support the entire load. I mean magical load rather than a physical one. That's why the room or passage is narrower than the first or second floor, and the ceiling is low. In other words, it's a multi-purpose room, right? Yes, I think there is a good chance that a real luxury gambling house was built on a deeper floor. At that very moment, thunder crashed. It was the sound of Skull hitting the head of the one-eyed giant standing at the exit with a battle hammer. The head of the giant, nearly six meters tall, literally shattered into pieces. Instead of watching Salami and Eligos, who were fighting hard, Yong Ho kept asking Ophelia. By the way, is a gambling room an essential dungeon facility? He asked because the gambling room here was about the size of a racetrack. So, he did not understand quickly because she mentioned that a high-end gambling place was probably on a deeper floor. She knitted her brows a bit and replied, I told you about it once before, but it is a useful space in many ways. As one of the twelve spirits of the House of Mammon, I would like to strongly recommend that you install it in the Mammon House, too. How about a bar there? Just as you're faithful to your desire, the dungeon spirits are also faithful to their own desires. They need a playing area where they can satisfy their desires. Hmm. Actually, she was right. Unlike young Yuria or Baduk just content with something to eat, orcs might have various desires. Although the free city was available as a place to satisfy their desires, it was so far away from the House of Mammon. Obviously they couldn't go that far after their work was over. Although the ratio of undead spirits like skeletons was overwhelmingly high at the House of Mammon, general dungeon spirits also increased a lot in the process of Yongho absorbing Free City and the House of Randolt. As the owner of the dungeon, Yongho could not help but consider the welfare of the dungeon spirits. What about other masters? I mean the masters of larger dungeons. Since the masters of dungeons in the southern area, especially the dungeons of those masters affiliated with Yongho, were weak, their dungeons were not big. What he wanted to refer to was the dungeons outside the southern area and the dungeons of powerful masters at that. Ophelia smiled brightly and said, there are many good cases where they build huge estates outside their dungeons. You mean something like a village, right? Yes. Besides, the role of an estate is not just a place to satisfy their desires. It serves as a driving force that can help them control a much larger number of dungeon spirits than a normal dungeon. Aside from the labyrinth of greed, it is difficult for thousands or tens of thousands of spirits to live in a typical dungeon. You bet. Right now, the free city was playing a similar role. It was necessary for Yong Ho to secure a space where a large number of people could stay in order to command thousands of soldiers. Actually he asked the question casually, so he stopped delving into it further. It would not be too late for him to devise about building an estate after occupying the third floor. While Yong Ho and Ophelia were exchanging opinions, almost all of the dungeon monsters in the slime stadium were wiped out. He looked back at Catalina, who was guarding him as his escort knight rather than fighting directly because she was smiling at him strangely. Noticing his gaze, she replied quickly, Well, I feel the gambling place here looks good because Alun, not anybody else, is in charge. Libra Alun, to quote Skathaka's words, she was one of the twelve spirits who was sincere and methodical. Yong Ho also naturally nodded. Her images that he remembered in his memories were far from gambling. She was strict, serious, and stern in everything. Like Catalina said, however, he thought she was a good fit as the manager of the gambling place. 
does it mean she ensures fairness in the gambling place? Anybody could trust Elun, and she would not give short weight and short measure anyway. Catalina nodded quickly, saying that it was exactly what she thought. But Ophelia was different. She said with a wicked smile, well, what I say may sound impertinent, but her presence in the gambling place may be a sophisticated strategy for true deception. After all, a gambling house is a place where the gambling house, not the clients, wins. This was the statement by the former hostess of the tavern, who used to run the largest gambling house in the free city. Chapter 158 Catalina opened her eyes wide at her statement, while Yong Ho imagined a situation where he, who squandered family fortune at the gambling place, watched Yuria and Baduk crying while lying on the floor. For some reason, Salami was also crying beside them. Yong Ho felt he needed to think twice about setting up a gambling room in the dungeon of the Mammon House. Let's keep going anyway. By now, the dungeon monsters at the entrance were removed already. Yong Ho walked toward Salami bravely making the snorting mixed with sparks. The third floor was a gambling room, as Ophelia expected. Yong Ho passed several simplified arenas, rooms with roulettes, and lounges before standing before a tightly sealed door. Like the Garden of Life, Scat Hacka's space, the third floor gambling house was structured so that he could go down to the fourth floor without having to pass by the twelve spirits. In front of the sealed room was a large staircase leading down to the fourth floor. Elun, one of the twelve spirits and Mammon's escort knight, already died. However, Scat Hack told Yong Ho that Elun must have left behind her surrogate. For this reason, Yong Ho again ordered Skull and Salami to step back. He allowed only himself and his dungeon spirits to enter the room. At his order, Skull and Elagos opened the tightly closed door. The room was spacious and quiet. Yong Ho didn't need to throw a lighting device. The moment the door was opened, a soft light poured down from the ceiling. It was like moonlight. He stopped Skull from trying to walk ahead then pulled Amon out of the air. His greed naturally triggered as if he was breathing. Some of the colored smoke arising from him wrapped around the dungeon spirits, and the rest spread into every nook and cranny of the room. He took the first step. Darkness in the room and the light from the ceiling reacted to him. Every time he took one step, darkness was cleared away. The light from the ceiling illuminated the place where he stepped forward, as if to guide him. There was no such thing as a trap. Led by Catalina, the dungeon spirits began to follow him one by one. And when he finally reached the middle of the room, the door that was open wide closed smoothly. The light guiding him became stronger, while the other lights from all sides dimmed. It was like starlight that dimmed when the moonlight got brighter. The soft golden light became one. It formed a lump of light then took the shape of a human in no time. It was a blurry shape. However, Yong Ho could see it clearly. Golden hair and a red eye patch. Libra, one of Mammon's twelve spirits. Elun who cuts the night. It was a beautiful scene. Standing up from the light, she breathed softly. Everything about her coincided with the woman in his memory. Despite her slender figure, he didn't think she was fragile at all. Rather, he felt she was strong, determined, and sharp. She opened her mouth, the king of greed, who has finally returned. At that moment, Yong Ho knew that none of the previous masters of the House of Mammon could face Elun. She opened her eyes in response to his greed. Elun continued, what you are facing now is a mere shadow of the old me. But don't worry. I am obviously Elun that cuts the night. And I, standing before you now, will think and judge the same way I do. On the day Mammon died, Elun also died. Moreover, Elun died ahead of Mammon. So, the Elun that was standing here was her ghost. She was a kind of alter ego she had left behind right before she went out of the labyrinth of greed lastly. But it was exactly what Elun said. She could not be classified as a mere ghost. Yong Ho felt like he faced the very Elun in his memory. Even the dungeon spirits realized that they were facing a legend just like when they encountered Skathak and Gusayan. In particular, Catalina seemed to have been more impressed than other spirits perhaps because she shared with Elun her unique characteristics such as an escort knight and a lover. Catalina looked at her with a pious expression. 
Well, it's a good introduction. Can you show me your face a little more clearly? Ilun said kindly. She wasn't necessarily as sharp as a sword. She, who had loved everything about Mammon, also loved him because he was Mammon's descendant. She wanted to face him kindly as if she were his mother. Yong Ho took a couple of steps again to get closer to Ilun. Although she was wearing an eye patch to cover her eyes, Ilun had a mental vision. She could easily see through anything that ordinary people could not see. Ilun gently caressed his cheeks. A smile came to her lips naturally. You look like that person. He didn't need to ask who that person was. Withdrawing her hand, she took a step back. Once again, she took a look at him as a whole then said brightly, You're very attractive. I don't know how many generations have passed, but it was certain that a person's blood must be flowing in your body. And you seem to have inherited the blood of the Incubus a lot. It must be the blood of the famous and powerful Incubus family. Pardon? Yong Ho raised his voice before he knew it. Ilun laughed gently and said, Don't be too surprised. I can figure out this kind of stuff very easily. How can you? He blurred. He felt something was strange, but he thought maybe she was right. Above all, her voice was full of confidence. It's been quite a while since you became the king of greed. I can feel gravity in you. You seem to be older than you look. And. Wait a minute, he said, shaking his hand quickly. First of all, I'm from the human world. I don't know my ancestors, but my father is just a normal human. It's only been about half a year since I became the master of the House of Mammon. Ah. Uh, Ilun said in a strange tone. It was a familiar scene for Yong Ho. Oh no, I can't believe my ears. You became the master only six months ago. Your blood was not mixed with an incubus. Remarkably embarrassed, Ilun quickly looked at his lower body. Aside from her embarrassment, she blushed. He quickly covered his lower body with his hand as if he was also embarrassed. He was sure why this scene was familiar to him. Dang it! How can she be wrong? Ophelia murmured, narrowing her eyes. Eligos leered at Catalina while Skull looked at Catalina openly. Catalina was so shy at the moment. As if she was humiliated, she was at a loss of what to do, turning red. Put to shame, she lost their reverence, let alone mystery about her. In the same league as Elun, Catalina, who couldn't stand it anymore, covered her face with both hands. Likewise, Elun did the same. It took a lot of time for the two escort knights, who shared everything over a thousand years, to regain their composure. You, the king of greed who has finally returned. Her voice was elegant and beautiful. Resonating hazily in the moonlight, it was truly fantasy itself. But Yong Ho said, knitting his brows, wait a minute. It seems unreasonable to start over from the beginning as if nothing happened. Not only Yong Ho, but also the dungeon spirits of the Mammon family looked at Ilun with mixed feelings such as cold, compassion, and regret, etc. Ilun curled her lips and said, so mean. Grumbling a bit, Ilun suddenly stretched out her hand then pointed to Catalina, who was feeling shy like her. Hey, come over here. Uh, me? Yes, you. Since she was singled out suddenly, Catalina blinked, embarrassed, then turned to Yong Ho as if to ask for his permission. When he nodded a bit, she scurried to Ilun. Ilun let out a long sigh. She quickly glanced at him, but he was not clear because she was wearing an eye patch. Then she put her lips to Catalina's long ears and whispered something. Then Catalina showed a reaction befitting her. She flapped her ears as if startled then nodded violently, looking at him. He was not sure what she was trying to express to him, but it was clear that her action bothered him a lot. Ilun smiled then whispered into her ears again. As if she agreed completely, Catalina kept nodding. This time Catalina whispered to Ilun. You're right, you're right. This time, Ilun agreed excitedly. Yong Ho was extremely bothered. After all, Ilun said something very important. Oh, I just feel refreshed only now. Ilun laughed. Catalina also laughed instinctively then quickly curled her lips. Ilun patted her on the shoulder and put her index finger in the middle of her lips. 
This time, Catalina raised her finger as Elun did then nodded. It looked like they wanted to keep their conversation today to themselves. While Yongho was nervous, wondering about their conversation, Ophelia clicked her tongue. Eligos shook his head because he felt sympathetic to Yongho, and Skull just laughed. With a brighter expression now, Elun looked back at Yongho and said, Don't look at me like that. What you see here is Elun's ghost. That's why she is more honest, simpler, and more childish. The real Elun is a beautiful and noble swordsman, so don't worry. Since Elun reacted so brazenly, it was hard for Yong Ho to respond properly. Catalina, trying to read his mind, quickly came to him and stood where she was. As if on cue, Elun spoke again right away, I think I can stop playing with you. The power of my ghost has become so weakened. It seems it took much longer than I thought for the new king of greed to appear. Let's get back to the main point now. Elun changed the atmosphere. Yong Ho felt her manner was distant now, though she looked very friendly to him a moment ago. The fact that you are here means that you have been recognized by Skathak and Baphomet. The light in the room dimmed. The moonlight pouring toward Elun dimmed, but the starlight became brighter instead. Skathaka's power is life. Baphomet's power is death. The number of light increased. However, the light could not drive out the darkness. The moonlight was eclipsed, and the starlight was too little to drive out the darkness. The starlight was buried in the darkness one by one, and the darkness in the room grew thicker. However, no one looked away. Everyone looked at Elun. There were others right next to her, but they didn't feel it. They felt as if there were only Elun and Yongho in the dark. Chapter, 159 I, Elun's power is justice. However, justice is very hard to come by, contrary to what others think about it. Just like true perfection could not exist in this imperfect world, justice could not exist. So, it is like an ideal we have to just look to. Elun knew that her own justice was not true justice. It would rather rightly be called an indomitable conviction. My strength is like a will that never bends. It's like the courage to take a step toward the light even in the dark where you can't look ahead at all. The starlight faded now. The dim moonlight was eclipsed by the darkness. Elun asked in the darkness, if you want to back down, now is the time. But that's not an option. It was a pointless question. Yong Ho wouldn't have come here if he hadn't intended to challenge the test in the first place. Elun didn't delay any further. Okay, let's get started. Silence was added to the darkness. He couldn't see and hear anything anymore. He breathed. He couldn't feel it. It wasn't just the darkness that eclipsed the surroundings. What was Elun's test? Surely, was it to endure isolation created by darkness? It was not. He noticed that the test began. The sword of light poured down. After cutting through the darkness, it cut his chest. He instinctively backed down, but he couldn't avoid it. The terrible pain in his heart spread to his whole body. He was still in the dark. He couldn't feel his surroundings. Moreover, it was difficult for him to even concentrate. He felt regret now. The memories that he wanted to forget, the memories and feelings that had been dulled by time, began to come flooding back to him. It was a shock that surpassed the pain of the flesh. It was brief but sharp enough for him to forget the pain. Elun did not stop. The sword of light poured out again. He couldn't escape it again. His shoulders were split, with blood gushing out from it. Even his blood was eclipsed by the darkness. He could not come to his senses. Mental and physical pain alternately raged in his body. He stumbled without hearing his own scream. Elun's ordeal, which came so suddenly, was so tough. Concentrate. You must set yourself right in the dark. You must end the confusion with a strong will. Amun shouted, but it didn't reach him. The darkness blocked Amun's voice. Yong Ho gasped for breath. The funeral came to his mind. The pain that had been buried in his heart tormented him. The little Yong Ho was crying sadly. The sword of light kept pouring down. He was hacked. He desperately moved his body, but he couldn't even tell the right side from the left. 
all he could do was to avoid her fatal attack. The darkness took away his sense of balance. Pain and confusion endlessly disturbed his concentration, which made him drift in a flood of emotions. It was almost impossible for him to erect five horns and release mana. Amun did not stop shouting. Amun shouted to him to stand tall in the dark with strong winds and greed. However, he could not produce the power of greed. It seemed that he couldn't even think about it. He was just being hacked in the darkness created by Elun. Amun felt nervous. Amun knew Elun. Elun was different from Skathak. Elun was much more resolute and cold-hearted. He could die at the end of this ordeal. Little master. It was almost a desperate scream. Amun felt that his voice finally reached him. Amun was convinced that he was focusing in the dark. But it was too late. The sword of light cut his chest again. As he couldn't stand it, he sank to the floor. Amun called him again. He didn't answer his call. He raised his head. It was so dark that he could see the sword of bright light. He instinctively knew it would be his last moment. He didn't even know how much time passed. The time he wandered in the terrible darkness where Elun invited him was short, but he felt it was long. The sword of light poured out from overhead. Amun screamed. Yong Ho also clenched his fist. He called only one name even at this moment when his memories and feelings were being hacked. At that very moment, the darkness broke. It shattered and collapsed. The sword of light did not reach him. Yong Ho gasped for breath. He lifted his head, sweating. Elun, grasping the sword of light, was standing in the bright moonlight. Catalina was standing behind her back. She was aiming at Elun's neck with the sword of black mana. Moreover, it wasn't just Catalina. Skull was standing before him. Kuhu. Yong Ho laughed beyond the wreckage of the shattered darkness. All the wounds inflicted by the Sword of Light were fake, but the mental shock was real. Because of that, he felt the pain as if he had been cut by a real sword, but he still smiled. Ah! Uh, how could you? Elun asked in confusion. She asked Yong Ho, not Catalina who was aiming at her neck. The purpose of this ordeal was to strengthen the will of the successor of the House of Mammon. Overcoming extreme confusion and darkness with strong conviction was the model answer. But Yong Ho didn't do it like that. The reason Elun stopped her sword was not because he overcame her ordeal. It was because Catalina, who was supposed to not know what was happening to him, aimed her sword at Elun. The darkness eclipsed not only Yong Ho but also his dungeon spirits. Of course, there were differences. Unlike the darkness that eclipsed Yong Ho, it only blocked their movement. The dungeon spirits should not have known what was happening to Yong Ho. In fact, except for Catalina and Skull, the other spirits were only looking at Yong Ho and Elun alternately as if they didn't know what had happened. How could you? Elun asked again. Wiping his cold sweat, he replied, Skathak told me I should fight you with dungeon spirits. Of course, Skathak didn't say it to him, with Elun's test in mind. In fact, he didn't recall Skathaka's kind reminder from the beginning. Even now, he could reply like that because the fight was over. When he was in the dark, he lost himself. As Elun intended, he drifted in confusion and fear. But at the same time, he could feel it when he was thrown to the floor and in terrible isolation by the darkness. At that moment, he felt he was not alone. He knew that even in this darkness, there were his dungeon spirits, who got connected with himself. What came next was totally his own world. He couldn't hear Amun's voice, but he focused. In the midst of being swept away by the drift of emotions, he never let go of his touch with the dungeon spirits, who were connected with him like a lifeline. And he finally moved. He conveyed a simple but strong will to Catalina and Skull. It was Catalina who responded first. The escort knight became a sword to protect her master. She broke the dark veil that Elun had unfolded. And Skull became a shield for its master. Elun opened her lips. Yong Ho couldn't specifically explain what he had done, but Elun already understood it. That was why she didn't withdraw her sword right away. The Elun standing here was her ghost. 
In other words, she was a replica that the real Alun had left behind just before she left the labyrinth of greed. Because of that, her emotions and memories were the same as hers back then, which synced with Yong Ho and made Alun silent. Some time passed after that. When he began to feel nervous, Alun withdrew the sword. She felt a bit dispirited, but she smiled kindly. It wasn't the model answer to my test, but you have overcome it anyway. The moonlight pouring from the ceiling became stronger. Yong Ho instinctively lifted the magic field on his left arm. It was giving off a golden gleam, next to blue and purple. Catalina and Skull naturally stepped back. Elun politely showed due manners to Yong Ho. She ended the ritual by transferring her power to him. Power of anguish again. Last time Gus Ion and Kai Wan said that the source of the master's power is an incredibly powerful desire for lust. Ah, uh, no, that's not true. Oh, it looks like a weak denial, not a strong one. Then, is it really true? Ophelia said, hurriedly covering her chest with both hands. Why the hell did she cover her chest while talking about it? Yong Ho looked around as if asking for help, but there was no one who could help him. Eligos gently cleared his throat, and Catalina didn't turn to Yong Ho at all. As always, Skull just laughed. Skull Skull. Yong Ho and his dungeon spirits left Alun's room. They headed back to the upper floor with Salami and Skull's unit on standby. After saying goodbye to Yong Ho's party, Elun watched them leaving quietly. Since she transferred her power to him, she couldn't sustain herself anymore. Along with the dimming moonlight, her body turned more and more gray. Elun. The flames of the red lotus arose near Elun, who was now almost translucent. Amun also overworked itself. But Amun couldn't help but see her last moment. Although it was nothing but her ghost, it was still Elun. Elun did not ask about what happened after she died because she already knew the answer after learning about the current status of the Labyrinth of Greed and Skathaka's request to Yongho. Amun didn't say much. It was just content with staying with Elun. When her last moment came, it was Elun who opened his mouth first. I think that person, too, must have thought of us until the end. You bet. Amun knew it, too. Although Amun didn't see Mammon's last moment, it remembered the moment when it got disconnected from its master. Mammon did not die in regret, anger, or fear. What he thought about until his last moment was his concern about the twelve spirits and Citri. Well, I have to say goodbye to you once and for all. Amun could hardly see Elun's figure now. Elun turned to Amun. She smiled like Mammon did and said, I hope the new king of greed is in your great hands, let alone the escort knight who resembles me. Instead of answering, Amun nodded. Elun slowly closed her eyes and disappeared. The only thing left in the darkness of the night where even the starlight disappeared was the flame of the red lotus. My master, the great one who saved the demon world. With that faint call, Amun also closed its eyes. The flames of the Red Lotus were flaring up fiercely and faded with the wind. Chapter 160 The King of Pride issued a declaration of war against the King of Envy. There were many who wanted to stop the King of Pride. The King of Fury expressed his opposition by deploying troops on the shore, but he was ignored. The King of Pride knew better than anyone else that this pacifist, stigmatized as the war fanatic, would not be able to strike himself first by crossing the sea irrationally. One of the five directors of the Dungeon Chamber of Commerce, Orovas, called a man of Herculean power, uncharacteristically sent a gentle letter to the King of Oman. In the letter, he expressed humbly that the Dungeon Market did not want a direct war between them. The King of Oman also ignored this letter. After all, the Dungeon Market was nothing more than a motley of traders. They could not take a hard line to completely block their dealings with the King of Pride, for it meant that the dungeon market would be directly involved in the two kings' actions. Other kings would never stand by the arrogance of the dungeon market. There was also some movement behind the scenes. For instance, the King of Envy tried to desperately stop the breakout of an all-out war that might bring about a total catastrophe. But all such efforts were in vain. The King of Pride made the decision. As the most arrogant king under the sky, he did not know the option of breaking his will. A full-out war began. 
the king of pride was in no hurry. His offensive was slow but persistent. The king of envy's army was defeated. The dungeons at the border were destroyed and captured. But it was only a skirmish of the war. The king of envy's defeat was not fatal. Those who watched their battle didn't think the king of pride won decisively. But some of them thought the battle was already over. Among them was the king of envy. The king of lust walked across his or her harem. The dungeon spirits and contractor witches, exhausted from the frenzied feast that lasted for forty-nine days, were lying here and there, naked in various places in the harems. The king of lust was both a child and an adult. He was both he and she, and a pure virgin as well as a madman addicted to sex. As someone who could freely choose men, women, and children, his look didn't matter to him at all. The king of lust walked alone in the palace where everyone was asleep. On the forty-ninth day, the king was a child, so today, on the fifty-ninth day, he was an adult. He was a handsome young man. His white skin like a marble was a sharp contrast with his black hair. With the horns of a lewd goat, he entered the devil king's room in the deepest part of the harem. Unlike all the places in the harem, that place welcomed the king with constant purity. He felt good when his bare feet touched the floor. The image of the king of lust was reflected like a mirror on the floor made of smooth obsidian. The king of lust enjoyed the last fun before facing the hustle and bustle that called him to this place. The king of lust sat on the throne. It was as soft as a virgin's skin, as comfortable as a woman's breast, and as hard as a man's muscle. He looked into the air with blurry eyes. Hey, long time no see. It's been almost thirty years since I came back here, right? His little whispering was transmitted far away through mana. The magic, called the Watcher's Eye, connected a distant being with the King of Lust. Asmodeus. It was an old man's voice. The King of Lust closed his eyes and faced the images that came to his mind. He was a thin and tall old man. Both his white beard and hair were long. The clothes he was wearing were more than high quality even from the king's point of view. But all these things were hidden by one thing. It was the old man's eyes. His fully raised eyes reflected ferocious emotions. All right, Leviathan. The king of lust called the old man's name. Calling each other's name was unusual to them because there were few who could call the king's name. The king of envy. He caught his breath once. He seemed to have calmed down his hot temper as much as possible, but his voice was trembling. You probably know it. That little kid, King of Pride, has attacked me. How ungrateful he is. He surely heard from his father about our special services, right? Perhaps, if there had been any dungeon spirit near the King of Envy at that moment, he would have killed it. The King of Envy had terrible emotional power. The King of Lust asked with a sigh, what did we do for him? At that moment, the King of Envy held his breath. It wasn't because he couldn't remember what to say. He was upset. He sprang to his feet and cried out in anger. We saved the demon world. Saved the demon world. Without our help, the demon world as it is now would not have existed. It can't exist. Even that little king wouldn't have been born. The king of lust laughed again and shook his head. No, Leviathan. We didn't save the demon world. He saved it. It was Mammon who saved the demon world. Absolutely, we didn't. We are just petty cowards. Did you already forget why we covered up what we had done on that day? Asmodeus. Did envy change you like that, or was it because you could take possession of envy? That was what the king of lust wanted to ask him, but he didn't. Instead, he asked, Leviathan, what do you want me to do? The king of envy let out a harsh breath. He barely calmed down and opened his mouth, but he spoke harshly as if he could not overcome his hard feelings. Help me. Let's defeat that arrogant little king together. We had better have him get on his knees under our feet and lick our shoes. We're going to share all his possessions. The king of lust let his words in one ear and out the other. Then he shook his shoulders and said with a smile, Leviathan, the war has just begun. As the person who spent that day with you, I wish you good luck. Don't expect more than that from me. 
I don't want to use my sword against you. Sword Demon Asmodeus, he was once the greatest swordsman in the demon world. The King of Envy clenched his fists, trembling in anger. He couldn't stand it when anybody despised him. But he had to put up with it. If he made even the King of Lust his enemy when he was fighting the King of Pride, everything would be ruined. The King of Envy clenched his teeth. However, he couldn't help but vent out his anger. You will regret it. The King of Lust laughed again at his warning. It wasn't his ridicule of the king, who was gripped by the sin of envy rather than overcoming it. It was obviously his self-mocking laugh. Yes, you are right, Leviathan. I will regret it just like I did after that day. He would keep regretting it. But nobody can't put back the past. It was impossible to change again. The King of Lust accepted his depression without suppressing it. Then he leaned over the throne. As always, he regretted what he had done in the past. Ho, ho. Inside a noisy bar. Yuria, who, with her chin resting, was sitting on a high table that she could barely stand on tiptoes, shouted with a sad expression as if she was about to cry at any moment. She was already crying. Baduk, sitting right next to her, clenched its fists and stared at the table, with its eyes bloodshot. The bones and chicken vouchers it had collected so far were on the table. It was the chips piled up on the table that first attracted Baduk, but now, it couldn't afford to look back at them. Ophelia looked down at the two beyond the table. She asked, waving her clenched fist gently. Really? Don't you regret it? Do you know what will happen if you lose again? Ophelia was sweet enough, but cold-hearted at the same time. Yuria's clear eyes, like glass beads, trembled without any reason. Oh my! Yuria bit her lips. She wanted to run away right now. She wished all this was a nightmare, so when she woke up, she could find herself lying on a warm and cozy bed. Bark! Bark! Holding her hand, Baduk barked violently. It was just barking, Yuria could understand it, which was something like this, you should not back down. Think about how much we lost. If you give up here, we don't have anything left. Don't give up. You can make it. I know, but. Bark. Baduk nodded strongly. Its eyes filled with conviction gave Yuria strength. Hole. Yuria shouted, looking straight at Ophelia. Baduk also stared at Ophelia glaringly. Ophelia rolled her eyes to the side. She moved her eyebrows a few times as if she got nervous and said again, Really? You don't want to change it? Noticing her weakness, Yuria and Baduk shouted triumphantly. Ophelia sighed out loud. She let her arms drop as if she was disappointed. Then she opened her fists in front of Yuria and Baduk that were extremely tense. Okay, let me show you my card. Yuria's heart froze. Baduk couldn't even breathe properly. No matter how many times they looked at it, there were only two dice on Ophelia's palm. All right, these are all mine now, right? Ophelia spoke cheerfully and picked up all five pebbles on the edge of the table. It was a gift that Yongho bought for Yuria after he returned from the human world. They were five pebbles with multiple colors. Actually, the gift was Yuria's most cherished treasure in the world that she didn't even take out even when playing with Bok. Stiffening on the spot, Yuria was frozen and couldn't say anything. Tears flowed down her soft cheeks. Chapter, 161 Ophelia smiled again. Then she sat down at her eye level, who was crying with a dejected expression and said, Yuria, look at me. She faced Ophelia, but she couldn't look at her in the face because of the tears on her face. Oh my god! What shall I do? Ophelia roughly wiped Yuria's face with a handkerchief. She then let her blow her nose. Slipping the five pebbles in her hands, Ophelia said, Let me return them to you, but this time only. I won't next time. Got it? She spoke to Yuria sternly. Yuria couldn't even check the pebbles in her hand and kept bowing to her. I'm sorry. I won't do it again. Is that all you want to say? Yuria shook her head and bowed deeply to her. Thank you. You're welcome. Ophelia, patting Yuria's hair happily, stood up. At that moment, 
Baduk made a miserable groaning. But Ophelia was stern. Actually, it was Baduk that held Yuria's hand and ran to the gambling room here. I can't forgive you. Baduk again groaned miserably, but Ophelia wasn't persuaded. Instead of stroking Baduk's head, she hit it gently. Go back quickly. Looking at the bones and chicken vouchers on the table, Baduk swallowed its tears. Baduk left the table bitterly with Yuria pulling its hand hard. Yong Ho, who was waiting until the dust settled, let his shoulders droop and said, What did you do to them? Well, I've taught them some lessons early on because gambling is a shortcut to the ruin of one's family. Hey, I don't want to remind you of this, but you remember who asked me to build this gambling house, right? Ah, uh, you know it's me. Ophelia smiled refreshingly and went back to her seat. Indeed, she acted professionally like the former hostess of a tavern. Twenty days had passed since Yong Ho was recognized by Ilun. Yong Ho opened a bar in a gambling house on the first floor of the House of Mammon, as recommended by Ophelia. The space was more than enough because some of the major facilities including the Demon King's room was moved to the first floor of the Labyrinth of Greed. News of the war between the kings in the northern area was also delivered to the southern area. But the fighting there was too far from the south. As he planned for the first time, Yong Ho took care of things in nearby places one by one. As Ophelia predicted, refugees from the west began to rush into the southern area. Yong Ho had no problem in accepting them because there was a sharp decrease in the population of the free city due to repeated wars. It was also not difficult to establish a new order because the House of Mammon became incredibly stronger than before. Yong Ho no longer neglected the prey at his mercy. He began to retrieve them one by one. He sent dungeon spirits to the dungeon of the House of Abigail that Oris had refurbished before his death. He wanted to reactivate the silver mine, which was the source of the Abigail family. Yong Ho also cracked down on the runaway soldiers hiding in the western area. He crashed some of them but absorbed others to join them in the unit led by Tigrius, with Skull and Rikum reinforcing them. Now, Yong Ho thought he had a good many troops with half the Skull unit and the newly established Black Orc squadron. He made the decision when he bought nearly 200 skeleton workers. He now aggressively used the power of evolution. By evolving the existing orc troops, he turned them into powerful heavy infantry. The reason Yong Ho sent Rikum to the west despite his position as the garrison captain was because he wanted to have Rikum gain evolution EXP. Yong Ho had no intention of wasting the resources of the existing dungeon spirits. I guess Baduk has become stronger than before by now. Come to think of it, Baduk went through a good many evolutions. Maybe it was stronger than he thought. What are you thinking about now? Well, the eastern area. The eastern army was strong enough to occupy the northern area. Now was the time for them to return to their territory in the east. Yong Ho had no intention of striking them first. He thought it was better to realign and strengthen his troops instead. Of course, he toyed with that idea, on the assumption that the eastern army would return quietly without making any further trouble. If they showed any sign of attacking the southern area, he would choose to attack rather than defend. I think I have to tell our guys who went to the west to come back, said Ophelia. He nodded. The reason he needed them back wasn't just to prepare for the attack by the eastern army. He needed Skull and Tigrius to attack the fourth floor of the Labyrinth of Greed. The arena, too. At that moment, he suddenly straightened and took out a purple marble slightly smaller than his fist from his pocket. It was a long-distance communication device he received as a reward for challenging the fifteenth floor of the arena. You're no gentleman. Ophelia quipped. Yong Ho smiled at her and activated the device. As if to verify his gift from the arena, the device nicely connected him to his dungeon spirits even though they were far from him. Tigrius of the House of Randolt is honored to see the master of the Great House of Mammon. Tigrius's voice, mixed with a bit of noise, came from the marble. Strange rumors are circulating in the north and west. Rumor? Are you talking about other rumors than our master's defeat of embryo? Ophelia asked, squinting her eyes. Tigrius replied immediately over the marble device. Well, the rumor itself is about our master and embryo. But the problem is the substance of the rumor. There are conflicting rumors about the fighting between our master and embryo. 
one of them is really true, while the other one has been distorted a lot. In particular, they are divided about the bone dragon. What Tigria said was somewhat strange about the bone dragon, Yongho thought. It is not the bone dragon that embryo mobilized. It's just a wyvern that's a little bit huge. What Turgrius briefed him was fairly accurate. Tigrius continued. The mobilized force or the aspect of the fight they are talking about is also very different from the truth. If we only believe in the distorted rumors, the victory of the House of Mammon this time was not a miracle, but a battle that can be won sufficiently, depending on the tactics. First of all, the number of our troops was exaggerated. As for the aspect of the fight, they are speculating that our master's forces were inferior to Embryo's forces numerically, but ambushed and defeated them by pure luck. Anyway, the fact that Yongho won by surprise attack was the same. However, even with the same victory, the potential of Yongho and the House of Mammon could be evaluated differently since the way he won was different. Particularly, the way they mistook the bone dragon for a giant wyvern bothered Yongho. If only dozens of troops penetrated Embryo's forces and won, it meant that Yongho's combat power was excellent. If there was one general who can confront hundreds of soldiers alone and the other one who leads hundreds of troops and defeats 1,000 troops, which general was more threatening? Aside from other factors, definitely, the former was more threatening in the demon world where the Superman exists. What is the source of the rumors? Those who claim they're survivors of the battle that day are responsible for the rumors. I'm sorry to say this, but it seems difficult to find the specific source because all kinds of rumors are getting around now. It wasn't Tigrius's fault. Rumors were supposed to be spreading like that. Once they began to spread, it was not easy to control them or find out those who spread them initially. For this reason, Yongho thought of something more fundamental than the source of the rumors. Why were these rumors getting around? Who would benefit from these rumors? At last, Ophelia opened her mouth, which rumors do you think are more true? You put more weight on the latter, right? Exactly. Right now, they are distorting the truth. It seems that Embryo's runaway soldiers are engaged in a disinformation campaign to make excuses for their defeat. It was as Yong Ho expected. Ophelia said, well, people come to believe more of what they want to believe. In fact, the fight between our master and Embryo was too big to start in the southern area. As a result, those who haven't seen the fight directly naturally tend to believe false or exaggerated episodes or rumors. She generalized about the fighting, but this kind of generalization could not explain everything. She continued, but even if we take those factors into account, the current situation is strange now. There are too many survivors of the day for this kind of false rumor to be mistaken as true. It's not easy for false rumors to replace the truth like now even if only a couple of survivors spread the rumors. Do you think somebody is engaged in organized manipulation? I think it's reasonable to think so. The mastermind behind the rumors, who could exercise organizational power. What came to his mind immediately was kings. From a commonsensical point of view, it didn't make sense for them to put lots of effort into the deserted southern land. However, Yong Ho had no choice but to doubt them because he remembered Embryo's warning. But what kind of benefits can they take? Which benefit could they take from the distorted rumors about the alleged underestimated power of the House of Mammon? Both Ophelia and Tigrius were silent. It was clear that they had the same doubts as Yong Ho. When they kept silent for long, somebody cut in suddenly. Master, I've got reports from the dungeon meerkats. A group of unidentified wolves is approaching the entrance of the dungeon. It was Lucia's report. Yong Ho said immediately, Tigrius, get your troops back and come back to the southern area. I'll get back to you in a few hours. Yes, master. I'll follow your order. His communication with Tigrius was lost. He put the marble device into his pocket and went out of the gambling room with Ophelia. He also summoned Catalina and Elagos through Lucia. A flock of wolves. What came to his mind at the moment was just one name. Chapter, 162. The dungeon meerkats, which became quite a large family by having babies, shuddered. It was because of a herd of wolves roaming about thirty meters from the dungeon entrance. The wolves did not act threateningly. Much bigger than ordinary wolves, they were silent. 
Without making any sound, they just looked at the entrance to the dungeon in the House of Mammon. They also remained silent even when the dungeon entrance was opened. Embryo, the demon king of wolves, the reason he was called that was because he was with a herd of wolves anytime, anywhere. However, Yong Ho had never seen a herd of Embryo's wolves. Even the moment Embryo was fighting Yong Ho desperately, he didn't see the wolves. These wolves were away from Embryo until now. Why weren't they in that place on that day when Embryo was engaged in deadly fighting? Were they staying out of the battlefield at Embryo's order? Since Yong Ho was silent, his dungeon spirits didn't act recklessly. Only Catalina was ready for the fighting by raising the blade of black mana. It was the wolves that moved first. They were now split into two groups. A grey wolf stepped up through the gap between them. It was especially a bigger wolf. It was so high that it almost touched a person's chest. It slowly approached Yong Ho with its head slightly down, as if to show that it wasn't hostile toward him. Yong Ho watched it quietly. And finally, the distance between Yong Ho and the wolf was narrow to none. Standing right in front of Yong Ho, it raised its head high to reveal the necklace hidden in its fur. There was a red jewel at the end of the black belt. Jewelry for saving information. This is a storage medium into which memories or images can be inserted. Lucia said it because she was right in front of the entrance. Yong Ho carefully reached out and unwrapped the wolf's necklace. He held the jewel in his hand and tried to inject mana on it. Light was emitted from the gem. It was like a beam projector. The light gathered in the air and took the shape of a translucent humanoid like Elun that he had seen on the third floor of the Labyrinth of Greed. It was what both Yong Ho and all of the dungeon spirits expected. I am Embryo. If this video is being played by somebody here now, it means I'm already dead. And someone here killed me. It was different from Elun. It was simply playing the saved video. Yong Ho recalled Mammon that he had encountered in the human world. The one who killed me. The one I recognized as the new head of the herd. You may think I am meddling too much if I go to the trouble of leaving this data behind. But if the one who killed me was the same one I thought of, he would need this data. As someone who talked about his own death, Embryo spoke too calmly. In fact, it was natural. Embryo never thought that this video would actually be used like this. The reason he made this video was because he wanted to prepare for the new head of the wolves. He just prepared it for contingencies. He took a deep breath and said, I was making a deal with the king of gluttony. According to the deal, he would support me with reinforcements, and I would use them to unify the southern area. It was a simple and clear deal. The hypothesis Yong Ho assumed the other day was correct. Ophelia suddenly stared at the dungeon meerkats that had been gathered at the entrance of the dungeon. Some of the quick-witted parents moved quickly for fear that their babies would fall on their buttocks. After taking the babies, they dug into the burrow. Some of them were running, covering their ears with their hands as if they couldn't hear anything. Embryo continued. The king of gluttony was planning to rule the southern area after promoting me as a puppet. And I wanted to become a new king after unifying the southern area. Then he made a self-mocking smile because his plan was just reckless. As our intention was contradictory, the deal broke down as a disaster. Well, we used each other in a sense. The reason why the king of gluttony went to the trouble of using me was because of other kings. As the one who killed me, you also know that the six kings are currently enjoying peace by holding each other in check. In other words, they don't want any of them to be unusually stronger. There were not three, but six kings who had similar power and forces. Whatever the condition of their real abilities, that was the current situation where they were in, and they enjoyed peace through mutual check and balance for over a hundred years. If I died without unifying the southern area, it means that the king of gluttony also failed. He would not promote any puppet right now because it's too unnatural for any strong man to appear immediately after me. Perhaps, he would leave the southern area vacant for several years. But if the one who killed me wasn't just an ordinary master in the southern area, the king of gluttony would move, and aggressively at that. He will move not to obtain the southern area but to overthrow you who killed me. The king's move was worth it because Yong Ho had more value than the entire southern area. Ophelia opened her mouth and blurted out, 
that's why they downsized the rumors about the battle between you and our master so that other kings could not notice our master's extraordinariness. It was because the king of gluttony had to monopolize it and hog the treasure. It is unlikely for the king of gluttony to raise up a great army. He will move in secret. Maybe he will visit your dungeon in person so that other kings won't notice that he has overthrown you. That was the way the king of gluttony did things. He never had his possessions taken away. He was always ready to dive into the mud for whatever he wanted. Rumors were circulating in the north and west. The king of gluttony was already on the move. Embryo was silent for a moment. After moving up and down his lips as if to try to calm down, he continued. Maybe there is still some time for you to prepare. If you are not ordinary, as I think, and if you are the man who has the sin of greed that has disappeared in the demon world since that great mammon. His words were mixed with self-mock and arrogance. He smiled at his conviction that he himself would not be killed in a southern area by someone who committed no sin. In the end, the fact that he had no greed made him mock himself. Embryo smiled very little. It was his first and last smile for Yongho. It's an area of possibilities, but I probably would not have died alone. I would have made the Watcher placed by the King of Gluttony my fellow traveler. The killing of the Watcher will give you some time. Maybe because of the Watcher's death, the King of Gluttony might not have exact information about you. Then, you can buy more time. At least three or four months after my death, or even half a year. If you're lucky, it could be years before the King of Gluttony attacks you. Embryo took a deep breath. This video wasn't made just before he died. Rather, it had been made much earlier. Embryo had thought he might be defeated. In the end, he did not turn away from the future when he could not be a king. So, he confessed, but he didn't reveal his innermost intentions. He didn't even reveal it right before he died. He didn't need to babble about the reason why he wanted to be a king or tell about his past in the video left behind in case of his death. Embryo, the man who wanted to become a king regained his composure. Then he spoke to the old him. Let me keep everything I know about the king of gluttony in this jewel. You will find this very helpful because I have prepared it in case you will have to confront him one day. Embryo didn't hate the king of gluttony that much. Rather he liked the king. He was a man with cunning and courage that befitted his ambition. Since he had the patience enough to wait for the right time and the composure that was not easily shaken, he could be called truly an ideal monarch. Nonetheless, Embryo wanted to take the side of the one who killed him rather than the king of gluttony, for the one who killed him would be the very one Embryo himself really wanted to be. Even if he committed no sin, the one who killed him would dream of becoming a king, with the southern area as his base. I doubt if you will use this video actually I think I was too much into it. Honestly, I went a bit too far because the one who killed me may not have the sin. Maybe he might be killed by a sword for no reason. If you consider the current situation in the southern area, it could really happen. But I've already taken the video. Even if it will never be put to use forever, I think I have to wrap it up properly because this video is for the one that I will recognize as the leader. Embryo refined his expression again. As he himself said, he was absorbed in it and wanted the position of the king of greed, he put his whole heart into it. If you who killed me is truly the king of greed, if you are the one I have longed for. Embryo slowly closed and opened his eyes. He made a request to the new leader lastly. Be prepared. The king of gluttony will visit you. Embryo's figure was scattered in the air. Elagos, who was tense, gulped, and Catalina curled her lips. Ophelia closed her eyes tightly. The king of gluttony. One of the six existing kings. He was coming. Chapter 163 Embryo was dead. He did not exist anymore. However, just before he died, he chose Yong Ho as the new head of the herd of wolves. The wolf leading the herd herd leader. The man who was responsible for the preservation of the herd. It was common for the one who defeated the head of a group to become their new head. However, considering the preservation of the herd, Embryo's choice of Yong Ho was a bit strange. At the time, he left behind the video, Embryo wasn't sure of his death or the existence of the King of Greed. But it was different right before he died. 
Embryo also knew that Yong Ho was the king of greed. The king of gluttony was about to mount an attack against Yong Ho. And it meant that the new head of the group would be once again faced with an extreme crisis. Nonetheless, Embryo chose Yong Ho. He entrusted the herd of wolves to the new king of greed. In a way, his decision was natural. Embryo decisively characterized the king of gluttony as an enemy in the video prepared for the next leader to succeed him. He himself was thinking of fighting the king of gluttony one day. The wolves dedicated their loyalty to Yong Ho, just as they did to Embryo. They didn't even howl, much less talk, but Yong Ho could feel it. To Yong Ho, they were a completely different kind of connection from the dungeon spirits. Yong Ho himself got connected with the dungeon spirits in Seoul. This was possible because the dungeon spirits dedicated both body and soul to Yong Ho. Yong He didn't get directly connected with the herd of wolves in Seoul. It was like the members of the herd were connected to a mental network created by magic. Strong bond. Exchange of opinion. Sharing of senses. The herd of wolves was a group that had been around for hundreds of years. They were one of the several survival guides made by ancient shamans in order to survive in the demon world ere the law of the jungle dominated. As the new leader of the herd, Yong Ho knew that fact. He could also faintly feel the moment Embryo became the herd leader. There were also some additional effects. His physical strength and endurance became stronger. A new sense that should be called wildness was added to his existing senses, and the ability to regenerate his body, which he did not have before, was also created. Of course, it was not a deceptive force like Embryo's superhuman ability to regenerate. It enabled Yong Ho to heal wounds twice or three times faster. But this was enough. Yong Ho had a quick recovery rate thanks to his physical evolution. It was obvious that he would benefit from it during battle. Yong Ho gently accepted the herd of wolves. By doing so, he understood Embryo more deeply. He could read the traces Embryo left behind in the herd. It was Yuria who most welcomed the wolves as new members of Yong Ho's forces. She especially liked the grey wolf with its long fur and soft hair. Actually, the wolf was no. Two in the herd in ranking. Baduk, who was deprived of Yuria all of a sudden, stared at the grey wolf's fur with a jealous expression. Yong Ho felt he would pay special attention to that part of Baduk at its next evolution. Yong Ho ordered Tigrius, Skull, and Raccoon to come back quickly. It would not be too late for him to mention the King of Gluttony after they arrive at the House of Mammon. I don't think the King of Gluttony will come here right away. I'm positive about it. Yong Ho could feel anxiety in Ophelia's voice, who was always calm when she talked about intelligence. The King of Gluttony, one of the six kings who currently rule the demon world, carried gravitas befitting his name. Ophelia finally continued after moving up and down her lips several times. The war in the north will rather help us. Because of the unprecedented all-out war between the King of Pride and the King of Envy, all the other kings except the King of Sloth are showing signs of raising up their armies. The king with the power of sin and godly energy was also the most powerful weapon. Naturally, he got the most attention. Exposing the king's whereabouts itself was also a means of intimidating others. The King of Fury and the King of Gluttony were exposing their location. Because of this, it was more difficult for the King of Gluttony to be away from his place. The King of Gluttony won't be convinced yet that you have the sin of greed. So, he will need to verify any intelligence about your location. Embryo is right. You still have time. At least, it will take several months for the King to make the move. So, you don't have to be impatient. You've got enough time to prepare. Ophelia began to speak faster as she approached Yong Ho. Although she was talking to Yong Ho, at the same time, she was talking to herself. Calm down. Do not be impatient. You still have time. Yong Ho nodded. It looks like he's in a hurry today. He seems to have something urgent, Gus Ion, seated in the special seat, said in a low voice. Amon also agreed. Yong Ho, fighting the floor master on the 18th floor, was more hurried than usual. Yong Ho became strong very quickly. Thanks to greed and the power of evolution, he quickly increased mana and stamina, 
but he was basically excellent in fighting. He knew well how to fight. He found the shortcut to victory every time without being bound by a stereotype. Apart from that, he also had a talent for martial arts. Of course, he wasn't as good as Amun or Ilun. However, he was extraordinary. Although it was true that Amun taught him how to use a spear, his spearmanship already surpassed the level that any ordinary man could reach in just half a year. The floor master on the 18th floor was one of the previous masters of the House of Mammon who belonged to the arena. His different name is the Demon King of Shadow. He mainly used a tactic of oppressing the enemy by using his shadow like an alter ego. Yong Ho was fully pressing the floor master of the 18th floor. His spear covered with the green flames tore the shadow with overwhelming power. Yong Ho would win after his fifth attack. Both Gus Ion and Amun thought so. Changing the way he was sitting, Gus Ion chewed the green grapes that Catalina brought. They were harvested from the Garden of Life. Did you say it is the King of Gluttony that has our little master on edge? So, it seems to have nothing to do with the betrayers on that day because gluttony was one of Mammon's sins. Mammon had greed, gluttony, and fury among the seven deadly sins. It's definitely a big ordeal for our master. But if he overcomes it, he will get qualified to face the truth of that day. Gus Ion, Amun said in a little voice. Gus Ion didn't turn his head at Amun's worried call. Instead, Gus Ion replied while looking into the air, Don't worry, Amun. Too many years have passed since that day. I am not obsessed with revenge as you might think. I just want to hand down the great achievements of Mammon to our little master. Gus Ion spoke with a bit of grunt. Amun found himself empathizing with Gus Ion. Right at that moment, Yong Ho was done attacking for the fifth time. Finally. After burning the floor master on the 18th floor, Yong Ho was delighted with the items from the reward box, not the victory itself. His face was very bright as if he forgot all his worries about the King of Gluttony. Chapter 164 Amun and Gus Ion turned to each other then stood up at the same time. Well, I think I know what he will do next. He's going to summon somebody with that reward. Of course, it's Kai Wan. Unlike the one that he obtained after breaking through the tenth floor, this time, Yong Ho obtained only a one-day minor summons with which he could summon a dungeon spirit from the arena. But it was enough for him. A smile was all over his face. Staring at him quietly, Amun asked earnestly, Are you trying to increase your anguish? Catalina opened her eyes wide, and Gus Ion admired. Making a face, Yong Ho said, Nope, not at all. Then what are you going to do after summoning Kai Wan? And why are you summoning her? The floor master on the 18th floor is also a former master of the House of Mammon. Gus Ion asked quite sharply because Yong Ho sometimes mentioned this, Kai Wan, if I can't summon another former master when I first wanted the summons. This is out of his anguish again. Amun was convinced. Gus Ion giggled and Catalina pouted her lips. Yong Ho shook his head and said while shrugging his shoulders, Well, you will know who I summon soon. See you again next time, Gus Ion. Yong Ho looked around the stadium where Kai Wan and other former masters were sitting. He then headed straight for the exit. With Catalina hurriedly following Yong Ho, Amun turned to Gus Ion. Amun asked as if he was asking for consent, I guess it must be anguish, right? Gus Ion giggled once more. Instead of answering, he put a cigar in his mouth. As soon as Yong Ho left the arena, he didn't go far. After taking a seat in Kai Wan's lounge, he summoned through Lucia the remaining dungeon spirits of the House of Mammon. Eligos and Ophelia arrived in less than a few minutes. Both of them were sweaty as if they were sparring at the training ground. It was regrettable that Skull and Tigrius were not available, but it was inevitable. Yong Ho lined the three including Catalina side by side. And he stood with his back two steps ahead of the three. Let me get started. Yong Ho tore the summons right away. Then, his mana was concentrated in the air. Kai Wan was summoned through the process that the dungeon spirits of the House of Mammon had already experienced. So, you're going to make your wish come true through me this time right? Standing obliquely, Kaiwan asked provocatively, 
but she stopped in no time because she was distracted by the familiar and nostalgic scene of her good old lounge. The lounge looked like the same one before she disappeared. She gulped at the moment. If she let her guard down here, she felt like she would cry, recalling her brother. It was a situation that Yong Ho didn't expect, but he had to control it. He grabbed her shoulder then looked straight into her eyes, which were a little bit wet. When she seemed to calm down a bit, he said with a straight face, Kai Wan, this is my wish. Sure, tell me whatever it is. I want you to be my dungeon spirit. Good what is it? When she asked back, he already got down to work. On behalf of Yong Ho, Lucia proceeded to register her as a dungeon spirit. When he summoned Kai Wan last time, he noticed one difference. She was different when she was in the arena and outside the arena. To be precise, the arena's dominance over Kai Wan was different. Outside the arena, its dominance was weak, of course. A dungeon spirit belonged to the dungeon. A spirit in the arena belonged to the arena. If so, what would happen if a spirit in the arena was made a dungeon spirit? It was difficult inside the arena because the dominance of the arena was too strong. But what if Yong Ho weakened its dominance further by releasing tremendous mana? The magic field and brigada rings on his left arm and right hand respectively lit up. Not only Yong Ho, but also all the dungeon spirits erected their own horns and released mana. They did so, guided by Yong Ho. And now Ophelia and Eligos knew what he was going to do. Yong Ho literally poured out all his mana. He released much more mana than he did when he forcibly made Salami his dungeon spirit in the past. Lucia screamed. All the stored mana in the dungeon has been released. Please stick it out well. Master. Yong Ho was kind of a vehicle at the moment. Almost all the mana of the Mammon family, including that of Yong Ho himself and the dungeon spirits was poured into Kai Wan through his body. At last, the arena's dominance was blocked instantly. Yong Ho and Kai Wan's souls were directly connected. Lucia hastily stopped releasing mana. Catalina, Eligos, and Ophelia collapsed or stepped back because of the repulsive force transmitted through their own brigada. Yong Ho released his hand from Kai Wan's shoulder. He stumbled while stepping back. Then he roared in no time. A new power was surging inside him. It was something he experienced every time he obtained a powerful dungeon spirit. Kai Wan had four horns. Because of this, it did not bring about innovative change to Yong Ho with five horns. However, it was never insignificant. Yong Ho felt that his mana was upgraded once more. What he wanted was not an increase in mana alone. The power of distortion. He felt it. His greed sensed a new power in him. By keeping Tigrius as his dungeon spirit, Yong Ho acquired the power of combination mana. With that power, he combined the power of life and death into one and dealt a fatal blow to Embryo. It was the same this time. And this was the reason why he chose Kai Wan as his dungeon spirit. The floor master on the 18th floor. The power of the shadow he used did not benefit Yong Ho. He could do as much by using Catalina's black mana. By acquiring Kai Wan, however, he could gain the power of distortion called the Absolute Shield. Catalina, Ophelia and Eligos also began to roar. Since Yong Ho, their master, became stronger, they also experienced growth, as well. And at this moment, there was another one that was growing. Kai Wan wrapped her own shoulder. She screamed, sprinkling red light from her eyes. A fifth horn rose from the middle of her forehead. The moment she crossed the wall that had been tightly blocked for decades, Kai Wan felt she became completely new. And when it was all over, everyone in the room was gasping for breath. But they were all smiling. Yong Ho clenched his fist. His growth now had proven everything. He hijacked Kai Wan from the arena, and he succeeded in growing stronger, along with his dungeon spirits. Kai Wan smiled brightly. Indeed, she felt liberated from the arena after decades. The unpleasant senses that always dominated her soul disappeared. Instead, she had a new connection to Yong Ho. She was happy. She was never offended. Rather, she felt faithful satisfaction. Kai Wan licked her lower lip once. 
With joy in her ferocious eyes, she approached Yong Ho and whispered gently, My master, you're the one that I have to give all my body and soul. Kaiwan. He was embarrassed, but she was calm. She hugged his neck and kissed Yong Ho. Although it was short, her kiss was much more passionate than before. She withdrew her lips from his. He looked at her blankly, and she laughed mischievously as if to provoke everyone around her. I am now yours. She winked at him after saying that. In terms of the nuance of her words, it looked like Yong Ho became her dungeon spirit. And the one watching this scene in the back nodded alone. Then he said in an inaudible voice, it's the power of his anguish again. Amun smiled gently. Chapter, 165 A week had passed since Kai Wan joined them as a dungeon spirit. She proved herself competent by actions, not words. Moreover, she showed her competence not in combat but in other areas. Even at a glance, the dungeon has grown so big suddenly. I think I have to take care of lots of stuff in it. In fact, she was once the master of the House of Mammon before she was a powerful spirit of the arena. She was the legendary master that transformed the House of Mammon on the verge of collapse into a powerful one that other masters were afraid of. Accordingly, her know-how about dungeon management was unrivaled, dwarfing Yongho. She had as many as ten years of experience in managing a dungeon. Moreover, she was extremely efficient. She served as the master in a harsh environment where she could not waste even small resources. Any items that would be considered trash to others were valuable resources for a great use. Ophelia also admired the way she took care of her work flawlessly. Ophelia was also a pretty good manager, but a dungeon was different from a tavern. Obviously, the way Kaiwan managed the dungeon was more efficient. Yongho humbly accepted this unexpected result. Honoring his father's advice that the president didn't have to be an expert, which his father used to tell him when he went out for chicken delivery, he had Kaiwan a de facto dungeon manager. In his opinion, he felt he made a good decision on it. Kaiwan was his dungeon spirit, so he didn't need to worry about her betrayal. One week passed. Yong Ho, who welcomed back Skull, Tigrius, and Rikam, who returned from the western area, held a conference in which all the key members of the Mammon family participated. The meeting place was the room of the Demon King, which had been moved to the first floor of the Labyrinth of Greed. On the left and right of the large table in front of the throne were the vassals of the Mammon family. Right next to his right side was Elagos, the butler, and Ophelia, the manager of the Free City. And next to them were Tigrius, the manager of the Randall Dungeon, and Rikam, the garrison commander of the House of Mammon, and Bergrim, the chief of the workshop. Yong Ho looked to the left. Catalina and Kai Wan were seated nearest to him. With her long ears drooping, Catalina was at a loss what to do, and Kai Wan was gently hugging her as if she was so cute. It was a familiar scene for Yong Ho. Before he knew it, he recalled the Lun and Citri that he had seen in his memories of the House of Mammon. He smiled bitterly and rolled his eyes when he also recalled Ophelia's reminder that he was the Demon King. Seeing Catalina and Skull next to her, he felt relaxed somehow. He did not mention the impending threat of the King of Gluttony, the most important issue at the moment because it was something he would not forget, let alone one that he would keep in mind all the time. He felt those dungeon spirits of the House of Mammon, not those under his direct control, had better not know about it. I think it is the most important thing to increase the dungeon's soul, namely Lucia's control, in order to take over the fourth floor, our new target. It was Kai Wan who first presented her opinion. Normally, she talked informally to Yong Ho, but in a public place like this, she always used honorifics. The fourth floor of the Labyrinth of Greed. Among Mammon's twelve spirits, eight-handed Baruna, which was Cancer, passed away a long time ago like Elun. Besides, she did not leave her surrogate behind like Elun. Because of this, Yong Ho could take her recognition for free, like Skathak said, but it wasn't necessarily good for him. Since he didn't get Baruna's recognition through a legitimate process, he could make his godly energy near perfect, but he could not properly use her power. The power of eight-handed Baruna was that of creation. According to Skathak, Baruna used the power of creation to work miracles, such as creating something from almost nothing. It was the power befitting the builder of the labyrinth of greed. 
When a dungeon spirit to succeed Baruna's position emerged someday, she would be able to revive the power of creation again, just like Skull and Catalina succeeded Baphomet's death and Elun's justice respectively. Because of this, Yong-ho could put aside his lingering affection for the power of creation for now. The reason Kaiwan emphasized the need to take control of the fourth floor of the Labyrinth of Greed was because of the facilities there. The fourth floor of the Labyrinth of Greed was a workshop. Moreover, it was truly huge. Since it was a semi-automated factory, it was possible to mass-produce high-quality equipment as long as there were enough materials. The facilities on the fourth floor are amazing. If you can use those facilities, I bet you can make weapons that are several times better than now. It will be possible to produce traps that are more powerful than the existing ones. There are lots of blueprints left behind. Bergrim wrote down those sentences on the board in an enthusiastic handwriting style. His eyes were shining as if he was very excited, but it didn't last long. Recalling the problems that engineers faced all the time, Bergrim presented his own opinion timidly. If you can increase the budget and the amount of essence a little more. Yong Ho couldn't answer immediately. So, he heard the opinions of the next dungeon spirit. This time, Rykam said, we need to purchase additional battle wagons and various equipment. If we can add specialized troops, such as large-sized warrior horses for transportation, we can greatly increase our military strength. In fact, when very powerful masters started a war, they usually deployed various kinds of dungeon spirits. For example, a mountain giant, which played the role of a turret by throwing huge rocks, a giant golem that could be called a tank itself, or a large flying spirit that could carry dozens or more at a time. Although Yong-ho had the power of evolution, it was difficult for him to raise large-sized spirits in a short time. This matter was a little different from training the skeletons that made up the skull unit. Instead of answering immediately, Yong-ho heard another dungeon spirit's opinion. Eligos said a little timidly, it would be nice if we can add a working golem to the silver mine in the dungeon of the Abigail family. He used the expression it would be nice, instead of it is necessary. It was because he took into account the fact that Yong Ho would need a significant budget to handle the requests that they already made. Yong Ho finally looked at Skull. Skull also presented its opinion with a sincere voice. Skull Skull. Yong Ho nodded at Skull's message. Other dungeon spirits didn't make the mistake of asking him what Skull just said to him. Yong Ho knew he had a way to solve all these problems at once. Although his action plan was different from the original one he had in mind, he had to change it because the situation changed. At first, he thought it was the best way to attack the arena and the labyrinth of greed, but it wasn't. Since the price for it was fascinating, the risk was also big, so it took a considerable amount of time to attack the two places. Where could he confront the king of gluttony and his soldiers? The location should be a dungeon. Even at the risk of damage, this time, he needed to fight in the dungeon of the House of Mammon. And Yong Ho was thinking of using not only the House of Mammon but also the Labyrinth of Greed. A demon king was the strongest when he fought in his own dungeon. He could use the mana of the dungeon through dungeon souls, and he could make use of the geographical advantages available through various traps installed in the dungeon. So, Yong Ho needed to get ready to fight in the dungeon. To do that, he needed to refurbish the dungeon. There was only one way for him to get both the budget for a stronger dungeon as well as the experience of the dungeon spirits in a short time. Yong Ho said briefly and clearly, we're going to attack the eastern area. Stravati, one of the two masters that divided the eastern area, claimed to be a strategist. He was a Nagaraja with a snake's eyes and heart. Just like any Nagaraja, Stravati was cool. His brave decision to divide the eastern area was motivated by his cold-heartedness. Through his expedition to the north, Stravati strengthened his friendship with his rival and his most powerful ally, Sargatanas. Sargatanas was no longer a stranger to him. He was the husband of Stravati's only daughter, and the heir to inherit everything from Stravati one day. The eastern area was no longer two. It was one. Besides, he obtained a huge amount of loot in the process of occupying the northern area. He also took the essence of the northern masters to his heart's content. Embryo died, and the western and northern areas were devastated. Agars, who ran wildly in the areas, was not seen any longer. 
but there was only one problem. It was the house of Mammon in the south. It was a very simple situation. If he defeated the master of the house of Mammon, there would be no enemies in the southern area. It was also possible to unify the area for the first time since that great Mammon. However, there was one thing that made him anxious. He could not evaluate the power of the house of Mammon properly. He kept an eye on the clash between Embryo and the Mammon family. Of course, he had secretly dispatched a spy to monitor their fighting and report back. He wanted to find out how much damage Embryo would suffer. However, the spy did not return. To his embarrassment, all of the spies he dispatched were entangled in the battle and lost their lives. Chapter 166 Since Stravati did not know that the Bone Dragon's broad breath burned the spies, he had no way of knowing the exact situation, which made him very frustrated. After all, Stravati was forced to put together all the intelligence and rumors available to make an educated guess. Since there were many survivors of Embryo's army, it was not difficult for him to gather some information. However, there was also a problem here. Totally contradictory rumors were spreading among the people. Which rumor should he believe? Should he trust the ridiculous rumor, assuming the worst scenario? Or should he trust the more commonsensical and reasonable rumor that lots of people were now believing? Rumors about the bone dragon just don't make any sense. If Embryo had such a card, why didn't he use it in his attack of the western area? Embryo struggled very hard in his fight against the Western Masters Alliance. He had to spend as many as several months to defeat the Western Masters Alliance. Besides, he had to use the extreme military method to destroy most of the dungeons and the city in the western area. What would have happened if Embryo had turned to the Bone Dragon in his fight against the Western Masters Alliance? If so, the situation would have been completely different, and the Western Masters Alliance would have been devastated much earlier. And there was a decisive problem from the beginning. Nobody could buy monsters like the Bone Dragon just because they had money. Did Embryo buy the Bone Dragon with all the money he collected from the occupied northern and western areas? From whom? At the dungeon market? To purchase a Bone Dragon there, they had to go through the auction process. Those who could purchase this kind of monster without an auction were extremely limited, and of course, Embryo was not included in that limited number. Considering other elements of the rumor except for the Bone Dragon, the rumors that a wyvern appeared in Embryo's fight were more reliable. Stravati watched closely the Mammon family's expedition to the western area. Although he was not sure of the exact situation because he got the intelligence from his moles, the number of skeleton soldiers and warriors exceeded 100, getting close to 200. Examining the rumors about the Bone Dragon, the forces of the House of Mammon were utterly shabby. Given that Embryo devastated the western area and that there were so many survivors of Embryo's army that the Mammon family could not acquire lots of loot even after the victory. It was also unlikely that they bought new undead monsters after the battle. There were too many undead monsters for that. Because of this, Stravati estimated the strength of the House of Mammon, based on the rumors involving the Wyvern, not the Bone Dragon. As always, he made a rational judgment. But the guy beat Embryo. No matter which rumor he believed, he had to admit it. Embryo was a monster that smashed the Western Masters Alliance by himself. Given that he absorbed all the essences of the defeated masters there, it was reasonable to think that Embryo had five horns. Let me assume that even the master of the House of Mammon has also five horns. Since he defeated Embryo, it's certain he absorbed his essence. Stravati closed his eyes. He kept it in mind that the upcoming battle would not be a combat between the masters, but a war involving the mobilization of the army. After all, even a five-horned master was made of bone and flesh. This meant that he could be ambushed and killed by a sword any time. Let me reduce the variables. If my own forces are not enough, let me get some help outside. He had no enemies other than the House of Mammon. Even if he squandered all his financial resources in the eastern area, it would be okay if he won, for he would obtain the whole southern area anyway. Bought by a sudden optimism, Stravati looked at the map of the battlefield. The troops of the House of Mammon were marching toward the east. Hey, Yong Ho. Do you know something like Najabamjo win in the day but lose in the night? He cleared his throat when Kaiwan's voice transmitted through the communication device on his neck. 
what the heck was she talking about now? Apart from its meaning, was there such a word in the demon world? Me, me too. I want to do Najabanjo, too. Catalina also said quickly, pricking her ears at Kaiwan's voice. He cooled the heat on his face with a fan. Obviously, Catalina didn't know what it meant, but she was pretty much conscious of Kaiwan now. He stroked her hair and said over the device, Stop the nonsense and watch out for your surroundings well. Our master is watching me anyway from above. I trust you, so I hope I'm in your great hands. Laughing cheerfully, Kaiwan cut off the communication. It was good for him to see him cheerful, but he was embarrassed at the time because she was so different from when she was the former master. But this might be her real image, Yong Ho thought. If she had not become the master of a crumbling family at an early age, her eyes might have been gentle rather than ferocious like now. For days after Yong Ho made the decision to storm into the eastern area, the troops of the House of Mammon led by the Skull Unit were advancing smoothly toward the east. There were not so many troops mobilized. The main forces consisted of 250 members of the Skull Unit and 100 members of the Black Orc Unit. And the rest were some transport units and about 200 other troops serving as escorts and reserves for the transportation unit. Since about half of the troops were the undead who did not need meals, the cargo of the transport unit was very light compared to the size of the unit. As the number of troops mobilized was small, they had to rely on the power of the commanders, so all the dungeon spirits of the House of Mammon were mobilized again this time. Eligos, who was confused about his identity as the butler or the assault leader these days, took command of the first independent task force with Ophelia. Unlike its impressive name, the task force consisted of only two, namely Eligos and Ophelia. Skull and Rykum commanded the Skull and Black Orc squadrons, respectively, while Tigrius was responsible for the transportation unit in the rear. Kaiwan, the leader and only member of the second independent task force, ran a horse beside Skull. She had served as the master for many years, but she had rarely commanded large-scale troops, so her fighting alone like Eligos or Ophelia was more efficient. Salami, carrying Yong Ho and Catalina, fluttered its wings high in the sky. Since Salami wasn't simply evolved but promoted to fire elemental dragon, it was quite different from before. First of all, it got bigger, and its wings and tail also got longer. Its head that looked like a lizard or a salamander in the past was added with a hard shell, which made it look like a dragon a lot. But Salami was still Salami. Its handle on the back was still the same, and the way it shook its head after listening to the conversation among Yong Ho, Catalina, and Kai Wan was the same. The reason that Yong Ho was on Salami's back in the sky was not simply to play the role of a vanguard. It wasn't only the Eastern Army that he was concerned about. What concerned him was the minions of the King of Gluttony who attempted to manipulate rumors about him in the west and north. It was highly likely that they were hiding somewhere in the east and south to watch the fight. Since he had already shown his strength in the fight against Embryo, he didn't think of being absent from the battle at all, but he had no intention of revealing all his strength fully to the enemies. Unlike the southern area, there were lots of huge strange rocks, mountains, and canyons in the east. Because of this, he couldn't look far away even though he was overlooking from the sky. But if I think the other way. It meant that not only the place to fight the enemy but also the place to hide his troops were too obvious. Using the communication device, Yong Ho ordered the dungeon spirits to be cautious because the shape of the strange rocks and bizarre stones in the surrounding area was unusual. A huge hill was blocking them in the front, and a forest and strange rocks were located on the left and right respectively. It was a terrain where hundreds or thousands of troops could easily hide if they put their mind to it. Salami also narrowed its eyes as if it noticed something. Kaiwan, who was riding a horse at the forefront, raised her hand and stopped Skull and the others. But Tigrius urged the transportation unit to quickly catch up with the main forces. The eastern army, ambushed on the hill in the front, appeared. A group of troops poured out from the forest on the left. Instead of rushing to Yong Ho's troops, they moved slowly as if to form a siege, trying to attack the transportation convoy and rear guards led by Tigrius. Yong Ho couldn't afford to count the number of the Eastern Army. Salami suddenly turned to the strange rocky area on the right. An earth shaking rumble overwhelmed everything. Yong Ho also saw it. 
A huge monster that rushed recklessly as if to destroy the strange rocky area burst into an angry cry. Then it charged straight at Yong Ho's forces. Stravati, sitting on a hill with his elite soldiers, smiled in satisfaction. Everything was going well, as planned. He could make the most of the battle battlefield in his favor because the master of the Mammon family innocently marched his troops straight into the treacherous enemy terrain. Stravati knew well how the master of the Mammon family fought Agars. It was a very clever and wonderful operation that the master deployed a land worm into the battlefield and confused Agars' forces. Chapter 167 So, Stravati used the same strategy. He called a more heinous and terrible beast into the battlefield than the land worm. Chimera, it was a terrible monster that lived in the east since long ago. This beast, which had the body of a bear with scales on its three heads a lion, a griffin, and a drake. Its tail was a snake, which was huge and violent. With its shoulders nearly ten meters tall, a chimera could easily eat even a fully grown land worm at one gulp. Based on the standards of the dungeon market, it was a monster that would be ranked five star. It was a huge task for Stravati to wake up the chimera sleeping soundly in its nest for this battle. In order for the chimera to intrude at the right moment, he had to do some really meticulous calculations and sacrifice a large number of dungeon spirits. At the end of the day, he made it. All he had to do now was to wait for the outcome of the chimera's attack. He expected that the chimera would destroy the House of Mammon's troops completely. Of course, he didn't expect that the battle would be over with the chimera's attack alone. The moment the chimera was killed, he planned to advance his troops in the front line and in the rear. Then he would siege and annihilate the forces of the House of Mammon, who was severely wounded by Chimera. Stravati's troops were numerically superior to Yong Ho's forces. The number of his troops in the front and in the rear was close to 2,000. By any standards, it was impossible that Stravati would be defeated in this battle. The Chimera roared again. Not only Stravati, but also Sargatanas next to him laughed happily. The chimera, which was making an earth-shaking rumble, tore away Stravati's dungeon spirit that angered it. As if it was still upset, the chimera stared at the forces of the Mammon family stationed right in front of it. Excited, the chimera kicked the ground. Stravati clenched his fist. Then a huge storm of mana raged in front of them. It was a phenomenon that occurred as tremendous mana was opened simultaneously. A red beast jumped up toward the chimera that jumped into the air. The muscles of its red upper body covered with grey fur expanded as if it was bursting. Its fist, fully pulled, could be called a hammer. Something incredible happened. The red beast's fist struck the chimera's upper body hard. Hit by that punch, the chimera, which would weigh at least dozens of tons, was thrown down on the floor. The red beast that pulled its punch could not overcome the repulsion of his punch and bounce off into the sky. It was truly a Herculean punch beyond one's imagination. The beast's amazing attack did not end there. A woman with grey hair ran. As soon as the chimera hit the ground, she burst into a cheerful laughter and swung her whip sword. Like a snake that crept through the ground, her whip sword quickly wrapped around the lion shaped chimera's neck. When the whip sword was released again, the chimera's flesh and blood covered the air. The chimera's neck, which had been severed to the extent that its bones were fully exposed, drooped and wobbled. There was one more red beast. Much smaller and quicker than the first one, it soared into the air. Then it cut through the blood sprinkled by her whip sword. A lightning strike struck Griffin's head. Its power was also as mighty as a thunderbolt. One of chimera's three heads was still intact. However, it did not dare to stand up. The red beast kicked Drake's head in succession, and the woman with grey hair wielded the whip sword to tear the snake's tail to pieces. The chimera couldn't devastate the main forces of the Mammon family. It didn't even approach them. With Yong Ho's main forces only ten meters away, the chimera was almost dead and fell on the floor. It was impossible to imagine the beast of fear dominating the eastern area being mangled by another beast. Stravati's calculation proved wrong. He had to stop the operation now. Father-in-law. Sargatanas urgently shouted. Startled, Stravati, who had been staring at the chimera blankly, looked straight ahead. 
Yong Ho's main forces were rushing toward his troop station down the hill. A black beast that could not be called a horse anymore howled in anger. A skeleton knight with black armor on swung a long ivory hammer made with a spear. The energy of purple death arose like flames. Rush! Surround them! Sargatanas urgently cried. Stravati shook his head. He momentarily lost his mind because of the imposing posture of the rushing undead unit. Reasonably, it was right to form a siege. However, rationality did not exist on this battlefield. Skeleton troops charged toward them like a storm. They were too fast. Normal skeletons could not move as fast as them. Moreover, the convoy at the rear was also strange. Rather than preparing for the enemies in the rear, they quickly followed Yong Ho's main unit as if they were in a race. It seemed that they didn't even worry from the beginning that the mix of their friendly forces would result in the great confusion of their formation. Stravati again felt confused. But he soon understood that the irrational attack by the Mammon family's forces was actually based on rationality. The eastern army, which collided with the skeleton unit, was literally smashed. The skeleton unit's combat power was unusually high. It was not just the strength of one black skeleton knight at the forefront. Anybody would believe it even if the knight would be called Skeleton Warrior or even Skeleton Knight's Army. It wasn't simply because of the power of evolution. There was something that Stravati could not imagine in the overwhelming combat power of the Skull Unit. Synchronization of power through the herd. Yong Ho paid attention to the mental network that Embryo's wolves formed among themselves. With the help of Tigrius and the wolves, he copied the network itself then formed a new group network consisting of Skull Troops. Since the Skull Unit had a faint ego, Yong Ho could include more than 200 Skulls in the group. Since Skull alone had to be responsible for almost all of the mana that maintained the group, it was worth the effort. First of all, Skull and its unit were in sync. The Skull Unit copied some of Skull's combat functions through the mental network and shared combat experiences with each other. The hardware itself was the same. But the software was literally revolutionized. Their combat power expanded rapidly. Skeleton soldiers were almost as good as a skeleton warrior, and the warrior equaled the knight. The skeleton knight and dragon soldiers also experienced their power expanding greatly. Moreover, as they shared experiences with each other, their accumulation of evolution EXP was several times faster than before. The skull unit devastated the eastern army. The eastern army collapsed even before they, who got around the forest, could even attack the transportation unit led by Tigrius from behind. As things stood now, Stravati's siege plan went nowhere. Moreover, the synchronized skull forces showed a speedy movement that Stravati could never imagine. The transportation unit led by Tigrius passed by the skull unit. They then disrupted the formation of the eastern army with the black orc unit. The skull unit turned. As if hundreds of them were merged into one, they changed the direction of the attack in unison. Then they made a dreadful reverse rush toward the eastern army that ran to complete the siege. While witnessing the crazy fighting scene, Stravati did his job based on his reason. He realized that the red beast, a wild beast, and the gray-haired woman would soon join those crazy skeleton squads and go after the remaining eastern army. The eastern army was still numerically superior several times as many as them. But Stravati felt his numerical advantage was meaningless. He needed to do something powerful to turn the tide. Sargatanas and he himself had to lead the reserve and join the fighting. The eastern masters commanding their units on the battlefield alone were not enough to defeat Yong Ho's forces. His reason told Stravati that he himself and Sargatanas were strong because they had five horns after taking the essence of all the northern masters. So, you can make it. You can do it. Sargatanas shouted again. The moment he heard it, Stravati realized one thing. There was one that he had to be most wary of among the Mammon family's forces. Nevertheless, he completely forgot this man because of what was going on before his eyes. Stravati raised his head. He saw the sky. And right there the green sun was blazing down intensely. It blazed down towards Stravati in his reserve. It was obviously big and intense. The moment the green sun hit the ground, the surrounding area turned into a superheated hell. 
Based on Yong Ho's standards, the current sun was smaller and weaker than the sun of the green flames he created in the fight against Embryo. It was because the absolute value of the time he gathered mana was only about one third of the time, although he became stronger by using Kai Wan as his dungeon spirit. However, this kind of factor did not have a big impact on the situation. Stravati's reserve army was burned. Stravati fell into confusion amidst the green flames that engulfed everything in the surrounding area. The painful screaming of the soldiers, who were burned to death, tormented him. Stravati instinctively released mana to drive away the green flames threatening to devour him. To protect himself from the heat, he created a curtain of mana. His mana with the attribute of chill not only repelled the green flames but also calmed him down. Stravati asked himself, is it possible for him to make an ideal retreat by realigning his troops in this situation? If he and Sargatanis join his forces, can they turn the tide? As soon as he thought it was impossible, Stravati came up with the next plan rationally. The moment he devised it, Stravati shouted, Sargatanis. Yes, father-in-law. Chapter 168 The chill embedded in his mana broke apart the green flames and opened the way. Stravati saw Sargatanas defending himself by releasing mana just like himself. Five horns were towering above the head of this purple-skinned giant. Given that his muscles were wriggling, it seemed that he was prepared for the fight. But Stravati thought he should not fight. So, he reached out and grabbed Sargatanas instead of shouting at him. We're going to retreat. Father-in-law. Their eyes crossed. Sargatanas' eyes trembled greatly. He was inflexible, but not stupid. He clearly understood why his father-in-law mentioned retreating. We're going to desert the entire Eastern Army on the battlefield. Only two of us will run away. Sargatanas opened his mouth wide at his sudden proposal. Although he could not persuade Stravati, a smooth talker and strategist, he wanted to say anything. The total number of the Eastern Army soldiers on this battlefield exceeded 2,000. Dump them here. It was something he could not think of. He could not follow his father-in-law. Sargatanas stopped breathing for a moment. Stravati looked straight at him without saying anything. There was no more time. Stravati already began to feel the presence of the man with terrifying mana, the master of the House of Mammon, approaching him beyond the green flames. Sargatanas clenched his teeth. Stravati activated his power. Stravati's nickname was the Demon King of Jump. The two men jumped over the space and disappeared amid the green flames. Salami, trying to dive into the green flames while burning Stravati's reserve army, suddenly fluttered its wings again. Then it instantly changed its direction and increased altitude. Yong Ho also felt that Stravati and Sargatanas disappeared because Sargatanas's mana, who opened all his five horns, evaporated before his eyes. Yong Ho thought of several possibilities of his disappearance. He could have made a short distance leap as Tigrius did in the past. Or he could have simply hidden his mana and gone into hiding nearby. I guess he has at least five horns, Yong Ho thought. Sargatanas released mana very shortly. But Yong Ho was extremely good at detecting the opponent's mana. Given the size, color, and properties of the mana that arose among the green flames, it was clear that Sargatanas was a demon king with five horns. Just because one had the same number of horns, it did not mean that even the strength and weakness of the mana owner were the same. And the range of a mana's strength and weakness within the same number increased as the number of horns increased. Sargatanas's mana was a little stronger or similar to that of Kaiwan, who barely produced five horns. Given that Stravati also had five horns, it wasn't easy for Yong Ho to deal with two demon kings with five horns. But, given his power as the master of the current House of Mammon, he could defeat Sargatanas and Stravati without any difficulty. It might be too hasty to judge the outcome even before Yong Ho had yet to confront the two, but he thought so. Catalina, who was prepared to jump in the green flames and have it out with the two leaders of the Eastern Army, looked at Yong Ho curiously when Salami changed direction. In his right hand, he held a moonlight sword he inherited from Alun instead of the dagger he used until now. It was a silver sword that looked like a crescent moon. It looks like the two ran away. Let's wrap up the fighting first. Yong Ho, who stroked Catalina's head, 
ordered Salami to turn back. Stravati had hundreds of reserves, and only a few of them were struck by the green sun, but Yong Ho didn't care anymore. Now that their main forces broke up, there was only one option for these soldiers who lost their commander. As Yong Ho expected, the reserve soldiers started running away instead of joining their main forces on the battlefield. They were living witnesses who would convey the overwhelming defeat of the Eastern Army everywhere. Salami fluttered its wings again. It squinted to see Bucephalus striding down the ground with Skull. Just as Salami was promoted to Fire Elemental Dragon, Bucephalus was also promoted to Nightmare Lord. With a mane made of green flames and a pitch black body, which was more than twice as large as a normal warhorse. Bucephalus was now powerful enough to dwarf the ordinary phantom steed, so much so that the Eastern Army soldiers were so scared of its glaring green eyes as to drop their weapons. Quietly watching Bucephalus fighting on the battlefield with its owner's skull, Salami nodded its head slowly. Looking at Bucephalus's glaring eyes, it seemed Salami was quite satisfied with its fighting posture. There was a massacre, not a battle, happening on the battlefield. If the two large armies fought head-on, the death toll was surprisingly small, generally speaking. However, when the formation of any one army collapsed, it was a different story. Besides, when they started fleeing with their back against the other party, the number of their deaths increased dramatically from then on. That was why the loser in many of the historically famous battles incurred an enormous number of casualties, compared to the winner. In other words, the army that lost its formation and ran away was just helpless against the opposing army's attack. The overwhelming destructive power of the Skull unit broke the formation of the Eastern Army from the front. Skull, teeming with Bucephalus to sprinkle death in all directions like Baphomet, was a disaster for the Eastern Army. However, it was because of Eligos, Ophelia, and Kaiwan joining them when they decisively smashed the formation of the Eastern Army. Out of the trio, especially Kaiwan clearly knew what her role was on the battlefield. The general role of a general was to command his soldiers. However, the roles of the three dungeon spirits, named as independent task force, were different. Kaiwan considered herself an assassin, rather a sniper. It's time for you guys to be punished. Kaiwan's whip sword wrapped around the waist of a struggling Eastern Army commander. Even before he could resist her attack, she wielded the sword violently. He instantly fell on the ground. She swung the sword in succession, making him hit the ground several times. She fought very splendidly. Bursting into a thin and high-pitched laughter, she drew the attention of the Eastern Army soldiers. Her targets were simple the one riding a horse, the one fighting well, the one shouting, the commander, and the one supporting with mana in the rear. In other words, she attacked only those who served as a sort of commanders who made numerous individual soldiers move as one group. It was much more beneficial to kill a single commander than defeating dozens of rank-and-file soldiers. Eligos, who made his brutal nature explode, could not control his anger precisely, but Ophelia didn't. Soon she understood Kaiwan's intentions and acted the same as she did. The absence of the commanders soon resulted in the collapse of the entire Eastern Army. Losing the will to fight, the Eastern Army soldiers began to run away, which soon led to the start of their massacre. The Eastern Army commander, who was thrown to the ground several times by Kaiwan, could not gather his senses. Fever came all over his body as if all of his bones were broken. He could hardly exert his power because of extreme pain. Kaiwan approached him and withdrew her whip sword from him. Since it became clear who was the winner of the battle, she did not kill him thoughtlessly. She tapped his cheeks, who still didn't get back to his senses. Let me save your life. Smiling brightly, she straightened and looked at the sky. Then she shook her hand toward Yong Ho, who was getting on Salami. Stravati used his power in succession. If he was fully focused, he could jump up to 600 meters instantly. So, if he used it in a row, he could escape from Yong Ho as far as several kilometers in an instant. He used his power exactly ten times. Landing on a strange rocky area about six kilometers from the battlefield, he took a deep breath, gasping for breath. Depending on how he used it, he could really reveal deceptive abilities, but this space jump didn't have only an advantage all the time. Since he exhausted his mana and stamina together, excessive use of it caused a rapid loss of his combat power. 
For this reason, Stravati always used space leaps, based on his rational calculation. Accordingly, he didn't use his power ten times in a row impulsively. Sargatanas opened all five horns and quickly turned west. The battlefield was now six kilometers away from him, and the strange rocks around him obstructed his vision, so he could not see the battlefield well. Oh my god! He sighed, almost losing his mind. It was natural that he showed such a reaction, given that he dumped in the battlefield the eastern army of two thousand soldiers, who had attacked the northern part with him. It was a very shocking defeat to him. The power of the House of Mammon far exceeded his expectations. What should he do now? Should he fight to the end or save his life by letting Yongho's forces occupy the eastern area without any resistance? Sargatanis turned with a heavy heart. Then he looked at his father-in-law as well his ally Stravati, who already led him to the right way after they decided to join hands to defeat Yongho's forces. He is strong. We cannot win with the method we have taken until now, Stravati said calmly, as always. Even at this moment, Stravati didn't stop thinking. He deduced from the battle the strength of the master of the House of Mammon and his dungeon spirits and drew one conclusion. Father-in-law. Stravati nodded. With his back straight, he faced Sargatanas, who was in great confusion. He got his face closer to Saratanas to say something important. He whispered in a calm voice, Listen to me, Sargatanas. Sargatanas gulped. He just remained silent and listened to him respectively as he did when his father-in-law led his army to break through the east and devastate the northern area. Then he opened his mouth and groaned. He looked at his father-in-law putting his hand on his chest. Sargatanas had no time to be astonished by his action. Stravati did not tolerate his resistance at all. The moment Sargatanas raised his head again, Stravati busted his heart with one hand to the heart of Sargatanas in one hand. He screamed silently. Stravati covered his mouth with the other hand. At the same time, he released mana as well as magic power that would never fall behind him. He even nullified Sargatanas's desperate struggle, who lost his heart before he knew it. Even though his heart was busted, this mighty demon king didn't die immediately. He glared at Stravati with resentment and anger. He tried to squeeze his voice to say something. But Stravati tightened his hand that covered his mouth. As always, he explained it calmly, two of us, who are weak, can't deal with this strong man. Even if you and I join hands together, we can't defeat the House of Mammon. What we need right now is one absolutely strong man. We have to stop him with the dungeon-style fighting, not a battle like this. Sargatanas's eyes trembled. His body stiffened, and he quickly lost the warmth of his body. Goodbye, Sargatanas. It's sad for me to part with you like this. He was serious. It wasn't a lie. Stravati carefully laid down the dead Sargatanas with his eyes open. After closing his eyes with the hand that covered his mouth, he sensed his dungeon spirits were coming to him. It seemed that all of them got out of the battlefield as he ordered. Everyone seemed to have left the battlefield as directed. Stravati no longer talked sentimentally. He swallowed Sargatanas's essence. Chapter 169 The chill embedded in his mana broke apart the green flames and opened the way. Stravati saw Sargatanas defending himself by releasing mana just like himself. Five horns were towering above the head of this purple-skinned giant. Given that his muscles were wriggling, it seemed that he was prepared for the fight. But Stravati thought he should not fight. So, he reached out and grabbed Sargatanas instead of shouting at him. We're going to retreat. Father-in-law. Their eyes crossed. Sargatanas' eyes trembled greatly. He was inflexible, but not stupid. He clearly understood why his father-in-law mentioned retreating. We're going to desert the entire eastern army on the battlefield. Only two of us will run away. Sargatanas opened his mouth wide at his sudden proposal. Although he could not persuade Stravati, a smooth talker and strategist, he wanted to say anything. The total number of the Eastern Army soldiers on this battlefield exceeded 2,000. Dump them here. It was something he could not think of. He could not follow his father-in-law. Sargatana stopped breathing for a moment. Stravati looked straight at him without saying anything. 
There was no more time. Stravati already began to feel the presence of the man with terrifying mana, the master of the house of Mammon, approaching him beyond the green flames. Sargatanas clenched his teeth. Stravati activated his power. Stravati's nickname was the Demon King of Jump. The two men jumped over the space and disappeared amid the green flames. Salami, trying to dive into the green flames while burning Stravati's reserve army, suddenly fluttered its wings again. Then it instantly changed its direction and increased altitude. Yomho also felt that Stravati and Sargatanas disappeared because Sargatanas's mana, who opened all his five horns, evaporated before his eyes. Yongho thought of several possibilities of his disappearance. He could have made a short distance leap as Tigrius did in the past. Or he could have simply hidden his mana and gone into hiding nearby. I guess he has at least five horns, Yongho thought. Sargatanas released mana very shortly. But Yongho was extremely good at detecting the opponent's mana. Given the size, color, and properties of the mana that arose among the green flames, it was clear that Sargatanas was a demon king with five horns. Just because one had the same number of horns, it did not mean that even the strength and weakness of the mana owner were the same. And the range of a mana's strength and weakness within the same number increased as the number of horns increased. Sargatanas's mana was a little stronger or similar to that of Kaiwan, who barely produced five horns. Given that Stravati also had five horns, it wasn't easy for Yongho to deal with two demon kings with five horns. But, given his power as the master of the current house of Mammon, he could defeat Sargatanas and Stravati without any difficulty. It might be too hasty to judge the outcome even before Yongho had yet to confront the two, but he thought so. Catalina, who was prepared to jump in the green flames and have it out with the two leaders of the Eastern Army, looked at Yongho curiously when Salami changed direction. In his right hand, he held a moonlight sword he inherited from Alun instead of the dagger he used until now. It was a silver sword that looked like a crescent moon. It looks like the two ran away. Let's wrap up the fighting first. Yongho, who stroked Catalina's head, ordered Salami to turn back. Stravati had hundreds of reserves, and only a few of them were struck by the green sun, but Yongho didn't care anymore. Now that their main forces broke up, there was only one option for these soldiers who lost their commander. As Yongho expected, the reserve soldiers started running away instead of joining their main forces on the battlefield. They were living witnesses who would convey the overwhelming defeat of the Eastern Army everywhere. Salami fluttered its wings again. It squinted to see Bucephalus striding down the ground with skull. Just as Salami was promoted to Fire Elemental Dragon, Bucephalus was also promoted to Nightmare Lord. With a mane made of green flames and a pitch black body, which was more than twice as large as a normal warhorse. Bucephalus was now powerful enough to dwarf the ordinary phantom steed, so much so that the Eastern Army soldiers were so scared of its glaring green eyes as to drop their weapons. Quietly watching Bucephalus fighting on the battlefield with its owner's skull, Salami nodded its head slowly. Looking at Bucephalus's glaring eyes, it seemed Salami was quite satisfied with its fighting posture. There was a massacre, not a battle, happening on the battlefield. If the two large armies fought head-on, the death toll was surprisingly small, generally speaking. However, when the formation of any one army collapsed, it was a different story. Besides, when they started fleeing with their back against the other party, the number of their deaths increased dramatically from then on. That was why the loser in many of the historically famous battles incurred an enormous number of casualties, compared to the winner. In other words, the army that lost its formation and ran away was just helpless against the opposing army's attack. The overwhelming destructive power of the Skull unit broke the formation of the Eastern Army from the front. Skull, teeming with Bucephalus to sprinkle death in all directions like Baphomet, was a disaster for the Eastern Army. However, it was because of Eligos, Ophelia, and Kaiwan joining them when they decisively smashed the formation of the Eastern Army. Out of the trio, especially Kaiwan clearly knew what her role was on the battlefield. The general role of a general was to command his soldiers. However, the roles of the three dungeon spirits, named as independent task force, were different. Kaiwan considered herself an assassin, rather a sniper. It's time for you guys to be punished. 
Kai Wan's whip sword wrapped around the waist of a struggling Eastern Army commander. Even before he could resist her attack, she wielded the sword violently. He instantly fell on the ground. She swung the sword in succession, making him hit the ground several times. She fought very splendidly. Bursting into a thin and high-pitched laughter, she drew the attention of the Eastern Army soldiers. Her targets were simple the one riding a horse, the one fighting well, the one shouting, the commander, and the one supporting with mana in the rear. In other words, she attacked only those who served as a sort of commanders who made numerous individual soldiers move as one group. It was much more beneficial to kill a single commander than defeating dozens of rank-and-file soldiers. Elagos, who made his brutal nature explode, could not control his anger precisely, but Ophelia didn't. Soon she understood Kaiwan's intentions and acted the same as she did. The absence of the commanders soon resulted in the collapse of the entire Eastern Army. Losing the will to fight, the Eastern Army soldiers began to run away, which soon led to the start of their massacre. The Eastern Army commander, who was thrown to the ground several times by Kai Wan, could not gather his senses. Fever came all over his body as if all of his bones were broken. He could hardly exert his power because of extreme pain. Kai Wan approached him and withdrew her whip sword from him. Since it became clear who was the winner of the battle, she did not kill him thoughtlessly. She tapped his cheeks, who still didn't get back to his senses. Let me save your life. Smiling brightly, she straightened and looked at the sky. Then she shook her hand toward Yong Ho, who was getting on Salami. Stravati used his power in succession. If he was fully focused, he could jump up to 600 meters instantly. So, if he used it in a row, he could escape from Yong Ho as far as several kilometers in an instant. He used his power exactly ten times. Landing on a strange rocky area about six kilometers from the battlefield, he took a deep breath, gasping for breath. Depending on how he used it, he could really reveal deceptive abilities, but this space jump didn't have only an advantage all the time. Since he exhausted his mana and stamina together, excessive use of it caused a rapid loss of his combat power. For this reason, Stravati always used space leaps, based on his rational calculation. Accordingly, he didn't use his power ten times in a row impulsively. Sargatanas opened all five horns and quickly turned west. The battlefield was now six kilometers away from him, and the strange rocks around him obstructed his vision, so he could not see the battlefield well. Oh my god! He sighed, almost losing his mind. It was natural that he showed such a reaction, given that he dumped in the battlefield the eastern army of two thousand soldiers, who had attacked the northern part with him. It was a very shocking defeat to him. The power of the House of Mammon far exceeded his expectations. What should he do now? Should he fight to the end or save his life by letting Yong Ho's forces occupy the eastern area without any resistance? Sargatanas turned with a heavy heart. Then he looked at his father-in-law as well his ally Stravati, who already led him to the right way after they decided to join hands to defeat Yong Ho's forces. He is strong. We cannot win with the method we have taken until now, Stravati said calmly, as always. Even at this moment, Stravati didn't stop thinking. He deduced from the battle the strength of the master of the House of Mammon and his dungeon spirits and drew one conclusion. Father-in-law. Stravati nodded. With his back straight, he faced Sargatanas, who was in great confusion. He got his face closer to Saratanas to say something important. He whispered in a calm voice, Listen to me, Sargatanas. Sargatanas gulped. He just remained silent and listened to him respectively as he did when his father-in-law led his army to break through the east and devastate the northern area. Then he opened his mouth and groaned. He looked at his father-in-law putting his hand on his chest. Sargatanas had no time to be astonished by his action. Stravati did not tolerate his resistance at all. The moment Sargatanas raised his head again, Stravati busted his heart with one hand to the heart of Sargatanas in one hand. He screamed silently. Stravati covered his mouth with the other hand. At the same time, he released mana as well as magic power that would never fall behind him. He even nullified Sargatanas's desperate struggle, who lost his heart before he knew it. Even though his heart was busted, this mighty demon king didn't die immediately. 
He glared at Stravati with resentment and anger. He tried to squeeze his voice to say something. But Stravati tightened his hand that covered his mouth. As always, he explained it calmly, two of us, who are weak, can't deal with this strong man. Even if you and I join hands together, we can't defeat the House of Mammon. What we need right now is one absolutely strong man. We have to stop him with the dungeon-style fighting, not a battle like this. Sargatanas's eyes trembled. His body stiffened, and he quickly lost the warmth of his body. Goodbye, Sargatanas. It's sad for me to part with you like this. He was serious. It wasn't a lie. Stravati carefully laid down the dead Sargatanas with his eyes open. After closing his eyes with the hand that covered his mouth, he sensed his dungeon spirits were coming to him. It seemed that all of them got out of the battlefield as he ordered. Everyone seemed to have left the battlefield as directed. Stravati no longer talked sentimentally. He swallowed Sargatanas's essence. Chapter 170 It was an overwhelming victory for Yong Ho. The Mammon family's casualties were only about thirty. On the other hand, nearly half of the Eastern Army soldiers lost their lives, and hundreds of those who survived were injured. Unlike Embryo's army, whose frontline commanders mostly survived, the command system of the Eastern Army was smashed. Therefore, there was no leadership for the defeated soldiers. Since they were completely shattered, they were no longer a threat. The battle was completely over. However, the battlefield was still full of vitality because Yongho's forces were absorbed into capturing booty from the dead Eastern Army soldiers. The armaments of the Eastern Army soldiers, who gained wealth through their northern expedition, were quite excellent. It was clear that just recovering various armaments and armor would generate a considerable amount of money. Moreover, some of them possessed quite expensive items. But Yong Ho was not greedy for small things. He planned to distribute most of the items obtained from the battlefield to his rank-and-file soldiers. Actually, he had already made the announcement about it before the battle. He took the measure to raise the morale of the soldiers of the free city who were out on an expedition at his order. Fluttering its wings, Salami landed on the ground. Salami landed in front of the skull unit that maintained its ranks in an orderly fashion even when other soldiers were to acquire the spoils of the battle. Bucephalus was the first to pretend to know Salami. Its face was soulful when it neighed cheerfully. It seemed to ask Salami something like, Didn't you see me fighting well? Wasn't I cool? Salami snorted, but only for a moment. Instead, Salami appreciated Bucephalus, its archrival and bad friend, with a pleasant smile. Skull, the knight of death, who could now be said to be the pride of the Mammon family, expressed due respect to Yong Ho by erecting its hammer spear. When the two hundred members of the Skull unit, who had yet to break their synchronization with the end of the battle, bowed to Yong Ho in unison, they created such a spectacular scene. Yong Ho was really happy. He seemed to know why it took so long for the principal to make a long speech whenever he took the podium when he was in elementary school. Hundreds of skulls fixed their eyes on him. He felt a great thrill at that moment. Behind his back, he heard Catalina flapping her ears and tail cheerfully. She was as much thrilled about the skull's spectacular greeting as he. Indeed, the shabby little house of Mammon on the verge of collapsing was the thing of the past. Just like Salami did, Yong Ho returned their greeting with a happy gaze. When they were done, Skull laughed heartily, as usual. Skull loosened his synchronization with his members that he had maintained during the battle and sat down on the ground comfortably. Man, they're back to their old selves. The two hundred Skulls, who behaved themselves so politely only a minute ago, were fully relaxed and began to wander around in place. Some of them sat down on the floor like Skull or even rolled around on the floor. It seemed that it was not just their combat skills that were delivered through the synchronization. Yong Ho also lightly tapped his left chest to get out of the consciousness that had been gripping him throughout the battle. At the moment, he felt a tingling pain in his chest, but he soon felt comfortable. The heart of the demon god. Mammon's legacy, which was left behind in the human world, was not an ordinary brigada. Know how on how to deal with greed was just redundant for him. The seven fragments stuck in his left chest. The heart of the demon god was different from the godly energy of greed that was created through the twelve spirits of the house of Mammon. 
It was an object that existed for only one ritual, namely bringing the owner's spirit and body closer to the demon king. Of course, it wasn't permanent. It was just a temporary doping. But the effect was absolute. When one fragment was triggered, they called it one demon. When one demon was activated, one's consciousness started working since the fragment penetrated deep into the heart. Brigada's fragment directly stimulated the essence, which could be called the center of the mana, so that it could make the flow of mana stronger and faster. It forcibly opened up the potential of the body through insinuation, which would not normally be opened up, it was like overclocking a computer. It was also thanks to the activation of the demon that Yongho managed to create the green sun, although he couldn't have enough time to concentrate mana, compared with when he did during his fight against Embryo. There were seven fragments that made up the demon god's heart. Naturally, the stage of consciousness existed up to seven demons. When the consciousness progressed one step further, it was supposed to increase the power, so it was hard to imagine how powerful it would be when all the seven demons were fully released. Perhaps, as the name suggests, Yongho might reach the level of the demon god. Of course, it was dangerous. Even activating one demon exposed one's body to severe stress. Moreover, starting with the stage above four demons, the method of amplifying the power itself was not as simple as one demon. It demanded more than stimulating essence with Brigada. The reason why Yong Ho learned about the heart of the demon god even belatedly was because he made Kaiwan his dungeon spirit. He came to know roughly about its usage and danger through Mammon's remaining mana left in Brigada. Probably, it seemed to be a kind of artifact that wouldn't trigger at all if the owner's mana did not reach a certain level. It was indeed Mammon's way of securing his surrogate, which was consistent with many experiences Yong Ho went through until now. After deactivating one demon, Yong Ho faced the dungeon spirits more comfortably. The captured commanders are here. They are at your mercy, master. You can either grill them or kill them. Kaiwan unleashed one of the captured commanders that she dragged to the floor, bound by her whip sword. Then Eligos and Ophelia also laid down the eastern commanders they had carried or bound. All of them were in bad shape. Those with one of their arms or legs broken were the least injured, while most of them were severely wounded. In the battles of the demon world, especially the battles among the masters of houses, there were few cases in which prisoners were released for ransom. The masters could grow their power only when they took the essence of their opponents. Moreover, the death of the masters meant a sharp decline in their dungeon defense. Because of this, it was a big advantage for the winner to capture and kill them. Nevertheless, there were some reasons why the master of a house was taken as a prisoner. First, when he was highly valuable as hostages. Second, when the winner wanted to make him a subordinate. Third, when the winner wanted to gather information from him. The eastern masters come commanders taken as hostages, who fell on the ground, generally had three horns. They had four horns at most, but the level of their mana was the nascent four. Since there was such a gap between the level of his mana and theirs, Yong Ho would not get much benefit even if he took their essence. It was for the second and third reasons that the eastern masters were captured alive. I will set up a temporary prison and torture room right now. Please allow me to take the task of interrogating them, so they can leak everything about the eastern area. I'll force them to confess anything they know, said Eligos with his eyes glaring sharply this time. Although his whole body was stained with the blood and flesh of his enemies, he seemed to be even more muscular and powerful than before. Catalina narrowed her eyebrows, and Yong Ho smiled bitterly. Though he witnessed it several times, he could not get used to the way Eligos enjoyed his hobby of tormenting their enemies. Well, let me give him a pass since he does it only occasionally. In fact, Eligos needed it. Since he didn't catch Stravati and Sargatanas, the heads of the Eastern Army, in this battle, he had to gather all the intelligence to prepare for the next battle. Even Ophelia made a horrible expression at Eligos's request, but Eligos was all smiles on his face and got ready to interrogate the captured Eastern commanders. Right at that moment, somebody shouted, No, you don't have to interrogate us. One of the least injured among them opened his mouth. He was a master from the Nagaraja race that was said to have a snake's heart and tongue. I will tell you all. Let me tell you anything that you want to know, no matter what. He didn't say that because he was resigned to his miserable situation. 
There was resentment in his voice. Eligos urgently clenched his fist. How dare you try to trick us? Stravati and Sargatanas abandoned us first. They betrayed us. The Nagaraja master shouted quickly. The resentment in his voice was not directed against Yongho, but Stravati and Sargatanas. He was right. Stravati and Sargatanas did not appear while the Eastern Army was being annihilated. The Nagaraja master knew what their disappearance meant. It meant that the two leaders of the Eastern Army fled after making them scapegoats on the battlefield without even fighting Yongho's forces. The Nagaraja master stared at Yongho desperately. Kaiwan, who was silent all along, stepped out to second his opinion. It doesn't sound like he is telling a lie. I don't think he has any reason to stay loyal to his bosses who ran away. I agree. Moreover, this guy is from the Nagaraja race that allegedly has a snake heart. It is unlikely that he will keep his loyalty when the Eastern Army has collapsed, and he himself was betrayed by his bosses, Ophelia seconded this time. Then she made eyes at Yong Ho slightly, suggesting she was ready to test him if her master wanted. Catalina didn't say anything, but given that she flapped her ears and tail, she seemed to be on the same page with Kaiwan and Ophelia. All right. Let me listen to your story. Yong Ho gave him the go-ahead. The Nagaraja man let out a breath of relief, while Eligos became sullen, with his shoulders drooping. Chapter, 171 We're going to take over the dungeon now. Please wait a moment. It sounded a bit far away, like a cell phone call with a poor signal, but it was definitely Lucia's voice. One day passed after Yong Ho's army defeated the main forces of the Eastern Army. Yong Ho, who kept making an inroad into the eastern area without a hitch, took over the dungeon of the Nagaraja master who had surrendered and used it as a forward base. The number of the eastern masters also dropped significantly amid the turbulence caused by embryo. According to the Nagaraja master, there were only two eastern masters under the command of Stravati and Sargatanas. And the number of soldiers that the eastern army could mobilize again was about a thousand or so. Given that even if all the soldiers left in the north or scattered in various dungeons were mobilized, it would be no more than 2,000, so Yong Ho didn't have to worry about confronting the enemy with a huge army beyond his imagination. The intelligence that the Nagaraja master provided was better than expected. He even knew the power of Stravati and Sargatanas. Stravati's power was short-range space jump, while Sargatanas's power was strengthening of the body. Both were good at close combat, but Stravati of the Nagaraja race also seemed to be good at spelling magic. In some respects, they might be tougher than Yongho thought. Yongho sat down on the throne engraved with a serpent's head and pondered over how to deal with the two. He drew a map of the eastern area in his mind. The current dungeon was located in the south within the eastern area. Moving a little further to the northeast, he could find Stravati's dungeon. Tigrius, Rikam, and Ophelia said in unison that the next battle would be a dungeon battle, not a battle in the open field like this. Their opinion was reasonable. Actually, Yongho himself thought of fighting the king of gluttony at the dungeon fight instead of a battle. It was when the master was fighting at the dungeon that he became the strongest. Thanks to the dungeon market, the concept of supplies in the demon world was different from what they used in the human world. As long as they could secure a dungeon with access to the virtual space of the dungeon market and enough funds, they could deliver supplies even into the heart of the enemy camp, though incompletely. Yong Ho had no intention of letting Stravati buy his time. He intended to devour the eastern area quickly like lightning. The current situation was different from when he defeated Agars. Back then he was pressed for time. He had to hurriedly take the essence of the dungeon's heart and leave the eastern area while guarding against other masters in the surrounding areas. But it was different this time. The dungeon's treasures and resources, dungeon spirits, and the essence of the heart. He intended to take away all of them by all means. Really, he would do it, just like the king of greed. Takeover of the dungeon was over. Are you going to access the virtual space of the dungeon market? The energy of greed arose. The greed that grew much bigger and more abundantly than before engulfed Catalina and Kaiwan, standing next to the throne. It did not stop there and spread widely. Yong Ho closed his eyes and accessed the virtual space of the dungeon market. Recognition number, 
0-9-0-0-9-0-0-9-0-0-9-0-0-9-0-0-9-0-0-9-0-0-9-0-0-9-0-0-9-0-0-9-0-0-9-0-0-9-0-0-9-0-0-9-0-0-9-0-0-9-
namely her question about him doing business with Citri as usual and the way she behaved when she appeared in this space first. And he could discover why she was surprised when she knew he was in this space. It was never uncommon for Citri to deal directly with her client. So, Samuel wanted to know the reason why Citri wanted to face Yong Ho in person. Samuel. Somebody, not Yong Ho, called her. Samuel turned back to the voice naturally. Citri. Wearing a nightgown, Citri let out a long breath. She concealed her fatigue and said to Yong Ho, Dear client, could you wait a minute? Please. Samuel looked back at Yong Ho. Instead of answering, Yong Ho responded with a nod. Then Citri and Samuel disappeared. And within a few seconds, Citri appeared again. What about Samuel? When Yong Ho asked instinctively, Citri frowned a bit. Then she curled her lips and approached him. I sent her back for now. Did she act rudely? No, not at all. When he replied, Citri sighed again. She seemed uncomfortable just like she did when she was caught recalling the memories about the House of Mammon the other day. But shortly afterward, she made a smile again and gently pressed her chest. In the blink of an eye, she took off the nightgown and put on the dress she usually wore. Do you know that your pupils got big a moment ago? Instead of answering, he cleared his throat at her mischievous question. Citri made a hearty laugh as usual. Now, what kind of deal do you want today? Let me provide a little more service than usual because I feel sorry for being late. She winked at him right at the moment when she mentioned a little more, then sat down on the chair that soared before her and leaned against it. Yong Ho also sat down. He started striking up a deal with her, as she wanted. Chapter, 172 Yong Ho's transaction in the virtual space was over. His connection with it was also lost. Instead of opening his eyes right away, he thought of something that he put off as an afterthought. Samuel used honorifics when speaking to Citri. And Citri sent back none other than Samuel in a few seconds, one of the five directors of the dungeon market. Is Citri also one of the five directors? If so, Citri's usual joke about describing herself as a big guy at the dungeon market was true. Well, it was natural if he came to think about it. Citri was Mammon's lover, the king of greed. This meant that she was one of the giant dungeon spirits that lived for over a thousand years. There was nothing wrong with her even if she was called one of the five directors of the dungeon market. So, Yong Ho didn't bother much because his ties with her wouldn't change anyway even if Citri was one of the five directors or not. Five directors at least Samuel doesn't know Citri's relationship with Mammon. And Citri wants to hide it. Although there were some assumptions in his thinking like that, his conclusion was quite reasonable. He thought about one more thing. A master's frequent meeting with Citri. How would it affect his deal if it was known that a master meets Citri often? Am I too worried? Maybe it was meaningless. If something urgent really had happened, Citri would have sent him back, not Samuel. But. It was clear that he was bothered by Citri's action. He even felt that he was attracting Citri's unnecessary attention. Whatever. Yong Ho opened his eyes. He gently shook his head to put it out of his mind. The immediate task for him was to occupy the eastern area. Are you back? Did you buy a lot of cheap stuff? What about my gift? Catalina and Kaiwan asked as if they were waiting for him. Instead of replying, Yong Ho looked for Eligos and Ophelia to discuss some practical matters. Two days later, Yong Ho started to attack Stravati's dungeon. There were two ways to attack the dungeon. One of them was to just blindly dispatch a huge number of troops to neutralize the traps inside the dungeon and take over it. The other was to properly attack the dungeon by infiltrating the elite force. Most of the masters preferred the first option compared to the second if they could afford it, even if their damage was heavy. Attacking a dungeon was completely unpredictable to any attacker. On the other hand, a dungeon was the ultimate home ground for the defenders. It was dangerous to send an elite force to such a place. What if the elite dungeon spirits fall into an unexpected trap and get killed? They were different from low-quality spirits that could be easily obtained with money. There was a high possibility that the elite spirits could not be obtained even with money. Moreover, if the killed spirits were put to service as dungeon spirits, 
they would deal a considerable blow to the dungeon master. For this reason, the attack on the dungeons in the demon world was often carried out in the following ways they send a large-scale force of low quality to neutralize the defender's traps and collect information on the inside of the dungeon. After that, an elite force could pass through the incapacitated trap zone, destroy the defender's force, and occupy the dungeon. Generally speaking, when attackers devised tactics, the defenders also prepared their own tactics. But the attackers changed their tactics too often, so the defenders changed the dungeons accordingly. As for the traps, those with a wide range of effectiveness and specialization in slaughter were preferred to those with high power and accuracy. And the structure of the dungeon was changed in a way that was easier to deal with a large number of attackers rather than a small one, so they could trap them all at once. But there was one thing that didn't change. What was the most annoying and difficult thing when attacking a dungeon? Yong Ho, who had not much experience in attacking dungeons, could easily answer that question. It was because anybody could easily answer it if they thought about the PC games they used to enjoy during their middle and high school days. The answer to this question was getting lost in the dungeon. In other words, the attackers keep wandering about in the same place because they couldn't find the right way. Demon King or Paso, who was famous for making dungeons in the past, said, the best and worst dungeon is the labyrinth. Stravati, always reliant on rational thinking, turned his dungeon into a labyrinth. His dungeon was huge, above all. It was large enough to hold three to four dungeons, compared with a typical dungeon in the southern area. Moreover, the passages inside were complicated. They were not just a motley of crossroads. Stravati could change its internal structure in real time. Of course, due to more variability and more complicated passages, the durability of the dungeon wall could be problematic for the dungeon owner. But Stravati solved this problem in a very simple way. He expanded the dungeon site. If the dungeon site was wide enough to create a complex passage with walls of sufficient thickness and strength, he would not have to worry about it. It was only Stravati, the designer of the dungeon, who perfectly understood the dungeon structure. The dungeon spirits knew no more than the zone assigned to them. Stravati, located in the Demon King's room in the deepest part of the dungeon, believed in his dungeon, a labyrinth that he built with utmost efforts. So, as always, he devised a rational and simple strategy. The House of Mammon was now the only enemy to Stravati. If he defeated its master, he would achieve everything. That was why he spared no time and effort to win in this battle. His strategy was to reduce the combat power of the House of Mammon and wear them out. He was ready to use all his available dungeon spirits and traps for that purpose. A true labyrinth didn't allow for the attacker's entry but also their exit. So, once the attackers were lured into entering the dungeon, half the battle was already over. Stravati intended to lure the master of the House of Mammon and his dungeon spirits into his dungeon and kill them slowly. That was his plan, which he had to carry out, and by all means at that. But how could they break through it? Stravati asked in a low voice. Instead of expressing anger, he gave it a serious thought. He tried to understand the unreasonable situation unfolding before his eyes right now. Stravati's dungeon spirits, who were called the Four Knights of the East, also could not hide their embarrassment. What was happening in the dungeon map that the souls of the dungeon opened in the air were completely beyond Stravati's expectations. The infiltration troops of the House of Mammon were advancing straight ahead inside the dungeon. Straight, without any hesitation or wandering, they were advancing through the shortest route straight. Even the structural change of the dungeon itself, Stravati's pride, was not functioning. When he changed the route by manipulating the forks and part of the passage, the infiltrating force of the Mammon family changed the route accordingly. The four knights did not fully understand the structure of the dungeon. However, they partly knew that there were limits to structural changes. Moreover, the Mammon family's infiltrating forces found and destroyed the core structures that were subject to change. By doing so, they gradually reduced the room for Stravati's changing the dungeon itself. Stravati's dungeon was no longer a labyrinth. It was just a simple one-way dungeon. Moreover, that wasn't the only problem. Yongho did not dispatch a large unit into the dungeon. He sent a relatively small number of only 40 members there. Besides, it wasn't just ordinary dungeon spirits that attacked at the forefront. 
Each of them was the dungeon spirit of the Mammon family with tremendous power. Neither the traps nor Stravati's dungeon spirits could not stop them. The passage, which was inevitably narrow because it was a labyrinth, rather empowered the dungeon spirits of the House of Mammon. Stravati's dungeon spirits had to confront the enemies they couldn't deal with properly. They could not make use of anything like a numerical advantage in this fight. Of course, to prepare for this kind of situation, there was always supposed to be a gathering place in the dungeon, along with a special force specialized in destroying the enemy's elite force. Stravati's special force was strong. Trained only for the purpose of fighting at the gathering place, they could defeat any outside attackers, who were twice as strong as they were. But there was one problem. The dungeon spirits of the House of Mammon were strong and too strong at that. It was no exaggeration to say that they were strong enough to be called the Master's Alliance, rather strong Master's Alliance. Stravati's labyrinth was neutralized. The traps and dungeon spirits there were incapacitated. He could stick it out if only one of them was functioning because he had sized up the power of the House of Mammon early on. But when both of them proved useless before Yongho's forces, he could do nothing to defend against them. Even this time, his combat calculations went wrong. Stravati opened his eyes. Once again, he repressed his anger and stood up from the throne. The risk of his next strategy was high because he failed to wear down the Mammon forces, contrary to his expectations, but he had to carry it out. He had no other choice. We're going to destroy them one by one. Everybody, stand by in your position. At his order, the four knights swallowed in extreme tension then hurriedly got out of the demon king's room. Under his plan, he intended to capture each of the dungeon spirits of the Mammon family then kill those powerful enough to equal the head of the master's coalition to weaken the master of the house of Mammon while growing his own power. First of all, let me get rid of that gray-haired girl. Chapter, 173 The white-haired dark elf moved too fast. Moreover, she always stayed with the head of the Mammon family as if she was his escort knight. The red beast and wild animal always paired to attack the enemy. As they moved in sync with each other, it was difficult to catch only one of them. The wizard that dismantled the traps did not go forward. Like the dark elf girl, he also did not distance himself from the master of the Mammon family. The skeleton knight was also threatening. The essence of the undead with the energy of death could not be absorbed in the usual way. So, given the priorities, it was the last one. In terms of elimination of the enemy, what was left now was the gray haired girl. Apart from it, there were many more reasons to single out the girl with gray hair. She always took the lead in the attack. Because of the way she attacked splendidly in many ways, she often distanced herself from other dungeon spirits. Besides, her mana was powerful. If one ate it, one could expect a significant increase in horsepower. Stravati once again communicated with the souls of the dungeon. He looked straight ahead and activated his power. He jumped through space. Combination magic. Gust of ice. The fierce wind caused by Tigrius struck low on the floor. It pushed away not only the energy of dark green poison that leaked out of the wall but also froze the whole thing. Eligos and Ophelia ran around side by side. Although the gathering place was quite spacious, it was a disaster for Stravati's dungeon spirits because it was indoors. They could not escape anywhere from the beasts running wild to attack them right before their eyes. Yongho stood in the rear of the gathering area and watched his dungeon spirits fight. He was refraining himself from trying to do anything other than finding the right passage with the power of greed. He needed to save his energy to confront Stravati and Sargatanas, who were likely to exist in the deepest part of this dungeon. Catalina, too, did not get into the fight for the same reason. Skull was also on standby in the rear, just commanding his unit. Among the dungeon spirits of the Mammon family, only three were currently actively fighting, Elagos, Ophelia, and Kaiwan. And in fact, it was difficult to say that even they were doing their best. Hey, make my day. Come on if you dare. Shouting loudly, Kaiwan wielded her whip sword. The sword, which was only stretched long enough to reach the ceiling of the gathering place, tore everything caught in its blade. It was safe to say that the blade was like a whirlpool. While the terrible massacre was going on, Stravati's special force didn't lose their fighting spirit. 
since they went through repeated brainwashing, they were never afraid of death. They willingly sacrificed themselves to inflict any damage to the dungeon spirits of the House of Mammon. A series of big explosions continued here and there in the gathering area. It was suicide bombing by Stravati's special force. Eligos and Ophelia, who were fighting the special force in close range, hurriedly moved their hands and feet to protect themselves from the explosion. Tigrius, once again, caused a strong wind to push out the flames and heat of the explosion. Kaiwan was also caught in the explosion. She wasn't injured a bit because she quickly opened the barrier of distortion, but she couldn't help it when her vision was instantly blocked at the explosion. Kaiwan momentarily hung her sword loose to catch her breath. She waited for the dust ahead to scatter at the wind caused by Tigrius. Right at that moment, she breathed out long, Catalina yelled at her suddenly like lightning. Kaiwan. It was because she sensed that something threatening was approaching Kaiwan. However, her warning rather backfired. The moment Kaiwan instinctively looked back at Catalina, her blind spot became even bigger. After all, she allowed the opponent to attack her. Stravati jumped over space. At the moment Kaiwan and Catalina's eyes crossed, he already landed behind Kaiwan's back. As soon as he snatched her waist, he opened up his mana. It was a silent roar. It resonated throughout the whole gathering place. Stravati's harsh mana suppressed Kaiwan. Stravati. Yongho yelled. Catalina hit the ground. Kaiwan looked at Stravati's arms around her waist. And Stravati also looked at the point where he started. Then he activated the power of jump. The power of jump was not invincible. Although he could jump as long as 600 meters, he had a decisive weakness the place within his vision. He could only make a space jump only toward that place. Catalina's moonlight sword cut through the air. Stravati, who appeared from the exit of the gathering point, activated his power in succession without delay. By changing the dungeon terrain through the soul of the dungeon, he secured his own vision while blocking the Mammon Force's vision. He jumped through space exactly seven times. When his space leap was over, Stravati was standing at the last gathering point on the third floor in the basement. Kaiwan, who was exposed to his space leap without any consideration, felt dizzy severely. And he made the eighth space leap. Stravati appeared four meters away from the place where Kaiwan twisted and swung her whip sword. Stravati saw Kaiwan who turned lightly and crashed on the floor according to the law of gravity. He immediately came up with the next move. The souls of the dungeon injected mana into the gathering place. Then, a powerful curse of magic was activated from the gathering place. The four knights, who had already arrived and waited in advance, also strengthened the power of the curse by activating their own magic techniques. It was the most basic, and therefore the most effective curse of weakening the opponent. Kaiwan shuddered. Although she thought she had to open up her mana to release the curse, her mind had a way of its own. It was because the poison of Nagaraja spread all over her body. Perhaps, she was poisoned when Stravati held her back. Moreover, Stravati didn't put Kaiwan down anywhere. It was no exaggeration to say that the spot where she fell was a poison pool. Tall and skinny, Stravati was a man like a snake. With an intelligent-looking face underneath a brownish blonde, he made a light smile for the first time since the dungeon battle began. All five horns protruding above his ears trembled slightly. His overwhelming mana that he increased dramatically by taking the essence of Sargatanas filled the inside of the gathering area. Kaiwan bit her lips. She managed to open her horns then immediately activated the power of distortion. As if a turtle was hiding in a house, she protected her entire body with a hemispherical shield of distortion. It seemed that she was determined to give up fighting and stick it out. Stravati clicked his tongue and shook his head. He thought her action was truly useless. He felt that her action could buy her only a little time. And he could tear the weakened shield apart with his powerful mana. Let me devour you, BTCH. Instead of cursing at him, Kaiwan kept concentrating. She was not sure how many times she would be able to withstand Stravati's attack, but she needed to buy some time by all means. Stravati drew a small sword and struck the shield of distortion with all his power from the beginning. 
Exactly three times, Kaiwan vomited blood with a painful groan because the shield of distortion that she barely maintained was broken. Nagaraja's poison injured her intestines. Stravati acted rationally. He wasn't going to waste his time harassing Kaiwan needlessly. He trampled all over her abdomen with his shoes on. After fixing her so that she could not move, he aimed at her chest with his sword. At that moment, the ceiling exploded. The flow of mana flowing in the gathering ground was cut off. The curse was destroyed. The four knights screamed in horror, looking at the broken ceiling. Stravati also turned around. He couldn't stand it anymore. He became irrational and shouted at the opponent in anger, what the heck happened? How could you chase me like this? How? The gathering site was supposed to block the flow of his mana from leaking outside. And it was impossible for Yongho's forces to chase him with the mana released from his dungeon spirits. Did he find out the passage? It was also impossible. It wasn't through the proper path that they moved from the basement on the second floor to the third floor. Obviously, they could do it by reversely using Stravati's own power to leap to a space in a strange place. But how could they chase him and in such a short time at that? Yongho looked ahead before answering. The smoke of greed, tied in only one strand, engulfed Kaiwan in the gathering place densely. Kaiwan smiled in pain, and Yongho spoke a little brazenly, Well, it's because she is mine. What did you say? Stravati asked back blankly. Instead of answering, Yongho stretched out his right hand into the air. Then he grabbed Amen, the magic spear of the Red Lotus. He instinctively moved on to the next step. The moment the Spear of Flames appeared in the air, Stravati left the place by exercising his power. It was the right decision. The sword of a dark elf girl, not the master of the Mammon family, flew like a beam of light and pierced the air. Stravati, who jumped to the end of the room at once, summoned the four knights through ritual, not words. Armed with full plate armor, the four knights quickly gathered next to Stravati and prepared for defense against her attack. The dark elf girl held the gray-haired girl in her arms and left the place. And their void was instantly filled by the master of the Mammon family and his two dungeon spirits, namely the red beast and the wild animal. It happened in a few seconds. Stravati tried to recover his reason. He suppressed his emotions and thought about this attack. There was only one answer. Stop the dungeon spirits of the house of Mammon. He spoke low. In fact, he made the decision from the moment he decided to have it out with the House of Mammon at the dungeon battle. Although the battle unfolded very differently from what he had intended in the first place, he didn't care because what mattered to him was the results he had in mind. The dungeon was Stravati's own territory. The souls of the dungeon informed him about the situation around it. Not all of the dungeon spirits of the Mammon family came here for the fight. The wizard and the skeleton knights had yet to arrive at this room. Only the red beast and the wild animal stood by the master of the house of Mammon. The dark elf girl, presumed to be his escort knight, was moving toward the wizard and the skeleton knights with the severely injured gray-haired girl. The situation wasn't bad for Stravati. The souls of the dungeon issued an alarm urgently. All the remaining spirits in the dungeon were about to gather here. Chapter 174 Besides, the red beast and wild animal were most heavily used among the dungeon spirits of the House of Mammon. Although Stravati failed to wear them down completely as he planned, it was beneficial to him to confirm that they were in their best shape now. With the help of the four knights, who became stronger like him, he would be able to hold the red beast and wild animal in check, even if he could not defeat them. It is not reasonable to defeat them in a pincer movement. It wasn't good for him to attack them with four knights through a pincer movement. It was more efficient for him to block the red beast and the wild animal and have a one-on-one -on -one duel with the master of the Mammon family. Stravati thought quickly. At his order, the four knights stared at the red beast and wild animal as if they were fully determined. Yong Ho, the master of the Mammon family, faced Stravati and four knights. Instead of wielding Amun, he said, You ate Sargatanas, right? Although Yong Ho got suspicious when he first heard it from the Nagaraja master who surrendered, he was convinced that Stravati really killed him and took his essence. Stravati twisted his lips and said, Yes, that's correct. Let me show you the results of it now. 
he already opened five horns. However, this was not his best weapon. Stravati took a step toward Yongho. He awakened Nagaraja's blood in his body. The snake's heart began to pound and transform Stravati into a more combative shape. Blue serpent scales sprang on the back of his face and arms. Stravati took another step. This time, the souls of the dungeon reacted to it. They instilled dungeon mana into Stravati. But this alone couldn't increase his mana, but it was possible to recover his mana. It was like providing Stravati with a mana recovery tank of tremendous capacity. Stravati felt greatly uplifted. With the serpent's heart, he didn't have any guilt for Sargatana's death in the first place. All he felt was something like a sense of loss and a little anger from the fact that he killed Sargatanas, whom he loved. But now he didn't feel even such feelings. Why was he so obsessed with the fighting calculations? What the heck was he afraid of? Wasn't he perhaps the strongest master in the abandoned southern area, with such mighty power? Stravati's mana filled the gathering place again. It was mana filled with chill. Stravati laughed confidently. The four knights also admired his great power. But at that moment, Yongho opened up his mana fully. With Yongho's five horns soaring, his mana arose like flames, and the green flames devoured the cold energy of Stravati that was filling the inside of the gathering place. His fierce mana was like an explosion. Even without the battle of strength, it roughly crushed Stravati's mana. The four knights made an embarrassed expression. Moreover, Yongho's attack was not yet over. Light came from the magic field on his left hand and Brigada. Two of the seven claws that made up the heart of the demon god bit Yongho's heart at the same time, and it brought out stronger power than now. Stravati's mana was just huge. On the other hand, Yongho's mana was swirling violently. It was like a strong storm. The moment Yongho stepped forward instantly, the tide was turned. His fully uplifted feelings a moment ago were shattered completely. It wasn't just the difference between the power of their mana. In terms of the absolute amount of mana, Yongho lagged behind Stravati. With the advantage of the dungeon fight, Stravati was in a much more favorable position. Nevertheless, he was overwhelmed by Yongho. Unlike the four knights who were scared of the wall that suddenly appeared before their eyes, Stravati quickly understood why. Therefore, he experienced much more fluctuations in his emotions. The strength of Yongho's mana was different from his. It also differed qualitatively, not quantitatively. There was an explosion. It was the sound of Yongho, Elagos, and Ophelia, rushing toward him with full force at the same time. Absorbed into thoughts, Stravati could not react immediately. Besides, he even thought of something that he should have not at this moment. Can I win? The gap in their fighting abilities widened further. Now it was irreversible. Kong. 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 Eligos and Ophelia struck the four knights hard. Eligos's fists smashed not only the wall and floor but also the knight's armor. Ophelia's attack was much more elegant but fatal at the same time. One of the knights who were overwhelmed by Yongho's mana was kicked in his chest. Since he couldn't even stand it, he was pushed back and collided with the wall. The noise of his clash resonated through the gathering place. Stravati leaped through space. Faced with a close call, he could avoid Yongho's blow by exercising his power. But that was it. Stravati moved only to escape, not avoid his attack. At the same time, Amun pierced the air. Yongho turned. He was guided by the experiences he gained through numerous fights. He released black mana from his left arm and grabbed Stravati, who just finished making a space jump. Then he threw Stravati down on the floor even before the latter regained power to leap through space again. Stravati moaned in pain from the shock transmitted from his back. No matter how powerful his mana was, he was bound by the body, after all. There was a brief pause. When Stravati repressed his pain and opened his eyes, Yongho already finished taking the next step. Greatly expanded black mana blurred Stravati's vision and blocked his space jump. Amun was riding on black mana, and its burning spear pierced Stravati's abdomen. An unbearable pain seized Stravati. His strong Nagaraja body survived the shock, 
but his mental shock was still there. Stravati acted instinctively. He exercised his power to escape the pain. He didn't do it after some careful thinking. Because of this, he couldn't do anything like adjusting his distance with his opponent or his location. He looked at something in the dimming darkness and threw himself into that place. Stravati felt the sense of soaring in the air and falling down at the same time. Since the burning spear disappeared, he felt like a burden was lifted, though just a little bit. Yong Ho grabbed him by the neck. Once again, Stravati was bumped against the floor. Moreover, this time, his head was hit first. He couldn't open his eyes properly, and even if he did, the only thing he could see was the floor. Mana, magic, and power, with these three factors, Stravati could escape the current situation. But he needed time to escape, but Yong Ho did not allow it. Yong Ho pierced Stravati's waist with his left hand. A shield of distortion spread out from the hole in the side that Amon had already pierced. Stravati couldn't even scream. When Yong Ho's hand bounced from the wound like a rocket, Stravati's belly was a mess. The wounds opened wider, and the pressed intestines were torn and crushed. There was no such thing as an elegant gladiator match. Even the close battle between the rival masters with equal mana didn't take place. Yong Ho concentrated his magic on his right hand. Just as Stravati suppressed Kaiwan's mana, he instinctively blasted Stravati's mana, who was struggling to survive. The gathering place was shaken. It looked as if the whole dungeon was moaning. Yong Ho moved his hand again. Though the situation now was overwhelmingly favorable to him, he didn't let his guard down. The dungeon was still injecting mana into Stravati. His Nagaraja body quickly rebuilt itself even though the placenta of his intestines was crushed. That was why Yong Ho had to keep attacking. Yong Ho held Amon short with his left hand. He then made a new hole by stabbing Stravati's back multiple times. Stravati struggled once again but never escaped Yong Ho's attacks. Yong Ho did the terrible thing repeatedly. After releasing Amon in the air again, he put his left hand into the hole. Using the power of distortion, he destroyed Stravati's body. His skin with scales swelled greatly. His bones pressed down by the distortion of the shield were broken. His lung was also maimed, gushing blood. Since his heart, one of the gathering points of mana, was busted, the speed of his body's restoration was also slow. Yong Ho grabbed his right hand then put his left hand on his body that was devastated like a piece of rags after he crushed Stravati's snake-like neck. He grabbed Amon with his right hand for the final blow. Stravati wriggled. The souls of the dungeon squeezed out mana to inject it into Stravati, but it was all in vain. Amon, giving off extreme heat, pierced the back of Stravati's head and burned his head with the green flames. Master! One of the four knights shouted. Struggling against Elagos and Ophelia, they felt their mana drastically dwindled. Since their owner, Stravati, was killed, their connection was also cut off. Yong Ho was also convinced of Stravati's death. Letting out a long sigh, he stopped using mana. Then he deactivated the heart of the demon god, which was straining the spirit and body of the dungeon spirits, and took the next step. Stravati died without showing his abilities properly. He didn't properly use his mighty mana, nor did he show off his swordsmanship well known among the eastern masters. He also didn't make the best use of his secret card of Nagaraja mana and the power of space leap. But Yong Ho was not interested in them. Since he fought and won, it was time for him to reap the results of his victory. Stravati's mana, which was equal to five horns. It could be called the combined mana of those masters who once existed in the eastern and northern regions. Elagos and Ophelia turned. As they were virtually born and raised in the southern area, they instinctively realized that what would happen from now on was not simply for the winning master to absorb the essence of the defeated master. The Abandoned Southern Area as the name implied, it was a land without an owner. It had always been divided since the times of Mammon, the great king of greed. It was not abandoned anymore. The era of a new king would finally unfold after a thousand years of a long break. Yong Ho expressed intense greed. He ate all the essence that Stravati had. The king of the unclaimed territory. A crow chirped. 
Watching Stravati's dungeon, it contained information in its black eyes. Then it flew away, making a big chirping noise. The unclaimed land in the south was unified finally. Although he had not yet combined all the power available, he could unite the essence of mana. The king of the unclaimed territory, Citri said. She raised herself in the black silence. Instead of digging through old memories, she witnessed what happened now. What would all this change bring about, timed with the war in the north? Citri shook her head. She got all her inferences out of her mind. She just followed her pure feelings now. She realized she was happy about the outcomes of the battle. Mammon. The nostalgic name warmed her heart. She smiled brightly like a girl. When would Yong Ho come to see her? She didn't hide her excitement. She gently pressed her chest and closed her eyes. She looked forward to seeing him. Chapter, 175 The fight in the northern area was unfolding differently from what the King of Fury expected. The King of Fury initially thought that the fight in the north would soon escalate into a great war. But it was not. The King of Pride attacked slowly and steadily as if the only kings in the world were himself and the King of Envy. He felt like he was engaged in a one-on-one -on -one duel with the King of Envy without the third party. The King of Lust, whose territory faced the borders with the territory of the King of Envy, did not move in the harem at all while the two kings were fighting each other. He did not help the King of Envy to repel the King of Pride, nor did he ambush the King of Envy who was in a head-to-head -head battle with the King of Pride. The King of Fury, who led his troops and camped on the northern borders, felt frustrated. As a king with pacifist leanings, she obviously did not want a world war. But it didn't mean that she was satisfied with the current situation. Although the King of Fury was often called a simplistic and ignorant warmonger, she was by no means a fool or a madman. She was just a little more naive and simple than the other kings. The King of Fury soon understood that the northern area was like an active volcano that didn't erupt yet, for she realized why the King of Gluttony was watching the fight as an onlooker, aside from the King of Lust. When she found out the reason, she thought it was really unpleasant. Well, I'm going to intervene only after they have been exhausted. The King of Fury always thought of the best scenario. And the best, one she thought of was that the war in the north itself fizzled out at the beginning. That would be the least damaging to all. But other kings differed on this. That was why they regarded the King of Fury as a foolish king rather than a pacifist. According to their logic, what was important was not to reduce the damage. It didn't matter whether it was the King of Pride or the King of Envy. What they wanted was to stop any king from dominantly accumulating any one of the three, namely essence, godly energy, and sin. The damage unrelated to this was rather an advantage to them. In other words, the damage, in this case, was that of the King of Pride and the King of Envy, not the King of Gluttony himself. Because of this, they didn't care even if the King of Pride overpowered the King of Envy. They would welcome it with open arms if the King of Envy was unilaterally damaged and his force collapsed. So, the King of Fury thought that now was not the time to intervene. There was nothing she would gain by intervening to stop the fight. It was only when their fight was almost at an end that she would decide to intervene. The King of Pride might have found out her intention. The most dangerous moment would be when he beheaded the King of Envy and had everything. In that case, all the other kings would certainly go after the King of Pride. Or if he enlists the help of the King of Envy. And if he succeeded, there would break out a great war at that moment. It would be a war between the king, who took two godly energies in sin, and the other kings. The king of gluttony was confident that he knew quite well about the king of fury. As someone who liked to go to any battlefield, she was so straightforward and simple-minded. Although there were rumors that she was a warmonger, knowledgeable people knew that she had a tough time working for her people, not for her own interests. What bothers me is the king of lust and the king of violence. These two kings would be her prime competitors when the fight between the King of Pride and the King of Envy came to a head. It's going to be incredibly bloody. The King of Gluttony smiled in satisfaction. It was not because of the looming war. It was because of a letter politely delivered by the half-naked Afsaras, one of the beauties of the King of Gluttony. The southern unclaimed land was unified. 
However, other kings couldn't pay attention to the southern land since they cared about the northern territory alone. They couldn't afford to care about the southern land that had been devastated because of Embryo's war. Above all, it had been abandoned for a long time since the time of Mammon. There were no competitors there, so they didn't need to fight each other. The only thing I have to do is to check it out once last time. And if he got the result he wanted, they would see what would happen when the competition started. They would witness the appearance of a great king who has acquired more than two sins for the first time since Mammon, the king of greed. The king of gluttony felt a strong appetite. He beckoned to Afsaras. She hastily rang the bell and prepared dinner for the hungry king. Hey, that's mine. Seated on a long sofa, Kaiwan shouted, behaving like a snub. As if she felt her message didn't get understood by the other party, she spoke again, changing the way she sat, and in the end, she burst into laughter. It's mine, you know. Oh my gosh. Yes, that's right. I'm Yong Ho's, Yong Ho's, Yong Ho's. It's been one day since they smashed Stravati. Kaiwan was excited all day long after she was detoxified from Nagaraja's poison thanks to the special remedy that Skathak had given her before she left for the fight. I wish everyone here had seen Yongho's face at that time. He was a man of perfect flames, you know. Anyway, I'm Yongho's. Catalina, who was sitting next to her forcibly, pursed up her lips at her repetition of the same words. She let her ears droop several times and tried to balk, though timidly. Well, I'm also Yong Ho's. Don't you know it? At that moment, everybody was silent. Although Catalina tried to assert herself as brazenly as possible, she puckered her lips again when Kai Wan stopped smiling and stared at her. Blushing, Catalina let her ears and shoulders droop at the same time. Kai Wan glanced at her quietly then stretched out her hand. She not only pinched Catalina's cheeks but also hugged her suddenly. Oh my gosh! So what, my sister? What do I do about it now? You're so cute. As always, Catalina was at a loss about her unexpected reaction, but Kaiwan didn't care and laughed a lot, pulling even her tail. Yes, you and I are Yonghos. Everything here is all his, right? Kaiwan asked Catalina, who was struggling to get out of her arms watching them quietly, Salami shook its head, while lying face down. Obviously, Salami thought about something weird. Ophelia shook her head, but with a different nuance from Salami's. She really could not believe that this cheerful woman before her eyes was the former female ruler, Kai Wan, that her father and Delian used to mention, the noble and beautiful woman who was like a thorny rose. Smiling apologetically at Catalina who signaled to her for help, Ophelia took her gaze from her and looked at her master who was absorbed into something. Do you know you're turning up your mouth now? No way I wonder if you really think you were cool like the dungeon spirit Kaiwan said when you. Lucia, who took control of Stravati's dungeon, spoke in a fully assumed voice. Again, Yongho ignored her message lightly and displaced Stravati's dungeon information in the air by teasing his finger. It's a really big and complex dungeon. It has a long history, but it seems that it has been greatly expanded and renovated recently. Yongho nodded. As Lucia said, it was a complex dungeon that made him feel dizzy just by looking at it. Without the power of greed, he would have wandered for several days on the first floor, let alone the third floor in the basement. In my personal opinion, it's a little regrettable to destroy it. There are many good facilities inside. Just like the property of a family that built up wealth for a long time, Stravati's dungeon was well built. Besides, there were several facilities such as the Advanced Training Center for the Masters, the Intermediate Magic Lab, and the Reagent Manufacturing Center, that the House of Mammon didn't have. The dungeon whose heart was destroyed was supposed to perish. The moment Yong Ho took its essence to make Lucia grow, this huge dungeon would be thrown into the fate of inevitable death. Because of this, Yong Ho also thought it was regrettable to take it. He really wanted to make this dungeon the forward base of the eastern branch of the House of Mammon because it was too good to be compared with the small dungeons that he had used as forward bases. But he had no other choice. Actually, one of the main reasons for his expedition to the eastern area was because he wanted to make Lucia grow. At the same time, he couldn't give up the essence of this dungeon, which was much more valuable than a mix of a few small and medium-sized dungeons. 
I can make Lucia grow anyway. When Lucia grew, he could obtain various facilities in the labyrinth of greed. Given that the facilities that he could newly install would also increase, it would soon become a big dungeon like this one. Okay, let me focus on laying the firm foundation for the future dungeon now. The reason he bothered to occupy Stravati's dungeon was not just for viewing or reference. His main purpose was to collect all kinds of treasures hidden in his dungeon. Chapter 176 Gold and silver coins that could be called cash were not found much, compared to other goods. However, it was only a relative evaluation. Actually, they were several times as much as the amount of cash that the House of Mammon possessed now. It was Stravati's personal safe that caught the attention of Yongho the most among the treasures in the dungeon. If Yongho and Lucia had not taken control of the dungeon, they would have never known its existence itself. Although Yongho couldn't be sure what was inside it because he hadn't yet visited the dungeon, just a mere glance at the list of Stravati's possessions astonished him. Are these pictures? Yongho, who did not know more than five artists in the human world, could not determine the value of the booty. Besides, paintings were one of the items that were quite difficult to convert into cash. Therefore, he turned his attention to those things that he intuitively found it easy to understand. A fire dragon's teeth. Jin's necklace. Black Mamba's armor set. Chantier collection no. 116, 91, 240. Mandarik. Yongho was silent for a moment. And he humbly admitted that he couldn't understand their value at all. Like his father advised him, he decided to leave it to Ophelia, an expert in the field. When he put aside the secret safe, there appeared extravagant places such as wine cellars and enormous bathrooms he once again expressed regret about his decision to dispose of the dungeon when he looked at its huge bathroom. But he stopped at the next place. He said before he knew it, the door of space. It was not used for a long time. It looks like it was built more than a hundred years ago. Listening to Lucia's additional explanation distractedly, Yongho was seated on the throne. The reason why he momentarily stopped at the door of space was because he recalled something suddenly. Come to think of it. Kaiwan. Ah. Uh. After pondering over something, he called her immediately. He looked at the sofa, which he had ignored, then flinched for some other reason. It was because he saw Kaiwan pulling Catalina's tail with some kind of menacing look while holding her with a long face. Luckily, Salami's sullen face in the back helped him wake up to the reality. He slightly turned away from Catalina's desperate glance, which he thought was cute, then asked Kaiwan, why did you stop making the door of space in the middle? Uh. Oh, that stuff. Currently, the door of space in the House of Mammon was not newly built by Yongho from start to finish. He finished it after picking up where Kaiwan had already built half of it. Why did Kaiwan make the door of space? She didn't answer right away and then puckered her lips. She then leaned against the sofa. Rubbing Catalina's tail, she barely opened her mouth, I was a little lonely. I also wanted to get some help. Because I knew about your family. What I mean is the descendants of another Mammon family who exist in the human world. She hid her loneliness with a smile. Then she continued in a lively tone, I saw it in the record. I also heard some from the previous masters I met at the arena. She needed help. She needed somebody she could rely on, somebody different from those trapped in the arena. She needed an elderly who could help her directly. Someone who will lead her, not just her deputy. Well, who knows, your relatives in the human world may live well. I was thinking of getting some help from them, she said jokingly. Because of her mention of his family in the human world, Yongho could also recall some funny episodes. I guess you would have stuffed yourself with chicken there. His grandfather ran a chicken restaurant. Yongho heard that it was the best one in his neighborhood. Fortunately, Yongho only thought to himself about it. As Yongho laughed, Kaiwan, who laughed along with him, touched Catalina's tail again. The reason why I suspended the construction of the door of space in the middle was simple. It took too much more resources and mana than I thought. So, I stopped the construction, thinking of resuming it sometime in the future. Good job, he again thought to himself. It took tremendous resources to construct the door of space. 
If the only reward she got after constructing the door so hard had been just chicken, Kaiwan would have fallen down with a fit of anger. Kaiwan laughed again and looked at him gently. I suddenly have a bit of regret now. If I had completed the door then, I might have met you earlier. Kaiwan didn't finish her words because she felt somewhat out of place at the moment. It was as many as thirty years ago that Kaiwan served as the master of the House of Mammon. Since she had been held up in the arena during the whole period, she might feel it looked like only yesterday, but it was just a long time ago to others. Suddenly, Kaiwan realized there was a big age difference between them. Going by age in the human world, it would not be strange for people to call her his grandma. Catalina, who quickly found out why Kaiwan was now on the defensive, realized that she had a chance to strike back. She got out of Kaiwan's arms then said a bit brazenly but timidly just like her, hmm. I'm only in my late twenties and early thirties. Nobody knew exactly how old she was, but she was around that age. If so, she was almost the same age as Yongho. The twenty-one-year-old Yongho turned his eyes away from the two with an effort. Suddenly, she thought of Citri. Right at that moment, Lucia changed the topic as if to save Catalina, who was tilting her head blankly, and Kaiwan, who was in confusion. Someone from the dungeon market is here. Currently, Butler Elagos is going out to meet him. From the dungeon market? Tilting his head to the side, he looked at Ophelia. She shook her head right away when he glanced at her quizzically as if to ask her if she bought anything. It wasn't Yongho himself who bought stuff there. Since he accessed the dungeon of the Nagaraja master last time, he had never entered the virtual space of the dungeon market. Eligos directly met an employee of the dungeon market. He doesn't look like a courier. It's a mare in a black suit. He sent a letter to Eligos. Speaking to him in succession, Lucia created a new screen in the air. It was a video that greatly enlarged the outer envelope of the letter Eligos received. Yongho didn't recognize the luxurious outer envelope and the seal stamped in the middle. However, he recognized the pretty, thin letters on the bottom of the outer envelope. Samuel. She was one of the five directors of the dungeon market, who had the fastest wings. It was her letter. Since Stravati's dungeon structure was so complex, it took more time than expected for Eligos to return. Since he wanted to hand the letter to Yongho as soon as possible, Eligos even turned beastly and ran fanatically. Thanks, Eligos. You don't have to overwork yourself like this next time. Eligos deactivated his beastly mechanism and greeted him, a bit embarrassed, because he felt he made a big fuss over it. He had no intention of embarrassing him at all, so he didn't say or ask him anything for fear that things might get complicated. So, he expressed gratitude to him again sincerely then headed to the sofa instead of the throne because there were a lot who wanted to know what was written in the letter. Kaiwan and Catalina naturally arranged a seat for him in the middle. Ophelia was already seated behind the sofa. Only Tigrius, who just returned after being summoned, was in his seat politely. Skull was also seated in the same spot but felt comfortable because it was the floor he was sitting on. When Yongho sat between the two women, Ophelia politely held out a knife. It was only for the purpose of opening envelopes. Phew! As he was about to open the letter, Yongho got a bit nervous because he felt a bit of mana inside, although the outer layer of the letter was nothing special. In case of an emergency, Yongho wrapped the envelope of the letter with mana. He could do it because of his excellent ability to control mana. Watching him doing so from behind, Ophelia smiled happily. There were two reasons why she did not examine the letter first this time like she did when he received a letter from Tigrius, requesting a duel. One of the reasons was that it was unlikely that the dungeon market would harm Yongho, and the other was her trust in him. Her owner and master of the House of Mammon was no more a green boy. He was a mighty monarch who unified the whole unclaimed area in the south. Finally, Yongho opened the envelope and took out the letter. It was a small black paper in the form of a card that he didn't even need to open. Special auction by the dungeon market is this an invitation? While reading the golden letters on the top of the card carelessly, Kaiwan was astonished. Startled, she raised her upper body leaning on Yongho. Samuel, the lady with the fastest wings oh my gosh. Do you really mean Samuel, one of the five directors of the dungeon market? 
surprise as much, Ophelia also made a big fuss over the invitation letter from Samuel. Even the gentle Tigreus opened his eyes wide with his jaws dropping. Five directors. Elegos responded belatedly. Catalina, who was embarrassed by the situation where everyone was astonished, pretended to be startled, too, because she didn't really know what the five directors meant. Fortunately, nobody noticed Catalina's awkward action because everybody fixed their eyes on the invitation in his hand. Inject mana in it. I think it's a video card. Chapter 177. Kaiwan egged on Yongho to do it quickly. Ophelia also nodded fiercely behind her back. Although nobody asked him, Tigreus explained it to calm himself down. The five directors of the dungeon market are not just dungeon merchants. Each of them is the master of their house with their own dungeon. And apart from their godly energy and sin, their power is considered to be equal to the six kings. The difference in power caused by their possession of sin or not was very large. However, they were owners of the dungeon market whose five directors were said to dominate the entire commerce of the demon world. Considering their additional resources, they were strong enough to compete with the six kings in terms of their forces. Now, one of these five directors sent an invitation directly to Yongho. Thanks to Tigreus's explanation, Catalina now understood what was going on, and she got as excited as Kaiwan and Ophelia. Even Salami looked at the invitation in Yongho's hand with twinkling eyes. With everyone so tense, Yongho injected mana into the invitation. One of the five directors of the dungeon market and the general manager of the auction house, Samuel, who has the fastest wings, is happy to greet the master of the great house of Mammon. The light emitting from the end of the invitation formed Samuel's images. It was about the size of two palms put together, which seemed to be just a recorded video of her message. It's not an invitation to everybody. It's an invitation specially sent to you, Yong Ho. Kaiwan said in excitement. In fact, she could not help but get thrilled. Samuel, one of the five directors, directly called him the master of the great house of Mammon. Elegos was moved to tears after a long time. Catalina also flapped her ears with overwhelming emotion. She had tears welled in her eyes. Ophelia understood Elegos and Catalina at this moment. At last, the House of Mammon was recognized. The House of Mammon had become the subject of great scorn after falling over a long period of time. As a result, nobody from the House of Mammon had been invited to the banquet of the demon kings in the southern area. Joining them belatedly, Ophelia's chest filled out. Elegos and Catalina, who had experienced hard times by themselves, had a lump in their throats, deeply moved by the invitation. Kaiwan broke down in tears, though a little bit. Although she couldn't make it when she was the master of the House of Mammon, she was so happy about Yong Ho's great achievement. Besides, it was her master and lover, Yong Ho, who was formally recognized. Samuel in the video continued, there is a special auction scheduled to be held in seven days. I hope that the master of the House of Mammon can attend the auction by all means. We will prepare all the conveniences for your visit here. If you are willing to participate, please feel free to use the summon scroll attached to the invitation. Our staffer will go and see you. After directly telling him the message, Samuel gracefully showed her manners. Then she said goodbye with an angelic smile. I look forward to seeing you again. The video was over. Kaiwan asked right away, did she say she was looking forward to seeing you again? Have you met her before? Also five directors. Yeah, a few days ago. After answering her question quickly, he examined the envelope a little more closely. Indeed, there was a scroll of the same size as the invitation. At that moment, Kaiwan hugged his arm and brought her face closer to him. She didn't do it to express her affection but wanted him to tell more about his meeting with Samuel instead of being distracted by something else. Since Catalina and other dungeon spirits agreed with her, Yong Ho put down the invitation. Then he puckered his lip for a moment as if to choose his words then said, Well, I met her in a virtual space by chance. She and I were waiting for Citri at that time. Citri? That lady of the dungeon market? Again this time, Kaiwan expressed a big interest. Catalina and Elegos, surprised, blinked their eyes. Yong Ho nodded and said, Yes, you're right. 
Citri. She was the dungeon merchant who helped all the previous masters of the House of Mammon before they formally inaugurated. But she usually paid little attention to any other master than Kaiwan. Maybe Citri is also one of the five directors. Are you sure? Citri is also a director. Eligoza's voice trembled. With her eyes open wide, Catalina also couldn't say anything. Yongho hesitated for a moment because Eligos and Catalina looked so groggy at the moment. However, he decided to continue because he already opened his mouth. This time, he revealed something more surprising. And Citri is one of the women affiliated with the House of Mammon. How should I call her properly? Should I say she is my grandma? Eligos was completely frozen. But Catalina sprang to her feet and shouted, That woman with red hair. The woman who always tormented Alun anyway, she was a witch who was one of Mammon's lovers. Citri also had red hair. Ophelia explained on behalf of Eligos, who lost his mind at the moment. I told you about it once before Mammon had so many women. However, there were two special women among them. One was Alun, who was Mammon's escort knight, and the other was a red-haired witch whose name was unknown. Yongho recalled his ancestor Kumiho or the nine-tailed fox, but he didn't mention the name. Kaiwan leaned her head on his shoulder and whispered, that's why. Perhaps, Kaiwan was thinking of her memories about Citri. Given that Citri called Kaiwan a nasty but cute girl, they must have a pretty good relationship. Anyway, it's the auction house, right? I heard that the dungeon market auction house was not just a place for auctions. Just like the regular banquets of the demon kings held in the southern area, it is a meeting place where the demon kings, who would never see each other normally, meet and rub shoulders. Regaining his composure, Tigrius explained in a quiet voice. Ophelia also added, it's a place for them to relax. They can avoid conflict through direct conversation. Yes, that's right. But they were held once every few years. Yongho understood why Catalina and Eligos broke into tears. The former master of the House of Mammon, who committed suicide because he could not bear the shame, had been totally ignored not only by other masters but also by the dungeon market. So, it was natural that all of them were deeply moved when one of the five directors of the dungeon market, the highest executive body, recognized the House of Mammon. However, it was natural that they were choked up with emotions because one of the five directors of the dungeon market recognized the House of Mammon. Perhaps, their sorrow buried deep in their hearts must have exploded. Does it mean that the dungeon market is not a typical marketplace? Based on the details about the dungeon market so far, the dungeon market was not obsessed with simply selling things. Just like a government that cared about the welfare of its people, the dungeon market had worked in various ways for the peace and well-being of the demon world. For example, they provided food at low prices or took measures of easing tensions, as Tigrius mentioned. If you want to sell something, you have to have someone to buy it. Maintaining a huge society called the demon world is also beneficial to the dungeon market because they can sell more in that environment, said Ophelia. Her answer had a point. Without demand, there was neither supply nor profit generation. After all, it's money, isn't it? Don't we have enough money? Yongho spoke carelessly, but Ophelia responded quickly, contrary to his expectation. Well, you are not supposed to say it since you are the king of greed. She didn't say it just because of her merchant spirit. Yongho was none other than the king of greed. Money, woman, power these are something anybody who has desire wants to pursue. No matter how much they have, they are never satisfied. And that desire was the source of Yong Ho's power. How could the king of greed say he had got enough money already? Yong Ho, who nodded on impulse, felt that Catalina and Kai Wan were pulling each of his arms firmly. Catalina was about to cry, with her ears drooping, and Kai Wan was staring at him ferociously after a long time. Although they looked at him differently, they seemed to see eye to eye on Ophelia's rebuke. Hey, stop it. Yongho cleared his throat at that moment and hastily changed the topic. Anyway, I think I have to decide whether to accept the invitation or not. He then looked at the card again. Tigria said, I think it is a great opportunity for you to broaden your knowledge. Although there was an all-out war going on in the north, 
I think powerful guys from the demon world will gather at the auction house because they offer special auctions this time. You bet. Yong Ho recalled the time when he and Citri attended the auction house. It was a good experience. Since he was exposed to a wider world back then, he could reach a higher level. Without his growth at that time, he would not have made what he is today. Yong Ho himself did not exist. Moreover, I got Brigada at that time. There was no one against him obtaining another good item this time. Rather, better auction items might be waiting for him. Okay, the only thing I have to do now is to get things done before I attend the auction house. In the eastern area, there were still some dungeons of Sargatanas and small and medium-sized dungeons. Yong Ho could own them easily if he decided to. Even if there were good auction items, he would not be able to buy them without money. So, it was time for him to collect all the money available to participate in the auction house. His eyes shone with greed, and Amun, watching silently, was relieved. His greed was still strong. Chapter, 178 Exactly a week after he received the invitation, Yong Ho took over the dungeons of Stravati and Sargatanas then stood at the entrance to the dungeon of the Nagaraja Master. Kaiwan and Catalina, fully dressed up, stood on his left and right side while the rest of his dungeon spirits saw him off, standing at the entrance. The dungeon market kept their time, as always. Over the sky where the sunset began to set, a flying wagon of the dungeon market appeared. Catalina, who unwittingly gave an exclamation of surprise, flapped her ears and tail because the flying wagon of the dungeon market was so beautiful. It was a white streamlined carriage resembling a shining moonlight, but what drew her interest, in particular, was the six pegasus pulling the carriage. She felt like it was even holy thanks to the bright moonlight behind the carriage stepping down from the sky. The carriage safely landed on the ground. Sitting on the coach box was an incubus well dressed in a neat suit. Half the subordinates of Samuel with the fastest wings were Mares, and the other half were Harpies. Those in charge of external affairs were mostly Mares among them. The incubus, who jumped gently from the coach box, expressed due manners to Yong Ho by deeply bowing then opened the carriage door. There was a familiar face inside the almond-like flat oval carriage. Dear client, it seems you have a thicker skin now. Never did I think you would have a big shot like me come over here like this. Wearing an alluring red evening dress, Citri spoke quite sharply. But she had a smile in her eyes and lips. Yong Ho also smiled at her and replied slyly, Thank you for your help, Citri. Well, you're welcome because you are my dear client. By the way, you have a cool cheek. Don't look innocent. I liked you better when you were more fresh and cute. Yong Ho had nothing to say this time other than smiling bitterly. Even Tigrius and Elagos, who knew how to be politically correct, didn't blame her rudeness. It wasn't because she was one of the five directors of the dungeon market. She was once Mammon's lover, the great king of greed. In some respects, she was doting on him as if he was her grandson, so they couldn't blame her. A uh, Citri? Kaiwan, who was standing next to Yong Ho, carefully called Citri. Although Kaiwan didn't bat an eyelid typically, she was nervous this time, with her eyes trembling already. It was because she was worried that Citri might not welcome her. Citri saw her. Then she opened her eyes wide and opened her arms in no time. She said kindly, Oh, cute client, it's been a long time. Can I hug you? Kaiwan couldn't stand it anymore. She jumped into the wagon even before she was done greeting her. Then she hugged Citri suddenly. Citri. You are still acting like a spoiled child. Citri stroked Kaiwan's head and back over and over again, who was held in her arms like a child. Although all the dungeon spirits of the House of Mammon were watching her, Kaiwan wept, rubbing her cheeks against Citri's chest. Citri was like an older sister and mother to Kaiwan as a child who had been earnestly looking for an adult she could follow. Moreover, she met Citri today after several decades. Citri hugged her tightly as if it was inevitable then glanced at Yong Ho, signaling to him to get into the carriage quickly. Okay, let me leave now. See you back at the house. Yong Ho was going to return to the house of Mammon right from the auction house. Since he got all the large dungeons in the eastern area and cashed out all the extraordinary items at the dungeon market, 
he had no reason to stay there anymore. It was important for him to develop the dungeon of the Mammon family before confronting the king of Gluttony. I hope you have a pleasant journey. Tigrius spoke on behalf of the dungeon spirits while Elagos and Ophelia saw off Yongho with a smile. Fluffy cushions were arranged in an oval shape inside the carriage. Since Citri and Kaiwan were sitting right across the door, Yongho sat with Catalina on the left side of the door. Kaiwan wore a black evening dress that highlighted her white skin so much that she could be even said to look pale, and Catalina wore a white evening dress as if she wanted to be in contrast with Kaiwan in costume color. As soon as the carriage door closed, Citri said, Let me tell you this for caution's sake. Don't leave me at this auction. Avoid using the power of greed as much as possible. Got it? Yes, I hope I'm in your good hands. Yongho answered cheerfully. It was natural he did so because she was right here after accepting his request. I don't think Samuel invited you with bad intentions. She's too sincere for that. He was very satisfied with Samuel's invitation itself. He was also pleased that Samuel, one of the five directors, officially recognized the House of Mammon. However, Yongho did not let his guard down. Normally, he would have accepted the invitation, but the situation was different now. The King of Gluttony will visit you. This was the warning from Embryo. The special auction organized by the dungeon market was attended by lots of influential figures in the demon world. It was very unlikely that the king would come to this occasion directly, but it was possible that the king's close aide would attend. Yongho did not want to expose himself to them. He thought that Samuel had two reasons for calling him. One of the reasons was that she invited him with pure motivations. The House of Mammon was no longer a collapsing small family. It was an unrivaled powerful family that they could equate any comparable family with, let alone an adversary, in the southern area. Yongho might be conceited about this, but even Citri agreed on this point. And the other reason Samuel called him was because of Citri, as he thought. I think she did it out of curiosity. She might have been curious because Samuel, who was always stuck in her house, showed interest in a man. For example, she might think like this, what's so special about this man that this big shot of our dungeon market has to deal with? That's my guess. Yongho smiled bitterly, and Kai Wan, still held tightly in Citri's arms, wouldn't move. At that moment, he felt a sense of floating and speed at the same time. The six Pegasus pulling the carriage began to speed up ferociously. Oh my god! Make sure all of you wear this on your arms because you have to hide the power of Brigada. Citri pulled out three silver bracelets from her cleavage and gave them to the three. It was a plain bracelet with the same shape as one on Citri's arm. Brigada, also called God's Medal, was special. However, it was only when it came into the hands of the king and his dependents that its special power was in motion. If anyone wore accessories made with Brigada, it was most likely that he was a king or his dependent. Brigada itself is a fairly hard and light metal, so it was common to make spears without knowing it was Brigada, but it was very rare to make jewelry with it. Wearing Brigada accessories was like wearing metal trousers. So, Yongho needed to hide his Brigada first in order to conceal the fact that he was the king of greed. At first, he thought about not wearing a Brigada at all, but it was unreasonable because of the heart of the demon god. Unlike the ring, the heart of the demon god was not something that could be worn or taken out freely. If you wear this bracelet, Brigada's performance will be weakened. So, be sure to unfasten the bracelet when necessary. Got it? Yongho and Catalina wore the bracelets with a nod. Kaiwan asked, How about you, Citri? It will make me look weird if I don't wear it when you guys are wearing it, right? With a chuckle, Citri pinched Kaiwan on the cheek. At first glance, it was like an older sister, and her sister was playing friendly. If I did so, she would be definitely mad at me, Catalina thought. In fact, Kaiwan liked to pinch her cheeks and touch her tail or ears, but when she tried to do the same, Kaiwan always reacted sharply. But now she just smiled shyly when Citri touched her. She was like a cat asking for a little more petting. Citri said again, this auction is a little bit bigger than the auction you participated in the other day. In addition to the official auction organized by Samuel, we have also prepared exhibition-style free auctions. 
exhibition style? Catalina asked, flapping her ears. Citri responded kindly as always, to put it more directly, I would say it's like a market. We put several items in the auction house at the same time and sell them. If you find an item you want to purchase, you can bid higher than the maximum price of the item at that time. It is an auction style that allows the person bidding the highest price within the deadline to take the item. If you don't want to wait until the bidding ends, you can buy the item at the seller's price directly. The flying wagon jumped into space. Just like the cat carriage did the other day, this one also narrowed a huge distance at once. Here are the masks I prepared. After peeking out the window for a moment, Citri opened the box that was located between the cushions. Before handing them out, Citri put on a lioness mask on her head. Yong Ho received a male lion mask with a mane while Catalina and Kai Wan received a dog and cat mask, respectively. Somehow, the three masks befitted them very well. As you already know, since you visited here last time, there are many ways to identify the person even if you cover your face with a mask. Please keep that in mind. After giving them a gentle reminder, she buried her body deep in the cushion as if she had nothing to say anymore. Yong Ho looked out the window of the carriage. Like he did last time, he had a panoramic view of the gorgeous auction house in his eyes. Chapter 179 This time, Yong Ho entered the auction house proudly unlike the last time when he had to sneak in through the back door. He confidently entered the main door and felt a little joy while wearing the male lion's mask. He felt different from what he did before. The violent mana that swirled randomly like a blind sword was still the same. It was still swirling roughly inside the auction house. But he didn't feel that it was burdensome anymore. He could ignore it naturally as if he was facing a breeze. It wasn't just because Yong Ho understood his own mana better than before. The reason was simple. His mana became strong. He was different from the time when he had to look up at the dark sky. This time, Yong Ho himself was in the sky. He could look down, and he didn't feel the sky above his head just far away. Even now, after having absorbed Stravati's mana, he had only five horns. Actually, they were close to six. In other words, he reached a stage where he had to realize a new wall that he should overcome. Catalina, who obtained five horns after Kai Wan, felt the same way as Yong Ho. She felt a little joy in her comfort. When this auction starts, it is highly likely that Samuel will greet you directly. Until then, feel free to enjoy the free auction. Citri's whispering tickled Yong Ho's ears. He flinched unwittingly then quickly nodded and moved to the free auction house. Catalina and Kai Wan followed him closely. The free auction house reminded him of an exhibition, as Citri said. It looked like an exhibition with all kinds of items lined up along the wall. Devil Nails Anyone who bled, hit by a devil's nails, is cursed by a powerful devil. Anyone with a demon curse suffers from a demon's mental attack. Not only your concentration, but also your overall physical ability decreases, and the effect varies, depending on the strength and weakness of your mental power. If you are both mentally and physically exhausted, you might be killed at once. Additionally, it's highly likely that it will cause fear in the other person. In order to maintain the devil's curse, you must constantly supply mana. Kai Wan's eyes glared when she was looking at a red dagger. It was very peculiar because not only its handle but also its blade was very red. How about this? Don't you think it's going to be quite useful? Yong Ho, who was looking at the area next to only two cells from the devil's nails, responded awkwardly. When Kai Wan turned around, there was an elf spirit with a slim body for sale. Given that the elf had a chain around his neck, it looked like he was a slave from another world. Kai Wan narrowed her eyes wide with a long face while Yong Ho began to eagerly examine the devil's nails. Meanwhile, Catalina, flapping her ears and tail together, was staring intently at one of the rings. Dead spirit ring. It uses a nearby corpse to create a skeleton type undead. However, skeletons created in this way are destroyed as soon as mana is not supplied anymore. If there is enough mana supplied, it is also possible to make corpses automatically undead within the range. Catalina recalled a smiling skull in her mind. Wouldn't it be very effective if skull went to the battlefield with this ring? 
It looks okay, but it seems that its mana efficiency is bad. Why don't you get a necromancer-based familiar spirit? Catalina checked the bidding prices. The bidding price was not high as if its efficiency was not good enough like Citri said. Necromancer. Yong Ho, who put the devil's nails down, also intervened. Certainly, considering the recent battle he had, he felt it would be nice to have a necromancer because there were enormous corpses everywhere each time he was done with the battle. Of course, it was quite inhumane from an ethical point of view. However, he could not deny that it was an attractive item. The synergy effect when combined with the power of evolution seemed to be enormous. As the proverb said, strike the iron while it's hot, Yong Ho looked around to see if there was a necromancer familiar for sale. Right at that moment, a surprisingly sweet scent tickled his nose. Not only Yong Ho, but Kai Wan and Catalina also turned their heads instinctively as if they also smelled the scent. The source of the smell was a sales item across from the elf spirit. There was a large pot and a small teacup there. Citri said, pointing to the purple drink in the teacup it's Soma. It is a soft drink with a slight hallucination effect. Since the scent is particularly good, it seems to be a really high-quality product. Kaiwan swallowed, while Catalina flapped her ears violently. It looked as if she wanted to drink both of them but could not dare to ask her. At that moment, a woman wearing an ugly and terrifying red ghost mask elbowed her way through the clients and came to Yongho. The woman who checked the Soma quickly wrote the bidding price. Because of her ghost mask, Yongho could see her face, but given her figure and charming air, she was obviously a great beauty. She was wearing a colorful red suit that suited the ghost mask, but unlike her long and loose sleeves, her lower body was almost naked. Her white legs tied with a thong underneath the short skirt that revealed her thighs clearly were attractive with beautiful curves. Yong Ho looked at the woman. It was not because he was attracted by her stunning beauty. His heart was pounding, and his breathing became rough before he knew it. Obviously, he felt it before. This time, the way his heart trembled was different from when he first ran into Catalina and Kaiwan. The man wearing a ghost mask. Someone came to his mind suddenly. He was a giant man who met her eyes the other day when she visited the auction house. No, it's not that my heart is pounding. He didn't get it right back then partly because he was at a distance from the other party, and it was partly because he felt it on impulse back then. But he could understand it clearly now because he obtained the heart of the demon god. He could distinguish it because he had experienced his heart throbbing when he met his lover several times. It was greed. Greed was the source of his excitement. Then why was his heart throbbing? Because he wants to have her. Because of his sexual desire. Right at that moment, he got goosebumps. And the woman turned around as if on cue. They looked at each other, wearing their masks. The woman, who faced him, frowned as if something was strange, and he stopped being nervous with an effort. Instead of avoiding her eyes right away, he stared at her for a little while. Her rainbow-colored eyes were shining like stars. They had an air of dignity and intensity that overwhelmed him. He caught his breath. He just acted like someone who accidentally met her eyes. He smiled awkwardly inside the mask then nodded at her lightly like an English gentleman in a movie he had seen one day. Then he turned around and walked on naturally. Citri hugged his arm. She egged on him to see the next auction items quickly. As if she read his intentions, Citri led him away from that woman. Catalina and Kaiwan also acted tactfully. As Yongho's familiar spirits, they did not make the mistake of looking back. While moving away from that woman, Catalina's tail became a little stiff, but Kaiwan managed it well. Catalina flinched when Kaiwan grabbed her tail tightly in a surprise, and thanks to her quick-witted action, it looked like they were playing pranks on each other like close friends. The distance between Yong Ho and the woman increased further. The auction crowds filled the place they left. Even after Yong Ho's party left and the auction was going on here and there, the woman was standing still in place as if fixated on it. She stared at him for a while, then tilted her head only after he completely disappeared. Then she bit her lips out of frustration. What the hell is it? She didn't murmur it to herself. Actually, she was talking to a woman with a bear mask who caught up with her belatedly. 
With a strong build and lots of muscles, she was big enough to fit in the bear mask. She also looked at the direction the woman was gazing at. There was nothing special over there, so she tilted her head and asked, What's the matter with you? The woman did not answer right away but just closed her lips once. Then, crossing her arms, she said, standing a bit stiffly, it's definitely my first time seeing that man. But why was my heart throbbing as soon as I made eye contact with him? My breathing was also rough. At her serious question, this woman with a strong build blinked her eyes. Then she expressed her opinion mixed with embarrassment and expectations. Because you fell in love with him at first sight. No way. How can I love him only by looking at his eyes on the mask? You must have checked out his figure, let alone his impression, right? She puckered her lips again at this strong woman's response. Obviously, she liked his build quite a lot. She was also happy about his height. No, it can't be. And he was a weird guy. Even when he made eye contact with me, he wasn't agitated at all. Rather, he nodded at me in a composed manner. He must have smiled even inside the mask. Have you stared at him with your jewel-like piercing eyes? Asking the question, this strong woman got embarrassed. Then the other woman apologetically replied as if to make excuses, well, I did before I knew it. I just looked at him. That's all. Hmm, it looks like you were clearly attracted to him. There are few men who remained calm even after encountering my master. The woman's eyes were the eyes of a king. Because of this, anybody without extraordinary courage and boldness didn't dare to encounter her. Do you think so? Yes, you might have taken a liking to him. The strong woman asked with more interest this time. Chapter, 180 No, it doesn't make any sense. The woman shook her head again, getting such a possibility out of her mind. It was because of her toying with the idea of loving a man just didn't make any sense in reality. Of course, she felt several times that her heart pounded when she met other kings. But it was when she was in battle, and in a fierce battle with other kings at that. If her heart had not pounded in such a situation, she would have looked very weird. Her fury back then was roaring itself. It synced with other sins and roared against other sins. But it was different now. She felt something she couldn't explain. The only thing she could express at the moment was that she felt something intense the moment she encountered him. Oh my did I really fall for him at first sight. At that moment, the woman blushed in embarrassment, and her attendant and faithful friend, Yacha woman grinned inside her bare mask. She visited the auction house with her master suffering from ever-growing depression for a change, so her surprising response after meeting a masked man was an unexpected pleasure. If you see him again, you will find out if you are really hooked on him. If your heart is pounding again, I think you must love him. Right? The auction just started. So, she still had lots of time to hang around before the official auction began. She again looked at the direction where Yong Ho disappeared. This woman called Dhritarashtra, King of Fury, nodded slowly and tapped her chest once for no special reason. She must be the owner of the sin. Yong Ho was convinced. He couldn't even think of any other possibilities. One of the six kings visited the dungeon market auction house. If so, who was it? Which sin belonged to this woman who ran into Yong Ho? You're okay now. He suddenly regained his sense of reality upon hearing Citri's words. He found himself already out of the crowded free auction house. He was in a secret room where he once stopped by when he had first visited the auction house. Catalina and Kaiwan first took off their masks, perhaps because they were freed from the embarrassment and tension beyond their understanding. Yong Ho also took off the male lion's mask and buried himself on the sofa. Citri said again, probably, she is the king of fury. Catalina and Kaiwan were startled. On the other hand, Citri combed her hair casually after taking off her mask. She sat on the sofa across him and said, as I said first, the only thing that you can cover with a mask is your face. There are many factors with which you can identify the other party. He just listened to her instead of expressing his opinion. Citri listed the reasons one by one and counted on her fingers. First of all, the gender of that masked person was a woman. Besides, her medium height, white skin and slim figure, 
dark blue hair, and a sweet flavor characteristic of Gondarv. Gondarv was a race with an overwhelming number of men, compared with women. There were not so many Gondarv women even in the vast demon world who had the status high enough to access the auction house. The King of Fury revealed herself directly in numerous battlefields, and as a result, there were lots of things identified about her look. Everything Citri just mentioned coincided with the King of Fury's look. And the decisive evidence that she was the King of Fury was your hunch. You seemed very surprised to meet her. Citri then pointed to the silver bracelet. The bracelet that hid the power of Brigada also had the effect of sharing status information among its wearers. Yong Ho covered his face with both hands. Then he said in a much calmer voice, well, it wasn't just a resonance between sins. Although he didn't have any specific evidence of it, he was convinced of it. As she said, it could be called his hunch. Citri did not disagree with him. Rather, she nodded and said, because you have that woman's legacy. The heart of the demon god. The legacy Mammon, the king of greed, left behind in the human world. At that moment, Yong Ho raised his head suddenly and replied immediately, greed, fury, gluttony. They were the sins that Mammon possessed in the past. Yong Ho felt he could understand it now. It wasn't just something like resonance. The heart of the demon god that he had was a replica of the one owned by Mammon, the king of greed, in the past. However, that did not mean it had low quality. Since it was a perfect replica, it shared the memory of the original owner. The heart of the demon god did not forget the sin of fury. He missed the sin he had once cherished. It is less likely that the king of fury recognized me. Yong Ho made a conclusion like that before he knew it. Although he himself had the heart of the demon god, the king of fury did not. She had never harbored any other sin than fury. Probably. But she must have been strongly impressed by you. I mean her heart must have throbbed when she saw you. Yong Ho also understood it. It wasn't just because of the fact that he made eye contact with the King of Fury. He had a similar experience. A man in a ghost mask. He was farther away from that man than when he faced the King of Fury. His power of greed was also much weaker than now. However, Yong Ho knew that his feelings then and now were fundamentally the same. His greed that united with the demon god's heart made him convinced of it. Then, who was the man in the ghost mask? Which sin did he have? What Citri said about it helped Yong Ho find out the clue. Besides the mask, there were many clues about the masked man. For example, the tips given by Embryo. Yong Ho already knew all the tips. He came up with an answer naturally. There was only one possibility of his identity. The King of Gluttony. Yong Ho had an adversary in front of him now. He had already met the king. Then I will close the deal today. Samo laughed softly. The king of gluttony, who was facing her with a desk in between, nodded with a satisfied expression and said, it was a good deal, too, this time. Thank you for visiting us, as always. She exchanged pleasantries with him. She had made several secret deals with the king of gluttony, but that was it. Their interaction could never be called a special relationship. His deal with Samuel wasn't a perfect secret deal. The five directors of the dungeon market knew what and how Samuel traded with the King of Gluttony. Samuel simply played the role of a terminal. This transaction was between the dungeon market and the King of Gluttony, not between Samuel as an individual and the King of Gluttony. Other kings also made secret deals with the dungeon market. And any information about their transaction was also shared by other directors during their meeting. The auction house is still booming. It seems that many people participated this time, said the king of gluttony. His words were only perfunctory, but given their unusual position in the demon world, their conversation carried some significance. Samuel replied with an angelic expression, because the war in the north is not the end of the world. Depending on who interpreted her words, it had various implications. The king of gluttony laughed heartily and said, I'll see you at the main auction. See you then. The King of Gluttony wore the ghost mask and stood up. Samuel got up from her seat and saw him off in person. Both of them didn't say any further after parting there. They didn't reveal their innermost thoughts to each other. 
When the door of the secret room was closed, Samo let her back wings droop. Her face-to-face -face dealing with the king of gluttony always exhausted her. As if to show off the fact that he was a king, he showed his desire without hesitation. Does he want to be the king of the unclaimed land? Is it what he hides in his fiery desires? It was hidden in the king of gluttony's craving for her, namely his incredible gluttony. Normally, she would not have noticed it because she was blinded by other intense desires, but today she knew it. Samuel was sincere like Citri said. She did a lot of research on the Mammon family. And she discovered that rumors in the South, to be precise, about the fight between the Mammon family and Embryo, the King of Wolves, were artificially twisted. The unclaimed land in the South was the realm of Citri, the highest among the five directors. So, Samuel didn't think about it deliberately. But now the situation had changed. The unclaimed land was virtually unified. Moreover, the method of unification was very violent. It was not a one-sided unification. The warlords who rose up the army in various places attacked each other as if they were playing a tournament. As a result, the deserted southern land became more desolate, but on the contrary, there were some things that became stronger. The demon king was supposed to grow big when he took the essence of someone equal to or stronger than himself. It was not efficient for him to take the essence of someone weaker than himself. The tournament-style fight that took place in various places brought about the effective concentration of essence. If someone had unified the South unilaterally, he would have preserved the dungeons and their masters, but he would not have achieved the concentration of such a huge power like now. The King of the Unclaimed Land Why did the King of Gluttony covet him? Did he simply wanted the essence of the unclaimed land? Or was there anything else that Samuel herself didn't know yet? What if things happened as Samuel speculated? Samuel stopped thinking. Trimming her tired wings, she left the secret room. It was time for her to face the king of the unclaimed land. The king of fury stepped forward, looking around. Maybe because of the Yacha woman chattering beside her, she felt her heart beginning to pound again even when she could not find the man with a lion mask. He walked leisurely. However, contrary to his slow movement, his sin of gluttony was in full active mode. He constantly expressed hunger. The main auction time was approaching. Kings and other influential figures began to gather in one place. Another king started to move among them. Chapter 181 Yong Ho's decision was as fast and simple, as always. Let's go back. Catalina pricked her ears. Kaiwan regrettably put down the catalogue of the free auction house she was reading earnestly, but she did not object because he was right. The resonance between the sins was confirmed. Moreover, the King of Fury was staying in the auction house. It was highly likely that the King of Fury did not recognize that Yong Ho was the King of Greed. However, it was just a probability. If the King ran into him again, he might think differently this time. The King of Gluttony it was the King of Gluttony that Yong Ho had to avoid more than the King of Fury. The King of Gluttony had already participated in the auction, wearing a ghost mask. Even at this moment, it was highly likely that the King might be rummaging through the catalogue somewhere in the auction house. We gained a lot here, didn't we? Well, that's correct, but... Pouting her lips, Kai Wan pulled Catalina's tail, who was sitting next to her. Flinching a bit, Catalina hurriedly glanced at Yong Ho for help, but he ignored it, pretending not to have noticed it because he found her frowning cutely rather than trying to check Kai Wan's mood. Although Yong Ho's party didn't buy anything at the auction house, they gained a lot like Yong Ho said. Yong Ho learned about the resonance between the sins and recognized the feelings of the King of Fury and the King of Gluttony. Now he could recognize the two anytime, anywhere. Yong Ho also confirmed the growth of his power. He could roughly size up his place in the demon world. Well, Kaiwan had an opportunity to meet Citri here. Nodding at once, he looked toward Citri without hesitation. Well at ease, Citri said, are you going to leave right away? No, I may encounter them on the way to the carriage. Let me leave when the main auction ends. It was obvious that he would be noticed if he left in the middle of the auction. Citri smiled softly as if she liked his answer. What a good judgment befitting my dear client. Okay, let's do that. 
After pausing for a moment, she got up from her seat and approached Kaiwan and Catalina. Cute client, do you have any item you really want to have? Citri. Kaiwan asked in confusion. It wasn't because of her question. It was because she could infer a certain fact from her question. Citri sat next to Kaiwan and pointed at herself elegantly. I'm going to stay here at the auction house. I can meet and talk with Samuel. As you know, I'm a big shot of this dungeon market. Citri was not from the Mammon family. So, she had no reason to go back with them. Even if she stayed here and encountered the king, she would have no problem at all. Oh, of course, it doesn't mean that I'm going to give you a free gift. I'm going to get it back from my dear client. Of course, you don't have to pay for my service. Citri again drew their attention to the auction items Kaiwan and Catalina looked at Yongho before responding right away. Yongho approved with a nod, choose it one by one. Kaiwan yelled in delight quietly and opened the catalog. Then she pointed to one item. Okay, let me choose this one. It was the devil's nails that she had been fidgeting with at the free auction house. Slightly narrowing her eyes, Citri said, Hmm, you have to get close to the other person and even hurt him with this, but the more demanding the conditions are, the stronger the curse becomes. Sounds like a good choice. You agree, right? As if she was happy about Citri siding with her, Kaiwan was so excited. Catalina, who was waiting for her turn nervously, also opened the catalog. I want this one. It was a pendant in the shape of a ghost face. It was impressive because it was grey like a piece of plaster. It's an item that strengthens the attributes of darkness. I think this is also a very good thing for our escort night girl, but... She blurred at the end of her words, then turned her eyes at Yongho. With her shoulders drooping, she said, as if to blame him a bit, Dear client, I just wonder what the hell you did to these beautiful ladies because they wanted only combat tools like this. As you know there are lots of beautiful accessories here. Two. Kaiwan just grinned at that, while Catalina signaled to Citri with her eyes that he didn't do anything wrong to her. Instead of making any excuses, Yongho read her thoughts and said duly, Citri, can I have one, two? Don't beat around the bush. Please answer me. A little smile was on her face. He spoke without opening the catalog like Catalina or Kaiwan. Not all items for auction here were displayed in the catalog. I would like to obtain a wizard-based familiar spirit capable of necromancing. What? Don't you want an elf spirit? Citri. Citri laughed heartily again. She replied by burying his back on the sofa, hmm, great. If you can't get one at this auction, I'll recommend one from the Dungeon Market catalog. Maybe you like the Undead series, right? Like Lich. Well, yes as long as I have the funds. The combination of Death Knight and Lich, which he had been longing for for a long time. Even if it was impossible, the necromancer was useful in many ways. It was a familiar spirit that was worth obtaining even with more money than expected. At that moment, there rang a soft bell. Citri wriggled her charming eyebrows at the sound echoing from quite a distance. It's time for the main auction to start. Shall we move now? Citri reached out to Yongho without getting up. Then Kaiwan pulled Catalina's tail to make her sit down again, who was about to get up casually, then looked at Yongho like Citri did. For peace in the family, Yongho did not escort anybody, and Citri burst into laughter. It's impossible he went back already. Although the soft ringing of the bell was beautiful, she didn't feel that way. Yacha woman Kurtamuka, who was the right-hand woman and friend of Dhritarashtra, King of Fury, looked around again sharply. She could not find the man with a lion mask anywhere in the auction house. No problem, Kurtamuka. I just ran into him by chance anyway. But you still. Kurtamuka bit her lower lip and looked down at her master, King of Fury. Although she couldn't see her master's expression because of that ugly ghost mask, obviously she must have been quite disappointed. Just a few minutes ago, she looked around more earnestly than Kurtamuka. Kurtamuka felt really regrettable about it. Of course, she didn't really expect anything from the masked man. Although Kurtamuka teased her by saying she fell in love with him at first sight, it was just nonsense in the first place. What Kurtamuka wished was just her master's slight deviation from her daily routines. 
She just wanted her master to get clear of the mess for a moment because she was overly concerned about everything due to her thoughtful and warm-hearted personality. In other words, all she wanted was just a little happening that could make her master reminisce over it with a smile. Finally, even the bell stopped ringing. Shortly afterward, the main auction began. Those who were talking to each other in the dark auction house stopped talking to each other and fixed their eyes on the stage. Let me get out for some fresh air. If they auction Soma or Amrita, you must buy it. The King of Fury acted exactly the opposite. After telling her attendant not to follow her, the king left the auction house. No, he is not here either. She rolled her eyes again on her way out, but she could not see him. The King of Fury pouted her lips. It seemed that she was unconsciously expecting to meet him again a lot. Well, he made me feel better anyway. She didn't murmur it just to comfort herself. When she came out to the balcony and breathed in the cold night air, she felt like that before she knew it. When did she think of a man like this for the last time? Wasn't it the first time since she admired the magnificent figure of the King of Fury when she first saw him as a child? The more she thought about it, the funnier she felt about her own behavior before the start of this auction. She could not understand why she was disappointed not to see him again. The King of Fury took off her mask. It was the rule to use a mask in the auction house, but since everyone entered the auction house to participate in the main auction anyway, she didn't have to worry. Her white, soft cheeks protected under the mask were exposed to the cold night air. She felt even refreshed because of the cold sensation on her skin. When she returned after the auction was over, she would be faced with an extreme confrontation. She had to bide her time, watching closely how the battle in the north unfolds or how the king of gluttony acted. It was something she really hated. She wished they just started a war. Oh, no, what am I thinking now? Take it easy, Dhritarashtra. You can't kill so many innocent people just to satisfy your frustration. Rebuking herself like that, she got the complicated thoughts out of her mind and looked up at the night sky. Her heart was pounding. Chapter, 182 She blinked her eyes. At that moment, a flying wagon pulled by six Pegasus horses soared into the sky. It was fully reflected in the King of Fury's eyes. It wasn't like the King of Flight slightly passing over the balcony. She was at some distance from the carriage, but this woman, the King of Gondarv and the King of Fury, was possessed of extraordinary physical skills. She looked at the carriage and noticed the face of the person looking out the wagon window. She made eye contact with him. It was a very brief moment. His greenish-black eyes, black hair, and well-defined features. The Pegasus flew up, and the flying carriage quickly faded away. Naturally, the man's face was also out of her sight. And again a few seconds passed. The King of Fury raised her hand and pressed her chest hard. Her heart was still pounding, though not as hard as she first saw him. Startled by her own reaction, she was embarrassed. Even before she knew it, she said clearly, Oh my did I really fall for him? At that moment, her cheeks blushed quickly. At the same time, there was a loud noise from behind her back. Master! Master! Is it Kurtamuka? Wearing the mask again hurriedly, the King of Fury, turned back. Kurtamuka took off her mask, contrary to the King of Fury. She said with a rigid expression, By heavens! It was when only the first item was listed for sale after the main auction began. However, the King of Gluttony left the auction house. The King of Gluttony was chewing the bones of the small devil imp that delivered him urgent news. Still, he could not suppress his anger. Although he was patient enough normally, there was something like the last straw for him. Once he got upset, he could not calm down easily. The beauties of the King of Gluttony shuddered for fear that they would be eaten, too. Eating man was by no means taboo to the King of Gluttony. As soon as he arrived in front of the huge wagon that could be called a moving palace, the Afsaras moved quickly. They hurriedly moved the food stocked in the wagon to the table. The King of Gluttony devoured the food ravenously. He even chewed the plates and twisted the neck of one of the poor Afsaras in the end. The rest of Afsaras struggled to refrain from screaming. Even with trembling hands, they carried food more hurriedly. 
they were grateful that the woman who just breathed with them a moment ago was not eaten alive. It was so miserable. The king of the unclaimed land. The fruit was ripe. The fruit that absorbed various nutrients must be truly sweet. If the fruit was truly greed, it couldn't be better. Even if it wasn't greed, it was worth eating if it was the king of the unclaimed land. So, the king of gluttony thought about the harvest. Once his schedule at the auction house was over, he was going to prepare to attack the southern land. But everything was messed up now. It wasn't because of the king of the unclaimed land. If the king had taken measures to protect himself, the king of fury would not have been as angry as he was now. The king of the unclaimed land in the south was the one he hated most as well as a pain in the neck. The king of gluttony broke the long silence. He deployed the troops to the borders with the southern land. The king who didn't possess the sin. Nevertheless, he was a monster that succeeded the throne of a king. And he was the most powerful dragon in the demon world. The king of violence. Finally, he moved. He messed with the king of gluttony's occupation plan. Since the times of Mammon, the great king of greed, those kings who ruled the demon world had always had their own names after the sin's pride, envy, lust, gluttony, fury, and sloth. They could not avoid getting away from such names because none of them who didn't possess the sin could obtain the power and forces strong enough to be called a king. It was an old unwritten rule. It was a sacrosanct fact that nobody could dare to ignore. However, there was a man who denied that fact totally. He didn't possess the sin. But his strength was comparable to those kings with the sin. His forces were more than enough for him to build a kingdom on his own. He was the owner with the largest build in the demon world as well as the most powerful mana in the demon world. The kings were pleased with his presence. The king of envy declared that his very existence was a blasphemy against the kings. Other kings expressed sympathy for his declaration. The demon world was a place where the law of the jungle ruled. Power meant justice in the demon world. Finally, one of the kings rose up in revolt. He started a war to punish this man who was called a king even though he didn't possess a sin. The former king of gluttony. Also known as the king of flies, he attacked the territory of a nameless king with a legion of several millions of locusts. Their attack was so overwhelming that it seemed to destroy the whole demon world. Not only the kings but also various lords of the demon world expected Beelzebub's victory. But the results betrayed everyone's expectations. Beelzebub was ridiculously defeated. The army of colored dragons that ruled the sky and the earth destroyed the army of gluttony made up of locusts. Beelzebub was killed by the nameless king. Thanks to the mana he released as a last desperate resort, he didn't lose the sin of gluttony and godly energy to this nameless king, but that was it. The news about Beelzebub's defeat shook the entire demonic world. Given that the man who didn't possess the sin defeated those kings with the sin soundly, it was only natural that the whole demon world was shocked. It was an extremely extraordinary event that the demon world had never experienced during the past thousands of years. By now, the whole demon world had no choice but to recognize the victor. It was only secondary for the kings with the sins who didn't like him to approve of his existence. The nameless king got a name of his own. There was only one name suitable for him, who smashed the king of gluttony and his army with overwhelming power. The demon world called him so, and other kings eventually recognized his existence. And that happened more than two hundred years ago. For more than two hundred years since then, the king of violence had remained silent. He never left his land. Even when he defeated Beelzebub and his army, he did not cross the borders. A new king of gluttony and the king of fury emerged. The king of pride also succeeded his predecessor. Even during this turbulent period, the king of violence alone stood tall like a mountain. At that time, the king of gluttony thought that when the fighting in the north reached its peak, the king of violence would also be his rival. To him, the king of violence was only a variable. Even the king of gluttony, who was the wariest among the six kings of the king of violence, did not think the latter would intervene in the war among the other kings. But the king of violence moved, contrary to their expectations. He ordered the army of colorful dragons to advance as if to scorn at their evaluation and guesswork. Of course, he didn't start a war. 
the Legion of Dragons was still within the territory of the Violent King. He only deployed his troops at the borders with the territory of the King of Gluttony. But even that was a big threat to the King of Gluttony, who had never seen such a gathering of his troops along the border in the last two hundred years. Upon hearing Kurtamukha's report, the King of Fury blinked her big eyes. Though momentarily, she wondered whether Kurtamukha, her faithful friend and loyal subordinate, made a reckless joke. Her report was so shocking to the King of Fury. Did you say the King of Violence really moved his troops? She asked again to confirm it. Kurtamukha nodded fervently. Yes, that's right. A legion of dragons gathered on the border with the territory of the King of Gluttony. Oh my god it really makes you feel the goosebumps to hear the news about their gathering. Kurtamukha shuddered then approached the King of Fury a little closer and activated the golden bracelet on her arm. Then a small image unfolded in the air above the bracelet. It was a scene of her troops patrolling the borders. Dozens of dragons covered the sky and the ground. Thousands or tens of thousands of monsters under the control of the dragons were with them, so their menacing posture was terrifying. The King of Fury took a deep breath. Even though she knew that the Legion of Dragons was heading for the King of Gluttony, a cold sweat broke out on her back. Master, the King of Violence is our ally, right? Chapter, 183 Even Kurtamukha, a valiant Yacha warrior, could not hide her fear. The King of Fury nodded slowly and even tolerated her question, which was even somewhat rude, for even the king felt scared, though for a moment. Yes, that's right. We have a secret alliance with uncle. There will never be any occasion for us, gods of arms, to fight the Legion of Dragons. The king not only reassured Kurtamukha but also herself about it. She took a deep breath to calm down. It's okay. We'll be all right because we have an alliance with the king. Actually, uncle helped me several times. The relationship between the king of fury and the king of violence was so good that other kings could not imagine it. That was why the king of fury called the latter uncle openly. To the king of fury, the king of violence was an adult whom she could trust and follow. He was an advisor who helped her make the right decision all the time. The king of fury bit her lips once. Because of the King of Violence's reluctance to fight, she had never talked with him about politics or military affairs. Most of the advice the King of Fury himself sought from him was limited to her personal matters. Nonetheless, the King of Fury regarded him as an ally. She believed that he would definitely come to her rescue whenever she was involved in a war with other kings. To be honest, the King of Fury had some grievances against him. How did he not inform her in advance about such a large-scale military action? No, that could not be true. Probably the King of Violence had some reason for that, she thought. Maybe even at this moment, an envoy sent by the King of Violence was running toward her own palace. Besides, it was a national agenda of grave importance. Even now, it was necessary for the King of Fury to build a proper alliance with him based on their awkward friendship. The King of Fury tapped her on the cheek lightly. Then she focused on her immediate task. The King of Violence had a bad relationship with the King of Gluttony. However, their relationship was rather one-sided. The King of Gluttony hated the King of Violence. The relationship between the two kings was usually bad in the first place, but the former showed extreme hostility to the latter. There were several rumors about their relationship. Some said they had a bad relationship because of Beelzebub, the former king of gluttony. Others said the king of gluttony didn't like the king of violence because the latter didn't possess a sin. Some also cited the inherent inferiority that the king of gluttony felt toward the king of violence as the main cause of their bad ties. The king of gluttony was originally a preta, the lowest level demon. But he was well known as a self-made king who persistently climbed to his current position through the power of the sin. On the other hand, the King of Violence was powerful from his birth because he was born as a dragon, and a red dragon at that, always cited as the strongest race in the demon world. Of course, the King of Gluttony was born with a sin when he was born, so he was the same as the King of Violence in terms of their special birth. Nonetheless, there was a difference. For the Preta, the lowest level demon, the sin was like a pearl necklace on the neck of a pig. 
nobody could even imagine how much the king of gluttony suffered before climbing to the position of a king. By the way, I thought the king of violence was in a sleeping mode now. It was the real reason why the king of violence remained silent even in the midst of the turbulent war in the north. Thanks to this, the king of fury met the king of violence in recent years. Good. I won't solve the problem by just agonizing over it anyway. The king of fury again put on the ghost mask. He just did it ceremonially rather than just for any reason. As if to reassure Kurtamuka, she stretched out her hand and tapped her shoulder larger than hers. Let's go back too. I think I have to send an envoy to uncle. Just in case, I'm going to see him. No matter what the king of gluttony was doing at the moment, he would be desperately struggling. It was clear that he wasn't going to act recklessly, but the king of violence already showed he could be unpredictable. Nobody knew whether the king of gluttony would act recklessly. Okay. I'll get ready to go back right away. Kurtamuka, who finally felt reassured by her trustworthy master's action, spoke with a nod. She hurriedly showed due manners to her master then left the balcony to gather the servants, who were scattered throughout the auction house, and prepare a wagon. The king of fury, who was about to follow Kurtamuka, stopped. She stepped back and turned around for a moment. Yeah, later, not now. Even if it was true that her heart pounded when she saw the masked man, now wasn't the time for her to dwell on him. Since she saw his face, that was enough for now. If it was meant to be, she would see him again. The king of fury turned back again. Not as an innocent virgin, but as the king of a country, she stepped forward. When the king of fury pulled herself together, Yong Ho was in agony. Did she find out my identity? He made eye contact with the king of fury. Although he was at a distance from her, he was sure she did. Why? It was when the main auction started that he saw her. So, there was no particular reason for the king of fury to appear on the balcony where she could see the flying carriage clearly. Of course, there was something like coincidence that could be the reason in any situation, but there was a fat chance she came out to the balcony by chance. If the king of fury was looking for him and as a result saw him for the second time, it was possible in the worst scenario that she might have found out that he was the king of greed. No, I hope not. It wasn't just his mere optimism. He could feel it when his eyes met hers, though very briefly. Embarrassment. Surprise. Heart beating fast. Dang it. Did she completely figure out my identity? If she was also confused and surprised to know that Yong Ho was the king of greed, all the puzzles would be put together to solve all the unanswered questions. Ah, uh, I don't know. I don't think so. It's unlikely she has recognized me. Above all, the king of fury did not have the heart of the demon god. Besides, she encountered him at a longer distance than when he faced her in the past. So, it was unlikely that she might have noticed his identity. Even if she had noticed him, the king of fury would not have sat idle, just looking at him blankly in such a situation. Anyway, my visit this time paid off because I saw the bare face of the king of fury. She was a fresh and beautiful girl whose nickname fury didn't suit her at all. Yong Ho closed his eyes and once again thought of her face. And there were two people watching Yong Ho at that moment. Oh my he is now thinking of another woman, right? Kaiwan, watching him coldly, whispered. Catalina quickly nodded. Catalina, who had a good night vision like a dark elf, also saw the King of Fury standing on the balcony. However, since the King of Fury took off the ghost mask and Catalina saw her only momentarily, she just thought the woman was a pure beauty rather than the King of Fury. Kaiwan frowned when Catalina whispered about what she had seen. It was because she didn't like Catalina's description of the king as a fresh beauty with dark blue hair. Kaiwan again said to Catalina, let me try to be seductive and enchanting to him, so you should try to be innocent and pure. Got it? Hearing their conversation, Salami would have shaken its head, asking them what the SHT they were talking about, but it was Catalina who listened to her seriously. Opening her eyes wide again, Catalina whispered something again. Kaiwan snorted at it by saying, what? You're far from sexy. Dang it. You must be a mixed succubus. Catalina, whose eyes grew blurry for a moment, grinned, flapping her ears and tail. 
Kaiwan said again, anyway, the point is you shouldn't make him attracted to another woman, got it? Catalina nodded fervently. Then she looked at Yong Ho sharply like Kaiwan did. The sky of the demon world was black. However, even that darkness could not completely cover the posture of the giants positioned under the pouring starlight. Dragons, perfect beings as one. Dragons were positioned there as a group. As a legion of dragons, they watched the land of the king of gluttony. The king of violence was not with his dragon army. He was stuck deep in the dragon rare area, west of the demon world, as usual. But he stayed alert. Armed with the godly energy of the king of greed, he saw the fragments of his imperfect memories. So, he roughly figured out what had happened to Mammon, the king of greed, a long time ago. Unknown stories. Concealed facts. It was a thing of the past. Maybe it was just no more than an amusing thing of the past that had nothing to do with the present and the future, something that he should forget as a legend. The king of violence did not open his eyes. However, his alert consciousness had him raise his head and look to the south. He felt it instinctively. Godly energy, with which the king of greed once dominated the battlefield, told him something. The sin that had not appeared for over a thousand years. The seventh king who disappeared. His greed has returned. He was now in the southern area. Chapter, 184 Two days after Yong Ho returned from the auction house urgently, the eastern expeditionary force, headed by Skull and its units, returned to the house of Mammon in the afternoon. Are you back? Sure. How did it go? Yong Ho and Ophelia giggled while exchanging greetings to each other. They could feel relaxed for now because the news about the King of Violence's advance into the South didn't reach them yet. Ophelia gathered intelligence much better than when she worked as the hostess of a tavern, but she didn't do it well enough to immediately find out what was going on outside the southern area. After welcoming Ophelia and other dungeon spirits back, Yong Ho got to the point even without having them take a break from their long journey. He talked about what happened at the auction house while they were moving various essences collected from the eastern area to the heart room where Lucia was located. Really? You met the King of Fury? Yeah, to be precise, I didn't meet her. I just made eye contact with her. I don't think she noticed that I am the King of Greed. Ophelia didn't respond immediately. Instead, she kept her mouth shut for some time, as if she was lost in thought, then asked, making eye contact with him, how did you feel about the King of Fury? What do you think she felt about you? Well, not bad. I only saw her face only briefly. Burring at the end of his words, he recalled the King of Fury. Her rainbow-colored eyes and fresh face came to his mind. At that moment, he turned his eyes and saw Catalina walking side by side next to him. In no time, he said to Ophelia again, well, I felt like she was like Catalina. I'm not sure what she thought of me. She didn't know I was the king of greed in the first place, and I didn't talk with her in the auction house anyway. Catalina blinked and flapped her ears at his reply as if she didn't know what he was talking about. On the other hand, Kaiwan narrowed her eyes as if she understood it. Ophelia grinned and said, if so, I think my analysis is correct. Catalina became more puzzled now. Obviously, she was the main topic of their conversation, but she felt like she alone couldn't make head or tail of what was going on. Ophelia said, Someday, it will be known throughout the demon realm that the King of Greed has returned to the House of Mammon. It means the opening of the Era of the Six Kings. When that day arrives, the King of Fury is the strongest candidate to be your ally. There were as many as seven kings in the demon world. With seven kings and their territories, it was natural that they formed a temporary alliance of their own because it was impossible for any king to confront other kings as a group. Yong Ho, who recalled the Three Kingdoms game, asked Ophelia again, isn't it good enough to be close to the King of Fury? Ophelia replied immediately, although the King of Fury is known as the Warmonger, she is exactly the opposite, if my analysis is correct. She doesn't enjoy fighting. She only goes out to fight for the peace and well-being of her own people because it's the fastest way to end a war. Do you mean she is a pacifist? Sort of. What she wants is not to seize the hegemony of the demon world, but to bring peace and prosperity to her people. 
Besides, she is sharing the borders with all the other six kings. She even has a border stretching into our southern area. Nowadays, there is a big turbulence in the northern area, so I think she needs an ally badly these days. Ophelia spoke so fast that Yong Ho and the others found it hard to follow her, but she hit the nail on the head. Reviewing her point in his mind quickly, Yong Ho nodded. Then he said in a low voice, recalling the King of Fury's face, I wish I could be on her side. I don't want to fight her for some reason. What do you mean? Kaiwan asked, cutting in timely. Like she did last night, her eyes were glaring sharply. Catalina gently pulled his hand as if to imitate Kaiwan's action. We're almost there. Right at that moment, they reached the entrance to the heart room of the dungeon. Skull shouted loud as if to help Yong Ho and opened the door. The day I have been earnestly waiting for has finally come. Pounding, pounding. Pit a pat. Please give me essence quickly. I feel dizzy. As soon as Yong Ho entered the heart room of the dungeon, Lucia shouted, making a big fuss. Since they were also in the heart room of the dungeon, the dungeon spirits could hear Lucia's voice. Kaiwan whispered, shaking her head, isn't it right for you to follow your master when you choose words or speak in the heart room of the dungeon? Exactly. Tigrius replied seriously, and Ophelia grinned quietly. Yong Ho, who suddenly got embarrassed for no reason, cleared his throat. But Lucia was still cheerful. She shouted cheerfully without caring about Yong Ho's embarrassment. I've not eaten anything for the past several days, waiting for today. After all, Yong Ho also burst into laughter. After receiving the essence from Elagos, he approached the heart of the dungeon. As if to reflect Lucia's mood, he pushed the essence into the wriggling heart of the dungeon. Be sure to chew it. Of course, I will. Yum yum. Oops. So delicious. Lucia didn't exclaim artificially. Obviously, she admired it sincerely. Lucia was not the only heart of the dungeon. It was good to say that the heart room of the dungeon was Lucia herself. The dungeon spirits felt unusual energy. It was as if the whole room was wriggling. Please keep supplying it to me. Please. Lucia shouted. But her voice was a bit weird. Her voice trembled in ecstasy as if she had drugs. At that moment, Yong Ho paused for a moment and looked back because he wasn't sure if it would be okay to keep injecting essence. At that moment, Tigrius shouted, now is a good chance. Don't stop. The efficiency rate of essence absorption has been doubled. It's a very rare occurrence, so don't miss it. Yong Ho, who thought of the double EXP of online games, immediately began to act. He injected various essences into the heart of the dungeon at high speed. Oh. So good. Even though he was so embarrassed because of Lucia's shouting in ecstasy, Yong Ho did not stop it. Finally, when the essences harvested from the eastern area ran out, a bright light was pouring out from the heart of the dungeon. Wow. The brilliant light never hurt their eyes. Yuria, who followed Yong Ho with Baduk, innocently admired the scene with her eyes twinkling brightly. It was beautiful. It was a splendor reminiscent of the morning sunrise. Then the light disappeared. A hush descended over Yong Ho and the others. Lucia. The dungeon has gone up by three levels. I have taken control of the third floor of the Labyrinth of Greed. I will immediately start taking control of the fourth floor. As the dungeon has leveled up, you can install new facilities. Intermediate bathhouse slash advanced training ground slash advanced workshop slash advanced water and sewage facility slash sleeping room slash recovery room slash mine with improved mining efficiency slash refinery slash cultivation room slash arena, etc., can be installed. As the control of the dungeon increases, it is possible to manage and understand the dungeon more carefully. Found new veins. One silver vein and one gold vein. Both are located on the third floor of the Labyrinth of Greed. Currently, I'm taking control of the fourth floor. When the control of the fourth floor is completed, you can use the equipment manufacturing facility of the Labyrinth of Greed. I feel the best right now. Lucia, who gushed like a machine gun, kept exclaiming in joy as if she was enjoying the lingering pleasure. 
Just as absorbing the essence was the highest pleasure for the master, the heart of the dungeon also felt the extreme pleasure in the absorption of the essence. After enjoying the lingering pleasure for some time, Lucia suddenly realized a strange fact. Yong Ho and all of the dungeon spirits of the House of Mammon were glancing at her blankly. Right at that moment, Yuria, who had been watching her behind Skull, walked out. She said, presenting the beautiful colored pebbles, her precious treasure, do you like playing with pebbles? Lucia blinked, and she soon realized that she blinked her eyes. Through the dungeon's perceptual abilities, she recognized herself and the heart of the dungeon that changed its shape. A girl with blue hair in a white dress was standing there. Since a large silver cable attached to her back was plugged into the floor, she couldn't move far, but it was obvious that she was a humanoid anyway. Lucia tried closing and opening her hands. She also moved her fingers then jumped from her seat. Oh oh. I can play with pebbles. Of course, I like it. From now on, I'll love it very much. Chapter, 185 Lucia hugged Yuria suddenly, which Yuria liked, with her eyes glittering. She could not help but burst into laughter because she met friends her age for the first time at the dungeon of the House of Mammon. In fact, both of them were only a year apart. Everyone laughed warmly at them, but Baduk felt jealous about Yuria, who was so happy with Lucia. Lucia's rapid growth resulted in more workloads of the dungeon spirits of the House of Mammon. Skull and its unit were dispatched to the construction site of a new facility. Farming, which was virtually suspended during their eastern expedition, was also urgent, so some members of the Skull unit headed to the Garden of Life. Under the command of the dragon soldiers, who were reborn as veteran farmers, the Skull unit newbies held sickles and hoes. Eligos and Ophelia were also busy. They needed a manager to take care of developing the new silver veins and other veins. Ophelia had to even design the water and sewage facilities. Flushed with excitement, Bergrim started to inspect the facilities on the fourth floor. The orc blacksmiths, who had been reassigned as Bergrim's disciples and direct subordinates, trembled at the joy of seeing the upcoming new facilities while feeling terrible at working through the night. Yongho also had a job to do. Fully prepared, he headed for the arena with Catalina and Kai Wan. 24th floor of the arena. Behind Yongho's back lay Troll Mountain King, whose head was about a dozen meters high. The blue-skinned guy's body was covered with various ores, so despite being naked, it boasted of his powerful defensive power as if he was wearing iron armor. Because of this, Yongho cracked the neck of the guy, which must be soft. It wasn't that difficult for him to cut it because its neck was also big just like his body. Mountain King wasn't just a giant with high defensive power. Like a troll, the guy had a tremendous ability to regenerate, and it was raising parasites capable of casting attribute magic. Since it was not enough to cut the neck once, Yong Ho went into the body of the Mountain King and burned all its internal organs. Thanks to the Shield of Distortion, Yong Ho could stop its attribute magic and gastric juice, but the gas in its stomach was a problem. Barely avoiding being suffocated, he took a deep breath several times. Man, I almost died. The arena changed, starting with the 20th floor. Of course, one thing never changed, namely the appearance of a stronger floor master every time he took over a floor. But the penalty in case of defeat and the emergence of the floor master were significantly different from those below the 20th floor. First, the penalty became heavier. It wasn't just the penalties that required the challenger to become a spirit of the arena in case of defeat. In the event of defeat, there was a penalty that required the loss of a dungeon spirit as well as half of the loser's mana. And the lineup of the floor masters became more colorful. Up to the 19th floor, floor masters almost as tall as humanoid or humans appeared, but from then on, not only giants these days, but also monsters reminiscent of dragons appeared. Previous masters of the Mammon family also appeared more frequently. Well, the process is difficult, but the rewards are better. Yongho absorbed Mammon's mana. He didn't feel like his mana was growing rapidly like before, but it definitely worked. Every time he absorbed one, he felt like his mana became pure. His mana, which rapidly increased through the absorption of the essence, was as good as rags. Although he devoured it with the power of greed, he didn't digest it properly. But Mammon's mana solved this problem. 
Each time Yong Ho got mana, it closed the gap between different essences and filled the gap. The clear rewards of the 24th floor was an elixir that restored all abnormal conditions and restored stamina and mana. There was golden water in a very small glass bottle, like a medicine for an eye bottle. Damn it. It rips me off, man. I never expected getting an elixir on the 24th floor. Gus Ion mumbled with a happy look. Yong Ho carefully kept the elixir in his pocket then hurried to the special seats where Gus Ion, Amon, Catalina, and Kaiwan were waiting. So, the king of gluttony is going after you. And I feel like the countdown has begun. Yong Ho nodded softly. Catalina and Kaiwan, who was next to him, were warming up to challenge the arena. Gus Ion gently patted his chin and said, grinning suddenly, you said when you faced the King of Fury, your power of anguish grew stronger, right? Catalina and Kai Wan rolled their eyes at the same time. Yong Ho quickly looked at the weapons that the two were holding. He did it almost instinctively. Gus Ion continued with a hearty laugh, just kidding, man. Oh my god. It's amazing to find my dear Kai Wan has changed like this. You, too, escort knight. Kai Wan turned her head, a bit sullen as if she was embarrassed, and Catalina pouted her lips. Amon said, Our little master's power of anguish has become stronger. I want to tell you it's a joke, but that's true. Catalina and Kai Wan looked at Amon sharply again. Yong Ho looked at Amon, feeling betrayed, but Amon was silent. Gus Ion quickly stood up and changed the topic, smiling slyly. Anyway, it's just good. I told you already that the guy who guarded the fifth floor was Sagittarius, right? I mean our inflexible knight Asclepius. Yeah, you did. So what? Yong Ho hurriedly responded to Gus Ion. Gus Ion winked at him slightly, and said, the fifth floor is his armory. It's a perfect place for him to confront his enemy. Gus Ion. You must be a trickster. Yong Ho, who hid himself behind the wall, cursed at him. Even at this moment, dozens of arrows of light kept striking the walls ruthlessly and penetrated the passages between the walls. There was something special about the arrows, let alone the arrowhead and arrow shafts. The arrows, literally flying like light, exploded every time they collided with the wall. The noise of the explosion was so big that Yong Ho could hardly hear anything. So, he once again cursed and recalled what Gus Ion told him. Sagittarius Asclepius, the Knight of the Sun. He's a proud and honorable guy like his name suggests, though he is a bit too brusque. If he runs into you, he might express due manners to you like a noble knight. Actually, Asclepius was the opposite. When he ran into Yong Ho's party, he reacted very shortly. All of a sudden, he fired arrows of light. Yong Ho. Block it. Several voices rang at the same time. It was because the arrows, which had only been flying straight ahead, started to turn the moment they passed the wall. Yong Ho hurriedly stretched out his hands and created a shield of distortion. Catalina, who was right behind him, looked over the shield at Kai Wan on the opposite wall. Like Yong Ho, Kai Wan also protected Eligos Nophilia by opening a shield of distortion. Ka Kang. The arrows of light hitting the shields of distortion exploded in succession. Regardless of Yong Ho and Kai Wan's efforts, the shields of distortion shook wildly. Yong Ho reinforced his mana and signaled to Kai Wan. Like his familiar spirit, Kai Wan immediately read his intention and nodded. Both of them signaled to each other with their eyes then hit the ground at the same time. It was a passage three meters wide. Yong Ho and Kai Wan created a barrier together. It would have been impossible if their relationship was just routine, but it was also possible to mix their power because both of them had a tight bond as a master and his familiar spirit. The large and thick shields of distortion stopped the arrows of light more smoothly. Yong Ho saw Santoros sitting in the middle of a large room beyond his blurred vision. Once again, Gyuzhin's words came to his mind. I might speculate this, but don't worry if he runs wild. If you obtain the fresh green armor from Mammon's armory, you can negate most of his arrow attacks. Well, I think that must be the fresh green armor. The lower body of Santoros was a nice black horse, and its upper body was a knight in green armor. 
The green armor seemed to be made of tree trunks and leaves. Thin stalks were placed all over the armor, like vines on the wall, and wide-grown leaves were stuck on its shoulders and chest. What Gusion told Yong Ho proved all wrong. Asclepius, the Knight of the Sun, was insane, and the green armor that could negate his attack covered his body. It wasn't possible for Yong Ho to talk with Asclepius now. Moreover, Asclepius didn't seem to stop being a mere threat to him. Like Baphomet on the second floor did, he tried to kill Yong Ho's party. Swallowing, Yong Ho rolled his eyes. Because of the explosions caused by the arrows of light, his eyes were blurred, but he could easily see several corpses scattered throughout the floor. Most of them were probably the past dungeon spirits of the House of Mammon. Maybe one of them might be a previous master of the Mammon family. It was the moment for Yong Ho to make a decision. Chapter 186 Clenching his teeth, Yong Ho looked to the left and right with glaring eyes. Then, he conveyed his intentions to his dungeon spirits. Kill him. I'm going to give up Asclepius. Kill him who became a madman. Yong Ho grabbed the air with his right hand. Stretching down Amun that arose from the flames, he stared at Asclepius over the shield. He counted the numbers deep down. He moved his hands with Kaiwan at the same time and deactivated the shields of distortion. Then he pierced in the air with Amun repeatedly. There arose a strong wave of green flames. It was not for the purpose of killing him. He planned to block Asclepius's vision with the green flames even for a moment, so his dungeon spirits could rush toward him. He could carry out such a plan because the green flames of greed could identify Yong Ho. The raging green flames quickly engulfed him like a beast. Eligos and Ophelia also awakened their beast nature. Kaiwan and Catalina threw themselves into the flames without any fear. And at that moment, the waves of the green flames were split in two. They were scattered into two groups but perfectly united as one as if heaven and earth were separated. Right at that moment, Yong Ho saw Asclepius splitting the green flames with the Sword of the Sun. He was a maniac, but at the same time, he was one of the twelve spirits of the House of Mammon. The next moment was compressed then another moment came. Asclepius's horse hoofs hit the ground hard. While holding the Sword of the Sun in his left hand loose, he took the giant spear in his right hand at the same time. Then he charged into the lingering green flames. It was a tremendous lance charging. Asclepius's giant spear, which reached the highest speed when he moved only three steps, aimed at Yong Ho's chest. However, Yong Ho wasn't an easy target. It was because the moment he noticed Asclepius rushing toward him, he also started moving. His giant spear pierced the air. Yong Ho and Kaiwan flew on the left and right sides, not just content with merely avoiding his attack. Kaiwan twisted her body and swung her whip sword. The moment Yong Ho stepped on the ground, he twisted his body hard. Then he fired the green flames with Amun loaded with centrifugal force, aiming at Asclepius's exposed back. Kaiwan's whip sword coiled around Asclepius's right arm. The green flames engulfed Asclepius. Then Kaiwan floated into the air. It was Kaiwan who caught him, but it was Asclepius's Herculean force that turned her upside down. Kaiwan did not lose her whip sword. Yong Ho also did not attack Asclepius, who twisted after hitting the ground. It wasn't just Yong Ho and Kaiwan who were here. Skull riding Bucephalus struck him with a hammer all of a sudden. Asclepius hurriedly lifted the shield on his left arm to block the hammer, but he could hardly stop it in the first place. Not only Asclepius's left arm but also his whole body was pushed back. Seizing the moment, Kaiwan regained her balance. Instead of being thrown on the floor, she climbed behind Asclepius's back and let go of her whip sword without any regret. Then, she pulled out the devil's nail from the back of his waist, which Citri obtained for her, and stabbed it between Asclepius's armor. Then she twisted the nail inside it. Quack! Asclepius screamed in pain for the first time. He ran around violently and lifted the crossbow attached to his right hand. But nobody allowed for his next attack. Skull swung the hammer again, and Eligos and Ophelia also charged at him at the same time. Catalina also drew a moonlight sword and ran fast, keeping low as if she was stuck to the ground. Their attack synced with each other perfectly. 
When Skull's hammer pushed Asclepius back again, Kaiwan stooped low on his armor and pierced between the armor with the devil's nail. Ophelia's sharp horn broke Asclepius's right hind leg, while Catalina's moonlight sword cut his left leg. Eligos punched his fist toward Asclepius's back, who was losing his balance and collapsing. His punch that passed over Kaiwan's head, who lay flat, showed off its terrifying destructive power. This time, Asclepius moaned silently. He was thrown toward the wall like a marionette that was completely broken. At that moment, Kaiwan, with her eyes closed tightly, created a wall of distortion between herself and Asclepius then blew herself away. The hand of the black giant, created by Catalina, grasped her floating in the air. Asclepius, flying nearly ten meters above ground, collided with the wall. The ceiling and floor shook. Elagos, who just blew a strong punch, let down his arms with a rough breathing. Skull turned around and glared at the wall where Asclepius collided, and Catalina hastily let Kaiwan down on the floor. Yong Ho took a step. Asclepius's look was revealed as the dust disappeared. Centauros, with both legs broken, was pulling a big bow, sitting halfway down on the floor. Although his body was mangled by Eligos's attack and Kaiwan's devil curse, his arm that pulled the bow did not shake. Asclepius was a knight of the sun. However, the sun did not exist in the deep dungeon. His various divine powers, which were activated only under the sun, could not exert power. But he was still Mammon's knight. Even at this moment when he was dying as a madman, he was pulling the bow without any trembling, which testified that he really was Mammon's knight. Amun whispered something to Yong Ho. Amun did not beg Yong Ho to save Asclepius, formerly his faithful friend. Amun knew that Asclepius could not be saved anymore. The faithful knight of the sun should have died that day with the king who was his son. The king's considerations for saving his life rather ruined his life now. Yong Ho grabbed Amun. Catching his breath, he focused on the flow of mana. His dungeon spirits respected his intentions and stepped back. Asclepius let go of the bow and shot a golden arrow as bright as the sun. Yong Ho hit the ground. He read the flow of his mana. The moment the arrow left the bow, Yong Ho predicted the path of the arrow and ran without hesitation. An arrow brushed against Yong Ho's cheek. The tip of Amun's spear pierced his green armor and then his chest. Yong Ho did not create the green flames. Asclepius's heart, pierced by the spear, had been already broken since ancient times. Asclepius felt Amun and sensed Yong Ho's greed beyond him. His lips were wide open. For the first time since he met Yong Ho, he began to speak. He said in a squeezed voice, You have saved the demon world my king. That was it. Asclepius couldn't say any more. The knight who lost his master and lived like a shell for a thousand years finally died. A new light came from the magic field on Yong Ho's left arm. It was a brilliant orange symbolizing honor, the power of Asclepius. Asclepius's body collapsed like ashes. Yong Ho saw the images of Asclepius transmitted at the last minute. The king climbed the stairs alone. No one could follow him. They just had to say goodbye to him for good, who they had always followed. Asclepius was in despair. He cried at the fact that his king died and that the king no longer existed in this world. Contrary to the king's intention, he died slowly in self-destruction for a thousand years. Yong Ho's images of him disappeared. However, other memories emerged in his mind one after another. Gus Ion called Mammon's name, crying bitter tears. Skathak also cried, next to him. Citri said goodbye to Mammon while hugging Elun. Mammon chose to die alone to save everyone. Mammon was climbing the stairs. When the twelve spirits of the house of Mammon saw the king for the last time, they only saw his back as he climbed the stairs. What was there at the end of the stairs Mammon climbed? Why was the last fight involving Mammon and his twelve spirits not known to the demon world? My king who saved the demon world. Just because he possessed the sin and wonder, can he be called a king? It was Amun's voice, not Asclepius's, that came out last. Yong Ho looked down at Amun. However, Amun, the magic spear of the Red Lotus, still refused to answer. It became a ray of flame and hid itself. Yong Ho did not pressure Amun. 
There were things that he could find out without doing so. Mammon saved the demon world, but that was it. His action did not affect the present. That was why Amon and other dungeon spirits hid what had happened to Mammon from Yongho. After all, there was nothing that would harm Yongho himself. Yongho thought to himself that he would wait, waiting for the time Gusayan mentioned to him. And he thought it was coming quite soon. It felt that way. He heard Skull's voice above his head. It was laughing loud, as always. Just by looking at it, Yongho felt like he got a load off his chest. He quietly looked down at Asclepius's relics, the sun sword, the green armor, the unknown crossbow, and the big archery. After a brief silence on the faithful knight, like Gusayan said, he turned around. He saw his dungeon spirits. He laughed out loud on purpose. Then he clapped loudly and said, let's go and collect the booty as much as we can. Skull chuckled again. Catalina fluttered her tail, and Kai Wan nodded happily. Elagos and Ophelia opened the door of the armory. Tigrius, who did nothing in the fight against Asclepius, lighted the dark armory with a magic light. Lucia said, I will start taking control of the arsenal. Mammon's armory was now taken control of by a new master. Chapter 187. The core of the dungeon was its master. So, when the master died, the soul of the dungeon also died. The dungeon, where the dungeon's soul died, could not perform its various functions. Even if the dungeon itself survived, it dried up before long because the supply of mana was cut off. Therefore, in dungeon battles, it was as important to defend the master to protect the heart of the dungeon. It was for this reason that the master's room was usually near the heart of the dungeon. The master was supposed to be protected in thorough defense against any outside attack. However, ironically, the master, who was protected like that, was often the strongest power of the dungeon. It meant that the master often had to hide the most powerful weapons without ever using them. When applied to a chess game, the master was like a mix of king and queen. Although he was the strongest horse that could crisscross the enemy line, he would lose the game when his horse died. In a way, it was like a double-edged sword. The king was no exception. The country ruled by each king could be called a huge dungeon, a collection of dozens of dungeons. The king was the country's most powerful force. Compared to modern warfare, the king could be compared to a tactical nuclear weapon. Therefore, the movement of the kings was important. Depending on where the king was located, the situation of the war could be affected. In some cases, the king hid himself thoroughly like the king of lust, and in other cases, he kept his enemies in check by engaging in the fight actively, like the king of fury. The king of gluttony used to prefer the king of lust's method to that of the king of fury. But this time, he had no choice but to follow that of the king of fury because the military force of the dragon legion dispatched by the king of violence was so powerful. The king of gluttony, who redeployed to the southern border about half of the troops deployed on the border with the territory of the king of envy, exposed himself. The king of gluttony's troops led by giant beasts caused fear among lots of people just by advancing to the front line. The people of the king of gluttony, who were alarmed by the army of dragons that had suddenly approached them, regained a sense of stability amid fear. They even praised the king of gluttony, saying he was the strongest king. However, the king of gluttony, leading the army, was not satisfied because the size of the dragon core was so huge beyond imagination. Flying monsters such as wyverns and drakes, which comprised most of the dragon core, were not a problem to him. Although they numbered thousands, he didn't feel like they were a big threat. What mattered to him most was the dragons. There were too many dragons. Even one dragon could bring disaster on the battlefield, but there were dozens of dragons. There were five or six ancient dragons that were fully grown and had entered the mature stage of their power. Faced with dragons like this, it was natural that the king of gluttony was on edge. Of course, he had numerous minions including all kinds of monsters. It was not because he was afraid of the dragon court deployed at the border. What was most disturbing to him, and what angered him the most was that he could not find the whereabouts of the king of violence. Shortly after the legion of dragons began marching, Dragon Rare, the king of violence's land, literally became an absolute fortress. 
Without the king of gluttony himself going there in person or sending his elite troops, any general reconnaissance force could not approach there to detect his exact location. Where was the king of violence now after he sent the legion of dragons? Was he still stuck in his dragon rare? Or was he enjoying staying in the polymorph state, called the dragon's proprietary patent? Hiding the king's location was as much a powerful strategy as revealing his location. It was very annoying to face an enormous enemy in a situation where they did not know when and where the enemy would appear, and a very devastating force at that. Even his appetite could not soothe the anger of the king of gluttony. Even if he ate an awful lot of delicious foods, and even if he had sex with lots of beauties including Apsaras, he could not calm down his annoyance. Why did the king of violence move now? Where the hell was he now? The king of gluttony felt a new appetite in rage. The southern area. The land he thought he could lay his hand on any time if he reached out. But the king of gluttony suppressed his desire. He had a little more patience. Now that the king of violence was posing a threat to him, he could not move into the south recklessly. Now was the time for him to wait patiently. He needed to watch the situation a little more. The king of violence. The king of gluttony gnawed his teeth. He stared at the south, looking forward to the day when he would bite the king of violence's heart. The king of fury looked to the south. However, the direction he gazed at was somewhat different from that of the king of gluttony. She looked to the southwest, the territory of the king of violence. I wonder what the hell my uncle is thinking now. The king of fury, dressed in white, twisted her dark blue hair with her fingers. Contrary to what she expected at the auction house, there was no envoy or letter from the king of violence. Like the king of gluttony, the king of fury could not know what the king of violence felt inside. Kurtamuka kept gulping, who insisted on wearing the armor of the Yacha after returning from the auction house. With a tense look, she whispered to the king of fury, wouldn't the legion of dragons under the control of the king of violence make a surprise attack on us? In fact, most of the Yachas and Azuras, who were in charge of combat among the king's people, had been deployed on the northern and eastern borders. In this situation, if the Dragon Corps located in the south marched, the King of Fury would helplessly collapse. It was the most terrible scenario for the King of Fury and her people. But the King of Fury shook her head violently. No, I don't think he will. You don't have to worry about that. Rather, you should be prepared for the possibility that the King of Gluttony will attack us. She wasn't just ranting like a child now. She believed in her own insight. The king of violence was still her ally. Kurtamuka held her tongue at her resolute response. It was because she knew the king of fury's stubbornness, but she trusted the king absolutely. Kurtamuka turned the topic. I am still worried because the battle in the north is not over yet. The king of fury sighed. The war in the north was still dominated by the king of pride. If the war went on like this, the king of gluttony would be faced with a situation that she didn't want. Just thinking about the fight in the north made her annoyed. Whichever side won, it was clear that there would be a bigger war in succession. The northern area was now a big-time bomb. As the face of the king of fury clouded quickly, Kurtamuka realized her mistake. She urgently tried to appease the king with comforting words. I think our Kalavinkas, scouting all over the place, will bring you good news. That would be great, but... It was like she kissed and stabbed at the same time, but the King of Fury didn't care. Looking to the south a little more, she fidgeted with her hands habitually. Kurtamuka asked, by the way, Master. What have you been drawing for some time? Kurtamuka glanced at her hand, and she looked down at her own hand. She had a pencil in her right hand and a sheet of paper on her thigh. She was drawing something carelessly, and now there was a pretty good portrait in front of her eyes. The King of Fury was embarrassed. Uh, ha. Huh. The Gandharv race stood out in art as a whole. As the chief Gandharva, her painting skills were outstanding. Even though she drew it roughly, the portrait had a photographic precision. Approaching her already, Kurtamukha looked down at the painting. It looks handsome. It's a male face, right? Uh, yes. He is. The King of Fury blurred awkwardly. Kurtamukha narrowed her eyes at her awkwardness, 
and soon she noticed that the King of Fury was mentally wandering around, looking for a place to go. Kurtamuka thought for a moment then she got startled. Oops. Is this the guy you met at the auction house? Then, is this an imaginary portrait? Oh my god I didn't know you fell in love with him so deeply. Did you imagine your face just by looking at one of his eyes? Are you in deep love with him? This is not an imaginary portrait. I saw him directly. The King of Fury replied hurriedly then blushed before she knew it. Kurtamuka asked again, are you talking about his bare face without the mask? Yeah. Of course, I saw him only briefly. The King of Fury regained her composure. Fanning off the heat on her face with her hand, she said, anyway, stop talking nonsense. I just drew his portrait to kill time. However, Kurtamuka was still narrowing her eyes. Then she picked up the portrait. She examined it and said in a very serious voice, the fact that he participated in the special auction means that he has a strong force of his own. Or at least his own ability is excellent. It would be nice if he was not in the control of another king maybe he will be a great help to you, master. Do you think so? Chapter 188 The King of Fury pricked her ears a bit as if she was lured by what Kurtamuka just said. Kurtamuka laughed again at her response. Even if she lined up handsome Devana Gondarv guys in the field, her master never showed any interest in them. Given her track record like this, Kurtamuka never expected her master would show interest in a man. But her master was different this time. Right at that moment, a strong breeze blew through the large open window. Translucent white fabrics fluttered violently, and Kurtamuka had to close her eyes tightly, though briefly. But the King of Fury was different. She jumped up and greeted another friend of hers. Gardamundi. Appearing through the window was Garura Gardamundi in red scale armor. With red feathers, wings, and bird-like feet, she traveled around the world and served as the King of Fury's eyes and ears, apart from Kalavinka's. Gardamundi happily waved her hand at the King of Fury, who welcomed him so friendly and jumped from the window frame and approached her. Kurtamuka screamed angrily, You're so rude. How many times did I tell you to come through the main gate to see our master? She scolded Gardamundi severely like a Yacha woman. But she just ignored Kurtamuka's anger as if she got used to it. Obviously, the two growled at each other like cats and dogs. After all, the King of Fury quickly opened her arms to mediate between the two. Gardamundi knelt to pay respect to her and blinked. Even though she didn't express due manners, she again stood up suddenly. Gosh, you wretched girl. Wait a minute. Isn't he the master of the Mammon family? Kurtamuka's cursing and Gardamundi's voice were mixed. Quickly taking the portrait from Kurtamuka's hand, Gardamundi nodded in succession. It looks like the man in the portrait was pretty much beautified, as if painted by a woman enchanted with a man but I think he is definitely the master of the Mammon family. Where did you get this? She asked the King of Fury. Master of the Mammon family? Tell me about him a little more. Do you know this man? This time, the voices of the King of Fury and Kurtamuka were mixed. Gardamundi shrugged and said, Sure, I know him. He's one of the targets I went out for reconnaissance this time. The King of Fury opened her eyes wide. Kurtamuka began to get nervous. Both were aware of the House of Mammon. But she needed to double check. Gardamundi wriggled her eyebrows several times as if she felt strange about their reaction. She then said in an exaggerated tone as if she was an actor, Yong Ho Chion. The current master of the House of Mammon. He is a brave man who was not just content with rebuilding the ruined House of Mammon but has unified the unclaimed land in the south. Wow. Good. Weapons are overflowing here. I think not only Skull's unit members but also the Black Orc squadron members can arm themselves with these weapons. Lucia, who took control of the armory, spoke cheerfully. The inside of the armory was very simple. A large room with a high ceiling was filled with cabinets, and various weapons were stacked up inside the cabinets. Yong Ho felt as if he entered a big supermarket. Kai Wan, the descendant of the Mammon family like Yong Ho, puffed out her chest broadly. Then she said with a bit of conceit and pride, it's no wonder this place is amazing because the eight-handed Baruna's creations are stored here. 
At that moment, Yong Ho laughed, recalling Kai Wan's armory. He gently closed and opened his eyes once to look at the mana inside the armory. It was so dazzling. Among the weapons that filled the armory, there really wasn't any single item that wasn't cast with spells. Tigrius, the most knowledgeable about magic among Yong Ho's party, picked up a sword nearby. He gently pulled it out of the sheath. He looked at the blade and said, it seems that most of them seem to have been put in the magic of sharpening or material enhancement. If they are armed with these weapons, the combat power of the skull unit will be terrifying. In fact, the skull unit surpassed normal skeletons with the power of synchronization alone. So, if all of them were armed with magical weapons, they could be a formidable force that was a match for a hundred. With a hearty laugh, Skull raised his hand and pointed to the inside of the armory. At a glance, it was a place where special items, not typical items, were on display. Armor. I need armor. In fact, the composition of the current dungeon spirits of the House of Mammon was quite asymmetric because most of them were warriors, who were good at close-range combat only. Comparing it with online games, it was a crude mix with no long-range dealers like a wizard or archer in the party, let alone a healer. Of course, Yongho himself or Kai Wan could attack the enemy at a distance with the green flames or a whip sword. There was also Tigrius, a wizard, even though there was only one. But it was not enough. Given that he was fighting with his dungeon spirits usually, he needed to find more long-range dealers and wizards for a more efficient party formation. Of course, I can't improvise the dungeon spirits because of that. So, Yong Ho wanted armor. Since he could not make up for the insufficient spirits immediately, he had to find a way to utilize the existing forces as efficiently as possible. From his perspective, Yong Ho thought that he and his dungeon spirits had sufficient attack power. But their defensive power was weak, so much so that it was just so poor. Since there was no healer he could use at the front line, reinforcing the defensive power was more desperate. A dragon leotard? The first thing that caught Yong Ho's eyes was the red leather armor worn on a mannequin without limbs. In fact, it was armor in name only. It was so thin as to be called tights. He felt like it was even a swimsuit because it was an all-in-one with no limbs. However, it was armor stored in Mammon's armory. Its mana was unusual when Yong Ho felt it. Kai Wan, standing by Yong Ho, looked at the nameplate on the mannequin's neck and said with a smile, it's made of dragon leather, although it is for women. It looks like it suits me or Catalina. I don't think it will interfere with my movement. Who are you going to give it, Yong Ho? Catalina pricked her ears at her seductive voice. Yong Ho replied with a smile, there is one more suit over there. Both of you can wear it. Kai Wan frowned as she got the wrong answer from him, while Catalina was happy, flapping her tail. Eligos raised his voice, oh. I found something suitable for you, master. Not only Yong Ho, but everyone in the armory turned to Eligos. Eligos, looking very pleased, pointed to the armor in front of him. All of them without exception gave an exclamation of surprise. The glittering light that seemed to have melted the moonlight caught their attention. Metallic Dragon Armor It was an armor made of silver dragon scales and leather, very rare among dragons. I think you have a discerning eye, Eligos, as the butler of the Great House of Mammon. It is the item that ranks the highest among the equipment registered in the armory. Materials are none other than silver dragon leather, scales, and bones. Besides, Brigada and various precious metals were added. The producer is eight-handed Baruna, as expected. While listening to Lucia's explanation, Yong Ho's eyes glittered. It was awesome, so much so that he recognized its value without her explanation. In this arsenal, there was no object that released more high-quality mana than the silver dragon armor in front of them. The silver dragon armor was worn on a mannequin like a dragon leotard. However, unlike the dragon's leotard, it had both arms and legs. There was no exposure of the bare skin because it had silver armor on the black tights. Tigria said, most of these types of armor have detachable magic. When you activate the magic with the starting word, the armor is automatically dismantled and then wrapped around the owner's body and reunited. Like Iron Man. Tigrius narrowed his eyebrows at his question. Yong Ho giggled. 
Lucia spoke on behalf of Tigrius. Since you have taken control of the armory, you are the owner of all weapons here. If you find out the starting word, you will be able to install it immediately. It is written here. Starting word. As if she listened to Lucia, Kaiwan opened the nameplate attached to the neck of the mannequin and showed it to Yongho. Under the simple and clear name, Silver Dragon Armor, there was various information in fine characters, such as type number, material, etc. It's so simple that I have to enter it again later. Looking at his bitter smile, Kaiwan egged on him to wear the armor. Standing next to her, Catalina's eyes also twinkled. Even Skull urged him now. After all, Yong Ho couldn't wait any longer. After passing the nameplate to Elagos, he took a big breath. He said shyly, Wear me. At first, it was a simple voice. However, some meaning arose from that voice. Yong Ho, who could see the flow of mana with his eyes, could directly observe the extraordinary happenings on the silver dragon armor. His heart was beating. The dungeon spirits of the House of Mammon nervously looked at the silver dragon armor and Yong Ho hopping on the mannequin. Right at that moment, they heard a strange noise. Pot. The clothes that Yong Ho wore were shattered into pieces with the noise. To be precise, his clothes were torn and scattered in the air. Yong Ho was embarrassed when he felt suddenly cold, and the dungeon spirits were even more embarrassed. It was only a second or so, but he became naked completely. Shortly afterward, mana was released violently in succession. The new black mana that entwined his whole body quickly became tights that stuck to his body. It was like the mannequin was wearing it. Only then did the silver dragon armor start to move. The silver dragon armor that was shattered into dozens of pieces quickly flew from the mannequin onto his body. Then they began to be reunited as he expected. Click, click. A pleasant metallic sound was heard in succession. Yong Ho straightened his back and soon felt a pleasant sense of bondage when the silver dragon armor tightened his body. Chapter 189 At that moment, he let out a breath before he knew it. The silver dragon armor covered his entire body, except for the left arm armed with a magic field and his head. It was such a spectacle, but the dungeon spirits were still confused and embarrassed. Ophelia, who made eye contact with Yong Ho, gave a pleasant exclamation briefly then held up her thumb with an awkward smile. He decided not to think about what she meant. That's great. Tigrius, who first came to his senses, spoke. Kaiwan giggled, and Catalina flapped her ears, blushing. Yong Ho focused on the armor. It was surprisingly light. He felt as if he was not wearing anything. Well, I feel like I'm wearing underwear. He moved his body one by one, starting with his fingers. Since he became a demon king, he had gained considerable Herculean power. But it seemed that he could now exert several times as much power as that. Is it a power armor rather than a simple armor? Reinforced armored suit. It was an equipment that not only protected the wearer, but it also reinforced his various abilities. In fact, there was nothing new because most of the magic armor reinforced the wearer's abilities with magic. Yong Ho was surprised again when he tapped his chest hard because he didn't feel any shock. So, he knocked it a little harder, but he felt the same. Silver Dragon armor disperses and absorbs the impact at the same time. Tigrius uncharacteristically explained in an excited voice. As someone who lived as a master for a long time, Tigrius had never actually seen a dragon armor, though he saw it in the old document. Seeing its performance before his eyes, he couldn't help but admire it. Yong Ho again moved his body back and forth. He was surprised for the third time because he felt something weird all of a sudden. Tail. The big, thick tail down from the place where the tailbone was located shook lightly. It was an artificial tail made by attaching dozens of small pieces of metal in a row. Yong Ho tried moving his tail. As it was missing in a human body, Yong Ho might find it hard to move it, but surprisingly, he got used to it quickly. This time he moved it hard. Given that it carried his power, it seemed that he could use it as an offensive weapon. When Yong Ho waved his tail, it was Catalina who was the most thrilled and happy. She also flapped her tail excessively. By the way, it suddenly came to my mind. 
While he was absorbed into demonstrating the functions of his silver dragon armor in front of the dungeon spirits, Yong Ho drew their attention. Turning to them, he asked, wouldn't I invite the dragon's grudge if I go around, wearing equipment made of dragons like this? I'm not really scared of their grudge, of course. A dragon wasn't just a monster. It was a tribe with intelligence. Just as ordinary people have an instinctive aversion to tools made of human bones, dragons would most likely feel the same when humans were wearing tools made of dragons. Maybe Yong Ho might invite their unexpected grudge. The king of violence was also called the dragon lord. Of course, as he said at first, he wasn't really scared. It just came to his mind. Tigrius and Ophelia looked at each other, and as if by an unspoken agreement, Ophelia opened her mouth, well, you don't have to worry about such a problem. Dragons are complete giants by themselves. They don't care about even their little babies where or how they live once their hatchling days are over. And their life and death after that are their own, not anybody else. Well, it's pretty dreary. Ophelia shook her head and said with a smile, in a way, it can also be called respect of their own lives. But that doesn't mean they are just cold-hearted. Although it is rarer than other races, dragons are also aware of their own race. Dragons usually react to the appalling scene that they can't bear to see with their eyes open. The reason why equipment is made with dragon bones, leather, and scales is because they are the best materials. Even the dragons don't feel appalled at this kind of thing that Ophelia mentioned, Tigrius said, picking up where Ophelia left. Yong Ho once again looked at the silver dragon armor. Is this in that best equipment category? That was true. It was the best armor in anybody's eyes. Nobody could make a mockery of this armor. According to Ophelia and Tigrius's explanation, even the king of violence would not show any reaction to Yong Ho's silver dragon armor. Overall, you're right. But when it comes to the story about the armor, it's a bit different. A voice flowed from the red bracelet on Yong Ho's right arm, another form of Amun. Thanks to his continued strength, Amun was able to talk to him to some extent outside the arena. Naturally, they turned their eyes at Yong Ho. Amun whispered. Young master. The silver dragon armor you are wearing is made of the bones and leather of the silver dragon Ernasaga, the dragon rod of the day. Oh oh. Yong Ho gave out an exclamation automatically. Although he thought it was unusual, he never knew the armor was made of the dragon lord's bones and leather. Kaiwan clapped her hands and said, I've seen it in a storybook. The fight between Mammon and the Silver Dragon. I know it, too. It was a tremendous showdown where the heaven and earth shook. Catalina chimed in. The story of Mammon and his twelve spirits was a legend in the demon world. All the other dungeon spirits nodded as if they also heard the story. Yes, that's right. It was a fight that lasted for three days and nights. Yong Ho could naturally imagine the battle between the giant silver dragon and Mammon. It seemed that his dungeon spirits also imagined the same thing. Kaiwan even gulped. After that battle, Mammon fought almost all of the remaining members of the silver dragon family. That's why the silver dragon clan was virtually extinct. Was it the revenge of the silver dragon clan who lost their master? No, that's not true. As the young master's dungeon spirit explained, dragons seldom get even with the enemy, even if their leader is killed. Why? Why did the silver dragon clan attack Mammon? Why did they fight until their clan was annihilated? Amun didn't answer right away. Somehow, he felt like he was hesitating for a moment then he whispered, Mammon made bags and accessories from part of Ernasaga's leather and presented them to Alun and Citri. Maybe there are a few left in Alun's room on the bottom floor. Citri might still be keeping them even now. Yong Ho blinked so did Kaiwan and Catalina. Ophelia and Eligos looked at each other. Tigrius cleared his throat and said, Hmm. Silver dragons were a race of honor. Tigrius came up with a fantastic explanation. Mammon also knew the cause belatedly and regretted it greatly. I see. Yong Ho suddenly felt sorry about the silver dragon armor. He cleared his throat like Tigrius did then change the topic again. He allowed the dungeon spirits to freely choose the equipment they liked. Shall I give the fresh green armor to Rykum? 
I think it would be better for Catalina to use the sun sword with her moonlight sword. Yong Ho took a step back and watched them search for their items. After some time, Amon, who had been silent, called Yong Ho again. Young master. If you occupy the next floor, you will have half of the labyrinth of greed. You have already owned half the arena. In a way, Amon didn't have to remind Yong Ho about it. However, there must be a reason why Amon brought it up in this place, not in the arena, by consuming a lot of mana. It seems that the day when I will call you master, and thus reveal the truths of the past that you want to know, is not far off. Amon. Yong Ho felt Amon smile. Then Amon whispered, the owners of the sixth floor have the exact power that you need. If you make good use of their power, you will be able to rise to a higher level with your current power. Owners. There are two owners on the sixth floor. Gemini, Yuho, and Yuan of Yin and Yang. Their strength is harmony. Please tell me a little more. I don't have any more to tell you. I just observed him. And I just gathered rumors getting around in the tavern. Gardamundi shrugged and rubbed her red hair. Kurdamukha didn't like her rude behavior but forgave her for now. She quickly turned to the King of Fury and said, Although it was despised because it was an abandoned land, you can never ignore the vast size of the unclaimed land in the south. But this man has unified the whole land there. If we can have a good relationship with him, he will surely be of great help to our people. The King of Fury curled her lips and responded, Good relationship. Yes. Good relationship. Isn't it good for you because he is not under any king now? I think we had better hurry up to have him on our side. Kurtamukha got his face closer to the King of Fury and said, It seems he has a great character, given that he not only recovered the bodies of the killed in the battle but also compensated their bereaved families. I feel like he is going to be a great king. The King of Fury nodded on impulse but sincerely. It was no exaggeration to say that she was the only king who cared about the welfare of the killed soldiers' bereaved families. Then there appeared another man. Even though the House of Mammon collapsed, he is the master of the prestigious Mammon family with a long history and tradition, so I think he is in the same league as you. Of course, the House of Mammon has been resurrected now. Having said that, Kurtamukha winked at her. The King of Fury, who already read her mind well, quickly pushed her aside and said, Hey, don't talk nonsense anymore. Contrary to her rebuke, her cheeks were burning red. Besides, her earlobes were also red and her mouth was strangely turned up with a smile. Kurtamukha laughed openly, even though she fell on her buttocks. Once again, the King of Fury squeezed her lips and looked at the portrait of the master of the Mammon family she painted. Watching her quietly, Gardamundi thought, let me hide the rumor that he is a womanizer. Its credibility is low anyway. The King of Fury raised the portrait and smiled shyly before she knew it. The King of Violence raised his head. He wasn't mentally alert now. His body, which would reach hundreds of meters in length, moved directly in decades. The giant dragon's eyelids shook off the weight of years. One person was reflected in his golden eyes, which caused fear in those who looked at them. After raising his head, the king of violence raised himself up. He looked down at the visitor from high above. Although he invited this visitor, he didn't expect the visitor would appear. It's been a long time. His small and low voice was amplified. The breathing of the dragon lord, who inherited the fantastic vein, became magic itself. The room where the king of violence stayed was filled with the great king's mana. The visitor looked up. With his black robes letting down, the visitor looked straight at the king of violence. The visitor acted proudly. Even though he faced one of the six kings who ruled the demon realm, he showed no fear or embarrassment. The king of violence made eye contact with the visitor. With respect, he called the visitor's name. King of Sloth. Their eyes crossed once again. Chapter, 190. The news about the king of violence's military provocations reached the house of Mammon. Yong Ho and Ophelia decided to take it as good luck. Faced with the real threat of the king of violence right now, it was very unlikely that the king of gluttony would attack the southern area. Instead of being in a hurry and impatient, Yong Ho set into motion his action plan one by one. 
he moved the entire living facilities on the first floor to the first floor of the Labyrinth of Greed. The original place of the facilities was filled with the dungeon defense facilities. He also moved the heart room where Lucia was located to the fifth floor of the Labyrinth of Greed. Although he felt sorry for Yuria, who just made friends with Lucia, who was also very disappointed, it was inevitable. The heart of the dungeon had to be kept in the safest place. It took some time for him to move the dungeon facilities and establish a new defense facility. In the meantime, he carried out the evolution of the dungeon spirits that he had postponed. The Skull Unit, which brought a lot of achievements in its eastern expedition, had many members eligible for promotion. Thanks to their synchronization, its skeleton soldiers and skeleton warriors carried out excellent performance as skeleton warriors and skeleton knights respectively. So the Skull Unit's combat power greatly improved through several promotions of its members. In the case of General Dungeons, when the dungeon grew and brought in stronger dungeon spirits, the existing spirits were usually abandoned because most of them were much weaker than their new counterparts. However, thanks to the power of evolution, no dungeon spirit at the House of Mammon was abandoned, for they also grew together with the dungeon. After evolving the goblin rangers to the point that they had little traces of goblins except for their green skin, Yong Ho stretched himself. Although he evolved hundreds of dungeon spirits until now, he had some other work to do. How about taking a break without overworking yourself? Kai Wan sat on the armrest of his chair and put her hand on Yong Ho's shoulder. He felt he was working too much like Kai Wan said, but he couldn't delay again. He said, gently pushing her away, because time is gold. Well, if you think so. Unexpectedly, she gave up easily then stood beside other dungeon spirits. They were lined up, facing his chair. Everyone can get a promotion except for Skull. Their promotion was overdue because all of them got promoted a long time ago. Regrettably, it was impossible to evolve Skull through combination magic. It was because Citri couldn't find a suitable necromancer undead. Skullkull. Skull laughed loud as if it didn't matter. In fact, Yongho felt he didn't need to hurry because he evolved Skull into a Dragon Bone Knight only recently. Let me do something about Catalina first. When Yongho called, Catalina, who was standing next to Skull, came along. Her current position was Shadow Mistress. Yongho promoted her to Shadow Queen by activating the power of evolution. On the surface, Catalina, who was standing at the place where the radiant green light disappeared, did not change significantly. However, Yong Ho, who could see her and her mana directly, felt a marked difference. And there was somebody who noticed a subtle difference, too. Well, I wonder if that's what Yong Ho prefers. I hope he can change me like her. Since she noticed that Yong Ho could change one's appearance with the power of evolution as he wished, Kai Wan cracked jokes like that whenever she had a chance. Elagos, who was the next one after Catalina, approached him anxiously while Ophelia giggled. So, she only moved her lips to convey her intention to Yong Ho silently. Well, yes. That way. When Yong Ho responded naturally, Elagos flinched. He looked back and asked, promotion I'm getting promoted, right? Don't worry about it. I'll get you one. With Elagos being tense and anxious, Yong Ho promoted Elagos by activating the power of evolution. Now promoted from Red Demon Tyrant to Red Demon Genocide, he had a hairy chest and wild look. Ophelia was happy about the outcome of her promotion. She was promoted from Red Demon Breaker to Red Demon Champion, and Tigrius was promoted from Wizard to Warlock. Kai Wan, who went through evolution after becoming Yong Ho's familiar spirit, got a promotion for the first time so she was rather uncharacteristically nervous and tense this time. Yong Ho, who felt the urge to tease her, put his palms on her cheeks. Then even before Kai Wan could begin to complain, he activated the power of evolution. Her hair when she got promoted from Sword Queen to Sword Empress turned a little more like a flame. She laughed after checking herself as a whole. Oh gosh! How can I get this plastic surgery without any side effects? I think I am blessed with a man. Yong Ho turned away from her with an effort then pondered over whether to evolve Skull. Since they repeatedly went through evolution and promotion, the dungeon spirit's EXP accumulation slowed down a lot. Since Citri said she would get him Necromancer undead within a few days, it might be better for him to postpone their evolution. 
as if it read Yong Ho's agony, Skull shouted, showing both palms it seemed Skull wanted Yong Ho to delay evolving him. Okay, take a good break today, everyone. We're going to start attacking the sixth floor of the Labyrinth of Greed right away tomorrow morning. Yong Ho made the announcement, and each of the dungeon spirits moved to their room. Instead of standing up right away, Yong Ho sat on the chair and looked at Amun, placed in the form of a bracelet on his right arm. He recalled what Amun said right after the attack on the fifth floor. They're really terrifying. The dungeon monsters that occupied the sixth floor were not comparable to those on the fourth or fifth floor. Not only the white-haired gorilla-shaped monster lesser demons that eat ogres, but also Cyclops, the one-eyed giant, and Stragos, the prince of the ghouls who were not comparable with ordinary ghouls, came out in droves. However, when Kai Wan said it was terrifying, she didn't refer to the dungeon monsters. She was talking about the Skull unit slaughtering the dungeon monsters after they synchronized with Skull. As Yong Ho expected, the Skull unit, armed with magical equipment on the fifth floor, really boasted of their tremendous combat power. They were no different from the unit with hundreds of skeleton knights. Given that they had the attribute of the tireless undead, they had a combat power strong enough to beat thousands or even tens of thousands of skeleton warriors. On the sixth floor, there were various living spaces as well as a prison and a torture room. Although Eligos strongly expressed his desire of touring the place, he couldn't because of Ophelia who had complete control over him. Eligos knew when to restrain himself. With Eligos feeling frustrated, they examined the whole sixth floor for a while. Finally, Yong Ho's party reached Yuhoyuan's room next to the passage leading to the seventh floor. Since the Skull unit was in charge of the battle to take over the sixth floor attack, Yong Ho and his dungeon spirits did not waste their physical strength at all. Skull and Eligos, at the order of Yong Ho, who signaled to them with his eyes, opened a large steel door. Gemini Yuho and Yuan of Yin and Yang. There was little record about the duo, in particular, among Mammon's twelve spirits. Amun said the two were already dead, just like Elun and Baruna. However, Amun also said that the duo might have left behind their surrogates with a high probability. The room, which looked about 10 meters wide and 20 meters long, was full of toys. Unlike other rooms so far, this room itself was equipped with a bed and other furniture as if it were a living space. Yong Ho first stepped into the room. Then, a soft light appeared on the chair at the end of the room. A pile of light that closely resembled what he saw in Alun's room in the past became united and formed a human shape. It was a boy and a girl sitting side by side. Hi. The boy, who looked a little over ten years old, was dressed in black. His hair was gray, and his eyes were blue. The girl sitting next to the boy was dressed in white. Contrastingly, her hair was black and her eyes were red. Both were a boy and a girl who were pretty like dolls. The boy and the girl opened their mouths before Yong Ho could even say anything. It's the first time anybody has come to this room with Amun. The duo continued, you even have godly energy. Not all of the twelve spirits of the House of Mammon challenged their masters with battle-related tests. The boy and the girl beckoned to Yong Ho to come closer. When he and his dungeon spirits approached them close enough, they continued, I don't think you need a cumbersome test. If you can handle the power of harmony properly, you have already passed the test. The way they spoke to Yong Ho was far from childish. Both of them seemed exhausted. What was left in this place was the same replica of those that existed in Alun's room. Yuho and Yuan beckoned to Yong Ho again and asked them to stand in front of them. Yong Ho stood in front of Yuho and Yuan, and the two looked up at him. For the first time, they made a childish smile. You look like the master. Yuho and Yuan raised their hands at the same time and touched his godly energy, then transferred their power to him naturally. The power of Yuhoyuan was harmony. Amun once told Yong Ho that it was particularly important, unlike the typical power. The moment he accepted the power of harmony, Yong Ho knew it. He seemed to know what he had to do with this power, and why Yuho and Yuan said that dealing with the power of harmony itself would be a test. Yong Ho exercised the power of harmony. His power was not limited locally, but he let it engulf himself. He used it for everything he had. It was a vast power that made him feel dazzled. He felt dizzy. In the meantime, 
he maximized his senses then he found some familiar energies in no time. Chapter, 191 The Power of Harmony Yong Ho used it harmoniously. It smoothly connected forces that had been somewhat disorderly connected until now. What was really affected was the power of the dungeon spirits, in particular. A space that could accept the dungeon spirits. Each domain of the dungeon spirits in it was in harmony with each other. The gap was filled, and the space they occupied was reduced. The area that had been expanded when Stravati, the loser of the eastern area was defeated, had more space now. Now he could say that was enough. If he exerted the power of harmony once again, he would be able to get it easily. Yong Ho opened his eyes. He couldn't tell how much time passed. It seemed like a few hours or only a few seconds. Yong Ho turned. Instead of looking at the dungeon spirits, he raised his hand. Then he held the magic spear of the red lotus in his hand. Amen. Yes, my master. He didn't need to ask or reply anymore. He ordered Amun to be his familiar spirit. Amun accepted his will. One of Mammon's twelve spirits, Amun, finally accepted a new master. And Amun's change began. A bright red flame arose from the magic spear of the red lotus. Five horns sprout on Yong Ho's head. He released mana, roaring wildly. Even the dungeon spirits experienced a marked change that they had never felt before. They felt a flood of enormous mana. Amun, the magic spear of the red lotus. The leader of the twelve spirits of the house of Mammon. Yong Ho reached the extreme limit at once. And he finally jumped over it. A new sixth horn sprouted on his head. Amun's flames did not stop. The flames of the red lotus soon turned into green flames, which filled the room, and surged through the dungeon spirits. Catalina and Kaiwan's mana grew dramatically. A fifth horn sprouted on the heads of Elagos, Ophelia, and Tigrius, and a magnificent dragon's power arose from Skull's body. Yuho and Yuan smiled in the green flames. Looking at Yong Ho's back, Yuho and Yuan recalled Mammon, the king of greed, whom they trusted and followed. Finally, you, the king of greed, have come back. Yuho and Yuan turned into light then disappeared. And at that moment, an enormous mana sprang from Yong Ho again. The king of fury looked at the letter she wrote in person. One side of the desk was full of letters that she stopped writing and crumpled. Good. This looks just right. It was good for her to push Kurtamuka out of her room, who was making a fuss over her letter. In the letter, she politely proposed to have friendly exchanges. He might be embarrassed if I ask him for a meeting suddenly. The King of Fury herself would also be embarrassed in that case. Nodding in satisfaction, she sealed the letter. Then she called Kurtamuka, who was earnestly waiting outside the door. Yuria handed out food to the dungeon meerkats. She was depressed because her new friend Lucia moved to a distant place, but she tried to avoid looking depressed. After all, she had Baduk nearby, and dungeon meerkats acting cute to her like this. She rather felt sorry for Lucia who moved to a remote place where she didn't have any friends. Noticing she was in a bad mood, the dungeon meerkats acted more cute than usual. She burst into laughter loudly as the baby meerkats climbed over her neck and tickled her. Eventually, she forgot to give them food and began to play with them, rolling over the floor. Suddenly, the adult meerkats raised themselves upright. Not just one or two, but almost all of them did. The baby meerkats who were playing on her body also straightened and stared at the sky. Bark, bark. Baduk also pointed to the sky in confusion. Yuria quickly raised herself, and looked up at the sky, holding the baby meerkats in her arms. Something was flying through the sky from afar. A huge beast with the head of a bird, a beast, and a demon. They were the king of gluttony's forces. The king of violence has never left his dragon rare. It was the last message left by Tamkaruku, the king's eighth familiar spirit, about three hours ago. The king of gluttony recognized Tamkaruku's demise because about all his communication line with Tamkaruku was cut off about ten minutes after he received the message. He was the king's loyal minion man who directly infiltrated the king of violence's innermost hideout place and obtained the precious intelligence about the king's whereabouts. 
Even though he knew it was a mission that actually cost his life, Tankaruku left without complaining at all, and he finally completed the mission. While mourning Tankaruku's death, the king of gluttony cursed the king of violence that caused the situation as it was now. The death of familiar spirits was a big blow both physically and mentally to the master. However, it meant something different to the king of gluttony. Each of the seven deadly sins had various characteristics of its own. Just like greed allowed the king to have more familiar spirits than ordinary demon kings. The gluttony possessed by the king of gluttony could digest whatever came in his mouth. The same was true of his increased abilities with the addition of more spirits. Assuming that the relative value of the lost mana was 100 when the general master lost his familiar spirits, the king of gluttony lost only 20 to 30 mana, which was much less than that. As one of many abilities the king of gluttony had, that was why he could consume or change his familiar spirits more drastically than other kings. Nonetheless, Tamkaruku was still his spirit. The king couldn't help but feel so sad about his loss. The king of gluttony pondered over the king of violence. The king of violence was currently staying at his own dragon rare. The dragon corps under his command were on standby at the borders. The king of fury was only caring about the north and the east, as if to imply that he was aligned with the king of violence in one way or another. There was a war still going on in the north. Now is the chance. The king of gluttony made the decision. He no longer thought of dragging on pointlessly. There were abundant harvests in the southern area. It was time to harvest the ripe fruits. The king of gluttony thought of ten warriors among his elite force. Consisting of eight familiar spirits and two general spirits, each of them was strong enough to be called a single-man corps. Embryo was a competent guy who could be ranked at least in the middle out of the ten warriors. Of course, Embryo had never revealed his genuine abilities. Granted his power reached the highest when he died, nobody thought he could be ranked more than the upper middle. In fact, even his upper middle rank among ten warriors showed he had a mighty power. There were not many with five horns ranked in the upper middle status in the vast demon world. The king of the unclaimed land in the south defeated Embryo with such tremendous power. Since he also absorbed the essence of Stravati, the loser of the eastern area, it was no exaggeration to say that he could be ranked in the top group of ten warriors. After he was done calculating the gains and losses of his war, the king of gluttony fidgeted with his fingers then summoned the ten warriors. Summoner Sabnak, the leader of the ten warriors, faithfully fulfilled the command of his master. As a wizard from the alien world who crash-landed in the demon world hundreds of years ago, he was reborn as a demon by choosing to be a mummy lich with powerful mana. He was the strongest and the longest living among the familiar spirits that the king of gluttony had taken until now. Although he became a mummy, he still had a hooked nose, his pride. Wearing a priest's suit adorned with gold and standing with a cane shaped like a snake, he stared at the ground. Seven of the ten were placed on the back of Trigon, a beast with the heads of a bird, a beast, and a demon. It was only Sabnak's own calculation, but given the average of their combined power, it was comparable to six embryos gathered in one place. Moreover, among the seven was not only the summoner himself but also the elder lich, Frost. It meant that he could summon hundreds of spirits anytime, anywhere. Given the size of their power, the ten warriors were too large to be sent to occupy a dungeon. However, their master, the king of gluttony, was not satisfied. He was thorough in his plan, as always. Frost had a scroll with which they could install the door of space leap. Due to the nature of the dungeon, which naturally blocked the flow of mana from the outside, it would take several minutes or more to create a proper space door, but that was not a problem. The king of gluttony ordered them to install the door of space immediately when they felt that it was beyond their power. In that case, he said he would help them out directly. The king's order was always absolute. Moreover, it was his gravest order in recent years. To be honest, Sabnak was nervous. Since he always highly valued embryo, Sabnak was warier of the master of the house of Mammon. However, that was the situation when they started moving into the south. While they left their master's land and flew to the borders of the south, they changed their mind. It was never easy to use magical power to catch a summoner moving at super speed or to hinder his flying itself. It was natural that the typical master could not defend himself. 
However, their opponent was the king of the unclaimed land in the south. It was disappointing that they didn't have any means to detect their flying at super speed, let alone any magic field that could stop their flying at super speed. They saw the dungeon meerkats hurriedly struggling to run away on the ground. Some were staring at them, while others hurriedly went into hiding. This meant that the southern people only recognized their invasion through the most basic dungeon defense system. Chapter 192 they saw a weird monster in the shape of a dog head carrying a girl on its shoulder and jumping into the dungeon in a hurry, but they didn't care much. Anyway, the dungeon would be smashed away today. Trigon landed on the ground. The dungeon meerkats alerted the house of Mammon immediately. Rykam, the garrison commander in charge of the dungeon defense, ordered the Black Orc squadron to arm themselves immediately. The orcs, who were on a contingency standby, grabbed their weapons and ran toward their defense position. Assistant Butler June ran into the hallway to command the evacuation of non-combat dungeon spirits. John, Ron, and John, the remaining three of the Goblin Rangers, escorted June. It happened less than a minute after the alarm went off. The moment when the Trigon landed in front of the dungeon of the House of Mammon, a new voice echoed in the minds of the Mammon family spirits. As of now, all the members of the House of Mammon enter a special defense posture. All dungeon spirits, please follow the direction. Let me remind you of the message again. As of now, all the members of the House of Mammon enter a special defensive posture. It was Lucia's order. Most dungeon spirits only had fragmentary information about their special defense posture. However, garrison leader Rykam and assistant butler June were different. There was clearly a sense of strong tension on their faces. Special defensive posture meant virtually abandoning most of the defense facilities on the first floor. They could not defend the enemy only with the forces on the first floor. And there was virtually nothing they could do except to buy their time. A special defensive posture was triggered only in such circumstances. Rykam immediately corrected his order given to the Black Orc Squadron. He ordered not only the troops who had already departed for their defensive positions but also the orcs who were in a defensive posture to retreat. Their gathering place after withdrawing was not the first floor, but the final gathering place located on the first floor of the Labyrinth of Greed. June tried to overcome his fear. Rykam clenched his fists, getting intensely tense. The current master of the House of Mammon was the owner of the Southern Land. There was no enemy within the southern area that could make the dungeon spirits of the House of Mammon so nervous and tense like this. It meant that the enemies who appeared now were from outside. And there was only one among the outside attackers that could mount a sudden attack against the south. Rykam gnashed his teeth. He got the ominous delusion out of his mind. He hit the ground only to follow his master's order. Coming inside the dungeon hurriedly, with Yuria on its back, Baduk was aghast at the loudly ringing alarms moreover, a girl's constant voice confused Baduk even more. What the heck is a special defense posture? Obviously, Baduk heard something like it before but couldn't recall it well. Back then, Baduk only remembered the taste of the chicken it had shared with Yuria. The seasoning was so delicious. However, Yuria was a little different. When entering the dungeon first, she lost her mind like Baduk because of the big fuss over the alarm, but she got more nervous because of the baby dungeon meerkat that she held in her arms the girl's voice ringing in her head made a difference. Yuria blinked. But she wasn't sure if she was right, so she frowned. Right at that moment, she heard a voice once again as if to quench her curiosity. Yuria. Can you hear me? Lucia. Yuria was now convinced. Forgetting the fear of the three-headed beast, Yuria shouted at Lucia happily. Startled by Yuria's sudden movement, Baduk barely managed to keep balance. A baby dungeon meerkat stood tall on the head of Baduk and looked everywhere. Lucia shouted repeatedly. Just run ahead. Go straight and then downstairs along the ramp you're seeing. You know Sister Skathaka's garden, right? Yeah. Yuria nodded vigorously. After calming down Baduk that was struggling impatiently, she pointed her finger in the direction Lucia gave her. Baduk, who immediately read her mind, responded, Bark. Bark. Run. All right. Run, Baduk. Yuria beckoned to Baduk again. 
Once it became clear what it had to do, Baduk was not confused anymore. Then Baduk began to run at a tremendous speed as if to show off its evolution achievements. Several minutes later, when Yuria and Baduk just entered the ramp, the door of the House of Mammon opened. The ten warriors stepped into the dungeon. Sabnak raised his head. He stared at the ceiling lights still shining even though the enemy stormed into the dungeon. The lighting wasn't just turned on at the entrance room. It continued along the corridor. Sabnak could understand somehow that their defense against the enemy penetrating through the air was poor. But he could not help but express doubts about the fact that they didn't block the lights, the most basic of the dungeon defense readiness. It wasn't something he could simply ignore as the lack of their basic defensive posture. He couldn't persuade himself that the man who managed the dungeon of the master so poorly had defeated Embryo. If so, this kind of shabby defense must have been deliberately put in place. Is this a trap? The lighting that continued through the dark corridor was also a signboard, such as come this way, or follow our guidance. Some of the ten warriors were impatient while others were prudent. Elder Lich Frost, who was on the prudent side, showed his intentions with his red eyes. What he meant was that they needed to summon the troops from now on even if they consumed some mana. Sabnak agreed. Lich, in the shape of a mummy, summoned three groups of demons by using the three rings on his fingers as a medium. Each of them was a demon trained in attacking dungeons only. Hellhounds were useful for finding the way and tracking down enemies. Demon Dew, a spirit-type giant, was useful for destroying traps. The cannibal ghost, Bug Bear, had strong magic resistance and regeneration power. Since each group led at least ten members, they filled the corridor in no time. Frost, who watched them quietly, took out the bone meals from his pocket and sprinkled them on the floor. Skeleton warriors were summoned from each bone piece. As a result, dozens of skeleton warriors were put together immediately. Since they were summoned through bone fragments, they were disposable objects that would disappear when their time limit ran out, but Frost could consume them without feeling any burden. After confirming the powerful bone golem standing up among the skeleton warriors, Sabnak advanced the troops again, headed by Hellhound. The straight passage continued longer than expected. There were only a few corners, but there weren't even threadbare traps or scouts along the way. Since their defense posture was so poor, Sabnak rather felt tense and nervous this time. Moreover, the lighting above his head continued to get on his nerves. Hellhound, who he installed as the scout, barked loudly and made him turn to it. Sabnak noticed a forked passage. One was a side road and the other was a downward ramp. As if to tempt them, the lighting was only on the ramp side. The ten warriors exchanged their gazes with each other. Then, they looked at their leader for direction. Sabnak nodded. As a matter of fact, he was getting so impatient right now. Sabnak released his power, hoping that all these deceptions by the House of Mammon were not just its master's bluffing. Five horns strong enough to be equal to almost six horns. Following Sabnak, the other six also released their mana in succession. Even the weakest had five horns. Indeed, they were too powerful to be sent to occupy just one dungeon. It took some time for the summoners to regain their composure, amazed by the menacing posture of the ten warriors who showed their strength in succession. Hellhounds, who recovered quickly as they were the farthest from the dungeon spirits, took the lead this time and headed for the ramp. Then the undead army that Frost summoned followed them. How long had it been since they started going down the ramp? When they went down the ramp only a couple of minutes, something unusual occurred. Instead of the blurry lights pouring from the black ceiling, a bright, brilliant sunlight rained down on them. That wasn't all. A fresh wind blew over them. There was a rich breadbasket in front of them. Well-ripened golden rice plants were swaying in the wind like waves. On one hand, the fragrant scent of fruits was carried along with the wind. It was a beautiful and heartwarming scene, but the only thing that the army of the King of Gluttony led by Sabnak could feel now as they felt totally out of place and bizarre. Hellhounds hesitantly stepped into the rice fields. Like a necromancer, Frost, who deeply pressed the pitch-black robe over his eyes, summoned the skeleton warriors in succession as if he was anxious. The skeleton warriors he summoned already numbered over three hundred. 
No matter how disposable they were, summoning them required consuming lots of mana materials, but Frost kept feeling that they were not enough for an unknown reason. Even though the troops led by Sabnak were close to 400, they didn't feel the vast rice paddies were not crowded at all. It was such a vast area. Sabnak had seen numerous dungeons as the king of gluttony's right-hand man, but it was his first time seeing this kind of dungeon. He couldn't even imagine that he could see the sky and the sun, let alone feeling the fresh breeze inside the dungeon. But the troops of the House of Mammon didn't yet appear. Sabnak prepared a new summoning technique. Frost moved the door scroll of space with his left hand so that he could use it at any time. 